Herzlich willkommen, bienvenue au Mans. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the centenary of the Le Mans 24-hour race. We are here outside the medieval city of Le Mans in the heart of France, the heart of the French early motoring industry to celebrate the centenary of the world's greatest endurance motor race. Starting the coverage for you today, Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin and Jim Roller. And Jim, perhaps the biggest day sporting crowd of any event this season, more than 300,000 people here packed around this eight and a half mile racetrack. And every one of them is breathless with anticipation as we are just hearing you uh, do the welcome. I got uh, goosebumps, <laughs> the fourth round of the World Endurance Championship, but this is more than just another race in a championship. As you said, it is the uh, centenary of this absolutely marvelous event. In 1923, a group of uh, three men got together from the ACO and from a, a wheel manufacturer and put together a plan to prove the reliability of the automobile and to foster innovation. And 100 years later, we are still following in that tradition, still proving the automobile, still proving new technology, and still enjoying the fruits of the labor of these manufacturers, which should provide for us today an absolutely stunning 24 hours of the month. Well, first of all, let's offer our thanks to the men and women, the boys and girls in orange who keep everybody safe here. All the marshals, all the workers on the round the track, our volunteers have always been. Without them, we would have none of this racing. We would not have great names like Jackie Ix and Roger Penske on the grid. We wouldn't have great manufacturers like Ferrari and Corvette and Aston Martin and the rest of them. We would have nothing at all. So our first thanks go to them. The ACO, the Automobile Club de la West de la France, originated this race back in November 1922. The thinking came around to creating a 24-hour race, and here we are celebrating its centenary. Le LeBron James there, and uh, you can see the difference in height between a, uh, yeah. a multiple NBA champion, LeBron James, and a multiple Le Mans winner, Tom Christensen, quite significant. Yeah, elbow and, to head, I think that was, Martin. Yeah, and this track, 13.6 kilometers it is a shorter version of the original 10 mile track but it still presents phenomenal challenges and two-thirds of it remains on public road for the rest of the year so it has a very different nature to anywhere else we go racing historic names in the corners and this historic challenge has not lessened since it was a 10 mile dirt track back in 1923. Last year's winners, Toyota Gazoo Racing car number eight in the overall category, Jota won in LMP2. You can see there the race record lap times. Brendan Hartley with the fastest lap of the race last year. Well, LeBron James towering above everybody here in terms of stature. Minister of Sport there, I believe. It was indeed. Yeah. him, yep. So you can see the cars on the grid and they are gradually removing the excess humanity from the field. Well, let's take a look at the markings new for this race on the tyres in the hypercar category. And think of it basically W for wet, water is blue-ish. Uh, <laughs> the soft tyre for cold conditions, white. Uh, medium hot conditions, yellow, and red hot conditions, uh, red, that would be the hard tyre. So we've got three compounds in our hypercar class, the top tier here, that is uh, three compounds of slicks plus the wet weather tyre. Miguel Molina, part of the crew of the number 50, a, of course, a Ferrari, which claimed pole position. The significance of the 50 there, lost to me all season, is, of course, that it's 50 <laughs> years since Ferrari raced with a factory team in the top class at Le Mans. And while it's dry around the start-finish area, it is definitely wet out on the rest of the track, track yeah, Graham. That's part of the Mills and Anne, uh, part of the Hunod, yeah. It's not the whole length of it, it but as you can see, see Fred, Fred Vasseur there on the grid. Mm -hmm. it, it's everywhere you look, familiar faces. Uh, yeah. But uh, it is wet out there, uh, still warm here so if we don't get any more we're doubting it will dry quickly zero doubt it's slick conditions to start this race but uh, equally well none of the drivers and none of the cars apart from 
Michelle Leclerc. Uh, none of the uh, teams had a chance to actually scout out those conditions. That will come on the formation lap. In the LMP2 category, control tyre supplied by Goodyear. The blimp is also supplied by Goodyear. You see that a lot. One wet weather and one dry weather tyre. Nico Lapierre, the boss of Cool Racing. Brendan Hartley and the rest of the crew of the number eight Toyota team there. Big team effort to get here. Big team effort for whatever they've managed to achieve through qualifying and a huge team effort to tackle the Le Mans 24 hours. Yeah. There is a, this is a Satoshi Yoshino with Tomino Bufuji. The D-Station Racing car was damaged in qualifying. That will start at the tail of the field. And the race is not just 24 hours. The race is actually 10 days long. On Friday and Saturday of last week in the centre of Le Mans, the scrutineering it's in the open air le paysage this has been a tradition for the last 30 odd plus years cars come in one by one the teams follow them and the fans get a chance to see everything using uh, the test there on the lifting gear that is required for each car in this race and all the world endurance championship races and a chance to get that famous photograph of the entire team together I mean, Jim Roller, the location could hardly be more French, could it? And, and all these teams just enjoying the beginning of the week with a little parade of cars down through the city as well. Yannick Dalmas, our safety car driver, will have slightly uh, more up-to-date equipment, hopefully on his hands, than the 1923 winner. It was a very great beginning to the, the 10 days. Yeah huge crowds there as well scorching weather in the center of town Very and hot. friday was absolutely rammed saturday even more so and uh, the drivers parade last night the traditional drivers parade in town again probably around a hundred thousand people jammed into the center of le mans the cowboy hats for the corvette racing team they were brought by the starting driver of that car ben keating the man who put it on pole position in the gte am class uh, we'll say, by the way, gentlemen, you may have noticed as we see the uh, first cycle the, the, this afternoon of the Centenary Trophy, Kamuri Ko, uh, Kobayashi there. One car not starting from the grid as we see these celebrations in town last night for the driver's parade. Uh, the 708 Glickenhaus uh, gearbox leak, and uh, that car will start from pit lane. And as per the regulations, that will be one lap down. Yeah, so uh, already on the back foot there, but as the team said, onwards. That's the only way to attack this race, is to attack this race. And if the car starts to develop recalcitrant tra traits, keep pushing it back out of the garage. Yeah, happy scenes in the Montown Centre after the... How can I put this? The staggering recovery from COVID. Great to see this race back in its pomp. Leo Henry told me uh, only time in his life he ever felt like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Former yeah. class winner here, one of the gentleman drivers, and he said it was uh, probably one of the biggest thrills he's ever had was being in the parade. Yeah, it, uh, it's great to see first time teams and drivers here as well. They are absolutely blown away by the reception from the crowd. So lots of uh, friends of the famous down on the grid and in the pit lane. Still a little bit of rain falling. We've had a few drops of water in the air most of the night and all of the day. The weather is moving away to the west there on the Le Mans radar. Le Mans, by the way, is the local uh, newspaper. That was the first section of Funoria, the Mulsanne Strait, as was. Professor with uh, the Toyota Kazoo Racing crew now. Philippe Leloup, who is a long-time member of Ugde Shonak's crew at Orica. Mohamed bin Sulayem there, the president of the FIA. And greets the first ever race winner in an FI World Endurance Championship race. That's uh, Lila Wadu yep. uh, from last time out uh, at Spa. Well, our top class here is no longer LMP1, it is now Hypercar, but two or three years ago, the ACO introduced a new element to qualifying, Hyperpole. And the deal here is that the fastest eight cars in each of our three classes got to go through into Hyperpole, and they had half an hour all together on track to try and set the best time. Ben Keating, again, pulled absolutely exceptional performance out of 33 Corvette Edex Sport. Paulu Chatin, they were the perhaps surprise pole sitters in LMP2. A great, great Le Mans pole for them, their very first. And although Toyota pushed hard, 
Ferrari pushed harder. Brendan Hartley put the number eight car third. For a while, it looked like the 51 car of Alessandro Pierre Guidi would go fast enough. But an astonishing performance from Antonio Fuoco put the number 50 car clear and away in front. I mean, the stars lined up. Car number 50, 50 years away. The last time that Ferrari raced here, they had a car on pole position. Half a century later, they're back and they have a car on pole position. And of course, that car was the absolutely beautiful 312 PB. One just recently went at auction for 13 million euros. Wow. So this will be the 91st running of the Le Mans 24 hours for reasons that everybody will be very well aware of. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, there was no racing here in France, but the circuit and the town survived World War II pretty much unscathed. And by 1949, they were back racing here again. This is the Mission H24 uh, machine. It is basically uh, an adapted LMP2 car, which runs on pure hydrogen. The only uh, exhaust, if you like, from this, the only emissions from this is H2O. Yeah, to the left, the driver that will be leading this field. Stefan Riquelme, many times a starter here at uh, the Le Mans 24 Hours. This is uh, an ACO project, so firm favourites of President uh, Pierre Fion with a, an array of industry partners. Total Energy is involved here. Adesa supply the chassis as well as uh, the supplies of all the tech. It's an LMP3 chassis. It is an LMP3 yeah. chassis, right. What it actually gives you as well is a great indication of the absolute carnage that surrounds everything <laughs> here. <laughs> Le Mans. Just so many people need a slice of so much. This morning we were treated to a great parade of more than 50 original Le Mans winning cars. We reveled and, in this, didn't we? Uh, and a whole host of others that were, for one reason or other, the smallest, the fastest ever, were particularly notable. Bricks Cunningham bringing a, a Cadillac. Under all of that, under the bodywork of the monster, is a Cadillac. The Group C cars, the cars from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, they were all there. Toyota brought their first and their most recent Le Mans winner. Audi brought a whole slew of their Le Mans winners. We saw Le Mans winners from Peugeot and Ferrari and just about every other brand you could think of. And you'll be hearing from one of the drivers as part of that parade later about what it was like. Yeah. Guy Smith sure. joins us here for the commentary team this year for the first time. Delighted to have him here for this fantastic centenary race. And again from Bentley, we had old number one, the first car to win here at Le Mans for Bentley, and it was a two-time winner, and their most recent winner as well, the, the uh, EXP8 Speed 8 that uh, that Guy drove. Uh, it just seems like a few years ago. I, I'm not going to embarrass him by saying how few that few was. <laughs> it does feel in very recent history still, the the, uh, the Speed 8, but not quite as recent as perhaps we'd like to imagine. 20? <laughs> uh, he's still so, a sprightly young thing, Guy Smith. He'll be, um, but remember, he's actually already raced twice here this weekend. Yes. Well, that's right. In the Road to Le Mans, <laughs> uh, part of United Autosports LMP3 setup. A part of the pageantry of this event, of course, will be the fly pasts. We'll see the, the French national display team, Patrie de France, uh, from the uh, Armée de l'Air. In fact, I, I'll correct myself, I've always called them the Armée de l'Air, the French Air Force. They are, in fact, Armée de l'Air et d'Espace. They are now called the, oh, really? the Army of the Air and Space. Uh, so, yeah, Go we'll ahead. also have the flag, the tricolore, which will wave the uh, drivers away, delivered by the... Uh, helicopter crew from L'Armée de la Terre. And uh, the flag that they'll be using here has been signed by every single driver who is here to start the race. So there'll be 186 signatures on it. Correct. And uh, that will be used to flag the way, uh, flag away the race. And we'll then go into the museum here. The flags of, I was gonna say all nations, there's not very many nations who don't have a participant here this all weekend. All competing nations, and uh, they will be celebrated with their anthems on the grid. Yep. Well, there's been so much celebration around the centenary of Le Mans. We've been right in the heart of it. Where we live in the caravans, just in the TV compound, was about 20 feet from the uh, launch of the fireworks <laughs> and about 25 feet from the sound stage that provided the uh, uh, son for the Son et Lumière display that was uh, last night, yesterday Fabulous. evening. Chaparral. Yeah, yeah. 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 isn't that great? Une well, 
uh, I have to say, I, I don't know what automobiles or aviation or life will look like in a century. And I'm sure it won't be around without question, won't be around to see it, but hopefully something of at least the spirit of this race will still be going in a hundred years. This race started on dirt roads with very primitive vehicles and now still represents the zenith of racing technology. Whatever that is in a century from now, whatever powers uh, vehicles, then hopefully they will still be doing this. Flux capacitors. There you go. I Dor say Dorian Pam there. Flux capacitors. Dorian Pam bec will become, in just a few minutes' time, the 65th female driver to have started this great race. There have been uh, numerous, uh, uh, numerous class winners. Could she be just the next? Odette yep. Silco was the first back in 1930. Yeah, and uh, amongst the uh, the uh, female drivers that have actually won this race, of course, Michel Mouton mm -hmm. uh, has won in class before. There is LeBron Ron James. Also, He's, uh, also Pikes Peak. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Not sure how they're going to spot him from the grandstands. <laughs> they're going to have to crane their necks and look up wise, aren't we, are they? This is part of the camaraderie that uh, takes part here. Friends, old and new. Yeah. And it's absolutely part of it. The, the mutual respect that's required to survive this race within the team, within the car crew and within the paddock is, is absolutely all-pervading. And that's one of the joys here. Now, Alpine unveiled their new hypercar here this week. That car will be on the grid in the World Endurance Championship, the calendar for which was also unveiled, and at Le Mans next year. So... The Alpine hypercar. Look at the detail in the oh, rear lines. I mean, I love that. There's, there's nothing ah. about this car that is not absolutely drop dead gorgeous, from the colour scheme to the little light details and the, my other cars and Alpine A110, all of that. It's absolutely gorgeous. If it goes anywhere it will, like it looks, it should be brilliant. And this, uh, even further into the future, yes, the H2 the... concept from Toyota Kazoo Racing. Uh, with the, uh, the, we've already seen the hydrogen fuel cell demonstrator from uh, the ACO with uh, the uh, H24 project. This is hydrogen combustion technology, and this is pointed towards where Toyota want to take uh, their future at Le Mans. And Toyota have already started racing cars with internal combustion engines that use hydrogen rather than petroleum. So it, it's not a future technology, it is a nascent technology. Jensen Button, one of 18 XF1 drivers on the grid, the only Formula One world champion competing this year. And as you can see from his shoulder and his chest, he's not in a prototype. He kind of is in a prototype, yes, actually. Yes, he is. Garage 56 is for cars that fall outside the normal rules. They're either innovative in the, the, the adaptation of the car for the drivers, if they're handicapped or uh, are, are, are otherly able, or in the technology they use. This year, Garage 56 joins the celebration for the centenary of Le Mans with the 75th anniversary of NASCAR. There is a NASCAR Cup car modified for endurance racing. Jensen Button, former race winner Mike Rockefeller, and seven-time NASCAR Cup champion Jimmy Johnson are the crew. Well, here is the crew at Ferrari. Eh? Of course, a Ferrari. These guys, Antonio Foco there and left, massive smile on his face. Whatever happens in the race, hole at Le Mans, 50 years after last being here, they've won. They've won <laughs> so much here already. And now all they can do is go out and just roll the dice like everybody else. You can have the best car. You can think you've got the slowest car. Le Mans decides who gets the luck of the green and who doesn't. So for every, genuinely in this race, above all others, for every single crew on the grid, you could be on the podium and there's not many sporting events where you can say from the extreme of either end of, of the sort of ability and knowledge scale that that is true. OK, Toyota there, the man behind the Toyota name and the winner of the 2023 Spirit of Le Mans Award in the centenary year of this great event. And he could not be more proud of the effort that his team, his brand, has brought to this race over the last few years. They are desperate to defend that title. Rightfully so, he should be proud. Rightfully so. Yeah, Brendan Hartley said, OK, we lost our string of consecutive pole positions here at Le Mans, but we are going to go out all guns blazing to try and win the race, you know. Uh, 
the first skirmish went to Ferrari and went decisively to Ferrari. They made the very best use of the track, of the drivers, of the car, and they were quick. But Toyota have the knowledge of the car, the knowledge of the race, and that is absolutely key here. You can bring the biggest dog to the fight. If it doesn't know what it's doing, then you could be in trouble. So Toyota's still very much the benchmark. Absolute gallery of legends, whether or not they're in the race or just want to be here for this race. And one of the best things for me about this race, gentlemen, every year, and never more so than this year, it's not just the likes of Jensen Button, who's world-class athletes of motorsport that are here. This is the race that can deliver on your dreams. If you're not a professional racer, if you have the skill set and you have the resource to do it, and you have the passion to do it and follow through on it, this is the race that you can come to. And that car, the number 911 car, is one that proves it. Michael Fassbender here uh, in the f year five of a five-year programme with Porsche. There is Michael. Yeah, the second Hollywood star to take on this race. I hope Patrick Dempsey is here as well. In fact, I hope second it's not in, in most in, recent memory. I hope yeah. it's of modern era, yeah. yeah. Paul Newman. Newman. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll see Michael racing. I hope it's not the last year we'll see him on the one because he's been an excellent ambassador for this form of racing. As so many people who've come and discovered Le Mans have been in the past, including Patrick Dempsey, still here, still with his name on the car. A podium uh, sitter here as well, of course, uh, Patrick. And we go down and down and down this grid. Towards the back of the grid, by the way, out of position three cars, uh, the number 38 Hertz Team Jota car, we started by Antonio Felix Costa from 60th place on the grid, the 13 Tower Motorsports car with Ricky Taylor, 61st and the 777 D-Station Racing Aston Martin in the hands of Tonobu Fuji those three cars failing to set times in qualifying will start from the back of the grid. One other slight change is the Garage 56 Hendrix Motorsport Camaro will start behind LMP2, but in front of all the GTE AM cars. It's about six seconds a lap quicker, so for safety reasons, instead of starting it on the back row, they've decided to start it ahead of the cars that it's faster than, and behind the ones it's slightly slower than. Tiziana from the team manager from Kessel Racing. Uh, famously, uh, she was the only member of the paddock that actually was in the paddock when our race director Ed Wallafreight has made his debut uh, in our standard driver's briefing a, a, a couple of months ago. She's an absolutely stunning individual. Uh, happy people on that crew, as there are on all 62 crews here. This is the pinnacle of ambition, not just for the drivers, remember, but for the team members as well. Huge pride on that grid. And it's an enormous undertaking. It's, a, it's a, an enormously challenging race. But this is a little bit like being a downhill skier. The only people that are likely to upset your race are yourselves. Everybody else has got their own race to get on with and their own plan. And you are all battling the clock and Le Mans. And Le Mans is a tough mistress. If you win this thing, you know you've done something special with your life. If you become a world champion, that's an exclusive club as well. This is a tough race to win. You saw uh, the Amani driver, Ahmad Al Harti, his orange uh, Aston Martin will start on the outside of the front row of the grid in GTE Am. Charlie Eastwood, you saw there in the shot with him, he will start the car. Nicky Katzberg was being interviewed just down by the pole sitting car in GTE Am. It's the car with the lap set by Ben Keating. And Nico Varoni is the third member of that car. Well, let's hear from the talented Texan, Ben Keating, on the grid by his Corvette. You put in such a performance in qualifying and hyperpole. Yeah, it was really, really special. Uh, it, as a team, we were kind of struggling with how to set up the car. Uh, uh, you know, after the incident that we had the, the, right before qualifying the day before, uh, I like a car that's really solid with the rear axle. I don't want any oversteer. And the team gave me maybe the best car I've ever driven at Le Mans. It, went, it, it would go exactly where I wanted it to go. I had no moments. and. Uh, it was quite easy to be fast just because the car would do exactly what you wanted it to do. So much fun. You know, it was it was quite emotional when I got done. I didn't think much about it. I did a good lap, but when they said, okay, you've just done 
the pole qualifying lap in the last year of GTE for the 100th anniversary. It's a big deal. It really is. Thank you very much. All the best for the race. Thank you. Middle name, passion, Ben Keating, good to see there. Yeah. The, uh, the team lined up and some of the passion that is around that NASCAR Garage 56. Uh, John Duden there, uh, captioned as being the IMSA president, also the team principal of this effort, yeah. and doing so on behalf of his boss, Jim Franz. IMSA president's just his day job. He does this for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and he's having a big time, and Jim Franz couldn't be more proud of these guys. Uh, Jim's had phone conversations uh, with with uh, John and is actually here today for the race. So absolutely fantastic. There you see LeBron James and this whole NASCAR effort has really claimed everyone's attention. Let's hear from Jensen Button about it. I'm with the driver crew for the number 24 Garage 56 NASCAR Camaro here at Le Mans and you're really blowing everyone away Jensen Button. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, it's it's such a special race, this. It's the 100th year as well of Le Mans. So to bring a NASCAR stock car here, <laughs> it's pretty spectacular. I think the I think the fans are really loving it. From what we hear every time it passes, there's a big cheer. So, um, yeah, it looks great, sounds great, and what an amazing team of people they've put together. And I get to race one of the mates, which is pretty cool. And Jimmy. <laughs> That's kind, isn't it, Jimmy? Uh, but also the times that you're putting in, the speed that that car's got. Yeah, the car has been, been uh, well prepared and a bit more pace than we anticipated having. Uh, so it's been nice as we're positioned here ahead of the GT cars right on the heels of the, the P2 cars. All right. Well, we look forward to speaking to you during the race. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to just ca count this on the Jensen button there. That I'm afraid I'm terribly sorry. I have to apologize to you, ladies and gentlemen, for the blatant lie from Jensen Button, because there's no way you can hear cheering over that. Because uh, that is one very loud car. Well, I think there you are said loud it, cheers. But... We hear there are lots of cheering. Yeah, no, they absolutely won't be hearing it inside it, the car. What they will do, though, is is see all the heads oh, turning. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, I mean, they, we, they're we, very we, well aware. We were on trackside, uh, as you know, all three of us at the test day, and it, it's just a smile spread. Yeah. Uh, that, that effort. It's absolutely fantastic that they're here. It's historically appropriate. It is a real buzz as we enter into this era of convergence between what have been divergent codes of sports car racing, and this feels not only like a celebration of 100 years, but the start of an era that is really, truly very special indeed. Absolutely right. Jota, as so often, with two cars on the grid, 28 here, their lead, in fact, they're now their only LMP2 car, they're also running the first customer Porsche hybrid that has escaped from captivity, and that is the Hertz Team Jota car, number 38, there's their uh, most famous number, and uh, Mighty 38, the first time we see a customer program for a hypercar. The first, but definitely not the last. The, the second kind of customer car is 311, the Action Express, Cadillac, but uh, that is uh, a quasi works effort, let's say. The colours of Delage, uh, an historic French make that has history here at Le Mans and is a new era now with a road going or track focused hypercar. Is there a racing future for that? We don't know yet, but the fact they've got their colours all over a race car uh, means that it's not a definite no. Number four, hypercar. Interesting there, the gendarme, uh, maybe from the public information office, getting a quick interview. Absolutely, quite right too. <laughs> great, it's you know great to see Everybody so many has members. The fever, don't they? So many members of the first responders for the oh, yeah. uh, French here, and we've had uh, a need for uh, for some of those this week amongst this team. I'm talking about it, mm. uh, as well as the armed forces. We had a fabulous show uh, in the air from the both the naval and the air force arms of the French armed forces over the last couple of days. Uh, low sneak pass a couple of Rafales uh, just a few a couple of hours ago and we'll wait and see just how special the fly pass is going to be usually very special Frank Meyer he'll be lapping this up a proud Frenchman and he's been a loyal servant to the Glickenhaus uh, efforts remember one of their two cars on the grid the other car the 708 car will start from pit lane and a lap down after a gearbox uh, lead. local boy made good right there Sebastian Bourdais I was just about to pick up on that he's from Le Mans little message on the radio during morning warm-up to the crew yes. guys great work to get the car out here they had a fire yesterday in uh, in the final practice session or two days ago in the final practice session and uh, he said okay great job don't forget it's just a race don't overthink it 
let's just go and have fun let's do this thing and that's exactly the way to approach it it's it, it is a race and you know everybody has a, a strategy and a plan and everything those will go out the window as soon as the lights go off at the start of it because the weather and and circumstance will intervene but the thing to focus on is enjoy doing what you're doing especially for a team like caddy who are here for the first time in a long while most of these team members didn't come here with the north star program so it's a whole new adventure for them it's a whole new adventure for us it's a new era graham of top flight sports car racing there is the 708 uh, in the garage that car i'm sure will make the start of the the, uh, the race Raman Dumas, uh, amongst the most experienced men of this great race. Uh, but that car will start, as I say, a lap down. Uh, we've got a good long look as well at the third Cadillac here. There's two caddies, the number two and the number three uh, for Cadillac Racing, fielded by Chip Ganassi. The third, the 311 car, is the first time here for Action Express Racing. Talked about the NASCAR, Jim. Uh, that is effectively Jim Franz's day job, if you like. <laughs> That's his Sunday uh, roadster right there. Not this one, but uh, the uh, Action Express car. This is, this is appropriate. This it's is the Centenary Trophy and a recreation, I yeah. believe, of the 1923 winner. I don't think the number 1923 Shanae Walker survived uh, the subsequent years, but the most successful race winner, Tom Christensen, nine victories here at Le Mans. So he's won nearly 10% of all the races ever held on this track. What a, what That's a record. just greedy, obviously. Eight, 18 <laughs> starts for Tom. Four yeah. of those didn't result in a finish. The 14 that did, he finished on the podium every, every time. single time. Yeah. And by the way, that trophy, it arrives here as the reward, amongst the rewards for the winning crew, uh, after a global tour to promote this great race. I keep bumping into it. I don't mean literally. It, it, it wouldn't stand the, the, the denting. But it's great to see uh, all sorts of major events, not all of them sporting events, the ACO have put in a great deal of effort to try to spread the word about this uh, about this event. And boy, did that work with tickets selling out completely. And not a more appropriate person on the planet to be driving that replica with that real trophy. The man who's won the other trophy more times than anyone else. It's perfect. I think Absolutely one of the things he's perfect. enjoyed most about the build-up to the centenary is the opportunity to drive lots of old winning race cars. He's yeah. done a whole <laughs> bunch of films, you know, starting with Bentleys and so on, and, and a very different kind of atmosphere driving those cars. You know, he's now trying to go, okay, centre throttle, right hand brake, centre throttle, where, which is the which is the which is the neutral, where's the gear lever, all of that stuff. You know, he is. <laughs> there you go. Ever the showman. Yeah, he is, of course, the ultimate pro. And they are absolutely the correct ambassador for this event this year. I'm sure his ex Audi teammates in particular will be watching him just trying not to make a mistake with no little glee there. AJ yeah. Foyt will tell you that the Indy 500 made him who he is today. Richard Petty will tell you the same thing of the Daytona 500 and the 24 Hours of Le Mans has not only made Tom Christensen a national hero in his home, Denmark, he is a worldwide celebrity because yeah. of this event. And, and how many racers and racing teams are here or have cycled through this great race because of the example he set? Yeah, absolutely right. La Marseillaise, the French national anthem as ever, rings out across a packed grid and grandstands here at Le Mans. And to deliver the starter's flag, Lame de la Terre bringing it in in the now honored tradition. This is the view over the circuit of Le Mans from the helicopters as they bring in. That's some firepower right there. That is some firepower. It's also got a camera pod, but uh -huh. this is on board the main delivery vehicle. Yeah, just making sure that that's a new element in race controls armory there. <laughs> <laughs> There's no solution track. for track limits, track gentlemen. Limits, yeah, this, we'll be, th this, be punished by a 105 millimeter howitzer. Yeah, this uh, spectacle though has become part of the ceremonial over the last few years, mm -hmm. including the rehearsal on Friday. Indeed. Night. Yeah, and if you weren't aware that helicopter pilots were certified the insane, <laughs> just you watch will this. Be. You will be. And not just the helicopter pilots, why would you leave a perfectly serviceable helicopter yeah, without before a it parachute? Lands? Absolutely. <laughs> Abseiling down with the Chicola. And again, this, I'm sure, is a huge honour for those responsible. Not coming down slowly, no. either. Brave men and women 
of the armed forces of this great nation. And once the flag has been dropped off. Two more coming down. Yeah. So the first two will be stabilising the drop ropes for their colleagues that follow with the slightly heavier load. And then one of these servicemen will have been accorded the honour of taking his nation's flag to the hands of the man that will signal the start of the centenary running of the train around four hours of Le Mans. And the traditional bow to the teams on the grid from the heli, I expect, at any moment. Ropes will drop shortly. There's the trickler. Yep. Oh, oh, got it caught. There we go. Not for long. Good luck to you, sir. This is a proud moment for him. It's gonna, I think it's going to be... Is that quad bike it's going to be coming on? I think it is. Nose down, very low and very, very loud. Yeah. And away they go. Trim and epic. Eurocopter Tiger. That's featured on a Bond film some years ago. I was ago. just going to say that. It is that a... helicopter. It's the same basic piece of kit. Yeah, in the same family as uh, the American Apache. Yeah. Frederick Akia in the centre of the group of luminaries, the CEO of LMEM. You can just see Dr. Volkan Goldrick in about the third row behind yeah. there. So LMEM, the organisation that organises the FR World Insurance Championship and its family of racing events around the world. We're privileged to provide the words and pictures for you. There's the man that will wave the trickler, Some LeBron James, to the Los Angeles Lakers. Not Some the only top American sporting yeah. star on the grid because the most successful quarterback in NFL history, There's the smile. Tom Brady, is here <laughs> as well. There's a big man and a big smile, LeBron. And this will not be lost on him. No. Huge glories uh, in his career, but this... We've already seen the public statement from LeBron, the honour that this represents, and he will remember this. There's not many times LeBron will have been in front of a crowd this big either. No. Yeah, that's for sure. Nope. I mean, same deal with Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a Super Bowl crowd is a big crowd. There's Jackie Hicks, six times winner of the Le Mans 24 hours, just on the left-hand side of the shot. And until Tom Christensen came along, that looked like a record that yeah. might never be beaten. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> Right on cue, gentlemen, thank so, you. Some of our colleagues walked in this morning through uh, the pedestrian gate. Jack Hicks was just in front of them, race suit in one hand and, and uh, a briefcase walking in the other. In. Absolutely, yeah, just walking in through the normal gate, same as everybody else. Tell no something, tell something treatment else. Treatment Jackie, Derek Bell, those guys, heroes of mine from my era as, uh, as a kid. And I'm delighted to say they don't let you down in terms of their attitude, their outlook. Stunning human beings. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's, you know, it's been a huge part of the, the spirit of the, this event to this point. Now the new guys, the modern guys take over, but to this point, the spirit of this event has been defined by their example. And it's a fine example. They have shown all of the young drivers coming up. Yeah. This is how you act. This is how you're a gentleman. And more importantly, this is how you're a sportsman. And this a is proper how you, sportsman. This is how you show the respect for the event too. Yes. You know, it is that, that thing. It's it's very often in sport, and this celebrity-obsessed culture we have yes. nowadays, it's not like that here. Yeah. There's no one that is bigger than this event. No. Well, we love coming here, but I can tell you Tom Christensen and Jackie Hicks love coming here even more than we do. <laughs> you know, we've got links with this place. We've been coming here a while. Yep. Jackie's been coming here a very great deal longer and has very much stronger links with this place, but they just absolutely love it. You know, it is it is just a delight. The teams, the drivers are so welcoming. They just embrace everybody because everybody's here with the same passion. Wherever you come from, whatever language you speak, whatever your background is, none of that matters. Everybody's here because they love this crazy event. You have some wonderful moments in this crowd, whether or not you're here as a fan. I've done that for many years, whether or not you're here, just wandering through and enjoying the sights and the sounds and the smells of this place. There's always a conversation to be had. There's always a nod of acknowledgement. The passion is there for everybody. Stefan McKelmey just suiting up and getting ready to lead this field away in the Mission H24 car. Second generation fuel cell car from that uh, 
technology demonstration. So a very different looking pattern on the side of its Michelin tyres, and that's all going to be part of that as well. All the tyre manufacturers trying to remain as valid as possible, as, as recyclable and as sustainable as possible, while generating the same performance from their tyres. They too move the game along. So, so many things from decent lights, windscreen wipers, disc brakes, decent tyres on your cars have all been developed directly here at Le Mans. With a cloud of water behind it, off goes the Mission H24 hydrogen power prototype. And Monaco driver Stefan Richalmi knows the track well. He knows his car well as well. He and Norman Nato, who's uh, in the main race, have been deeply involved with the test driving in his car. It is a phenomenal engineering test bed because trying to overcome a whole host of challenges in terms of packaging, temperature control, you can see the big air scoops and so on, of these pure hydrogen fuel cells is, uh, is not the work of a moment. And we're going to have to get used to saying off in a cloud of mist. As to <laughs> <laughs> off uh, in a way, cloud of uh, but, smoke or dust. By yeah. the way, that car has raced. That car has taken part in Michelin Le Mans, uh, Le Mans Cup races, including yep. here at Le Mans uh, last yes, year. Indeed. There is, I believe, potentially a third generation of this. And you can see there, our first opportunity, that's not the water coming out the back of the car. Well, it is, <laughs> but it didn't start inside the car. Still very wet there, but looks to be starting to dry. So within 20 minutes now of the start of the race, I don't know about you gentlemen, but the butterflies are starting here. Goosebumps are rising. This started on, well, it started on Friday, but the transit has been even before that. Some of these teams have been building up for a full year to this race. And now it is going to start to get very real. Information to the pit lane, information to the pit lane, the race is declared wet. The race is declared wet. Uh, that means two things. It means you must run with the rain lights on the back of the car. And the other thing is you can now, should you choose to do so, fit wet weather tyres. Before that instruction uh, from Eduardo Freitas and Race Control, no wet weather tyres. And we should point out that in our conversations with Michelin, in the past we've been used to seeing teams choose between slicks Intermediates yes. and wets, yep. and now it is really a. One and the then other. they had the slick to immediate, yep. and now it is a wet that Michelin is very confident will take you all the way to dry, so that you don't need an intermediate. Yeah, their technology, they now say, it makes it a drying wet, which yes. means it clears the water and gives you the grip in cooler, wetter track temperatures, but will survive the heat and the torture that the cars are put through that the tyres are put through by the car as the track dries, so there should not need to be that, that intermediate step, which is exactly what the tyre says on the carcass between a wet weather tyre grooved like your road car and a slick tyre grooved like the tyres you take off your road car when it needs yes. new ones, but, but, with, but with more life. Uh, not sure I expect anybody to start on anything other than no. a slick tyre here. There is, you've seen there is very significant wetness on the uh, Hunodier, but... I don't think enough of it, and for far enough, that's going to make that choice anything other than a real, well, mm. uh, long shot, should we put yeah, it that way? I, I, it, it, it's a fool's errand, I think, a wet weather tyre. You can see here, this is the run Bone down dry. from Indianapolis to Arnage. Bone dry, and most of the ground around. Again, you can see the colour that the grass isn't. It's predominantly <laughs> yeah. straw yellow rather than green. It's been fairly dry around this track for fairly long periods of time recently. It was only yesterday evening that we started to get any kind of rain. Gentlemen, it's time for me to take my leave of you because Anthony has arrived and there's there's Rexy. And uh, good you up there. Have a have a great race. I will be back with you in a couple of hours. We look I am forward to very it. much looking forward to this folks at home. I hope you enjoy this half as much as I'm gonna enjoy it. <laughs> if you enjoy it half as much as us then we've enjoyed it twice as much as you. Absolutely correct. And uh, we'll be hearing from uh, 2014 FR World Endurance Champion uh, Anthony Davidson shortly. He comes uh, literally hot foot from the grid in the midst of what looked like barely controlled craziness, but uh, I'm sure he'll tell us the atmosphere was absolutely electric down there. And welcome back.
Thank you. What's it like down there? Absolutely electric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said I was sure. I, I wasn't wrong. But uh, packed and uh, celebs yeah. everywhere, it seems. There seem to be famous faces every single time uh, the camera pointed a different direction. Here's one again. It's great. It's, it's full of happiness, joy, expectation, optimism. It's, I love this part of Le Mans. You know, clean sheet. Everyone goes in the same right now. And uh, you, like I say, you don't know what's coming your way, but at this point in time, you're just soaking up all the atmosphere and enjoying it. Like, yeah, you just look up to the crowd in the grandstands, you look at the driver's faces, all the team, personnel, it's, it's absolutely, it's the best in the world. It's Brilliant. just, I, I, I just soaking it all up. It's absolutely amazing. We're Lots of words. We're at that point where we can say, hashtag, what could possibly go wrong? And you'll find out what could go wrong in the next 24 hours here if you stick with us for the Le Mans 24 hours. It is uh, a race of three races, remember. Three classes here. The hypercars are the lead of the grid. LMP2 uh, split into LMP2 and LMP2 Pro-Am. We'll get to that in due course. And GTE and plus, of course, the innovative car. That does mean that uh, three races are happening here at the very same time. There's a lot up for grabs other than just glory, and we are just minutes away now. And have you mentioned at all, obviously I couldn't hear you on my way down here, you've mentioned the fact that it's absolutely soaking wet at the first chicane. Yes. Almost, okay, good. Yeah, yes. Because that, I mean, you're on the grid, it's boiling hot, absolutely dry, and standing water yeah. on, uh, on yeah. the hood yeah. Jose Maria yeah. Lopez came running up to me with a picture of someone had been out there and sent him a photo. And he said, no, have you seen what it's like at the first UK? Yeah. And I, I couldn't believe he was talking about the same day. I said, are you winding me up? I'm live on air here. Are you winding me up? So I'm going to go on and say the wrong thing. He said, absolutely not. It, no. That's genuinely what it's like. Yeah, it's, so, been, it's been a little uh, a little downpour there. And it is very wet. But it will, you know, track is hot. It will dry fast. And I don't see anybody doing anything other than going on medium slick tyres. I'm, I'm, the, the thing I'm happiest about here, not just to hear that the, the spirit on the grid is effectively an escalated version of what we always expect, is we genuinely are expecting a really good race here. Now, in all three classes, the depth of competition here, absolutely fantastic in all three classes. And yeah, I mean, just talking to the drivers there, uh, most of the drivers that aren't starting, of course, they're a little bit more relaxed. Let's talk Christensen, yep. gets on that iconic helmet. Yeah. And all oh, the drivers saying, look, the common theme is, nobody that got through to hyperpole was saying look it's, that it was because of just a lack of speed it was just a lack of luck yeah they said, like the peugeot drivers traffic. Said, yeah traffic, traffic. red flags uh, we should be higher up should be closer to the likes of ferrari and toyota which is music to my ears yeah Absolutely. tom christensen climbs aboard the car i could just see in the background we're about to get the fly pass from the patrick de france and uh, tom as the grand marshal will be in the leading car very distinct livery on that car, celebrating the 70, 75th anniversary of the creation of Porsche. And we saw one of the very earliest cars, the Gmunt Porsche, the pre-A series 365 that raced here. And since then, Porsche have raced here pretty much every year since. Not always in the top class, but they are the manufacturer that has the most wins of all outright. Dila, Dimore, Bon, Motors. Nice work by LeBron James. That is, drivers, start your engines. And here come over, overhead the Pratville de France in their Alpha Jets. That's an Airbus A400. Uh, the heavy lift. A400M. Uh, yeah, A400M. They're, they're, they're a military spec That's car. A, that is a big plane. It is indeed. I'm going to steal a line that I read, and I'm going to say thanks to whoever wrote this on the Autosport social media account. Because we have that Hendrick Motorsport car as well. It's time for Le Boogity Boogity Boogity. It most certainly is. And Davidson's just spat water down. I himself. should be Excellent. laughing. Excellent, my race is complete. You totally caught me off guard there. I do oh, apologise. That's it's awful. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's so awful, it's genius. It's the drama, it's just the temperature's been turned up by the ceremonial. Congratulations to everybody that has attempted to stage manage uh, this. They've done a fabulous job of making this a very special year. And we're only just about to go racing, gentlemen. Green flag waves. One formation lap. 
So far this season in World Endurance Championship races, without the use of tyre warmers, we've had two formation laps. This will be a single formation lap, and the only chance the drivers have to discover what wet on the Anodier is like. It has been bone dry and scorchingly hot throughout all of the practice and qualifying sessions in test day as well. There is the Chevy Camaro ZL1 the adapted NASCAR Cup car. He's waiting for the rest of the LMP2 field to roll off. Reminder to the pit line, car 708 will be starting from the pits. Car 43 has declared a mechanical problem. If that is the case, the gaps are to be respected. That's the 43's DKR Engineering's Orica, the all-Belgian crewed Pro-Am car, starting in 33rd position. And in fact, you saw it down by the pit wall as the uh, Henrik Motorsport Camaro rolled off. I think it was still beside the pit wall. So here comes our GTE Amfield, and there will only be this single formation lap. So that's, uh, that's really bad luck for Kendi Genklas's Luxembourg Watt team with the all-Belgian crew and the very Belgian commemorative livery. And here comes the rain. I could just see the safety car in front just kicking up a bit of spray. And yet, sure enough, look, riding on board the Ferrari, the sister car in front on pole position, doing exactly the same thing. Oh, I just, as a driver, you drive around this part of the track right now and you're thinking, oh dear, oh dear, what have we got here? You, like we said, bone dry around one half of the track, that other part, you're really going to have to have your wits about you. Right, bodywork going back on there on the Come car. On, boys. Come on, boys. Maxime Martin is the driver. And he was there in the WRT garage yesterday celebrating his Fanatec GT Championship co-driver Valentino Rossi claiming what is Rossi's first ever GT3 win and his first win at Le Mans since MotoGP in 2008. You can see the transition point is at the end of the first chicane and then bow dry. Mm -hmm. This is treacherous. Absolutely on slick tyres. We saw it in Spa, didn't we? The last race we had in the World Endurance Championship. Although it's, oh, yeah, look, you can see there, don't touch that curb. Yep. Stay on the grey stuff, son, that's what it's there for. The, the big plus side is they've had a chance to see it, at least. They're yep. not coming blind into this, but that's going to be precious little. And the other thing is, although they're going very much more slowly than they will be in elapsed time, they have at least ch had a chance to feel how much or little grip there is. The DKR car being rolled off, so that will take the rolling start, hopefully. To be pushed into the pit lane, it says on timing and scoring, but has he got a chance to go? We'll see okay, shortly. That, that's changed. Stay at the back of the queue. So he's not allowed to rejoin his position in the queue. He will start at the back of the queue, but they won't lose any laps. Then it dries up going into the second chicane. So it is yeah. so localised. Yeah. It's basically just the first chicane and a few hundred metres before it. And the, 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 well, the, again, the, the problem here is it's not just about what the temperature's like here, it's what the temperature's like there. And on an eight mile course, that's the problem. If I was race director right now, I would throw a slow zone just for that sector. OK. That's not a bad shout. That is not a bad shout. Slow zones, the race director can have a a, a, a section of the track where the maximum speed is 80 kilometers an hour and that would be a, a pretty decent way of just protecting them from danger in the first couple of laps but you can see how dry it is down the end of the Mulsanne straight is still in the pit lane I was looking for you on the on the grid so Jim can you tell us what's happening right now yeah, uh, before we went out, um, we noticed a little leak on the transmission seal. So rather than fight it for 24 hours, we decided to be cautious, change the seal. It's fine, it's ready to go. Um, you know, with this new pass around procedure, it's not really an issue. And uh, we're ready to go. Great, thank you. Thank you. Safety car leading the field around before the start of the Centenary Le Mans 24 hours. Since 1923, they've been racing on this track around the outskirts of Le Mans in France. The world's greatest endurance motor race is about to get underway for the 91st time. A 10 year hiatus in the 1930s and early 40s. 
We have been back to racing almost ever since. And for the first time in 50 years, Ferrari return to the top class at Le Mans with a factory effort. They start on pole position with car number 50. It'll be Niklas Nielsen leading the field ahead of his Ferrari teammate, James Collado. On row two, defending champions Toyota Gazoo Racing, number eight car won the race last year. Sebastian Buemi with them and the best of the Porsches. The number 75 car starts right behind as we ride with Buemi. And that 75 car driven by Brazil's Felipe Nasser. Mike Conway in the second of the Toyotas and the first of the caddies of Earl Bamba, car number two. The Peugeots are in 10th and 11th position in our 16 car top class field. The 708 Glickenhaus, as you just heard from Jim Glickenhaus, will start in the pit lane after a change of a transmission oil seal and always try and address problems as soon as you can. Pole in GTE Am, set by Ben Keating in the 33 Corvette Racing uh, Corvette, and it is Nicky Katzberg that heads that field. Edex Sports, Paul Chatan, the man who set the pole position in LMP2, heads the second prototype field away. And just quickly, the reference to the pass around, there are new safety car rules this year, which will stop drivers or cars losing a lap to the leaders in their class and will then bunch all the classes together before they're released. So Jim Glickenhaus is uh, very much the opinion that will help them get back onto an even keel. But we are getting ready for the start of the centenary race at Le Mans with Ferrari, Toyota, Porsche, Cadillac, Peugeot, Glickenhaus and Floyd Van Wall in our hyperclass. We've got 23 cars, 24 cars in LMP2, and we have Corvette leading our 21-car GTE Amfield. It's a huge effort from these manufacturers to bring all these cars, most of them new racing this season, to the grid here. Huge anticipation from more than 300,000 fans packing Circuit de la Sarte. They could not have sold another ticket everything is full to the rafters and we are ready to get the race underway the challenge is known it's well known the factors that are going to be the stories told over the next 24 hours and for years beyond are completely unknown and that's the best part of this and there are so many unknown factors with this race the way it comes at you it comes at you hard and the fact there's so much newness here and the depth of competition in every class we're about to go racing we are about to go racing at Le Mans for the centenary race, the 91st running of this great endurance classic. Cars heading off what was once all public road, and back in 1923 was a 10 mile course. This is the permanent race facility as they head into the Porsche curves. Anthony, some of the greatest challenge on the country in the uh, in the world of motorsport. We just hear from the race director. All cars to assume grid positions. All cars to assume grid positions. Let's close those gaps. Let's please close those gaps. Again, two lines of cars. Please, two lines of cars. Easier said than done somehow on those really tight final chicanes. And you tell yourself as a driver at this stage, keep it clean going into the first couple of corners. It's a long race. But again, that is easier said than done too. The 75th anniversary liveried Porsche safety car will lead the field around. Also Sprack Zarathustra reaches its conclusion. The clock is set to four o'clock Central European summer time. The centenary running at the centenary of the Mont 24 hours will end away. LeBron James waves the chicola and we are racing. Ferrari locked out the front row of the grid. Will they still be in front in 24 hours time? The Toyota number eight sweeping around the outside, looking for second place. Lock up from the Porsche, the 75 car. There's contact with the Toyota. They both survive, Peugeot and uh, Cadillac both take to the runoff area. There was contact. It's a Ferrari 1-2, 50 ahead of 51. The number eight Toyota in third. And the number seven Toyota up to fourth place ahead of the 75 Porsche. That's the car you can see right behind. Then the Blue Nose, that's the number two Cadillac. The second Porsche is next up behind him. And then we get into the first of the Peugeots, the 93 car with that distinctive. It hasn't lost its rear wing. That's the way it's supposed to look. Look, 
So the race start will be investigated by the stewards. They get into the wet now as they come off Terche Rouge onto the first part of the Mulsanne straight. And Anthony Davidson, this is where the potential danger is. It is very wet here. They are on slick tyres. Well, we saw what happened into the first chicane. Let's see into this one. It is treacherous, like you say, Martin. And already the 75 going wide again. I think that's the same car, Felipe Nasser, that ran into the side, the left rear of one of the Toyotas. And cars going off the track, left, right, centre here. Yeah, the four of the 63 take to the infield. Oh, there's a barrier there. It's a 311 into the barrier on the exit of the first chicane. That's the Action Express Cadillac. And he is right in the middle of the field. He's got no steering or he's got no bodywork. He has a uh, low left front corner. Now he's going to try and drag that back to the pits. Jack Aitken. One chicane in, Jack Aitken caught out and on the in the barriers. He will try and drag that back to the pits because who knows what else might happen in this race. Well, we called it even before the start of the race that that first chicane was going to be a little bit treacherous and on the exit just losing it at 3-1 one mark, but he's okay. Martin. We need to see what happens to the 51 Ferrari. That's gone from second to fourth. He's been yep. jumped by the two Toyotas. Nick Nielsen still leads in the 50 car, but Toyota number eight in second. Sebastian Buemi, teammate Mike Conway in the other red and white Toyota. That's in third place. There's the 51 Ferrari in fourth. And there is Jack Aitken, the uh, British Korean driver trying to drag the car back to Action Express. All sorts of body bits will be required, but it's going to have to go back into the garage and have a new front end put on that car. Look how racy the Toyotas are looking at the start of this. Yep. Right up behind the car 50 now and breezing by into Indianapolis. That's a surprise. Yeah, car number huge, eight. huge attack from Sebastian Buemi. There's his teammate Brendan Hartley and the rest of the garage applauding as Toyota retake the lead or take the lead for the first time. It is Nick Nielsen in the number 50 car for Ferrari, who's now in second place. So a lead change already, halfway round lap one of this race. Yeah, as we were focusing, of course, on the incident for Jack Aitken coming out the first chicane, it was the Tota squaring up to the first of the two Ferraris coming into the second chicane. That's where the first move are made. We've just seen the second, and that uh, that's early Tota pulling away. Now, Ferrari has been very quick in race trim in free practice. It was very quick as well in qualifying trim in qualifying. So what has changed here? Is it the conditions? Is it something about the attitude of the Toyota drivers? I'm going to take this by the scruff of the neck on lap one and drag it out to the finish in 24 hours. There's a long way to go, a lot of racing. Safety the safety car. car is out, and that possibly not because of the slow-moving Action Express caddy, but the debris field that he left behind at the first chicane. And potential damage to the barrier as well, Correct. which needs to bunch the cars up to allow a big enough gap for marshals, uh, to be on the circuit and, and recovery vehicles as well to do now, their thing. Question here, the Glickenhaus that starts from the pit lane should join in at the end of lap yeah. one. But ah, there's that's, another problem, the Inter the Europol problem. 32 car. And is that at the second chicane? That's, that's Marshall Post 11. First uh, chicane. OK, so Mark Vam in some trouble there. Uh, Jack Aitken still bringing this car back at pace, despite the fact she's just got three wheels on the wagon effectively here, yeah. but in a hurry to get back to pit lane. I've got to say, that looks like it's built like an Audi, doesn't it? This is on board with Jack Aitken. Do you want to take us through this, Anne? Yeah, so the first ride, we knew it was wet. Stay off the kerbs, a little bit of oversteer there. Through that next left, the caddy getting sideways, the sister car, and on power, the rear just snaps. He catches it. The equivalent of the high side of the motorbike goes the other way. Advised, we have a lot of debris on track. After the first chicane, we have, a few, we have some cars to pick up. It's, so, sorry, Graham. It's so easily done as a driver there. You're getting on power. You've got cold tyres. You just had that slow warm-up lap. And we all saw it beforehand. Here's the 32. Snapped away from him in the chicane. Just ahead of the NASCAR there. And okay. powerless, really, at that point. Again, just that shot looks like it's in a video game where somebody's just gone, I'm going to race a NASCAR in this one. But that is uh, genuinely part of the race. It looks very different from everything else. Yeah, a little bit like one of those lockdown uh, videos from uh, Tom Aaron. Tom, I know you're here on the, on the uh, place here, the uh, PR man from Brands Hatch. Well, great work by Jack Aitken to get back to the pit lane so quickly. Now, in the end, this will now be about making sure the car finishes the race. I mean, right from lap one, their battle plan has changed. Fix the car, get it back out on track, try and make the flag, because they know with the field this competitive, they're unlikely to be a contender. But that was their battle plan all along. They would have had it in their debriefs before mm -hmm. the race even took place, saying, 
our strength has to be reliability, getting this car home. If we get through unscathed, we're guaranteed a podium. Yep. It's always the way it is when you're not in the fastest car, and they haven't been since the first laps we saw here. So I know it's, uh, I know it's easy to say sitting here, but you just, it's a game of survival when it's wet like that in the, in the first chicane, but it was just getting on power. Maybe didn't have the TC quite turned up, the traction control turned up enough and uh, a little bit of a bump as well, slightly offline. He had the other car to the right-hand side, uh, the number three car, and maybe giving that car space meant he was offline and uh, round it went. I'd really like to see another view of it, just to see if there was even a tiniest bit of contact from behind. It's, it's, it did look like the car just spun up, but you can never quite be certain. Here's the 32 car being removed from the gravel at the chicane. That's at the first chicane. Safety car has now picked up the leader. We have three safety cars here, and all three are on track. They have all been scrambled. Well, we're not, I'm not going to say we're not going to have to go through the new procedure, which we'll have to explain at some point. There's are no cars behind the second or third safety cars just now, but we do have a car on pit lane. Uh, also, by the way, to catch up here, we'll come back to the safety car procedure. On track now is the 708 uh, Glickenhaus. That Correct. one has joined in a lap late, and we'll see how that works out with this process. Um, the interior report car now recovered to the racing surface and making progress up the order are the cars that started late. Now, this is the perfect time, in fact, to talk about the safety car procedure because we heard Jim Glickenhaus saying, with the new safety car rules, starting from the pit lane shouldn't be a problem. OK, they're not going to get... Oh, hang on a minute. They might get a lap back. They will get a lap back. Where is the where on is the, the very first lap of the race. Glickenhaus is at the back of the queue. So what happens with the new safety car rules? There are three safety cars. They're scrambled at the start line, at the first chicane on the Mulsanne Strait, and at Mulsanne Corner. And those are now all circulating at the same pace. Let's take a look at the start of the race again. I just want to watch out for this number 75 Porsche. He goes to the outside. Has an almighty lockup on the right front. Already looking very racy there is Felipe Nasser. I think he already had to have a little stab on the brakes there. He did. And this is where it went wrong, didn't it? 51 side Ferrari side was not quick away. It's that right front again. I wonder if there was some kind of uh, regen issue and uh, putting too much force going through the front right brake, but uh, yeah. Number six, Porsche got in very deep there alongside the number two caddy. The, the Peugeot coming, steaming over the runoff area on the outside. Go, 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 yes! That was the number eight car, Sebastian Bemi, taking the lead. This is the moment that led probably to the uh, safety car scrambling, the 32 car going off in the wet. One twitch. Yeah, no, no sound of contact from behind. It just sounds like it just spun itself up there. And it was very subtle as well, wasn't it? It's was almost like it wasn't under, under limited traction. It just too quick for the corner. Kind of like the Antonio Fuoco incident in uh, Spa, where in a straight line, it just sort of got spat across the road. Now, let's talk about the safety car rules. So three safety cars circulating. The entire queue is behind one car, but, but that's immaterial. Once the track is safe for racing again, the three safety car queues will merge. Safety car B and C will wave the field by, and once they're all in one long queue, then we get wave bys. So if you're in a queue of safety cars, imagine in the middle of the race, you're in a queue of safety cars, your class leader is behind you. Yes. You get waved by to the tail of the queue, so you don't lose a lap behind the safety car because of the safety cars. Then we will reposition all the cars so that all the hyper cars that are in the race are ahead of all the LMP2 cars then the Garage 56, number 24 Camaro, and then all the GTE cars. So that is the way it will work. Now, what Jim Glickenhaus was saying was that, you know, if we get into the queue, but if we're nearly in danger of losing another lap, if there's a safety car, we'll get that lap back, if you like. We uh, won't lose it. Uh, I, uh, which is why I was asking where is the queue, because if it's at the back of the queue, he won't get... He won't get it on this part. Correct, around, but what no. it will be is a lot closer to the traffic. There is one other uh, outstanding uh, item here, which is what has happened to the 25 Aston Martin. Let's have a listen first. I don't know what's going on with Seb Boemi in the brake car. We see from the Porsche on board, it looks maybe that it hit more the, uh, the side than the rear. It looks like the, the side of the left-hand rear. OK, that, that is secondary problem. The problem is I don't charge. It's not charging when I brake. 
I have no assistance. It's really hard to break. I need to press really hard. I have no assistance. The, the kilowatt don't go in negative. Yeah, copy that. We know we're on it. I'll get back to you when we have something, mate. Best, best to leave it to us. Well, that is uh, that's a revelation, isn't it? And not a good one for Sebastian Buemi. Uh, Toyota already in trouble. He's saying basically on this fly-by-wire braking system, you usually have a lot of assistance from the, the brake pedal to help to regen. You can see the energy levels there on the left-hand side. That's a combination of battery power and fuel used. So your total energy, they're obviously all up there at the moment in the 90s and the, uh, the high 80%. But what he's saying is, I'm having to physically press the brake pedal really hard. I've only got the mechanical brakes at this point. Now, it wouldn't be a problem at the moment because the state of charge of the battery is high because that's what it is at the start of the race. You charge the battery up. Yeah. You have almost a 100% SOC, they call it, state of charge. The problem will come if he's got no regen, then that energy level is going to go down and down much faster than anyone else. 37 looks to be going to the garage here for uh, the... Uh, cool racing squad 38 uh, the Hertz team Joda car also on pit lane There's a number of teams take the opportunity to just top up with fuel the other aspect, by the way to this new safety car procedure is pit entry remains open Until the merge process starts the cars will be held at the end of pit lane until the next safety car passes and That will be safety car B so anybody being released now will just lose position against the first safety car but when the safety cars come, before safety cars come in, they will all be merged into the same queue. So this is free time. Uh, it's effectively free time to top up with fuel. As soon as merge starts, pit in closes. Yeah. And a driver change. There was a driver change there as well after one lap. So all these cars in the queue here have to wait until the next safety car Correct. passes them, yeah. But there's barrier repairs underway, so there could well be uh, a little bit of a delay here, I'm afraid. Is Edward afraid is there? At MP12, exiting the first chicane, everyone to bear totally right. Exiting the first chicane at MP12, everyone to bear totally to the right. I've got a lot of heavyweights on drivers left. That's a train of cars released behind safety car B. If you're wondering why it is that despite the fact there's only one safety car train, the other two cars were circulating, this is why. Uh, it's because this is part of the process. There will be a merging process. We will get to see that this early in the race. Slightly unwelcome. There goes the Goodyear airship, the Zeppelin. It's the main body, if you like, of the field behind the first safety car past the scene of the incident. Still not clear, by the way. What's happened, if anything indeed happened, I think it might have been a time, it is a timing glitch, we had a couple of those. Yeah, the LRT by TF yeah. Aston Martin, that's Graham was referring to, that started second in GTEM, is actually third in the queue. It's a bright orange car, it's quite easy to see, but not by data. It keeps going from last back up to third. Will it be a long one or what do you think? Uh, let's, uh, I think longer. The repair uh, seems uh, seems big. Service vehicle on site now. Let's see if they uh, don't do a slow zone after that. Yeah, I think they're right. It's a longer. It's, this is. It's not a very very quick fix. Uh, so I think we are going to see the entire new safety car process. Which means that as the pit lane remains open now, some cars may duck in and out. Now the question for the number eight Toyota team, what they will be doing now is hacking through all of the data they're getting off the car to try and figure is there, if there is something they can reset, if there's something in the menus that Sebastian Buemi can try and control or delete, reset, change or whatever. Part of their problem is that it's not charging up the batteries and the hybrid power, although it's not used for a lot of the lap, probably no more than six or eight seconds in an entire three and a half minute lap, it is used and it is part of the power of the car. It doesn't add to the power of the car, nope. it just takes the place of some of the internal combustion engine. But Anthony Davison, the more significant factor, and we saw this in Portimao when the Ferrari lost brake by wire and they didn't get on top of it quickly enough, is that the brakes aren't built to stop the car on their own. And so imagine if you have two brakes on your bicycle and you're only ever using one, it's going to overheat because it's doing more work than it should do. And that's, that's perhaps the larger problem immediately. 
Yeah, that's the safety car will mitigate that because he's not using the brakes very much. That's absolutely right, Martin. And what they can do as well, they can do half throttle recovery as well. So when you're not on full power, you do get the recovery that way. It uses the internal combustion engine to charge the battery. It'd be like a, so like a, how a dynamo. A mild hybrid on a road car. Exactly, exactly. So half throttle, you're getting all the recovery you need until the state of charge of the battery reaches a level that it's happy enough with, and then it does naturally hand over to the mechanical brakes. Trouble is, as soon as they're up to full speed, it's going to be doing that non-stop, and you, there's very limited room on this track to be carrying half throttle everywhere. The point of a racing car is to be flat yes. out for as often as possible. Again, behind the safety car, you can't utilize that because you're on the speed limiter and it, it is fixed at a maximum of 80 kilometers an hour, so the engine will be fixed at a certain RPM so it doesn't exceed that. You can choose within the car to make it charge under mm. the safety car as well because obviously yeah. under the safety car, you're not, the, basically the, the full course yellow limiter at 60 kph is doing that job for sorry 80 kph is doing that job for you it's it's limiting so the the, the electronics hands over to the electronic motor to slow the car down even though the throttle of the car is being told to go to 100 yeah. percent the the e-motor is slowing you down so you don't go flat out another uh, another thing I would like to see introduced is enormous A, B and C on safety car roofs. We just saw a shot of a little safety car queue. That's safety car B. Those were the cars that ducked in and out of the pit lane. And again, Anthony... Let's listen. Uh, to be fair, you know, Jack, he was being cautious. He yeah. really was. He's just this well, unfortunate yeah, he had positioning. He his alongside. He knew it was slippery and greasy. And he wasn't like... Wah! It was just... Wah! I was waiting for the, yeah, like you say, that 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 high spike. slip, the yeah. spike of, uh, of of the traction control not being there for him, and just letting the revs fly up. But that didn't happen. He wasn't doing anything, in my opinion, irresponsible. It was just a, a racing car on slick tyres yeah. on a wet track. So uh, yeah, it's, um, your heart goes out to him. Well, there he it, is. Jack Aiken. Could have been anyone, mate. Yeah. Could have been anyone. It's I can't see anything he did. So here's the heli shot, and I'm trying to see where the Cadillac is here. I know the Toyota the fight shot. is interesting. Cool. The two Peugeots <laughs> nearly take. That's each other where it out. happened. That's where the pass happened out of uh, out of the wow. first chicane. They just had better traction there. Well, we saw this in Spa, didn't we, we the did. Ferraris? They just didn't have the warm-up capabilities of the Toyota. They couldn't start that race in slippery conditions on the slicks. The Toyotas did. And we saw their first, or one of their first stints on the slicks being painfully slow compared to wow. the Toyota. That was the pass to Lee coming down towards Indianapolis. And it was one of the things that Toyota seemed to be a little bit unhappy with, with the tweak of regulations coming into this race, allowing tyre blankets back. Yeah. That hasn't been part of the scene this year so far. And they said, all that work we've been doing with no tyre warmers, making sure we can switch our tyres on, being clever in the way that we do that, has totally been eradicated for this race. So they felt like a little bit hard done by, but you've got to be there when the regulations change. Uh, you know, it's the same for everyone really, but that work, they felt they had an advantage on cooler tires with no tire blankets. Yeah, further gaggle or pit stops, including yet another, at least one more, uh driver change, that's Francois Perodo. That is Francois Perodo. Now, why are they putting their gentleman driver in? Because they can. Norman Nato started to negotiate the carnage of the first few laps. The start of Le Mans is, is never a place for the faint hearts and Anthony, but now the safety car's out. Each driver has a minimum amount of time they must drive and a maximum that they're allowed to drive. You can't do all 24 hours. So they're putting in Francois Perodo now so he can get himself up to speed in the safety car queue, get himself dialed in and then start a, a decent long run. Maxime Martin back in the pits with the DKR engineering number 43 car and this team making their debut appearance in the big race here. Looks like they've got no, more no. issues than they had second. No, no, they're not. They, they, they earned one last year uh, through success in LMP3, and actually their history in LMP2 goes back way before into the old rule set where they raced a uh, open-top uh, Lola many years okay. ago. But uh, well-known team in the industry, Kenny Jenglas, uh, member uh, commentating with Oliver Gavin for races prior, and uh, he'd raced GT1 Corvettes with Kendi's team uh, back in the day with DKR. Ironically, Jack Aitken's mistaken. Yeah, look, Alex, is that Alex Sims? Yeah, it, it is, is Alex, Alex yeah. yeah. Just saying probably what I've just said on air. Look, you know, Mate, it could have been me, it. it could have been anyone. Yeah. I've, I've heard it, I've seen it. 
you were just on the outside. The, the sister car had a, a moment in the left-hand part. You had a moment around the right-hand part, but unfortunately the barrier was closer on that part yeah. of the track. We can go to car 37, Nico Lapierre. Okay, even if only one of the Toyota pits, you pit. If one of the Toyotas pits, you pit. Or if both, then you pit. Mixed message there is actually James Collado's radio instead, and uh, quite an insightful one as well. So that could be an interesting game of bluff and double bluff, couldn't it? Uh, what this has done, gentlemen, is it's thrown mixed strategy into the mix immediately. <laughs> yes. So we're not going to be in the situation that we, where we might be with a full green start to this race, where you've got a predictable cycle for the whole field in each of these classes, because LMP2 and GTE Am, we've seen about half the, the grid for each of them already down pit lane. Well, people who don't regularly watch this see inside there's a little thing there with a the yellow safety car message in it that's the the driver's safety system every single car has one it relays all the flag signals as the driver gets to them and messages from race control can be sent directly to that car too safety car remains out here at Le Mans in the centenary running we are 22 minutes in and on lap one an incident for the Action Express Cadillac of Jack Aitken that clattered into the barriers and the number 32 uh, LMP2 car from Inter Europol have brought out the safety car number of cars have gone in and out of the pit lane to fuel up and in a couple of cases make driver changes and Davidson people who are not used to endurance racing you might be going well why are they stopping for petrol if they don't need any i think american racing fans will always have the answer always take fuel when you can you just want to try to split the strategies up uh, the unfortunate thing at le mans is that you do have the three safety cars whether at some point they're going to merge or not is yet to be seen this time around but it's a nice idea to particularly for the lmp2 cars that have uh, amateur drivers as well. I was just looking at a replay there of Jack Aitken going into the barrier on that first opening lap. Yeah, the outside view confirms there was nobody close behind him, so it was in contact either with the number three car alongside with the yellow nose or anybody else. I just feel it could have been avoided, all of this and all of the this safety car period by seeing that it was wet there. They're all on slicks. I called it as, as straight away as soon as I saw how treacherous it was, but I think it needs a driver and a, a current driver to be there helping out as well to say, look, this is the safest thing to do, uh, to throw a full course, not full course, yeah, a, a slow zone. We have the beauty of that in the World Endurance Championship and the, the circuit is split into mini sectors to uh, accommodate that, to allow for that. And I just feel like all of the drivers would have been in agreement with, uh, with, with having that in place. It was, for me, it was the, it was a no-brainer, the safest thing to do. But uh, now we, it is what it is. We have a, a barrier repair going on, and the cars out there eager to get going again. And the, the, the good thing is with the slow zone is that the race carries on once you've passed that uh, that period of uh, of slow speed. You can go to the car 94 Peugeot, Nico Muller. Nico, we would like you to box this lap in case pit entry is opened. If pit entry is closed, stay out. Copy, I'll just follow the light. If it's not on, I box. Correct, this will be fuel only. Copy. So again, taking the opportunity while the safety car remains out to top up with fuel. Prepare for merging, pit entry is closed. Prepare for merging, pit entry is closed. So now, Nico Muller will get a message going, do not box, do not box, pit entry closed. Now, in one of the free practice sessions, the pit entry closed light was on for the entire session so that all the drivers would have a chance to see where it was, what it looked like, and then they'd have no excuses if they came in while it was closed. So now we're going to see, for the very first time, all sorts of history gets made of this race. This is another little facet of it. The first time we will merge the three safety car queues. Now, uh, safety car B has got a queue. Safety car C's queue has already been waved by, so they're between the chicanes on the Mulsan straight, ahead of the safety car that they were behind, and safety car B has waved its cars by as well. It's pulling in 
on the exit of Arnage now as safety car uh, C has pulled in at the first chicane. Right, so they will all join this long queue. Yeah, the differential between the cars, by the way, is you'll see on the B pillar of the car, the A, B or the C. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what's going to, going to happen. It needs to, be, B. needs to be more enormous for idiots with <laughs> poor eyes like me. Uh, but safety car B has now indeed pulled in. Uh, and just to explain, when they say pits are closed, while well, pits are open, uh, before the call to start the merge uh, begins, uh, the pit light, uh, exit light will be on until the next safety car passes by. You join the next available queue. As soon as the pits are closed, you will wait till the single safety car completes another lap. In other words, you'll lose a lap. Yeah. Now, I hope that everybody watching Trackside is either listening to Radio Le Mans on their, on their radios or Chris McCarthy, the English language uh, commentator here, who joins Bruno von der Steek and the rest of the French crew, because otherwise, I'll have no clue what is going on right now. OK, everybody's behind the safety car. Those guys are overtaking the safety car. That's not right. You can't do it, because this is brand new. We haven't used it all year long in the World Endurance Championship. We've never used it at the Mon. This is absolutely brand new. So if people... You know, haven't been reading all their briefing notes for the drivers, and they won't have because they're not drivers, then this is going to be quite confusing. Hold on tight, boys. Yeah, it's uh, for all the traditionists out there, used to the three car safety car rule, yeah. it's uh, it would be very confusing if you're just sitting in the grandstand uh, with, with no uh, commentary to tap into. But um, yeah, I'm excited to see this. Apparently, when they first tried this, did they Barcelona. try it? We tried it. We had it in Barcelona uh, in the drawing an LMS uh, race meeting. And uh, let's put it this way, there were some director's notes that came out of that. <laughs> it's not simple. I mean, when you, you're quite right, Martin. When you're used to doing something the same way over and over again, mm. however clear the instructions, the new ones can be missed. And, uh, and the other thing is, we're dealing with people mature enough in race control to understand that the way we thought it might happen might not be quite that easy. And there are tweaks. And there have been tweaks. And, and the other thing is, to make sure that everybody gets the message, repeat the message. It'd be really interesting, actually, to see on board what messages are coming through to the drivers in their safety systems? Four Absolutely. laps into the Michelin mediums on Nick Nielsen's car. Again, I think pretty much everybody started on mediums. At the moment, it'll say safety car, but I wonder if in, in a queue that's being passed around or waved by, whether you get a message saying pass SC or something, and then when you're in a queue here, my, if, my understanding is the instruction goes to the team yeah. through the timing screens, it's then for them to instruct their drivers appropriately. The responsibility yeah. is with entirely the team. the team. Let's listen to what's going on with Toyota. Okay, so I need a report on track condition again. Report on track condition. Yeah, seems to be uh, a lot drier. Still uh, a bit damp in uh, the first chicane. The rest seems to be dry. Copy that. And when you can again, on throttle, charging sock, 55 target. Okay. Did we send uh, a wrong map that I have to do that or not? On a roll map. Now, there are various... You can see when you look inside the cockpit, you see twiddly dials. That's the technical term, I think, isn't it, Andy? Twiddly dials on the wheel and a roll map, which is on the spokes, normally you have a sort of rotating thing. Many of your road cars will have that to, to go from fuel consumption to how many miles you've done and whatever else, convert to kilometres. And, and that's the same sort of thing. You, you'll often hear them giving them, you know, alpha 12, beta something or other, little commands to set traction control and fuel economy and so on. But when you need to get deeper into it, as he obviously does, to try and sort out the braking issue and the re the harvesting of, of electricity issue, then that's it in a sub-menu that's not necessarily immediately there. And it's good, you know, it's a luxury. They've got this time to do it. Imagine if they didn't have the safety mm -hmm. car. They would have been really fighting fires uh, real time at high speed yep. and would have been losing time, maybe even losing their, their brakes as well at points. So right. uh, very lucky. LMP2 and now start the drop back and here comes the Camaro. Now then, the Camaro is supposed to stop behind the LMP2 no, it'll, field. It'll drop again. Okay. It, it will so, be, so the, the, they will drop yeah. back the Camaro once this is complete. This Ooh. is... Now, we didn't see the 75 car had been into the pit lane. We didn't document that. That is now going to get to go by all of these cars and into the tail of the hypercar queue. I think That's 38, that, you mean. The 38. Jota. 38. Oh, sorry, thir what did I say? 75, yeah, 38, sorry. So LMP2 has dropped back to the back of the field. OK. Then? Then the same will occur. I believe we're then going to see the same happening with the NASCAR. 
and okay. then the GT, uh, the GTE AMS. And you can see all the LMP2 cars that have pitted going, oh, ah, right, I'm, I'm following that queue, because you can clearly see from yep. behind. You don't, may not know who it is, but you know what it is, right? Follow the LMP2 queue. Right, so they're all together. They'll then drop back in here. Now, the advantage of this in restarting a race is that you've effectively separated out the three races yep. into cars of a generally applicable pace. So it means that, that the madness that you sometimes see, safety cars breeding safety cars, should be less likely to happen. Yeah, mitigated. So That's the word yeah, I was searching you're, for. You're not starting the race leader behind 35 gentleman drivers in, in slower cars or, or even five gentleman drivers in slower cars. So safer for everybody and less likelihood that safety cars will materially and majorly affect the actual race in the classes. You're going to see the same happen. Car 24 now to do the drop pack exactly as we just predicted. What it means is you're not going to see the fabulous in-car shots of the likes of Fernando Alonso powering through loads of traffic yet. Well, number one, Fernando's not here, but there were some <laughs> epic, uh, epic in-car shots of that. But what we will see in just a few laps' time is them catching that train. Yes. They'll still have traffic, but it won't be quite as frenetic because they're in their own battle, uh, which they can control themselves, rather than the urgency to get through that traffic to keep with the queue. Now, as well as testing this out for real in the European Le Mans series in Barcelona, what other things do teams do to test things when they're not on a real racetrack? They go to the... Sorry, I was looking at something else. As well as testing this system in real life the in Barcelona, they go to the simulator. Yeah. And what do we now have in Le Mans racing? Uh, simulators. The virtual, virtual Le, Le Mans. Mans. Virtual Le Mans drivers yeah. have done several races rehearsing this with the race controller and with race director Eduardo Freitas. So, as well as the teams preparing for this on the sim, the race director has prepared for this on the sim as well, using some of the teams and drivers from the Le Mans Virtual Series. Got to be said, very effective, doing this very quickly. So we've had two of the pass sorry, the merge uh, parts of this, or the pass around parts of it, within a single lap. And I think yep. we're going to get close to getting the third done, because the 24 car is now getting towards the position it needs to be. And then we'll get, uh, carry on through with the GTE. Once the, f the field is under control, once it's in the correct order, we can go back to green flag running. So most of the time under safety car has been for the incident to be dealt with. Once the race direction are happy that that incident site is safe, they'll then go through the process we've just seen. One question, why wouldn't they drop back the GT cars first? Why have they done it, the LMP2 cars, and then the GT cars? Let me think that one through for a moment. Uh, there must be a reason, but I can't what? think of it for at the moment. Uh, other than the fact that what you've seen there is you've had a mixed batch of cars pitting, LMP2 and GT cars. It does help to sort that. The, it does help to sort that, so that actually what we're seeing is cars coming forward into that, into that queue, both in pace order as well as class order. And I still don't understand the answer to your question. Because they, the next move I'm sure we're going to see is the GT cars drop back, and that relieves the number 38 Jota to join the back yeah, of the, the hypercars. cars. Thinking it through, the answer is, if for whatever reason, including an early pit stop, you've got an LMP2 car in the middle of the GTE cars, that sorts that first. They'll then cycle back forward in front of the GTE cars. So the 43 car, for instance, is at a race with the LMP2 cars. It's in the middle of the GTM cars. This helps to order the LMP2 field first, and then you do the same with GTE naturally because there's no other cars in the in the mix for them. Yeah. And of course, once we get into real life racing where the first car in the queue is the first car that the safety car picks up because you want to neutralise the race instantly. It's not necessarily a hypercar or the hypercar leader or the race leader. Yeah. So all of that gets taken into consideration as well. What we're seeing here is that the hypercar was taken up first. The race leader was taken up first. Let's catch up with the Jota team. Louise Beckett down in the pit lane. I'm with Will Stevens from uh, Hertz Team Jota, number 38. Now, we've got a new safety car procedure. It wasn't great for you guys having to start at the back of the grid. Um, what happens now? That's what everyone's asking. Yeah, so basically, obviously, us starting at the back of the grid, um, 
this couldn't have been a more perfect time for us to have the safety car because the new procedure basically means that once um, they've done all their pass around on the drop backs, they'll be class by class. So now we've caught all the way back up to all the hypercars and we'll basically be at the back of the, the hypercar class. So um, if we were to create the perfect scenario, then we've had the perfect first 40 minutes of the race. So now we're fully back in the race, right behind the hypercar. So now it's game on and, and we can get back to what we know we're, we're going to do. Good stuff, thank you. Thanks, Jason. And a very telling point just made in my uh, offer by uh, and Davidson, and that is Ant. That they've also been able to top up with fuel as well in that 38 Jota. So it's an absolute win win and a brilliant bit of strategy. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. If you're way behind the hypercar, you're not going to lose. Nothing to lose at all. And it's been a, an absolute net gain for them. And, and the minute the safety car came out, fuel, 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 get him in. Some drivers have changed. And, and what I speculated about when we saw Francois Perodin getting in, Nico Lapierre has confirmed exactly the same that, that they have also had a pro driver start the race and try and keep the car in one piece and the moment a safety car came out okay great let's get our am driver in let's get a lower rated driver in let's get them in the car in the race just you know alive in this but start them off behind the safety car and uh, nothing to lose what that also means gentlemen is we are highly likely if we don't get dramas when this race goes back to green within the next hour or so that hertz team jota will lead this race um, also, we have been told on their uh, media channel that there is absolutely no problem at all with the number eight Toyota. Uh, it was just it was just said worried about settings in the, uh, behind the safety car. So all that talk about being hit on the side and doesn't look like there's much damage and what map is it in? Yeah, absolute standard stuff. Yeah. So as ever, there's been a, <laughs> yeah a discreet veil drawn over anything that might be of any interest whatsoever to anybody by the Toyota yeah. team. But this is, you know, racing driver's mind when you're in the lead as well. He, he's, he's very experienced and he's just flagging up potential issues. You know, it's better to do that. What's the next thing that could mm. go wrong? That's that's always the question you have to ask. Damage on the rear of the, that is 63, I think. Yep. There is Dorian Pat. That car has been hit or has had some, some kind of contact with the rear. And that is a, that's it's the light in the legality panel. And I think that's going to need to be fixed. They will probably get. Um, they will probably be to allowed to it. fix it at the next Safety stop. Car will come in at the end of this lap. Safety car will come in at the end of this lap. Right, 40 minutes ago, I stood up to start the race. I'm going to stand up to start the race, as <laughs> we didn't get. We only got one corner off three or four. <laughs> so we are getting ready to go back to green flag racing, and that means that the safety car driver will uh, race away ahead of field, Pedro Cachero. Well, uh, the great thing is we haven't had to explain how the safety car is going to work. <laughs> We've now seen it. Uh, what other was, new rules are there that might be applicable in the next that was, two minutes? That was pretty orderly. Yeah. That was pretty orderly. And, and, and with, with the incident cleared, by the way, done very quickly. Yes. Now, there, there was two things about that. First of all, it was bone dry and, and broad daylight, so everybody got to do it while they could see it. And secondly, it's also given them half an hour for that wet first chicane to dry up a bit, Ant. It has. I mean, it's, it's a bonus for that. But uh, what, what you're going to see is that the safety car will naturally only really come out when you've got a, t a barrier repair yeah. going on. It's, it, they're, they're not just going to throw it at, at any time. Please remind drivers, no overtaking before the line. No overtaking before the line. And again, that's a different rule in the IMSA WeatherTech series. When the track goes green, it's green everywhere. In FIA rules and here at Le Mans, you can only pass when you start the green lap. It's not green here. It will only be green once you get past the line. So that's a very different deal. And a different deal as well in that you don't have to stay within a certain length of the safety car. You can let that go. It peels off and it's the leader that dict now dictates the pace. So the entire hypercar field is nose to tail, barring the lapped Glickenhaus. It's on the back of the queue, but it is a lap behind. Then all the LMP2s, then all the GTE AMs. Race leader Sebastian Buemi brings us back to green, ahead of Nick Nielsen, Mike Conway in the second of the red and white Toyotas, then James Collado in the second all-red Ferrari. Felipe Nasa in the Porsche number 75, not staying right with the leaders at the restart. Well, he nearly was in amongst them as he outbraked himself at the first time of asking in the Dunlop curve. They all get safely through this time. They feel a little more strung out, uh, Anthony Davidson, than they were at the first start. So hopefully there should be no repetition of the bumping and boring at the start of this 24-hour race. Absolutely. I think they were much calmer 
this second time around. It's almost like you need to get the first one out of the way and reset. But uh, yeah, all cleanly through, as you say. Mike Conway was putting immense pressure on the Ferrari in front of him through that uh, the end of the first sector. But now Nick Nielsen's managed to get a little bit of a breather, and it's Mike that comes under the attack from James Collado. In the slipstream as they head down towards Turn 1, what's the uh, dampness situation going to be this time around? Side by side, one of the Porsches in the pack against one of the Peugeots are going to mark one piece of Le Mans history. Fastest lap of the race as we go back to green is the NASCAR. Four minutes and 57 seconds, 0.906. It won't stay for much more than another lap or so, but yeah. it's a nice to have. And that's, by the way, slightly better news, but better news for Jim France and what he's got happening on pit lane at the moment. So here we go, side by side battle, two Ferraris. 21 car with the yellow highlights and the red livery and then the JMW Ferrari and coming down the inside steaming down the inside comes one of the Dempsey Proton Stroke Proton Racing Porsches they're running Harry four Tingle. different cars with nearly identical liveries that is Harry Tingle in the number 88 car the teal uh, uh, dazzle livery car past the veteran number 66 the seven years here at Le Mans number 66 uh, JMW Ferrari 488. Tower Motorsport didn't get a lap in qualifying. They're involved in a clash with a 777 D station racing car. Their race is not getting much better. They've been given a, f a three minute stop and go penalty because of that incident in free practice one. That will now need to be served now that the race has gone back to green. And here comes the second Toyota again, Mike Conway. Hoving up behind Nick Nielsen and exactly as Sebastian Buemi did, going by in a straight line. So the, uh, the Ferraris look like they had good top speed in free practice. The Toyotas look like they've got very good top speed in the race. Toyota back to 1-2 after the first half a lap of racing from the safety car. It's interesting speaking to Kevin Esther on the grid and uh, in the number six um, Porsche, Penske Porsche, and he was saying, yeah, you know, we're quick in the Porsche curves, but the straight line speed of some of the others, and he named particularly the Ferraris, we can't quite match. But you've just seen there the Toyotas blasting past. And we haven't seen that all week so far. Mm. 75 car being warned about its earlier contact. It does look as though the 51 Ferrari, the car in fourth place, James Collado, might be looking to get by Niklas Nielsen in the 50 car. The first, those two red cars with the yellow stripes. Then the rainbow colours, that's the first of the Porsches, that's car number 75, that's fifth place Felipe Nasser, the blue-nosed black-tailed caddy, that's number two Earl Bamba. Then two more of the Porsches, those are both the Porsche Penske Motorsport cars, Christensen in the five, and the six, Lawrence Vantor, we just saw going by the Peugeot of Paul de Resta, about halfway around the lap. So Peugeot move, uh, uh, Porsche moving up. Cadillac at the moment sort of a little bit in stasis, not going anywhere fast with the number two car. And I think he's going to come under attack, Earl Bamba, in the next couple of laps. It's just a, it's a warning flag. It's going to go to 75 for Felipe Nazar's contact to the side of Seb Buemi at the start of the race. So no further penalty for that. We heard Seb talking in the car uh, about potential issues uh, arising from that, but no sign that's an issue at the moment. Race director has said that the 63 Prema Motorsport car that was trailing that bit of bodywork will need to repair it at the next pit stop. That will be just the tail end of the car removed. It will be a few seconds longer on pit road, but it's not a big repair. Laurent Pantor looking pretty racy in the number six Porsche here. Pulls out to go side by side with the number five of uh, Michael Christensen. Christensen not really keen on giving this one away. Meanwhile, the Ferrari coming back. This is Niklas Nielsen, the 50 car, having a look for second place. But through goes Lawrence Van Tour. And again now, Christensen under pressure because here's the Peugeot right behind of Scotsman Paul de Resta. He's got Nico Muller behind him. Then the yellow nose caddy. That's the number three car of Sebastian Borde. Here comes the Peugeot. Yeah, I think that Christensen could have been a little more elegant in the way that he let his teammate pass there into that first UK. And he kind of fought it too long got on the slippery stuff and now is potentially going to lose a position to De Resta, but it looks like he's just got the straight line speed to hang on to it to the yeah. second one. Even Andy Stevens, is. even Stevens in terms of straight line speed there, there wasn't it? Fascinating moment to see the comparison of performance between these two very, very different cars. And it's that difference that this new class is bringing to this field. And, and look day. how close they are. One sort of half think about a pass that didn't happen. And suddenly the two Peugeots have got the caddy of Sebastian Bourdais with that yellow nose 
all over the back of them. And again, that 50 Ferrari, Nick Nielsen sort of had a bit of a kind of a little look at Mike Conway. It didn't happen, but he was offline and he's lost, you know, half a second to three quarters of a second. He dropped three or four car lengths further back. And this is, this is why this class is going to be so fascinating because there's... The cars are all totally different, and yet they're so similar in the performance window. Gallardo's having a look. He's having a look at Nielsen on the inside of Indianapolis, but thinks better of it. And I think there must be a headwind at that part of the track because he got a pretty decent run out of Molsang Corner. And then before they got to an Indianapolis, he was right there behind his teammate. So I think that headwind helps to aid the slipstream. Well, his teammate, Nick Nielsen, in the first of Ferraris, is getting a little toe off the, off the Toyota in front. And, of course, Collado is getting a double toe because he's getting a bit of a toe off, the, off both cars in front. So he's going even quicker in a clear air. And, again, he's looking once more. Collado's not happy as he's flashing the headlights at his teammate. We've heard him get pretty feisty in Portimao. Uh, I think it was fighting Nielsen as well then, back then as well, wasn't it, come to yeah. think of it? So uh, no love is lost between these two. <laughs> and I'm sure no better place to uh, prove who's the fastest driver within your team once and for all at this big race. Well, one of the bits of perspective you brought to the WEC coverage every race uh, and is the fact that it's not been a formation uh, uh, race for the Totas when they've had limited uh, opposition. And it certainly isn't the case for Ferrari, where you've got an awful lot of players here with a lot of pressure on them with this historic new programme. And you certainly sense, don't you, they're looking to see where they are in the pecking order. It's probably worth, if I was in, in charge at Ferrari at the moment, probably worth just having a look to see what speed collado has got. Yeah. You can swap them back afterwards. You know, obviously the race is long, but you don't want to be wasting time at any opportunity. Look at Buemi making a break for it out in front. Just see what your other driver can do. And Graham, that takes us to Toyota's rule. If you get on the radio and whistle up the team and say, I'm quicker, they will wave you by and you've got two laps to clear off. And if you don't, back in the queue. It's a great discipline. By the way, change in the order for Hypercar, and that's a position gained by Hertz Team Jota. We said they'd cycle back round, uh, thanks to that strategic call to bring the car in. Up to 13th position ahead of the number uh, number four Floyd Van Walker, top deal man, and Antonio Felix da Costa now right on the rear of Frank Meyer in the lead of the two clicking house. Here comes the number two Cadillac, that's the blue nose of Earl Bamba looking up behind the second of those three Porsches. Porsche currently running fifth, sixth, and eighth, and the caddy having a sniff at the tail of Lawrence Van Tour. He had got a backer, actually, of Michael Christensen. He had got ahead of Christensen. Christensen's got back past him. And now Bamba dropping back into the clutches, the 75 car. Lardo's coming. His teammates even thinking about defending there. Oh, don't do that. Come on, guys. Matty Pregliasco, the team manager, needs to make sure that the drivers are working together. You can't fight each other. Yes, you can't win the race unless you beat your teammate, but all six drivers and everyone in the crew want Ferrari to win Le Mans. That's what this is all about. Ferrari wins Le Mans is the only headline that anybody cares about. Counting full green flag laps now, 15 minutes into this race, the top 13 cars separated by 9.2 seconds. This is what we've wanted. This is what it's beginning to live, deliver. It's going to get better still. Ferrari looks like it's just starting to switch on their, that, those tyres, those Michelin medium tyres coming into it now. Now, what's Nielsen going to do? He's pretty close to Conway. He's in the slipstream, but I don't think he's going to be able to attack him into that corner. But Collado, to me, looks like he's slightly got an advantage over his teammate. And uh, but it's, it's now is the time. If the team aren't going to help you out, now's not the time to have a hot head. You know, you've got to keep reminding yourself what a long way there is to go and anything can happen. Now's not the time to start damaging your car. So if the team don't make the change happen, you go to plan B, which is to sit back, sit in the slipstream, let your engine do less, save fuel. Now, talking about Hertz Team Jota, they've already topped up and they're still on the lead lap. They're still in the lead queue. If this and stays... that means they will go out, they will already be racing longer when everybody else comes into the They pit. will lead if this stays green. Yeah. They will lead if this stays green. Extraordinary uh, vision from a, a, a team first time in the top class. We know how good they are. You know more than anybody how good they are. And Davidson 
uh, able to give you everything you need in terms of information, guidance and strategy. And that's a cracking call from uh, Steve Jota. And it's exactly what the Americans would do in racing. Every opportunity, there's only two rules in American racing, track position, take fuel at every opportunity. And if you haven't got track position, take fuel make it work for you and, and the, Will Stevens said this is the most perfect start to the race you could have for a car that started on the back of the grid and he was absolutely right they could not have paid enough money to get that safety car in lap one it really helped them so Paul Day on pit lane in the number three Cadillac now that's uh is that early that has to be a problem it must be early if they've been uh, with 35 minutes uh, behind the safety car well, well if we'd been green from the start he would still be going in three laps at least early because they should do at least a dozen laps all three-way battle in gte falcon horse going by the iron dames the tires are soft they will struggle with tires start to put some pressure on them we want to put some pressure on toyota they are on soft they start to struggle i think we I think we might need to double check that when we looked at pictures of the car on the grid I'm sure we saw M on the side of the Michelin's now because they're rotating at speed It's hard to tell we don't have full colored sidewalls. We do have a little colored tab on them and but there's the graphic. He's absolutely right the number two uh, no, second place number seven to it is on soft tires and Really? Well, I mean maybe Toyota decided to do what they did in Spa start on the soft tyre when there's wet on the track, but he's under massive pressure now with Mike Conway, so it all completely makes sense that that's why the Ferraris look stronger. Oh, Mike hanging on in there. I thought he was just going to let him slip past, but I mean, this is the point of the race where Mike's got to get his elbows out and put a halt to that Ferrari's pace. Now their medium tyres have switched on. But how long is the soft going to last? We know from Michelin, here we go, both Ferraris looking to go by in the same move. First it's Nick Nielsen, then James Collado. We know from Michelin, they expect the medium to at least triple stint, very likely quad stint. So they're probably going to be on these till sort of seven in the evening. Alpha 6, 11, Alpha 6, 11. Seb is looking after the tires. Are you doing a good job? Uh, that, that, I'm guessing, is just keeping back, and he's not managed to do that. Through goes Nick Nielsen into second place. The young Danish driver who's won a title with either or uh, AF Corsa and Ferrari every year since 2018. That Toyota's got a lot of top line speed on the straight, yeah. isn't it? So Conway what he was really fighting for that, wasn't he? What he was trying to do was be smart and stick behind Nielsen to put himself at less of an attack from the, uh, the threatening Ferrari behind. So he played that pretty cleverly, but they're fighting a losing battle here. If they're the only ones on a soft tyre, they're going to start falling further and further behind, and Seb doing the best he can to well, preserve those softs. Look at the queue of traffic behind him. It's like Seb's... Well, uh, no, now that my, Seb's gone, it's like Mike Conway's towing a caravan. He's just got a long queue of cars behind. You I are. mean, he's not that slow, but, but everybody is now bunched up. They have dropped the Porsches. The Porsches are all now running line astern, 5th, 6th and 7th. They've got ahead of the caddy of Earl Bamba, then the two Peugeots, then her team Jota. I mean, they're all queuing up to have a go, and Seb Wemby is trying to race away. Hopefully he's cured his, his regen problems with that front axle and, and is getting the full power. Otherwise, he'll have to Jake come in into the pits. pits early. Split strategy from Ferrari. Did they set them off on not full tanks? That's early, 10 laps. And we were, we were expecting car. 12 lap stints, and they have been behind the safety car for half of those 10 laps. And they're splitting the strategy, come what may, aren't they? We heard, remember, the uh, instruction to the Ferrari driver if the uh, Toyota pits, you, you follow him, didn't get to that point. The 50 car comes in. Only fuel, only fuel. Yeah, that makes sense, because on the medium tyre, you only do the fuel, you keep them going. We're expecting they can comfortably, the medium tyres, do three stints. But I'm still perplexed as to why they're in so early, uh, particularly under the safety car. But don't forget, it was that car that started on pole. Maybe they wanted to make sure that it had a chance of staying at the front. 51, here comes James Collado. This is for second place. Trying to get round the outside of the Toyota, Mike Conwin. He, if he opens the door, the Porsche is coming in as well. Felipe Massa, and behind him, Lawrence Van Tour, and behind him, in the three identical Porsches, Michael Christensen. 
Uh, yep, yeah, Porsche right there, and another Porsche absolutely flying at the moment. The uh, fastest lap of the race goes to the number 38 car, now into the top 10 in the hands of Antonio Felix da Costa. They're gonna, not waiting for this to cycle back to them, they're going for it right now. Last year when he was racing the 38 Jota in LMP2, he was announced as a Porsche factory driver for their Formula E team. Now he's a Porsche hypercar driver okay, as well. We see you're doing a good job on tire energy, protecting the fronts more than bike in high speed. Good job, mate. Can we get feedback on the tires when you can? Yeah. What is the bike doing tire energy compared to me? Such a calm head there for Sebastian Buemi. Unusually really doing so. a good job looking after those tyres. He knows exactly what he's doing. He works obviously with the, the Red Bull racing team in Formula One, and it's all about tyre preservation in that category. So he's using his experience wisely there to uh, put himself in the best possible scenario on those softs. Well, one of the things Mike's doing to keep his tyres alive is sit in the slipstream of the fastest Ferrari. Number 13 Tower Motorsport LMP2 car has not done a stop and go penalty and has now been reported to the stewards and that may result in a black flag. That is a major, major failure. Look at the energy level. It's just below about the halfway mark in the number seven Toyota. Again, you can see full throttle being applied here. Drivers are very rarely on anything other than full throttle or full brake. And he's sitting in the slipstream now behind the 51 Ferrari of James Collado, who's in second place. Porsche's queuing up behind, then the Caddy, the Peugeot, they're all in the tow. And the leaders are from second down, there is not more than about six tenths between any of these cars. What am I missing here that I don't understand why they pitted that car? I don't understand why fuel... I can understand if we were within a lap or so of the fuel window, but we weren't. They are splitting the strategy for some reason we do not understand, and they're splitting it by a very long margin. Yeah, they really are, because you can see everybody else had sort of about 40% of the energy left, Anthony, which means that actually not, not only is this not going to be a 12-lap stint, which we would have had probably under green, of course, there's a, a lap to get to the grid, so normally your first stint is at least a lap shy of what a normal race stint would be, but he's done six green flags laps rather than 12, and that seems, yeah, strange. It doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, they must be sticking to their strategy, some kind of a strategy, splitting the two cars, perhaps, in terms of strategy. Uh, it didn't seem like there was any problem with the car. The fuel just went in normally. Uh, but we all saw the graphics when it came up, the energy graphic, like I said, Martin, all around the, the 38 to 40 percent mark. So why would you hit when you've got still a, a plenty, you know, plenty okay. of energy still remaining? Two reasons. It's not about the fuel. There was something else. And the other reason, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't about the fuel because, as you say, you know, <laughs> Unless there's a safety car now, he's half a lap behind the leaders rather than three or four car lengths behind second place. That, it does seem that there must have been another reason. The number three caddy of Sebastian Bordeaux was in very early as well. well. To give an indication of how far out of their window they are, we're now getting the cars that didn't stop under the safety car from LMP2 stopping. And we know they, on a regular WC circuit, could do about 40, 42 minutes. The hypercars go further. Always do. They're mm. way outside the window. Yeah, I'm not sure what was going on with that. The only information we get for Ferrari was the standard stop for fuel, but it wasn't standard. We are one hour into the 24 hours of Le Mans. We've broken the back of this thing, boys. We're, we're pretty much there now. An hour in, we've already had our first safety car, first view of the new rules here regarding the safety cars. Three become one, and then we shuffle the field all right back into the... We stack the jacks at the front and, and, and keep the low cards at the back. I thought you were talking about the Porsches there. Three <laughs> become one, because if they couldn't get any closer, could they? They really have been in, in team formation, and sticking with them, by the way, uh, is the lead, the only undelayed of the Cadillacs. And look behind there, that's Team Jota uh, getting back in the mix. The two Porsches are hanging in there way quicker than we've, uh, we've uh, been expecting them at this point. That's got to be good news for that programme. And the two Glickenhaus is not out of this either. Yeah, I mean, we haven't given uh, Paul DiResta or any of the, the Peugeot drivers much attention this year because it's mostly been revolving around their reliability or lack of. 
but they've got to sing their praises. Both drivers doing a great job, particularly Paul de Resta uh, in P8 at the moment. He's really not letting that gaggle of cars go in front of him, just seven tenths behind the Cadillac of El Bamba. Yeah, great stuff. Looking back down through the classes, by the way, in GTM, it is the F Corsica on the hands of Davide Rigon. It is Rigon from Cairoli from Alessio Picariello. That's the 1 2 3. Rexy, second at Le Mans. The Dinosaur Livery Project 1 AO Porsche 911 RSR, second place in the hands of Alessio Picariello. Uh, the hands of Matteo Caroli, rather, with Picariello in the Iron Links number six to the bright yellow car third. But they can't take our eyes off this stellar battle in hypercar change in just a moment in the voices you're going to hear delighted that very shortly we'll be welcoming back uh, first time in a few years to race coverage here at the Le Mans 24 hours to a familiar voice to many tv and radio broadcasts of this great race from the past Seb Hoyby leads fastest lap of the race now goes to James Collado the gap is coming down 4.1 seconds Gallardo in the number 51, Ferrari 499P. Uh, Jim Roller, welcome back. We're going to have a listen in, in a moment to uh, in car from Toyota because he races. Okay, Seb, three laps to go this then three laps to go, fuel limited. So, so that, fuel limited. Yeah, that is how long the stint should be for these cars. Jim, you've been watching this develop. We've come through, OK, a frustrating, but an, an edu uh, educational period with the uh, safety car. Ooh, as yes. This time, it's per a Porsche on Toyota. Take yep. us through it. Yeah, he had a great run around uh, Tetra Rouge, and uh, I don't know what happened to Mike Conway on the exit, but the move looks like it's going to be pretty set into that first chicane. A nice run that uh, 75 had there. Has he used up those tires so much that he can't get any power now? Perhaps, I think you're right, Jim, it's the, the fronts that are going off, that's yeah. why we heard from yeah. Wemi saying, how about Mike's fronts, what's happening, give me some more information, and sure enough, Tetra Rouge, a front limited corner, by that I mean the fronts are slipping away from you, quite literally as you go through that high speed corner, and Mike just couldn't get down on power as much as the, uh, as, as soon as Felipe Nasser could. Is there any chance, also Anthony, that maybe the Ferrari's dialed back a little bit for reliability? Is the Ferrari, uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't think so. I, okay. I still stand by what I said in qualifying in the hyperfold that the Toyota should have been much closer yeah. to the Ferrari. That it was due to the uh, the red flags that we had there. So here comes the number five Porsche, now of Michael Christensen, on the back of Mike Conway. He ducks to the inside before Molsan Kink. Conway resists. Who's going to have this corner when they get to it? He backs out of it does the number six, Carl Lohan Van Tour, sorry, not Christensen. The three of them still running so close together. Leader in traffic now, and that is helping James Collado to close the gap. It's 3.2 seconds now. New fastest lap of the race goes to the chasing Seb Bourdais, an early pit stopper. But good grief, this is four, five, six cars contesting significant positions, getting into the second hour of the centenary running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. This is epic. This is proper hypercars. This is what we wanted to see. I mean, we've longed for this time, haven't we, when we can see competitive, a, a competitive field of hypercars. I mean, this, this is anyone's right now. And the other thing that I noticed when I was watching in the first hour is the fact that there is no margin for error. No. If you make a mistake, because this field is so closely bunched, if you make a mistake trying to make a move on the guy in front of you, all of a sudden your mirrors are full of not one, but two or three other competitors. And here we go again, going into Porsche curve. Now this is where it gets really fun, or not, depending on which situation you're in as a driver. <laughs> you're coming up against the GT cars, and you've got to get through them cleanly, efficiently, but also take absolute risk when you need to, because that gives you lap time. And this is where Hypercar again throws in a different dynamic. You've not got the additional punch we had in LMP1 days. You've got to measure those passes very carefully indeed and be very sure you're past that car. Yeah, one thing we used to have in the LMP1 days was the boost of the hybrid was on top of the internal combustion right. energy. Yes, yes. So now the problem is that they have is it's much harder to overtake cars from a similar speed because you can't play with that additional power. It's just there in unison, comes in combined with. It's just part of your integrated power and it's not on top of what you have. When you get the hybrid boost, the ICE level, the internal combustion uh, power, 
drops, so you always remain at the same power level. Right, for old farts like me, that's almost like back in the day with the 935, just dialing in a little more turbo. Wheel. There you go. Yeah. So they're, they're, the maximum uh, potential that they have is 520 kilowatts oh, of power. Oh, trouble for... That's the, that's 18, that's the 16 proton. car. That's, that's the 16, the 16 car. yep, the Proton competition. So that car Richard started... Richard Hardwick behind the wheel of that car, the American uh, getting back underway. Yeah, so he's got away with that, and uh, away he goes. It's the yellows at Marshall's post three, just for, for that car to recover to the track. Set board eight, still pushing on and pushing hard. He's rejoined the train of hypercars, 14th now for the Cadillac that has pitted. Still making his way up the order, by the way. Antonio Felix de Costa up to ninth place overall now. We have seen some pit stops also in the LMP2 category as Alpine team elf uh, Charles uh, Malesi behind the wheel of the 36 car now leads the class. And in GTE Am, it's the Project One portion number 56 with uh, Matteo Caroli behind the lead. Yeah, that's going to be a quiz question, isn't it? When was the last time a dinosaur led to the Le Mans 24 hours? The that's answer right. is in that's 2023. Rexy. Fantastic stuff. The 36 car, by the way, leads courtesy of it being one of those LMP2 cars that opted to pit under the safety car. So they came in fuel only. They've taken effectively the same advantage that uh, Hertz Team Jota are going to do in just a couple of laps time. There's the uh, Tower Motorsports car. They he had the penalty earlier. They're in trouble. Yeah, they're, yeah. this is going to be a long day for them. I have a yeah. suspicious feeling. I'm impressed by uh, Antonio Felix da Costa in that Hertz Team Jota car 38. We know he's carrying more fuel than the cars in front of him because they're, they're the only ones that stopped when we had the safety car. Of course, we've had uh, the Ferrari uh, number 50, uh, 50 stop as well since that, but they're behind the number 38 Jota. And, uh, you know, da Costa is he's starting to close in on Bamba, Christensen, Vantour, Conway, the cars in front of him. He's passed the first, the Peugeot's, and he's caught yep. Paul de Resta. So it's an epic run here from Antonio Felix da Costa. On the screen now is Rexy, as uh, he's uh, well clean name. That's the uh, AM leader, that's the Porsche. And the Rexy comes from uh, the Hyatt's daughter wanted to see a T-Rex on the car, so that's what the teeth are, and they got the little Rexy arms on the door. And here is our overall leader, Sebastian Buemia. He has driven a phenomenal first that stint is. here. Really, really impressive stuff. He's opened the gap to Mike Conway. They're usually nose to tail, those two. Buemi, this is an absolute masterclass in how you preserve tyres when you're not on the, the correct compound for these conditions. He's out there in front and you can see the difference between how he's played this compared to the sister car. Yeah, okay, the balance might be slightly different as well. We've seen the two cars during this season have a bit of a difference in performance as Conway is now into the pits. He's clearly not happy with those soft tyres. I wonder what they're going to do. I suspect a set of M's are going to go on that bit. And then get the car completely out of strategy. With that, do you do a driver change as well when you go for the tyres? You probably would. Is this just a single stint or are they going to commit to staying on these uh, these soft tyres. There's no sign of a driver change, so I'm going to say how much it's of a just risk fuel. Is that? How much of a risk is that? He's only going to go, I mean, he's holding on, of course, to a, a position somewhere near the front of the field, but this is going to be a long, painful second stint coming up for Mike. Yeah, and it's, and, it, and it's cumulative. That's the thing about decisions now that become cumulative that you have to make up for them later. And it's only going to get worse once you stack a whole load of extra fuel. All that weight goes in uh, around a, another Looks four. Like they're they're waiting with tires. They're waiting with tires. Yeah, they're waiting with tires. There they go. They're going to leave him in, but change the tires. So he'll do a, a triple stint. The tire only did one stint, and then now he's going to go on the double with the mediums. There you go. That makes sense. Also on board here with the number 94 Peugeot, Nico Muller, after his first stint. Nick Nielsen cycles round and now ahead of the number seven Toyota. We have that earlier pit stop. And still, this battle goes on. I love this graphic to show any amount of energy left. This is not how much fuel is left. This is how much energy the car has left, both with fuel and with the amount of energy the regen will develop while that fuel is used. Really interestingly then. So yeah, look, Felipe Nasso using an awful, almost double the amount of total energy compared yes. to his teammates. Yeah. A bit yeah. too, uh, is that oh, not? He's, he's been <laughs> mashing the throttle pedal a little bit too aggressively. He's getting a bit carried away he's there. He's going to have he? a cramp. He's been <laughs> mashing top, that gas. <laughs> top 
eight in this race still with an hour and 11 minutes elapsed uh, still within 14 seconds of the lead uh, that is exactly what the plan should be for hypercar moving forward. my next off shift i think i'm going to dig and see how many race cars have finished on the lead lap in, in this race in the past well we could just break that record if the uh, Le Mans god smile on us so let's just catch up uh, well we'll uh, catch up with uh, lmb2 when we've had the, the pit stop cycle we, uh, work its way through. The Toyota Kazoo Racing, Seb Buemi, completely correct, by the way. Uh, James Collado closed right back in as they came into the first batch of traffic. But Seb Buemi has executed that beautifully. Uh, that gap back out to 5.6 seconds now. They've uh, completed 14 laps of this race, 35 minutes of which, as we're going to see, a problem. Oh, just a catch there. For, is that the 31 or the 41? That's no, a 31. 31. Uh, he's at the lead. That's our uh, LMP2 leader at this point. So what can Felipe Nasser do to save a bit of total energy? Has he got, did he have slightly less fuel on board because they're going to pit him first? I should assume that was their strategy because you don't want to go holding up with a car with three, uh, a team with three cars. You don't want to be pitting all together, of course. Oh, you yeah, want to try right. and separate, right. uh, particularly if they're out of sequence in terms of where their pit box is. Yeah, he's down to three percent now. First pit stop on the way for the and NASCAR 24. Traffic. Always risky when you follow your teammate through or another car through uh, a, a, a lapped car. You've just got to put a lot of trust in the car. They see one car passed. Do they turn it off? Has there? come into the pits. Yeah. Eight, 75. 75 and 93. Plus the two Cadillac all on pit lane. Ferrari lead Le Mans. For now. Haven't said that in a long time. And he's going to be due in Sue. He's soon. He's down to uh, 55 percent. Uh, James Collado is in that AF Corsa. Ferrari, there's the Peugeot in the pits. Now, do they leave Buemi on those soft tyres? He's been doing a great job. Remember, as Martin Haven just popped in and uh, told me when I, uh, I went off, off air for a while, he said they've got to see those soft tyres again yes, at some they point have. in the race. Yes, 100% they do. We'll, we'll get into tyre allocations uh, rather deeper into this race, but they absolutely do. And watching the, the gaps here, James Collado, who will be uh, down pit lane shortly, 3.6 seconds to the good ahead of the two battling factory Porsche Penske Motorsport uh, cars, but a really impressive stint in this group is the car that's now running in fourth. We will not have to pit at the same time. And that is Antonio Felix da Costa, under eight seconds off the lead, pitted on the safety car. None of the other leading uh, hypercars did so and will cycle around and will become our fourth leader of this race. We've got uh, double yellow flags being shown at the circuit at the moment. Can't see exactly what's going on at Marshall's post 13, which is between, so the exit. It's, of the, it's just past the exit of the first chicane. We'll keep uh, an eye on that rim if someone's had a moment. It's uh, all over and done with. Hour and 15 minutes in, just 22 hours and 46 minutes to go. It's separated just slightly now between those two. Uh, Porsche teammates, the car six, car five, they're the regulars of the World Endurance Championship. Car 75 has got the driver lineup, uh, which competes in the IMSA Championship. Yeah, that's car four, Floyd Van Wilkenhart. It's been struggling for pace, but it's still staying ahead of the LMP2 battle. A uh, big flame at the rear of that car on startup. It's nice to see the Penske Porsches running further up the field now yeah you know, they, they are part of this uh, they're part of this fight for overall big I didn't think they would be uh, based on the knowledge of what we've had so far this season what we've seen from the car Kevin Estra was saying the car feels so much better to drive around this circuit compared to what we've what we've been used to uh, up to this point so that's really nice to hear and it's nice for us as well to see well and let's face it as well I think that most of these cars have been designed first for this place 100 percent it's all yeah of course you come back this is your 75th anniversary if you're porsche you know what better way than to be super competitive and try and win outright uh, this year uh, we're talking about pit stop strategy and execution in the pit lane as well uh, there's been a variety of things happening here with driver changes and with with tire changes one thing that absolutely has happened is the number 50 ferrari has jumbo totus ah Ooh, the old 
So Nick Nielsen currently running in fifth position and is the first of the pit stoppers behind that Hertz team Jota car that will be the last to stop. In come the remaining two. No, they don't come and, in. And the Jota. And the Jota. Now, but why has that happened? The Jota has got 46%. Is that no? No, he's down to 3%, according to the graph. Uh, did they short fuel the car? They may have. Don't yeah, understand that's, that's, that. That's bizarre. Yeah. Unless they're going through energy, you know, using a bit more uh, electrical energy. Who knows? But uh, here are the two Porsches. That's what I was talking about. You've got separate pit boxes in the right. World Endurance Championship. Unlike uh, Formula One, right. you have to share the same one and other series around the world as well. So you have to be in sequence when you come into the pits. Otherwise, it gets all a bit awkward. You yes, have to be like so it, this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, this this was right. Car number six in front of the car number five, oh. and they followed each other in in that order. Ah, um, what gets very a bit complicated? Good point. That's an excellent. You don't want to. That's why they pitted 75 earlier as well. Yep. Oh, is that Mike Conway getting yep. down the inside of the Peugeot into the uh, second corner? Just using. Of course. Just using those Michelins. Of course, Graham. They were always going to get jumped to the pits by this car we see on screen because yes. they did the tire change on the Toyota and they would have kept the mediums uh, on the Ferrari. Right. So this is our new race leader, Nick Nielsen, leads Le Mans from Sebastian Bourdais, the other car that pitted early, remember, the number three Cadillac. So now is that why we now see what was the uh, the Cadillac strategy seeing? Of course, the Ferrari 50 was uh, it was a, a bit of a benefit to stop earlier because then you can. It's not just the undercut. Well, it is an extreme undercut because you're not out there lapping slower GT cars as well. Yeah, so it's not about a, it's not about traffic. A, it's not about a tire undercut coming in because they kept the same tire on. It's the traffic undercut. Oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> and confusing. <laughs> yes, but that this is part of it. It's, 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 it's always been a little bit of a cerebral sport, hasn't it? Here's Sab Bourdain, by the way. He's not far back from... Uh, it's two and a half seconds that all of a sudden the lead battle is not Toyota and Ferrari. It's not uh, Ferrari and Porsche. It's Ferrari and Cadillac. And that explains it because, yeah, Bourdain stopped before the Ferrari 50, so proves the point I was trying to make. Yes. And he had even longer to be out there with a free yeah. track with no traffic good luck winning an internet battle about cynicism about this uh, about this formula <laughs> well if you are then look you're at just this not watching now look at this you've got the two porsches the toyota and a peugeot one all two coming out three of four five six seven eight nine all right there in the same shot unbelievable in, in three and seconds amazing stuff we're going to need more of these energy graphics the yes. longer we watch this yeah, race because they are, they're all out of sequence. Well, most of them are out of sequence. Here comes the Jota having a look down the inside. How cheeky is that? The plucky Jota team with Antonio Felix da Costa at the wheel trying it on with the, uh, with the big boys of the, the main team. Yeah, they're taking names up there, aren't they? And this is great stuff. The team, something else we're going to need is a lot more coffee because <laughs> I'll tell you that nobody off shift is going to want to leave this booth. Here comes Conway. He goes to the outside of the 38 Jota. Can he make this one stick? It's going to be a brave move if he can. He does it. He does. He carried a lot of speed under braking, didn't he? Oh, the last yeah, of the late break, great late breakers. Mike Conway takes the uh, position on the exit of Molson. And it's exactly what you said earlier on, Jim. It's all because of what happened in the previous corner with Antonio trying it on. on the point. He got yeah. himself a little bit out of line. And, you know, uh, when you're looking forward, suddenly you, you're going backwards and Conway's at it again. He's not done yet on the run down to Indianapolis. Mike Conway takes another position. That is going to move him up to eighth, I think. New tires, so don't forget, guys. Wow, that's new tires. He's got that huge, fun. huge advantage. <laughs> <laughs> huge advantage. Uh, that's why he could break later as well into Molson. Ah, great point. Better traction. You know, he's just got that, the new tire effect right now. It is clean as a whistle as well. We've had a little bit of a brush here and there, but fantastic wheel-to-wheel -wheel action between cars from multiple teams with multiple makes. It is trains of two, three, four, five, six cars throughout. Okay, going to replay oh. here. Oh, hello. That shouldn't be happening. Got, got a little uh, bump from behind there. That was the Glickenhaus getting tagged by the number 60. Ferrari. 708 car, by the way, that started a lap down is now beginning to make its way up through the GTM field. So it is coming up the order. So we've got 14 undelayed um, 
hypercars. Still the 311, I'm afraid he's in the garage after that uh, incident for Jack Aitken. So, did they keep those the same tyres on Buemi? I'm guessing they did, because he's so far ahead of Conway still. I reckon he was doing such a good job on those soft tyres that they've kept him on them. The pit stop seems to indicate he changed tyres. Minute and 26, 58 seconds is a fuel stop. I think yeah. he's changed all four. Probably did. That, that's what I'm taking from that. Unless there was some other com uh, complexity in that pit stop, that's about a full uh, full four-tyre stop for Sebuemi around that time. Okay. Something like 10, uh, 10 seconds quicker for two. Here we go. This is the lead. Cadillac are going to the lead at the Le Mans 24 hours. Well, no, it's car no, 50 it's in the lead, isn't apologies. it? Apologies. Yeah, I've got the lead. It's another Cadillac Ferrari fight. This time around, they get oh so close, does Bam, but... It's the battle for fourth, fifth, sixth. <laughs> the two horses. <laughs> and look at... But the, 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 the driver... holds sway through the first chicane. The driver that's coming up on them thick and fast is Conway, Conway. of course, on those brand new tyres. Conway is flying here, isn't he? He's gonna, he's gonna, he, he wants to be part of this. There's a move side by each around the Aston Martin, the GTM car. Oh, oh there's touch. a touch. Yeah, that there's was our first. Uh, that was a bit of a biff. Yep, that's so, a the perfect, perfect description there. Collado wow. hangs on to it for now, but uh, that uh, the Cadillac of Bamba's looking pretty quick, especially the straight line speed. Conway ducks out to the left-hand side. Is he going to make a repeat move that he did on Felix da Costa a lap ago? Oh, yeah. Looks a bit easier yeah. this time. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, only this time he's made it look a lot easier. Round yeah, the folks happy because the uh, I think the two car got around the six. Slower lap, by the way, as we're watching this group. Slower lap for the leader. And Seb Bourdais is now 1.1 seconds off the lead. So ahead of this group, there is further epic action in this hypercar class. Yeah, if this racing isn't good enough for you, folks. Hang on a sec. Bamba's <laughs> under attack. <laughs> really good stuff. Bamba's under attack here from the, uh, the number six of uh, Lauren Van Tour. Soon to be looking in his mirrors because Mike Conway is coming up. Yeah, this hour brought to you by our partners. Well, and oh my God, <laughs> absolutely fantastic action. They come past the 37 LMP2 car, car that uh, made an early stop to switch to the bronze driver. When, when, when you're getting past like that, when it's one or two cars, it's one thing. What when it's a whole train? What is that like? You beat me to it, Jim. Absolutely beat me to it because you know LMP2 drives and GT drivers are more than used to dealing with the odd hypercar coming past you, uh, but not a whole freight train of cars. So uh, this is a new experience for them, definitely. Imagine the poor spotter still there. There's another one. <laughs> oh, wait, yep, one more, yep. Yeah, imagine nope, that, yep. yeah. Still okay. one more, one so more. So you've got seven cars coming up on you through the Porsche <laughs> Cup. <laughs> oh. Give me a break. Astonishing stuff. What an hour of action we've had since that safety car. There was that Apple touch. Yep. There was that there, touch that you spotted, Graham. Yeah. And, and just think, we've got two, 22 and, and a half hours more of this. Outstanding. Yeah, so I'm what you're seeing on screen there, folks, is second, is fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. I'm going to have to get my head around the, the differences, the subtle differences of the Porsche's liveries, because uh, I can't tell their numbers on, on this screen look, we've got look, in front. Well, they've got the... Uh, Shape uh, bands. I always yeah. use the... I always use the uh, the windscreen. The, the windscreen. The colored wind. Uh, one so black, the, one the black, black is, yeah, the black one is black, black, five. And six is red. Or it's 75 no, is five is red. 75 yeah. is red. Five 75 is red. <laughs> and, and six is white. As easy as that, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. There you go. Easy there you see six is white. Then there's a Toyota. And then 75 is red. And the black five windscreen is the five. Just do what Cadillac do. That's the example. <laughs> I know, that's the number two. The, the, the blue one. Blue I, was, was two. I was talking to our great friend, Andy Blackmore, who uh, showed uh, a few ideas of what this could have looked like if you'd chosen the three liveries. Maybe the fans could have picked those iconic liveries, but it doesn't take away from the action because he's absolutely astonishing. Oh, in the oh this is huge oh. news. 
Huge news, the number 33 Corvette going back into the garage area. That's, uh, I think Ben Keating started the race. Is he still in the, in the car? The Katzberg. Graham? Uh, uh, just checking that, because I was just putting something else on top of the scoring. Bad news for GM as that car comes in. Good news for GM as the 311 rejoins the race. Ah, fantastic. Great work by the by the Action Express guys to get that car back out onto the race, that car that brought out our first caution. Nicky Katzberg brought that car in. And the Action Express car rejoins with Jack Aitken back at the wheel. Now it's gonna be also very interesting to see as these guys work traffic, how quickly they can re close back up on each other when traffic does separate them, because it will occasionally in certain spots. There's gonna be places on this racetrack where the slower cars just can't get out of the way. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, it'll always ebb and flow. And uh, you know, you, you do have winners and losers through traffic. It's, it's, not a, it's not a benign thing. Watch this moment before I just uh, update you on what's uh, going on. Oh, and that was a hefty hit for the 13 on the rear of the 39. That's a 13 car already in trouble here. 39 car. Graf racing with uh, Guido Vandegarde behind the wheel of that car, 13th position yeah. in the LMP2 category. Yeah, the 13 car in the hands of Ricky Taylor. He'll be in trouble for that. I think so. He'll be in trouble for that. Yeah, he's, he's damaged the car in front. And, and Ricky uh, knows better than that. Right front problems for the Corvette, suspected damper issue for the Corvette. That's not the work of the moment. So a ball the number five now chasing now. A team formation, choose what you will. Number 75 car, Michael Christensen following Felipe Nasser to come into the Porsche curves. Awesome, awesome part of this racetrack. Traffic ahead. See, this is what happens when you don't have uh, huge wings on cars. You can actually follow each other around high-speed corners. Oh, imagine that. Now, who would have thought of that? Past Harry Tinknell in the GTM number 88 car. He's had a fine start to his race. Buemi, absolute masterclass in that number eight. It's, I'm so impressed at the moment with the job he's doing. And uh, yeah, cool head right from the start. He, he's, he's played this very well. And I gotta, I gotta tell you, he's not a guy that's, that's necessarily renowned for having a cool head. And he has really demonstrated a maturity here in the beginning of this race. Oh, is, oh that is a huge uh, shunt for the That's a 14. 14 car. That and is so, sorry, guys. the front of the car. That off. just happened when the Cadillac was overtaking. Ah. Uh, we were riding on board with it at the time, and I, I thought it was overtaking the Jota. Well, mm. it is. It, yeah. It, well, it, it the gold car. Like it, yes. it, yeah, it's not the Jota. I thought it was the Jota 38, but it was. It was. Something happened there with yeah. the Cadillac going around the outside in turn one. Not clean, did it? Rodrigo Salas. Here we go. He's brought the car. What happened here? There's Rodrigo in the gold car. Oh, he lost oh, it by himself. Lost it. I think oh, he was looking heavens. too hard at the car coming. I think he possibly oh, they got just got the dirty stuff on the right hand side. Missed wow. his. That's Trying to get out of the way and no good deed goes unpunished. Wow. I was hoping we weren't going to see any contact there, but wow. it just, I, I saw the cat when we were on board, and of course, you don't see what's happening at the rear, but so rare just to lose it there in the dry conditions. 90 minutes in, the 2022 Asian Le Mans Series champion, Rodrigo Salesh. I think and you're right, Graham. I reckon he just got a bit spooked by the faster car coming to the Look at that. Get going again with the three, yeah. three wheels. If he gets that car back Very and they get the car in the race, that's heroic. And Very he's going to try. Very Piro of him. Very Emmanuel. He's going to try. I th that car looks I think he's going to do it because, you know, rear wheel drive. Right. And he's still that's got right. the left he's steering wheel. The, prob the, prob the bigger problem here is look at the state of that side pod. It's the radiator. Could, could there's, be a there's, there's fluid coming yeah, out the bottom yeah, of that car. I think that car is done. Yeah, right, Graham. I think yeah, losing too many fluids to do a whole lap like this. If, if that was if that was at the end of the Porsche curves, half a modicum of a chance. But with fluid coming out that car and the reduced, there's no airflow either uh, through that side of the car. That car, I'm afraid, is done. Poor Rodrigo Salas. It's a small mistake and a massive, massive consequence. Yeah, that's an eight mile. That's an eight mile trundle. And yeah. that's not going to happen. On three wheels. Yeah. So, it is only a slow zone, though. We have not seen a safety, this is the lead. safety car yet. I and mean, we have a battle for the lead. Local boy, Sebastian Bourdais. Never won this race in the, in the top class. Putting pressure on the lead Ferrari of Nick Nilsson.
great to see. I didn't think that Cadillac were going to have the speed against Ferrari here, but it's uh, they're certainly, and Seb, certainly proving me wrong, and I'm glad they are. This is great stuff. Great stuff by all of these teams at this point. All of that pace, all of them. The the Minos baby, Cadillac, sorry, the, uh, the Glickenhaus and the, the Floyd Van Wall uh, team off the pace, but now in comes this battling pair. Now who does what? What do you go for here? Stick with the plan, take track position. What do you do? Brilliantly done there by yeah. Day. He has yeah. absolutely nailed that pit entry. And look at the distance he's gained on the Ferrari in front just from that one move. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, we, uh, we're looking at some pictures from 22 years ago. So a picture of Sebastian Bourdais in the, in a gallery there. And have a quick listen into what's going on with Ferrari. Service, full service, maximum push, maximum push, full service, fuel, driver change, and tires, driver right. change. So, Caddy, double stint here. So this is a double stint, driver change, tire change, fuel. Nielsen getting out. Keep an eye on the Cadillac. What are they going to choose to do? Sebastian Bourdais, remember, had that earlier stop. Bourdais was, looks like he's staying in the car, unless they've already done the driver change. These were the two teams that uh, stopped out of sequence. Yeah, Seb's still in there. I can see the helmet design. Yep. Now, are the tyres ready for the Cadillac? They are certainly for the... What's going on there? Trying to see the logos. No, no tires, no tires. For the Cadillac. Cadillac, go ahead here. So a third stint now for Bourdais and the Cadillac. Interesting. So, of course, he's going to get eat, eaten up. Yeah, eaten up by the Ferrari that's on new tires when we go green again. But uh, he's got that uh, 30 or 40 second uh, gap. That left another... over by, by the, the tire change. But that will quickly come down. You know, that's as Americans, stop. we love that strategic. <laughs> There's a, that's another stop for Jota. There's another stop for Jota at the same time. So that's a third pit stop for they Jota. Must have, they've got to have an issue with making that many stop. Are they not getting uh, fuel pickup? So back to the lead. The full fuel load. Yeah, so on the medium today, just saw the graphic pop up with uh, Sebastian Buemi. So he'll be glad that he's on those tyres now, and uh, it's, it's got rid of the, uh, the softs as the car gets uh, yeah, craned away. Yeah, that, that tubs. Disaster. What is this? This is the 98 Aston Martin. Alex Ribeiros. Oh, good heavens. Oh, was that? That's coming out of the uh, first chicane up over the hump. That's uh, covering down in 20th in Tonic's outlap. Pushing too hard on fresh, fresh tires. Is there impact damage, or has somebody just failed on that hood? Well, that's a good point. It's not a part that they need to get into usually in a regular pit stop. Well, something sheared there. Yeah, the what the the, the screw clamp looks yeah. like it's just come apart. Meanwhile, as they head into Monson, it's the uh, the two, the six, and the seven. Still at it. This is the battle for third, fourth, and fifth. That's Earl Bamber now, Lawrence uh, Ventura, and still Mike Conway, who is on his first set, his second stint, but his first set of medium tires. He started on the softs, and he's trying to work his way back from really having trouble with those soft tires. With a slow zone in operation at the end of this lap, and it just means we can still go racing for much of it. That's right, that's how... Great moves always when you stick it down the inside, you hover around the outside of the right-hander to end up on the inside. You put a lot of trust in the in the driver that you're overtaking there, but uh, he's cleanly through nevertheless. So the slow zones, if you're uh, not familiar with this uh, form of racing, is I think it's a wonderful way to keep from always having to bring out the full course caution because the drivers have areas that they know that they must slow in, they have to slow down to safety car speed, and then they go right back to racing. And on an eight-mile racetrack, it is it really helps the racing. Yeah, you've it just helps got... the, the, the people that have the incident and the people there to clear up the incident. It's safe for them, and it helps the racing stay uh, exciting. All the cars have got uh, a full course yellow button, they call it. Just one switch where they press that button, it limits the car to uh, the 80 kilometers an hour. And then another one for the pit lane speed limit, for those of you wondering, that slows you down further, 20 kph. 
trundle down the pit lane at 60 km. So you've got to be so now they're in the slow zone, as you pointed out there, Jim. You see the, the, the four way flashes flashing away, and the car is now limited to 80 kilometers an hour. You've got to be very on it as a driver to know exactly where to brake, slow it down, hit the full course yellow button, get the car held at that speed, and you just trundle along now until we come out of this uh, this section that they're in. We'll take you through where the incident is to turn one, turn two, three, the Dunlop chicane. And on the exit of that chicane, you're gonna go up and over that brow of the hill. And that's where you get released to get into the green, you cross the line, hit the full cross yellow button again, and away you go. Well, here we see a gaggle of GTE AM cars coming into Mulsanne. Normally we'd say that that 33 car is in the middle of the fight, but he's not. He's uh, trying to rebound from a damper problem, but those three Porsches that you see right there, oh, another big crash. Oh my heavens, that's the number 13 car, the tower racing car with Ricky Taylor behind the wheel of that car. We saw him have a little bit of an incident earlier and uh, now I think uh, we, may, we, we may have enough carnage around the racetrack at this point that we might see our second full course caution of the day. Anthony and, and Graham have, uh, have taken a break and joining me now in the booth are uh, our two dear friends and I'm just uh, thrilled to be working this centenary edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans with uh, past winner of this event, Guy Smith and uh, the man who uh, made the Wright brothers look like pikers here at Le Mans many, many years ago, and that is Peter Dumbreck. Welcome, gentlemen. What are your, uh, as we see uh, Ricky Taylor get loose there and kind of cartwheel sideways towards the wall. Again, I think we need a, a close-up you know, view. Here's an onboard. Nope, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's already, it's happened. already happened. I mean, it's very unusual, very experienced driver. Yeah. Um, so, but we know that car had a bit of uh, contact earlier on. Yep. Could it be as a consequence of that? Was there something that was on the way to getting broken and that's it just failed? Yeah, it's really been an awful, uh, an awful week for the 13 car. Obviously had the crash earlier on in the week in, in practice, um, which required a new, I believe a new chassis. And uh, it, hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been plain sailing so far in the race for them uh, to this point. So yeah, just a, an awful race and uh, it was a, looked like a strange accident, so we need to see what uh, exactly what happened. There's the uh, 98 car that was in that we saw going down the back straightaway, the Monson with its hood up, coming for repairs. Racing still going uh, in the non-slow zone areas. They looked like they had extended the slow zone on the front straightaway. The Cadillacs have really sort of turned. I was going to say, how, is the, how have the Cadillacs impressed you? Anthony's been very impressed. Uh, are you gentlemen equally equally impressed? Yeah, they just seem to. I mean, they've, they've sort of been quiet all week, really. I mean, I think in uh, in Hyperpole, um, Bordet showed that they had some real pace. Unfortunately, had that fire and uh, had, to, uh, had to, you know, they lost their lap. But they kind of just, uh, yeah, quietly came up, you know, went about the work. And... Um, they're really showing their uh, their pace now, and uh, certainly a match for the Porsche. I mean, I think you'd have to say that the Ferrari and the and the Toyota probably slightly got the edge, but uh, these guys are certainly pushing them hard. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's just shaping up to be a, an absolute epic battle. And uh, having all these manufacturers in the fight is great. Yeah, it's so um, well unusual to see so many manufacturers so close together, and you know, where we talked about it in the last few days, how the whole category is on its way up the whole race in fact you know it's there's so many cars so many manufacturers involved as we see the damage from the 13 car i mean potentially that's going to be the first uh, failure there we go oh there he made contact with look like the the, uh, the delage it looked like he uh, ran up the back of the delage there so that'll be twice that he's come into the back of a car in front of him was it the other way around last time, though? No, no, the, the other way the, around. He, uh, he hit, yeah, because I said he should know better. I see. I mean, there's just been so much going on in this race. You don't know where to look because uh, there's just stuff going everywhere. Sebastian Buemi coming into the pits, completing his second stint. Here comes uh, Mike Conway in. Interesting to see. Here comes the six car. Of course, and this is almost a free pit stop as well because the slow zone is on the front straightaway. 
so might as well make the pit stop as opposed to going through the slow zone. Yeah, because these guys are losing that much time. They've, they were in just a couple of laps ago, weren't they, before this happened? So they were probably 10, 15 minutes ago, these cars were all in. Yeah, because you can see the, uh, the, the, the energy for most of these cars is still in the 50% range, so this is a, a short stop. Yeah, it's almost like whenever, obviously, when there's a safety car or a slow zone, they're all taking the opportunity to, to, to make the stops and uh, get in the pits while uh, they don't lose too much time. And there, that's where the slow zone for the 14 car incident ends at the top of the hill as they go under the Dunlap Bridge, down through the Dunlap S's, which used to be called the Forest S's back many, many years ago. And then here it goes right back to a slow zone for the Ricky Taylor incident coming out of Tetrouge all the way down through the first chicane and then partway through to the second chicane. Probably the slow zone will end right after, the, so, uh, right as they get to the second chicane. So yeah, as you enter the um, you, 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 the slow zone, basically the, the Marshall Post before that, there's a, a board which says next slow and a, and a waved yellow flag. And basically that's to warn you or pre-warn you that the slow zone's coming up. So by the time you reach the next um, Marshall's post, that's where it's wave yellow. And at that point, you have to be 80 kilometers an hour. And it's so easy or, as a driver to just push that a little bit harder. And, um, you know, if you over speed into, the, into that um, slow zone, then um, you know, with the GPS, they know and they'll ping you for speeding. So likewise, if you release the button too early on exiting a slow zone, um, they'll ping you from that as well. So it's quite easy to make a mistake. And when you've got multiple slow zones, you've really got to be on it, yeah. you know, because you can gain or lose quite a bit of time. Um, but the worst thing you're going to do is get a penalty. The uh, the other thing that I, I need to correct something, I said that this happened after the first chicane. That was actually the exit at Tetrouge is where that happened. So wow. it's before the first chicane. So the slow zone will end at the end of the first chicane, and then they'll be able to carry on, carry on racing. So my apologies for that. In fact, there you see the, the first chicane, and there's no incident there. Interesting what you were saying about how um, the warning is coming up for the slow zones, etc. That's now coming across to Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three. So the, the, all the FIA championships are all getting that same system. I think it's a great system. And here we go. Back at full race speed. That is your race leader, the number 51 AF Corsa Ferrari, the factory effort, the 499 with James Collado behind the wheel. It's been a long time, gentlemen, since we've been able to say Ferrari leads Le Mans. It's kind of, kind of fun to say. Oh, it's great. It's absolutely fantastic to see. And I have to say, I think it's such a beautiful car. Uh, it really is a, a, a pretty race car. And so far, it's been super, super fast. Has he got the reliability? That's, that's the question. Yeah. Now, he had his hands full a little while ago of the number three Cadillac, Sebastian Bourdais, but Bourdais has pitted. So now he has dropped back to eighth position in the class. So now he's got another Cadillac. It's the uh, the El Bamba car. Um, which rinse see, and repeat. It rinse and repeat. It's just a blue one now. So instead of having a yellow caddy chasing him, he's now got a blue caddy chasing him. So um, again, is that caddy put keeping the pressure on? Um, they've, they've got some pace, haven't they? So uh, yep. let's see. If, uh, let's see now. They're now they're up and running. Can he can he catch uh, the Ferrari? Uh, 3.7 seconds. The last uh, interval for the distance between the Ferrari and the Cadillac. Porsche number five is a further five seconds back. That's Michael Christensen behind the wheel of the number five Porsche. Then it comes the 75 Porsche with Felipe Nasser. He too is, uh, has been in since the start of the race. So the, our front runners, the only team to Made a driver change, I think, was the number six Porsche, is that correct? Lawrence uh, Ventura. Uh, we've also had a driver change in car 50. Um, That's right. That's right. As I knew yeah. I saw yeah. one. Thank you. So why are they so far back in 11th now from having led the race? What, what actually, I missed the procedure that took them back to 11th when everyone else ahead of them also stopped. I think, Peter, I think what they did was, I think, um, a lot of the other teams just did fuel, and and they did fuel and drivers. So they obviously had that long tires. Yeah, yeah, tires. Sorry, yeah. yeah. 
and that was the, that was the yeah difference. it was full service which yeah. is what we're seeing is full service was about a minute and 26 seconds and just fuel is like a minute five and you can there see, you see what yes. happens when they get into the slow zone from the onboard as the uh, leader James Collado does come into the pits Let's see if we get looks like this is going to be fuel only there's no tires out the Michelin engineer comes out to visually inspect the tires. Clean the mirrors. You, you would expect those mediums to be able to go three stints, wouldn't you? Yes, wouldn't and, and that's what the Michelin engineers told us, is that they would easily go three stints in the night, maybe four. Yet the 50 car, we believe, has, has changed tires, so yes. that's, they would have only done the two stints. Yep. Yeah, the 50 car changed tires. The only the other one that changed tires was uh, the two Toyotas because they started on the softs and switched to the, switched to the mediums. We've so also, now we've also we've also seen with the slow zones as well in in some of the other races, support races. It's quite um, difficult is when you've got a chain of cars and they then break for a slow zone. Um, a bit like you get in traffic on the road when you have this sort of concertina effect. We've uh -huh. seen it in the past where, particularly if it's a new new slow zone, um, that the cars at the back sometimes have been caught out and then rammed into the, a car in front. So that's, again, something that the drivers have to really uh, pay attention to. Well, they have to be aware of. There's Chip Canassi, the man behind uh, the Cadillac operations for cars two and three. Full season operations in the WEC. The 331, of course, is the X Express car. Here's the 21 car has now had a problem. Yet another slow zone will be coming out for this. And Cadillac leads. Now. And Cadillac leads because uh, of the 51 pit stop. So Cadillac leads them off. That is under the Dunlop Bridge. So that's in the area where the number 14 car was. was they must slow have zone. just cleaned up. They must have just released the slow zone. And uh, the Aston. There's been contact between two cars there. Yeah, because there's uh, going to be. Contact between a lot of cars. So that's the Cadillac. Got hit from behind as it went into the Close on. By what it looks like, um, an Aston Martin. Wow. So it looks like it, it looks like the either the Ferrari or the Aston Martin ran into the back of the Cadillac. And on this lap, remember earlier we were talking about the slow zone. Well, prior to this lap, that was where the slow zone ended so everybody was getting on the gas there so that was not a slow zone where that happened now it is <laughs> but but at the time it wasn't so more bad luck continuing for the for sebastian borday and the three car they survived the fire they they battled for the for the lead of the race and now they've been uh, they've been uh, hit in the back and there's obviously some damage there as they go into the uh, a slow zone down at the end of Need to get a view game. of the back of that car and just try and... I'm sure the team themselves would like a view of the back of that mm -hmm. car. Green flag waves at the end of the first chicane, so now they will be back under racing. Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't slip stream somebody that's got damage. Well, straight away by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, back body one, yeah, yeah, definitely going to be pit stop here. Certainly. Oh, yeah. maybe the, the rear of the car is going to have to. It's got the rear of user, Peter. Yeah. yeah, it looks. Oh, it's pretty bad. That's a shame. It's going so well as well. Yeah, that's what I say. They they rebounded from the fire magnificently, and it, it actually battled for the lead of the race. Of course, their sister car with Earl Bamber behind the wheel is now leading by four seconds over the Michael Christensen Porsche number five and the Felipe Nasser car, the IMSA uh, Porsche, which is uh, five, another second and a half back behind its sister car, the number five car. 
Yeah, the Ferraris have kind of slipped down a little bit down the order. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out, but they've kind of slopped, you know, sort of dropped down now, sort of 30, 33, 36 seconds behind the, the leading Cadillac. Well, I also think it's interesting because uh, I'm dying to see some stint data to see what they're getting because we were really surprised that the 50 car came in as early as it did the first time around. We weren't really surprised that Mike Conway came in because he had just absolutely crashed those tires. And so he had to come in or he was just losing too much space, too, too, too much time. Yeah, unless, unless they're carrying a problem or they, they found it, you know, spotted an issue that they needed to, to, to check or they needed to do some kind of reset in the pits. But um, yeah, it's just, it does seem like a strange call. A little preventive maintenance kind of thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Right now, both of those cars look like they're on rails. In the LMP2 category, it's Team WRT with uh, Robert Kubica behind the wheel, the number 41 car. And uh, yes, it's a slow zone, but still got to uh, try to think, uh, see if that is, I think that's the 55 car that is also involved. I mean, that's the thing about Le Mans. You, you know, you can see already the attrition rate. There's some, some seriously damaged cars yeah. now. Now That's you know. probably now four cars out of the race. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and this is actually kind of early for that many to be out. Absolutely. You might get one or a shunt or something that leaves someone out. Here comes the uh, Sebastian Bourdais in the Cadillac. This will probably be a driver change and fuel and tires, and then they'll wheel the car back in. Yeah, uh -oh, they're going to do the driver change back in the garage area. There's multiple IndyCar champions. Scott Dixon ready to yep. get in the car. Hopefully, it'll uh, just be a case of the rear wing assembly comes off, uh, rear bodywork, and uh, no suspension or anything damaged. Yeah, a, new, a new diffuser. Yeah. Just kind of the whole back module of the car putting the trolleys under the car. I suppose it depends on whether the actual rear corner wheel and the connectors all right. took any kind of damage at all, whether they're bent or, because he, he, he wasn't, you know, coming back quick, was he? No. He, well, was, he, he was, was taking it yeah, well, relatively, was, but just being safe. Yeah, he was being smart. When, when these cars are designed, I mean, obviously designed for speed and performance, but in this type of racing, the design to fix quickly so that they're as simple as possible to to make quick repairs to because obviously for this very reason that if you can make a quick ch a change or a quick fix it doesn't ruin your race so let's hope that they can make that change get the car back on track and hopefully not lose um, you know certainly lose a lap especially with the amount of slow zones out there hopefully they can keep them uh, on the lead lap right now we've got about a quarter of the racetrack under slow zone the slow zone goes from right before the Ford chicane all the way through the end of the first chicane. So through up underneath the Dunlop Bridge, down through Tête Rouge, and the first run to the first chicane, which is basically from the Dunlop S to the first chicane is the fastest part of the racetrack. So that right now is under a slow zone. They clear the first chicane. The green flags that you see will be waving, some blue flags there to let the drivers know that faster cars are coming up behind them as now Earl Bamber trying to get a little heat back in the tires there. Holds a three second advantage over the number five Penske, Michael Christensen, then Felipe Nasser, Sebastian Buemi after his full service stop to get off the soft tires has now climbed back up to fourth position. Team Joda, who we all thought would uh, was off sequence, has gotten back on sequence with everyone else with kind of an extra pit stop, but they have climbed up to sixth from uh, starting at the back. So that's a pretty good drive in his first stints by uh, Antonio Felix da Costa. Yeah, they're, they're very much in the fight, aren't they, the uh, um, Joda team? They're doing a really good job. I mean, bear in mind that they only got their car at the last round at Sp uh, Spa, and Really like, the, the week of spot. like the weakest yeah. spot, like literally had a rollout, I think, in, in the Porsche's test track at Isaac and then turned up at the race and did a fantastic job. Um, and, and they're still learning, and, and you know, in terms of the performance, here they are pushing the factory Penske team, um, yep. which is great because it shows that 
you know, a privateer team can take a car, hypercar, and take on the factory teams. And that's the spirit of Le Mans, you know, people, we've seen people like Yost do that, and uh, that's what makes it, you know, really exciting to see uh, that happen. And, and it's, it's always been Porsche's ethos to have customers and to support the customers, as now the customer puts it on the manufacturer. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that uh, it's something that we've, we've missed lately, you know, with Toyota being sort of all dominant and seeming to have everything in, in their pocket, but all of a sudden now we've got a proper race on our hands with several cars, several ma manufacturers, and as you say, Jota right up there, they had their issues earlier this week as well, but they seem, now they're in race spec, it seems to be going well. Five, we have at least one representative of five of the six manufacturers in the top 10. That's, that's parody. <laughs> that, that's pretty good parody. I'd love to see a replay of that uh, contact with the back of the um, Bordeaux's Cadillac. I think to try and figure out what I think happened. we've seen all they had. So now they're, uh, they've come through the uh, Porsche curves. Onto the front straightaway. There's Mike Conway. And this should be uh, almost to the slow zone. Well, actually, I guarantee to you that in the stewards' room, they're looking at all kinds of different <laughs> angles, the uh, ones we are not going to see. Well, so. we might not have access yeah. to them, but yeah, exactly. It's really hard as a driver as well with all these slow zones because it really it really affects your flow. You know, when you're doing a lap, you kind of get, you know, you're looking at your lap times, you're looking at your splits, and you get into the rhythm, and then suddenly it's stop, and, you know, you have to coast along 80 kilometers an hour, then you go again, and then it's stop again. And it's really quite difficult to, to, to get your flow and your, your, your rhythm. I actually changed that one scoring page to that little map because it was kind of knocking me out of my flow and they had changed so much through three different incidents that it was like, okay, now where, just exactly where is the slow zone now? There you see the one of the lift tractors trying to extract the number, still trying to move the number 13 car. That has taken a while. I suspect there may have been some barrier damage there. So what you have now is you have the engineers basically on the radio talking to the driver and telling them, you know, the slow zone is still there, it's still in play, uh, keep an eye on it. And obviously, when they think that the slow zone is going to be removed, they're just trying to keep the driver informed at all times. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a really good time, isn't it, Peter, to kind of get the information from your team while it's kind of, you know, not under stress or, yeah. or pressure. And the, the engine note is low, so exactly. you're able to contact and understand each other really well. Of course, on the, the trucks in the pits, they've got very high antennas where they can, um, with a modern technology with the radios, you're able to speak to the driver all the way around the track. I think it's, um, for me, one of my biggest fears as a driver is losing the radio. There's nothing worse than feeling like you're out there on your own and you've got no idea what's, what's going on. I mean, I've been very fortunate. I don't think I've ever had it happened to me but it's one of my biggest fears yeah. that that happens and then of course the, the pit board becomes the all-important thing but it, you're seeing it one lap later so you, yeah. you've got to kind of keep your eyes peeled for it and, and especially with these slow zones you know the situation as well if you haven't got radio you're not aware of it so you're kind of just doing it purely by sight and uh, you can lose a lot of time um, you know by, by by not having the the information so just checking in on GTM, there you see the uh, third place car, the number 85, the Iron Danes. Rachel Frey behind the wheel of that car. She's being chased by the Proton Competition, number 911, Rickard Leitz behind the wheel of that car. Dr. Rickard Leitz, one of the, uh, just most of these guys that came up through that Porsche Junior program went on to be engineers and, and doctors of engineering. And, what a luxury to have a driver who's also one of the engineers on the car. That's just absolutely fantastic. Matteo Caroli still leads the class in uh, Rexy, the number 56 Porsche, and then the GR Racing number 86 with uh, Ben Barker behind the wheel has taken over the uh, second position. So even though the Porsches were, were quiet in, in qualifying, they are now first, second, third, and fourth. Just looking at the uh, Garage 56, the uh, Hendrick Motorsports uh, NASCAR, it's just 
slightly dropped now behind the, the first turn of four um, GT AM cars. Um, I know that's through pit stops or, or speed, but um, really looking forward to seeing them do a pit stop. NASCAR style. Yes. I'm yes. excited to see that. I think their lap times have been have been representative. I think they've had uh, probably, and I think they may have made an extra pit stop. I'm not sure. I think they're no, actually they only made one. one. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the cars are wrong on that. The cars around them have made two. Again, like with everything else with that program, they may be starting out conservative uh, because for them, there really isn't a class to win. So for them, it's just going to be let's finish and let's make sure we finish. Here's that Porsche battle we were looking at moments ago. There's a driver now. This is, this is awful. This is when you just you, you want to look be looking ahead to seeing a clear racetrack. And when you look over and you see you see all those cars, it's like you know it's hard work. But you know sometimes it can work for you. Sometimes you can get through the traffic cleanly and you can build a gap from the car behind. Uh, likewise, it, it can go against you. It really depends on whereabouts you hit the traffic on the lap. And uh, I would say the Porsche Corners is probably one of the worst because it's it's super high speed. And if you get a couple of GT cars, it really kind of you know, exactly. as you can like see, that. just like this, yeah. they get backed up, and next thing you know, you're, you're under attack. So, uh. And it's one thing to come upon a battle that is two LMP2 cars, but when you come up on a battle of LMP2 cars working their way through a battle of GTM cars, that's just got to be really difficult. And also, how, how familiar are you with the kind of talent that might or might not be behind the wheel of that car that you're trying to get by? I mean, that's really true because I think what you find is, I mean, I think Peter will agree, but when you're in a series, you start to learn the various different, first of all, which cars are quick, which ones are erratic, and then you also start to know which driver's in it and, and, and who's, you know, who's quick or erratic as well. So it's, um, yeah, and with it being Le Mans, it, sometimes you've got a different driver lineup. So you do start to learn, and throughout the week in the testing, um, you start to build a bit of a mental picture of who you, you can do. trust and who you can't. I, and uh, you, what I always found was, there will be maybe, could be like three or four cars in the whole field that every time you come upon them, you know just to take extra care because you don't quite know what they're going to do. And I found that in Nürburgring 24 hours as well, which ah, is yeah, a, okay. an even more uh, complex circuit with, you know, the bank corners and, and the, you know, the bumps. And, and a much broader spectrum of exactly. who can drive and who can't. Yeah. I mean, let's yeah. face it. So now Interesting, Da Costa there, trying to keep uh, pressure and, and heat in the tires. Yep, yep. Well, this is a long, slow zone, isn't it? So yeah. everything's starting to settle yeah. down, and then you suddenly have to push again, and yeah. you come to a hard braking point into, yeah. into the chicane, second chicane, and uh, you're, you just want your tires to be up to temp. And quite often, what you find yourself under a long sort of safety car is you're kind of working the brakes. If you work the brakes, you heat the disc. If you heat the disc, it heats the rim heats the tire so as much as anything you know i was always kind of i mean my understanding is the best way to actually warm the tires is not always the weaving it's the brake accelerate brake accelerate and it excites the carcass of the tire which energizes the tire which which builds up the the, the temperature so um but the brakes are important as well to keep the brakes warm because if you go ah, green great and you go flying down to the next corner and hit the brake pedal in the cold as these carbon brakes do you know cool down very quickly then um you're not going to stop so is the, um, I mean, physicists will tell you it's easier to heat from the inside than it is the outside. Of exactly, the yeah. exactly. There you are going through the first chicane now. You'll see uh, on driver's left, uh, on camera right as they come out, you're going to see the green flag. There it is, the green flag waves there, and there goes the Jota around the, the 33 car. Then comes the number six car. Further back, here comes... Uh, Sebastian Buemi, who looks like he's gotten by the 75 now. So Sebastian Be Buemi is on his way back to the front. Let's see if uh, indeed my lion eyes have, uh, yes, there he is. And he is definitely within striking distance as, as a little bit of curb there for Christensen kind of got the front of that car to wash out. That's one of the things I was talking to Anthony about earlier and is uh, near the end of his first stint on the show is, is that the margin of error, because this field is so close, is so small. One mistake, and all of a sudden, your mirrors are full of the competition. And we saw that. Speaking of uh, one mistake, 
That's a lockup by DaCosta. Well, it's exactly what we say. You know, great, yep. I think things have just got uh, cool. We saw the previous corner was at car six. Uh, Lauren Van Tour. Mm -hmm. He had a bit of a moment into the chicane. So, yeah, the cars, I think, they're just they're getting hard to drive because you're not pushing them all the time. Yeah. And it, there's a, a big zone where you're just cruising along at uh, 80k an hour. And also, uh, the older the tyre, the longer the, the tyre has been on the car, it's, if it is second or third stint, every time it cools down, it takes that little bit longer to, to re-energise and get the temperature back in it. So, it, uh, yeah, it is very, very tricky. But you see, backed up here behind the Ferrari, they're kind of queuing themselves up want to get a good run here out of uh, Arnage and try and clear this car nicely before they get to the Porsche corners. And then it's going to be P two P2 cars ahead again. Super fast, also probably equally as fast in the Porsche corners. Probably not a big big amount in it. Want yeah, to try I, and clear these cars. Yeah, I apologize. I've gotten very carried away with myself here. This is the battle for fifth, folks. That's how, that's how good this race is. The battle for fifth looks just like a lead battle. There's, there's so, so much so action much going on yeah. everywhere. So much action. This is the battle for fifth. So the uh, Jota with DaCosta is uh, is fifth, sixth. Uh, the sixth car, Ventour, is seventh. Then it's uh, Mike Conway, who is uh, the Toyota in the back there, followed by the two Ferraris, who are also on the hunt, trying to chase down the guys at the front, who is the Cadillac number two of Earl Bamber. Michael Christensen in the number five. Porsche and the number 75 of Felipe Nasser. So, got myself straightened out there. You see the power of the uh, NASCAR there. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? Yeah. A little wiggle under braking there. How disconcerting is that when you're driving? So, <laughs> but it looks like it's quick it, hands. I mean, the Costa does look like he's just slightly struggling a little bit, um, whether it be. Like I say, maybe lack of temperature in the in the tires, or maybe the tires are just starting to to go off slightly. But um, may have a bit of a flat spot now, yeah. a bit of vibration. Mm. And here we go back into it seems back to have come around so quickly. Yeah. So uh, Conway um, Conway wasn't able to get by the P2 car in front. So the two cars in front have just created that little gap. Yeah. And it is a long it's a long zone, this isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, as a driver, you're just looking for that green light, that green flag with your mm -hmm. finger on the on the button as soon last, as you get there. Last time by, it looked like they almost had uh, the 13 car uh, removed from the scene. He was being pulled back up onto the flatbed. The other thing is that, you know, when the release comes, the green, the green flag, and there's a lock up again into Molson Corner. Yeah. When the green flag comes, you're kind of how close do I really have yeah. to be? To, you know, there's got to be a little bit of tolerance. To so you're trying it. to just take those tolerances. I thought that was, that's a serious lockup because there's a big yeah. dark line. I mean, it wasn't, oh, it wasn't yeah. like a little lockup. I mean, that was so tough. he's going to have vibration. He's definitely going to have vibration. He's, he's definitely in blister country. And you can okay, see the so flashing. There's, there's Buemi, who's in, still in the slow zone, just went out of our frame. And then that's the distance from Buemi back to DaCosta. So yeah, after two hours and 10 minutes, we've got still a pretty close oh. race going on here. Right over here. Yeah, just a note, the fastest lap of the race so far is from the Cadillac of Bordet at 2.28.2. So the, the Cadillac has definitely got some pace. But is the Cadillac back on track? Is it fixed and back out? Does it? Uh, I think it maybe is. I think it's a lap down, is it? Uh, uh, Scott Dixon, yeah. Yep, so there he is. They switched to Scott, yeah. So, okay, they are they are back on track. That's good to see. Currently 13th overall. 13th in class as the green flag waves as they exit the chicane. They'll barrel down this uh, short shoot to the second chicane. Second chicane is left right. The first chicane is right left. The second chicane is left right. Then it's a hard sprint through what used to be the kink. And then late braking for the Mulsanne. This is much like Indianapolis. Folks think that the, the braking point for this is much earlier than it is. You really, you're really waiting a long time before you get on the binders, aren't you? Right there. Yeah, I think they're just going into Mulsanne now. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's actually super bumpy as well, breaking to Mulsanne. It's, it's... Mm. 
So we know the Cadillac was uh, fast earlier. Let's find out more about what's uh, happening with that three car. I am with Sebastian Bourdais, driver of number three Cadillac Racing. Sebastian, can you just tell us from your perspective uh, what happened with that incident? Well, I, I think you probably saw it pretty well on TV. Um, you know, there's just a succession of slow zones turning on and off, and then one is on, two is on, three is on. Next thing you know, they turn off, you know, zone one, but then you go straight back into zone two, and I don't know, somebody didn't remember that zone two was still on. It was very confusing, to be honest. The, the displays inside, they, they kind of start lagging, they don't, they're switching information, and, and you don't really know what to do. And uh, I think I think we just make, kind of creating the monster a little bit, which is a shame, because, you know, you end up paying the price for something that's none of your fault. Well, we're back to green flag racing now, and you guys do have a lot of pace. What can you do now? <laughs> Hopefully you run out of bad luck, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know what we could have possibly done in a prior life these days, but the uh, the tough days uh, keep piling on. So hopefully uh, there's another safety car pretty soon that we can uh, get back in uh, in line and not go lap down. Well, it's a long race, so hopefully your luck will turn. Hopefully your luck turns. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> well, thank you. So there you see the number six car. Interesting that uh, it's, it's kind of what we thought it was. Just a slow zone here, slow zone there. No slow zone here now. Oh, oops. I think he just alluded to the fact that the whole process is very confusing, full stop. And I think, you know, just take somebody that's uh, maybe a couple of cars back or, or whatever that, that, you know, they, they just haven't clearly seen it. And uh, they've hit the back of Sebastian and, and cause that incident. So yeah, it's very, very much, very unfortunate for those guys because they were having a great, great race up to that point. But um, hopefully, um, you know, they can get back into this race, get back on the lead lap. As he says, I mean, that's that's a new thing for this year. If there was a safety car now, and then the wave by, they'd be able to get back on the the lead lap exactly. again. Whereas in previous years, uh, it's pretty much yeah. impossible unless yeah. you fight your way back. Right. I think if there's a team on the grid, um, you know, Chip Ganassi Racing, they're, they're, you know, if they're smart enough, they've done this enough times to, to figure out how to, to get laps back. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how they uh, how they do. So we've got the Penske Porsches now, first and second. Very strong. So far we've got to say Toyota leads Le Mans. We've got to say Cadillac leads Le Mans. We've got to say Ferrari leads Le Mans. And now we can say Porsche leads the line. Those are those tag lines you always try to get out so they don't have the side. <laughs> this, though, is still the battle for fourth position. In fact, right now it's Porsche, Porsche, Toyota, Porsche, Porsche, and Toyota. So this has turned into, uh, and then the two Ferraris, followed by the two Peugeots. Cadillac number two coming out of, uh, back on the track on his outlap after his pit stop. That's Earl Bamber. And then Frank Mayu in the uh, Glickenhaus, number 709. And then, as you said, uh, rightly so, Guy, uh, the number three car now being driven by Scott Dixon in 13th position. Olivier Plois in the 708 Glickenhaus, which had to start from pit lane, has worked his way back up to 29th overall. Yeah, both Persian are still, still going strong. Um, seven seconds apart from each other, but uh, just not quite able to get on the pace of the, of the other cars at this stage. But, um, you know, it, this race can change quite a lot as we start to go into the evening and into the night time and it starts to cool down. You find that some cars come alive, uh, some cars, you know, are not so good in those. Ones. So you, we start to see, you know, varying uh, perform, uh, changing performances. And also, we've, we, we've seen one little intervention from Mother Nature at the beginning of this race. I'm sure that's not the last intervention we're going to hear. So the five car, we've been talking about a lot. They now lead. Let's and check in. This is my go from Fox. Driver change. So. That's going to be it for uh, Michael. This is his uh, 
This is the completion of his second stint. This is only the second pit stop. So Joda is the one. Joda has had, I mean, given the fact that they have, uh, they already have, they've now made three pit stops to just one pit stop for the five car. They've got some pace in that car. Definitely, definitely. We saw the 50 car there on a bit of a slide into the corner. Clearly that uh, downhill turn six, I think, is it? Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit slippy. I think this is the third stint on those tires for that car. And when you start the race, the track's super nice and clean. They, they clean the circuit, get rid of all the marbles, that, the marbles of rubber that you get around the outside of the circuit. Um, as the race goes on, these marbles start to build up. And what happens is in these, the, the faster cars will, when they're overtaking the GT cars, are quite easy then to get into the marbles, which can be very, very tricky. I love this graphic. I love to see the, uh, the compar comparison of the speeds from the cars as they go through various parts of the racetrack. And then not just top speed. It's very interesting to see who's carrying more speed in, into the corner. Who's, who's carrying it, you know, out of the corner? Who's got the best speed? That, to me, is very, very interesting. So, this is the battle now. So, we got get a good sense now. Uh, the pole man, pole yep. pole. Um, Closing up behind the back of Mike Conway. Let's see what the speed difference between the two cars. We, we know the Toyota flew by early on, didn't it? Um, but the, the Ferrari seems to be right there. Loses a little bit on the initial power. Well, I think part of the reason the two Toyotas flew by everybody is because they started on the soft. But that didn't, you know, they, they used those up. for Conway used his up a lot quicker than I was very impressed with the maturity that Wemmy showed on that first uh, that bumpy. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's that bumpy, but boy, when you see that kind of, almost that, that wasn't quite porpoising, but that was, uh, that was certainly riding the bumps. Boko, who had that absolutely outstanding qualifying lap, has proven to be a, a rising star in the sport in the first three races of the season. First four races. This is the fourth race of the season. First three races of the season. He's been very impressive, and he has continued to do that here. Waiting to go to work. Completing the next pit stop for their, their men. Through the Porsche curves. This is a real rhythm part of the racetrack, as now the number five car, as we heard moments ago, box, box for Michael Christensen. He comes into the pits. It will be a driver change. Webby now moves back into the lead of the race with the Toyota. Dane Cameron, the young American, still a young American. Of course, all of them are young compared to me, but... Um, Watched him come up through the open wheel ranks and then into uh, the support series of IMSA and then getting full-time rides in IMSA, past IMSA champion. He has really, his father was one of the great uh, mechanics of Formula Atlantic and open wheel racing and helped Johnny O'Connell get his start. Uh, and uh, so through Johnny, we really got to know Dane quite well. And he's, he is fully, uh, it's gonna be fun to watch him in this portion. He's right in the Roger Penske mold, too. Real kind of clean-cut kid who uh, minds his P's and Q's and is all about the process. So, when he leads, let's find out what they're talking about on the radio. And, uh, Johnny, that's I was working at this speed one down. Copy. Yeah, Zeb, it's correcting for higher illegal out of turn seven. It's nothing we can do about it. How is balance at entry to turn two, question? How is balance entry turn two? Uh, big problem on the braking. Big problem on the braking. So, so we've heard Sebastian more than one time this weekend complain about this car under braking. That's interesting, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to be slowing him down too much. He's obviously leading the race and uh, seems to have a strong pace, but uh, clearly 
he's not he's not totally happy with that Toyota. So um, yeah, we just have to keep an eye on that and see whether it becomes more of an issue. So was that something to do with the harvesting of the energy and uh, the brake performance and the mix of Because the, they, they did talk about that yes, the other day yes. as well, didn't they? So I think they still haven't got to the bottom of um, that perhaps the harvesting is happening too strongly. We've had a change of position now as uh, Fuoco has gotten by Mike Conway. And now he sits in fourth position. Conway has dropped back to fifth. That happened while we were watching uh, Listening to Sebastian Buemi, here comes the uh, the pass. That was out of uh, uh, Ted Rouge. It does seem that with these hypercars, they do get a proper tow. I mean, it seems to whichever yes. cars follow it seems to have quite a bit more yeah. straight line speed. And then we, we certainly saw that at the beginning of the race with the Toyota, and then we've just seen um, the opposite of that with the Ferrari sort of powering past the Toyota. So. Assuming that they're all running similar power levels, um, it looks pretty pretty evenly matched. And Fuoco set a personal best in the second sector when he was making that pass. So that uh, that tells you he's carrying a lot of speed, and he's going to join these two Porsches that are battling here very shortly. Like Wemmy, he has the bit between his teeth. I don't think I think Ferrari is very cognizant of not wanting to let one of the Toyotas get too far down the road. Porsche off. Ryan Hardwick, I think that is. Oh, we've got a oh. contact again. That's coming down to Tete Rouge. You can see the spin marks round and round and round. Is that the Iron Lynx car? That's the 16 and the Iron Lynx car. Yeah. Ooh, that was closer than it needed to be. Let's see what happened. See what happened. Oh, we've seen this. Oh, 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 got collected. Nowhere to go. 60 drops a wheel off. Take 16 with them. I thought for a moment he was going to go all the way out to the wall, but he when he when he corrected it bit, and he came back right in front of the 16 car. Literally nothing the 16 car could do. Just a complete uh, innocent party in that. Just had nowhere to go basically. We've seen that earlier on in the week. We've seen that a few times coming out of uh, that corner where people have run wide and collected somebody on the exit. That was that was Ryan Hardwick in the 16 car. No rain expected in next 40 minutes. Nothing expected in the next 40 minutes. There are some darker clouds, though. Keep us updated on what you see. Claudio Schiavoni was behind the wheel of the 60 car. So it was Ryan Hardwick in the 16 and Schiavoni in the 60. The Jota car getting very racy there, taking to the uh, the sort of perimeter road almost to, to make that pass on the Porsche. Uh, so that's third, fourth, fifth, sixth? Yes, there's a shake. <laughs> Yeah, like I said earlier, that's third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Oh, yes, there you go. Hard oh, squeezing by. Yeah. Early in the race, boys. I told you he was coming, and he has arrived, making the pass on the entrance to Monson. Now the Jota knows that he's coming, letting him know with the flashing lights. Fuoco is on a mission. Yeah, everybody's a bit elbows out. Everybody's mm -hmm. feeling feisty still. It's uh, still 21 and a half hours to go. <laughs> a long way to go, but it's there bouncing around. You would think it was a six hour sprint watching this, but um, this is what we want to see. This is the excitement of, of hypercar and the mod racing. This is what it's all about. And, uh, Can they keep this up for 24 hours? Well, well it's we're going to so. find <laughs> out. It, it, has, it has become a 24-hour sprint race over the last few years because of the reliability improvements in cars yeah. and, and the technical advancements and, and teams just knowing what they're doing and, you know, everyone being on top of everything. But this is the first time that so many teams are coming here for the first time with new equipment. I mean, only Toyota and Glickenhaus have been here before with this equipment. So it's, uh, yes, they know what to do. 
They know how to handle issues, but are they fully prepared enough to be ready to go for 24 hours at this blistering pace? Yeah, we're, turning, we're turning 131s, 130s, 128, 8. Last lap for Fuoco. Yeah, that's a, their fastest lap of the race, so they're they're pushing hard still. Going to hear from uh, our race director. Caution at MP6, bear left, bear left at MP6. Track is partially blocked. Bear totally to the left at MP6. Bear totally to the left at MP6 and MP7. Of course, that is Tetruge. And what he's talking about when you hear him say MP, they have the marshal posts marked around the racetrack. And this is where you saw, the, this is where the slow zone begins. And this will make sure that the cars are fully s slowed down and under control when they get to the actual scene of the accident, which is actually in another uh, marshal position or two. And those marshal posts, uh, you can Google the map, and if you have it at home, folks, you can you can either print that out or have it on your computer. And there you see why the track is partially blocked because they've had to get a lift truck. And this is, I think, probably one of the best innovations that, that we've seen for safety and for clearing up when we have an incident, that these cars now all have a lift system whereby they can attach that bar that you saw to the to the roof line of the car and lift the car up and each of the cars when they go through scrutineering that is tested and I, and I was enjoying saying that not only did they have to pass the sniff test they had to pass the lift test I think we're going to see a drag race oh, yeah. any yes. second now and we're going to see who's got the strongest engine and who's got the best tool and you can see the flashing lights there on the Porsche I don't think it's got it on the Ferrari but it on the Toyota and that's to indicate that the um, the the that, yeah, the 80 kilometers an hour, full course yellow. They're uh, on the button. They're on the button. So one that when once they get to that green flag, it's a race to the button. And as, as Pete said, it's going to be a drag race. So uh, and and then Ferrari has it on the tail lights, which is probably more important, so that the yeah. guy behind him knows he's on the button. This is a replay of uh, earlier. Yes, this is when Fuoco uh, used all of the racetrack. That's pretty dirty over there. That. Uh, that red asphalt over there to the right of the white line is uh, pretty nasty over he there. Took, he the took a risk, didn't he? Yeah. Go, the, the, the other risk to that, not only from the, the physical side, is actually the risk of getting a puncture. Yes. Because obviously, once you go off track, it's pretty, there's lots of sort of loose gravel and stuff, and, and there is a risk there of, of picking up a puncher. You know how when you uh, are on a long airplane flight and the pilot comes back and sits down and rests, and you wonder who's flying this plane? That's what just happened. This is our director, Olivier Denis. So who's in charge? <laughs> He's just come in to say hello with us. Right, here we he go, green wants tea. Green flag. Here we go, green we go. flag. Straight away moving Pay out attention. of the way. Jim. Trying to break that toe, isn't he? Yes. So that Porsche was away quick. Yeah, Pulled very, a gap. very quick. I don't like that weaving. I'm sorry, we saw it in Indianapolis, and it's one man's opinion. I'm sure I'm wrong, but and here, here's my favorite graphic. We also can see who has what energy left. So we're gonna start seeing some pit stops pretty soon. Damage to the 708 on the right front. That's gonna be at least a nose change. Back to the action. So that, the, that's the car that had to start from the pit lane. That's right. Lap down already, so more trouble for them. Yep. Here they come into Mulsan. They've made it through the kink, under the uh, Total Bridge, and almost to the braking zone onto the binders, you hear the whine of the regeneration. And then back on the power of that Ferrari as they make the run down towards Indianapolis with the second fastest spot on the racetrack. They're gonna catch some traffic. Foco setting him up, gonna try to go around the outside. He's gonna have to make a decision here. There's a, uh, the, uh, one of the LMP2 cars, the Belgian LMP2 car now. Is it gonna go to the right or left, or is he just gonna be used as a pick? And De Costa does a great job of using the Prima. He does. <laughs> just boxes him in. I think that was the, uh, the 63 car. Yeah, it was the Prima 63 car that he used as a pick to just hold off Woco in that fast part of the racetrack. Now they go through the slowest part of the racetrack, which is our Naj, and now they make the run to the Porsche curves, and hopefully they won't catch any traffic here. There's a Porsche there in front of him. 
yellow flag zone. Yeah, the yellow flag zone is still uh, no, the, the yellow flag. Yeah, there, so there it is, double there's, yellow. There's been yeah. No overtaking into this area. So I wonder what's uh, what's caused that. Oh, it's back to green again. The number 16 car has stopped at the Porsche curves. That's the uh, the, pr the reason for that double yellow. So that was uh, the easy for them to dispatch. We've still got the slow zone once they get to the top of the hill. Coming to the pits. The 38 and the 50 both come to pit lane. Right together, get down to the pit lane speed limiter. So that's the, what you're saying earlier on. That's the fourth stop now for, um, for the Jota, uh, the Jota right. team. All the other cars have either got two or three, and yet they're right up there in the yeah. fight. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting. The other Ferrari is also in. This has been there. Uh, the, the Toyotas split their stops because Wemi was able to go further on those soft tires. The Ferraris have been pitting together. Oh, that's going to be tight. That's the problem. Yeah. And well, they, they, they're set up for that. You can see the. Um, they're set up and ready for that. There is the way they have the tape on the front of the, the pit area. They can either come in parallel like this, or they can come in on an angle. And everything's been measured out, so they know where to stop. This is the Jota pit stop, fuel first. As is the rules, you can't work on the car until the fueling is done. Then, once the fueling is done, then the tire changes and any other uh, work that you need to do can take place. So, looks like it's going to be full service here. Nope, the 50 car is away, no tires, just fuel. Well, if you remember, they had a driver change last That's time, right. so they did the full service then. So, uh, different sequences, a driver change also for the 51, good spot by... Uh, by you, Peter, and looks going to be a tire change there. The 50 is out of the pits now in fifth and uh, sixth position behind the number two Cadillac. So and they then right jumped, into the slot. Jumped the Jota there. We've got 51 has still got um, James Clado in the car. He's been in now since the start of the race. It didn't look like they were changing drivers. Yeah, um, I, I think they did. Did they? I think they okay. did. We'll have to wait until he comes across the line to see. So we're hearing that uh, potentially Gian Vinazzi is now in the car. Oh, that'll be fun. And here they are in the in the slow zone. If you're not, if you if you lose uh, your attention span for a moment, you look up and it's like, is that a a, a, re a replay? No, they're in a slow zone. Now we're uh, expecting rain off and on throughout the 24 hours this year. And right now, they're calling for rain at Marshall's Post 25 to 35 uh, in about 8 or 10 minutes. And as they go back to green, as they enter the first chicane. Well, Wemi was making yeah. his intentions very clear all the way down yeah. the straight there. Yeah. Please just stay out of my way. I'm yeah. coming through. Yeah. Jensen, just stay right there, big guy. I'm coming by you. Let's go down to uh, the pit lane and Stephanie. Hi guys, it's been a while since I've checked in with you, but I am actually outside the DKR garage right now where the car has just come in with severe damage to the rear wing. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen what's happened to that car, but there is definitely going to have to be a rear wing change because it is very lopsided, flopping to the left. And yeah, so that car is going to need some servicing. So Thank you, Stephanie. That is car 43, Maxime Martin. Yeah, DKR yes. engineer. That was the car that we saw going slowly on the uh, driver's right. Of course, they had the problem on the grid, didn't they? Right, yes. the grid, so they, they were already probably a lap or so down. Yes, you do, yes, you do, take care. Yes, confirm, slow puncture, left rear. Ah, so slow puncture for the number six car. That was Lawrence Ventor that we heard there as we were watching this uh, battle that is now uh, taking, starting to hot up between the number 38 Jota, the Peugeot number 94, and the number 75 Porsche. 
with uh, Philippe Nasser still behind the wheel. So he's on his third stint. So Laurent Van Tour, he will have seen on his dashboard the tire pressure monitor system, TPMS, will have come up, flashed up, and said he had a, um, he's losing pressure. So he's just double checking that with the team who have confirmed it. So, yeah, never a nice thing to see as a driver because you just wonder how, what you're, you know, you, how much grip you're going to lose and how fast you can go. And I guess they're going to make a pit, a pit stop very soon. Now uh, here's Mike Conway and Lawrence Van Tour. We heard that radio traffic that Van Tour has been told uh, to be careful. He does have the, the slow puncture, and here he comes to the pits, and with him is going to be Mike Conway. So both of these guys now making their third pit stops of the race. And it'll be interesting to see if we get full service here with both of these cars. Uh, this will be uh, Conway's third stint, the end of his third stint. So uh, second stint on his tires, but third stint for him. It's not looking like a driver doesn't, change. It doesn't look like it unless he's coming out the other side. Ventor, uh, Ventor is going to be a driver change. So, so, you know he's going to get new tires on that car, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, he has to because of the because of the slow puncture. So this now has moved the Peugeot number 93 up into second place with Jean-Eric Byrne behind the wheel. Could we see a Peugeot leading the race? I was going to say, are we going to get to say uh, everybody, you know, everybody in the pool, everybody gets their shot at the front. So we now got EPA on the in the uh, Jota car. And uh, looks like Kevin Estra is jumping into the uh, into the Porsche, uh, replacing Lawrence Van Thor. Kevin Estra is another one of those uh, guys who's come up through Porsche's GT ranks, getting his uh, first real opportunity at some uh, frontline prototype racing. Meanwhile, here is that battle for fifth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. See a little uh, yeah, wiggle yeah, from the, the holding off there. Yeah, God, sorry. Partial, the partial leaving the corner, a bit of oversteer. Losing just a little bit on that exit. Two P2 cars racing. And these LMP2 cars are seriously fast race cars. It just shows how fast these hypercars are when they just kind of blast past them. So it's uh, it's really impressive. It's getting put pretty tight there into that second chicane. Yep. Porsche's kind of got boxed in behind the... Yeah, uh, the, the, the there's nowhere the Porsche can go in that no. situation, either of them. <laughs> the GT car or the, uh, or the hyper car. And it's so frustrating to drive when you find yourself in that position. You, you work so hard to get onto the tail of the car in front, and then you get that bit of traffic and you lose that, that momentum that you maybe spent sort of three or four laps trying to trying to close that gap. And here comes uh, in the back of your frame now, Antonio Giovinazzi. He's going to join this group. It's going to become a four-way battle here very quickly as uh, Woko has uh, headed, uh, he's uh, trying to catch the Cadillac. Meantime, Mike Conway's in the middle of this. Back into the Porsche curves, Porsche curves, or turn 19, so. Uh, double yellows, guys. Uh, block everywhere, between seven and eight, straight. So the rain that we, uh, we saw a little while ago, that uh, in about the next two minutes, there's supposed to be rain arriving at the Porsche curves. That's that's uh, there. And uh, word from uh, Stephanie in the pit lane is that it's starting to sprinkle in the pits as well. So uh, the rain we've been expecting has arrived and here's uh, more damage. Let's see what happened here. And way off in that, Oh, off in that dirty stuff, and then you've got no control coming back on. Oh, my oh. heavens. United car. The United car just absolutely goes into the side of the Porsche. I think, is that the 88 Porsche? That's the Proton car, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the Proton. It's either 77 or 88. Oh. I think it's the 77. It's got the blue... Uh, Frederick and of course, Lewis. that's the 22 United car. That's Frederick Lubin behind the wheel of that car. 
you've got to feel sorry for the Porsche. Just it uh, is the 77. Minding its own business, driving down the straight. He will be fuming in that car. And again, the attrition rate, Peter, is just amazing. It's like, I just can't believe how many incidents we're having. Uh, I mean, as I said, it, these guys are just racing like it's a full-on a full sprint race, and that's all the way through the field. I mean, obviously, that was a, uh, a it was unlucky, but... Um, yeah, it's, just, just, it's yellow zone after yellow zone after yellow is. zone. Yeah, he got out there. We, in fact, we were just talking a couple of laps ago. You get out on that red asphalt, and there's a lot of dirt out there. Well, That's I, where the truck diesel is. Yeah. That's where all that stuff is. Because this is a, a public road. And so you get out there, he, he just totally lost control of that car. He had, he had his wheel on the grass yeah. or the dirt yeah. on yeah. the inside even. So, yeah, yeah just t too much risk, I think, going on there. Everybody thinks of Dale Earnhardt. Well, the, these cars are so low to the ground as well. You know, they're, they're literally, you know, centimeters off the ground. And once you go off onto that kind of side road or whatever you want to call it, service road or whatever, you can see the amount of gravel and stuff. Oh, yeah. If the car just bottoms out a little bit, the wheels come off the ground, and suddenly you're out of control. And, and that's kind of what happened there to, uh, to Lubin, which is really unfortunate. But uh, So but this is also going to make things interesting because if you, when you come out of a slow zone, with cold and maybe tires. you've lost some <laughs> heat in your tires, yeah. and you go straight from the slow zone into the rain. That's, uh, that's it, prom it promotes more slow zones. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cautions breed cautions. Well, this is a familiar slow zone so far. This is from uh, uh, Marshall Post Six all the way down to the exit of the first chicane. Again, we talked earlier that this is the fastest part of the racetrack. It is also on the opposite side of the racetrack from where the rain is right now, as you see some of the spectators there starting to shield themselves. So the word is that we've got, uh, there's actually some rain on the, on the ground coming down just outside our booth. There's rain in the pit lane. I suppose another, uh, another uh, thing about the rain is it makes the track really slippy. We see rain not hitting whole track, just between 14 and 18, and it's decreasing in intensity. So this is going to be making these poor guys crazy for the next 24 hours, because I think this is what we're going to get. You're going to get that little spit. Every now and then, we might get a shower that takes half the racetrack. That's the thing. Yep. So as, as I was saying, we've, we've had a period of hot, dry weather, mm -hmm. and it seems obvious that the rain's going to make it slippery, but it's going to make it extra sli slippery because um, because we've had that dry track. If it, we'd had bits of rain, the, the track itself wouldn't be so bad, but it's just this, it's suddenly coming on race day when it's been so dry. Well, and the other issue is, again, this part of the racetrack is public road. So if it's been dry, you've got a lot of diesel, you've got a lot of oil, you've got things that have dripped out of cars. That when the, when the rain gets on that asphalt, all that stuff comes to the uh, surface first yeah. until it gets cleared by where the rain, and it's like driving on ice. Even the white lines that you see down the middle of the road, you know, they, they could be very, very slippery when it's wet, so it's, uh, it, it is you know, pretty treacherous. But the thing about the bond rating is that you can see that with all the slow zones, the weather conditions, it's just mentally exhausting, isn't it? There's so much yes. going on. Yeah. I mean, like, this is probably more exhausting for the drivers with all the slow zones because they're having to make sure they're activated at the right time and release at the right time. The rain, there's so much going on, it's it's just um, mentally uh, really challenging for them. You're always thinking when you're in, there comes the move now. So that the was 50, 51 car going around the. Uh, that was oversteer on the exit, yeah, wasn't sure it? So was. he lost traction. But So they're into the wet condition now. These cars are unlikely to go to wet tires because no. the track's so dry, so they've just got to put up with it and try and keep the car out of the wall. And also the fact that the, that the rain is lessening in this part of the racetrack, and it's the only part of the racetrack where there is rain. Interesting, the Peugeot seems a little bit happier in that mixed condition than the uh, Porsche number 75 in front of him. So, Gustavo Menendez. I think if I was in the Persia right now, I'd be praying for rain because they probably haven't quite got the speed in the dry to challenge. But you never know, in the wet, they might just have something that the other cars yeah, don't have. Yeah, so, more variables, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if uh, Menezes can uh, hold off the, the 70, 
the, the, the 94 in that section of the racetrack because that's really the only spot he has to worry about because it, once he gets over to the drier part of the racetrack you can see he's pulled away is now the 51 car going up towards Dunlap is going to try and go around the outside he makes that pass stick hard on the brakes gets it done before they catch the Corvette and that was probably very fortuitous on his part down the hill now out of Dunlap go around the Corvette and there you go. He can uh, use the, the Corvette as a pick, and he's off and on his way. Now in third position as the 75 car has a look as they get to the slow zone. It's a nice work by the 51 car there. He's, he's got a car in between so he can get straight back up to speed at the end of the slow zone. And we saw the 77 collected by the P2 car, the United P2 car. Bit of damage on that. Thankfully back to the pit, so they should get it fixed and back in the race. But any chance of a, a win or even a podium is like, unlikely now. Yeah, that's just too much damage to, to it, you know, you're in a recovery drive after that. And it's, I have to say, it's, it's pretty awful. When, once you're in that situation where you're sort of in the race and you fight it, once you have a problem early on, and you are five, ten laps down. It's it's a long it's a long race. Okay, mate. So unfortunately, we're just gonna have to try and survive through this. We're gonna have to try and survive through this. It doesn't look to be uh, a big storm at all, uh, meaning it's not gonna last very long. And it's the only area the, of the track uh, which will be wet. So we still think it's going to move through closer to Indy and then eventually into Mulsanne, but only on the south side of the track. Oh, so that's really, the, that's, that's really the worst when it moves across the racetrack because it's, it'll be wet here and then it'll be wet down the Mulsanne straight away, yeah. which will drive fast. Here's another look at the incident between the 77 and the 23 car. 23 car gets over in the gravel and then just absolutely broadsides the 77 car. He's an innocent bystander and just gets absolutely destroyed. The thing is, he didn't. But both of them keep going. He that was amazing. Yeah. And they both kept going. But he didn't need to be that far over. There was there no. was clear daylight between him and the, and the Porsche, and he could have just... I think he got over there far enough, and then he got pulled over. Maybe you know, I mean, you, I, you, and there was you, a, there you was start a, to get into too much a, of that a stuff. Kink coming yeah, as well. and then and then you've got the left hander coming. And uh, there's a fine line between hero and zero, isn't there? Sometimes you make those moves, and it's all spectacular. Ooh. It looks great. A and shortcut of the chicane there. Yeah. So his wiper on. Yep. Unless it is now starting to move across, and there's a little bit of just saw a couple uh, drops on the camera there. So maybe it is moving across the racetrack now. I pretty much confirmed what I, I thought. Um, he's, he's gone more easy on the yeah. brakes this time, and now 75's just gone round him. So wow, interesting that he had a problem in the last chicane, and then he seemed to be mm -hmm. very cautious going into Molson Corner. And it looks like the Peugeot's going to get him as well. He does. So two positions in one corner. He is not happy. Uh, maybe he's not comfortable in the slick conditions. Sometimes it's just a, perhaps a oh, lack of experience. You the know. Peugeot is because he's just now taking the Porsche. I think what we're seeing, the Porsche is just a little bit more difficult to handle in these mixed conditions uh -huh. on slick tires. Also, Jota made a driver change very recently, mm -hmm. so he's he's still not, fresh. Not in the rhythm yet. Yeah. 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 Porsche's she got him back, back at Arnage. <laughs> Slipping, sliding, just searching for grip. And back comes the Peugeot. The Peugeot and then the Jota as well. So yeah. it's, it's all change. Here's the uh, first part of the. All right, boys, keep on the island. Yeah. First part of the Porsche curves. Everybody staying right in the middle of the road, just kind of tiptoeing through there. That's amazing how they've had to just find that comfort zone. You really see the rain yeah. coming down. And, and then, then, then here you go. Just around the corner. And then, and then in two corners, you got rainbow. The Peugeot's so. through. 
Yep, the Peugeot has gone through on the Ferrari, but I'm sure Giovinazzi is going to uh, grab that back as soon as they get on the front straight away. Let's check in in the pits. So I know that on the other side of the track, it is absolutely tipping it down, but I can tell you that the sun has come back out in the pit lane. So this side of the track, it's completely dry. I don't know if that's gonna impact what sort of strategies the teams start to pick. Well, it probably means mostly, guys, that they're gonna stay on slicks as now here comes Joe Renazzi. How long is it gonna take? It's gonna be interesting to see just what the performance of this Peugeot is. So it seems like the Ferrari on this this dry part of the track has got the got the advantage for sure. And then once we get onto the wet part of the track, the uh, nope. yellow oh, no, zone is a again. slow zone. Yeah. <laughs> so he's held him off for now. Held him off for now. Great for uh, Gustavo Menendez. Yeah. In fact, for, yeah, as you said earlier, from his point of view, he'd like more rain. I think so. <laughs> I mean, it, it definitely seems that when the track is wet. The Peugeot seems to be the most happiest in those conditions, certainly the, the 94 car, so they'll be uh, doing a rain dance in the and, pits. And actually. the other people that are really happy are not only these guys in the pit area, but the PA system is going insane right now, that the fact that Peugeot, the, the, uh, the French car, has moved into second place in the most French of automobile races. Oh, wow. And there you see the rain, that's over the Porsche curves. So they are really going to be having a tiptoe. There's the one of the GTM cars. But yeah, to go back to the tire situation, they That's do the have 74 to just four cars. Sorry, they just God they have it. to put up with it. They just have to cruise around slowly because uh -huh. it's it's what it's it's less than a mile long right. of rain, and then you've got another nine miles of dry. I right. guess it's it's what time you lose. I mean, it's quite significant right now. I mean, once you get oh. standing water with slick tires, you are in trouble. There's the number 100. The Ferrari 100 off into the gravel trap. We might be seeing, might be a slow zone. Some more, there here more offs early. and potentially some yeah slow zones or safety car. As they uh, clean up the the gravel that's been uh, left on the racetrack by the collision between the 77 and the 23, these four cars now. The Peugeot number 94, the Ferrari 51, the Jota uh, Porsche number 38, and the. Penske IMSA Porsche number 75. The thing is, if you did stop for wet tires now and you're oh. on this part, they'd, they'd be wrecked and have a lap. Yeah. Mind you, if you're driving a GT, you can have drying tires on the car. Or if you're driving yeah. on wet tires in a slow zone, you don't, you're not chewing your tires. Well, that's true. true. That's true. It's a real, it's a real yeah. I mean, somebody could be brave with the strategy in terms of uh, rolling the dice here, but uh, yeah, you're and right. That looks like a while as well, because they've, they've got, they've just kind of brought those machine, that machinery down there, haven't they? Yeah. To, to fix the barrier. So yep. we could be in for a while down there as well. If these barriers are going to be like brand new by the end uh, of the weekend. Safety car. Safety car is coming out, and that is without a doubt because of the rain, I would suspect, over in the Porsche curves. It's just probably a little too dangerous right now to be running oh. flat out. And there's a Glicken house, the, the 709. It's Olivier Pla. Olivier, uh, but is, Olivier that, Pla. is that actually just pulled up? That's not oh, actually. Oh, Caddy, Caddy, Caddy. Oh, oh, Caddy. Wow. Three car, three car, just very narrow. Here Dixon. comes the Porsche. Ah, you see, it's too much time there water for the, and now what you get is, is, is car complaining. hitting another car. So these cars are parked. Yep. And yep. Without the issue it. you've got now is having a multiple car pileup. Yep, and there go. Here comes the safety car. The three car has gone off. That is the leader in in GTM. That's uh, Ricardo Pera, who was leading the GTM category in the number 86. Now he's got going again. A little bit of uh, oh. something hanging off the back. That's serious aquaplaning. Yeah, this is. Uh, I can remember the SEC run a runoffs at Road Atlanta. I don't, you both have driven at Road Atlanta. You get to the top of the racetrack and there's the double right-hander and it was the same kind of situation it was bucketing down at that part of the racetrack the rest of the racetrack was dry it was the national championship for what was then the the category here's the uh 79 car just trying the third that's the uh, 41 so this is what happened or 31 31 that's the uh 31 oh and then the ferrari goes through 
Good heavens. Wow, that, that came in super Came in really game. hot. Dixon kissed the barrier, but I, th I, I think he just barely kissed that, it if yeah. he kissed it. Yeah. yeah. He got well, away the Ferrari it. kissed him on the way by as well. Yeah. And uh, Caddy, again, just nope, a small just, touch. Just missed it. And got lucky that he didn't get collected <laughs> by the Porsche, who then hits the barrier. Wow. Yeah, but the point of my, my, my story was that all but two cars literally ended up down that hill and in the woods. And two cars finished the race. Right. And here we see more spinning yeah. as that's now down at Mulsan, so the uh, Mulsan corner. So that has... Uh... No, that's Arnage. My apologies. So the rain has now gone all the way from the Porsche curves back to our Naj. Here comes the three Cadillac limping, uh, limping along. Here's the 31 car that we saw go uh, along the wall, kind of bouncing off the wall. Looks like he's he's got some damage, but it certainly wasn't as bad as it might have been. So you're right, Guy. I think you will see a split strategy. I'm not sure everyone will go on to wet tires, but some cars will. Yeah, I mean, I think it's weighing up. Do you drive on? Do you look after your wet tires on the dry bits of the track? And because I think you lose so much time, yeah. and risk having an accident on the wet that it's actually probably the safer option. Yeah. I think yeah. at this point you're not really looking at performance. You're looking at no. actually look survivability. At, you're, you're looking at the fact that we've got 21 hours left Absolutely. in this race. The 31 car, just to, to to put a button on that story, that's being uh, driven by uh, Habsburg, Ferdinand, Ferdi Habsburg. That's the uh, WRT car. Here comes the 311. They're getting ready for the 709 to come in. We saw that car off. There's uh, Dixon has made it back to the pits. Here's a quick question. Safety cars are out. Is it survivable on slicks in a safety car queue? In which case, don't go wet, because half the track is bone dry. Look at the pit lane here. Can you survive, guy? Come on, I mean... Well, this, this is the thing. It, it, it's, 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 as you saw, I think once you've got physically got standing water and you've got um, puddles, I think on slicks, as we saw, the, the car just, just basically aquaplanes and you're out of control. Even at slow speeds. I think, well, I think even behind the safety car, you're... you're so it's, do Somebody's you, do gonna you, gamble, oh. Yeah, exactly. I think, you're, <laughs> do you stay on, do you, do you nurse the wets on the dry bit? Because there is some of it in slow zone. And then, and then obviously have the, the safety um, in the wet part of the track. Look at the water pouring out yeah. of the uh, side pot of the Ferrari. I think if I'm Peugeot, I stay on slicks. They're, they're, well, obviously, they come, they've they're got, obviously staying on slicks. Yeah, they're staying on slicks. The yeah. Peugeot's got wets out, though. So there's your race leader, second place in the pits. 94 car. Or do you split the cars? Do you, do you, you know, split your strategy? I mean, that's, that's the advantage of having multiple uh, horses yes. in the race is, is you, you can afford to do that and, and someone like Peugeot you know at this point you've got to gamble you've got to do something because you know you're you're, you're not quite there on pace and dry so let's try something different it does look like they're going to put wets on it as Amato Ferrari runs their AF course that runs the uh, the Ferrari program I think uh, Peter the the um, engineers and uh, the gurus on the pit wall now are really kind of earning the money. It's what do we do? You know, this, yeah. this is over to them. It's for the drivers. It's just trying to survive. It's really a case of them, you know, of the engineers now. What is the best strategy to do? Dixon's back out. Now, we saw problems for the GR racing Porsche. That means that when the Iron Danes, who are in the pit currently, come out, Rachel Frey will be leading the class probably. So we might have the Iron Danes leading Le Mans as now we're on board with the 50. And we didn't get to see if they actually put oh. the, the rain tires on the... Uh, All queuing up, aren't they? At the, uh, on the uh, Peugeot. Well, queuing because of the safety car, they're waiting for the next safety car to come by. So then they'll be able to... Then they'll be released. Here they come. Yeah, wet sun not pushing that. Here comes the 100 car, which we saw. And there's Wets going on the Porsche. See the uh, little W in the trapezoid. Oh, careful. 75 car getting uh, Wets. I suspect that Yi got Wets. He was not comfortable at all. I think Conway has stayed out. I think Buemi has stayed out. There's the 5 car. So that slicks on that just now. 
so mediums or softs? Did you could you see? I, I couldn't yeah. see. No. Well, I, I could have, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, and wet's going on. Uh, a set of wets just right. going on the five car. So they they were fueling, so they hadn't gotten to the tires yet. So do we think the number 50 Ferrari that's currently leading is still on the slick tire? Yeah. yeah yes, because he stayed out. Okay. So he stayed out. See how they and, and 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 Joe Renazzi stayed out, and I think the two Toyotas have stayed out. This is uh, Tet Rouge. Yes, it uh, is. So, so they have we've definitely got, stayed out. We, we, we have on the drier parts of the track, we now have rain. Yes, we're just starting to get the rain as it's going across the racetrack. Well, gentlemen, I've enjoyed my uh, my two hours with you. I'm going to take a little bit of a break, and uh, uh, our man uh, Tutal will be in. So the next voice you hear, after you hear these two guys talk for a minute, will be Martin Haven. So, Seb, what I can see is that this big, massive rain is moving across the circuit. I would expect it to hit turn ten, between turn 10 and turn uh, 12, and then it'll disappear. Then it'll disappear just like the team radio did. Okay, well, hmm, it's, it's time for the gamblers, isn't it? Ferrari... We talked about this right at the top of the show. Ferrari have already won enormous headlines by taking pole position at the Mans. The question is, how much of a gamble, or how much, how confident are they that they're making the right decision? Of course, you can only ever find out in hindsight. Saw the Peugeot come in from second place to change tyres, and that can't just have been a standard stop. Little problem for the 41 WRT leading the pit lane. We're under safety car here at Le Mans. As we approach the end of our, where are we, three of the race. Just three hours in, three hours and a minute into the 24 hours of Le Mans. This is our second safety car period. We had a safety car from lap one, or on lap one, from basically the beginning of the Mulsanne Strait. This, uh, there was an incident there. And then we saw the Toyotas on soft tyres at the start of the race, which clearly turned out to be a major tactical error and not the sort of thing you might have expected from Toyota. They jumped into the lead uh, ahead of the two Ferraris, but then their tyres started to overheat midway through that first stint, and the Ferraris came back to them. Ferrari now running 1-2, Peugeot 94 in third place, and the safety cars are out on the track. It is wet. Let me know when you arrive in Porsche, if it looks better in Porsche or not. If it looks better in Porsche, we don't pit. If it looks not better, we box. Martin Haven, Le Mans winner Guy Smith, world champion Anthony Lee Davidson. Guy, we were talking just a couple of minutes ago about the fact that somebody's going to gamble. Well, Ferrari are comfortable enough not to have bothered splitting the strategy or not to have, or the drivers have gone, no, 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 this is survivable. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a tough call. I've just said there on the radio you know, to the drivers, is it improving? And, Possibly is improving. You're looking at the pictures there. Certainly, the track is wet. Um, it's the standing water is, is for me is the big issue on on uh, the slick tyres. Is the standing water still there? Is it improving? Well, I mean, it looks to me like that that looks a better picture to me. It looks like it's uh, it's definitely clearing up. So, yeah, compared to this two laps ago, I mean, it was an absolute flood. But that's the sort of nature of this place quite often. You get a massive cloud burst that stops almost instantly, and you get like an, an inch of water on the track, which then clears away. But I mean, when we saw the caddy, Anthony Davidson, spinning there, it was very, very wet indeed. It does look quite survivable. They haven't actually gone quick enough to catch the safety car yet. No, it's, it's certainly looking better than it was. I agree with, uh, with Guy's comments there. I mean, it's still wet, but Fuoco's got to make a decision now, is he going to come in or is he staying out? I mean, that still looks pretty treacherous around the Porsche curves, and that was the specific part of the track that his engineer was asking him about. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Stay out, come in? I, I may be worth staying out because this safety car could last an awful lot longer. Yeah, I mean, I think Ferrari could even, they could split the strategy because they've at the minute they've got all their eggs in one basket. They've, they've got both cars on the same tyres, so... 
they can afford to do something a little bit different. Don't forget, no matter how slowly they go, everybody else is behind a safety car. The race leader is in, Antonio Fuoco. Now, does Antonio Giovinazzi follow him? Look, it's, it's bright sunlight. Well, There's he... almost no rain falling in the pit lane. And he is. Our, but then we've got barrier repairs probably that need to be done where the GR Asia portion went off backwards. Because if somebody can go off there once, they can go off there twice. Um, there might be something else around the circuit as well that requires attention. We saw that, you know, the, the big clear-up operation at Tete Rouge. So Toyota have decided to stay out there. Both Ferraris in. This is very interesting. They're going to put the wets on. Are they, though? Well, the wets are ready. Yeah, in they're hand. in hand. They are in <laughs> hand. Yeah. It couldn't look any more ready. OK, so the deal here is fuel and safety items like cleaning a windscreen uh, can be done. Driver change can be done. Brand new, unscrubbed, wet weather Michelin's ready to go. Safety car queue in the Porsche curves. How quick can Ferrari be? Is the pit lane going to be closed when they get to the end of it? The other deal, Anthony Davidson, don't forget, Michelin told us about this new wet weather tyre we've got this season. They say it's a drying wet. It's not an, a monsoon tyre only for wet weather conditions that will die if the track dries. They believe in these sorts of conditions, it will do at least a stint as the track dries out here at Le Mans, which is a, a brave, brave suggestion. This may be the first time a NASCAR has run on the wet in a, in a long, long while. OK, this is not a high-speed oval. They do run on wet weather tyres uh, on uh, road courses, but the Ferraris and the Garage 56 NASCAR are caught in the queue. There is the Iron Dames Porsche right at the back. We haven't seen much LMP2 or GTM action apart from when they've crashed because the it has been dominated by the movie stars in the top class, and Hypercar has not stopped giving yet. The Iron Dames were in the lead. It's now the AF Corsa, number 54 car, the silver Ferrari. Started by Thomas Floor. It's got pro driver Davide Rigon at the wheel. And Sara Bovi, the bronze driver in the Iron Dames car, because all the drivers in these categories are bronze or silver or gold or platinum, if they're superstars like Guy and Ant here. So she's the bronze driver in that car. That's now currently second in the queue. And again, Ant, don't forget, with the three safety cars, we will merge the entire field when the track is safe and the safety car is effectively no longer needed to protect the workers. And then we will rearrange the queues. You will not lose a lap in the safety car. You might get away by if your class leader is behind you. Yeah, I mean, look, it's still T-shirt weather out there. It's, it's warm. The ambient is wet t-shirt weather yeah, wet in some places, weather, yeah. yeah. But it is it's drying. Mm. The circuit is drying, and I just wonder. Oh, I, I, I see what he's doing. You know what he's doing? He's taking a photograph of the timing screens because Gustavo Menezes <laughs> leads Le Mans for Peugeot. And well deserved. Of course well. he can get exactly. Gustavo was driving an absolute blinder there in those uh, very tricky conditions on the slick tyres. He, you know, well deserved to be heading the field right now. And I think publicly quite an underrated driver. You know, he's, he's had quite a long time in LMP2 with, with Rebellion and LMP1 with Rebellion and then sort of, you know, I think, I think he could turn out to be a bit of a star turn here for Peugeot. But this is an absolute, I don't know if you agree or not, Guy, with this one. I just, I've got the feeling this is an absolute pivotal part of the race right now. This, whoever is the eventual outcome, the winner, I think the outcome will be a lot hinging on this moment right now. It's absolutely so close and there's no room for a wrong decision at this point, whether it be from the drivers making a mistake or, or from the teams making a wrong tyre choice. Um, so you're absolutely right. It, it's so nip and tuck right now. And I think um, I think we all hoped it would be, it would be this close, it would be this fraught, but it's absolutely over-delivering. <laughs> it really is. And, and the thing here, of course, is that the weather forecasters aren't just suggesting we might get a sprinkling today. Through the night and into tomorrow, this could happen again and again and again. And, and again, the more it happens, the more you've got to get it right every time, guy. Because otherwise, if you get it wrong once, you might recover. 
if you get it wrong more than once, there's too much good opposition. And that's where you know, teams like Toyota, um, they've got that experience, they've got that knowledge. Um, so you have to look and see what they're doing and say, you know, these guys have, have been here before. They, they've, they've, they've experienced these types of uh, big decisions at big, big moments. Um, the other teams, are, while they've got experience on board, they've, they've maybe not found themselves at Le Mans in this situation. So i definitely looking to see what Tari to do, and uh, I'd, I'd be sort of trying to mirror that. The other thing as well is this, this safety car is going to bring the, um, the number three Cadillac back into play, because obviously it lost that time early on with the problem. So hopefully it'll be bringing it back onto the back of the... Uh, hypercar field and bring that car back into play. Well, we're closing up behind the safety car. Now, each of the safety cars does have cars behind it. There are a couple of outliers, but no, so nobody has caught safety car B yet. That's the one that the Ferraris were sort of closing up on. Um, the uh, Porsche 911 safety cars all have full road tyres, high performance road tyres, but also have four wheel drive. So it does give them the opportunity to sort of survive these conditions. Right now, under safety car conditions, Peugeot leads at Le Mans. Wet weather has returned to the Circuit de la Sade. We are three hours and ten minutes into the 24 hours of Le Mans. For the second time in this race, the safety car is out. And because extremely heavy wet weather arrived, and Porsche curves one of the quickest parts of the circuit, caused a number of incidents and added to the tally of clear-up operations going on on the track. And Eduardo Freitas, the race director, scrambled the safety car. There's the Garage 56 NASCAR. Anthony Davidson, before we came on air, we were laughing that a shot of work going on at, at Tete de Rouge. There was a big, tall, blue car in the corner. Said, oh, is that the... Oh, no, it's just a Peugeot 306, <laughs> one of the Marshalls cars. But it, 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 it looks so different here that it stands out quite notably. Well, let's catch up with some of our teams then. It definitely looked a lot lighter. It looked like it was only going to affect uh, the south side of the track, not the whole side, and not be near as intense. We see now it's uh, the opposite of that. And again, weather forecasting is more of a craft than a science. There is science behind it, but you can never predict entirely how much is going to come from the clouds and where, so they went with the information they'd been given. Clearly it was much more of a deluge, and Antonio was just going, did we expect that much? And the answer is no, we really didn't. Cars queuing up there, you can see Garage 56 Chevy Camaro and the two hypercar Ferraris now in the queue. They join the end of one safety car queue, which in fact is safety car A, I believe, which has got quite a lot of the hypercar field in it. Because the Ferraris, of course, were at the front of the field and then pitted. So at the moment, the overall standings Peugeot's 94 car, then Hertz Team Jota, a little internal cheer from Anthony Davidson, yeah, there the 38 car is in. Uh, second place, head of the two Ferraris. Uh, the uh, caddy that... Oh, I shouldn't say this, should I? Hasn't had any trouble yet. I know, I know. <laughs> That's the number two car. There it is, the blue nose. Yellow car number three has had problems. And so too has 311. That was one of the cars that brought out safety car on the very first lap. Uh, pit stop for one of our teams, the 94 Peugeot, under investigation. Now, that may be possibly concerned with speeding in the pit lane, too many people working on the car, engine fired while it was on. I mean, there are all sorts of rules and regulations and, and, and could, you know, could be anything. Could be the driver going over the white line as well when pulling into the pit box. And obviously, it was a, a stressful, busy time down there. Was, we saw them all peel in to, uh, to put the wet tyres on. So, yeah, let, let's wait and see. I got a feeling like a, a penalty, a small penalty might be coming their way, but they're pretty hot on that. Um, when it comes to safety in the pit lane, any kind of infringement, they're, they're usually uh, they're not wrong. They're not wrong on. So uh, the two Ferraris, you saw them queuing up behind the uh, the uh, Chevrolet Camaro, the uh, the NASCAR car, and uh, they've joined safety car C, 
the Glicken house out there. One yep. of the only, I think it's the only hypercar out there just joining the queue behind safety car B right yeah. now. Exactly right. And then uh, the number 80 car is barreling along behind them as well. That is the uh, AF Corsa LMP2 car of uh, Francois Perodo and his crewmates. And actually, the 708 is going to be one of the big winners here in the hypercar category because they're currently running in 23rd position, pretty much splitting the uh, the LMP2 field. So once they get the uh, the wave arounds or the, the drop backs, whatever you want to call it, they will find themselves again back behind the uh, the rest of the hypercars. They won't. Oh, they won't, know Because they'll be in the queue behind the hypercar leaders rather than in front of, because the hypercar leaders are all behind safety car A, which is the one that... Oh, no, hang on a minute. The Peugeot is going to be behind 708, and that is the race leader. When we go back... When we go to the merge, Anthony Davison, you have just pointed out absolutely the race... It's not... Everybody joins up behind one of our three safety cars, and that will be safety car A. So at the moment, there are three safety cars with three queues of differing lengths, depending on who got stuck behind which one. When it is safe to do so, we will merge all the cars into one safety car queue, and then any car that is in the queue ahead of the leader of its class will be waved by the safety car, will blat around the lap as quickly as they dare or can, to join the back of the safety car queue so that at a restart they they don't have the danger of losing a lap if they get caught in traffic at the moment behind safety car a is almost everybody in hypercar behind safety car b is the 708 clicking house and one gte am car this what we're watching on the screen by the way is the safety car a queue but behind safety car c is the 94, among other things, is the 94 Peugeot. Is also, Safety Car C has also got 54, which is the GTE AM leading A of Corsa car of Daphne Rigon. And where it's also got the LMP2 leader, which is the 28 Jota car. So all three class leaders are behind the third, so basically, the effectively, at the very back of the safety car train when they all join up. So almost the entire safety car queue so almost everybody in hypercar, including the 708 Clicken House, and almost everybody in LMP2, and almost everybody in GTE AM will be sent past the safety car once the queues are put together to come all the way around because the leaders of each of the three classes are going to be right at the tail of the, of the thing. And so they will then move up. So and then I guess that will mean the whole process will take longer. Surely, because it, yeah, it would take longer it, than the first yeah. time. It, the first one was actually quite smooth and quite fluid. It actually thought yeah. that worked really well because nobody was lapped. No, exactly. Yeah. Now it's going to be a, a longer process. Yeah. Yes, this will give us more of an indication of how it's going to work, won't it? Yeah. Uh, and and how long it might take because we're basically going to wave by forty cars, maybe forty-five cars. So what we're saying is, anyone that was brave enough to stay on slicks and just stay behind the safety cars for as long as possible might actually benefit massively here. Oh, although will they? Okay, Brendan, feedback as you can. When you go around the circuit, please, on the tire. I mean, right now I'm on the right tire. Uh, from uh, 10, from 10 to 14, it's, it's crazy wet also through the Porsche curves. So obviously, the effect is relatively dry. Copy. It will, uh, the situation should evolve, so just let us know when it changes for you. So the yeah, Porsche's on the wets. We've seen the, Pe the Peugeot go on the wet. I'm just trying to see what tyre the, the Toyota's on. Yeah. Oh, you're on the right tyre, Brendan. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but what is it? Yeah, <laughs> what tell tire us what is it? it is. What, see, now, because the Peugeot stayed out, everybody else in hypercar benefits. Because uh, they'll get the wave around. Eventually, they did come in, I saw. That I saw, I saw they were both on outlaps at one stage, so they must have come in after we saw the Peugeot. 94 Bojos stayed out while the Ferraris ducked in, and then the safety car got scrambled. That's why 94 leads the race. He didn't pass the Ferraris, the Ferraris pit it. 93 Peugeot has head of Brendan. That might have come in, because that's done... Well, they've all done four stops, apart from the Jota car, which had an extra early one earlier. You know, if it doesn't rain anymore, it just stays... And we have a lengthy... Um, 
sort of wave by, if you like. Mm. We're talking, it could actually be the moment we're back to some slicks again. But that was my yeah. point, yeah. yeah. Anyone that's braved it out and stayed on slicks could be laughing yeah. after Let's this one. Let's see what the leader thinks of it all. So at the moment, a lot of the track is good, but if we gain one, I still will not. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous because there's zero visibility. If you gain one, the ball is bad. Compete. And that, that might be part of the issue. Yeah, I mean, the safety car is out for barrier repairs, and that's the key thing. It's not so much about the weather. The weather is moving away. It should dry. We'll have to see what's going on. Uh, we've got a chance now to catch up with DKR Engineering's Maxime Martin. That car out early on. I'm with Ma Maxime Martin from the 43 D DKR Engineering car. We can see what the car looks like right now. Can you just um, give us an overview? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame because uh, there were some double yellows since uh, Dunlop Curve through uh, Terre Rouge because there was a, cra a car crashed in uh, Terre Rouge before Terre Rouge. So I was slowing down and then after Terre Rouge there was a slow, slow zone, countdown. And when I started to slow down at 80, I got hit by the Geekon house and I uh, got spun, hit the barrier and uh, yeah, we broke the whole car, the rear of the car. It's a shame because there are already a lot of double yellows. It's a pro car, it's a hyper car, it's a pro driver. And to hit it like this, it's just, uh, yeah, anyway, it's uh, really bad. Have the team given you a review of the car situation? Yeah, the car, has, uh, the, whole, the whole rear was broken, the whole rear left. So they have to change the, the whole corner. Um, yeah, so they are working on it. We lose a lot of time, so at the end now, we really have to try to just go to the end. Uh, Tom and I'm really sorry for Tom and Hugo because that was first time for them in Le Mans. And uh, yeah, we now just have to go to the end. All right, thank you. Thank you. Maxime Martin, long-time GT ace, Spa 24-hour winner, as was his father before him. And uh, yeah, but a tough break for them. And as you said, you know, they, they, we've seen quite a few, Guy Smith, sort of rear-end shunts when drivers haven't quite been alert enough to the fact that they're in a slow zone or entering a slow zone. And the car in front has, quote, come to a halt in front of me. Yep, you get that whole sort of um, backup. It's like being in a traffic jam, um, yeah, like concertina effect. But it's just a high-speed one. And um, it's ruining a lot of people's days, isn't it? It's causing a lot of problems. And that, Anthony, explains what happened to the front of the Glickenhaus. We saw it coming into the pits with sort of that damaged right front corner. We thought, oh, when did that? Well, that's where that happened. We, I don't think we saw what started the DKR problem, but now we know what it was. I'm worried that they might end up running out of bodywork, all of these teams. You know, how about you bring, what, three, four spare noses uh, and, and you're desperately trying to repair them? Uh, you do have those facilities, quite crude facilities, but you do have the facilities available to repair damaged carbon, but it uh, all depends on how bad the damage is, and you just you wonder, uh, which was it? Oh, it was Sebring, wasn't it, Martin, where we saw the, the Peugeot 94 getting quickly replaced, or maybe it was vice versa. They basically they took one nose off of one car, and they were debadging it to put yes. the other car, and it clearly run out of noses. We could see stuff like that happening all over here. Just confirmation from the Iron Dames, who currently are in second in GTE, that Sarah Bovey did take wet weather tyres. Now, in the GTE category, it is a straightforward wet, and in LMP2, it is a straightforward wet as well. It's the hypercar category, the fastest cars on the track that have this drying wet. It's a new tyre concept, a new design from Michelin. Previously, they had a tyre that looked like a slick, but don't ask me how witchcraft or something also managed to clear water away. This looks like a wet weather tyre, but apparently lasts better. So, you know, there's, uh, there's all sorts of interesting technology, and this race has been responsible for an awful lot from halogen headlights, windscreen wipers, disc brakes, decent aerodynamics, hugely economical engines. I mean, and we're all these cars in this race are running on sustainable fuel that's created from bio waste. So it's it's pushing the boundaries of technology all the time. And and uh, yeah, I mean, for, for engineers and, and, you know, fuel companies and engineering companies, it's a it's a phenomenal rate of improvement, this test bed that is motor racing. And did you ever drive on the 
wet slick. Yeah. It's like witchcraft. It's, it, you're leaving the garage on slicks and it's raining and it, your, your head just can't compute. It's like, it doesn't make any sense, but I, it works. I, I never got a tyre engineer to sort of explain really how it cleared the water away, because it's as slick as a slick. And I, I, I mean, yes, I, it, 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 I drove it in the Peugeot days in the 908. And yeah, like you say, it was, it was, it was mind-boggling how it, you could drive flat out through relatively big puddles. Yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing too big, but you were amazed every time that the level of grip that you had. I mean, all it was was a really, really soft sidewall compound, so it was super squidgy. Uh, it didn't like dry weather at all. Uh, it was like the best intermediate tyre you could ever dream to have because yeah. uh, it, it could run far longer in a, in a dry scenario because you did go through that painful process of uh, all of the blocks of rubber getting feathered up and, and rolling around on itself. But they were quite incredible. But obviously very costly as well to, yeah. uh, to manufacture and produce. Seven-time NASCAR Cup champion Jimmy Johnson has had his first ever stint racing at Le Mans. So there, there's his charge. Uh, Rocky started it, so it's a 54 now in the hands of uh, Jay Button Esquire. It is one of 18 former Formula One drivers. We don't have any current Formula One drivers in the field. We do have Charles Leclerc here with the Ferrari team, but I don't suppose any modern Formula One team will allow a current driver to race. It seems that those days are possibly a, a, a bit beyond us. It would be good though, wouldn't it? It'd be great to see. I mean, it'd be great to see a current Formula One driver here. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a third car for Ferrari with, <laughs> with two F1 drivers in, that would be pretty epic. Did, uh, didn't Hulkenberg do it? Was he still in F1 at the point when, uh, when he won? Yeah, he was, was on a weekend off, wasn't he? Yeah. That he so was he on may the be he may be the last current. Well, he certainly is the last current F1. Oh no, uh, yes, you know, of course, because Alonso wasn't a current Formula One driver. Um, no, when he, had he when he raced, yeah, he was retired. He, for he the was first on holiday. Time. Yeah, he retired from yeah. the first. But he, to be fair to him, he did say, "It's not full retirement. I'll probably be back," or something mm. to those words. Yeah, if I have, a, if I get a chance, and I've won Le Mans twice in one season, maybe people will look kindly on me again. But I do believe that. I believe Le Mans and sports car racing in general, amongst other things that he's raced in um, since that first departure from F1. I think it's made him not just a better driver, a much better all-rounded driver, but it's made him see the bigger picture as well within the team. I think the driver we see today, maybe it's come with a bit of maturity as well, or maybe it's a coincidence, but since his return to Formula One, I've definitely seen a different character, not yeah. quite as selfish. Obviously, he's still such a hard character, but you know, he, he's, he's, I feel like he's a more rounded driver than he ever was, which, you know, of course, he was brilliant to start with. Um, he's such a mature racer these days and, and thinks about the team more. Yeah. I mean, we saw back in the day, you know, in the Group C days, when you know people like Martin Brundle, and they would, if they couldn't find a competitive Formula 1 drive, they'd come and race in sports cars to keep themselves sharp. And actually, they'd come back to, to Formula 1, and again, more, as you said, more rounded, uh, more rounded driver. So. Uh, uh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, the sort of working with the team to get any any chance of success is is a, a salient lesson that you, you don't so easily forget. Plus, of course, there's the maturity. And and when he went back, less desperation to prove himself than there had been. You know, when those World Championship with Renault were a long time ago, and Seb had won four since then, and Lewis had won I don't know whatever five of the six or six whatever. You know. That's a long drought for somebody who's been a world champion and is now all at sea. Coming back here did two things. It, it, it reinvigorated that sort of blending with the team is the key to success. And also, actually, you can still drive. And somewhere in your psyche, I mean, I'm not a driver, but I'm sure both of you can think of a time where somewhere in your psyche you're going, have I still got it? Well, yes, given the right opportunity, clearly he proved he did. and. Because, has now probably even more than ever. Because, you know, you are, to a certain degree, you're only as good as your car. And uh, that's why it's great. That's why this race today has been so great so far. Because, we've, you know, there are so many cars that look like they're fast enough to win on outright pace. And that's great for a driver. You, it's brilliant when you've got the unfair advantage of being in, in the best car on the grid by miles. But you don't get quite as much satisfaction out of it 
somehow as a driver. Like, yeah. you, you don't feel like it was all your own ability that won you that race necessarily. Um, and if you're, you know, equally if you're in a, in a slower car and you never, you can never prove it to yourself that you are deserving of being right at the front, you do start to lose a little bit of that confidence. So I think him coming to, to sports car racing, being with the, with the best team in the business at that time in Toyota and winning all those races and mixing it with your with people that drive the same car as you as well. You know, your two other teammates that share exactly the same equipment and you can measure your lap times against. Yeah, it completely proves it to yourself. I don't know if he absolutely needed it proving to himself, but what it did do is that he came to sports cars and thought, right, if I can't win those seven championships or four championships that Vettel and Hamilton have got, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try and go for the Triple Crown. I'm going to try and win Le Mans. I'm going to try and win the World Championship in something completely different. And that's, well, he did all of it apart from mm. the Triple Crown. Got so close. I know. And uh, well, Indy's still waiting there to be conquered, isn't yeah. it? You know, like, like a number of drivers are still waiting to conquer Le Mans. So, yeah, it's, it's almost it'll always said, be there. It's almost as if he said, all right, you guys stick to Formula One and win your multiple championships. Mm. Look what I'm going to do. Yeah, and, 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 and it, it definitely reflects... I mean, you, know, you talked about the fact that when you came back to racing in Jota, actually, you were not in love with the sport any longer. You didn't like motor racing. And then by the time you decided, OK, now I've finished, you loved it again. And I think that's part of it. You know, that's part of what he said about coming here is it gave him the love of the sport and the passion again, not just the grit and determination to grind it out and... and, and, and. It, 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 it reinvigorated him and... and you know, in life, as, as so many other sports and, and life are, you know, are parallels, aren't they? You, sometimes you need that. Sometimes you just need that boost to go, okay, great. Actually, this is still fun. Yeah, you know, it, it, I can totally empathise with what he was going through in the first time he walked away from Formula One, because it, it, you know, when you're not winning and and it doesn't come easy, it it becomes, you know, it, it becomes quite soul destroying, mm. and you can easily fall out of love with the sport that you you really did enjoy so much. And uh, for him coming here, it definitely reinvigorated him as a driver, as a person. And, uh, and that's kind of what happened to me when I stepped away and then went into LMP2. It was uh, a bit more fun. You know, I was driving with a, a, an amateur driver, with Roberto Gonzalez, and uh, you know, we, we had a lot of fun. And you suddenly remember, oh yeah, I am supposed to do this because it's fun. And it brings out a different element of you as well. When you're trying to help somebody else improve themselves as well as you're trying to improve yourself, it's very hard to be selfish. It's very hard to be, you know, totally focused and, and up your own tailpipe. So so there's all that element of it as well. And that, that enhances that, that team spirit. Looking there at uh, engineer from X-Track, the transmission company, chat to Laura Wontrop Clouser. Laura is a former engineering student graduate. She worked in production engineering uh, in General Motors and uh, joined uh, as a weekend warrior, one of their uh, nascent uh, junior tier racing programs in the, in the Cadillac brand, I think, and then has steadily become more and more influential and is now the head, global head of GM Racing. That's a lot of hats, Graham Goodwin, for, for one person. She's effectively in charge of the Cadillac program. She's in charge of Corvette Racing. Um, the Action Express Caddy, not necessarily... Yeah, that that maybe, is part of hers. That's yes, part of her yes. remit. Uh, the Garage 56 car, not part of her remit, but being a, the bow tie, being a GM brand, so that she'll, she'll be paying attention to that as well. But critically this weekend, uh, the other thing she's responsible for is the, uh, with a team around her, is the development and rollout of the Corvette GT3 programme to come, which is a completely new marketplace for the brand. Uh, this is on board now with Jensen Button, on board the Hendrick Motorsport 24 ZL1 Camaro. And he's absolutely loving this. Every time he talks to me about this car, about this challenge, he's just grinning from ear to ear. He's, he's, he loves conditions like this as well, we all know. And uh, I saw him driving it. Just, the off-board shot coming through the Ford Chicane a couple of days ago in free practice, and I just, I thought, that looks really neat and tidy, really smooth, smoothly done. I wonder who's that. That's, I bet that's Jensen. Looked at the timing screens. Yeah, sure button. enough, it was. I've, I've known him. Feels like for my for a lifetime since eight years old. When he, you just saw the graphic there. He's 43. I'm 44. And uh, it's funny having known somebody you've competed against uh, so, so strongly against your pretty much your whole life. And uh, you know, certainly in terms of my, my racing life, um, 
and and to, you just know that you know their style so well. Uh, he's, he has got one of those enviable styles, I'd say, as Jensen. He's just he, it's so effortless to him. He's always been the same from karting all the way through, just super smooth. Well. And you were always really regarded as having a very um, fluid driving style. Ragged, so fluid, I think, yeah. I think you know what you're looking ragged, at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but rougher than the badger's backside. When I walked yes. back into the booth, you guys were discussing, I think, Fernando Alonso and the course that he chose to take mm, a couple yeah. of three years ago and the difference that's made to him and his outlook. And it's equally brilliant that what's not happened with Jensen Button when his time in Formula One was up, that he walked away. He's going out there, he's having experience, he's raced here before the LMP1 car, probably not the campaign he would have liked to start this adventure with. Uh, he's gone off and he's done off-road racing, he's done some GT3 racing, he's gone on won a Super GT title. And still, as you say, Ant, he's loving life, he's, he's enjoying his motorsport, he's enjoying the adventure, and he's enjoying sharing that adventure. And that's, that's to all of our uh, advantage. It is not raining there also. <laughs> I say it's T-shirt weather some, lots, somewhere around uh, the track. Yeah, absolutely. Lots and what? lots of areas around the track. It is definitely not raining, even if it has been a bit rainy. But uh, 54, this is our GTE AM leader. You saw Thomas Floor uh, in the garage. So he started the car, and this is Davide Rigon. And they're going to change over to their third driver, rotating their guys through. You would have missed this chat probably, Graham. You weren't here at the time, but uh, Martin and I, a guy, were trying to decipher are we going to see the Glicken house that's in 23rd position? Cycle back to the back of this, yeah. this row. Uh, he is, let me get this right. He's it's behind safety car B, and the leader, the 94 Peugeot, is behind safety car C. So unless the leader pits and joins the back of safety car A, he gets right back to the sharp end of the he field. He will back. still... Yes. Get most of a lap. Now he won't. Yeah, but he won't get the lap that they were in the pit lane at the start of the race no, for. So uh, he, he so he he won't lose another lap, but he won't get that lap back. No, he'll get back to the lead lap. I'm oh, sorry, it'll be lead lap plus the length of the safety car. Slicks going on the number 28 Jota. It, wow. It's time. It is time. We've seen. All right, track temperatures down to about 29 or 30 degrees, but it was 40 degrees before it rained. We've seen. It is. It's definitely. He had slicks on anyway. He didn't have wets on. Those are not wet weather tyres on the apron. He had slicks on anyway. Wow, I mean, Jota leading the race in LMP2. Yeah. They're, they're brilliant at strategy. Of course they are. And uh, I feel like, my gut feeling is that you have to rely on here is, is the right thing to be on, the slicks. Iron Dames now lead in GTEM as well. And they're going to get moved around in the safety car queue. Mateus Besch uh, of 14 Nielsen Racing. Um, Mateus, it's never nice to walk into a garage and see that, and uh, I'm just so sorry for you guys. Yeah, it's heartbreaking for, for the whole team. I think it's uh, happening so early, for sure. It's it's very hard, and um, yeah, the team made so much effort. Like, you know, every team to be here, but it's a very family team, small structure. The guys are working a lot, and uh, yeah, everybody was basically crying because it's so much effort to put into this race, you know, 364 days for one race. Um, but also that's racing, you know, and I think just to stay on the positive side, we, we, we really show we could compete against, you know, top, top teams, Jota, Prema, all the big teams, and I think for you know, again, kind of this small structure. I think it's it's um, it's very impressive. I think the boys did a, an incredible work. We had a beautiful car. That's why it's also hard to swallow because we really felt Boxy like that was our day. We would like to and, switch uh, to slicks. Yeah, no restarts uh, before two laps it's, for sure. It's like this, you know. It's brutal. Le Mans is brutal, and it's part of racing, and that's why it's so beautiful when you win it. Obviously, it's even harder when it's the hundred year. Everybody really wants that one, but uh, that's how it is. And you know, we have to investigate what happened. We don't, we're not sure yet what really caused the accident, if it's just a driver mistake or if the car on the back touched him. It's, it's very hard, so we need to analyze it. All right, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Tough break for Nielsen. Now, cars coming in to change off wet weather tyres onto slicks. This is in preparation of the safety car queues being shuffled around again, but Anthony Davison you're right. Anybody who, again, you know, we talk, I talked about this with Guy and, and with Peter. Somebody was going to stick it out. Because the safety cars are going so slow, 80Ks, 50 miles an hour, maybe a little bit more, but 
the you track know, has you've, held you've on. You've got to try and gamble. The thing is, the track has held on to the temperature. Yeah. We, we haven't got any information here. And it's not night. Well, it, wa yeah. it was just about 29 degrees before I flicked back to see who was in on the second page of timing. So, it, from my experience, when it rains on a on a warm circuit, it always dries faster than anticipated. So, especially when the, the sun is still out and it has come back out. What are we looking at here? Floyd Van Wall tightening up the wiper arm. Yeah. You know, these are things you don't think about, but at 200 miles an hour, wipers come under a lot of, uh, of pressure. It's, whatever it is, whether it's the adjustment, the length of the, the, the wiper arm, it's taking out the shape. And yeah. one quick thing, we've got the 93 Peugeot at the lead of the uh, queue coming out of pit lane. Yeah. That car in its pit stall, where the car went up on the jacks, a lot of fluid. Now, it may well be just rainwater, but I didn't see that from any other car. There was a lot of fluid under that car. Early on in the safety car period, when we saw the Ferraris coming out of the first chicane when they hadn't pitted, every time they moved one side or the other, the sort of like double floor just sloshed well, I think water that, out everywhere. That, that was the... the look, that was early on. That was not, half an hour not, ago. Not here to cause drama, but the, 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 the subsidiary point is, it does go to show, doesn't it, the way in which these cars are constructed and work are yep. fundamentally different. Yep. Somehow, that car was retaining uh, water in the car where the other cars were. Fluid retention, sir. Uh, Ooh, no, the sir. Thing. Yes. Um, I did see, yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. My first thought was, oh, that doesn't look good, and then I, I, I just assumed it must well, just be I, I assumed the same, um, and then I watched the next three pit stops and none of the other cars did it. And they've all come from the same track in the same conditions. Now then. Here's another question. There are two things potentially going on here. One is who's on what tyre and dare they stop uh, before there's a wave around or what's going on. And secondly, who will need to stop for fuel and when? Who's got what energy left in hypercar? Who's got what fuel left in LMP2? There's a bunch of LMP2 pit stops starting. Yep. Are they just tyres or are people going to do a full service? You don't want to... You've, you've got to be very careful. If you're two safety cars ahead of your of your leader... Slicks coming yeah, forward slicks with, up. And, I, and that's a soft again, Anthony. Now Makes it's, sense. Yeah, track uh, temperature is lower. It's, it's certainly not in 40s like it was in qualifying, yeah. We've seen them go, well, play it safe, in inverted commas, play it safe at the start of the race by putting the, uh, the soft compound on. It served them well, to be fair, through the first chicane that was pretty treacherous. And, um, you know, they've been here many times before. They're in their... Uh, they're in their 12th event here uh, at Le Mans in a row. So they know this is about survival. Conditions like this, it's about survival. You've got to be there at the end. Uh, one quick question, and simply because I don't know, can I presume this is we're on the safety car for weather conditions? Weather and uh, shuntery and barrier but, but, repairs. But, but we've not seen a barrier repair. Uh, yeah, it was at Tete Rouge. Fine, uh, that, that's the... Um, the... Among, uh, probably among others. We also uh, we saw... Can. Immediately. We, <laughs> yeah, we also saw several cars uh, going off at Porsche Curves, so there may be work going on there as well, yeah. yeah we got Almost the energy. everybody is good for fuel, well, behind the safety car, for about the next hour and a half. Um, so that's not an issue. Even the 708 Glickenhaus can sit in the safety car queue until it needs to. Louise Beckett is in the pit lane. Louise, what do you know? I am just at Ferrari and I can see that the team are getting ready for both 50 and 51 coming in to change to a set of soft tyres for both of them. OK, the to you. thank um, you, Lou. Yes, by the look of it is the to Cadillac, that's Team Jota on pit lane as well, if they yay, from second place. The second, third, fourth and fifth place cars on track, now rolling their way down pit lane in what's been, well, an intriguing, a dramatic and astonishing Le Mans 24 hours so far, and we're not quite yet uh, at the end of the fourth hour. OK, safety car C has gone is going by the pits now, has gone by the pits now, that's got the race leading Peugeot in it. It stayed out on slicks, so it's now made two stops less than these guys because they came in for wets. They're now back in. Driver check. I mean, this is going to be full service. This is going to be now reset the race. Where are we? Four, uh, three hours, 45 minutes in. Give or take a second or two. Reset the race. OK, here we go. We're going to go back into the shuffle. We're going to be wherever we are in the queue, but we are going to have the right tyres, full tank of gas, new drivers. Louise Beckett. Well, that pit stop didn't go so well for Ferrari. As I said, both cars came in together, which we know normally doesn't happen. And uh, 
one of the mechanics from the 51 picked up a tyre from the 50 to put it on his car, and then they had to come back, give it back to the 50, and then get their correct tyre. A net result of that, by the way, is that the number two Cadillac has jumped both of the, the Ferraris in the queue. You can see it there, yeah. Good spot, Graham. So the uh, Jota is the the the, the Jota team, uh, Hertz team Jota Porsche is the gold car at the French queue. So you've got four hypercars there. Oh, trouble! Oh, Ninety-three. Three. Okay, not the race leader, but it is the other Porsche. Now, what on earth can he have done? That's his outlap. He's on slicks, Jev. Fresh into the car as well. No. Was Jean Eric Vernon Vern in the car before? He's on a, yeah, definitely on an outlap. It's outlap. on his outlap. What happened here? Bosan. Went around on him. Didn't have much in the way of revs on it, did he? Not at all. Just shows how low it is. White line? Gravel no, trap? No. It's just on the exit. Just, it's just no tyre temperature. Round it goes. I mean, I. I've been in this situation before where you're on those slicks and it's so painfully low grip. Mm. There's a little bit of dampness there still remaining and the team watch on and they just uh, wince because... Uh, and you could see so all four wheels spinning there as he tried yeah. to get it to move. Yeah. There was gravel flying up from the front wheels. Problem is, he let it roll back too much and it's beached itself. He's on mediums. How was the front wheel turning on that car in that situation? Because you because are... It was stationary. Yeah, because it should only deploy at 150 kilometers an hour. There is a rule that you're allowed to. We see them doing it in the pit lane as well. Yes, yes. you're allowed to. I think it's when the car is below a certain speed okay. as well. I, I, I would have thought that would be the case, and probably below pit lane speed limit, so 60 k. Exactly. Or backwards, um, by the way. Or now, backwards, the, yeah. The, the reason we know that's a medium and not an upside down W is the wet tire has a blue background to the W and the medium tire has a yellow background. So white is for the coldest conditions, that's soft. Yellow is for quite warm and sunny, that's medium. Red is for scotchio, like it has been all week until we get the, the biggest Ooh. race of the century. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the red background. Away goes that uh, train of four hypercars led by the 38 Hertz team Jota car. That car will come back out into sixth place ahead of the two. Cadillac, then the 50 and the 51. It is Ifeye, Alex Lynn, Nico Malena and Antonio Giovinazzi. Attention, first chicane and second chicane. That's from Antonio. Okay, we will go behind safety car A. We we'll go behind safety car A. They will do the merging, and after we should be eligible for pass around. I will confirm to you, but for the merging, nothing you have to do. We are already behind safety car A. I was just checking that on the tracker. Actually, have they come out behind? No. They have come out behind safety car A, but the leader is behind safety car C. So two safety car queues further back. So again, again, we're looking at nearly a full field wave route. Uh, 38 Jota, the Caddy, the two Ferraris, they all get the wave by. They'll stay on the lead lap. Information to pit lane, information to the pit lane. Safety car is at 80. We are recovering a car at MP20. We are recovering a car with a money to at MP20. So they've reduced the speed of the safety car, which normally be over 100 kilometers an hour to try and give them some chance of keeping tire temperature because there is the vehicle there in the gravel trap. So, Ant, you were saying you've got a theory about what happened here to Jean-Eric Van. Sometimes, if you've put the, uh, for whatever reason, if you put the full course yellow button on, you know, as, using that as a limiter, it can actually cancel out the traction control. Ah. I'm just wondering if something bizarre like that would have happened to him as he's tried to exit the corner. But it's not full course yellow, know, it's a safety car, so. That's the only thing mm. I can assume, but apart from that, you just have to say it must have been driver error carrying a bit of too much speed. But uh, Fuoco. Out from the number 50, a job very well done for him, you'd have to say. Very, very tough stint and what, a, what an experience as well for him to be here in the, uh, the top flight sports car event uh, category in the hypercar. It's, it couldn't have been any more difficult for him. Everything was thrown out of the drivers there. It doesn't look like he's hating his life at the minute, no. does it? I've, I've, I, we said after qualifying, it's just as well there's a day off because it's going to take him that long to, to, for the smile to recede so he can get his helmet back on. But again, you know, he's going to need to have two, uh, two double stints off to get, get it over the smile that's currently on his face. He's just... And actually, everything we've 
felt from this team, it's always the same. They're just loving doing this. Something different, something new for some of them, and, and something different, something new for the other half. Of it, whether they've come from Formula One or from G the GT program, it's all new, it's all discovering, it's all learning. Well, there's the 94 car. That is our race leader, 93 being craned away. It will, I think, be put on to terra firma and then sent back into the race. So hopefully, it, I mean, it prob probably won't cost them a lap because they will again, oh, I don't know. I think it is going to cost them a lap, isn't it? If they don't get that car moving soon, I can see on the, the screen will go that by. safety car A is quickly approaching the yeah. Mulsanne corner and he's waving, saying, come on, come on, come on, get put it me down. down, I've got to get down, going. Put me down, gently. He's going to go a lap down here. This is going to be very marginal indeed. To his own teammate. He's not even facing the right direction. Look at the gravel on the car as well. He's going to go a lap down. Oh, John Eric Van. Here we go, yeah. So this was coming into the Molsan corner. No one around him. He's just minding his own business on the right racing line, as number five did as well. And just, you can see it's a little bit slick there. Two uh, wheels on the outside on the wet. I mean, I mean it's greasy. Oh look, this is the onboard. No, well, this is the safety car queue, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Where yeah. Is uh, it? No replay. This is replay. Okay. Top left right. corner. Yeah. So he's not made it away. Safety car is on top of uh, outside corner now. And I'm not seeing the 93 car ahead no. of him. That's against the oh. replay. So he is going to lose that lap. Massive yep. penalty for such a simple mistake. Such not a curious. small mistake, yeah. yeah. So no, 93 still at Molzan corner. Safety car A now showing. Oh, hello. hello. Yeah. Into Europol and boom. What's okay. going on here That's in the queue? Something is. Box those back okay, up. pit entry is now closed, which means we are getting ready to merge. But I'm not sure what happened to the Inter Europol. And what was, what LMP2 car was that behind? It's the it? APR, was that the 28 APR. Jota? It's 34 um, Inter Europol. And look as these cars yeah. come back, come by. Let's see, it is. That's the 80 car. It is the 80 car. You're absolutely right. Yeah, of course, a car. The LMP. Yeah. Didn't but recognize it from the front because it's it got much more of a red, white, and blue tricolor on the front than uh, is normally the case. There is the Looked Corvette that started on pole and is now in where is it? I had a, that damper failure. It's almost the last running car in GTM. It's 15th place, the Corvette racing entry. That's bad news for them. They have a lot of work to do as we approach the end of hour four here at Le Mans. So the safety car remains out, but with the pit entry closed, Graham Goodwin and Davidson, Martin Haven watching the abated action with you, let's say. Uh, with pit entry closed, we're now going to see for the second time in this race how the wave arounds and the drop backs work. It, it sounds complicated when you, or looks complicated when you read it. Actually, when we talk about it, it is fairly straightforward. It, it certainly seemed to work very well the first time they executed that process. A couple of bits of housekeeping. The 93 car is now underway, but at the very back of what is now the merged uh, safety car queue. There's only one safety car. Oh, yes, hadn't noticed yeah. that. That's what the shuffling was going on. Which is on why the, pit entry is closed. Yeah, on the Mulsan. So they have merged. Normally, we are told that they're merging. But Do uh, they at least okay. get a chance to be behind, although a lap down, behind the hypercar category when it's all sorted yes, out? They, yes, 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 they will be the last car yeah. in, in hypercar. Um, the other little piece, piece of... Assuming that he moves, and he has not moved yet. He has moved now. He's on the back of the queue. Oh, has he? Yes, OK. Yes. Oh, no, so he has. Yes, it's he has. It's just done. a long, long uh, way. And <laughs> in fact, he's only about five or six cars behind the 94. So when they all get yep. wave round, although he's a lap back, he will be right behind Correct. the 94 car, uh, literally right behind it. The other bit, we saw those cars almost stationary coming down into Mulsanne Corner. That was the tail of the merged queue. Mm. So I just wonder whether or not they'd caught a slow moving queue yep. coming through an incident zone just a little too quickly, and that yep. was a little bit of avoidance, I think, what was going on yeah, there. Yeah, because but don't somebody forget... somebody wasn't very heads up there. The, the safety car coming down to where the Manitou was, rescuing Jev, yep. that was being told to slow down to well, 80 at that stage. So, yeah, you, you, I think they'd come barreling round off their 
safety car queues and then suddenly found that everybody was not going quite as quickly as they'd hoped. Well, here's the point. We we heard race control say safety car at 80 kilometres an hour managed mm -hmm. on track. Yeah. Now, we didn't hear that had been withdrawn. As far as we know, that was instruction. Yeah. They've only got themselves to blame. Well, we hear it and the teams hear it. The teams then have to tell the drivers. Drivers don't get radio in the car. They do get flag signals, but don't get radio. So... It is, yeah, it's a responsibility of the team to do it. I think a little tweak to the regulations uh, next time around for this event, obviously it's too late now, but it should state that if the, you have a merge of safety cars and there's still repairs going on on the barrier, mm. um, when you have that merge, obviously cars will be desperate to try to catch up with that, the, the leap, which is the safety car A. Mm. If you're set free, of course, you're going to blast past the, the incident zone. So for that incident zone, there should be a, uh, a slow zone. Which is why I think that Eduardo will not go for merge while there's anybody working on the track. Completely agree. But uh, still in situations like that, right, you, you, know, yeah. it, you, you can catch cars that are going much slower than you're capable of because you're not in that slow situation. Because of where that happened for uh, John Eric Fern. Great onboard shot one out that answers some questions. The uh, 93 Peugeot, by the way, is one of the worst you we thought it was for that car. That's now two laps down. That car's dropped down uh, to 30th position towards the tail of the LMP2 uh, train. And worse still, is behind the leader. So he's not going to get either of those laps back. No, he won't get either of the laps back. He won't lose any more to the leader immediately. What they might do is wave him by at the restart. Peugeot, I mean. Oh, yeah, they may well. Alpine won two at the moment, by the way. Stop the count. Mimu Rojas, we just saw him on board in the 36 car, leads Julian Canal in the third, other way around. Mimu Rojas in the 35 car, leads Julian Canal in the 36 car. And the big news for Alpine this weekend, today, yesterday, is that they unveiled an actual physical copy, a physical copy, physical version of their hypercar, which looks French sexy drop dead gorgeous. Uh, it's a great, great yeah. looking car. If that had been styled just to look good for a video game, I don't think they could have done a better job. If it works in the wind tunnel or on the track, it's going to be another awesome addition to the field next year. Here's a question for ex Peugeot driver uh, and Davidson. You're the team manager, and you've got the 93 car now out of position. It's going to be uh, behind their leading car on the road, but two laps down. You have the option. You can't effectively wave him by and allow him to gain back some of that lost time, or is he more useful to the effort as a rear gunner? Is he allowed to be waved by? He can be waved by by his own, own team car once they go back to green. OK, let's start thinking on the pass around. Let's start thinking on the pass around. I'm just just wait for, waiting for everyone to pass over intermediate one. My thinking would be, John Eric Van fresh in the car, fresh tyres, and should, if you wave him, if you wave him by right as it goes green, if he is directly behind the 94, wave him by, let the 94 sit in his slipstream, tow along behind him, that will give the 90, because otherwise, 94 is going to tow the 93 car, and whoever's in the queue behind, the Ferraris and so on, Profits are going to pick that. up all the slipstream. If you can put the 93 car, if you can put Jev ahead of race leader Gustavo Menezes, he will help Menezes in terms of top speed. And that might that might just help. Let you just explain, there'll be a lot of new viewers for the Le Mans 24 hours, what is going on? Well, and the answer is, this is wave by, okay. this is a long safety car queue. Because of the unique nature of this circuit, a uh, hugely long circuit, coming from three safety cars into one, uh, or there's three races in one, what this is, is cars that are in that safety car queue with their uh, class leader behind them, not losing a lap because of that. So listen what's going on with Johnny Brown. Yeah, we try to take as much fresh air as we can to cool down the steering. Let's try to take as much fresh air as we can to cool down the steering. Do you know, when we saw that last replay, I thought he's just like meandering over to the left as they go straight into the corner. Did his electric power steering lock up on him? I've Does it have electric that. power steering no. or is it electric hydraulic or is it hydraulic? I don't know. Was it, was it, that message before. Was it 
cause or effect? Did he have a problem in trying to get himself out? I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, it it's all it would explain why on his outlap, under safety car conditions, the car just looped around into the gravel. So what's happening now? The uh, wave by is any car that is has in the uh, the queue, it's class leader behind it, including hypercar, mm -hmm. will be allowed to pass the safety car and continue at some better speed around to join the rear of the safety car queue. And so far, one LMP2 car, has that just come out of the pits, 43? Uh, no, so that was already in the queue. One LMP2 car has gone by, all the GTE field, almost all the GTE field, and almost all the hybrid car field have gone by. Because in the safety car queue, what was the third of the safety cars had the LMP2 leader, and it also had the GCE leader, but then those pitted and changed. Yeah, so the, the Iron Dames are right at the back of this queue, which, yes, means, basically which means the entire field gets everybody. waved by and then joins in behind them. Well, to, to explain why that's a good thing, the reason this has been brought in is some years ago, early race safety car, which gave the, the top two cars in what was then GTE Pro mm -hmm. effectively a lap lead, and that was race done for two quick and reliable cars. This has been brought in to try to deal with that. Um, we're then going to get to a second phase of it. We'll describe that when we see it. Because talking about it is less effective than watching it and talking <laughs> about it. But this is all to do with keeping those races alive, not destroying those races because of circumstances that are nothing to do with it. Seeing Pascal Vastel in the, uh, the pit wall there at Toyota, he's not a fan, by the way, of this, uh, yeah. this new regulation. I bet he is now. I bet right this minute, I bet he is now, because his guys are coming all the way around to join on the back of the leader, not being... 10 cars in front of the leader as the safety cars released with a whole load of slow GTs in front of them. Because I bet he's a fan right now. Because the three safety cars did also ruin races sometimes. Yes. If you just yes. found yes. yourself yes. unluckily split into that second safety car, yep. you go, you, in such a tight field like we've seen today, that could have ended there, your chance well, of winning. Well, when Jota won a couple of years ago, they got a safety car queue ahead of everybody in one safety car, and then another one by darkness, They'd got basically a lap and a half on everybody. It was and last year. It was last lot. year. And and when, unless the car breaks or you have a major disaster, catching that amount of time is just so hard. The, the, I think the key to it is luck does play a part yes. in this game. It most certainly does. But what you don't want to do is to compound that luck mm. by just turning the knife. Um, there is no ideal system. This looks complex. We've seen it in operation. Actually, it worked very smoothly. And what, it will, what we'll end up with is the three races restarting in effectively race order in one queue. And that does two things. It's fairer in those three races. And the second thing is it's safer. Yep. Because you start all the fast cars, then all the next LMP2 cars, then you start the GT cars. Instead of having the race leader in the quickest car behind a gentleman driver in the middle of the night as it's raining, and trying to find his way through. The only thing I'm confused by here, and if I'm confused by it, then of course there'll be lots of people at home confused yep. by it as well. The Glickenhaus was able to overtake the class leader of LMP2, but the 93 Peugeot isn't. LMP2? Yeah. Look at the, the, the 93 Peugeot is still towards the back end of the LMP2 field, and the Glickenhaus has gone with the rest of the hypercars in front. And was, the Glicken, joined... was the Glickenhaus ahead of the 94? Yeah. The Glickenhaus yes, was, was in, in the, the middle safety of, car queue ahead of them. The Glickenhaus was in the middle of the LMP2 field. But it doesn't matter. It's, it, it's, it's his whether, own, whether or not he was... It's his own class yeah. leader. And his own class leader is the 94, 94 Peugeot. Peugeot. If he had the 94 Peugeot behind him in that queue, whether or not he's one lap, two lap, 15 laps down, he takes advantage. You still pass the field yep. around, so the fastest car, the lead car in, in each of our three classes has the rest of its field behind them. Again, that's the safety thing of restart. Part of it is so that when you get a safety car restart, you don't immediately get another safety car because of more collapses and more damage. But he is a lap behind still. Doesn't matter. Yes, yes. but what, what he's gained is effective. He's a lap and change. Mm. He's going to gain the better part of a lap. Uh, he then needs to catch and pass the race leader to get onto the lead lap. Yeah. Whereas he's almost two laps down. 
yep. in, in that situation. It, it doesn't matter if you spent 10 laps in the pits. When you're in the safety car queue, for safety reasons, you still start the leader of the fastest class with all the fast class cars behind, no matter how delayed they are. Glickenhaus could have lost 10 laps. It's still faster than the LMP2 and GT cars. Yep. So you don't start it behind them. You start it in front of them. Then you start the LMP2 cars, whatever their order is, relative to each other, doesn't matter. You start them all behind the class leader. Then you start all the GT cars behind the class leader. There's Patrick Dempsey in the Dempsey Proton garage. Great to see him back as well, enjoying his racing. So the 93 Peugeot has to, he has to wait until the LMP2 cars all drop behind him. Correct. On the, what, what are we calling that? The, 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 <laughs> The, the problem, wave around, drop back. The problem here back. is you're looking at the timing screen. That's not the order they are in on the road. Yeah, sure. That's just the order they are in in the race. So he's actually in the safety car queue, probably within one or two cars. This is, what this is trying to do is to give respect to the fact it's three different races. Yeah. That's, that, I think that's the, the, the easiest way uh, to, to explain it. it. It is confusing if what you're seeing is a morass of cars in a, in a kind of weird sort of order. The Glickenhaus has got, got done one of two things. It's either done it wrong or it was ahead of its... <laughs> that's uh, that's why I'm asking leader. the question. No, no, I agree. I don't okay. understand it. I, I think it's because it was ahead of the class leader. Okay. It was. Everyone was ahead of the class leader. Let's hear from the Toyota team. Do you think the, car, the truck is already faster on slick now? Did you say one or two laps still better with wet or straight away better with slick? We can wait one lap in case. But I think I think it's going to be way better. In one lap, it's going to be better. Kobe. Well, you can't in come in now. one lap, better with slick. No. Confirm. Can't come in out of that die is cast. You, you're, you're committed to the wet, clearly, which is the answer to the question we wanted half an hour ago. They're on wets, but as Michelin said, it will work in drying conditions as well, so they can pace themselves and decide when they want to come in. One of the quick messages we've seen on the screens here in the TV booth, but not seen reflected on the TV screens, is the 98 car. That's the uh, Northwest AMR car, the heart of racing car, yes. and the 911. Uh, 911. That's the prototype competition car. Uh, both reported to the stewards for not uh, obeying race director's instructions under the safety car. Now, when I was just off air a little while ago, bumped into one of the guys who's responsible for our full access program, Cedric. I said, how was it on the grid? Was it carnage? And he said, oh, my goodness, the stuff we've got from the grid is going to be epic, but it's going to take days and days and days to edit. If you have got a moment or two, you can just see on board the car there, the start, pass around, message coming up from race control. If you've got a day or two after the race and a little bit of uh, rub some sleep from your eyes, go to the FIAWC YouTube channel and check out full access. You can see the programs from Sebring, from Portimao and from Spa. And in about 10 days, you will see the program from Le Mans. We follow various teams around, lots of behind the scenes stuff and it is absolutely epic human drama and uh, it, it majors on the humans yep. more than it does on the cars and you're going to enjoy those i can't wait to see what they produce from the mark because this is just going to be spectacular so what's going on here just in case again to explain what you're seeing this is olivier Poir. he's uh, looking to catch up the back of the safety car train that's uh, jim glickenhaus the glickenhaus behind glickenhaus as if there was any other clicking house, <laughs> um, but cannot go any quicker than that because he's got a slower GT car ahead of him and he can't overtake. These are yep. still effectively under safety car, even though it's not in their sight, they're still under safety car. What we'll get at the point at which this is in order is we will then see the second, the next phase of this process. So all the cars have now been waved around. Any car in hypercar, or LMP2 or GTE that was in the safety car queue ahead of its class leader has whizzed around the track and is now in the back of the safety car queue. Here's the Floyd Van Wall car, back of the safety car queue, because the 94 Peugeot is at the front of the queue, that's the hypercar leader. Now you'll see the next phase, LMP2 prepare for drop back. That means the LMP2 cars uh, in squadron order, if you like, will move to one, so there you go, one side of the, uh, of the track. They will then allow the rest of the field to pass them. And the first car that went through was the 94 Peugeot. The next hypercar is 93. All 
cars to wear totally to the left, no zigzagging, all cars to wear totally to the left, no zigzagging, LMP2 prepare for the drop back. LMP2 prepare for the drop back. That okay, is the so LMP2 field. Yeah. That's the message the team got about 30 seconds ago, maybe a minute ago. You can see the whole LMP2 field is now behind the LMP2 leader, which is the 35 Alpine, and they've pulled over to one side. So all of the hypercars that were mingled in that queue go past. Yes. All the GTE cars that are mingled in that queue also go past. Well, then what happens is LMP2 drops to the back of the... The whole LMP2 field is at the back. Then all the GTE cars pull out, and then they drop back behind LMP2. And that's car first. OK, but yes, all right. But you're right, yes. So, so, yeah, yeah the, the Garage 56 NASCAR will drop back because it is behind LMP2 but ahead of GTE. OK, so there you go. We, again, again, great, you know, it, it, there's no chance that the driver won't know what's going on. Because of this onboard message system, this safety system, race control can tell each car in a group each car in a class, the entire field, or one specific driver, a message that they want to send to him. Okay, Jose, if the safety car comes in this lap, if the safety car comes in this lap, we follow the safety car in pit lane, but you need to let car eight go in in the pit entry because of the uh, pit position. So what we were speaking about before, they've got a, you know, one car has to be in front of the other one in regards to their pit box to stop what we saw earlier on happening to the Ferrari where it had a, unfortunately, a, a different category of car, a Porsche, I think it was, a, one of the GT amp cars in the way. So he had to pull in front of that Porsche and sort of nose it in, get the car onto the trolleys so then you could get it square, drop the car down, do your pit stop. It does take extra time to do that. So this is Toyota saying, look, if you do come in and the safety car comes in this lap, be prepared to let your teammate overtake you just so we can, as a team, have a faster pit stop. So as soon as the LMP2, now car 24, as it goes on the, uh, the uh, timing screens, Jensen button pulls over to the right-hand side of the track, he will now drop back and will join the queue behind the LMP2 queue. And once that's completed, they'll continue to complete the manoeuvre with exactly the same with the GT and cars. I have to say, uh, by the way, with what, when you read it when, and, and you, you hear it, <laughs> you it complex, you go, the drivers of the teams have executed this absolutely perfectly. Yeah, they really have. And uh, it has been rehearsed and it's been tried out a couple of times in real world and a lot of times in the virtual world to, to really kind of try and iron this out. Now. The, other, the only other element of this that could go wrong may possibly have gone wrong for the Corvette because they believe that a group of cars, including the class leader, were erroneously allowed to leave the pit lane and join a safety car queue that they shouldn't have been allowed to join. And so the Corvette has been stuck behind its class leader the whole time and will, as a result, not get... There's the pink... Porsche, that's the class leader in GTM, and the Corvette team believe it, it and a number of other cars were allowed to join a, a safety car queue they shouldn't have been allowed into. They were allowed out too soon as another safety car queue was coming they should have been held. But again, you know, pit exit has got to be 100% accurate on this, not holding cars too long and also not allowing them out when perhaps they shouldn't have been. Well, let's catch up with the other of our Toyotas. Okay, Brendan, we are thinking to stay out one lap, and we want to stay out one lap as we think the pit uh, will LMG be very full. LMGTs, prepare for the drop back. LMGTs, prepare for the drop back. And while we're listening and waiting for that drop back to happen for GTEs, confirmation that the two cars that were under investigation for not LMGTs, obeying... LMGTs, start the drop back. LMGTs, start the drop back. We're not, uh, we're not, we're under investigation for not obeying Eduardo Freitas instructions no further action on the 9098 or the 911 so that's one we can consign to the the bin of infinity so the gts dropping back past go all our hypercars and now, followed by all our lmp2s you, car 24 well done and also followed by the number 24 car the garage 56 nascar um what we get a chance couple of things bit of housekeeping first of all if you're enjoying this 
then why not sign up for the WEC app? You can enjoy the rest of the season, which will include the races in Monza, in Fuji and in Bahrain for the Grand Sum. Oh, and the rest of this race, by the way, if you choose to swap from wherever you are, £9.99 in the Safety UK. Safety car instructed to go at full speed. Safety car instructed to go at full speed. And immediately does so, pulls away from the leading Peugeot. So two Peugeots in the front of the field now, but that is Peugeot leading, the Peugeot that has lapped down, two laps down in fact, and in 14th. Yeah, but again, Peugeot can be neat with their strategy if they really think about it. And I mean, as a punter, I'm thinking, okay, Wave the 93 car in front as soon as you can and try and use him to put, poke the hole in the air for the 94 car. The two of them will go quicker together than for 94 to try and hold off the rest of the hypercar field. The number six Porsche, the number seven and eight Toyota, which are third, second, third and fourth. They're right behind in the queue. It's going to be a tough job to shuffle because look at Kevin Est. He's right up the gearbox of Jean-Éric Verne. So I'm not sure that Peugeot even have that opportunity now. I think uh, as well, you know, you, you do have the blue flag. So as soon as it gets going, he's going to have a, a face full of blue flags yeah. from all around the track and also the marshal system within the car that we just saw in operation with the uh, with the drop back. So um, I, I can't see any other way around it, Martin, that he's just going to have to allow this huge stream of hypercars past and not be in their way. I just have to try not to allow them too easily, that's all. Uh, we wait to, wait to see exactly what the long and short of that issue with Jean-Eric Van. They talked to him about cooling his steering. So anyway, safety car remains out and uh, we are approaching four and a quarter hours into the race. Just a quick hello to friends of the show. Hello, Dunk. I'm sure he is enjoying the race as much as anybody else. Didn't and uh, birthday probably, last week? probably with the time. Is he 50 already? I thought he was way older than that. It's he looks years. good on it, though. You know. It's not the years, it's the miles. <laughs> Enjoy a tonic or two while you are watching the action. In all seriousness, though, guys, it's, it's still not fully dry. Yeah. Look at oh, it. Look, you can no, see the hay, the, the steam coming off as, it, uh, as that warm track dries, but you can still see where they're driving. They're leaving tracks. So this is still wet enough that if or when they do get going under green, the safety car peels in, they're on slicks now, as we know. This ain't over yet. They're not there's on a, hot a, slicks a, either. They're not on hot slicks. Now this, the pit, this ain't over. pit entry is now open because this, uh, uh, this procedure is done. We wait for confirmation that the Porsche 911 to arrest club sport that car uh, will be pulling into pit lane at the end of this lap so this explains why they've all decided to go onto the soft michelin tires for yeah. especially in the hypercar category because yeah it's still not fully dry and the further that sun starts to set the longer it's going to take obviously to, to dry up and also the track temperature is not going to climb it was about 27 degrees when they looked 10 or 15 minutes ago it's not going to get any warmer so in fact as we start to head into the evening Soft will be more and more the relevant tyre choice. OK, as so we box this lap, box, box, press pit, confirm. We need you to stop in front of United, let car eight pass him by and then go to your position. Is the quickest for both. That's always going to be hard, isn't it? Right, let him go in front of me going into the pit lane. Safety car in the slap, safety car in the slap. Remember, no overtaking before the line. No overtaking before the line. There's been a shift change in the uh, race control as well. Eduardo Freitas, I'm sure, busy uh, parlaying fondly to everybody to make sure things go as they should do. Safety car has rocketed away. Big gap behind the two Ferraris, the Glecker now is closing it now, but uh, just goes to show perhaps less uh, comfortable in those prevailing wet conditions yeah. at those speeds and the uh, whichever the two clicking houses uh, that is so are the two toyota that are they lower than anybody else on energy we haven't seen that graphic mm, for they would know that mm, they've stopped more recently haven't you see haven't they so they were so pretty they much no everybody was pretty much okay so the energy plan graphic, here energy graphic. they're changing purely for tires they're on wets don't forget I saw some slicks ready for Toyotas when they came in before. Remember, no overtaking before the line, no overtaking before the line. Green flag. 
Back to green flag racing at Le Mans after four hours and nearly 20 minutes of high octane action. Peugeot leads as a slew of cars that are on the wrong choice on this drying track come into the pit lane. Now is the chance for Peugeot to get the 93 car unlapped and onto the lead lap ahead of its teammate. In come the Toyotas. They have swapped positions. Here's the battle now for second place. 75 Porsche Penske Motorsport car of Nicholas Tandy. Was he in trouble with his mum? Yiffy Yi in third place dives down the inside of Nick Tandy. Nice move. Wow. And to do, that on, to do that on Nick Tandy as well, in the same car, it's the, it's the same Porsche. 75 took time to get up to speed before as well. I wonder if Porsche are having trouble bringing their tyres back up to temperature in these tricky conditions. He's got the Cadillac, the number two car. That's oh Alex Lynn in his first stint in the car. And the Ferraris. Here comes Miguel Molina in 50 and Antonio Giovinazzi in 51. And behind the two Porsches, Dane Cameron and Esteban Gutierrez is the next car up in the, the order. But look at this, three wide. Dane Cameron on the oh. inside, inside, inside. Takes them both. He does take them both. Stunning stuff from the Porsche driver. Wow. That was... 10 out of 10 in terms of risk, but he luckily got away with it. There was contact between himself and the number 50 Ferrari. Jota to the lead. Jota have taken the lead of the Le Mans 24 hours. All Herbst right. Jota are ahead. Now that must be the, the 93. Car. The 93 lapped Peugeot is the one that you can see at the front of the queue. So the 94 car's Here going slowly 51. down the inside. Here comes Giovinazzi leaning on Dane Cameron. Cameron says, no, Giovinazzi can't get through. Dane Cameron, 11 out of 10 for effort, and here comes Miguel Molina in the 50 car. Wicked snap as he gets on the power end. Well, we've seen earlier on in the race, well, the first lap of the race, just how costly that can be when you get a snap of oversteer in these damp conditions on slicks. Brilliant stuff from Dane Cameron, though. Well, where, 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 hang on a minute. OK, how is the 75 car slow away? And yet Yiffy Yi has gone from wherever he was at the restart, fourth or fifth, he's leading. It's, I mean, this is all about confidence. We've seen jean Gavin spin it round, loop it round under snail pace around the corner they've just been around. IFA on the attack here. The battle, no, that's not that. Yes, no, that is. That is the 94 car. The that's 93 the is lapped and ahead. jean Gavin has gone, and 94 can't stay with him. So Yiffy Yi retakes the lead from Gustavo Menezes. Menezes looking again and right behind him is Dan Cameron. Cameron is absolutely on a tear. Outside, around into Indianapolis. That's not a brave move, is it? Brilliant move. He's absolutely on fire here, but Yiffy Yi is doing exactly what he's doing. So this is a, a quality showdown now between these two. Well, Epic now stuff. then, cooler track temperatures, and suddenly the Porsches are electrifying. This is phenomenal stuff. And look at the Peugeot. Both Ferraris just going straight by it, out of Arnage. It's the different strengths in different parts of the circuit. We talked about the start of this race, gentlemen, coming into play before our very eyes. Changeable conditions, partly dry track, partly sopping wet, and, of course, the transition between the two. Magical stuff again. This is absolutely brilliant. I really do apologise to teams and fans of teams in LMP2 and GTE Am, but I defy you to tell us when we should cut away from this to show their battles, and their battles will be equally epic. Jota still lead in LMP2 from Vector Sport, and the Iron Dames lead in GTE. Hey, mate, I'll say again, we're going to have to look after this tyre, so I know you can do a better job than the car cars in front. If you do that, we'll get them in the second stint, so no risk, OK? Very early. Canal out of the pits and into the barriers. This is his outlap. This 36 Alpine is one of the two cars that was running 1-2 early in the safety car. They came in and changed for tyres. They've come in and changed again. Clearly, he has not got to grips with that car in the slippery conditions. And Dane Cameron pulling, uh, Giffy E rather, pulling away from Dane Cameron. And this is, this is exactly where Yiffy Yee's WRT car died on him on the last lap of the race two years ago. <laughs> Hertz Team but... Jota lead the Le Mans 24 hours. This is yeah. the incident Again. for 36, snaps away. And that's what could have happened to the Ferrari. A very similar snap, yeah. but Julian Canal just couldn't catch it. The other point here is Jota lead both prototype categories right now. What a moment for the little team from the UK. Absolutely wow. astonishing. It wow. only their second race with this car. More pit stops. Leader, uh, the former leader is in, 94. So he was clearly on wets as well. Now he'll be on to softs too.
And, oh, look at this, lots of LMP cars coming in. Uh, the uh, Nick Tandy's car, 75, that's why he didn't get up to speed. He's come in for tyres as well. Clickenhouse, 709, that's in for tyres from eighth place. So sixth, seventh and eighth as they came into the pit lane. And it is now Jota in the Hertz Team Jota Porsche. Penske Porsche Motorsport with Dane Cameron. That's the one, two. The red Ferraris, three, four. The yellow highlights, that's the 50 car. The white highlights, that's the 51 car. Okay. Interesting message, wasn't it, to uh, Giovinazzi saying, look, we know we, if you just play it safe now, we know we can come back stronger in the second stint. Yep. They're confident of their tyre management pretty clearly. So, at the moment, just out of the pits, will be wor working their way back up the field as others work their way through their strategies. Phenomenally different strategies past the 708 Glickenhaus. So, further lap down for that car. And that is for position, by the way. At this stage, sorry, that's the 709, but is for position. Looking now, in eighth position as we currently stand, and that car is running away out of the pits. So it's been a solid race so far for the 709. Also, Still just out of the pits is Alexander Sims in the Action Express Cadillac 311, the car with the red nose that crashed on the opening lap in the really wet conditions of the first chicane. Yeah, 16 laps down that yeah. car, but running well, but 16 laps is a long, long way back. Hard on the brake, see how much energy still is in the tank of the number six Porsche. Fresh out of the pits on the last lap, going by the 777 D station, Aston Martin. Aston Martin struggling here, 98 cars out. And the number six car steaming up behind. Kevin Estra really pushing hard. Trouble for 311 on the outlap, just said he'd only just left the pits. Three minutes stop and go for the 22 United car for causing that collision that was right at the beginning, just before the beginning of the safety car period. And there is the Toyota just ahead of the number six Porsche. That is the battle for eighth place. Flying down into Mulsanne Corner comes the number eight Toyota. There's the number seven Toyota with the Glickenhaus on an outlap. Esteban Gutierrez. Look at these two Toyotas under pressure. The eight car, uh, that is who now? Uh, Brendan Hartley under pressure from Kevin Est. And behind him, Jose Maria Lopez. Four position, Esteban Gutierrez in the Glickenhaus. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we've seen Dave Cameron hustle this, uh, this Porsche. Kevin Estra will be looking to see that, show that he can do just exactly the same. Again, we come into another phase. Yes, it's frustrating. We've been for quite some time on the safety car, but again, they've lit the blue touch paper, and the whole field's come alive again. Uh, it is Jota leading LMP2 from the previous leader, the 36 car uh, that was in the barriers and has dropped right back down through the field to 16th. A pit stop, a mistake for Julian Canal. Back to Sport in second place in LMP2 right. with the number 10 car in the hands of Keenan van der Helm and Albert Costa. Third, I uh, beg your pardon, it's Panis Racing's team about the help. Third behind Matthias Kaiser. And in fourth place is Albert Costa for Inter Europol. So, I mean, oh, that's the 311 Ants just caught himself out on the curbs. That's how it happened. Yeah, By exactly. the way, a further drama for Cadillac. The number three car will be getting a 60 second stop and hold penalty for a technical infringement. <laughs> Well, Kevin Estrin, more hustle than a hustly thing, but over-hustled himself on the curbs there, and he's now gone from attack to defence. He was on the back of the number eight Toyota. Number seven is now breathing down his neck. Yeah, that was a big mistake there by Kevin Est, just in the uh, in the karting corner, threw the car in too early, clobbered the curbs on the inside, and that catapulted the car on the exit. So, uh, yeah, now under attack from the Toyota behind, like you say, Brendan Hartley, uh, no, sorry, the car number seven, uh, right behind Jose Lopez. Yeah, Lopez. Uh, behind them, by the way, coming through the chicane, you saw the black, red and gold of the Belgian colours on the DKR engineering car. That's now back out again and under steam with Tom van Rompuy at the wheel, but they had that incident earlier on. They were clattered by somebody else, and unfortunately it cost them a lot of time in the pits. Great battle. This is at the bottom end of the top ten, and these are two previously world championship winning teams in the eight and the seven Toyota. Bit of a wiggle there from uh, Jose Maria Lopez through the left hander of the S's. So uh, both Kevin Estra and Lopez pushing on. Brendan Hartley in front of that trio. Starts to get into the rhythm now. 
Cadillac taking that stop and hold. Another three car from 12th position. That is going to drop them back further. Will not lose a position though, because the next car in the order is a 708, which is a further lap behind. So it's lap and change now for Ryan Briscoe in the 708. But uh, really hectic action is way further up the field. If a yay, 3.4 seconds for the good now for Dave Cameron. Yeah, he was almost a second faster than Dave Cameron on that last lap alone. I don't know if traffic had anything to do with that, but Ife Yehi in that 38 Jota is absolutely flying. Oh, and Esther as well, that co's got to stop driving it a bit like maybe he was this time last year in, his, uh, in the GTE car, because these uh, more stiffly sprung, lower ride height cars, these prototypes, they don't like going over those kind of curves in the chicane, so uh, he just twitched. It, it really protested on him when he did that, so... Uh, He's got the speed, it's just, I just feel like he needs to stop attacking the racetrack quite as much as he is. Yeah, track limits on that last lap as well, so it's been noted that the aggression is there. Yeah, lap time was deleted. It doesn't affect the overall standing of the car, but... It counts towards a potential penalty later in the race if he keeps doing it. Exactly so. Just to say a quick hi to uh, former colleague Alan Bestwick, who's tuned in back home in the US. I think there's an awful lot of fans who have just kind of flicked off to see, oh my goodness, I can't take my eyes off this stuff, and are probably in for the rest of the 24 hours. Yeah, joker lap there. Oh, dear me. It's Dane Cameron. And that was a big moment for the number 50 Ferrari as Miguel Molina went through for second place. He'll get a penalty for that. You're supposed to stay on that road to the right-hand side. <laughs> He's rejoined. Big get out of jail free car played by Dane Cameron without which he could have been heavily in the wall. But Anthony Davidson, you're right, he should have stayed to the right hand side of the blue line. Now, not being a huge regular at Le Mans, he may well not have remembered that in the panic to avoid the wall and not try and lose second place. But he did lose second place, he's now between the two Ferraris. As Hurst Team Jota's Yippee Yee is now Graham Goodwin. Eight. Seconds ahead. That's, well, that's helped him, obviously, because with uh, Dane Cameron having that moment, and there would have been a minor lift, I'm sure, for Miguel Molina, that's made all that difference. I'm not sure he could follow the race director's instructions. Um, he was clearly not in total control of that car at that moment. That's the one saving grace that might save him. He was not under control. I mean, I, I've... You're out of control and you've rejoined the, the racetrack in a dangerous manner. They, they really don't... They, they frown upon that. Yeah, and they, board, they will way, still it, in the middle of. If he had track. enough, if he had enough control to find the racetrack, he had enough control to stay on the on the tarmac on the right. This is notable. jean Verne, Verne, uh, obviously two laps down on the leader, but right behind the race leader, has just set the fastest first sector of the race so far in the 93 Persia, and is looking to unlap himself from Ife Not, Not even slightly all. annoyed, I imagine. <laughs> and into the right at the start of the, the safety car. Four and a half hours into the 24 hours of Le Mans. Hello, Ted. Hello, Morgan. And hello, Matt, watching back home. I'm sure there are lots of fans from 3 to 93 tuned in to watch the race. Wherever you are across the world, thank you for joining us. However you're watching, thank you for joining us. Stay with us. I'm not sure this race is going to lose much of its sheen in a hurry. We're looking for another slow zone coming in for I think it's an incident. Board. Yes, board. But, uh, for that, uh, yeah. Uh, board that Dane Cameron knocked out of the way. There is Dane Cameron in the middle of the Ferrari sandwich. Here comes the 51 car, long way round the outside. There's been a lot of brave overtaking using the margins, Anthony. He's had to back out of it, though, because of that slow zone. No yeah. overtaking under yellow flags in the next slow before you get to the slow zone. It was just coming active as he was going for the move, so he's that was a critical moment there for the Ferrari driver to back out of it. There is the polystyrene board that yeah. Dane Cameron uh, dislodged. I uh, just wonder, if he can prove he was on the brakes the whole way yeah. into the corner, desperately trying to slow down, he might get away with it. There is going to be a gap here for them to be able to recover that. This should be a quick slow zone. There's another six. Let's oh, have puncture. an in. Puncture, right puncture. puncture. Oh. Now, is that from the off, or did that cause the off? It's right a rear. right rear. Yeah. Six car. Kevin Est. Now that's OK, so it wasn't Dane Cameron no. that, that, that had the punch. I was, wonder uh, if that, that was the five car. Sorry, guys. I wonder if that happened on the exit of Karting Corner when he when he got the car launched momentarily. When it, there's such savage uh, yes. dips in the track. And we were told all the time as drivers not to venture out too far. 
Yeah, they say. There have been remarkably few punctures to this race. It's something we see very often at the moment. It's a completely unique track surface. Remarkably few punctures. You actually said that. And don't forget the debris field under the Dunlop curve. We saw them at the Dunlop Bridge. We saw them drive for a few times. He's so he's far good. away from home here. He's already he's, gone there. He's so far yeah. away from home that oh, he's going to... That's gonna... where it goes. That's the moment. He's so far away from home here, he's going to have to really limp home. He's going to really have to go so the other way. He's going to fray the bodywork beyond repair. As painful as it is, you have to respect the speed limits that the team would have set in place for... A, a puncture like that. So the number 51 continues to chase down Dane Cameron in front. So Hertz Team Jota, 32.87 seconds from Ife Yate, the fastest first sector. So the, the speeds are going north here. New leader in GTE Am, and there's another twitch to the five car this time. Off he goes, just briefly. Manages to regain the track, Dave Cameron, but it's, that's a second uh, error that has caused a second position loss to a second Ferrari. Such tough conditions out there. Graham, you know, breaking into that first chicane, you go a little bit too deep and then you're onto the wet stuff. He did well, actually, to slow it down there. Uh, there are, there's a similarity, by the way, between uh, all three class leaders right now. They all begin with uh, a team operated by the other than uh, Jay. Two of them are Jones, and the other one, JMW Motorsport, the oldest car in the field, leads GTM 2017 wow. Ferrari 488. Debuted here in 2017, won that race and has contested every single Le Mans 24 hours and every single European Le Mans series race since. Second place battle in LMP2 is in your shot. The yellow and green car, that's into Europol's Albert Costa. The next car behind, the Zebra car with the red, white and blue nose. That is the third place car, that's Prem uh, A, of course, is Norman Nato. So that is the battle for second place in the LMP2 class. You can see the blue flags waving behind as there's more hypercars coming up behind, because there are a lot of hypercars to come up behind you this year. EFA has just set the fastest first sector. Yes. Yep. Oh, did you mention that? I did, no, yeah. No, but, but, but he's, he, he was actually fending off uh, the, the guy who just set the, two lap, uh, what, the lap before, which is Sean Eric Verne, who, by the way, has just gone extremely quickly again. It's a proper battle here for Ife Ye to keep Sean Eric Verne lapped. Um, the other quick thing to mention here, as we have a quick look aboard the 51 Ferrari, this yes. was the moment where he just couldn't hold it, could he gain Cameron? The yellow flags at Marshall's post 24, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, JMW Motorsport from Protons 88, it's Harry Tinkler, by the way, who'll be in hypercar next race in the FI World in Jones Championship with the next debuting hypercar, Proton Competition's new 963, and the A, of course, of 54 Ferrari completes the top three. GTM, well alight, LMP2, well alight, hypercar, a burning inferno. <laughs> it's, 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 it's been ridiculous, uh, and thank goodness we've had a couple of long inch and safety car periods because of weather and damage because otherwise I think we'd have peaked too soon we'd be needed to go for lie down in a dark room. Here are your two for um, right, your two Toyotas, the number eight car, number seven car running in eighth and ninth place and didn't have either the ability or the confidence to change from wet weather tyres onto slicks when most of the rest of the field was doing so behind the safety car. Maybe they just felt they were in the wrong safety car queue and, and couldn't do it, but either way, they stayed on wet weather tyres too long. It is a wet that will survive on a drying track, but the track was pretty much a, a, a guaranteed slick track, or slick tyre demanding track, and Anthony, I just they, they, they lost out because yeah. they just didn't react the way that everybody else did. I just feel like Ferrari caught them napping a little bit there by changing onto the uh, the slick tyre. It was clear that it was going to dry up in, in that lengthy procedure with the safety car. And uh, Toyota stayed out there. For whatever reason, they stayed out there on the wet tyre, only coming in when the safety car... I think as soon as they started to do... The thing that Ferrari realised was they were going to obviously do the merge of the safety cars, and in that situation, the pit lane light, uh, in light closes, up, closes uh, it comes on. So when it starts to merge, you have 
no options come in anymore until the safety car comes in. Yes. And that's what Ferrari read perfectly well. Stop and go for the number three Cadillac, by the way, was a tyre pressure issue. Right, so there is a mandated minimum pressure and maximum camber angle by Michelin, the tyre supplier for Hypercar. So clearly, it was under the minimum tyre pressure, which will have been a heating pressurising error by the team. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, that's what uh, the penalty was for. And lots of monitoring done, live monitoring at that from these cars, some of which is monitored directly from the, uh, the rail makers, some of which has to be provided, mandated by the teams. If a yay meantime, he is 13.2 seconds ahead of Miguel Mullen. And what a race! Uh, well run from him since his race went back to green. We're just seeing a slow mo of the number six Porsche of Ken Est, and here he is in the pit lane. I was just about to say, he has faded into the pit lane after picking up that right rear puncture. And I wonder whether there will be collateral damage, whether they will winch him back into the garage just to check everything else out. Well, they've lost the lap, uh, which is the, the, the major, major damage here, and that's going to be a fight back now, and fingers crossed and hope that there's going to be a safety guard that might help him later this race. There's still a mere 19 hours and 20 minutes to go, by the way, gentlemen. Well, they're changing the tail. I wonder if there's more to go. Oh, changing second place. There's the F Corsa car, number 80. It's now... Uh, Norman Nato in second, ahead of Albert Costa, the green and yellow into Europol car. That's the LMP2 second place battle. How far behind are they? Behind the leader, Jota's number 20. Uh, I can't read that. 28 car, Oliver Rasmussen. Uh, 10 seconds behind Oliver Rasmussen. Yeah, so a good restart from Jota again. They're executing beautifully uh, in the uh, in the leading car. Car number five reported to the stewards for overtaking car 100 under the safety car. That is the Dane uh, Cameron. Dane Cameron Porsche. Hasn't been a happy 10 minutes for the Porsche Penske Motorsport no. team, no. has it? Puncture for number six, off road excursion, and possible penalty for unsafe rejoin, and a possible penalty for passing behind the safety car for the number five car. Uh, you were mentioning earlier huge audience worldwide for this race every year never more so than this year and lots of different ways to follow it whether or not it's uh, with this broadcast with our colleagues elsewhere here uh, in the tv family if you're enjoying it go and tell people you're enjoying it go and tell people just how awesome this race is developing to be it's a brand new era for sports car racing yeah. there's lots of ways you can spread some positivity on social media absolutely shout it from the rooftops because if you know anybody who's even remotely a car fan who doesn't know about Le Mans, this is, you know, this is the perfect time. There's, there's rarely been a better time. There's Kieran Est having got out of the car. Little red-eyed. Yeah, he's disappointed. I wonder how he got that puncture. I mean, obviously we've seen there's been an awful lot of debris all over the track. I'm surprised. Yeah, like you say, Graham, we haven't seen more of it. Kind of. Convinced, I've convinced myself that he's it's because of running out in that yes. karting corner. Well, yeah. One thing I'll say about that is you can see in his face, couldn't you? He feels like he's let himself down, he's let the team down, he's let the tie down. Oh, oh, <laughs> uh, in the queue, by the way, I was just looking at the JMW Motorsport Ferrari. That car, no longer the class leader, AF Corsa now leads with the 54, the silver Ferrari in GTE Am, and it should be, no, it's not in this queue, so the JMW car is the dark yellow and black, and it's behind the bright bile yellow car guy Kessel Racing Ferrari, so that's actually a battle for sixth and seventh, but A, of course, a lead from Proton Competitions number 911, that's the silver car with the black rear end, and that is being driven by Estonia's Martin Rump, and. Arnold Robin is third. TF Sports Aston Martin, the 72 car. That's the blue car with the green highlights. That's up to third. There's the third place car in LMP2. Albert Costa losing a little bit of ground now to Norman Nato. Costa's got a lot of single seater and then GT racing heritage. So a GT3 program would definitely be a good match for him. I think he might be looking more to be perhaps angling towards a hypercar drive down, dives to the inside of the second of the Inter Europol cars. And that second Inter Europol car, which is his teammate, the white car with the green and yellow stripes, 
is being driven by, I can't see it on the entry list, it must be on page two, that's being driven by, oh, Kevin Magnusson's dad. Kev's dad? Yeah, so Albert Costa tucked up Jan Magnusson right like that. There he is, the Dane. I think that car's just at a penalty. I'm trying to recall, and I'm struggling to do so, but uh, that 32 car not had a very error-free and trouble-free no, run it, so it far. It was dropped off the road in the wet weather running earlier. There's Michelle Gatting in the Iron Dames garage. Uh, the, the next car in the queue, by the way, in the blue car with the orange highlights, that's 65. That's Olivier Panis's Panis Racing entry, and that's got Matthias, uh, I beg your pardon, Timon van der Helm at the wheel of that car. So that car is in fourth place in LMP2. Fastest sector time set by oh, Alex Lin. He's robbed it from uh, IFEA, so he's flying in, in the uh, Cadillac number two. Getting a lot of GT action here. This is the battle for third. The pink Porsche, that's the Iron Dames car of Sara Bovi. She's fourth, right in front with the blue and green of Matra and Pescarolo. That's Arnold Robin in the TF Sport 72 Aston Martins. This is the battle for third in the GTE AM class. So she was in the lead of that class um, a while ago, and I did see her just at the top of the screen as we were focusing on the hypercar category coming out the uh, first chicane. It looked like she might have run out a bit wide and gone straight through the chicane. Um, I'd, I'd like to see a replay of, of that moment if, if we have a chance. But uh, yeah, definitely something was going on. That she was completely offline anyway on the exit of, uh, of that first chicane. Right, right started going by. Yep, yeah, yeah, the, right there. By the 72 TF Sport car, the colours of Henri Pescolo Matra, the, the, uh, the also TF Sport run 777 car. <laughs> D-Station Racing, some fur way further back down the order. Yep. That car running in 12th, Casper Stevenson uh, unlaps himself from the new fourth place car and is pushing on to try to do the same and get back onto the lead lap here. See the headlights flashing in the air, of course, the car of Norman Nato. He's got a hypercar behind him, that's one of the two Glicken houses. And behind him is the 34 car that he just passed into Europol's. Uh, um, uh, Albert Costa. Yeah, I think that is the 709 car. The 708 is the car with the art car uh, dorsal fin, if you like it. Look to yep. me to be the white finned 709. The better place of the two cars. Clouds are clearing, Anthony Davidson. Track is drying, but the sun is dipping. Oh, it's nearly, very nearly gin and tonic time. Anywhere. At this time of day, low sun can be a, a major issue, major handicap for the drivers. It is, yeah, especially on that run down towards Indianapolis with a setting sun, then in the morning when we finally get there, there's still 19 hours to go. Um, you've got the rising sun on the way into Tetra Rouge, and that's equally as blinding. So, uh, yeah, combined with the fact that you have bugs and dirt and things all over the windscreen, when you get into the, the setting sun, the, the low sun situation, it's, uh, it's a very hard challenge, one that uh, not many drivers will ever experience in their careers until you drive here at Le Mans. Oh, there's a yellow flag, you can see the top left-hand side of the screen, the graphic there. That's Bolzac. Uh, that's, sorry, that's the first uh, chicane, the Daytona chicane on the Bolzac. Uh, I'm looking to see whether or not that's debris or a car stopped there. It is the number 74 car. Kessel Racing Ferrari. That's the Battle Cats car. Ask his son. Come through the kitty litter, the cats. Oh, I see. Very good. But back underway. Seeing lots of uh, personal bests uh, and fastest sectors out there. Nick Tandy now is his turn. Or Nicholas Tandy, as you said before, Martin, on our screens. Is, uh, is fastest in the first sector, and that was a well, big blow to the right it? front, wasn't it? Kind of snap back and hit the, the uh, right rear too, so hopefully no damage or no further damage for the 74. We'll keep an eye on that one. Well, we said it, we predicted it was going to be pretty difficult conditions for all the drivers once we went back to green racing, and uh, yeah, unfortunately we're, we're being proven right in uh, many occasions, but it's good to see them getting away with it, but it, it's... This hasn't been an easy Le Mans so far for the really, drivers. It really, really hasn't. Uh, the 80 car, AF Corsa, goes through its next pit stop. Norman Nato on pit lane will cycle back through some of this field. Oh, what's happened yeah. to car number seven? This oh. is Jose Maria Lopez off in the first chicane. Well, a rattle for the Felix he hasn't got. Better to do it that way round than running too wide, like we saw with the Ferrari number 74 beforehand. So, uh, different angle. 
He's got away with that one. Rode it well, didn't it? Let's say mixed reception to the new safety car rules uh, among the audience who have been uh, reacting to them on Twitter. Just, uh, again, they're not trying to win a race, so they're saying, oh, it, it takes too long, it just looks like a bit of a circus, but uh, it does hopefully it's avoid fairer. cars losing it, laps it's behind fairer. safety cars. It is much fairer. Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's two debates here. One is how long it takes, uh, takes race direction to get to the stage where they decide to go with the process. Yes. That's one debate. The actual process, I have to say... Takes about a lap. Um, I, I'm actually quite impressed with it. I think the thing that really didn't help that last safety car procedure, the wave around, yeah. is that the track was very treacherous. Yes. So it took Sorry. longer. It did. Because the cars were taking longer to get around. They oh. didn't want to stack it. to so that's Duquesne's car. number 30 Don't car. Don't say those words. <laughs> <laughs> that is the number 30 car, Duquesne team. Again, it's, it's clearly pretty treacherous still at uh, the first chicane. It's the same rule, isn't it? Stay off the kerbs. That's where all the water is, because that's not where the tyres are drying it. He's but, got in offline. But that wasn't the kerbs. I no. mean, he ended up on a kerb, but yeah. it's to do with the braking and turning in, that phase you go through on the run into the first chicane. It's still wet there. And like yeah, we said, is. with the setting mm. sun, that bit is taking longer to dry now than anywhere else. Nico Eight, Pino it is. Yeah, 18-year-old. Chilean driver. So drive through penalty for Dane Cameron for overtaking under the safety car. So he passed the Falcon Horst Ferrari. That's not great news. Well, Iron Dames right in the thick of the action in the GTE AM class. Let's get down to their pit garage. I'm with Michelle Gassing, driver for the 85 Iron Dames. This race doesn't do anything for your nerves, does it? Ah, it's just, uh, yeah, no. Especially not when it's still 19 hours to go. It's uh, pretty exciting, but to be honest, Sarah is doing amazing out there. So, uh, I mean, still way too many hours to go. But the conditions are changing so much. Obviously, it's such a bigger track than we're used to, but the conditions are just so different. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's been, the whole week has been exhausting in a good way, but, uh, I mean, uh, Yesterday night, we had a meeting at 9 o'clock, and we were all like, shit, we still have a race tomorrow, you know, so... But it's, it's been amazing here, the fans. It's, uh, obviously, the pink car is attracting a lot of attention, as we want to, and now for, for good reasons, but still, long time to go. All right, thank you. Thank you. Michelle Gatting, we saw her in shot earlier on with uh, beautifully manicured and painted nails. They might be... Uh, might be less nailed, it's beautifully manicured and painted, and uh, just a little uh, apology for the uh, entertaining language. Uh, as ever, the first language that any racing driver learns is Mechanics English. <laughs> what? It's not funny, Graham. It's not funny. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My children are listening. I'm, I'm still bidding for more TikTok coverage. <laughs> but certain references have been banned. Go and look online if you don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Yiffy Yee leads Le Mans for Jota, for Hertz Team Jota. They do no longer lead in LMP2 because Oliver Rasmussen has just been in and out of the pit lane in the 28 car, and they don't have a GT. Oh, and big... there's the 38 car. That is the race leader, Yiffy Yee. What has happened has there? backed it in to the chicane, the Porsche curves. Oh, that... Luckily, he is very close to the pit lane, and luckily, although it now looks like some very badly hacked about Hot Wheels car, he will have lost very little time at all. But Ant, he, he's still got all the four wheels pointing in about the right direction, oh, no, but he's, he's got... got no grip, yeah. and he's coming too hot. I mean, I'm assuming that he's lost the rear end in the, in the Porsche curves, and yeah, runs so far out wide before karting corner, ends up in the barrier, is this going to pivot the car right round? Yes, it does. Yeah. That's a bigger, that's a much bigger moment than I thought it was. And then, in desperation, he launches it over that car the curb into the pit lane, which and has probably done as much damage. He's just gone from hero to absolute zero. Well, he that... was doing so well, yeah. But that's the risk level he was taking, and that's why he is clearly going as fast as he was. That was.
maximum risk there from the Jota driver. And Ferrari now 1-2 again as Hertz Team Jota will have to set about this car as quickly as they can. Louise Beckett. Just walking down to the Hertz Team Jota car, but on the way, I could see the number five Porsche mechanics. They were lying on the floor looking as the five came through the pit lane. So something's going on on the bottom of that car. All right, and that's the car of Dane Campbell that's just come and gone. And we will go full course yellow. This will bring everybody down to 80 kilometers an hour, but will not use the safety car. Now then, Ferrari need a pit stop. Penske Porsche number five car needs a pit stop, and so does the 93 Peugeot. One full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. We are removing debris at several places on track. We are removing debris at several places on track. Almost all of it hurts Team Jota bodywork. Well, uh, very substantial chunks of Hertz Team Jota bodywork, including the entire rear wing assembly, the underpart of that tail section, and much of the engine cover, uh, which are in big chunks. Well, it's going to, you can guarantee it's going to take less time to clear up the damage on the circuit than it will do the, the damage in the pit lane for the team. That's such a shame. I, I'd love to see the shot from earlier on. How did he end up there so far out in the Porsche curves? Did he lose the rear around the last left-hander or the penultimate left-hander before the right where we saw him go wide? Well, did it, was he overtaking a car? You know, what happened? When you go offline to the left, I mean, not as a driver, I don't know this, but watching, we've seen when cars are out wide, they really bounce. The road is really ripply off the... Of course, you're on the other side of the camber, so the road is going away from you there. Whereas when you turn right into the Porsche curves, it's camber to help you in. If, you, if you're the wrong side of the camber on the public road part, you don't get that benefit. And then you're out on the ripply stuff. Remember when we saw the Peugeot bouncing up and down? It doesn't do that anywhere. Only when you're offline, you get really bumpy there, where the Porsche curves, the modern bit of racetrack, peels off the old public road, or I say old public road, off the public road. He's either lost the rear, like I say, on the uh, on the, the second part, the second left of the, of the Porsche curves, lost the rear momentarily, collected it, but then you're offline, you yep. get onto the wet stuff, and it, the car just simply won't turn right. That's what it first looked like to me. Or he's done what Dane Cameron did beforehand, but a, a slightly earlier in the corner. So he's brought the car back onto the track over the grass and not followed the uh, the, the perimeter road round to the right-hand side. I, I'm going with my going with the gut instinct again. The, the first thing is what well, the only thing I can imagine. We've seen three or four incidents now for multiple Porsches, where it sort of feels as if the grip's not been where they expected it to be. Well, it was in the start for Yife, wasn't it? Well, he was, it certainly was. That was an amazing stint. Uh, it was, he pulled out a 15-second gap on the field. It was masterful. What Absolutely he did. brilliant. But uh, whether or not that was overconfidence, whether or not there's a problem, whether or not this, whatever it is, uh, that was a big incident, one of the biggest we've seen so far in this uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. I mean, I'd like to, like I say, I need to see it from earlier on. I need to see a different angle from the one we get. Maybe it's unfair on him. Maybe he had a left rear puncture or something or a left front puncture. But I'd like to hope it wasn't driver error. And the other thing there is the belting that holds the tyre walls together has been damaged by that. That might require an intervention and a replacement or a refixing of that. But high drama again. We're not even five hours into this race. Good like grief. I was, like I was saying, guys, it's you know this has been some of the honestly some of the hardest driving conditions I've ever seen at this at this Le Mans event. And, and it is that point, isn't it? You were making it earlier in the show or the race rather, where. Look, we have seen extreme rain at parts of this circuit, but it's almost better if that's all you've got. What we've had is this constant phasing from bone dry, yeah. heavy shower, into dry again, but not quite dry, then wetter, and then drier again. And they're, they're looking for where the grip is on every other lap. The, the problem is, like I said, it, the circuit isn't fully dry and they're still out there on the slick tires and they're just about okay for these conditions because they're losing track temperature all the time. If it was a hotter track, it, it, you know, it, the tires would be much more pliable and they'd be able to extract that grip and have a bit more confidence, but it's getting more and more tricky uh, as, as we go. As the sun continues to set, the temperatures come down and uh, they're having to basically reevaluate every single time 
they approach the same corner over and over. Just noted, by the way, there, Will Stevens, as if A.A. is looking distraught, isn't he, really? Uh, Will Stevens was suited and booted there. I think that might have been his in-lap. Ife's in lap. It, why otherwise would Will Stevens be sitting there hands device on well, and helmet on? Within a lap or two. Don't forget we said they needed fuel. The Ferraris need fuel yeah. as well. The Ferraris are going to gain big here if they're not going to because we're going to give the end of the, the full course yellow. They're not going to be able to pit under full course yellow, uh, but they were going to be close to that as there was further damage they needed replacing. Recovered quickly, but unfortunately the thing is deconstructing itself. There's a big job for the Hertz Team Jota guys and girls. Oh, I bet that hurt. Yeah, you would have felt that. Um, but yeah, in desperation. Uh, yeah, green flag. I, I think you're right. It was yeah. As you go back to green, you know what? The way that Ferrari approached this, they didn't care that the that the Jota Porsche was pulling away from them. As we see a swap of positions there with the Ferraris. It, they didn't seem to care. They weren't bothered. Oh, they've done what Toyota did earlier yeah. on, where they did to get um, track position for the pit stop or pit stop position to save the team, uh, generally speaking, more time. So, yeah, just to get them in the right order before they stop. But Ferrari, to me, looked like their whole approach to this event so far has been absolutely bang on. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're picking their fights. They're not going with that Jota car pulling away in the distance. The engineer's quick on the radio to say, look, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll build this up nicely over the second stint. Look after these tyres in the first stint. We'll, we'll be there in the second stint. Their whole approach seems to be thinking of the long game. There's, a, there's a, another point here with this new safety car procedure, and I, 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 I'm keen to hear what you guys think about this. There's various ways in which race control can neutralise the race. We've seen slow zones, we've seen full course yellow, we've now seen two safety car procedures. Knowing that you've got a safety car procedure that is better at managing the real-world race order, I do wonder whether they've got more confidence in deploying it. I do, do wonder, that clearly, the main reason to go safety car, the main reason is, is to do with the incidents, but they're also mindful of the overall race and the overall events. And I do wonder whether or not this might play into this a little later. Are we more... Oh, the racing team Turkey car now off again at the first chicane. And who's aboard the 923? It is Tom Gamble. And he he's was stuck. Doing... He was doing absolutely the right thing there. He was creeping it back, creeping it back. But if you spin up the rear tires, it's going to dig itself in. And it just started to beach itself. And that's exactly what it's done. But once again, look, both cars, the 63 as well, running out wide under that braking zone. It's just you're turning and braking another car behind them as well, one of the GTs. That's GT a car. It that's is absolutely treacherous there. Doesn't look it, but it is clearly very greasy. I wonder if there's something else down at that corner other than just being wet, because we're seeing multiple, multiple cars. This is how it looked on board. Oh, must be a horrible moment. He saved it from going into the barrier, and then you just think, right, I've got to put it in reverse and just ease it back. But at that one moment where you feel the car sink down, your heart sinks with it. Hello, boy. Hello, Welcome Jim. Back. Welcome back. back, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. We're when in. I came back in after my after my little meal break, I'm looking at the scoring. I'm thinking to myself, when was the last time anybody was going to have to go on the air and say, uh, Toyota in eighth and ninth? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now cycling back in the two Toyotas, well, by the way, because yes. of the pit stops for the... Uh, yes, for they the, are, but yeah. they know they've got their hands full. Oh, yeah. In uh, the centenary, Le Mans. Boy, That's oh, boy, have we got a race on here. Boy, oh, boy, have we got a race on. And uh, Hearing what you said about Ferrari, Ferrari are not racing in a very Ferrari way. They're not going and wringing the, re the neck of this race. They know this is a race of survival as well as pace. And... Actually, that's been possibly the most impressive part of it. You've heard it here first, guys, and I'll probably get beaten up online for this. Ferrari's strategy so far has been brilliant. Yes, yes. But in the other thing I've noticed is that other than the first pit stop, they've pitted in 10. Yep. The first pit stop, they were separate. Surprising, but isn't it? But since then, they have pitted in tandem, and that's not something we're used to seeing here at the moment. Move for position. This is four second position overall. Yep. The 94 Peugeot give a position away to the first of the two Toyotas. Brendan Hartley goes through to second. Nick Tandy, by the way, leads Le Mans. 
Uh, Everyone's having a turn today. The car 75 yeah, out there in front. Exactly. I think the majority of this hypercar field have led this race. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Uh, 75 so remember, is led, 94 is led, 8, 7, 50, 51, 2, 3, 5, 6, 38. Yeah, 11, 11 of the of the 14 cars. I'll tell you something. The race. You can tell how good a race it's been because uh, not for the first time, uh, one of our uh, co-commentators has completely missed the point at which they should have gone to eat, and a racing driver missing out on a meal because they're enjoying the race too much. And Davidson wow. leaves us. Welcome back, Peter Dumbreck. <laughs> I got a quick slap. From I've me. eaten already. Oh, there you go. He's, <laughs> he ate with me. He's, He's the smart man. That strategy. Follow the, fat guy. He, follow the fat guy. He knows where the food is. I ate twice, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> it comes to number 94 from third position. Uh, Peugeot have led Le Mans. Uh, Porsche, Toyota, Peugeot, the one, two, three. Let's go, go down and speak to Jota, and it's uh, Louise with Dieter Gatt, the team principal of Hertz Team Jota. I'm a Dieter Gass, team principal of Hertz Team Jota, car 38. There's a lot of work going on to this car, obviously, which is why we're trying to stay out of the way. Dieter, I've seen a lot of body work going on and off. Uh, do you know the extent of the damage? Yeah, I think very much so. We obviously have seen the front end, rear end, rear wing engine cover going as well. And uh, from what we have seen, the, the elephant foot, that's what it's called, the part behind the front wheel and the forward part of the floor. That's the extent of damage that we can see so far. Suspension seems to be okay, we hope. So uh, we're trying to repair the bodywork and then uh, we'll go again uh, if everything confirms like that. What's the iffy saying happened? Yeah, he said he lost it under the braking in the wash corners and then obviously hit the tyre barrier and uh, that made quite some significant damage on the car. Was he ready to come in? Because we saw that Will was ready uh, in his helmet. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was up for a plant uh, pit stop in this lap, yes. Correct. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, sadly, that uh, lap was not to be completed at speed and FAA's hero run to the front and away at the front. Uh, was, I'm afraid, spoiled on that end lap by a bit of a miscalculation into the Porsche curves. And the racing in LMP2 is no less exciting at this point than it is in the hypercar class. We've got the team WRT number 41 leading with Louis Delatrans behind the wheel, chased by the United Autosports, the remaining uh, undamaged United Autosports number 23 with Oliver Jarvis behind the wheel of that car, and they are nose to tail as they head into Indianapolis. Uh, we're back to full track green running now, with the end of that incident uh, caused by FAA shunt, and uh, the clear up is complete. Uh, sorry, it was uh, the second one was Tom Gamble, wasn't it, at, uh, yeah. at uh, the first one's Anne Chicane. But uh, well into double figures for cars on the lead lap for LMP2. time lead lap in hypercar is the top 10. Nick Tandy in the number 75 Porsche from the two Toyotas now, second and third, eight and seven, Brendan Hartley and Pachita Lopez. Then it is the two Ferraris, 50 and 51, run fourth and fifth, Miguel Molina and Antonio Giovinazzi. Lloyd Duval on his outlap now in the 94 Peugeot 9x8 that has led this race with Alex Lynn who's shown real pace in the number two Cadillac the quickest of the caddies. We've seen some troubles today. Second of the Porsches is the second Porsche Penske car. Dane Cameron runs eighth. And then Glickenhaus run in ninth position with their 709, the untroubled with the two SCG 007s. Second of the factory Cadillacs, Renga van der Zander, the number three car. That car runs 10th. It's a 23 United Autosports car, Jim. Comes to a, to a stop on pit lane. Comes out of second position. Jarvis brings the car to a stop. Looks like this is going to be a standard skid pit stop. 75 and 8 on the racetrack. This is, uh, it hasn't changed. I've been away for uh, two and a half hours, and there's been a lot happening, but it is still the same eight or nine cars at the front. It's almost like we used to call it when we were kids in athletics class, Indian running. You know, you get in the line and the last guy in line and you have to go to the front. And the last guy in line and go to the front. 
that's what we've got here. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, okay, your turn to lead for a while. Okay, and now my turn to lead for a while. The um, interesting thing now is that, uh, for me anyway, that Toyota is gradually finding its way to the front again. Yep. Uh, so they're yeah, running nose to tail top three cars after, um, what, five hours of racing. And, um, and the now the 75 car is on mediums and the Toyota is on softs. The Toyota seems to be... Uh, at least the eight car was very, very comfortable on the sauce earlier with the Miami behind the wheel. Now they're nose to tail. A minute ago, they were a lot closer to the 75 car, weren't they? So they must have been held up somewhere. I think traffic got it. I think two, the, uh, yeah. that LMP2 car got it. Two and a half seconds is the gap. Nick Tandy pushing on. And, uh, and nice. those three cars are all due a pit stop, as you can see from the energy graphic. Yeah. 75 car down to 16% virtual energy. The pace has been good. Yeah. The battling has been epic. The drama, sometimes unwelcome, but boy, it's kept us awake. Um, overall, Peter and Breck, what's your assessment of this expanded hypercar class? After the hype on one side, cynicism on, cynicism on the other side coming into this, are a very different top class at Le Mans. Yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. I think the general consensus from everyone is um, we've finally, after quite a few years, got several manufacturers all fighting for a win. We've had each one of them gradually leading the race, and at the moment it's Porsche, Toyota closing in on them. So, yeah, fantastic. I love it. Some of the social media comments have been interesting because they are like, gosh, why are these drivers just, you know, it's a 24-hour race. What's going on? That's how important this is, that these guys know that they have got to drive all out. Let's find out. Okay, Brandon, car 75 ahead is for position. Car 75 ahead is for position. So I think uh, kind of Captain Obvious there. Yep, Captain. Uh, well, that's, that's, that is the Captain. That's yes. Captain Penske, but I thought the radio train it's going to be interesting to see, but it's, it's been a transition, hasn't it, into this race, all sorts of expectations. Much of what I read uh, coming into this race from others in my chosen profession was, well, poor, uh, uh, Toyota are going to drive away with it. It hasn't been like that to this point. I agree with you, Peter. I think what's happening now, not all of their own uh, making is this race is coming back to them because others have hit trouble. The, this is the team with the most experience here, and yep. certainly the team with the most experience here with the car they're driving this year. So it's the third year at Le Mans for Toyota Gazoo Racing with the GRO 10, and of course they've won on both previous occasions. Weather has been a factor, they've got plenty of data for that. I tell you what, I, I bet he's uh, desperate to get into the pits and have that windscreen cleaned. Uh, yes, especially as the sun, especially right now, because the visibility, if the clouds stay separate like that, the yeah. visibility is going to get pretty tough. This is our race leader in LMP2 as he came in uh, through the pits and uh, sees that lead back to Jota, Oliver Rasmussen, uh, head of Albert Costa in the number 34 into Europol competition, uh, Orica. That's the one two now with the next three cars in the order on pit lane, including your Malta uh, Jakobsen, the 37 car leading Pro Am and fifth overall LMP2 as they hit pit lane. This, our new race leader in LMP2. Trouble for Dane Cameron in the number five car. Now, what has happened there? Has it been an incident as he hits some kind of mechanical or systems trouble as the NASCAR goes blasting by? Well, we can hear it, it seems to be can't see damage on the car. I think that has all the hallmarks of mechanical, electrical drive. And there goes the 38. Well, the Jota Porsche back out onto the racetrack. That was pretty quick. It was. Let's have a look at uh, just exactly how quick that was. Toyota double pit stop here. Working in tandem, much like the Ferraris are. That was 20 minutes on pit lane to effectively rebuild most of the top half of the car. Yeah. Quite a lot of the bottom of it as well. So, eight and seven in that order, in their race order. Again, see the position or two. Ferrari cycle back round 
into second and third. Miguel Molina now ten and a half seconds back from Nick Sandy. And Antonio Giovinazzi up to third, but the drama at the moment, the latest drama, is for Dane Cameron. Just looking to see whether or not that car, it is moving, and it's back up to some speed. I think that was a power recycle. Control out the lead. Yeah. Hello, by the way, standing out uh, at the Mulsanne Golf Club to previous Le Mans leader, briefly, Martin Shaw. Ah, yes. Well, Martin. And then nice chat with... Uh, this, by the way, is what uh, yep. Hertz Team Jota repaired in 20 minutes. So when you're at your Porsche dealer later, if you've had a bit of a biff, that's the kind of service you should be expecting. That's right, $150 an hour. Yeah, he needs some early toy that one up. He, he just, yeah, if a uh, well, you know what, he'll have learned a little there. In a very expensive way. This is the car on its way in. 20 minutes it would take. Hertz Team Jota back out on track now in 32nd place, 14th in the hypercar class. We have had some dramas for some of the other runners. We can run through some of those dramas through the classes when we get a moment. If we get a moment with less drama than every five minutes seems to dole out to us. <laughs> this is a quick look at the number 25, Aston Martin, ORT by TF. Like the wheels, it blasted by there uh, by the all blue. Number two, Cadillac. And what's this about? That's Michael Dyne, and he's another one who's been in trouble at the first chicane and an impact with the barriers there. That's why we're looking at the 25. 75 car. This is our race leader. Nick Candy. I like I like the Nicholas on this one. <laughs> so Nick Tandy continues to lead. What did you see there? I, I was wondering whether that was a P2. I think it was. I wonder why it was going so slowly. Ah. So 75 making its way through the Porsche curves. He's going to be... No, he didn't come in. Uh, he should be coming in this time. He's down to 1% but still, virtual... Uh, he's, he's not up to speed. Yeah, there yeah, he goes. That's why. Yeah, but you'd still be up to speed all the way. It, it didn't seem right. Yeah, it, it he wasn't seem... on full throttle, was yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Wonder if he's. Is this uh, a scheduled stop? Well, it is. It, it should be because his uh, virtual energy was yes, down to one so percent. Right. So I'm wondering if he might have run it almost dry. Frank Bieler, one point for all. He well, yeah, indeed. He came past Rexy, the 56 car, through to the lead again. Come Ferrari, 50 and 51. Running, running nose to tail. Oh no, it's not the second one. I think the other, the 51 car is not far behind, isn't it? Three seconds gap. Say again, I was. Say again. The leading yeah. car and the second place car are only three seconds oh, apart. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Looks like a driver change, gonna be tire change uh, for the number 75. Nick Tanny will be out. Five car also making a pit stop. Dane Cameron was behind the wheel of that car when it came out. I wonder if he'll, uh, if he's still in. We'll find out in a moment. A moment of quiet, relatively. Yes. Is it, I mean, amongst Fred McAvicky, be Fred McAvicky behind the wheel of that car right now. at the moment, you are leading the race, sister car three seconds behind, the previous lap was too much consumption, 70.7, we need 69.5, and 69.5, please, a bit more saving than previous lap. Uh, very interesting, very interesting. Previous, previous lap, too much energy usage, Mike, he was on 70.9, and they wanted 69.5. Well, so be, be warned about that, because yeah. it's going to be either uh, it's going to be where they're schedul scheduling for that for the stint length and yep. pace they're looking for. But aside from what the rules say, but what you can do, remember that there are limits set within this rule set. That's right. It's part of the balancing that keeps the racing as close as the scene. Gentlemen, you know, what is this? 
not even six hours of this race, we've been able to say Peugeot lead Le Mans, Ferrari lead Le Mans, Porsche lead Le Mans. Cadillac leads Le Mans. Absolutely extraordinary so far. Hertz Team Jota lead Le Mans. Yeah. <laughs> what an astonishing yeah. opening, not even an opening quarter yet of the 24 hours of Le Mans, in the centenary year. Uh, we've had some treats here, and that's just the hypercar class, just the hypercar class. Uh, LMP2 has put its usual battle, battleground. Jota lead that class again as the pit stop cycle comes back around, and in the GTE AM class, well, we'll get to that. Let's have a listen what's going on with Lode Develop or the 94 Peugeot 986. You are already B3. Right behind the two Ferraris, the Ferraris are running 31.5, 32.0. Go for it. They're confident. Go for it. Go for it. The seven <laughs> car, by the way, there uh, on the uh, its first flying lap after that pit stop. Jose Maria Lopez had a little bit of a near miss. Uh, I think I just spotted. And there's double yellows, by the way, at the end of the lap. What's happened down at the Fort Chicane? Something to get occurred there. I think I just spotted as well. There is a there is a stop and go penalty for the 708. That cycled through too quickly for me to read what that was for. So I'll have a quick look at that in a moment or two. Double yellows at uh, Marshall's post 31. That's for the 43 DKR car. There's also another incident. Double yellows at Marshall post 11, and that is the first chicane on Mulsan. Yet another issue. These, it doesn't, guys, it doesn't, these guys have had a rough day. This this is obviously the, the incident at the, the first chicane, the Daytona chicane. What's happened, though, at the Ford chicane? The problem the problem in this particular chicane, you've got the dry line, obviously, and if you get it wrong, you're yeah. straight onto the wet, and then you just can't stop. In fact, I, I can't believe the Toyota managed to stay out of the wall. Yeah. Staggering, I thought for it? sure it was going in the wall. Shows the kind of traction he's probably got. He's got a little bit more than these guys do. That's about the 10th car. It is the number 72 car. Lost its rear wing, that car. That car's been flying high in the um, GTM class. Arnold Robin, it is. Local driver with his brother, Maxime. That car has been in the wall. It just brushed. Oh, oh, John almost took the Ferrari with him. <laughs> that is a near miss for the Ferrari. Count your lucky stars, young man, in now, the uh, uh, How 51. big an impact here. It's taken the rear wing. Is that just brushed off? It did. Yeah. That should get away with that after replacement rear wing. The and Matra and Pescarello coloured uh, Aston Martin. Antonio Giovinazzi seeing his uh, race life mask before his eyes there. By the way, um, we, should, we, we, we should at some point be able to say here that another problem this time, Vector Sports off the track again at the first. Uh, chicane. We're just looking at the fight for uh, second place in GTR. That's the Iron Danes, Sarah Bove, trying to hold off Francesco Castellacci in the number 54 AF Corsa, the silver livery AF Corsa Ferrari. Yeah, there, this is the battle for second, he says, Peter quite right, he says, two and a half seconds back from the leading car. Moment in the hands of Martin Rump, but that's the car of Michael Fassbender. Yeah, that's right. 911. Boy, would that be a storyline. <laughs> We've had one Hollywood actor in the recent past on the uh, podium here, and it being Patrick Dempsey, Michael Fassbender, in what could be his final Le Mans in this current iteration of his racing career. It's the end of a five year program with him with Porsche. Porsche tends to not let people like that uh, just go away. They tend to keep them around. We talked a little earlier about the way in which the modern world deals with debates. <laughs> and when the debate surrounds celebrity, it can be particularly cruel. I can oh, tell yeah. you from working in the same paddock as Michael Fassbender, his attitude, aptitude, Passion has been an absolute pleasure. A bit of a twitch there from the Ferrari coming through. Yeah, they, they had to be careful yeah. as they came into the yellow flag zone. Not quitting this, is it, Peter? It's not. Well, we, we heard uh, a short while ago um, Molina um, being given instructions to calm down on his energy use. So I guess, is that a case of lifting coast a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Into the corners, you know, just come off the gas. Break at the same place, but just coast. 
on the other hand, we heard Peugeot tell Luke Duval, go get him. Yep. Still double yellows, by the way, Marshall's post 32. And just trying to see, is that car still there? It is. It has not moved from there, so it didn't look a big impact, did it? No, it did not. But the car's but not it also did look kind of squatted down. Yeah. I wonder whether the rear, because I think he, he got a rear right puncture, which is the Aston Martin, yeah? Yes, yeah. That car is so. still where it um, hit the wall. The other thing we've not mentioned much of, but they're constantly on our screens, are drivers' laps deleted for um, using too, many, too much of the track limits. Sooner or later, penalties are going to come. Penalties yeah, will come. Start to see, yeah. yeah. That's uh, yeah. you get five free wins per car, right? Uh, it is to do with the driver. Oh, it's to five per driver. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's a little more fair. The driver that actually gets the penalty, it, although the penalty might be served yeah. by the next yeah. driver. Yeah. But uh, two incidents at the moment being managed by race control. So that means the DKR car must still be at uh, the first chicane. Yeah, he was pretty well beached. It's not lack for drama. The 24 hours of Le Mans this year. It doesn't show any signs that that's going to change. And one of the people that uh, Peter was uh, noticing going across the uh, scoring monitor was uh, Miguel Molina in that leading Ferrari. Had his last lap. Yep, disallowed. Well, the lap time doesn't count. I shouldn't put it that yeah. way. It sounds but like... Uh, it's He's not scored on the lap. He scored on the lap, but it just counts against his total of five free ones. Look out, He's boys. got trouble here. There was the, the, That's the, a slow zone. He was he was already... We, we noticed this earlier. The, the 963's hazard lights coming into a... They clearly light those up. Yes. And they're preparing to slow. But he wasn't quite under full control there. That could have been the, significantly yeah. more embarrassing or worse. Well, we heard um, Sebastian... Bordet talking about the system in the car earlier on and how um, they get a warning saying that the next zone will be a yellow zone and they've probably already done a lap. Yep. But um, he said sometimes it's delayed. I'm trying to look to see are there actually yellow flags this far back or the first ones around the corners and, and they actually, the, that first car what? there, did they slow down too much for a, Maybe he slowed still early. Still in the green zone, you know? Well, that's a good point. They may be slowing down. Oh, no, right. there, yeah. yellows. The yellows were on the inside, so no, it was it was genuine. Where they go again? So they clear oh, the it's zone. Oh, it's still not clear. This. Keen on, uh, keen on keeping his line in the Prima car. That's Mirko Bortolotti, who is due to be one of Lamborghini's factory hypercar drivers when that program debuts next year. Full season in the World Endurance Championship. An endurance season in the Ipswich Olympic Sports Car Championship ahead for that program. Uh, with the next burst of expansion in this extraordinary period in international sports car racing, under the Dunlop Bridge, the eight card looks to deal with the 63. I'm not sure there'll be a chance here. Mm -hmm. Probably not until he gets onto the Mossand Strait. Yeah, because they're about to come up to another slow zone. Unless the car has been removed. No, that is still there at the moment. Oh, hang on. Slow yes. Oh, no, it has gone. Yes. Yep. So, flat out now. Down the most straight away. You're on board with Nick Dandy. Using the slipstream, he'll go by the LMP2, number 63. Significantly bigger challenge for the top class drivers in this era, in the hypercar era, the hypercars well balanced between each other, but the margins between them and the LMB2s in a variety of parts of this race, significantly smaller than they were back in the LMB1 days, and that is making things significantly more exciting. Here's the 708 serving the penalty that Graham spoke of earlier. Yeah, 708 car, by the way. Remember, started a lap down at the start of this race, did not join the grid with a gearbox oil leak. Sits in 13th place now. And, uh, we'll see how that one pans out. I think it is still it is two laps down now. That's just put it back onto two laps down. This is the 43 car that was off the road at the Daytona Chicane. Why is it called the Daytona Chicane? It was part of 
the, again, the con convergence pro uh, 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 process. Yes. Daytona chicane now is the first chicane on the Nodier, the Nolzan Strait, whereas conversely at the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona, Daytona International Speedway, what used to be called the bus stop, is now for the Mont chicane. Funny, how it? Yeah, and indeed the curbs are painted That's right. in the colours of their partner circuits and both circuits. Here's here's a recovery drive for Vander Rangazanga. Let's see what's going on with this car. So drink bottles are working, so I'm just still pumping on each some guys. Make sure it's uh, not a drink bottle from my name on it, but the one that actually sucks something through. Yeah, 10 for. Let's check in in the pits. Did I hear from that? We did indeed hear from Seth. I'm outside the number 10 Vector Sport. As you know, it had a little issue out there. It turns out it was a braking issue. So the front bodywork is off the car and the mechanics are working hard on the front left of the car. There has been a driver change, so I don't anticipate they shall be in the garage for too long, but they are working hard away at the minute. So now we switch to the number two car. Currently in fourth position, Alex Lynn doing an excellent job in this car. Yeah, he's been consistently quick, and uh, lest we forget another one of the just the little tableau that have made yes. this Le Mans so special in the centenary year. Not wearing his own helmet colours, wearing those, and indeed the name on one side of Derek Bell. Great. So we're listening to what's going on aboard the number two with Alex Lane. The track is in quite a weird condition, man. Like the it's still down condition gains and stuff. It's a bit greasy. Copy that. Copy that. You're doing a good job. He's indeed doing a good job. This has been the area that's been causing so many problems in the last hour or so, Jim. Well, and it's uh, he's talking about the racetrack being very greasy. So. Uh, this, this rain really has changed the, the, the texture of the racetrack. Yeah. It was full dry, and then as the rain kind of moved around the racetrack, it didn't just rain in one spot, it kind of moved around the racetrack. It has not come back to a full dry condition yet. It doesn't seem like it from what they're kind telling It's strange that, because it's so warm still. Boxing this lap, box, box, fuel only. Right. So again, another car that's uh, on a bit of a recovery drive is the 33 car. After those uh, st the stunning performance by Ben Keating in qualifying at the beginning of the race did not really go their way. And as he comes into the slow zone, at the Porsche curves. This is, of course, still for that Aston Martin. Is that car still there? Or has that made it back to pit lane? Just checking, it's still there. It's still it's there. not great. Uh, Vector Sport back on track, I was just hearing from Steph, and that was a six minute stop for the British team. The British team, by the way, that uh, either by the end of uh, this season, or certainly for next, if they get the nod, will debut yet another new hypercar the Isotta Fraschini. If you don't know what Isotta Fraschini is, it's a, it's a, a, a quite an old Italian mark, reborn, and uh, that car has been designed and built with the help of Michelotto, who for many years looked after the Ferrari GT programme. I'm going to leave you uh, for a couple of hours in uh, just a few moments, and we're going to uh, uh, hand over the mic to Hi Kai Smith, that means uh, from this chair, over the last four hours, we'll have uh, had commentators with the sum total of one, Le Mans win. That's right. Guy Smith. <laughs> Your well, eyes don't deceive you, Peter. We are looking at the top three, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, the... Uh, and the Peugeot in between the two Ferraris. That's right. Molina is now chased by Luik Duval. He's gotten by Antonio Giovinazzi. So, Luik Duval is trying to push that Peugeot back to the front. I think the I, centenary of Le Mans. I think I might just start calling it a Peugeot as well, because then it's simple. It's tomato, tomato. I, I don't know how to say the word. What's I, that, I, Peugeot? I, I call I them Peugeot, but it's probably, uh, you, you might American, be right. I can't say maybe they are. I, I, maybe, I've tried. Maybe they are Peugeot. That's right. It's like centenary or centenary. 
Bahamas or um, yeah. the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> Made of tomato. Caribbean. Oh. Guy Smith, welcome. Your thoughts so far? Well, what a race. Yeah, I mean, huh? I'm struggling to keep up with it. It's so much going on throughout all the classes. Um, really surprised by just the amount of accidents, really, and shunts. Um, I mean, obviously, the weather conditions are pretty horrendous. Um, I don't think I'd like to be driving in that, um, those kind of conditions. It looks really tricky. But, um, yeah, what a race we've got here at the front. Uh, the two Ferraris still going strong. And um, it's great to see the Peugeot of Lloyd Duval in third place. Actually, you know, holding holding station. It's actually making some small gains. Drops back a little bit in traffic, but um, they're very much in the in the hunt. They really seem to like the mixed conditions. Those cars, the Peugeots, they they seem to handle well. Okay, we had the Sean Eric Van Vern mistake down in um, Mulsanne, but um, in general, I think that the Peugeot does like the mixed conditions. And if rain comes back back later in the race then you might see them pop back up to the top again. Yeah, I just popped down to the paddock. I just saw uh, Paul DeRest doing a little rain dance outside of his garage. Um, so, uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, um, I think they'll be definitely welcoming some, uh, some showers for sure. Magic number to hit here on the straightaways is 322. That's 200 miles per hour. It's great to see the, um, the Cadillacs back uh, back in the mix again. Yes. I think um, the one thing about the new safety car rules, I mean, while it works, it doesn't work for some, it, w it obviously does work for others, and um, it, it does allow that if you have had an issue, um, albeit a small issue where you've maybe lost a lap, as we saw with the Cadillac, um, the safety car does help them get their lap back and brings them back into contention, whereas previously they would have kind of been spent the whole yeah. race just trying to gain that one lap back. So it's kind of doing what it was designed to do to keep cars in play. Um, but obviously, if you're, you're in a situation where you've got a big lead, it maybe doesn't quite work out. Yeah, for you, so. exactly. Exactly. Joe Venazzi has now gotten himself past the... We swap positions in Arnage. We swap positions in Arnage or Indy, whatever is easier for you. There's no traffic in front. We swap positions now, now, now. So we're coming out for the 50 and 51 to swap positions. So I, I think that's already happened, hasn't it? So 50, yes, 50 was in is front, leading. That's now... exactly right. Yes. Yeah, that's already happened. So why? But now we know. Happen? Now we know why it happened. That that they were told to do it. Uh, they're getting ready for a pit stop, and that will put them in proper order when they come into the pit, so that uh, 51 is in the uh, pit stall that's closest to pit out, so they'll come in in tandem, nose to tail, and leave that way as well, as opposed to one stopping, you know, having to work his way around. Is that a fight for position? I'm sure it is. It sure <laughs> is. Is it the 75? Or the, uh, yes, it is. So that is the battle for position. Fifth position, number eight. Brendan Hartley aboard the Toyota. Yeah, that will become the, uh, the Nick Tandy looking at the back of it. Yeah, that will become the battle for fourth, the uh, third position here shortly when the 50 and 51 make their way to the pit lane. But right now, that is the battle for fifth. So tight, you know the. The hypercars, the prototypes, are so much quicker through these corners than the GT cars, and if they get stuck behind them, they really lose so much time. So they have to take these big risks going around the outside, uh, not to lose too much time. But really, it's kind of heart in the mouth stuff, really, when you see them uh, go around the outside. How distracting are those strobes that you get during the? Well, um, annoying, but. Maybe but that's not maybe that's yeah. why they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just to annoy the car behind. <laughs> well, that's a sign that they're harvesting, which is that that's important to know. Again, we're seeing the the Toyotas, especially the eight. Pardon me, especially the eight car, being able to be very quick and and put a lot of life in those soft tires. Porsche on mediums. It's kind of a Porsche in a Toyota sandwich there. Yeah, 
Both Toyotas are on the softs. But 18 laps on the uh, Tandy has 18 laps on his mediums. And the number seven car, Lopez, has uh, 19 laps on his softs. Yeah, the Toyota seems to like the softs, don't they? Yeah. They seem keen on running the softs. Yep. And that's what allowed Bohemi to lead and his ability to, to handle the soft tires. Down the Molson straight away. 18 hours, 21 minutes to go. And this has been, I'm gonna tell you what boys, if this was a six hour race, this thing, our, our, yeah, this is just absolutely stunning. Yeah, the crowds are definitely getting the money's worth today. Matthew Chaminade yep. getting ready for yep. his stint. The private preparation that you guys go through, everybody has their own. Did you put your overalls on a certain way, put a certain boot on before the other, put a certain glove on before the any of those little... No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have that. Yeah. I didn't have that. Yeah, how about you? Um, not really. I mean, you get to, like, maybe there's a, there's a certain pair of gloves that you prefer or a pair of boots that you prefer. Um, so I think... I, I know a lot of drivers are quite OCD. You know, everything has to be neat and tidy and kind of prepared. So uh, we all have our own little ways of doing it. But, um, yeah, everybody, everybody's different. Yeah, you don't have an OCD bone in your body. I don't know. Well, you don't. You don't. You wish you did. But no, but I, I do like things clean and tidy, but that's, that's probably nothing to do with OCD. <laughs> but, yeah. I, the one thing I did used to do when I was waiting, yeah. I'd want to, I'm about to get in the car and I, I need to, so I need to, whoa, I need, to whoa. I need my energy up, I need okay. to, and I, I would, um, I would sing all flower of Scotland in my head. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, before getting in the car. That's outstanding. So I'm going to go and fight now. There you go. Outstanding. A bit corny, maybe, but it worked. No, it's not. There's no, nothing's corny. Now, here we see the uh, LMP2 cars out on hards. Let's uh, check in okay, with Brendan, Brendan Hartley. We can see that you could do one more step on the front or rear anti roll bar. That's what our suggestion would be for balance. And also, question. Are you open to doing one more stint? Could you do one more stint, question? Yeah, no problem. I'm not sure how the tires are going to go, though. Copy. There you go. That's interesting. Now we're starting to, you know, almost six hours in, we're really starting to get into the strategy stuff now. Can you can you go another stint? Yes, I can. I don't know if the tires can. Um, Interesting that he's getting help and advice from the telemetry that the engineers are seeing on how to balance the car. Yeah, they're obviously looking at the data and they can see, you know, what the car's doing and how it's behaving. Uh, maybe Brendan had given us some feedback earlier on in the stint on the car. So um, he's obviously doing a good job. He's in the zone. Um, they're obviously happy. I think as we start to go, as the light starts to come down and it starts to go into the night, it probably makes sense to have the driver stay in the car. So you have that transition period. And if he's in the zone and he's feeling good, then 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 why not? You know, do one more stint and uh, and, and keep on going, really. So here is that lead battle or second place battle, I think, in uh, LMP2. No, nope, it's further back than that. Thirty-five car, eighth place. And the Jota car still leading in LMP2. Yep. See the flies buzzing around. That is something. Isn't it? Then we wonder why when we get the onboard shots, they're all, it looks like they're pitted. This is time now for all the photographers on the circuit. Getting some great shots of the cars, what great light as we start to go into the nighttime. You can see the headlights really kind of shining and see the car spitting flames and you see the brake disc glowing and lighting up. It's really, uh, really kind of magical time. 
if the uh, well, well, no, we're not too early yet. We'd be about if the sun was uh, if it wasn't so cloudy, we'd be in the gloaming, be in that golden light. I think as a drive, it's actually quite a nice time because it's it's kind of the track's actually quite quick because it's you know it starts to cool down. You still got the daylight, so you can see. Um, so it's actually quite a nice time to 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 go into in, into the car. And I think Peter and I were talking about it earlier on. You know, going into the night time, this is a really really kind of nice time to be in the car. Probably the only time that's better is is what we call happy hour, which is sort of early morning as you come out of the night into the into the morning into the daylight. First and second place cars in the pits together in LMP2. Oliver Rasmussen and Albert Costa. Rasmussen is one of 14 Danish drivers in the race. Yes. Yeah, t tell me Tom Christensen and Jan Magnussen haven't had an influence. Well, when I was, <laughs> when I was driving around this morning um, in the parade, I was behind Tom Christensen, and there's a, a mass of Danish fans at Arnage. So I'm sure there are plenty of Danish flags flying at Arnaj for, uh, for these days. It used to be last one out, bring the flag, because the entire country would come to this event. <laughs> That's how I know there's 14, because I met one last night in, in, uh, in town, a Danish fan. Oh, you mean 14 drivers. I thought you meant 14 fans. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a few more than that. I think so. This is the battle for eighth. 35, then 40 set. No, that's uh, not the cool reason. So they've got a car out of sequence in yeah. between them. That's it. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm trying to find it in scoring. That's the Alpine car, isn't it the Alpine car? Thirty-five, thirty-one, and sixty-three. So that's um, ah. So thirty-one, sixty-three are fighting for yes. position, but they're right. They're further down. That's yeah. the battle for uh, for sixteenth and seventeenth in the LMP2 category. They're trying to uh, they're trying to catch and pass the thirty-five car, which is in eighth position. So that's Ollie Caldwell in the thirty-five. So United Autosports now in the lead of uh, LMP2 with Ollie Jarvis. Jota in second and then followed by WRT. So. Here's the... Uh, 94. Again, the first chicane. Proving to be problematic. Yeah, doing the clever thing though if you if you think you can't make the corner and you're a bit locked up just straight line it just straight line it. yeah the, the drivers that come in too hot and go for the the commitment is that's the drivers that might spin in there and we've seen quite a few hit the wall or beach themselves in the gravel in fact one of the toyotas came very close to doing that as well patrick pile formerly uh Porsche factory GT driver in the uh, 39 car. Battling for 17th position with Mirko Portolotti in the Prema Racing number 63. Prema's had a pretty good season in LMP2 this year. Yeah, I think the 63 car would be disappointed they're so far down at yeah. the stage because I think. Um, yeah. They really fancy themselves, you know, for a, for a for a podium, if not a win. So um. that's one of uh, they're all, they're almost on the uh, level of AF Corsa with numbers. I think that's one of uh, three entries in LMP2 that they have. Two for sure. Nine and 63. Big outfit, that's for sure. Obviously, they're in Formula Three, Formula Two as well. The graphic may have been erroneous because it's the uh, 31 and the 63. The 63 has uh, gotten by the 31, and now scoring clicks over to show that change when they go by the next loop. It wasn't the 39 car, and the 39 car wasn't involved in this. 
this little battle. There's Alex Lynn with his Derek Bell tribute helmet on. I spoke to Derek yesterday and he was he was very, very thrilled that uh, Alex had done that. He was, oh, uh, I, bet, I bet that meant a lot to him. Did. That's the kind of... He really did. Uh, there's a certain amount... Uh, he understands... I, I think Derek understands not only the history, but his place in that history. And I think it means a lot to him to know, that, to see a younger driver... Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that, yes. Thank you. So the United Auto Sports number 23 now with a four second lead. Let's check back in with the Toyotas. Brendan Hartley. Okay, Brendan, we now see some dots of rain on the radar, possibly coming to a run. The pups will keep you informed. Had a little break up there on where the rain is, but they're going to keep him informed. So. That was not what he wanted to hear. No, <laughs> absolutely did not want to hear that, especially as it's getting dark and he knows in, he's in for another stint. So he's got to deal with uh, potential, um, well, if it rains heavily and they have to go to wet tires, then he will get out at that stage. the driver of number 85 Iron Dames. Congratulations, it's going well for you so far, isn't it? Well, so far, so good, finger crossed. To be honest, last year we had a puncture, I think after 10 minutes and lost two laps, so clearly it's starting better. Um, the condition were apocalyptic out there. When I did the first time the straight line under the safety car, I was like, I have no idea where I'm going. If there is a car in front of me or not, I have no idea. So it was really, uh, even under the safety car, quite difficult. Um, but I'm quite happy with the goal the team has made so far. The car is really nice to drive. But, you know, it's a very long race. We, we have done just a little part of it. And uh, we'll keep the head down, stay focused. Uh, I trust my teammate, I trust my team. And uh, so far, they're doing an amazing job. So, yeah, I'll try to rely on that. And we're heading into the night time. Are you about to get some rest before you're back in the car in the, in the darkness? Yeah, well, I actually like the, the dark a lot. Um, I think in Le Mans it's amazing uh, to, to drive in the dark. It's, uh, it, it feels so quiet in the car. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to my night stint. Um, but now it's, uh, it's Michi who will get into the dark. But uh, she has done an amazing job so far of the season. So uh, I trust her with uh, all my heart. All right, well, best of luck to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Michelle that she's talking about is Michelle Gatting, who is in the car now. The car circulates in fourth place behind the JMW Motorsports number 66 Ferrari. They, of course, the number 54 Ferrari and the number 25 uh, uh, TF Sport, but TF Sport car, the, uh, the Aston Martin. It's good to hear her so buoyant, isn't it? Oh, those, she's, the, she's that, that team a mega is, time out there. Oh, those, the, the, that team of racers is just, they're fantastic for the sport because they're so enthusiastic. They're very media savvy and they're very fast. Sarah had a wonderful race with Ben Keating. I think it was at Portimao, where the two of them were just nose to tail for lap after lap, swapping spots back and forth. The two of them got out of the car. It was like they rushed down to the pits just to shake hands because they both enjoyed racing each other so much. It was, it was a fantastic. So let's see if we can see some spots of rain on any of these onboard windshields. It's hard to see anything out yeah. of this wind windshield. So obviously the, the, on the uh, on the car, you actually have to tear offs like you get on a helmet. So uh, what they'll do is they'll probably run it until it gets to a point where the driver will say, look, the next pit stop, you, yeah, the tear off. you don't want to use them all obviously in the first few hours because you've got nothing left for the rest of the race. So um, as soon as it becomes you know, much, much worse, they'll, they'll take that tear off and uh, and have much better vision, particularly when you're going to nighttime. We were talking to the optics people uh, about that, and they put the windscreens come with 12 tear offs applied. So you got to make each one last uh, at least two hours. So dub double stitch tear offs. You got to double stitch tear offs. Yeah. How different the, the light is on this racetrack at this point because the cloud cover is so much thicker over the Molson straightaway. It's, it's darker when they get to the 
other side of the racetrack, up around the Porsche curves, there's uh, breaks in the clouds, so you, the sun that's going down is still giving it enough light that it looks completely different. You see how light the sky is, as, the, as you see it occasionally as the camera pans. The Toyotas are back on top. Seven and eight, Brendan Hartley, Jose Maria Lopez, Nick Tandy chases in third, and then the first of the Ferraris, Giovinazzi. Now it looks like the 50 car has made another pit stop because he is now on an outlap. That was certainly unscheduled. We didn't see it. On that Nicholas Nielsen on the wheel yeah. now. At the wheel now. Lewis Ball continues to circulate now in sixth position. Their pit stop. Although it says um, both on seven pit stops. So if it was an extra pit stop for the 50, we, it would say eight. So that Andre Lauder has had a track limits violation. Rain expected now at uh, Marshall Post 2 through 5. So that's pretty much the start of the lap uh, yeah. through to. Um, almost to Tetris. Yeah. yeah, almost to Tetris. Because uh, Marshall Post 6 is, te is Tetris. You see, the, the Porsche looks behind the toilet, looks really strong through the Porsche corners there. He actually gained a little bit of time. I think the Porsche loses a little bit on straight line. Toyota's yeah. certainly very strong. That could be. Uh, of course, downforce on the car, and that's why the Porsche is so good in the Porsche curves. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's able to close back up again, and he might lose a little bit straight line because it, they're carrying, carrying a bit more wing. There's that bright sky I was talking about. You can see how uh, going through the Ford chicane, that little bit of sunlight just wreaks havoc for the drivers with these dirty, pissed up windshields. It's always a challenge here in Le Mans with the setup. You know, do you go for a car that is uh, low downforce and super fast on the straights? Or do you go for a car that's got a little bit more downforce, that's a bit more secure in the corners, but you, you, you obviously get more drag with that. So it's always trying to find that trade-off of what the balance is. And, um... and of course, in the wet conditions, and if we are likely to see more wet conditions, you want more downforce do. as well. So that should come back towards the Porsche. Sometimes it also helps keep the tyres. If you want to do three stints, if the car isn't sliding around as much, it can also help the, the light of the tyre. I mean, we've seen before in, in the uh, in the American races, the Porsche can be quite hard on its rear tyres. Um, but, um, I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong currently with the uh, with the 75 car. They're really having a great run here and uh, certainly putting the, uh, the Toyotas under a lot of pressure here. Tandy hits 337. That's 209 miles per hour before the uh, breaking point for There's the Hurricane. Sparking car on the left there. Yep. Um, either lost a tire or lost a wheel and uh, got a long way back to the pitch from there. What's, can we tell what car that was? Yeah, we might slow? be able to. Let's check in with the... Uh, oh, it's the 709. We, uh, we expect rain at the Essa Dunlop at Tet Rouge in the next 10 minutes. So there's uh, what we were talking about earlier, the report to the LMP2 leader that rain expected from Dunlop to Tetrus. That is the uh, 709, which so, is on an outlap. So I wonder if uh, maybe they didn't get the uh, the wheel nuts on correctly or something. Definitely front and yeah. left, isn't it? Yeah, does he come out, did he come yep. out of the pits? Yep. He? Yeah, he'd just come out of the pits. It was his, uh, it's on his outlap. Now, this is the longest lap ever, isn't it? Yeah. And the crew discussing. He stopped. Yeah, he's just very slow. It's taken him so long to get to the next uh, timing line that it it is saying that he stopped, but he was still moving. He's not moving very quickly, but he is still moving. He's not moving fast. When he trips the next timing line, Almost to the 
Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. I think his damage is so yeah so great now that he's decided. Oh, well, I'll just bring this one very slowly. Very slow. Otherwise, I'll cause way more damage. There is your LMP2 leader, the aforementioned Oliver Rasmussen. At one point, we had Joda, the little the little company that could. Small firm out of England leading both the hypercar class overall and the LMP2 class. It's going to have to be a big comeback drive for that double to happen uh, in the hypercar class as the 38 car is uh, is down uh, probably about four laps at this point, down 30, uh, 26 position overall. So Nick Tandy takes the lead again as both yeah. Toyotas pit. Uncharacteristic mistake there is the uh, car overshot its pit box. Unless that's what happens when you don't come in in, in, in order, in, in proper order, in tandem. You have to exactly. go past and, and back yourself back so in. So we've seen the Ferraris um, organize position, themselves yeah, right. on track before they come into the pits, and it looks like the Toyotas didn't do that and uh, they came in in the wrong order because we did have. Um, Brennan Hartley, who's sitting in the car there, he was leading those two, the eight car. It's a big test for these guys now because they're under some serious pressure, which is great. Yeah. You know, this, but this is actually really testing them and um, how do they react to this pressure? You know, do they do yeah. they do they crack or do they do they step up? And um, you know, certainly a, a, a super super strong team, and it's great to see them in, in a battle. And it, and it will test their metal, and and they they've been they've been waiting for that. They they're not they don't have a problem with that. There is the 709 carrying on. And, All right, uh, there so there you go. The wheel was the the wheel obviously was not uh, the nut was not is secured. That, is that if the nut wasn't secured, surely the wheel would just come off. That was that not more suspension. Well, issues? if it if it got jammed up under the under the bodywork, as long as he doesn't yeah. go too fast, he may stick. But yes, it could also be suspension. That's or as it for was them. coming off, it may have damaged the suspension. They were having a pretty good run. They were consistent. They were ticking off the laps. Discussion down in the Toyota pit. Big lock up there. That's the 30 car. That's Duquesne. Uh, Duquesne. Yeah, Duquesne team. Neil Yanni. We're getting rain reports on track we're getting some rain reports on track so rain reports on track also they've asked the drivers to put their uh, rain lights on low mode i've seen uh, slippery service oh, i removed now march plus six so Right now, it looks like uh, all things are dry at the Porsche curves. And in comes, I suspect, the number 75, which will put, yep, 75 in the pits. That will put uh, Pierre Guidi back to the front of the field. Anybody looking for a Father's Day present? <laughs> the JMW team doing a really good job. They've got uh, quite a healthy lead now in uh, GTE over the Iron Danes car, 33 uh, seconds. So they're doing a, a strong, strong job. And that's a comeback drive for them because they had the, they had the big crash in the first free practice. So that's uh, rewarding the guys for a lot of hard work. Yeah, they've had a fast car all week, actually. They, they obviously were not able to qualify, and uh, they've not had the smoothest of weeks, but they have been quick when they've been on track. So um, 
they've obviously managed to work their way forward in the race and uh, in a strong position right now. Looks like it's going to be a steering wheel change for the number 75. Uh, once the fueling is done, then they can do work on the car. Left side, uh, right side tires are going on. New steering wheel going on. Old one comes out. So who's out of the wheel now? Uh, Jaminet. Yeah, that's uh, our Long Beach uh, winner in IMSA. This team won. We have, uh, the, the, the winners of Sebring are here. Uh, the IMSA Sebring winners are here in the 311 car. The Long Beach winners are here in this 75 car. So I'm wondering why these teams are competitive. They, they have had success in America, like other teams have had success in the World Endurance Championship. Oh, look at the, is that wet? Ah, that's oh. the wet now, yeah. yeah. It's starting to get literally wet. We had uh, the yellow flag up at Marshall Post 3, which was under that, the bridge. And then now we're seeing... Uh, <laughs> that's straight out of the pits on cold tires, yeah. straight into the wet. Under the wet. That's yeah. Nuts. Yeah. not... Well, there won't be cold tires. Stephanie be says oh, it's yes, now be, chucking yeah. it down the, in the pits, so... It'll be cold now. Yeah. <laughs> and wet. Yeah. And then here, at Tet, uh, once they get through Tete Rouge, out under the Mall Sun straightaway, looks dry as a bone. I'm looking at the gap up between the two Ferraris. Remember, not long ago, they were running nose yeah. to tail, but uh, Pierre Guidi is a 13 second gap over Nicholas Nielsen now. I think oh, this is, rain. yeah, Look you can the see rain. the rain coming down, and that's the 911, I think, going around. Right, back on the throat, yeah, good, got out of there. There you go, got out of there. Oh, and then this further on, tricky. once they got under the bridge, the 34 yeah, going by the 911, so he was able to get back going. So now it will be interesting to see, like Duval and the Peugeot, to see yes. if they really do have a good, strong, wet pace. So they're thinking about the wet tires now. See, I told wow, you, that's interesting. I told you Paul the rest was doing a rain dance, didn't I? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Did he have full pom poms and everything? <laughs> goes to Delage, and you can see that it is raining now. Hard on pit lane, it's as very we dark. were told. So the, the, I suppose now the statisticians will be looking at uh, time lost on a set of slicks on this one section of track versus putting the car on wet and running it for the they, rest of the, like, yeah, the dry exactly lap. Right. Well, they've actually got some data now, haven't they? They've kind of, they've kind of done it already once today, where they kind of Work, trying to work out what to do. Do we go for do we go for the, the wet, which is probably the safe choice? Um, so we've had a car off then. That's oh, 28. That's the Jota. Is, is that, that the Jota? That's yes, the it Jota is. Car. Is it? Yeah, yeah that, that was, was the class P2 leading. Car. Yeah, that was our class leading LMP2 car. Oliver Rasmussen behind the wheel of that car, and he has done some damage to the right front. Yeah, it looks like he's gone in front first, doesn't he? Yeah. Tear off any more than you need to, son. 50 car. 50 car in the pits. Now, is this to switch to softs or is that to. That was a, a short. Yeah, I, I, I think Peugeot putting I think on most, wets. Of the, most of the cars are going to go to wets, especially as it's getting dark. It's that bit harder. Yeah, the, the rest of the track will be cooler, so you'll extend the life of it a little bit. Of course, the other unknown is if, if there's a, some kind of accident or something that brings a safety car out again, then you could have had a different strategy again, just like yeah. the last one. Yeah, and now what's going on the number two Cadillac. Same with the Toyota. So everybody's pit strategies have now been thrown in disarray as they've had to come in to put 
wet weather tires on. So teams that have only been out for a little while, of course, they only have to fill the tanks for a, a brief moment. Too early to roll the dice and just stay out? Um, I, the 51 car, I, I think they have it, but I think they are on. Uh, He's a minute 11. Ahead, he's still out. Yeah, yeah, because the 50 car out. pitted, 51 didn't pit. So yeah. let's see what he does now. So the word from the pits, the 51 is going to come in for drying wets. And that is the 75 car putting his wets on. Remember, remember when Michelin came out with the maxi wet? And now they have the drying wet. So it's the drying wets aren't on the prototypes. I think they're only on the GTs, aren't they? Uh, here's the uh, Jota. Well, oh. Oh. He just made a move on the United car. Yep. Oh. And it didn't pay off. Nope. Nope. Well, when 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 we met with the Michelin guys, they they said that the the wet weather tires will last until the track is dry. Exactly. So yeah. that's where the I think where the drying wet name. Be advised, David is on track, MP14, bear right, bear right. The David is in the middle of the track, pull to the left-hand side, bear right at MP14. So Marshall post 14. Where do you think the rain starts then? It's it's kind of in the middle of the Porsche corners or entry? On standby to declare slow zone four at 22, 10, 15. We're doing slow zone four at 22, 10, 15. So the MP14 is the, the, the shoot between the two chicanes. So there's some debris in the racetrack. I suspect that's from the Jota. And a frustrated Ferrari. Pierre Guidi. Yeah. With the GT car not coming to the pits quick enough for his liking. And this is just losing seconds, Peter, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, that's frustrating. We've also got to be so careful entering the pits because all that Michelin, as beautiful as it looks, is probably quite slippery. Yeah. Very slippery. So, uh, and there is, there's a difference between the concrete of the pit pad and the asphalt of the yeah. fast and slow lane, acceleration lane and the fast lane. So that's one of the Porsches. Is that the Jota car? Oh, oh and that's the Ferrari. Another one. <laughs> yep, that's one of the Ferraris. Oh, uh, here we no, go again. That's the leading. That's the leading guy. GMW car. GT, GTM car, the 66. And it's stuck. And he's beached it. So that is that the exit to the port uh, to karting? Is that yes, karting yes, corner? Yes, yeah. yeah. That's the exit to karting. And it's very slippery. Is that the other Ferrari? Yeah, the other Ferrari's already pitted, um, and he went through the gravel. I'm yeah, just, yeah, he, yeah, he went through the gravel, was carried able, on down the road, was and able to avoid the wall. The pits. Yep. Now the seven is coming through here on wets. I think. No, he's uh -oh. now. Uh -oh. oh, good heavens! Uh oh. <laughs> that Toyota had to absolutely bail out of that. Um, he. He you know, got pitting. in there and had nowhere to go, and uh, we, yeah. Who was it that we stopped? There was a car that literally stopped in the pit lane, yeah. wasn't it? So, what's going on all around now? So, as, as, as long as that Jota isn't, not that Jota, the other Jota, the P2 car, isn't yes. too badly damaged, they've actually, it's not as bad as it could have been for them. Oh, because, exactly. Because, you know, this weather conditions, the slow zones. Okay, so the seven made it into the pits, uh, seemingly un unscathed. There is the 28 car. That'll be a that'll be a nose change. They're going to check the uh, obviously check it over for other damage. But if it is no suspension damage, just a nose, that's that's a pretty good break. Slow zones now. Uh, slow zone two. Or, uh, I'm sorry, slow zone four. Uh, and oh, now there's the 22 car, the, the nine car. They're all parking themselves. Yeah. That's at Indianapolis. That's at Indianapolis. 
Oh, oh contact. That's the, yep. 90, that's 90, the turkey. That's the yeah. 90, 923 spirited turkey uh, making contact with the nine. So there's Jarvis. She's locked a wheel. Yeah. That's 22. Great job. Just managed to get yeah. the car stopped. No damage. Heart and mouth moment. Yeah, exactly. 66. Yeah, they're telling them, stop. Stop already. <laughs> All you're going to do is dig yourself deeper. And those guys that were having such a great run. Yes. I think we curved yeah. them because they were doing so well. <laughs> no such thing. Oh. That's the... Uh, oh, that's the way you, you, you <laughs> yes. can see, I've done that, not that. When you're about to have a crash, you, that, it just goes in slow motion. Yeah, racing you can team sort of, turkey. You can just see it, feel it the happening. The thing yeah. is, though, you've got no control. You yeah. <laughs> sort of did have control. <laughs> he could have just come off the brakes and driven. Uh, yeah. uh, he would have hit the tire wall, probably, but he, he could have froze. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, froze. froze and just yeah. hard on the brake. If he had just come off the brake, he'd have got some steering back. But it's easy to sit here yeah. and say that. Very easy to sit and not have any stress and yeah. you know have a bit of a chat. <laughs> Another car. And now the hundred in the, in the gravel again. This is at least his second trip to the gravel. The first rain shower we had sent him off at uh, Porsche curves. This really is survival now. You know, just trying to keep the car at the wall. Let's see what the Cadillac and the uh, Corvette thinks of what's going on. You're doing a great job. We're trying to stay out to get a safety car. That's what we're trying to do here. Heavy rain at the King of Indianapolis. Heavy rain. Heavy rain, heavy rain, heavy rain. That's dangerous, trying to get a safety car. Staying out on slicks. Meaning he's still on slicks, yeah. <laughs> and where are we now? So we're on the, the Matsan straight now are we yeah that's the second chicane and it's very wet there oh yeah there's the 66 car right. being brought over so he can uh, get back underway that's the thing you you would think that they would just say okay you can drop it there and you can drive away but i think they've got different ideas where they take it right yes. out of the way don't they and and then let us get started, pull back out on the racetrack where he's not going to be in danger of anybody. So, so the turkey car's still going anyway, just in front after its little bit of contact. There's the, uh, there's the nine, nine car. car has made it back in. I'd imagine it's got damage on the rear. Look at the rear oh, left. Oh, yeah. Because it, it took an impact, so the wheel will be yep. pointing out the way. He'll have to go back in for repairs, I'm sure. 63 car, there's a 66 back underway. I wish we had a carbon shop, guys, because I think we're, making, we're doing quite <laughs> yeah. well now. We're going to be running out of parts soon at this rate. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's, yeah. That's a shame. That's looking a bit second-hand at this point. The luck of the draw, very yeah. unlucky there. Obviously, several cars going off in exactly the same place, and two of them made contact. I mean, in LMP2, quite a lot of the front runners you would expect to be contenders for the win are actually now dropped out. Yes, yep. This so. is going to open this up. Right now, Enter Europol is leading. Fabio Scherer behind the wheel of the number 34 car. United Auto Sports' Tom Bloomquist in the 23 cars hanging in in second. Third is the w, uh, other WRT team, number 41, with Robert Kubinson behind the wheel. Now, there's a guy who can who can pedal in the wet. You know, all his rally experience, his Formula One wet experience, is, he, that car's in good hands in the wet, I mean. Here's the 51 car, Alessandro Carguidi. Oh. But you could barely see anything. Hitting the, hitting the brakes on the straightaway. Just had a message from Karun, Karun Chandok. Uh -huh. He says, absolutely under no circumstances are we to have another safety car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. <laughs> I'll get right on that memo. So the 66 car has made it back to the pits. 
And I am sure that uh, Eduardo Freitas is loath to put out another safety car. But these guys need to, you know, the, the accelerator goes in both directions. And they just need to be a little mindful of that. Let's check in in the pits. Hi guys, I am at the number 93 uh, Racing Team Turkey, where we've just had a driver change of Sally Yolich for Tom Gamble, who is now in the car. But that car has actually received a both, both a front and back wing change. So let's repair of that damage. From the wreck, the 50 car is uh, now on an outlap. So how have uh, things shaken out so far in the pit stops and the rain. We've got uh, Pierre Guidi leading in the Ferrari number 51. Luak Duval in the Peugeot in number 94 is second. Cadillac with Richard Westbrook and then blue number two car is third. Fourth is the first of the Toyotas, Mui Kobayashi. Under 15 seconds to remove slows on four. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, slow zone four is now clear. Slow zone four, it's now clear. So the racetrack is yours, boys, have at it. There are no slow zones currently on the racetrack, but the racetrack in some spots is very wet. So I would imagine the car, what was the car that stayed out on slicks? I imagine he's probably the F33 now. car. Yep. Oh. And you can see just when he goes to power, the car moving around, it's just... Oh. It's he like, went between two cars there, didn't he? You know, sometimes when you're in this position, you feel like you're driving so slowly. You know, you feel like, oh, I'm not really pushing, I need to... Yeah. And actually, you're actually going quick, you know, for the conditions, yeah. and you, it, it's so difficult to know how hard to push. Um, okay, this is an area where the racetrack is not very wet, so uh, makes it a little bit easier for these drivers. Still a little bit of spray, still a little bit of moisture. So the two winners out of that whole uh, situation were the 51 Ferrari. Um, Pierre Guidi's got a 27 second gap over Loic Duval. Let's keep an eye on that because as we thought, the, the Peugeot is pretty handy in the wet. So um, let's see if you can bring it down a bit. And also the other one that did pretty well in that was Richard Westbrook in the two car. Yeah, he's only... Uh, another 14 seconds behind Louis Duval. And actually, one of the big losers was the 50 Ferrari. Yes. I think, is it because they had to make two stops? They just pitted and then they had to come back in again. Right. That's the three Cadillac go down another lap, currently in eighth position. So the leading Ferrari, number 51, is lapped up through eighth position. So they're not Westbrook there. And no, Westbrook's the, in the two car. That's the uh, that's the three car. That's right. No, that is... The blue. That's, that's Well, that's one of the uh, LMP2 cars. Ah, I see. Because Ko Kobayashi yeah. has just gone by Westbrook. Right. Yeah, that's an LMP2 car. Yeah, you're right. The Ferraris. Because the three cars off in the distance there. Yeah, the 709s picks up a penalty, a one-minute yep. stop and go for a, a technical infringement. Probably too many people working out in the pits. That was the car that was limping back very slowly, wasn't it? So Ferrari goes straight oh, on to the first uh, chicane. Yep. Well, that's at the Dunlop chicane he went straight on. Yeah. Yeah, the first, yeah. That's what I mean. Turn two. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so gentle on the throttle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just hit a little bit of water, a puddle, and you're hard on the gas, and Ooh, the car will snap. See, you can see there, yeah, Peter, he's just wobbling around. It's just if you drop your wheel off the on an exit curve, get on, on some of the paint there. Yeah. It's, uh, With a little bit of steering lock on. Yeah, the car goes round. Okay, there's Richard Westbrook in the two car. Currently in fourth. 
There's the seven, which just passed him moments ago. Move out a little bit of a gap. Kobayashi's always been comfortable in the wind, though, hasn't he? Looks uh, Richards probably is the first time in uh, prototype around here. I think he's done the race many times, but in GT. I mean, look at that lack of visibility. I mean, it's horrendous. And actually, what you find, you see, with the wiper itself, it's not actually that effective. I mean, they're kind of there, but I was speaking to some of the, the guys from Cadillac yesterday, and I don't believe they've done any or very little testing in the, in the rain. Right. So this is kind of their, their test, as it were. So yeah. these are the sort of things you find that actually the wiper doesn't work so well, and water starts to come in from all these different places in the car, and it starts to steam up. So. Um, Straight on from, uh, so that's the Ferrari, the second car. Yep. It's almost like the Ferrari followed him. Oh, there so yeah, it's the, the three, three car. car. Renger Vendezanda. Straight line chicane and then the Ferrari. Well, he didn't really straight line it. He, uh, he used the inside <laughs> curb, inside the bollard. Gosh, that's dicey. That's just so dicey. So Inter Europol's now got a, uh, a bit of a lead in uh, LMP2, 30 seconds. Yep, that's over Tom Bloomquist in the United Auto Sports, and then Bloomquist is being chased by Kubica in the team WRT number 41. He's just four seconds behind. And also the Iron Dame's doing a great job in yep. the lead now. Um, they're moving to the lead of uh, GTE. So we've got the yeah, Porsche one, two. This is a little bit GT better now. representation, guys, of what you can oh, see. That camera. Oh, oh, he just locked. Oh, oh, oh. And around he goes. He, he kind of locked. He locked the rear wheels mm. as he was downshifting, and uh, yeah, just kind of lost control and spun. So luckily, he didn't hit anything. So uh, hopefully, he'll get going again and uh, be on his way. Coming up behind the Camaro. First time that car's raced in this kind of uh, wet weather. I wasn't sure whether he was actually locked up trying not to go into the back of the Camaro. Mm -hmm. And he kind of... Yep. Yeah. But we were, we were completely yep. locked, as you say. But you can see the visibility is a little bit better. That other camera was down in the in the area where all that water was running so the visibility wasn't quite that bad but it's still not stellar I would say. so the leading car the 51 car is pulled out 45 second gap now to like Duval in the last lap or so he's gained 15 seconds on him wow yeah and the 50 car now is what one minute 40 behind the sister car. Back on board with Richard Westbrook. Much drier here. Still looks like it's a little dicey. That's going through the Porsche curves. Remember, this is where the rain started first, and we were scattering cars all over the exit of karting. Just trying to find yeah. the grip with the car, commit it, but then just, you know, yeah. Okay, Richard, question? Yeah, I just can't see where there's Wi-Fi. It's, it's so dangerous. Copy that, copy that. We are trying. Yeah, Richard is too. We talked about the uh, 33 car earlier. Uh, let's find out that just how that strategy didn't work out. I'm here in the pit lane at number 33, Corvette Racing with Nico Veron. You've just jumped out of the car. Tell us about the conditions out there, because it looks pretty dicey. Yeah, well, uh, for us, it was pretty crazy. Um, so we were 
we were full of water, you know, it was like a swimming pool out there and we were on slicks also like in the last part, so it was pretty crazy. I was just going into Musan straight like 80 kph for gear. I was aqua planning, going really slow and the hypercars, everyone passing me like really fast. So yeah, it was uh, scary to say, uh, but all in all, we can keep the car clean. Uh, we can make it back to the box and, and continue the race. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty tough up there. Yeah, so earlier on it was very difficult for you, but you guys have so much pace this today and during this race, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I just got out. I don't know how it was the pace. Uh, maybe it was good, but um, yeah, for sure I was giving my all. Uh, I feel like, yeah, we tried to stay out on slicks, but then a uh, proper rain came, came out. So yeah, I think there we lost a little bit of time, but you know, this is, this is racing and this can happen. It's just about managing the risk and see where we end up. Okay, well, we'll see you in a few hours when you do your next stint. Thank you so much. Thank you. You were saying, Peter, that Pierre Guidi, or, uh, yeah, Pierre Guidi had pulled out about a 45-second lead on Louis Duval. Well, that's because, a quick look at the last lap, he was 18 seconds quicker. He's turned in 409s in these conditions. Everybody behind him is 427, 425, 452 for the uh, 50 car. Uh, He's, he's obviously very comfortable. The closest to him is uh, the Toyota number eight with the uh, higher car behind the wheel. The, uh, four, yeah, different four conditions for everyone. Yeah. Obviously, a uh, sweet condition, but different feelings in the car. And sure. Confidence levels and uh, also depends on how much traffic you're around. If you're in, and because yeah. we heard from Richard Westbrook, I think it's, you know, it's difficult yeah. for everyone to see. And if you if you can't fully commit down the streets and commit to passing maneuvers, um, then you just lose seconds. Yeah, you don't lose tenths of seconds at that point. You start to lose seconds. Here's a look at the uh, overall classification. They've completed 80, 80 laps, working lap 81. 17 and a half hours to go. The, a, of course, a Ferrari 499, number 51 leads. So it's Ferrari, Peugeot, Toyota, and Cadillac in the top four, four different manufacturers. And uh, further down, see the two Glickenhouses rounding out the hypercar class in LMP2. It's Inter Europol having completed 77 laps, is leading. The Jota car back out has dropped down to 24th overall. They were leading the class until they had problems in this most recent rain shower. Leader in GTE Am is the Iron Danes, number 85. They're chased by the Project One Porsche, the number 56. That's the, the Rexy car. JMW. Porsche number 66 we saw crash early in that last rain session and we have five cars out of the race the number 83 Ferrari the 16 and 60 Porsches the 55 Aston Martin the 21 Ferrari the 13 Tower Motorsports and the number 14 Nielsen Racing out of LMP2. Yeah, the 51 car has been making all the right moves, all the right calls yeah, so far to yeah. be in the position they're in. And, you know, they seem to have just played a blinder here. So uh, down to 404s. So, yeah, so over, a, over a minute gap now to uh, Loic Duval behind. Yeah. So the racetrack is obviously improving because we're seeing many of the lap times come down now a little bit. But like you said, they've they've, they've caught this just right. I think the hardest thing is if you jump in the car now in the middle of the situation, it's finding where you can push. Whereas if you've been in the car from the start, you kind of start to understand where the grip is and where the track's worst or, or better. And um, at least you can acclimatize. But I mean, just look at the awful visibility they've got. And, and Kobayashi is, is a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of movement in the car. Okay, Joe, update on conditions. We don't see rain at the circuit anymore. Obviously, still quite a lot of water on track, but we don't see rain at the moment. Okay. Once I go behind the car, I see nothing. 
Yeah, but when I go behind a car, I see nothing. There you go. <laughs> How hard is that? I mean, is that... Do you just... Is it, is it just hoping for the best? Or are you... Yeah, yeah it's, it is luck. It is a lot of luck involved. I mean, you think about it, your brain says, right, put your foot flat. Mm -hmm. And you know you could drive down there flat out and the car wouldn't do anything, you know, there's enough downforce and grip. But then you see lights in front of you and your foot just starts to ease off the gas pedal and you're, no, no, flat, flat. And you're, no, no, I want to lift off. So you've got the devil and the angel on your shoulders <laughs> uh, just trying to protect you. But yeah, I've been in that situation many times and another track bad for that is Nürburgring. I mean, Nürburgring oh, 24 sure, yeah. hours of fog and, and everything. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, it's very hairy, but you know the situation is just you've got to commit and you know at the moment we've got um the guy right up the front who is obviously very committed 404 last time round and as we talked about lot of all next car 420 then a 416 422 so he's just gradually pulling yeah. away more and more and more and if he can just keep that all together um and when this all clears up and it gets dry again He's going to end up with a, a potentially, oh, yeah. a, you know, a couple of minutes gap over the next second place car. Yeah, the, the only guy kind of matching him really is uh, Jaminet in the uh, in the 75 Porsche. He's uh, lapping 402. So again, again another GT driver, wow. another kind of GT guy, um, and also Van Thor as well in the uh, in the number six car. Yeah, looking at the, the GPS map, you know. The 75 car. He's he's been in space. He's had no traffic, right? right. Yeah. So he's about to catch the back of a load of other cars. And yeah. the 51 car who's just coming on. You know, again, he's got no traffic. He's got a couple of cars in front, but not many. And I think if you can have some clear laps where you've got no spray, I think it's the spray more mm. than the than the actual yeah. circuit that is the issue. Because when you, like you said, when you can't go flat down the straight. Where versus being flat on the straight, just, yeah. you're giving away lap time. Um, yeah, if you're surrounded by cars and you don't know where they're going to go and you don't know where they're going to break for the next corner, you have to go easy. You could lose five, ten seconds a lap, couldn't you? Quite, quite. And I, I think that's exactly what happened to Richard Westbrook. He was, you know, we we actually saw his onboard yeah. and how much he could see, and uh, it just caught him out. He, as you say, caught up to that NASCAR in front and maybe just break marginally too late or whatever and, and just you know lost the rear end communication from the ferrari team via social media that they reset the 50 car on the last pit stop and lost 30 seconds i wonder i wonder what they reset uh, that that's a little a little cryptic it's these small little things obviously if you have a small problem and you lose that amount of time sometimes you never gain that back and it can it's such fine margin, especially, isn't it? Especially with this competition, you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, you yeah. don't have, there is, we talked earlier, there's no margin for error, whether it be in these kind of conditions where you can see from the helicopter shot, the spray coming off the, the almost like a, a rooster tail coming off the back of the leading car to a, a mistake in the pits or a Richard Westbrook spin. Anything like that could ultimately be the difference at the end of 24 hours when the, when the racing is this close. looking at the the arm battle iron dames versus uh project one 432 yep so we we got um matteo cairoli who i know yeah. is exceedingly quick uh catching up to michelle gatting now she just did a 426 his last lap was a 420 i bet this will be quicker because she was six seconds quicker only 11 seconds back as well, so within you think within a couple of laps, he's going to be right. Uh, yeah, he's right going now. to be within striking distance. Oh, car stranded on the track there. And spun coming out of um, Multan Corner. It's a long, dark run. Yeah, this is this is the part of the track where it's probably the darkest yeah. until you get to uh, into Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. Once you get out of Arnage, you can start to. Yep, there's you see the lights at Indianapolis, the right hand turn. Looking at one of the Porsches. 
that's an LMP2. It's an LMP2 battle with a with Peugeot, Peugeot in the, in the middle of the bat, yeah. <laughs> Got Mikkel Jensen in the 93 Peugeot doing quick laps, four and three, but still desperate to try and get some of the, you know, that lap back or two laps even now, I think. So I think this is the battle for fourth and fifth that, that Peugeot is in the middle of. Yep. The 35 and the 80 AF Corsa. They've been running nose to tail. Just half a second separating them at this point, and they've been that way almost the entire lap. There hasn't really been any, you know, they've, they've pretty much held station. Now he's closing in a little bit under braking. Yeah, Ben Barnico doing a really good job leading the uh, Pro-Am class for AF Corsa. Um, putting some pressure now on Oli Caldwell. This uh, Alpine Elf team number 35 has been right around the top five in class the entire race. They've perked to the top a couple times in pit stop sequences, but they've been been there or thereabouts the entire race as other than around them have had problems. Yeah, they've struggled a little bit so far. It's like the 80 car making a move. He closed in. Did uh, the, the, the 35 I think he, make I, a little mistake going through I, the yeah. Dunlop chicane? Yeah, there was yeah, some, sure. someone who went right through the chicane there, straight lined it. Yeah, only called dwell. Formula 2 driver, actually, he's the race winner this, this year. I think he turns 21 tonight at midnight. Yes, he does. Is that right? Yes, he so does. He's, yes. um, yep. In about uh, an hour and 20 minutes, he'll be 21 years old. Speak of the devil, there he is. Oh. <laughs> wide again. Yep. Well, he was fine. I think the 80 car ended up uh, almost not making it, having the straight line part of it. Now we get into the, almost into the part of the night when every now and then you'll see the napping crew member. Through the second chicane, that time, uh, that time Ollie used the inside line on the chicane as opposed to. <laughs> Both pushing the limits, aren't they? <laughs> Everything is being watched. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're almost getting back into the three-minute lap times now for the hypercar at four-minute dead, so yep. the track is gradually improving. Yep. Luke Duval picked up two seconds on that last lap, 4.02 for Piraguidi and a four-flat for Duval. I think it really was how how they fell. When, when the rain came down, it's where they were on the track, and then I think the 51 car was just in... More Just all the right clear. spots. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, they're all very similar times again, as you say. Little force. The top two, the top top eight, all uh, within a s two seconds of each other in that last lap time. So the battle continues for fourth and fifth with the Alpine team and AF Corsa number 80 as uh, one of the hypercars goes through that battle. Is that one of the other Peugeot? Was that the other Peugeot that just went through that battle? Well, no when we see the rear of it. Yep, there, yes, indeed it was. That's the 93 car and a bit of a recovery drive now. Two laps, uh, three laps behind the leader. Or, I'm sorry, two laps behind the leader. Caldwell still working hard through the Porsche curves, through Porsche curves to Karting and then White House, Maison Blanche, 
then the four chicane. The amount of concentration now on these drivers, you know, yeah. these, these, these stints are long, you know, so easy to make a small mistake and you know, put the car off the track or, or crash out. So it's incredibly uh, intense in there. Matteo Cairoli now just three seconds behind Michelle Gatting. So the fight for GT, yeah. um, the lead will be coming very soon. Yep, you, you called that one when you're... When you're uh, when you're into this part of the night and, and even into the, the, the wee hours, the single digit hours of the morning, uh, one, two, three o'clock, is it is it easier when you're racing somebody to to, to kind of keep your focus? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah, it's it's nice to have another car around you yeah. and, and give you a target. So if you're the one behind, you can kind of. But obviously in wet conditions, it's, it's more difficult. But um, if you're just running on your own with lapping cars or whatever, then that's a lot harder to really keep the focus and keep pushing. You see the spray now is definitely reducing. Yes. Although the wipers on, it's not... Uh... Gearing down, going through the first chicane. A little right flick, then left. He got it right that time. Well, there goes the 38 Jota Porsche on its recovery drive. Move him up to 17th overall. The second chicane they go. This one is the left flick, then the right. This is a wetter area, clearly. And now yep. he's getting the spray from the car. That must be the Jota. Yeah, that's the Jota Porsche that just went through. So Pierre Guidi continues to lead as the uh, times. Was that Oli um, oh, Caldwell, Caldwell heading into the? Oh yeah, he, he, got, went, he got it right. He, had, but, uh, yeah, he got it around. And there, there goes the car behind. He's angry yeah. at himself for that one. He braked too late, just outbraked himself and slid way to the gravel. Didn't quite get into the gravel, but almost out to the gravel. I think he probably stuck a couple of wheels in yeah, it. Yeah, he probably fair. dragged a couple of wheels through it, exactly. Was there not a car on the inside? That he, I'm not sure whether he was, he was trying to avoid a car, maybe not. Here's another look. We'll find out. Oh, you're right. Oh, there yeah, was, that's that was a, the... Uh, a spinning car. Was that the Camaro, perhaps, that was... Uh, I think it might be the Ferrari. No, it's a Ferrari. GMW, it's definitely... GMW. There we go. Yep. Oh, yeah, it's the 66 Ferrari. We went in deep, then almost to... And I think he just got his uh, attention. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because he went out there like he was going to come right out, but stopped and probably kind oh. of... Oh, oh no. no. Problem for the number 75. Porsche. Gemini, Matthew Gemini, behind the wheel of that car. I think that's... He was turning some great times. It's looking that like it's going to need uh, the full system reboot. His glasses, yeah. his, his glasses were fogging up done. in there, yeah. weren't they? I thought well, you can see the fog yeah. on the window as well. The lights are still green, though. That's good news because that uh, that's if the car, if those lights that you see glowing there at the front of the car turn red, that means the, the car has uh, got an electrical problem that is dangerous and he'll have to go to what they call Area 51 and he'll be out of the race. So, But he's just Whoa. sounds like he's got no power there. So, as predicted, Matteo Cairoli takes the lead of ah. GT. The reason I know he's so fast is because he was in my last year of racing, 2020, he was my teammate at Falcon and, and the uh -huh. Nürburgring. Yep. And 
I was pushing for everything to match his times, and he seemed to be just driving around. I, I watched his onboard, and I thought, how the yeah. heck are you doing <laughs> that? Making it look so easy, and I'm, I, I feel like I'm driving with a knife in my throat. <laughs> So now we're on board with Renger van de Zanda in the number three Cadillac. So now the number five Porsche, uh, Fred Makovecki, takes up the charge of the, uh, the, the, the Porsche, Porsche camp. Yep, he's now the highest running Porsche in seventh position. Fact, that was a little side bet, wasn't it? Guy? It was. <laughs> I, I, I bet on that five car. What, what car did you bet on? Uh, I, I played safe. I think we went for number eight Toyota. <laughs> well, they're six and seventh now, so. <laughs> See how that's working out for you. <laughs> the winner gets a tonic tea kick. <laughs> ah. So it was a big bet. Oh, tea cakes are not to be missed. How are those snowballs? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A lot better visibility now for Richard Westbrook. The number eight Toyota, it's two minutes and 21 seconds off the lead. It's, it's a fair, fair way. Yes, yes, which is which is a bit surprising. I, I would have thought they would have been like to, you know, like to be a little bit closer to the to the front yeah, at the yeah. stage. Coming up on 11 o'clock here in the Sart. Coming up on 17 hours remaining in the Centenary Le Mans. The 91st actual running of the race, but the 100th anniversary of the first law in 1923. It was decided that this would be a great way to prove the reliability and effectiveness and of uh, the automobile. And 100 years later, we're doing the exact same thing with a brand new category with 14 cars, 15 cars in the class, 16 cars in the class from five different manufacturers. It is uh, the dawning of what I think will be the next great era of sports car racing that will probably, hopefully, rival the, the Group C and GTP eras that we got to enjoy Group C in Europe and the GTP in the United States. So the number 75 car is still marked down as stopped. Um, yeah, he's not, uh, not got great well, coming through. He was, Ted, I think it was at Ted Rouge, wasn't he? He was parked. On is the, that where it was? I think so. Yeah, yeah you that can see him on the map up there. Six. You're yeah, right, he yeah. is still sat on the inside of Ted Rouge. So I'm sure he's doing all the resets. He'll be speaking to the team and uh, asking for advice. What do we need to do? What do we need to reset? And uh, trying to get that 75 car back up and running into the race. No bomber. So the Ferrari 50 car has moved ahead of uh, the Cadillac number two now as well. Ah, so he's uh, Nicholas Nielsen. Turned to 357 the last lap, I think. Yep. So 358 for our leader, 357 for Louis Duval. Four minutes flat for Kamui Kobayashi. So, and then 357 for Nicholas Nielsen. We could see 
Oh, is this Jamine going again? Or is this? Yes, he's moved yep. further. He's moved further on and now pulled off the racetrack. There's Roger Penske looking on. He's trying to carry on. Did you ever have to bring the car back to the pits on the starter? Did you ever have to do that? I've never had to do that. No. Yeah. No, but that, look, I, I don't think you'd make it all, all the way back. Well, from not there. not from that yeah. area, but but in, in um, that, just, that was something on the shorter racetracks in the United yeah. States. Every yeah. now and then, a guy would, you know. Yeah. If you're talking about a two and three quarter mile road Atlanta or something, yeah, you could coast it down the hill and then. But it's just so frustrating for these guys because they, they're actually having a great race and uh, very much sort of in the fight. And uh, yeah, so frustrating. Greedy in the 51 car is having a great stint. He's done that. He did such a great job in those tricky conditions to sort of pull out more of a lead, hasn't he? And he's still uh, doing a, you know, continuing to be uh, probably the fastest car on track. Just trying to build that get, build that gap as much as possible. Is that a purple first sector on Jaminet's uh, scoring line on the on the lap that he stopped on? I think that when he when you stop or slow down, it it seems to show up your faster sector. So uh, I don't okay. believe that's that's this lap. I got you. But there he is on driver's right. Still I'll puttering take a long along. Time nah, to come back at that speed. Yeah. Actually, the quickest guy on track just now is a Peugeot of, um, of Mikkel Jensen. That car seems to like the drying conditions. Remember when the, remember when the Audi against uh, Peugeot was... Yeah. Uh, when it was the changing conditions, it was so much faster. So, yeah, it would, yeah, it both. would rain and the Peugeot would catch back up and then it would start to dry and the Audi would, then when it was dry, the Peugeot would start to catch back up again. The number 94 car is doing a great job as well, hanging in there in second place with good pace. It's yeah, doing, doing a great yeah. job. And with 17 hours to go, a minute behind is not an issue. I mean, there's so much racing. Yeah. You know, that is. We've been talking about the track conditions. Let's see what uh, the eight car thinks. 14, second chicane. And five, six, seven. Copy. In your opinion, still not ready for slick? Question. In your opinion, still too early for slick? Go down, go down. Copy. So, you know, Kawasan, I think I was him saying that uh, it sounded like he wasn't so keen on the slick right now. Right, yeah. Too early yet, still too early. Second chicane, I think, still very wet on the Mulsanne. And the Ferrari, though, if, yeah, they're, they've they're, got they're, slicks ready. That's the 51 well, that, car, that's the leading car as yeah, well. Yeah, that could, that could push, uh, no, that's the 50. Oh, it's 50. It's the 50 in the pits. This could certainly uh, change Toyota's thinking, especially because they'll be able to see what his lap times are. Yeah. Thing and Herakawa-san might be told, no, no, you're going on, yeah, you're yeah. going on slick. I, I think um, maybe this was a scheduled stop anyway, so they were yeah. forced into yeah. doing something. So either you go and do another stint on the wet tire and potentially lose a lot of time, or you, right. you go into the slick now. But it's, this is the riskiest time now as well. Yeah. Because you can crossover, see... That crossover it's, moment. It's, it's yeah. dark, and you can... You, yep. You've got to be on the line because uh, it's wet either side. Oh, yeah, you can see you can see they're still leaving the tires are still leaving marks on the. But it, it's going to get all of the teams thinking now. Oh yeah, it's going to get them all thinking. Do we do we do do we match them? Do we uh -huh. do we copy them or do we play it safe? Guaranteed they'll be looking at those lap times next. 
I, I don't imagine this first first couple will be quite up to it, but then all of a sudden the times will come oh, yeah. down. So now we're taking a look at the battle for sixth and seventh in LMP2. James Allen, Oliver Rasmussen. Of course, this is a comeback drive for the number 28 car. They had an incident earlier, kind of did some front end damage. Given the fact that they're still in the hunt in sixth place with 17 hours to go, that was, uh, they kind of got away. I won't say they got away with it, mm. but but they got off light. That's when all that rain came down yeah. and yellow flag zones and you yep. know, slow zones. Going into, and, tet going into Tetris, you got And to every other car pitted at the same time. Yep. So I think the, yes, they spent extra time in the pits just inspecting the front right. of the car. But clearly the suspension geometry of the car was okay. It was yeah. just damage to the bodywork. You've got the um, United 23 car of Tom Bonquist lapping very quickly at the minute with a seven, well, it's seven seconds behind the inter Europol car. And um, so let's see in the next lap or two, there could be a uh, change. It was seven seconds quicker on that last lap. Yeah, yeah. It, could be, it could be a change for the lead of LMP2 in the next lap or two if it uh, continues this way. And we've got Martin Haven back to join us. Hello, Martin, what have you been doing? I've been watching. <laughs> you just can't take your eyes off this, can you? This is insane. It's everything that the 100-year anniversary race should be. And do you know what? You know, it's everything we sort of hoped for. When they started framing these hypercar rules, there was probably quite a lot of scepticism that you could actually produce a platform that lots of different manufacturers with very different ideas of what they needed from it could all embrace and could and could come out the other end of with cars that are equal but oh boy not one car looks like another even in sort of slight detail and yet they're all just tenths of a second apart on a on a eight and a half mile lap i mean it, it's insanely close and and guy you know we've, we've been through periods with one mark dominating and another mark dominating in, in different forms of the sport. But I, I don't know at the moment. I, it's, it's hard to pick a car that looks like it's got any noticeable advantage in almost any conditions that we've seen. It's been four seasons so far, apart from snow. So I, I, I think that there's, there's a very good chance that this might be, okay, a, a race for the ages, this is the centenary race. But I think next year, there's likely to be even less chance we'll see GT cars because there'll be even more hypercars having at it. Yeah, I was a little bit concerned that once the race got going, that it might be a Toyota kind of one, two again. It might be back into the sort of the old days as we know it, but it's, it, it's anything but that. It's actually absolutely delivered on every level. And we've had every manufacturer pretty much taking a turn at the top. And that just shows that they've got it right. They've got the balance of performance right. They've got the whole concept right. And, you know, the racing that we're seeing here is, is just, uh, just unbelievable. Le Mans winner Guy Smith. We're joined by world champion Anthony Davidson as well as we watch the 35 Alpine coming into the pit lane in a battle with the 80 AF Corsa car. That's the Zebra car that you, could, that you saw a moment or two ago. And APR Algarve Pro Racing. So that's four, fifth and sixth in the LMP2 category. Into Europol leading Fabio Scherer still at the wheel of that car. And his teammate last year in that car, Alex Brundle, currently doing commentary on Eurosport, watching on with interest. United also sports 23 car. Now that's their best car in terms of championship points. There goes the 80 car. And that is in second place with Tom Blomquist at the wheel. And Team WRT's Robert Kubica in third. Jota's car that had led earlier on, 28 car. Oliver Rasmussen still at the wheel. Now, we've done commentary gone for dinner, had a bit of a loaf around, come back, and he's still driving the car that he was in when we left at. Incredible, isn't it? He's putting in a solid stint. Yeah, real solid stint. Um, yeah, but Jota were at the top of the LMP2 field, to be fair, when we, uh, we left momentarily for our, uh, for our dinner. But uh, yeah, Rasmussen still at the wheel. But uh, yeah, right at the top there, Ferrari, Pierre Guidi, they're doing a fantastic job. And so is the 94 Peugeot, Lloyd Duval. Really impressive stuff uh, from them. I mean, it really came good in the mixed conditions for them. And the car suddenly came alive, didn't it, Guy? In the in those tricky conditions with the with the slicks on, intermediate conditions. 
and uh, suddenly that Peugeot is right there in the mix. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking at the timing screens now because we know that the 50 Peugeot, sorry, the 50 Toyo, uh, Ferrari, sorry, has gone on to slicks now. So it's the first car on to slick tyres. Um, so we just want to see whether it was the right decision or not. Um, so I'm keen to see how they go. Well, earlier on in the daylight, it was the right decision to switch early. I'm less convinced now, though. You know, it's a very different beast as soon as that sun goes down and the track just remains greasy for a much, much longer time. Usually, that's how it plays out here, but uh, I might be proven wrong. But uh, yeah, I think that's quite a brave move from, from Nielsen to be on the slicks. They might need to take a little bit of a roll of the dice because they dropped behind their sister car by over 30 seconds in the last round of pit stops. The team said they had to do a bit of a reset on the car and it just spent longer stationary. So maybe trying to get some of that advantage back. You can see tyre change here. That's a, that's a set of slicks. Yes, yeah. it is. That's slicks going on to the United 23 car. Now, that is their strong car. Into your pole, United and WRT's 41 car all in from the lead. And so now to the lead of the race goes the 28 Jota car, Volley Caldwell. Again, like in the hypercar class, as we have seen year in and year out with this car, with these LMP2 cars, and since before you were in LMP2 and since you've left LMP2, the battle has never been anything other than relentless. The cars are so closely matched, the teams are so closely matched, blink and, and suddenly you're out of the hunt. Absolutely, it's, it's always been a hard-fought battle, the, the LMP2. It's been recent years, like you say, Martin, yeah. WRT, Jota, United Autosport, they, they've really raised the bar. Driver change here, Richard Westbrook out of the car number two, Cadillac, and Earl Bamba back in. He uh, started this race, of course, for the number two car. And he really knows his way around this track, particularly in the night. He was always quick here, uh, back in his uh, Porsche days in LMP1. He was always phenomenally fast, in, particularly in the nighttime sessions. Going on to softs, so this is a change to slicks as well. Pit stop though, sparks flying from the wheel guns, a little bit slow on the left rear as well, a bit, bit messy there. Had confirmation from Penske Porsche Motorsport, Porsche Penske Motorsport, that the 75 car has had to be retired. It is shown as stopped, it is out on the circuit, and it is retired. Turns are really not bad from here. It's just uh, between the two chicanes and up to Milzan, so let's carry on. I think it's a good choice. Well, I think it's yeah, a good copy. I think it's a good choice. Well, that was the engineer telling Nick that he thought it was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, I think my decision was a good choice. <laughs> I mean, you're two seconds off the pace at the moment, but so suck it, it up, Buttercup. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's going to take it's going to take you say as you said a, a couple of extra laps to get the temperature into those tyres with it being a little bit um, without the sort of heat of the of the, the track surface and the sun. So I think it's going to take a couple more laps, but I think with every lap the track is drying out and um, it's definitely going more and more towards the slick. So. We all know that horrible feeling though, when you're on a set of old wets on a drying track and it starts sort of squidging around, you lose your confidence, you lose the grip, yep. and uh, you're just wishing that you could be on the slicks. And if you committed too early to the wets, you're out there for an awful long time losing lap time. Here's the 51 car in. Yeah, 51 is in. This is our race leader, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. He took over the last round of stops. Track temperature currently 22.4, air temperature 22.0, temperature in the booth 22.0. 23.0 just clicked up to. So right rear, left, uh, 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 right front. Um, yeah, a set of scrubbed slicks ready to go on. Normally, you don't see the chalk marks and, and that matte finish on a set of tyres that hasn't been used. So I wonder if those were tyres that may have done a little bit of work in qualifying. We'll wait and see. Yellow flag, top left hand corner. Yep, so they're going to put the slicks on. Yep. Off come the old wets, just as we were talking about. And it's a brand new set. Oh, it is a brand new set actually, of softs. Yeah. You can see the white tab yep. just at the bottom of the picture. Not, not the sort of big Michelin logo, but there's a little white tab about... Uh, yeah, four or five centimetres across with S inside it. So the white is for the coldest conditions. This makes life easy for simple people like me. White for cold, yellow for sort of nice and sunny, and red for red hot. So Ferrari back up to speed and back full of power, whereas Toyota 
Number eight car is in this lap, and the number seven probably in another couple of laps. Seven is in. You can see the energy logo just yeah. creeping up there, 39, 40%. So seven in, and uh, Toyota number eight uh, with uh, Rio Hirokawa at the wheel. They're due in this lap, just down to 1% left. Either somebody has really started banging on the outside of, our, outside of our cabin, or for the umpteenth night in succession, the fireworks are going off again. It was a magnificent display. If you haven't seen it, there it, it'll be all over social media. The huge centenary celebration last night, fireworks, drones, and all sorts of music and lightning and lighting and pumping you set house. A soft, you set a soft you going set on a soft. as well. It's cold enough. Uh, cold enough. It's not so hot. Softs should survive here, shouldn't they? This, oh, yeah. is, this is now nighttime running. The well, temperatures I mean, are cooler earlier, perhaps, than they might normally have been expected to be because of the rain. They started the race, of course, on the softs as well, and uh, in the well, much hotter conditions, the sun was in and out between the clouds and the rain. It was a proper kind of April showers day almost, but uh, a lot hotter with it. And uh, they survived those those warm conditions. Uh, Seb Buemi did a brilliant job managing them. He had to manage them, but they definitely hung on in there. First ever time I've seen this race control message type coming up on our screen. Fireworks and drone show is going on. So there is another centenary celebration show. There's another gig tonight, yet another gig on the stage behind our caravan. So, uh, yeah, it is. It is a very busy weekend all round, uh, outside the track, inside the track, above the track, below the track. Just emptying bin liners there. Inside this uh, little access hatch to try and get rubber out of the front of the radiator grill. Yeah, so th all these cars are designed with uh, the quick access to those, uh, those holes where you can clear the radiators out, and particularly the Toyota, where they've been doing this now for such a long time here for the rebirth of the World Endurance Championship back in 2012. And uh, you learn every step of the way. Of course, you follow rule changes. They come and go. And, but every, through every iteration on car design, car development, you learn a thing or two, and you just keep perfecting um, elements like that. So that's one area where Toyota certainly have that advantage over the others. You can see the fireworks through the top of the was. screen yeah that's but what that is that's the fireworks and also you can see in his mirrors little you know uh, uh, on your car your your uh, door mirrors will indicate you know when there's something alongside you you can see his has got a little car logo as well I mean, it's very it's got a standard production road car look to it, but look at the size of the mirror that's a proper nascar size mirror enormously wide and of course when we refer to the project uh, the, the garage 56 uh, number 24 Chevrolet Camaro. Objects in the rear view mirror may be considerably larger than you imagined. That's what happens when it comes along. It's like, uh, it's like a Christmas tree there, isn't it? I can't, I'm trying to work out so it's green and then it's going orange and red, is it? So I'm taking, like... Presumably that's because of proximity. Yeah, Starts but... off green, goes orange <laughs> and then goes red. But the car looked like it was dropping back in the distance. Yeah, now it's all red. The down there. But it was, it was going green when the car was dropping back. And then it suddenly started going red again when the car was getting even further away. So uh, it was almost like it was reverse, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The reverse of... <laughs> Just to keep you on your toes. You're well, good, you're good. Yeah. Oh, no, he's catching her. You're good again. Just to Hertz Team Jota Car, Yiffy Yee, had built up a 10-second lead after the last round of safety cars, raced away from the field. I mean, absolutely destroyed everybody. But then, unfortunately, one mistake turning into the Porsche curves destroyed the back of the car. They lost about 20 minutes, I think, in terms of overall standings. They are now down in 13th place, the last of the competitive hypercars. Now, here's a great opportunity to ride on board with Alessandro Pierre Guidi. We're going to sit with him for a full lap. Let's hear the sounds and sights of Le Mans.
So how brilliant is that? A whole lap in the dark at Le Mans in a Ferrari leading the race. Pierre yeah. Guidi at the wheel. But what would it be like in a Cadillac? You want to find out? It'd be great to find out, wouldn't We're it? We're going to find out. There's the fireworks show. Now, there's the view from above of the lights and the the fireworks bursting in air. I mean, it was it was full on last night, wasn't it? And right where all of that is firing off is the edge of the TV compound. Our caravans where we sleep for the week are in there as well. And then at midnight, uh, the Sonne Lumiere continued on the main stage, which is about the length of a cricket pitch from the back of our caravan. So we were breathing in every bass beat all night long. It was... It was impressive. OK, let's ride with former Le Mans winner Earl Bamba. Again, the sounds of Speed Sport 1 here from Le Mans. Turn it up. So this time, riding on board with Earl Bamba, like you say, Martin. This time you can see the steering wheel, so the driver really at work. Here we go, on the run-up towards the Porsche curves. I'm going to shut up and let you enjoy it. To Indianapolis he comes with the LMP2 car as traffic in front it's not quite as blinding as that the camera's picking up the uh, the, the flashing rain lights of the car in front but uh, you get the idea amazing what an amazing experience to really put you in the cockpit with the driver you get to hear how hard at work they are on throttle coming out of all those slower speed chicanes it's absolutely 
treacherous conditions for them on these slick tyres, really working the, the steering and the throttle. All the pedals just, it's, it's such high intensity, high workload for the driver, uh, like, like it is. But um, yeah, El Bamba making it look uh, pretty effortless, because I can tell you, when you're actually sitting in there, it's even harder than it looks. And one of the things you're not getting is the view I'm getting, which is here in the commentary box, and particularly in the Ferrari, every time the tail stepped out, you could hear the wheels spinning, and it was short shifting away. Fast twitch fibers of Guy Smith and Van Davis, and we're both trying to catch the car. Yeah. It's just an instinct born of decades of tuition. Right, Nick. Well, the, the Pergridi, and, and uh, Alessandro Pergridi, who's leading, um, I've been watching him when he was actually in the wet, when he was really, really tricky. He was almost 10 seconds quicker than anybody. I, I actually thought it was a mistake, and I kind of watching his lap times. And even now, looking, he's, he's, the, he's in his sort of high 339, 340s, and the other cars are in the sort of 44s, 45s. Oh, that's the Bicoles, uh, the Floyd Van Wall car. So it's Esteban yes, Guerrieri, the Argentine driver. Now, that's not an outlap or anything else, so what's happened to him? Oh, dear. Oh. A big bunch of cars going slower than he'd imagined down in the S's. Yeah, just on the outside. I think he was looking for a bit of space almost and uh, just ventured onto the wet start. I mean, it's so hard to see where you're going, let alone whether you're on the wet part or the dry part when it's dark like this. That's kind of, that's a real shame. I mean, that's a single car entry. It's a small team. They've gone their own way with engine choice, development and everything else. And actually, it's shown decent pace this season. It's had a couple of reliability issues, but yeah. Putting it off in the gravel is not going to help their attack here. However, again for them, it will be the prospect of finishing this race that will be the big deal. Back into the GTE category in the pit lane, Proton Competition's Jonas Reed in the 88 car, the third generation of the Reed family because his dad is racing here this weekend, Christian Reed. And it was his grandfather, Gerald Reed, who started the family voyage in the FIA GT Championship when he was racing in Porsches with Proton Competition with his son Christian, then the young Christian in his 20s. And Christian's teenage son, Jonas, gets his first Le Mans start. This is one of the boys that Christian told me would never go racing. They're going to do tennis or something that's cheap. And then when they started karting, he said, no, I'm never going to race with them at Le Mans. So he's not in the same car. And I was telling Jonas all of this when we were at Scrutineer, and he said, I'd love to race with my dad. And, you know, if you talk to Martin Brundle or Nigel Mansell or Derek Bell, you know, the chance to race with the boy, or the, in Mansell's case, both sons, was a really huge deal. And, of course, for, for Derek and Justin, it was nearly that enormous fairy tale in the Harrods McLaren. Well, I mean, I remember Derek telling me he actually... Even over his wins, driving with Justin was actually mm. more special to him than actually winning the race. Yeah, it just has it just has that human emotion. And the, the third driver, of course, uh, Andy Wallace and the team boss of that car, the late David Price. So Pricey, the Bells and AWOL nearly pulled it off. They had a Fiona Miller needs to be here because she was doing the PR for that car. I think they had a gearbox problem in the end and that dropped them out of what was the lead of the car, a lead of the race, and they ended up on the podium in third place. So, yeah, I, mean, I know, you know Jeff Brabham won here for Peugeot, David Brabham won here for Peugeot, and as he would still have it for, uh, for Tom Walkins here in the XJ220. So as far as I was concerned, I stood on the podium, I still got the trophy, so I, I still think I won it. But they never got a chance to, to drive with their dad and would have loved to do so. Both of the boys, incidentally, won on Father's Day, which was which isn't this weekend this year, it's next weekend this year, as, as you will all find out next weekend when you're back home. And we have a uh, Jan... Uh, Jan and Kevin. Jan and Kevin yeah, yeah. 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 When Kevin was between gigs in Formula One, yeah. uh, just briefly, he was uh, an LMP2 driver here, and then even more briefly, uh, he was a Peugeot factory driver, and then suddenly Formula One discovered they wanted a bit more of his uh, pithy vernacular and some, uh, some driving skills. <laughs> Not sure there is debut falling on the road track from the fireworks. That was a nice little mix, but back with our race leader, Sancho Pierre Guidi. It's been interesting, actually, in this race, uh, apart from that little bit of rally stage there in exiting Mulsanne Corner, interesting how at certain periods, some drivers 
in cars that ostensibly are really no quicker than the others have just wiped the floor with with their rivals and Yippie Yee was starting to do that after the last big safety car in the Hertzstein Jota car just ran away and it wasn't because there was a titanic battle behind him because a couple of cars broke free he just went and was gone yeah it wasn't like he got lucky in traffic which we can sometimes see him in this last lap Pierre Guidi did a 3.43.9 and uh, the car behind him Nico Muller this time does a 3.40.2 so uh, it's uh, swung in the favour of uh, Muller that lap uh, a 3.39 for Kobayashi but uh, yeah, when it was um, Ifeye's turn at the wheel, he, he was just genuinely fast, pulling away from the Porsche behind him, overtook and pulled away from both Ferraris. They were on evenly, uh, evenly matched tires with the same age, same compounds. I mean, he was just genuinely quick. Mm. And then I still don't know what happened in the Porsche cars, but I, I still reckon he must have just lost the rear end on the, the second left and just couldn't control the car, got on the wet stuff around the next right that followed, and uh, it was quite a hefty blow into, into the barrier there, now four laps down, but it was such a such a rise to the front, wasn't it, for, for Team Jota, the Hertz Team Jota car for, for a while. So I'm just looking, guys, we've got the, um, the Ferrari AF Course car leading hypercar, we've got the AF Course car in LMP2 in fourth, and the AF Course car in GT in third, so they're moving up the order. So uh, yeah. you know. they, they've almost got a podium in all three. They could potentially win all three classes, which, which we're pretty darn sure has never been done at Le Mans before. Imagine if you put money on on, a, on that on a clean sweep. Yeah, that that's been, a great, that great treble, great isn't it? Slow zone as they come out of the Dunlop chicane and down through the S's to Terre Rouge. Um, Graham Goodwin just pointing out uh, a couple of little interesting facts. Ferrari leads at Le Mans, haven't been able to say that for 50 years, not overall. Uh, a Polish bakery leads in LMP2, that's into Europol's number 43 car. And a dinosaur leads in GTEM. So Rexy, the Project 1 AO car, Matteo Cairoli, a Porsche Junior factory driver. There's your LMP2 leader. We will, fans, get around to LMP2 and GTE a lot more, hopefully, in the next few hours, because just for the moment, and actually, how far are we in? Seven and a half hours in, for the first time, the hypercars seem to have stopped swapping paintwork with each other. It has just settled down a little bit, like a slightly longer version of the Formula Ford Festival. It was fun, though, wasn't it? I mean, oh, yeah, and I'm sure it'll, it'll get back there. Yep. Uh, thinking about, you know, to the start of the race, before we had all the, the downpours that really spread them out eventually, uh, the Toyota did have the pace. It was a similar pace to the Ferrari. Boemi couldn't pull the gap on the Ferrari, but he had a different compound attire on, arguably the weaker compound at that time in the soft. The Ferraris had the medium. So it's not as if Toyota don't have the pace in this race to win it on outright speed. They can certainly match Ferrari in dry conditions. So, uh, and, and the Porsche was up there as well. So we did have this incredible three, four way fight that I honestly don't know who had the fastest package. And then, yeah, the rain, you see different drivers excel at different points. Um, we mentioned Yves but also Pierre Guidi and Nico Muller, the Peugeots came alive in, the, in those uh, mixed conditions as well. So, yeah, the, the gaps have spread out. But as we know, all it takes under these new regulations of the safety car, mm -hmm. where we get the, the three, then they become one, and we get the, the pass arounds and also the, the drop backs, so they, they split the categories again. It, all that it takes is one safety car now, that, that period of, of time behind safety car, and then it all bunches back up again. You're just watching Fabio Cherile in the Inter Europol car number 34, the green and yellow car leading in LMP2. And he leads by just over 30 seconds from Team WRT's Robert Kubica. Oli Caldwell in third place in the 35 Alpine Elf car. And Caldwell, as we have uh, famously uh, said a number of times, will turn 21 during the race. Uh, Jim was suggesting it would be at midnight. Of course, it won't be at midnight because he's not French. It will be at one in the morning local time because that's midnight in the UK. So that, that will be when that happens. This is all part of the drone show that we saw yesterday evening as part of the celebration to this Le Mans centenary. The headlights there become old number one. The 
1924 winning Bentley. In fact, that might even be the Chenard A. Walker. I was trying to decipher exactly which one it was. It's a bit beyond my time. That's so cool, Only a it? bit, though. It was. It was very good fun to watch. And uh, from where we were in the TV compound, we actually got sort of part of it. But from where most of the crowd were, watching it to looking towards the stage rather from the back of the stage, it uh, looked even better. And uh, the light show then also went on. To, uh, I wasn't quite sure what the uh, sombrero part of it was, but to, to uh, highlight some of the other features of cars that have been improved by Le Mans. Maybe let's go. The drive, fire switch, and go. Anthony Davidson. I think he might have been talking about tyres. Uh, honestly, mm. I, I, don't, I didn't quite catch that. It was brevity itself, wasn't it? I think he said, I think he said that something like the drier tyres are okay, but I'm, I'm, my confidence level is low on that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you need TC up a little bit on that one. I, I, no, he sounded I'm, infused anyway, whatever it was. Yeah. Matteo Cairoli for Project Mon AO. That is the dinosaur, the T-Rex number 56 Porsche. Easy to spot with its Why teeth. Why is it That's a dinosaur it. again? Uh, because PJ Hyatt's kids said, Daddy, could a car look like a dinosaur? And he went, yeah, of course it could. If you hit it hard enough. And so it did. <laughs> and so it, and so, so now when he races in the IMSA WeatherTech Series, his car looks like a dinosaur, and because he's racing here at Le Mans, and because why not, his car looks like a dinosaur. Quite remarkable, really, when the, uh, the colour scheme was first unveiled on the GTD car in him, so it kind of split opinion uh, for about five minutes until everybody agreed that actually it's really rather wonderful. And then uh, there's Chaparral there in the... Um, OK, now, I still, I still haven't looked up whether it's a 2E, a 2D or a 2H or 2F. 2F? What well, I think you should do is decide what it is and then we can get people on Twitter to criticise you. Now, I'm sure people will go, oh, how can you possibly not know that? Well, because I wasn't born. You mean you don't know? Barely born. He says, um, reaching... There, 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 was a, there was a really very good little bit on uh, a TikTok-y, Twitter-y thingy thing. Hair dryers invented here at Le Mans as well. Uh, a very good uh, bit on, <laughs> on TikTok of... Charles Leclerc walking back down the pit lane from the grid, being followed by the dinosaur, one of the two guys <laughs> with his little dinosaur arms, and he was not impressed, to which somebody had commented, sometimes it's tough being green, which I just thought oh, was no, just no. a work of genius. So I, I'm sorry, I, I haven't got the tweet handy, but whoever that was, you're obviously a Le Mans fan, that was uh, the, the tip of the hat. That was absolutely spot on. But very nice, very nice little touch. They had a couple of uh, guys dressed up in dinosaur suits as well. Because you know why wouldn't you? Le Mans is, is a serious race, but it's also to be enjoyed, devoutly to be enjoyed, to be devoured and, and loved. This thing. Well, there you can again. You can see more of the elements hybrid power coming to Le Mans for the first time here. All part of. That powertrain development that has gone into road cars and has come complete circle because, for instance, Toyota Gazoo Racing are using road car componentry in their current hybrid system, having used their LMP1 hybrids to help develop that. And then the two hydrogen elements together, H2, is hydrogen's uh, two atoms together, bivalent bonding of uh, the hydrogen atoms. So H2, you can see that with the H24 logo, that's the pure hydrogen-powered race vehicles that have raced in Michelin Le Mans Cup and in European Le Mans Series encounters. And uh, the ACO hope will be racing here in the Le Mans 24 hours before long. Riding on board with uh, Kamui Kobayashi here, team principal at uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing. And uh, he is he's putting on a charge at the moment. That last lap was a 3.36 lap time compared to the two in front of him, the 340 of Muller. Oh, and uh, Pierre Guidi actually tops that, he bets that with a 335.4, that last lap around. So, uh, yeah, Kobe Ashley again, he's uh, he's up there with the, the fastest out there, but he is certainly closing the gap on uh, the Peugeot 94. Early in the race, fans may have thought, ooh, Toyota really look like they're being outclassed here. You can't count them out. Not only have they got 
phenomenal experience of racing Le Mans 24 hours itself, but this is the third year they've been doing that with this car. We can't state that highly enough, I think. Ferrari's car is here at Le Mans for the very first time, as is the team as a race unit. Peugeot's car is here at Le Mans for the first time. Cadillac's car is here at Le Mans for the first time. So all of those cars are making their racing debut at Le Mans. Irrespective of who's running them, the cars have not run here before. And that knowledge, that ability to keep dialing the car into the track and the team into the car and the drivers into the car can't but help Toyota in the long run in this battle. I've been really impressed with the way that as the weather has changed so radically backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards their new coming rivals have been right there on the money they have been right there with them i did fear when we saw rain forecast that that would just really tip the balance in toyota's favor it may yet because of their experience i'm really impressed with the way the new teams have just run with this thing Racing Team Turkey in the pit lane, the 923 car. And I've lost... How can I lose a three-digit car? That's because it's on page two, a long way back. Tom Gamble at the wheel when he brought the car in. McLaren... Sorry, McLaren. Chaparral 2F. Ah, uh, oh, there you go, 2F. 1967 uh, yeah. at this great race. And it was a uh, front-runner, but uh, a retirement in the... After 18 hours transmission problem. Phil Hill and Mike Spence drove that car. Automatic transmission problem. Uh, down in the pit lane, if Steph Wentworth, what do you know about Racing Team Turkey, young lady? Well, they've been in the pit lane for quite a while. Uh, there was actually a broken suspension, and the guys have done really well to fix it as quickly as they have. Uh, it's Van Thor back in the car now, and they are ready to go racing again. Excellent. Now, what fans may not know is that Racing Team Turkey, uh, Sally Yolich, is, is the key to, to that whole uh, Operation Turkish Driver, a former FIA World Cup winner in uh, for Team Turkey. Uh, he and Anchan Juven won the first motorsport games of motorsport, uh, FIA motorsport games. Um, that car run by TF Sport, which is also running Aston Martins in the GTE AM class. And there is Rexy, the car that leads in GTE AM. And leads by how much a over the iron day? Uh, 61 seconds. Yeah, now. that's a. Uh, Matteo Caroli a... pushing on and yeah. going very well indeed. Don't know how much we've seen of PJ Hyatt yet. That's one to watch, remember, mm. in these Pro Am uh, classes. Is it's uh, it, There's an open season on when the teams can opt to put their bronze rated driver in the car. So we'll have a look at that in due course, but it's certainly a very impressive. That's either a fantastic firework display, it's a big off for somebody. <laughs> and I'm sure you can hear the noise from the effects cameras around the track, but you're probably also picking it up from the cameras in the booth here, because it is... Uh, we're not hearing it from, from the TV, we're hearing it coming through the wall of uh, where we're in a, a double cabin, like a temporary cabin deal. And, uh, yeah, that's definitely making itself very well aware of its presence here. There you can see the... Uh, Project One AO Garage and uh, Ferrari AF Corsa. It, it's been such a joy having AF Corsa and Ferrari together in this hypercar class because they have brought a good-looking car, a quick car, a good team of drivers who predominantly we know well because they are multiple GT championship contenders and winners, but also they have just been so open and enthusiastic. Now then, are we going to stay with this? Let's stay with this. Manu, I'm begging you now. We've had onboards with the Ferrari. We've had an onboard with the Caddy. Let's have a bit more Americana and ride with Jimmy Johnson.
I'll speak softly again for those of you who've still got your volume turned up because I'm sure there'll be a lot of those. It's the sounds of Daytona Beach, the sounds of Le Mans, isn't it? And yeah. what a great time to be alive. What a great time to be here at the Circuit de la Sarre. The centenary race has just served up the entertainment, the soundtrack, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and what an effort from this NASCAR developed problem though for another of the big V8 cars. Yeah, this is a car that had a problem on lap one, brought out the first lap safety car, the Action Express Cadillac 311. Alexander Sims at the wheel of this car, didn't see what the problem was. Where had he gone straight on? I think that might have been down at the second chicane, Martin. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We just saw Carl Malfino and uh, Carlos Tavares there. Yeah, we saw Carlos Tavares in the uh, AF Corsa Ferrari garage a few minutes ago. It was sort of uh, a slight mixing of the streams. I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. Uh, Steph Wentworth is lurking still down at TF Sport. What do you know about the 777 D station car? Well, the front has had a huge chunk taken out of it. The front right, it looks like it's crashed into a wall or a barrier because it is completely mashed up. We'll definitely be needing a full front change and maybe there might be some uh, suspension damage on the on, on the knees as well. Thanks, Steph. Now, of course, Graham, that car was not not that car, but the original 777 car that was scrutineered on Friday or Saturday was written off in free practice, first free practice, in a, an accident with the number 13 Tower Motorsport car, which is already out of the race. And that's a brand new car, well, it's a, an it's existing a car, car that was already at their base in England. That's right. So the car came out. It's John Hodgson's regular LMS chassis, but per regulation, if they can, uh, and they did, uh, switch the engine and gearbox from the original car to ensure that car was back. But I think you were just saying uh, off mic and you spotted where that car went off. Yeah, it went off at the first chicane. Um, it was there for quite some time. They were deliberating whether to put out the, uh, the, the uh, full course yellow or just a slow zone for that section of the track. And, uh, and then they got going again. So I'm, I assume it was in the, just where we passed there actually on the right hand side, uh, running board with uh, Nico Muller in the 94 Peugeot. I think that's where the 777 D station car went off. I think it's got Fuji Sam behind the wheel. Uh, you see on your screen, uh, Martin? It is Tomino Fuji. Yep. Came in with yep. that car. The gold ranked driver for D station racing. Now we've seen pictures of it. And so the TF Sports D station crew going to work. And that is not going to be the work of a moment for the car. Already down in 11th place and dropping quickly. It was running in ninth in class, I believe, before that incident. So. Uh, yeah, a shame for that tricky first chicane. Uh, we saw Alex Sims obviously run out wide in the second one, but uh, this track is still holding the moisture. Little update by the, the way on the number four Floyd Van Wall car. That was recovered from the gravel, has been into the pit lane and is back out again. It's now on an outlap with Esteban Guerrieri. So if you see the number four coming past you, it has been in a relatively long stop about it's actually just three minutes just three minutes so, so maybe a bit of a clean up after yeah. that trip into it, and eventually it, it through was, the gravel it was pretty harmless he just looped it off backwards uh, avoiding other traffic yeah, despite the some of the, the, the woes for some of the hypercars still the top 13 cars here of the 16 are the, the are all hypercars next one down the order is the number four car down in 39th position then we've got the retired 75 car, still shown as being in 51st position, but in reality out of the race. And a couple of laps still to uh, pass that uh, point is the 52nd place 311 car, the Action Express racing car that we saw in trouble just a few minutes ago. Yeah, that's in the pit lane, and that may well be there for a wee while longer. But we have the top 10 cars still on the lead lap at nearly one third distance of this race, despite all the best efforts and some fairly strenuous weather conditions to disperse them to all points west. Guys, like a toddler that's found the sweetie cupboard, this race simply will not quit. It won't calm down. It's refusing all efforts of anybody just to develop what you might reasonably call that, that, that rhythm that you get into at night. Never really understood why that happens, Anne, but it always seems to that you'll get this frenetic activity getting into this kind of time of night and all of a sudden things seem to calm down without your drama uh, interjecting and we get three or four hours spot off at, at, at Le Mans where actually what we've got is pretty fast running. Speaking mm. of rhythm, yeah, you're absolutely right, Graham, that the drivers in the car at the moment, particularly as it starts getting later, 
uh, in, in regards to time of day, the longer you stay in the car, the more in the groove you get. And it's quite often the next drivers that get in, you see a lot of safety cars and moments. We have a reported debris, Marsh Marshall Post 21. We have reported debris, Marshall Post 21. Marshall Post 20. Okay, that is Mulsanne Corner. Drivers left. Yeah, Mulsanne Corner. So somebody has possibly smoted a barrier on the way into Mulsanne Corner and uh, shed bits, or down the straight and shed bits at Mulsanne Corner. Yes, Ramsey. Uh, fires Ramsey. Got a light out. Yeah, on the one light right with 35 yeah. car. Yeah, the, uh, they will need to fix that because that will be spotted. That is on its outlap as well. Memo Rojas. Yeah, driver awesome. change there. Ollie Caldwell stepped out of the car. Now you're saying at midnight we should get everybody sing to him. Yeah. That's not midnight in England, and he's not French, so therefore Still 1 a.m. No, it's not. Doesn't count. Oh, doesn't count. Doesn't count. He wasn't born in France, so he wasn't born on French summertime. He was born on British summertime. Was he? I don't know where he's born. It sounds like we've got to find out I when he was born. <laughs> where he was born. I'm going to check that. I'm just going to give Mr. and Mrs. Caldwell a quick call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what time of day, please? is the number 50 Ferrari AF Corsa 499P. Nick Nielsen, man at the wheel. He started the race in that car, of course, so they have cycled through their first run of drivers. And the other two drivers in the car will be trying to get a bit of rest. Not very easy at this time of night, and you know, what's the time now? Half past 11, quarters to midnight here. You're still ramped up, you're st I mean, especially for these crews, you know, their first race in hypercar, their first race at the front of the field, the overall front of the field. It's going to be very hard to really tune out of that and just get a bit of rest. It's, uh, I was just saying before we had the uh, race director's message there that usually one of the hardest moments of Le Mans is to jump in when it's dark and you've been out the car seeing your, other, your two other teammates at the wheel and you might not be yeah, you might have been, uh, it might be your first go, actually, at this stage. So you're getting in the car for the first time because of all the delays we've had. Drivers are reaching close to their maximum driving time of four hours at the wheel. That's the, the most you're allowed in the hypercar categories of pro. So you finally get your chance. It's dark. It's slippery. You're starting to feel a little bit tired already just because the time of day is so late. Uh, at uh, 10 to midnight here, as we are in the morn. And you, it's just, everything's just in, in, in fast forward. You can't kind of, you can't get yourself up to speed. You see other cars around you. You see the lap time set from your teammates before you and you're miles off. You can be two seconds off and you're thinking, how on earth did they do that? I'm driving out my skin to be doing this. I'm, I'm living by all my senses right now. And I'm just desperately trying not to crash the car. How on earth do I go two or three seconds faster? And then gradually it starts to come. It's, you start to find the lap time. You start to find where you can and can't overtake the cars, the slower cars. And you get in that rhythm. You learn the processes, learn the track. Again, because it's a forever changing beast, the circuit, as you go through the 24 hours. The grip comes and goes, the gravel comes and goes that's been spewed onto the track. And you just, you have to be out there. There's no better time just to be out there in the groove, in the rhythm, and living and breathing it as it evolves. And that's how you find immense lap time. As soon as you change driver, you've got to start that learning process again. And that's what I always found the hardest. We're chatting away to a couple of the guys who raced here a decade or so ago. Uh, one, a factory driver, one, a privateer LMP driver. And we've been talking about what really has made the legends of Le Mans. And yes, of course, it's the winners. Of course, it's those uh, efforts. But it's other things, too. It's things like the faultless drives that people remember uh, that could be in absolutely any of the classes. And beyond that, it's then in adversity, whether in, in poor weather, when someone just gets dialed in and actually, frankly, destroys the rest of the field. It's like what Guy was saying earlier on about Pia Guidi. Yes. Who's 10 seconds yes. a lap faster that's than That's JJ Leto style, that's Tom Christensen style, and that's incredibly impressive, and it will be remembered. It's it's what... I'm not blowing my trumpet, I hate talking about myself, but that's what eventually got me my Toyota drive, is the stints that I did. Uh, Pascal Vassalon said, the stints you did in the wet in your Peugeot in the 908. Here you go. People were watching. They watch what you do, you know. It, 
in those tricky conditions, that's when a driver can really make the difference. I can remember a couple of other drivers in that situation, not here at the Mon, but it was a breakthrough drive that got them their break to come forward. Marcel Fesler um, destroyed the field at Spa 24 Hours in her GT1 Corvettes and and went on to do amazing things in LMP and GT cars. Andrew Lotterer, yep. his first experience in the Audi. It wasn't even the the, the fully fledged A team, was it? It was the uh, it was the Collis team. The Collis team, yeah. yeah. In adversity, when the Ryan Carter came, fell off the pit wall and uh, dislocated his shoulder. It was just him and Charles Waldman Jr., a two-driver effort that did things in the car that had never been close to doing that in private hands. 2009, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah and that's how Lotterer burst onto Completely the scene. Completely correct. And, and time after time after time, you know, these are the kind of things that do define that opportunity to break through and show what a driver of supreme quality can do. And I'll blow your trumpet. You are, you know, you were a driver of supreme quality, and it was blindingly obvious to anybody that took a, a, an opportunity to, to take a closer look where the quality was. And the great thing about this hypercar uh, class and is it is allowing quality to shine. I was going to say that a little bit earlier to Guy Smith and, and Peter Dunbreg. Do we think? that this is now a class that where the cars are so closely matched that actually the major difference between them at any stage is what the driver is doing at that time in the car. It just just starting to get that feeling. Let's hear from our leaders. Box the slap. Box the slap. Okay. And big stint from Alessandro Pierre Greedy. I think the answer is yes, and I'd like to hear more from, from Ant about that, but there's another aspect to this too. When you've got a more spec class, it takes something truly special to break, not just break through, but dominate in that circumstance. I'll give you, gentlemen, Mike Conway in LMP2, Brendan Hartley in LMP2. It takes something special to just show that field that you're not just going to take a tenth or a couple of tenths out of them, but seconds and keep doing it and keep winning. Yeah, absolutely. You know, We've just been saying about Pierre Guidi, heard from his team, he's coming in this lap. But uh, if they were, you know, it's a long way to go, with 16 hours still remaining in the race, but if they were to go on and win, and it's that car crew that does win, that's one of those pivotal moments, that drive, that stint, in very tricky conditions where you go, you, you kind of, you lean more towards that drive and you say, yeah. I mean, I know you wouldn't lose as a team, but once in a while, there's a standout performance that that more than hands you the victory. Yep. And uh, at the moment, it seems that that stint he's put in was very pivotal to their race. JJ Leto threw the night in the Ueno Clinic McLaren that ended up winning the race in, in conditions a lot viler than, than we've seen, but probably we're going to see a lot more of throughout the race. So, yeah, there are, yeah, as they always say, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Antonio, uh, Alessandro Pierguidi stays in. Uh, Kamui Kobayashi in the pits in the number 7 to 8 in second place. And also in the pit lane from third, the 94 Peugeot of Nico Muller. So we have got, in order from the top of the field, Ferrari, Toyota, Peugeot, Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Cadillac, Porsche, Porsche. Somebody asked a little moment or two ago on Twitter, is this the best top-class field we've had? in a while yes it is this is exactly what the aco and what imsa had hoped for when convergence was first spoken about that cars from both sides of the atlantic from all sports car disciplines would be able to race together not just at the same venue but in the same class and on level pegging and that is exactly what we're seeing everything that was being talked about and that was accelerated Graham Goodwin through COVID when there was no actual racing for months on end, that that COVID period of being able to talk and think and plan and work and, and do the testing and run the simulations that formed the cohesive rule set that we've got for Hypercar, that's what we've got now as a result. And uh, again, we've talked about this all year in anticipation of coming to Le Mans, that we are, there, there is the feeling 
all pervasive that this is the dawn of a golden era of sports car racing and nothing I've seen in the first third of this race tells me anything otherwise. Oh, I'll tell you this much. We came here hoping we might see a flavour of this. We came here hoping. Mm. I didn't really expect we'd see what we'd see uh, so far in this race. And I'm utterly delighted uh, to say that with all that you've just said about the, the amazing work that's been done uh, for the sport, uh, walking in through the door um, is a man we've got lots to talk about, including what we're now seeing on screen. Welcome to the booth. Uh, IMSA president, but more particularly, team director, our project director for the NASCAR Garage 56, uh, Camaro ZL1 NASCAR effort, John <laughs> Doonan. Um, you've had a, a smile about a mile wide <laughs> all week. I'm going to interrupt you because this is oh, our trouble. race leader, Alessandro oh, dear, Pierguidi, oh, on his outlap, stopped at the first chicane. He has looped it round at the first chicane. So that is the Ferrari sitting in the gravel, and that immediately means that the Toyota that somebody said on Twitter again a moment or two ago, well, they've been unfairly hampered by the change in BOP, and clearly they haven't got a car that's as quick as anybody else. That car is now the race leader. Oh, the Persia is the race leader. Uh, oh, the Persia is the race leader. Persia, yeah, the Toyota is out in second place. So, yeah, uh, let's take a look here. Car off ahead of him. OK. And, and a car in spinning avoidance. in front of him. Yeah, somebody spinning and somebody going straight through the chicane. So was there something on the track or did he just get checked up in avoidance? Car to the left and the car spun around. He, he, he came into the chicane in the glare of headlamps pointing in the wrong direction. So 51 is going to be rapidly recovered to the racing service, I'm absolutely sure. John, uh, you'll appreciate, we'll talk around uh, <laughs> what's going on on the track, around some incredibly interesting stuff that's been go going on with you. Ferrari and they, of course, are, of course, uh, absolutely straight into action and very concerned after a stellar stint from Alessandro Pierguidi. Eyes wide here from Ale. That will have been a moment. Hera, let's have a listen in with what's going with Ale Pierre Guidi. Hey man, they're going to come get you. They're going to come get you. Just shake off the rocks before you drive back. So, anxious moments, but with the work that he has done over the past hour, it doesn't exactly have a margin, but it will certainly serve to reduce the damage of this moment. And uh, will, I think, pretty soon be back underway. Didn't see which of the other two cars were involved in that, Martin. Don't know if you managed to pick that up. No, I didn't quite. We'll probably get another couple of replays. I think one of them might have been Manuel Maldonado. He's had a, a very slow middle sector. And it could be it was Michelle Gatting, because that's another slow middle sector. OK. Look at, uh, Michelle Gatting's Iron Dames car should be easy to spot. Alessandro Pierre Guidi doing exactly as he was told, having a big shake of the hips and a big wriggle to try and dislocate as much gravel as possible. Do you bring excitement with you everywhere you go? <laughs> That's right. it's both pockets full. <laughs> Let's talk. Oh, uh, oh, 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 replay. Is that, that is a Porsche. It is a 911. Good shout. It's the 911 911. It's 911 in the hands of Richard Leitz. Ooh. And they can't see which car it is on the inside. But we'll get, we'll get a view here as he spins in the lights. He's not quitting this one, is it, John? <laughs> oh. That was two into one, not going. Yeah. Didn't pick up the LMP2 car. Let's talk NASCAR. Um, what on God's green earth started all this? <laughs> <laughs> because whatever it was, can we do it again? <laughs> Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to be part of this project. And, you know, what started it... Uh-oh. Uh, oh, dear. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. That's been in a wall. You can see the damage behind. You do bring drama with you, don't you? I do. Oh, that's, that's Louis sorry. Pratt bailing out he in a Porsche curve. Get out of there. Is that the end yeah, of the career for this fantastic... Oh, there's two cars. It's the seven. Oh. It's the Toyota. No. It's the seventh Toyota with Kamui like Kobayashi. Touch a rouge. That yeah. is astonishing. It's coming out of the back straight. It away. is coming out. Kamui underway again, but is there damage to that car? It is. Left How rear. can there not be? Track announcers are going mental. I don't know if you can hear it through the microphones, but we can sure hear it through the walls. You can see the track. Pay
peppered with gravel now at that stage, but uh, that looks to me as if that Ferrari's been in the wall. It's in the middle of the track. I think a safety car almost inevitable here. Did he, he spin and clip the wall on the inside and come back in and then get collected by the Toyota? Or the other way around. Oh, man, people got to slow down. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, here we go. Oh! Holy P2 moly! There's a P2 car and the Toyota involved in that. The car was briefly airborne. There's four cars involved there. It's the... Is that one of the Alpines, the 36 car? Yeah, it looked like the 36. Yeah. And that's a 25 car, Here's I think, the Toyota's well. view. That's the ORT Aston in front. That's a Panis car on the left. Or was that the 39? The Toyota's taken a hit. The Toyota took where the left did the, rear hit from the Where Ferrari. did the Ferrari come from? That is the Ferrari tried to come zone. through 35. the gap. It's the it's 35. Slow, it's the beginning of a slow zone, guys. Oh. And they all got caught wow. out. They all got caught out. Seven in trouble. 66. Seven was the only one that saw it. He yep. slowed. Seven in trouble. The LMP2 yep. car. 66 and then... in terminal trouble. 35 the, also yep. in trouble. There's that, the JMW team. Look at the crowd that are still here at midnight. That is a horrible way for a seven year Le Mans career for the 66 Ferrari to finish. Kamui Kobayashi, team principal of Toyota. Okay, we have to try to start the engine, try to start the engine. There's power. Now, what we didn't see is... It's green, that's good. Yep. Is what hit him and where on the car? I think is the it 66 car, is, it was the last to arrive on that. Yes. And he went, tried to go between the 35 and the 7, or and 36 and 7. And cannoned off both. And, and, and but the, the 35 came past the, the came right. past Camus oh, on, the on the right. right. There, was the right. A, there was a P car on left. I think it was the Panis car. I think it was 65 you're right, you're on the right. left. I think 65 I think on 35. Right. Oh, man. OK, can we report the damage as well? We will switch to slow zone two and three, so slow zone from uh, turn three to turn ten on short notice. So stand by for the moment. It's still full caution. Okay. So okay. I can run with this. That is Steve Hager, the number one in the JMW Motorsport uh, team with Stefan Ortelli, 1998 winner, also driver coach to Louis Brett. Guess. Trying to figure out what was going on. Cards involved. It says here a 7 and 60 on the Marshall's screen. It's not That's 60. 7 and 66. 60 is out and has yep. been for some time. The car is moving. Seven car is moving, but very, very slowly. Mm. This is high drama. Multiple winning squad. Uh-oh. When you move 30 feet, John Doonan, and turn it on and off again, as a road car driver, you don't need to be Einstein to read those signs. That's not a healthy car. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's been a lit. Just have a listen in to see what Kabu Kobayashi is hearing or saying. What happened? Can you tell us more? When I start the engine, car is not long at all. There's no chance to run. OK, driver default 2-6 on. First of all, driver default 2-6 on. Strikes me that sounds like drive. It's a drive shaft or a gearbox issue. If he's taking a clout in the side, that could very well be. What's Something going on? Else with damage. That Who's is the that? 35. 35, OK. So the that is the car is... that came by on the right hand side of Kubu Kobayashi. Yeah. So he may eclipse something. Again, on board the Alpine, this is Memo Rojas. You can see the full course yellow sign being shown to all the drivers. That'll be in every car. Well, I'm, the, the only part of that I'm not sure of is whether or not it was the 65 and the 35 or just the 35 twice. 35, did that car go from the left to the right in that blinding? Um, well, uh, there were so many sets of headlights, that's really that's, hard to pick out, problem. isn't it? Stefan Ortelli looking, com, uh, looking concerned, but we did see Louis Pret get out the car. The car, though, looks done. Yeah. Tom Bastian there interviewing... Uh, for the circuit PA. Not sure that they know an awful lot more. Full course yellow, by the way, here. Yeah. 
Louis Pret out of the car so far. I don't think he stayed in that car for a conversation with the crew. I think his intention was to get out of the way and get over the barrier. Guys are not slowing down. They're, well, yeah. again, when, yeah, full course yellows seem to be causing a lot of confusion this time. Let's hear again from Kamui Kobayashi. Go, bravo. Bravo 12.6 plus acknowledge, Bravo 12.6 plus acknowledge. We have to try to start the engine. The only way to come back is try to use the engine. Just try to burn out, try everything. We have to use the engine. We don't have enough sock to come back with the front motor. It's too early. The only way is to come back with the engine, do what you can. Yeah, not enough sock, not enough state of charge, which means the batteries haven't got enough power in them to do the lap. Uh, Ant Davidson has been just analysing what we saw there. I think there's, there's definitely two LMP2s involved there. 66 yeah, got hit from behind. By yeah, a P2 by car. By the 35 by car. The 35, 35 car yeah. hit the Ferrari. That's why there's so much damage to the rear end of the Ferrari. So there's Ferrari just being hit by the 35. He then comes to the right-hand side, look, and he's still yeah. limping past. That's why yeah. the front left so completely destroyed on the 35. Yeah. You're right, Jim. They were slowing down under a full course yellow. Look, next slow on the Marshall on the Marshall this system is on the car. car. This isn't car with 35. Yeah. No, he didn't. Oh, so he it's, the Toyota. Toyota. It's, it's two P2 cars. One hit the Ferrari. The other one hit the rear of the Toyota and hit it hard. So who hit so that who one? I think it's 65. In. I think the 65 the is on. car. I think from the onboard with Kamui, we saw the Panis car on the left. I thought it was the colour of the Panis car, and I thought it was 65, then saw the 35, and I think that misled me. I think it was the 65 to the inside. Here's uh, on board with the 35 car. But that's not the replay, that's no. live, yeah. Um, Let's try and talk to John. John, uh, for, uh, I, I the appreciate of, the fact you've kept the, the fans for, for the educated <laughs> on what's happening here. My, you know, my talking uh, doesn't uh, doesn't oversee that. So. Well, for, for the love of heck, please don't talk anymore because something else is going to happen. But, <laughs> but let's talk about this effort. It has been, I think, the ultimate fan pleaser. And coming into this, as is always the case when something new comes, there's always a little bit. That is the number seven. A door open that is looking increasingly like it's going to be terminal, and we'll come to that as and when we get more uh, information. That is the front end of the Alpine that hit the uh, the rear of the Toyota. Now we can see why that Toyota's got a problem. It wasn't a, a minor dink in the side from a Ferrari. It was a fulsome shove in the rear from the Orica. So while we're watching this action underway. Tell me this, John. This is, in my, to my mind, a further cementing of what's been a very profitable uh, alliance between two great parts of motorsport, the ACO and FI family and the NASCAR family with him, sir. Yeah, I think, Graham, first of all, thanks for all the coverage. And you guys know I listen to you all the time, whether it's uh, a, a WEC race or, or a European Le Mans or an a, uh, Asian Le Mans. When I'm in Daytona, I, I, I love hearing uh, the coverage, so thanks for, for all that. It, you're right, it, this, this week has been uh, a further uh, extension, if you will, of the partnership that IMSA and the ACO have had, a uh, strategic alliance agreement for several years, which we, of course, announced an extension of that last year. And, you know, if you, to get to today, you have to look back at what uh, Bill France Sr. did in 1976, and uh, I think just he needed to jump to the Toyota. We just saw Kamui leap from the car. It's a red car. It's the red done. light is flashing. They have a potential high energy problem with the car. So that is a red car, and that will require a lot of specialized intervention. Now, the other car, while you were talking, that came into the pit lane with damage was not the 65 Panis car, it's the 39 Graf car, another dark blue and white car. And that is part of why we thought 65 was on uh, involved and th why uh, the 35 car was on both sides. So the 39 Graf car has come in with damage. That was likely the other car involved. Let's take a look again. Here. So is that the Graf car on the left there? Has it already happened when Kamui gets here? He gets tagged by the Graf car. There's the JMW car being hit from the back by, we think, the uh, the Graf 39. And knocked over the Toyota. And then 
and then the 35 car has clipped the back of the Toyota. Although I heard the Graf car had damage on the rear, so... Unless that was yet another car involved. I think that had damage on the rear, guys, because he was next to uh, the 7 car, and the 66 came in between them, just a house of fire, and, yeah. and hit the 39, then bounced over into the 7. Yeah. Well, well dramatic a, moments, uh, really dramatic headlights. moments, and it's certainly one potential race-winning car that looks to be at this stage out of the race. Out of contention, definitely. Now, they can rescue the car, and if it can be confirmed that it is safe to use again, they can use it again. He won't be excluded from having for having left from the car and got over the barriers. That is part of the safety protocol, unless he's meandered off somewhere, which seems highly unlikely, but... Yeah, from red car to green car is, and actually, particularly given the impact, that you sense might be the reason it's gone from green, green car to red car in the first place. It's outside assistance. That is, oh, that is oh, marks on the up car. to the window of the car. That's over. It's yeah, over. It is. The number uh, the, seven car, yeah. that is pretty much the acknowledgement that uh, one of the pair of Toyota Kazoo racing cars that have dominated here uh, in recent years and have an unblemished record in hypercar double one two finishes for toyota it is done for the number seven car well you only need one car to win le mans they only have one car left that might be enough but again so often seems to be the number seven car that runs into bad luck and that i do not think was any of their own making they were just doing the right thing and an innocent victim of a major multi-car pileup. So it's going to be a bit of a clean up here for some time. Debris, uh, stricken cars, at least two of them. Two more have actually made the pit lane. There may well be a further car involved in that. There was a lot of cars in a small place at the same time. We'll switch back to uh, IMSA president and project director for the NASCAR Garage 56 car, uh, John Doonan. John. It's been all drama. Yeah, I've got you brought a couple of, of my you. teammates in Daytona texting me saying, we're trying to listen to your interview, but the guys on track don't seem to want to hear you talk. So maybe they're trying to sell me, tell me something and I should go back to the garage. So tell me, but, uh, moving on a little, we'll come back to a little bit of uh, Garage 56. You've been one of the architects of where we are right now today. I, I'll tell you right now, we're bowled over by what we've seen so far today. Tell me your reaction to it. I think uh, beyond expectations is the best way to describe it. And, you know, architects a nice, uh, a nice uh, term to use, but I, I've really just been one of the teammates or maybe it's team captain. Uh, you got tremendous partners involved in this project. Uh, all the folks at Chevrolet and GM Performance have been absolutely terrific relative to the powertrain. Uh, we, we wanted to keep as much NASCAR DNA in this project as possible while we had to uh, endurance eyes the car, if you will. Uh, but this engine is uh, an R07 Cup engine. We did some work on the top end, the, the valve train, given experience they've had in endurance racing. Uh, Goodyear has been tremendous. Uh, they have worked so hard to develop a, a wider tire, multiple options for wet and inter intermediate for this beast of a car, if you will. And uh, the folks at Hendrick Motorsport, the, you know, they, they don't win 14 cup championships without being absolutely at the top of their game. Lots of Eurocentric race fans would go, OK, and NASCAR is just this kind of outlier from motorsport and it's got no real relation to anything else. But you talked about Hendrick and, you know, you look at the teams like Penske South and all the other big operations, Chip Ganassi Racing, they don't just do one thing. They do multiple things. They have feet in all sorts of camps. You know, a lot of them you see on a regular basis here in the Inter Weather Tech series, as well as being, you know, as, as well as running cup cars and trucks and, and, and everything else. So within those organizations never mind within the greater sphere there is that interplay of information that cross-breeding that that all helps to to make both sides of that of that deal stronger yeah there's a there's a drone uh footage video somewhere uh of a drone flying through the hendrick motorsports facility oh, that. in concord anybody that hasn't seen that needs to take a look and understand what 
these NASCAR programs uh, entail. They are first class motorsport organizations and much like uh, when we have IMSA races and the folks at BMW or Porsche or Acura or uh, Cadillac have a group of engineers back at home base, if you will. Hendrick Motorsports has the same thing on a cup weekend where they've got a group of engineers and strategists in Concord in a control room. So uh, it's, it's, you're right, I think there's a maybe a misperception and the hope I think coming here was a celebration of what Bill France Sr. did in 1976 and we're back to replicate it. Can I draw down a bit on CC Grip and CCR? Yes. Nico Muller, by the way, now leading the race again. Peugeot again lead the race. Who would have thought this coming into this race? <laughs> this program mm. being talked down thoroughly uh, yep. before this race, and all of a sudden, uh, they've got two cars still well, running. Well, this has been our hope all the way while through. We saw the car racing at Monza last July. It's never been to Le Mans, but there's clearly, you know, history of, of Peugeot aiming to win Le Mans, and, and the, the real hope was that this car would come alive here, that it would come good here, and that's exactly what seems to have happened. So, as so often is the case, the car has been designed to win Le Mans and hopefully deal with the other races. Safety car is out now, again, with rescuing the JMW Ferrari, that's fairly straightforward. It's the it's the Toyota, isn't it? That will need to have intervention. And, out. and it, well, there was, there was intervention vehicles there already. I think the blue lights. I think we saw weren't medical. I think they were almost certainly uh, the Technical. yeah the the team red crew. But that car will need moving. But also there may be barrier repairs as well. We saw cars going off on both sides down on the on the run to Terre Rouge. So that might be happening. John's phone is still buzzing. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's an awful lot, but you know, it's it's midnight here in Europe. It's we're we're barely getting into prime time. It's time to blow the froth off a couple uh, back home in the states. I, I, I wanted to ask another question about this. We talk about racing family. Yeah. There's one racing family in terms of this effort with the Garage 56 that's supremely important. It's 75 years of Porsche. And align, align with that, it's 75 years of NASCAR and one family, yeah. literal families behind that. And the latest, how can we put it, patriarch of that is your boss. Yeah, I mean, how, what? How passionate what, is he about this? Jim is a racer to the core, as is his nephew Ben Kennedy, as his uh, his his niece Lisa, um, France Kennedy, and I have to tell you the culture in the office in Daytona, the culture in the Charlotte office, the culture at the um, NASCAR R&D Center. Um, it's a group of racers and uh, they operate with the utmost of integrity. They uh, want to do what's best for the sport, not just NASCAR, not just IMSA, not just AMA uh, flat track racing, which Jim also has, has an opportunity to uh, be a part of. Um, they want to do what's good for the sport. They believe in rising tide lifts all boats, and it's just a wonderful place to work. And I'm so honored and blessed to be a part of it in in the IMSA sense, in the sense of the Garage 56 project. And I too have gone to flat track races. So <laughs> uh, I've got one final question about the Camaro. That is a fantastic achievement. What's been achieved here to bring that car? to bring it to be able to race safely in amongst this amazing field on this unique track is no small feat. You're not just going to park him, are you? We're going to see this car any, do anything more again? Yeah, so uh, first of all, you know, we went back to 1976 where Jim's father, Bill, brought two NASCAR uh, stock cars here. They're up in the fan village if people haven't seen them. It's the, the car that Herschel McGriff drove. Herschel's here, 95 years old, wow, and he climbed wow. in that car wow. yesterday. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, Ford Torino was the other car, and Jim wanted to replicate that. And uh, we came here to showcase what NASCAR is all about. Um, we're doing that. Um, the Hendrick folks are running this program in the garage like they do everything else, and that's uh, like they're competing for a win. And if anyone has seen the garage or walked through there, it is first class. It has an absolute award-winning uh, group of folks 
doing the pit stops, which was evident in the pit stop challenge. They they finished ahead of all of the GT entries with a 10.3. Uh, second four tire change. They were P5 overall. Like they are taking this very seriously. And as I've been in the garage all day, Greg Ives and Chad Canales are uh, battling like they do every Sunday. So it's it's really special. You've been here before. You knew what to expect. Okay. When we were in Lupezar scrutineering in the center of the city and, and all the guys came in in their blue shirts. We knew immediately who they were. And I went over they're, as they were... about fuck tall. Uh, exactly. They're, they're, they're <laughs> decent height, you know, none of these short Europeans. They, uh, they, the, the car started to come in through the first tent, and they were all, like, kind of looking over the barriers from the inside with all the crowd looking over the barriers from the outside. And I was talking to these guys, and I said, this isn't standard tech, is it? You're not just pushing the car into a garage for, for the NASCAR guys to check you. Have you ever seen anywhere more French in your life? Because the center square there, the Place de la République, is classic French architecture all the way around. And they were, just, and, you know, boiling sunshine, so they were at home with that. Big crowds watching tech. And, and, and the proximity of the crowds as well is something, again, that the cup teams will be very familiar with because that's all part of the U.S. racing scene. But has it been fun watching them as first-timers come here and seeing all this stuff and discovering the track and the parade and, and everything that goes with it? There's absolutely no doubt. And besides Jim France being on Claude 9 and Rick Hendrick being on Claude 9 and Jeff Gordon, who is here all day today, um, being on cloud nine the thing that i think is most satisfying for me this week besides the media coverage which is again beyond expectations and blown up is the men and women on this project many of them not even having been outside the u.s before ever and so here they are planted in lasark and they are part of this program a couple of them have old camcorders and they've been taking it in and i just i love that for them that they're so happy well, here's another GM product. Let's hear from Earl Bamba. Oh, can you give some feedback on the track conditions in general? Yeah, no, it's dried up. Um, I was taking it easy earlier because I just can't see the road. It's just fine. But now to be honest, it's dry except just the exit of Chicane 1. Everything else is good. Actually, the last message we heard from Nico Muller, he was asking the team about turning down TCR, so whether or not he was able to back off the yeah. traction control that they'd ramped up a little bit in the wet conditions. There you can see the red light still flashing in the 7 Toyota. There is the intervention crew. And it's not for medical purposes. That is to try and make that car safe. Indeed. With these high-voltage hybrid systems, very briefly, actually, yeah. it's it's a whole new learning, isn't it? You know, Europeans go and watch the Indy 500, people are leaping around and, and having buckets of water thrown on them. That's not something we're used to, because we don't use methanol right. in racing, right. but that's standard there. And these systems will have to become standard. Every corner worker that goes to every track that you race at, that we race at, has to understand the basic rules of how you deal with cars when the red lights are flashing. And the answer is, don't go near them. Yeah, it's been a nice uh, opportunity for us on the IMSA side to get with um, all of the suppliers, the Bosch, the Williams, uh, and all of our safety team. We have a great track services uh, group in IMSA. And Robert Bosworth uh, leads that uh, with Roy Spielman. They've done an amazing job of educating uh, the corner marshals at each one of the events. They're very crystal clear, uh, high voltage safety protocols that Bill Pearson, Simon, Hodgson, and Matt Kurdock have developed. So I'm really proud of how we've learned that um, as number one is safety in our sport. And I think uh, this is a perfect example of that. It is an amazing new era in this top class. Hypercar here, GTP, of course, the Inland Swimmers at Sports Car Championship. We've seen one new car that is definitely coming the way of the WEC. There's one more to come, at least, that is definitely coming your way for a part season, at least, John, uh, next year. And that is the new Lamborghini, uh, Ligier Chassis uh, Lamborghini GTP car. I was at the uh, the raw test at Daytona. I think there were more people at the raw test than sometimes seen at the race. The race itself, an extraordinary turnout and an extraordinary race, uh, for that matter. And I said when you arrived here and sat down, you've got a smile as well as your face. I've, despite just how busy it's been, I've not seen you without a smile this year. You must be buzzing. I, I think um, I'm, I'm happy. 
I'm happy for our sport uh, to be candid. You know, there's been a lot of people that put in effort to get to convergence. There's, you know, Todd Payne set a vision. Uh, Jim Brands had a vision. Uh, Scott Everton put time in on it. Ed Bennett put time in on it. And I uh, was fortunate to arrive uh, at a time where uh, we just had to get it done. And I'm happy for our sport. And, the other thing I'm happy about is you mentioned the roar, you mentioned Daytona. We go to Sebring and you know the attendance at that event sets a record. We go to Long Beach and I know Jim McCallion's quite happy with what happened there in terms of fan attendance and sellouts of suites and, and grandstand seats. And then our friends at WeatherTech Raceway with Minnesota announced a 35% increase, the highest record ever um, in advanced sales of that event. So. It just, there's a tremendous amount of momentum and lift. I think we're doing the right things around sustainability with a, a new fuel in IMSA uh, through uh, our partners at VP Racing Fuel. We're using a hybrid that gives us a longer stint length. We are decreasing uh, tire allocations with, with Michelin. We couple all those things together. We have the most sustainable racing on the planet. Um, the cars look amazing. You mentioned the Lamborghini. I've seen some photos. Uh, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, they also, yeah, John, you, no, you should no, no, don't show us that. That's a, that's a <laughs> I didn't say I've had them. You I've seen them. Uh, we had a great meeting with Georgie Osana, uh, Stefan Dinkelman, and his entire staff have done an incredible job on that car. And that was the intent. And I think the credit goes back to Jim France to have the vision that we can build prototype race cars that speak the brand in their styling, and that's what these cars do. There's a strange thing, isn't there? We, you and I have had conversations. I've had conversations with people up and down the pit lane, the press room, away from the tracks. Lots of the, 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 the talk before we came into this was, oh, this was so much more spec, BOP, it's not pure racing. No one's saying that. This yeah. has been an astonishing race. Daytona is an astonishing race. And all it's done is to open up a rule book to make these things look different again. Yeah, yeah, and I think we want the fans to identify with the GT cars that they see on the street, there's no doubt. And you've got a tremendous number of GT cars running in IMSA. Uh, Ten, I believe, manufacturers running. Uh, certainly several here. And, and as the GT3 spec becomes uh, the way forward here, you're going to see more of that. But then you have, and that's, that's what is today. Those are the cars that people see on the road. And then these hyper cars or our GTP cars are about what's possible going forward. And I think that's how each of these manufacturers has embraced it. Uh, they've got the design. They've got uh, potential customer car sales uh, in in the wings. So uh, again, I, I smile because I'm happy for our sport. I think it's great for the people who have followed endurance sports car racing. But I also think there's a bunch of young little boys and girls that I've seen here at this racetrack in awe of what they're seeing, and that's our next generation of fan. And we need to do everything we can to get them to races and get them engaged. John, are you guys doing anything to encourage the customer uh, programs amongst these factories? I know for Porsche that's easy, that's in their ethos. But for some of these other factories, it's, it's not really in their DNA to have customer programs. No, you hit you hit a nail, Jim. And as you know, uh, my background uh, was all about customer sales. So if I have anything to say about it, uh, it absolutely will be customer opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of spec Miatas running around. Yes, there <laughs> and, were. Uh, and NX fives, but um, clearly it needs to work in their business model. Um, I believe it's possible. You sell customer cars, it might be able to fund uh, or help fund a, a cold, uh, factory endorsed effort. You know, Further so development. that's right. And and I think customer programs are great. And when you look back, as Graham said, to the maybe the heyday of the sport. I think uh, people said golden era. I think we're in the platinum era now, but um, you know, there were custom, the customer teams were the foundation of GTP and IMSA. Um, and I hope that we can get back to that clearly to have, uh, you know, Cadillac racing, to have uh, the accurate teams of, of Mike Shank racing, Meyer Shank racing and Wayne Taylor with Andretti, to have Penske, to have these top teams, Ganassi, of course, Action Express. That's great. 
Uh, we need to get those customer teams going as well. Proton, uh, I believe, is, is announced now. Yes. Yep. Um, obviously, JDC kicked off at uh, WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. So I think the momentum's there, Jim. And uh, if this is going to succeed, we're going to need all the customer teams uh, we can get. Uh, you made uh, mentioned uh, uh, Spec Miata's Marcus Ho Hazelgrove uh, just uh, emailed me to say, say hi. I think we've got uh, Steph Wentworth down in pit lane. Let's catch up with the pits. Uh, Steph Wentworth down at Graf Racing. Steph, what do you know? I'm at the number 39 with Guido van der Gaard. Could you just explain what happened in that incident from your perspective? Uh, yes. Uh, a car flew over me. I, th I think he came out of nowhere and uh, he took out three cars, which is... Uh, yeah, such a pity because we were running really well. Of course, we were one lap down, but I was push, pushing quite hard. I think we were in the lead lap. Uh, we had a very good two stints in the rain, which was not very easy. And then this, this stupid incident happened, you know. I mean, uh, yeah, you're preparing for full course yellow, so you don't want to make any mistakes. You want to do it correctly. And then one car just flew over me, a Ferrari. And that's, uh, yeah, we have a lot of damage, so the team is trying to, uh, to fix it. So hopefully we can go out and see how the car is and uh, we can continue. Well, you've just been looking at a lot of data. Is there a lot for you to learn to be able to implement in the next stints? No, I mean, the, the, the speed was good. I think it was one of the quickest on the track. Uh, I think the, the start of the race with the, with the car was not so very good. It was a bit of oversteer, but now when it starts to get cooler, the car starts to be in a better position. And, uh, I was very happy with uh, with my stint, but uh, yeah, this this big set down. Uh, Shane, hope to see you back out on track with you. Uh, one quick thing: uh, we had already had a retirement of a hypercar before the incident that looks likely to be in the end of the number seven uh, this evening. Remarkably, remarkably, the end of the number seventy-five Porsche. Well, thanks to Alex Harrison, who runs the WC data if you're on Twitter. The first top-class retirement. Come on, since the Palace in 2020. Ooh, that's some stat, isn't it? Um, that for me, gentlemen, has been part of the remarkable part of this. We have seen cars that have problems, but these are very new cars, and as you were saying earlier, Martin, with the high voltage systems for many of these cars, that makes, if you like, the serviceability of these cars more challenging. But these cars have been into the garage, they're back out for the garage. And they're still running and racing. Well, let's take a look at those incidents, though. 75 Porsche turns out to be an fuel oil pressure. pressure problem. Fuel pressure. A fuel pressure. Action Express, incident. Yes. By Coles, incident. Yes. Toyota number seven, incident not of their own making. Hertz Team Jota, incident. Yes. Uh, Glickenhaus, whichever one had the broken front. They did. Incident. Yes. They have all been racing incidents where cars have come together either with each other or the scenery. Not one of them yet, apart from the 75 Porsche potentially, has actually been a mechanically induced retirement. And again, these cars, you know, they, they weren't even real life testing 12 months ago. Never mind racetrack testing, they were still, you know, building up from single cylinder, single cylinder test beds and from, from CAD and, and, you know, just being, being thought of and finalized before homologation. So these are things that are still, you know, the, think back to the, the, the 956s in the first year of Group C, they were not the all-conquering devices no, they became. And, and, you know, the, these cars are going to develop and fast. That's the, that's the progress we're going to see. And it's funny, as you're getting uh, input from listeners, I'm getting text messages. And you know, it was reminded uh, that, you know, Rick Hendrick's operation ran the Corvette GTP program uh, with Doc Bundy and Cyril Vandenberg. Rick talks fondly about that. They got the car running. Uh, they drove around uh, as part of the 24 minutes of Daytona at, before the Rolex 24. And, uh, I was just reminded in text with photos, by the way. Oh, there we go. Uh, really <laughs> excited. But Rick, that was the, the GM Goodrich uh, livery. That's yeah, right. That was a Rick, very Rick, told a, Rick told a funny story about that. They were at Road America. And Rick had the car all liveried, liveried up. And, of course, in those days, it was not really decal, uh, decals. It was hand-painted yeah. stuff. And uh, I guess maybe the paperwork hadn't been done yet. And the GM folks said, well, you can't unveil the car. But they're, they're literally ready to go racing. And Rick said, well, 
maybe since I'm a GM, good wrench dealer, will suggest that you know that it's it's my program that's doing <laughs> it. So, but um, what a great era! But I, again, I say I think we're at it now. Well, we've uh, now funny you should talk about that because the first thought I had when we saw the Mustang GT3 car unveiled here oh, yeah. is. Okay, Mustang GTP, that's ringing all sorts of uh, feel-good bells with me. Th those things, I you know, see. Scott Sharp's still around. He's, yeah. he's not, he's <laughs> not, not, <laughs> let's, let's have a third go around think, with Scott think, Sharp think, in GTP think, Mustangs. That, that ship has sailed, but I was going to ask you about Mustang, because we shouldn't forget, this is Mixed Last Sports Car Racing, GT Racing again in its pomp. The ACO switching to MG3 picture. You guys have already made that switch. And you've got something we don't have in the FI World Endurance Championship, which is a full pro GT3 base class. We've seen the new Mustang GT3 uh, for the first time uh, here this weekend. We know there's going to be uh, an opportunity to see that car race again GT3 Pro next year. We know also Corvette heading there. What an opportunity for two of the biggest names in not just US motorsport, but the US automotive trade to go head to head. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, we have a saying in the office, the market will speak. And, you know, the, the folks at uh, Corvette felt like a, a GT3 customer car was right. Clearly Ford has now unveiled their GT3 Mustang, uh, which they believe also can be a proper customer program. Uh, they have also said, Besides customer programs, we'd like to go head to head with some of the other manufacturers. And so uh, that's why we have uh, GTD Pro. Um, it's because they want to race against one another. And clearly a team like FAF independently owned, but has been a, a landing place for some of the GT factory drivers in, in the Porsche family. Um, Aston Martin decided to do the same. Lexus Racing uh, with, with Vassar Sullivan is there doing uh, a GTD Pro effort. So there's a place for it. We tried to simplify it with the same BOP. And uh, I've, asked, I've been asked a lot, well, wow, sometimes I see a GTD car ahead of a GTD Pro car. Well, you know what? Um, we're here to go racing. And why not put uh, the cars out there at the same end, brother? You know? <laughs> Was it Van Keating behind the wheel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's so, probably what happened. <laughs> good, good point. Uh, ben has done an awesome job, and it's been fun being part of Garage 56 because we've been part of the, the GM performance space this weekend. And what a guy Ben is. Uh, a successful car dealer in Texas. I think he has now 27 stores. And, man, is he dedicated himself to becoming a great race car driver and he's and he's running out of brand new cars to race you know so, to, so he needs a new generation because he's never raced a mustang had a four gt on the top step of the podium here at le mans yes, when the checkered flag did. fell lest we forget Porsche, so. and yeah uh, what he ran a viper for a long time uh, yeah i think this is ninth start at le mans in eight different cars <laughs> yeah, yeah. Re quite remarkable good step there and Thanks. he's never even raced lmp this side of the atlantic either uh yes he has yeah, came here with the Riley and he raced oh, him yes. in our Oregon yes, 03 yes, yes, with, yes. Uh, with Greg right. Murphy. We're going to say good luck to you for the moment. I want of you course. to do one more thing on our behalf and on behalf of the uh, the fans uh, track side, certainly. Let's have a listen to what's going on for race control before we do that. Car 56 must enter in the pits in the next passage and go out behind safety car C. Car 34 must enter in the pits on the next passage and go out behind safety car A. That's significant. That is the leader in yeah. the GTE. Um, and I sense what's happened there is that they have either not stopped at a red light or been shown a green light and beetled out just before the safety car queue arrived. Now, there was a little bit of feeling from the Corvette racing guys that that had happened in the first safety car period, that cars had been released into a, into a, a, a safety car queue that maybe gave them a, an advantage that, that perhaps shouldn't have come their way. But you're right, it's the, it's the uh, Project One car. Uh, which is one of them in the 34 into Europol car as well. Yeah, so, Steph there, does she got an update? Okay. Yeah, I think Steph may be down at Racing Team Turkey. Steph, what do you know? I am indeed, and I'm with Dries Van Thor, who jumped into the car just to do two laps, but unfortunately something's gone wrong, hasn't it? Yeah, unfortunately uh, I only did a few laps today, uh, well, it would yesterday uh, included. 
Yeah, uh, we are still have to investigate what really is going on. Uh, just something uh, keeps keeps, keeps uh, breaking. Uh, we have a mechanical mechanical issue. We just have to check what it is. Uh, and it's just a bit too dangerous for us to, to go out again. And, uh, yeah, be scared that it happens again on another place where we actually don't want it to happen. So yeah, very unfortunate. Uh, we were really looking, we were really lo looking strong uh, going into this race. Um, Unfortunately, like it is for everybody else, it's a mayhem out there, and uh, the weather is really making it very, very difficult for everyone. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, um, we're gonna have to see what happened and um, see what happened with the car because there was something wrong, but we we don't know what yet. How did the car feel though before? Did you enjoy driving it? How were the conditions actually out there? I mean, I only did the start so far. I did uh, not so many laps to, uh, yet in the race. Um, I think generally the car felt really good. Um, I think uh, with the track involvement, it would only come more to us, uh, knowing how, how the race always evolves. Um, at the end of the day, not really a lot to say to, uh, about my race. I mean, I didn't do so much, so yeah, I just watched and, and hoped for the best. Well, it's a big shame for the team. I'm sure you guys were hoping for a much better result. Yeah, we know. They will try hard, they will come back, and um, yeah, we'll make it work again. Stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juice Van Tool. Thank you, Steph Wentworth. And of course, that car racing in the European Le Mans series on the feeder series for the World Endurance Championship. Top, top the overall win in LMP2, the overall race win, in fact, for a Pro Am car. And that's, I think, only the second, possibly third time that's ever happened with a bronze ranked driver aboard. I'll finish the point and then let you get on to do more good things. Uh, if there are indeed any more good things you could possibly do. I'd like you to do something for us, please, John. I'd like when the next time you speak to Mr. Franz to say thank you very much for this and to everybody involved in it because it has raised so much interest, so much passion, so much joy. The fact that something different is out there alongside all the other good news. This has been... Uh, a real plus here at the centenary of Le Mans. It is a meeting of codes. I hope it's not going to be the last, and I hope, absolutely hope, it's not the last we see of this great car. Well, I promise I'll do that, and uh, I also want to say thanks to all the folks that are tuned in around the world listening to you guys, as I do uh, wherever I am, or especially when I'm in Daytona. And uh, so many people are texting and uh, watching at home. So hi to so many dear friends back in the States, former Mazda teammates. So many people are, are listening and watching this great uh, 100th anniversary. And I extend a huge congratulations to the ACO for, you know, this morning. Oh, my gosh, that <laughs> crowd. Uh, the people, the fanfare, uh, just remarkable pre-race. And... You know, uh, we all like to see lots of racing, so I pray that the second half of this race uh, is less filled with safety cars and more with uh, wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. Good stuff. Thank you so much indeed uh, to Garage 56, Mascot Garage 56. Uh, team president? Is that a team yeah, director? I th I'd like to say just team, team, show. team mate because uh, I've made so many great friends through this project. Uh, folks that I idolized, you know, Chad Knaus, Jimmy Johnson. The fact that I'm even Rick Hendrick <laughs> calls me up. Hey, Big John. And I'm just blown away you know, that, that these people that are such icons and Hall of Famers in our sport, I've had the chance to work with now. But the folks at GM, the folks at Goodyear, they, they have all stepped up big time to see this through and, and uh, to see all the joy on their faces. That's that's been the biggest reward for me. Thanks a million, John. Uh, have a great night to everybody uh, down at... Well, it is indeed not Garage 56, but Garage 62, I believe. Yeah, we're uh, first one there at Pit Out, and uh, it's been great. You know, the fans across the way, when the boys do the pit stops, are roaring uh, to see the, the floor jack out. And uh, it's, it's just been a great week, and I want to uh, keep the momentum going. And we've got 15 more hours to do it. Well, you know it raises 300,000 smiles every time it comes around, and that's just here. That's before it even gets on camera. I mean, those numbers are, are just, frankly, slightly crazy. And I didn't know that uh, Jeff Gordon was here. I bet he's going, oh, what, you couldn't have done this 20 years ago? What now am I, chopped liver, you know, for the 50th anniversary when I was in my prime? I bet he's loving every minute of this, and I know Jimmy is. Jimmy was saying, actually, when he was at the last safety car, he was driving slowly, all the fans were waving, so I was waving at them.
Well, this is why our current safety car is out. Cars caught out in the slow zone, and that has led to the demise of the number seven Toyota. We saw it on the back of the flatbed. It has been made safe, but it is now on its way to Area 51, and that's where it will remain. 66 JMW Porsche also out of action. The 39 Graf racing cars we heard from Gerhard van der Gaard, uh, that was used as a takeoff ramp unintentionally by the 66 car. And we also have uh, problems for 35. So slight correction. We think you'll be right behind the leader when all this uh, rearranging happens. So all I gotta do is take him out. Or just pass him cleanly. <laughs> oh, dear me. I wasn't. You can pass him. <laughs> We're better than that, Pojo. We're better than that. For car. the record, that was a Frenchman that said that. <laughs> for the record, that was a Frenchman. Got to give these people what they're what they're here for. A little Sebastian magic. <laughs> thank Classic. you, uh, thank you guys so much. I don't want to distract anything from uh, the, the proper coverage here. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell stories, and you better better let Anthony back in here. Or I'm going to be in big trouble. Oh, we got some All more right. legends to come along. <laughs> this one sitting in the back of. Uh, the, the booth at the moment. So uh, we, we'll, we might not get him in. We might be going back to shuffling some cars around soon. All but, I uh, know is I'm not coming back because what I've done to this race <laughs> in the time that I've been here is not particularly good. But it's given us a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about the program. And that's the hat you came with in with Garage 56. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's still an Ipsa logo carry. underneath this uh, Garage 56 uh, yeah. apparel. So well, thank we, you guys. We, we, we have to decide which way you, we slice you to see which, which goes all the way through. There you go. <laughs> well, the IMSA office has been open from 8 to 5, and at 5 o'clock, the Garage 56 office is open. Um, and that's how it's been the last couple of years. But just so happy that uh, we can celebrate NASCAR and I think show the passionate European fans what NASCAR is about. And hopefully, the NASCAR fans back in the States are cheering on what is uh, a really, really special entry. So. Fabulous. John Doonan for now, thank you very much indeed. Good luck to the guys in Car 24 for the next 15 hours and 12 minutes of the 2023, the centenary uh, uh, running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. Thanks, guys. We are under safety car at Le Mans. We have 15 and a quarter hours of the race remaining. So eight hours in, we're well into the second third or into the second third of the race. All sorts of anniversaries being celebrated. The centenary of Le Mans, 75 years of Porsche, 75 years of NASCAR. And of course, the big one, 50 years of the British Lawnmower Racing Association, the BLMRA famed for their 24 hour race. They are celebrating their 50th anniversary this year with a 500 lap overnight race. Should take around 15 to 16 hours. So really a sprint race by, uh, by uh, Wisborough Green standards. Not actually sure if it is in Wisborough Green, uh, but uh, William Ticehurst, thank you very much for that reminder as a former member, uh, mower builder and racer of the British Lawn Mower Racing Association. I'm, I'm glad to represent a bit of per herbum ad astra here. You, you realise what's going to happen now? Mrs Haven is going to insist that you show how good you are with a lawn mower. When She's you asleep. Well, I'm well. also good with a dishwasher and a washing machine, and I know where the Hoover lives. Wow. She's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to welcome to uh, the guest chair another legend of Le Mans. He's looking at me in that funny way. Uh, but he is, because uh, we're coming into, we're just talking to John Doonan there, uh, Martin, about the potential for a revival of the privateer marketplace in the top class. Sitting next to, to both of us, between us at the moment, is a man behind an effort that shone very brightly indeed and showed what could be done with ambition and passion. And not only that, he's going to tell me for how long, but I think for about half a lap, he led this great race. Martin Short, welcome. Thank you. From Rail Centre Racing. I know you're now in a, in a kind of gentle semi-retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Here with his, his lovely wife, Michelle, and uh, one of his uh, exceptionally talented sons. What do you think of this race? You were here with the fabulous Dolores, then the Pescarola, the, the, uh, perhaps a, a less happy memory with the, the Radical, but uh, that was there too. But uh, with an array of GT uh, race cars, an array of races worldwide with those, You've had a chance to stand trackside and watch what's going on. Aside from the fact that it's been a little bit mayhem, it has been fun. 
this uh, th this race shows what competition brings to a race like this. And you know, when I was doing it, we had Audi, and we were all cannon fodder, to essentially for the manufacturers. We were there to make the race, um, and Audi did a magnificent job. And we were always going to be the best of the rest. Um, and, and then Peugeot came along. And, Toyota, and there's never really been a race like this. And uh, just let's do what's going on with Toyota. Okay, Joe, you can go to tire one, please. Tire one, if not already. Yeah, tire one already. Okay, Joe. As we are fuel limited, we want to try something to save fuel. So Bravo five one, Bravo five one for more engine braking to try and save fuel. So work going on inside the cockpit, so these still extremely complex uh, top-class hypercars. But a different environment, a different time. Henri Pescarolo, you know, very much there. Hugh de Chanuk still here, 50 years of Orica. And that's where those fabulous Dallaras came from. That's right. But this race is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. These drivers are under such pressure they're putting themselves, they're loading the pressure on themselves, they're making mistakes, other people are making mistakes. The slow zones are causing carnage. It's, it's just kicking off, you know, it's... And, you know, I started, you know, in a, not a miserable fashion, but, you know, we never thought that we could ever beat the Audis. Well, there's, you know, who knows how many hypercars, and they're just all going for it. And now we've got the Peugeot topping, you know, the least fancied. It's, it's just extraordinary. It is a race that just continues to deliver the extraordinary. Let's listen to what's going on with Porsche and Michael. Michael, Francisco. after the merging, after the drawback, I'm counting five cars ahead, which will be in the leading lap. So that will be your target to overtake, to put us back in the lead lap position, should we have another safety car. Uh, my memory of uh, the Rolfe Centre racing days, Martin, was, was a number of things. One, exceptional ambition uh, with you, the Royal Band behind yep. you, yep. and some Royal sponsors as well, because that's what it takes. But also, that there were a number of very talented drivers that likely we would not have seen the best of without Royal Centre racing. Oh. But I'm, I'm, you know, looking at Joe Barbosa, yeah. uh, who was around, but hadn't had the big break, and has gone on to fabulous success in IMSA racing, and still, I know, Loves you like a brother. Uh, Phil Keane on the national scene, another one that maybe didn't get his best shot for a variety of reasons, but he learned a lot there. He did, yeah. Um, and that was what it was like. There was always something different and something new. That must have been a hell of a whirlwind. It, it really was. Um, Joao, we met uh, through my, you know, uh, Mosler manufacturing phase. And... Uh, we never really realised how good we were until uh, we did a race at Spa, and I thought I was the bee's knees and uh, in a Mosler, and uh, in mixed conditions, and uh, Jao had ne re never had a chance to show himself in all of testing and qualifying, and because uh, I helped the car, cause, of course, because it was my car, and uh, we got into the race, and I started the race, and you know did a double stint, came in, and you know, touched my shoulders and thought, yeah, I did a good job there. Joao gets in, first flying lap, two seconds quick. <laughs> I tell you what, I learned I learned a lot that day. <laughs> Let's have a look at what's going on in uh, race control this late at night. Incident clear, let's start merging. Safety cars move out of the way, turn on the green light, safety car B and safety car C. Let's do the merge, let's do the merge, please. Freighter starts the process of merging this field and rearranging into class order. This process all about making sure that when we go back to green, we, we try to avoid the yellow reads, yellow. And uh, we'll pick the bits out of that one post-race. I think so far it's been remarkably successful in that. Uh, Martin, should you be... Let's turn back the clock. 15, 20 years younger, and this opportunity in this field presents itself. Could it be done again? I think the money's enormous still, uh, especially with the hybrid stuff going on. Um, we, we had an amazing period where, um, you know, I, 
I went to Hughes to Shawnak and uh, said, how much are you going to sell two Dolaras for? Or one. And then it got to two, and it was £675,000 for two cars and four 20-foot containers of spares. So roughly what you'd pay now for an Oracle 07. Yeah, so we had two cars, and, uh, uh, and then uh, I had to convince the ACO that a GT team doing British GT that had only been doing it a couple of years from doing TVR Tuscans prior to that could uh, compete and uh, the meeting with the ACO was went uh, yes Mr Short you have only been racing uh, not that I've got a French accent I won't do it I thought it was uh, Welsh <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know you've only been racing GT cars these cars are very dangerous so um, I said well, well we'll do Zebring and see see how we do well with 10 hours into the race, it was Audi, Audi, Roll Centre, Dallara, Audi, which was absolutely extraordinary. And at the end of that uh, race, we, we, we ended up with a throttle breakage and we finished fifth overall. But that was a hell of a field. I remember distinctly Justin Wilson in that field. Lovely guy. And um, after that race, the uh, gentleman from the ACO wandered down you know, through the paddock, came up to us, shook my hand, gave me a Gallic nod, and I was in. Fabulous. And that led to just, well, half a decade or more of yeah. adventure, I think is actually it's the right word. Yeah. And yeah. that's what this is about. This is about aspiration. It is about passion. It is about adventure. And we, we thank you for all of that. So, you know, what, what did we have? We had uh, fourth overall here in the Pesquero Zero One. Sorry, we've not got Henri here uh, to remember that I, one. I did choke up a bit when I saw him on the phone on the uh, uh, presentation of the grid. That was wow. Yeah. And we had you leading that race uh, in extraordinary circumstances in your beloved Delara. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's amazing that a team that we first saw in Tuscan Challenge and then coming forward with your own built TVR server, still that the first car in what we now recognise as GTE, NGT, yeah. GT2, the first car other than a Porsche ever to win a race in that class. Well, uh we were the first car, certainly, to ever beat the Porsche. Yeah. Um, it was, I think, hand stuck in America in a BMW GTR, but it uh, got disqualified. Oh, well, that doesn't count, then. It did, so it didn't it's count. Your, and then uh, at Spa, we won. And uh, and then Porsche came out with the big guns with uh, Marino, Frank Kitty, and Kelvin Burt. And, and the adventure took off. And, it, and it's been an extraordinary adventure. And uh, I was just really lucky enough to meet people or have people contact me who loved my journey. And to be honest, most of them were TVR um, uh, enthusiasts. enthusiasts. They, had, they owned TVRs. And one of them um, worked for Deutsche Bank. And uh, he had a TVR Cerbera. And uh, I met him at uh, Bedford Aerodrome on a track day. And he was literally wearing an anorak and a bobble hat in the porter cabin. And you thought, that'll do. Well, <laughs> he, just, he just said, you're Martin. You know, I tried to get him to sponsor it. Oh, did you do? I, I worked for Deutsche Bank. Oh, would you like a passenger seat ride in a, in a Cerber? Yeah, that'd be great. Three laps. I didn't even take his phone number or anything. Shook hands. Six months later, we have our first outing with the TVR in British GT. And uh, I get an email. Would you like some sponsorship? And, and I, I, my jaw dropped. And he said, where should we... What do you think? Where should we start? He said, how about 37 grand, which was a weird number. And then two years later, he said, shall we do Le Mans? Uh, and I said, what, in a Ferrari or Porsche or something in GT? He said, no, 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 let's go for the top class. I went, what? Yeah, let's, go, we let's go. go for the top class. And that was that. Fabulous memories. Uh, Martin, thanks very much for, my, uh, for the moment. Um, we're going to cycle back in with, well, the man who led Le Mans to a man who uh, was the 2014 world champion that Davidson I think is due back in the chair um, enjoy the rest of the race thanks mate uh, another family here with you and I'm sure there's some more motorsport adventures to come because success is coming with your boys as well right now whether it's the virtual the actual the wallet's bleeding already <laughs> <laughs> arterially <laughs> thanks, thanks very much thanks Graham thanks very much for your time we can listen in again to what's going on with Eduardo Freitas all cars to move left, all cars to move left, including the safety car. Let's prepare for the pass around. Prepare for the pass around. 
No zigzagging, no zigzagging. Start the pass around, start the pass around. 1 a.m. Central European time. We have 15 hours of the 2023 Centenary Le Mans still to run. It is night time and we are behind the safety car. And the voice you heard of Eduardo Freitas, the uh, World Endurance Championship and Le Mans 24 hour race director, starting the pass around behind the safety car. So our three safety cars have been won. I do feel I should be in a white polo neck sweater sitting on a tall stool, talking about three becoming one and maybe singing that way. However, the cars are in a queue. The pass around now involves any car in any of our three classes that is in the queue ahead of its class leader gets waved by the safety car and comes around to join the back of the queue. The door goes down on the number 17. Uh, number seven, Toyota Gazoo Racing, TS010, uh, TS010, I beg your pardon, and uh, that car confirmed as being out of the race. There's Neil Charney with the crew from the Duquesne LMP2 car. And by the Martin way, uh, Haven, Graham Goodwin, uh, and we are joined now by Peter Dumbreck and Graham. Uh, just about to shuffle the field around. We could be within a lap or so of going back to green flag racing. Uh, we could. Uh, you saw that uh, picture there of Neil Johnny. He is the latest driver confirmed to be joining the Hypercar um, club, if you like. He'll be joining Proton Competition for the very next WC race in Monza next month alongside Jimmy Bruni and Harry Tinkle. Back in the chair, Peter Dunbreck. It's been dramas galore peter it has what what a race i you know i think the general consensus is it's one of the best for a long time absolutely right so i've got a question we've got uh is it what on earth has happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> we go down to sixth place and remember sebastian Bordet very early in the race got hit up the back they yep. lost the lap with a damage are they now going to get that lap back? So no, he'll. Re I think he's going to restart this right behind the leader. We had uh, what you missed was a little bit of banter uh, with uh, the race engineer, and uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's have a listen to what's going on with the number six Porsche. We're still looking like seven to eight green flag laps. Okay. Uh, listens the okay somewhat foreboding uh, where Sebastian uh, joshing I believe with his race engineer was asking whether or not they wanted him to pass the leader or just hit him um, but uh, most certainly light-hearted from Sebastian but the, what we think we took from that Martin is he's going to emerge from this process in a position to be able to get back on the lead lap exactly right and actually what that reminded me of was when we were talking to Antonio Felix da Costa on the grid at Le Mans a couple of years ago where he'd qualified fourth he said all I've got to do is pass three cars and I win Le Mans so okay that's the way to look at it absolutely 100%. that is absolutely the way to look at it and you're right uh, the caddy could be on the brink of of getting its lap back when we go back to green well some thoughts from Peter Dunbreck and Graham Goodwin and the next voice you hear in this chair will be Jim Roller so uh, with the pass around starting now so the process underway this is our third uh, safety car total time under the safety car at this point two hours and 48 minutes and that's for the most part been for uh, track clearance uh, barrow repair we are closing in though on what is that we're now into oh help me out here jim it says a 10th hour yep and it is nico muller leads the field in the number 94 Peugeot. Who would have thought? Absolutely, who would have thought? From the number eight, the remaining Toyota. A Toyota already gone. We can uh, have a chat in sh just a short while about where the casualties have come from. Third at the moment, the number two Cadillac Racing V Series type R in the uh, V Series uh, R rather in the hands of Alex Lynn. Antonio Fuoco, Alessandro Pierre Guidi still in formation. Uh, 50 and the 51 Ferrari 499Ps in fourth and fifth place overall. They are the cars currently on the lead lap with Seb Bourdet, Laurence Mateur and Michael Christensen uh, in that train and be, be looking to make uh, hay when this, uh, this gets back to green flag running. They sure will. And if you're just joining us, where have you been? You don't, you won't believe what you've missed. It's astounding. Yeah, it's been this has been an absolute epic 
24 hours. We're only 10 hours, uh, not quite 10 hours in. We're nine hours in. And uh, that's one way to keep warm. Let's carry on th talking about what's going on in the classes before we bring Peter yep. in for a bit of discussion about uh, the trials and tribulations of the, the first hours of this race. It is Team WRT's 41 car, car in the hands of their silver rank driver, Rui Andrade. Uh, the Angolan uh, driver, Angolan Portuguese driver, leads the way and at the moment is on a lap by himself, but there is a pass around it about to be underway. Kubish, excuse me, Miskowski for inter-Europol competition is second in the 34 car. Can that we just car go has with Jacob? Kuba. Oh, Kuba, there you Kuba, go. Kuba, Kuba. <laughs> uh, also, by the way, team principal of the uh, of the of this squad. Manuel Maldonado is at the moment the wheel of the Panas Racing 65 Arca. All cars in this 24 car starting grid in uh, LMP2 with Arca chassis. Heat Exports, Paul of Chatan. The pole sitter uh, is back at the wheel and in fourth. And Danny Kvyat for Prima Racing, the 63 car. What a recovery they've had yeah. over the last few hours. Stone last yeah. um, in the uh, the untroubled cars. In GTE Am, it is the Iron Dames in the lead. Michelle Gatting leads the race for the 85 Iron Dames. Porsche, the Francesco Castellacci in the 54A, of course, at Ferrari. And Rexy. Uh, Project 1 AO in the 56 uh, Porsche and Zabatu Caroni. He sits uh, third. So listen again to what's going on with Mr. Can kindly ask all cars on track to close the gaps, please. Car 77, I have the feeling you may be delaying the pack behind you. That is Chris Reed at the moment. Uh, should know better, I Christian. Love, I love that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all get the giddy up. Let's go. There you go. Um, Let's have a quick chat while we're waiting for this pass around and the rest of the procedure to come through. The, there has been actually quite a lot of attrition so far. There this, has. This time of the race. At the moment, we list, uh, what is that, 12 retirements now officially posted. Yep. Uh, headed by the latest retirement, which is the number seven Tota, after that multi-car incident coming into a slow zone. That same incident also accounted uh, for the number 66 JMW Motorsport Ferrari. Both Camus, Kobayashi and Louis Pret absolutely fine after what was actually quite a frightening multiple car uh, incident. And uh, Racing Team Turkey has also called it a night, as has the uh, other hypercar to have dropped out, and that is the P Porsche Penske Motorsport entry. Jaminet was behind the wheel of that car, the number 75 car, when it had a fuel pressure situation, and the car just ground to a halt on the racetrack, and they were unable to get it going again. The um, number 72, TF Sport. Locked to nothing incident, did it? Yeah. It was yes. damage. It, it wiped the rear wing off the car. Did go backwards into the wall, but didn't seem that hard, but he could not get that car restarted. And I sort of wonder whether or not there might be an element of cause rather than effect uh, there. But uh, I don't know if you saw that. Did I you? did. I, he, on uh, entry to Porsche cars, hit the wall on the right side. But as you say, it didn't look big. Didn't. I think it was enough to certainly give him a puncture. Yeah. Um, maybe some suspension damage. I just but wonder whether or not the shock through a wheel, whether or not it was a sideways thing through the wheel, maybe drive shaft uh, and gearbox. Mm -hmm. We've seen that a couple of times with uh, with GT cars and LMP2 cars, but it did not look a race-ending incident for him, but that's proved to be the case. And sadly, Henri Pescarello's colours will not be finishing uh, the Le Mans 24 hours in its centenary year. Richard Mill AF Corsa, you'll have to uh, tell me exactly what went on with the 83 car. Uh, the race-winning car last time out in Spa on the FIWC, that car out in the hands of Lila Wadu, not an incident I saw, I'm afraid. Yeah. Then behind them, Proton Competition, uh, Ryan Hardwick in the number 16 car, the 60 Iron Lynx, Claudio Schiavone, we saw that incident. Uh, the 55 car, that was all part of uh, when the rains came and they were scattering cars at the Porsche curves. Uh, Gustav Birch behind the wheel when that car yeah. retired. That car, by the way, not really extensive damage. We're hearing uh, from Aston Martin that the car just wouldn't go back into gear. Oh. So other than that, if they got the car back, that probably would have been good to go. You mentioned the 60 car. That incident with the 60 car for Claudio Schiavone also accounted for uh, the number 16 car of Ryan Hardwick. So two Porsches in the same incident mm. that went out there. Gustav Birch, uh, Ulis de Pau in that 21A, of course, a car that also was the incident that delayed the number two Cadillac. Yes. Am I right? 
Um, so that was the that was the what dropped no, that? No, no, the number three. That number was three. The one number okay. three Cadillac. Um, so that accounted to two more GTM cars, and then Ricky Taylor, uh, the 13 car, had just a wretched time. Uh, multiple incidents uh, for the number 13 car after what's been a difficult run into this uh, Le Mans 24 hours with John Ferrano having to pull out after injury at the Gunaseka a couple of weeks ago. Then the car being involved in a heavy incident uh, earlier in the week, which required a, a, the car to be rebuilt around a replacement chassis. And then multiple incidents, uh, one for, uh, for um, the gentleman driver uh, and then two for Ricky Taylor before finally something seemed to let go on that car and heavily into the barriers and out of the race. And finally, in the first retirement, the number 14 Nielsen racing car of Rodrigo Sales. Uh, that car looked like Rodrigo, slightly spooked by a, a, a rapidly closing Toyota coming up towards the Dunlop chicane, uh, getting onto the, the, the marbles to the, uh, to the inside of the circuit and turning, we've seen it happen so many times, sharp right into the wall. Uh, from where it did not continue. That's the 12 cars no longer with us. Still 50 uh, cars still running. It wasn't that long ago that 50 was the, the uh, was all this race That's would right. actually take. That's right. So there's a caption there somewhere with that picture, wow, wasn't there? Yeah. But I, I thought the shot of the Hendricks garage with everybody with their uh, lawn recliners. <laughs> <laughs> It was distinctly American, it's, I, I might add. It, it is still got the hints of the extraordinary that I'm on 24 hours uh, th this year. The celebratory firework display and uh, light show was of what can only be described as epic proportions. Um, if you did hear that through the, the mics in here, uh, it, trust me, it wasn't nearly as loud as it sounded while sitting in one of the lawn chairs behind here. Uh, we've got 14 hours and 48 minutes remaining as another P2 car looks like it's going for a power cycle. That seemed to have worked. Just trying to work out who that is. Somebody that's got some... That might be the 80 car. Yeah. That is it the 80 like car. It's fresh body work. That is the F Corsa car of Ben Barnicote. That's Ben's helmet. And he's struggling to get yeah. that thing fired. That's the old control alt delete all with one hand while you're trying to do the steering wheel and the paddle shift. It's not a great time for this to be happening with the safety car trying to sort things through the 80 car but we said before this race started the first time that um, the race here could have been won in all three classes by the same team yes. with af corsa but at the moment ben barnico that is ben now gets the car away and is it going to fire properly this time how far back is he on this these on the run down to Indianapolis, car not up to full speed. That will require coming into the pits, I'm sure, and that's going to be a delay for the car because we've started the merge and pass by. And from there on in, the pits are closed. That car is not in good health, is it? What are you seeing there, Peter? Anything to give us any clues as to what Ben's dealing with? Um, not really, no. Uh, a recalcitrant race car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a car that just doesn't want to run. It's moving, but just not very quickly. Still got a, quite a way before the safety car chain uh, catches up with them. The safety car, the single safety car now running down towards the first Molson chicane as Ben is just approaching Indianapolis. But it is nowhere close to the kind of pace you'd expect in a game going through a power cycle. Engine's running. So gearbox yeah. is drive. Yeah, it might be a gearbox, gearbox or drive. Machine. Yep, drive train. Trying to select yeah. a gear. So problems ahead, or problems uh, very apparent there for the number 80 car. Okay. These dramas just keep coming, don't they? Whether or not it's racing incident, whether or not it's some fabulous racing we've had when we've had green flag running. It has been quite a long time under the safety cars. I mean, if, this um, new safety car system, it, um, I think it's great in the sense that it gives people back the lap that they might have lost for 
maybe no no fault of their own but it does seem to be takes time takes a lot of time and it, it, it kind of you lose the rhythm of the race it does take time but i will say that i think at least two of the long cautions that we've had were because the barrier repair took a that, lot longer that, than i would have expected it to and the other thing too is i think some of the barriers around here are getting a little aged well, and, and you're having to see things that are having to be repaired that maybe in the past wouldn't have had to be repaired but the other thing too is is because of the speed of these cars now you can't have a barrier that's taken a hit and then just go oh yeah that's going to be fine if somebody else hits in that same spot it, that could be a barrier failure and you don't want that so you got to fix the barrier i think you know when we're looking at success or failure i don't disagree these have taken a long time when we look at success or failure of this new process it's not necessarily the process it's the repair or the incident that's led up to the that's point right. what i've been impressed by is when we've got to the point where the process kicks in that's happening quite quickly yeah and the it's teams, only about a lap maybe yeah, a lap yeah. and a half the teams it's, it's pretty clear have briefed themselves very well about what's required and i think they've done that because it's so different and it's so new here uh, and because of the length of the lap it does give space and time to achieve what they're trying to do which is that class separation and this car is going to get yeah. back to the pits uh, just before the safety car, I think, uh, actually catches them. It's, or it, it might just catch them, yep. but uh, it's going to lose a lap. It's clearly going in the garage, isn't it? So that's the least of his problems. He almost doesn't sound... He's he's probably just in one... He's he's found a gear, and that's it. So safety car in this lap. And it's not the right uh, gear either, is it? No. So with 14 hours, uh, probably be about 14 hours and 42 minutes to go by the time we go. Safety car is coming in at the end of this lap. Car 80 pulled to the right hand side on the runoff. Car 80 pulled to the right hand side on the runoff there. Let all the cars pass, please. Let's make the pit light. Which is exactly what he has done. And now here comes the Peugeot through the Ford chicane. Flick left, flick right. Keep it, try to keep it under him. And we are back racing at the centenary of the 24 hours of Le Mans with Peugeot out front, chased by the number eight Toyota. Nico Muller leads Ooh, that's uh, very Arikawa. Close. That was almost a touch. Ooh. Right side by each there, four cars, five cars trying to get through the Dunlop chicane. And I think that's the, the eight is so that yeah, Toyota's the, the punch is back to third now. Oh he's, yeah, he's lost two positions in that exchange in the Dunlop chicane. Is that a Cadillac? Yeah, the, yeah. Lead? the number eight leads now with the number two Cadillac with uh, Alex Lynn behind the wheel. I don't, there's think the that's Peugeot. Isn't that, I don't think that's Lynn. I think that might be Sebastian Bourdais. Ah, trying to get his lap back. I think it might be. I think Alex ah. Lynn is a little further back. Yes, the graphic is telling us this is Lynn here going by the Peugeot. Sparks flying there. Dark down the Mulsanne Straits. Uh, I think we may have both Peugeots yes. in this, and that's uh, confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be Thank clearing. You, we're going to be clearing the first timing set. Uh, Nico Muller was still leading. He certainly isn't going to be by the time they get to the second. Uh, ben Bonico climbs out of the 80 car and has got back to the garage. Team manager of car 80 to the race director immediately. It says. Exactly. He's got that magic. Yeah. Got about eight laps here before we have to pin. Just Set. focus forward. Do some good clean laps here, buddy. Seb Bourdais goes by and takes uh, gets back onto the lead lap. How's that for a restart? Some of that sea bass magic. Cars 25 and 35 are under investigation for an incident. Uh, 23:59, and that's uh, an hour and 20 minutes ago. Yeah. There's the two Peugeots running right together. So it's now Toyota number eight with uh, Hayakawa behind the wheel, then Nico Muller, then Antonio Fuco, then 
Alessandro Pierguidi. Has he gotten out of the car tonight? <laughs> <laughs> it's a he very focused effort, isn't it, this Ferrari effort? It's been a joy to watch them attack this race. There's nothing conservative about the pace of these Ferraris. Nope. And then uh, they're chased by Alex Lynn in the Cadillac. And then at the tail end of the lead lap now is the number three Cadillac in sixth place. And that really is the comeback drive of the race so far. On board the Cadillac. And uh, a bit of camera break up there behind one of the Glickenhaus cars. This is the number two of Alex Lynn. This is a replay. What's happened here going into first UK? Yeah, that okay. is Ferrari up the inside, the 50. I was say, they didn't look like they were up to speed because we were watching us. <laughs> so, Rio Hirakawa, it is that um, leads the race. 1.8 seconds. There are some, some cards, aren't there, on uh, social media? Uh, amongst the things being shown tonight on Twitter is a somewhat photoshopped uh, incident report sheet from Hertz for the 38 car. <laughs> Famously, Hertz Team Jota, uh -huh. um, a team, by the way, that joined Hypercar, yeah. just so we could tell the difference between the two cars. See, uh, see Martin, we, we blew our opportunity, because when he, when he hit the wall, one of us should have said, gosh, I hope he got the collision damage. Both the Glickenhaus cars, by the way, still running and running strongly. 10th and 11th. The 709 car in 10th position. Three laps down on the lead. And uh, it's fallen back into line with the car that started the lap down. And that burns on. Now just ahead of teammate Romain Dumas. And there goes the 80. So whatever that was, it was stuck in gear, wasn't it? That's what it looks like. That was a quick fix for us to be anything more serious than that. I think they've looked in the all-purpose racing toolkit, which, as we all know, consists of a hammer, a race tape, and a pair of tires. Uh, I suspect it was the hammer that was used there. What's impressed me about the Ferrari team is that it's like they've been racing here for years. 100%. They're, well, they're they so... Have. They, they have all been in GT. Yeah, but like, you know, in the top class, yes. they just, even things like reversing the order just before they come into the pit, so they, they line up the correct order, uh, you know, just little things like that. They just look so professional. Oh, the 28 car into the gravel. That's the Jota car from fifth position in LMP2. One-time leader in the class. It is uh, Pietro Filipaldi at the wheel for that. That's at... Uh, Marshall's post 11, that's again the first chicane. What happened here? Two cars together. And what was the other car involved there? It's a big pinch, wasn't it? So he was down the inside, it looked like, and uh, yeah, the car on the outside, better contact. I suspect that was the 47, maybe. No, it wouldn't have been. It was uh, either Manuel Maldonado or Rene Binder was the other car in contention there. And yet, punching the steering wheel in frustration. And Pietro Fittipaldi, who led and led convincingly in the early hours of this race, I think can't feel it coming away. Might need the bleep machine here. <laughs> All right, are you stuck? Are you stuck? Yeah, yeah, I'm stuck. Yeah, stuck <laughs> was the word there. <laughs> Mm. I wonder whether it was uh, slightly off, wet offline on the inside there because it was a bit of damp on that back straight still. It did look Long a little bit is now two into one wouldn't go there. So quite who was taking who. Slow zone activated for that incident and the recovery of the 28 car. Back to top class action. This is the battle for the push, third and fourth. Zone. Car 25 has a drive through penalty for overtaking and the yellow in the next slow zone. So that is Ahmed Al Hati, the ORT by TF Sport, Aston Martin running fifth in GTM, well up the order. Was that the car that was involved 
because when we saw the onboard from uh, Kobayashi just before he was hit, we saw a car passing another car. I, 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 there's another car involved here that I, I've not quite worked out the roll of. Definitely involved were the 39 Graf car, the 66 JMW, the 35 Alpine, Kobayashi, and the 100 Falkenhurst Ferrari. We're all involved in the same space. Let's have a listen, Ferrari. I know they are on your tire, but I think it's different. I know, I see that. I'll, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Here we go again, the Ferrari boys. Oh, come on, I'm faster. I know he's on the tires, but I'm faster. Uh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Recognize that voice. Just you had to take it, avoiding action on the braking zone there because yeah. he almost tagged the back of the other his uh, teammate. Ah, uh, did you see? I just saw that. An NRT. Uh huh? North American mm -hmm. Racing. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. The yes. NART. The NART logo. Of course, that's for. Fans of Ferrari will certainly know what NART is, North American Racing Teams. Luigi Canetti forming that team. He was the uh, uh, first person to win Le Mans in a Ferrari. It was in 1949. It was the year after. It was the year that we began racing here in Le Mans after World War II. And that victory cemented Luigi's relationship with Enzo Ferrari. And led to him becoming the exclusive importer of Ferraris into the United States for many, many years. And North American racing teams with his son, Luigi Jr., uh, has a rich, rich sports car racing history that is just absolutely outstanding. Uh, probably Luigi Jr. still is, is listening. And uh, if you are Luigi, hope all is well. Yeah, and uh, listen to the tales that uh, Jim Glickenhaus will tell you of his early encounters with Luigi Genetti and the defining mark that left on his ambition oh, to be in this great race. Yeah, yeah. Incident involving car 28 and car 65 mm -hmm. under investigation, so the other car was indeed the Panis racing car. Uh, race control taking a look at that. Here's a uh, replay of the nine car. Oh, boy. Yeah, Prima Racing. And that's, that's just, uh, that's kind of rough on the equipment. Uh, it's like with tennis with racket abuse. Yes. You know? Maybe they should. That car well down, 18th uh, in LMP2 and 46th overall at the moment. So long way to come back for the second of the Prima Racing cars. They said about the 63 car, we covered back up the field. Pogering up and down a little, Danny Kivyak going well at the moment though. Got shared with Dorian Pat, Luca Bortolotti. So slow zone still in place for the recovery of the 28. You're getting the tumble down the order, I'm afraid, and losing laps. The Jota car, and that's going to be a long way back. Yeah. Rio Hurikawa leads for the Mon 24 hours for 2023 in the surviving number eight car. You're joining us after a break, or for the first time, the Cesta car, the number seven car, involved in a multi-car incident, going into a slow zone, hit from the rear by the 35 Alpine. And that uh, led to that car losing drive and what we would term going red. Yeah. Uh, an unsafe hybrid system. I think he got hit on both sides, because when I think the car was on the flatbed, yeah, there was as much left side damage as there was Pretty right much as the 66 up. car came through between uh, he and the 39. Yeah, can we give it a good job? I got, um, uh, I got try to get the car back, but it was beyond him. So the seven car out of the race. Nearest competitor to that car in the overall order at the moment is, care to take a guess without looking at the topic screen? Prepare to be surprised. It's a 94 Peugeot, and that's been there for a while. It has led this race more than once. And, and, and led for many laps, and not just laps under yellow. No, and uh, Nico Miller doing a fine job. Three seconds back at the moment, so released fairly recently from a uh, safety car process. Then it's the two Ferraris. And at the moment, as things stand at the moment, the Peugeot are quicker than both of them. And I think the Peugeot is very much comfortable in mixed conditions. Yes. I think that's, is, is the longer this stays dry, I think certainly he's going to come under pressure very quickly from 
Cuoco and That's Derek right. Weedy. Yeah, remarkably at the moment, uh, what we've got are three pairs of two cars from the same teams uh, from third all the way down to eighth. Uh, there's no, the two, racing. Two, Absolutely. two Ferraris, two Cadillacs, the two and the three, and two Porsche Penske Motorsport 963s, the six and the five. That's uh, possessions one to eight. Racing has been stellar. There have been incidents, there have been safety cars, there have been interruptions, full course yellows and slow zones. But when we've had green flag racing, everything points to this being the start of something very special indeed in sports car racing. Because it's been hammering, Tom. There's been no... When the, when the racetrack's been green, it's been flat out all the way. There's nobody saving anything for later. Five car going back into the garage. There you go. That's uh, 75. So we've lost one Porsche Penske Motorsport car. The 75 car with fuel pressure problems eliminated some time ago. Problems now for the sister number five car. Cars have not been without their problems, and that's not unexpected. These are some very new and very complicated race cars. But boy, have these guys been going at it. So we'll listen into Porsche, find out what is going on for the number five Porsche 963. We'll take hybrid off, ignition off, and we are looking at a water leak. Water leak. Water leak for the number five car. So that does not look to be the work of a moment. Play nice, Hi, boys. Ferrari. This is the uh, 51 of Pierre Guidi trying to go by his teammate, yeah. Antonio Fuoco. Remember the headlines they're looking for, yeah. and the ones they're specifically not. So the pass is made. Fuoco behind Pierre Guidi now, coming through. Mulsanne corner, and away they go. It will be interesting now to see if... Um, Pierre Guidi pulls away, as we heard before. It sounds as though Fuoco is actually on newer tyres. Mm. Uh, we'll confirm it's a little while ago this message arrived uh, on my phone that uh, I didn't see the incident before Tom Longquist some time ago, but I do know something fairly hefty, and he's uh, taken a trip to the medical centre. He's been checked over and released back to the United Autosports team after an incident for the 23 at 10 minutes past 11. So that is, what, two hours and 20 yeah. minutes ago. So thank you to the team for letting us know that. Tom is fine. Car's still running, isn't it? It is still yeah. running. Josh Pearson at the wheel of the car, and uh, 14th in what started as a 24-car entry. We've lost three of them. We've had others that are or have been delayed, and the 39 car that was involved in that multi-car incident with the... 66 JMW car and the Toyota, that car still in the garage under repair. A proud make and back this year as I'm on for the first time in 50 years. They started this race from pole position, took the whole front row in an extraordinary hyper pole of real drama. And uh, they started this race as they meant to go on, battled hard. Both cars have led. Do you think the order was given there? I think it probably was. I think it probably was. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know, if, if uh, they're struggling to kind of keep the momentum, quite right, than it should. You know, these are factory races, you know all about that, and it's not about your career, it's about their reputation. Let's uh, look at the diffuser flapping away. Oh, that's the 911 car, isn't it? That's a little bit second-hand. That's Martin Rump. Drew goes to Glickenhaus. He's going to need a fix at some point. Sooner rather than later, I yeah. suspect. Repair on the five continues. and That's allowed the 93 Peugeot to go back uh, up into eighth position. Mikkel Jensen aboard that car. Two laps off the lead. Now the eight, so the seven, top seven cars now are on the lead lap still. Ryo Hurakawa, Nico Muller, Alessandro Pierguidi, Antonio Fuoco, Alex Lynn, Sebastian Bordet and Laurence Venture are the current contenders on the lead lap for the win for the centenary running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Gaggle of LMP2s with a hypercar or so in amongst them. 
announced uh, on Friday that the LMP2 class has been such a staunch supporter of this great race will leave the FIWEC for the very best of reasons at the end of this season for now at least will continue in the European Le Mans series where we have a near 20 car field of stellar racing in the Asian Le Mans series and also of course in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Yep. It's great to have John Doonan here. Quite a while in the booth trying to get our questions in as the dramas came at us like a frenzied gibbon flinging whatever at us. But uh, also worth reiterating as has been all the way through this it doesn't mean the end of LMP2 here at no. the 24 hours of Le Mans and at least 15 of these fantastic cars will continue next year through a variety of modes of select selection. So next year at the 92nd iteration of the 24 hours of Le Mans, it will be hypercar and more of them. It will be LMP2 and it will be another new class, LM GT3 replacing the GTE AM cars that we have here for the very last time at Le Mans. Still a season to complete for these fabulous GT cars. Rui Andrade continues to lead the LMP2 category, the number 41 team WRT. Then it is the uh, number 34 Inter Europol competition car. Got a great one there, have you? Yeah, outstanding. And then the D Duquesne team in the 30 car. Panis Racing in the 65 is fourth, and Cool Racing. Number 47 is fifth. The leader of the Pro Am category of LMP2 is the other cool racing car with Matthias Jacobson behind the wheel of that car, the 37 car, sixth in a class. That's Jacobson in that 37 car leads the Pro Am side of things. It's two cool racing cars uh, in fifth and sixth. Uh, the Duquesne car, by the way, in the hands of Freddie Binder, has just taken the third place it's a one minute stop and go penalty for car 35 for accelerating in an next slow and causing a collision at mp5 that is i'm sure from the, the incident. incident that uh, was sparked with the toyota and the uh ferrari the number 66 ferrari let's see whether or not that is the only penalty that comes from that i don't think it will be the six car in for uh, routine service that's the six car yes it is yeah in the hands of lance Fanteur. and it is a switch to kevin est beginning to see some tired faces here we can now by the way say happy 21st birthday on Coldwell. indeed should we sing to it i think the whole crowd should well i think the crowd should but i don't think 21st birthday, a very special time, and what better way to celebrate it than with a one minute stop and go penalty? <laughs> I cannot imagine, Peter Dunbrecht, what this is like 200 miles an hour plus in the pitch black. It's the more you do it, the more you kind of just accept it, and you know, you've got your, your points on on the track or you know, marker boards that you pick out and then you hit your break point and you know what's coming. No one's changed the track since the last time you came around. So, you know, it's really, yeah, if, if you take a look from on board like we're seeing now, but it, actually it's it's a lot easier in real life. Someone listening, oh, trouble, oh, trouble, trouble for 63. 63. That's big trouble. Big trouble for who's aboard that car, Jim. SEO, copy box, box, box. Bit confirm. Driver change for Seb. You can undo your drinks bottle. Copy. Yeah, last here's... time was very good. Ferrari 32s. He'd been in the barrier to the left hand side and then continued into the other barrier on the right hand side. And that is Danny Kvyat. I suspect that's the end of the race for that car. Yeah, he went from driver to passenger he and that did. was it. Interesting how he let the car roll back onto the track though maybe no brakes anymore but um that's what i assume because you would think yeah i, I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt there that, that uh, he, yeah. he'd lost the rear wing hadn't he before yeah. we saw him so he'd already been into the barrier pretty hard so I, I think he hit on the right left and then yes. came back yeah. across again 
So a fight back to podium contention for the 63, I think, has ended right there. Yes, indeed. That's uh, Paul Corsello is going to be coming in about 20 seconds' time. It's very recovery of that car. Recovery shouldn't be too difficult. It will be clear up. What we haven't yet seen, and I almost hesitate to say it, is whether or not there's barrier damage. And here comes uh, Hayakawa. Instant uh, pit stop for Ryo Hirakawa. As the he was called to the pits. Paul Corsello is called now. And that is ideal timing for Toyota. Pulls to a stop and loses, gains, if you like, as much as is possible in those circumstances, as the rest of the field is circulating more slowly. The clock, of course, is still ticking. So less time lost they to had... the rest of the field. That was, seemed a little bit unruly, that car leaving the pit lane there. Yeah, but they had tyres ready, but they chose not to change them. But they said to him, driver change. You can undo his drink bottle. That's right, they, they did. did. And he, they did. They did full service. Well they remembered. Peugeot back in the lead. Nico Muller once again leads. Go on. So somehow the full course yellow actually changed their minds. Yes. Well, I suspect that was they, they knew they had more to gain uh, by a quick pit stop in these circumstances. Although, having said that, you'd lose less, wouldn't you, with a driver change yeah, in right, these circumstances? Yeah, exactly. If you're going to do it anyway. Yeah, Danny right. Kvyat stalks away from that car, and that, I'm afraid, is all she wrote for the number 63 Prima Racing effort. There are going to be two, at uh, least two, impact points to be examined and dealt with. And that is one very second-hand Orica. Big impact to the rear, and the rear right in particular. And we have seen through that uh, left-hander, normally cars don't go in the walls no. so often, but you know, we've seen a few in there today. We have, mm. we have. Is that a function of carrying more speed, perhaps, Peter? Watch again, only in the back barrier backwards there. And then across the racetrack. Now, that, that hit didn't do any damage to the barrier. No, but, it but didn't. the first hit may have. The first hit was a hefty crunch. So that, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. Yeah. If he had any brakes there at all, he'd have stopped. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't really want to be rolling back onto the track. He's experienced situation. enough, too, to know to get the car stopped. So. Let's see what the strategy is going to be now under this caution. Yes, we will give, uh, we will remove a tear off for James. Well, I think, gentlemen, that is any hope of a meaningful result for Prima Racing done. The nine yes. car heavily delayed is 18th at the moment. Will obviously rise to nine uh, to 17th. Uh, at some point when the laps tick away, but uh, that 63 is done. That is the end of Le Mans for 2023 for Young Dorian Pin and for Mirko Portalotti and for Danny Kvyat. And with the other car so far down the field, I'm afraid the Italian team will be looking after the Lamborghini hypercar effort next year. That's all she wrote. Yeah, he's done damage to the side pod. He's uh, ripped probably. He's gone around, hasn't he? And his rear suspensions yeah. are, are toast. He's he's hit with the rear of the car and dragged the side of the car along the barrier as well, and uh, be an upsetting moment for Dorian, I'm sure. She's quite the talent. So again, to what's going on now with Alessandra Pierre Guidi on the 51 with the Air Corsa car in second. Uh, so far they are good, but they had a lot of focus errors, low zone, and things like this. I'm not sure if we pushed 11 laps in a row. Uh, like this is okay, just a bit of movement. Okay, copy that. That's why we think they're probably good for this kind of scenario. We keep getting a lot of slow zones. So lots of chatter with Ferrari. They're in good spirits, That's aren't they? Tire. Yeah, That's yes, I think so. Wear, yeah. yeah. I think there's decisions being made about just how far they can push it uh, at the moment with these Michelin tyres. 
lots going on still there in terms of development in all sorts of ways. Longevity of the tyres, of course. We've uh, seen the rather more, if you like, fan-focused element here with the new colour coding on the tyres. And still to come, more and yet more, uh, in terms of the sustainability of these tyres. The, the, I think I'm right, is it the wet is 40% renewable materials? The dry tyre, I think, yes. is 30. 30, yeah. And yeah. up in the, uh, the village, there's uh, racing tyres at 63% renewable materials. That's uh, a key part of the vision moving forward, the roadmap that's being established. So James Collado, he's going to get into car 51 when it pits. He's going to get his own there, isn't he? What song do you think he's singing? <laughs> um, Show me the way to go home. <laughs> Fast. If you weren't with us earlier, Peter explained that when he was ready to get himself psyched up and into the car, he would, he would sing a famous Scottish tune. I believe I can fly. Eh? No. I can walk 500 miles. No, oh, was it really? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, Flower of Scotland. Flower Did you really? Scotland, yes. Yeah. Music has an amazing effect, doesn't it, in terms of just keeping focus, shutting out everything else, you know, and... Um, Care to give us a couple bars? No, probably not. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'll, one would I'll appreciate wait, that. I'll wait till later when he's a little more tired and a little more pliable. <laughs> it's a tough moment, this, isn't it, for any team? The yeah, other car is still... it's after the pub is closed. Yes. Well, here's the thing. The other... Before we get to that, let's go and listen to what's going on with Ryu Hirakawa. The plan now is to come in when the full course yellow opens directly. From which corner? No, 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 Joe. It's uh, just... Never mind. Full course yellow. Full course yellow. Wow, that's okay. it. Now, now you've confused your guy. I have no clue what Rio thought he was saying. I mean, it's easy to confuse me. Yeah. But you shouldn't confuse your driver. Still work going on on the water leak we heard, didn't we, from the number five yep. Porsche. That down to 12th position now. And this will have helped them. It's less delay uh, yep. in terms of laps completed. But they are still now three laps down on the lead battle. And we're now down to, what is it? It is six cars remain on the lead lap. Uh, Rio Hokawa, by the way, in and out. That's an out lap for Rio. So now down behind both Ferraris and the lead of the Cadillacs. Or seven cars. Uh, Kevin Estre. Is he still on the lead lap? I'll have a look at that. Give me a moment. No, I don't think he is. It's the three cars, the last car on the on the lead lap. Remember, he got his lap back. He did. 94 car. And Anthony Camilla leads this race. You know, if he, if he keeps doing this full course yellow all the way through the race and mixed conditions and crazy things happening, you know, They're definitely you cannot rule that out. Right. Uh, right now, after the season they've had to this point, and the end of the season they had last year, there will be plenty of people at Peugeot and at Stellantis that will be turning cartwheels with the form they've seen from these cars. The other car, by the way, running in eighth position, and it's just one lap off the lead. So to say this has been a turnaround in form is a massive understatement. No one's laughing now. No. I mean, they probably came into the race feeling no pressure at all. And Let's finish the race. Let's do what we can. Exactly. The saddest the sight in uh, Le Mans. I hate that. The saddest sight in Le Mans. The garage door goes down. Yep. Um, our trusty tea maker, booth runner, and I'm afraid to say my son. All around son. Absolutely. Drinking, buddy. <laughs> so, he says with barely described mirth, described mirth, sells me the number six car, will cycle round to be on the lead lap after this pit stop cycle. Ah, OK, sure, that makes so. sense. Looking 
looking for a driver change soon at uh, Peugeot. That's a lead I've never seen. I mean, Paul Darista, they, that's is, Paul, is that Paul? It? Yeah, I've never seen those colors before. Another one of those uh, Le Mans specials, perhaps? Or a new sponsor. True. Well, that's it. That other part that we don't often talk about here, is, which is this is clearly a race on a rapid upward trajectory. And so let's go on uh, what's going on with Peugeot in the 94. Just so Ben said it, it, it's just quite risky. So if, uh, if we have a long full crit yellow now and stuff, bringing the tires back in and with how edgy and unpredictable it is, yeah, it's, it's not great, but I will do my best. The other thing to consider, Nico, is that there might be some rain coming in about 20, 25, 30 minutes. Okay. So this is also why we would rather not change tires. There's been discussion clearly about whether or not the envelope of these tires can be extended to keep the pit stop time down as much as possible, amongst other things. Two things to consider. Nico Muller thinking that's a little on the edge and then being informed by the race engineer that rain is on the way. Oh, we're going to see the uh, Ferrari being taken back it into is. the garage area. Now, it's three softs on, I think. Yep. So, Ferrari number 50 in the hands of Antonio Fuoco. The pole setting car is in the garage. More and more and more drama. Is this a simple matter? Trouble for the 311. A spin under full course yellow. This car has been on a near race long recovery drive. It's still, what is it, 17 laps under off the lead? Straight away. Oh, yeah. So that's coming out of the Ford Chicane as he's yep. looped it there. It's Pippa Durrani. They've had a long and lonely race. Mm. This was after Jack Aitken at a major whoopsie through the first chicane in horrible conditions. Didn't seem to have done very much wrong. It ended with the car in the barrier and with pretty su substantial front end damage. Oh, oh. So that was a Bremer car, so we were right. Contact on the right side, which put him over to the left. Yeah, and you were spot on. Pretty much destroyed the car. Just ping pong through the Porsche curves and carding. So is this, I was gonna say, it's obviously uh, suspension maybe? No, there's a, or brakes? Let's have a listen to what's going on with the number 50. Oh, we need to look for a leak. Leak. Braking system. Water system. I thought that was a water pressure. That would be a second car with a water leak. If that's what it was. Yeah. It could be a braking system leak. But uh, I thought what we saw in the hands of one of the technicians there was... Yes, a that's water bleed. Yeah. Well, I think they've chosen the time to do it. Oh, absolutely. Oh, sure. Being full course yellow, so making taking advantage of that, uh, of none of the cars at racing speed. They're losing time, just not losing as much time. And they're not at the moment losing a lap. 94 right. car that leads the race is just left the, it's between the first and second chicanes of the Monzan. So they've got a little bit of time here to retain the lead lap. Green flag, though, means that, that task just got a lot more urgent. Yep. Nico Muller leads the field away. So we heard about Muller and a uh, bit concerned about his tyres. They've got very cold as he's been driving around slowly. The track's still a bit damp offline there, you see, so he's, he's a little bit uh, cautious. Peugeot lead Le Mans. Hands of Nico Muller, the 94, Peugeot 9x8. Alessandro Pierre Guidi is the next threat. The 51 Ferrari, 499p, second place on the grid for that Ferrari. The team car, though, that was running in team formation, is in the garage with, we think, a water leak. This is the lead battle. There is Pierre Guidi 
right on the tailpipe. Getting that regen wine on those brakes. They go through Mulsanne hard on the accelerator as they head down towards Indianapolis. And that is just job done. That was much easier than I expected it to be. So Ferrari now lead, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And I think he's going to be looking to turn the screw. He needs to because Alex Lynn not that far behind in the number two Cadillac. Nope. 3.7 seconds off the lead before that pass was made. And of the drivers in this race to this point, I would put Alex Lynn's form right up there. Yeah, it's right on him, isn't he? So Lynn looking to do what he can do to get the big V8 engine caddy into second place in pursuit of Alessandro Piergrini. Keeping an eye on what's going on with the 50, still in the garage. And it's not going to be much longer before they lose a lap here. Already pulled a second and a half in less than half a lap. Uh, they're going to lose the lap. Yep. Yeah, Greedy from Muller, from Lynn. It's like maybe the end of a repair coming up here, but uh, still not buttoning things back onto. But in comes the 51, the lead car. So Muller goes back into the lead. And he comes through. But instead of losing just one, they would have lost three laps, probably two laps for sure. So we're seeing here a Kawa come back into the pits. We did hear a little bit of uh, radio chat with him. I don't really understand why they pitted and then pitted again now. And they were talking about driver change. So they probably do that driver change full service now. But so it's a strange strategy. I don't get that one. I, I don't understand it either. I don't know what they, were there, what they could gain from that. It didn't look typically to the type of stop. It looked a bit messy coming in. It looked a bit messy going out. So, Nicky Muller leads, driver change, we saw James Collado, Collado preparing to get aboard the car, he'll do so now in the number 51 car. The sister car still in the garage joining here, Rio Hirakawa on pit lane a little further back. Seb Bordet in and out in the meantime with the number three Cadillac, goes by the number 50 car into sixth position as he does so. second Peugeot that just passed by the number 93 car the eight car I think has jumped that Ferrari in the bits ah he probably he may have I think you're right Graham yep there it is confirmation game on yeah exactly so where are also, we also game on for uh, Sebastian Bourdais now he has lost uh, uh, lost that lap again with his pit stop but when the leader pits Yes, he will get that lap back, and it'll be interesting to see how much he's gaining. Two-car battle for the lead between Nico Muller and the fast-closing Alex Lynn Cadillac. Looking to grab the lead here before the next pit stop cycle comes through. And then a battle royal as well between Seb Buemi now aboard on a brake car, taking over from, from Rio Hirakawa and James Collado in close to contention with the Toyota. Both those cars on outlaps now. And to get Toyota Kazoo Racing leapfrogging the Ferrari. Still the second Ferrari, the 50 car, with some kind of fluid leak. We think a water leak is in the garage. Peugeot, Cadillac, Toyota, Ferrari. Four different makes in the top four. As we come to the end of the 10th hour of this quite fabulous race, it's quite fabulous event, there's so much more to race this week here with 100 years of history here at Le Mans being celebrated we have to get down to 5th place before we see the second car for any of the mates involved in this 16 car deep starting grid in hypercar and that make is Cadillac 1.5 seconds the gap for the lead James Collado 2.3 seconds back from the next set of brake lights we can see ahead. That is the remaining Toyota. 
with traffic coming for Seb Boemi. It's going to be very interesting to see how Boemi can handle the traffic as we have less than 14 hours to go now. It's 2 o'clock here at Lasard. That's... Uh, Eight PM on the East Coast of the United States. Took you a while there. <laughs> yes, indeed. It'll be interesting to see, for me anyway, whether uh, Collardo is going to be able to close up on that Toyota ahead. I wonder what the pace is like. He's just out. This is his outlap. And joining us in the booth for uh, the overnight hours. Guy Smith. Actually, both. Yeah, welcome back, Guy. Hello. Actually, both Buemi and Collardo both are fresh in the car. That's right. So it's, it's interesting now for me to see who's going to be the quickest to get on, on the case, push the car, and uh, get up to speed. No time to warm up. Straight into it, Peter. Straight Certainly. On. And straight into the darkness as well. But also straight into probably the best track conditions that they've had because probably the last time both of these guys were in the car, track conditions weren't quite as good. This is the second stint for both of these drivers. 123 laps complete. Let's find out what they're telling James Collado. Is there anything I should know about the track? At the moment, it's full green. I'll talk to Ali. I'll talk to Ali. The chicanes stay tight on the line because off the line, it's still damp. Stay up next to the curbs. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think we could see that from the yeah. from our camera angles yeah. uh, and, and the various offs that people were having. I think it's just a case of trying to get up to speed for, for James, isn't it? And making sure that, you know, while he hasn't been in the car, if there's anything that's come to light, um, obviously the track's evolving and changing. So, um, yeah, when uh, when Pierre Guidi came out of the car, was what was the feedback on the car? What was the feedback on the circuit? Anything they could do to help him to get up to speed will be uh, a big, big, big benefit. The days of drivers having a talk when they are on the exchange are long gone. The, 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 yeah. more about efficiency we can get you the information over the radio but the days of that little bit of conversation where you see the drivers talking about the car maybe hand gestures that sort of stuff not anymore not anymore well funnily enough this is one of the few championships i think where the pit stops are as quick as you can make them most championships nowadays have a, a pit window a, pit, a time yes. that you have to stay in the pits so take Nürburgring 24 hours for instance you have to be in there for a couple of minutes so you've no, you got plenty of time you've got chat. plenty of time to chat and the drivers can pass over the information firsthand uh, but in this racing there's no time for the, these pit stops have to be as quick as possible and it can make the difference between um, winning the race and not winning the race right and LMP2 now we've got uh, Pro Am car actually leading overall with the uh, the cool racing car there is Jacobson behind the wheel another of the uh, 14 Danish drivers that are here at Le Mans. And he's just been uh, recently appointed a uh, Peugeot junior driver. So great. Uh, I'm sure they'll be watching his performance very closely. Almost 300 kilometers an hour before he got to the breaking point for the first chicane. And you can hear the engine note of the P2 car. Quite, quite different to the hypercar. Yeah. Let's hear from the team. Okay, the fuel target now is 6.30. We need to save fuel to gain one lap. We are expecting some rain, so we need to go long, please, mate. We are currently leading the overall race. So there you go. The strategy with the rain coming is starting to play to all of these teams. We need to save fuel so that we can stay out longer for yeah. the rain to get here so we don't have to make an extra stop when the rain gets here. So there's obvious things you can do in this situation. I, I suppose the, one of the most obvious is you lift off 
when you're at max speed, you just lift off a bit earlier and lift still, still brake at the same point. One of the other things is most of these drivers are left foot braking. So if, if there's a crossover between your brake and accelerator, it burns extra fuel. Ah, okay. So that's something to think about as well, that the crossover isn't, isn't, isn't so dramatic. And, and quite often with the lift and coast, if you do it well, you can actually go just as quick, pretty much doing the lift and coast as if driving normally, because once you're at maximum speed, if you kind of just roll out of the bottle slightly earlier, it doesn't really affect the lap time too much, uh, but it saves, you know, quite an amount of fuel. fuel. Yeah. I could sit and listen to these onboards all day. Mm -hmm. And in the P2 car, they're quite high revving, and there's quite a lot of vibration in the car. Yeah. They, they really, really do sort of resonate and vibrate in the car. Um, but they're an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing car. Super reliable, and obviously it's a one make, uh, you know, one make class now. Yeah, but it's it 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 doesn't feel like spec racing. No. It doesn't feel like spec racing, even though it is a, a one make class. Everybody's running the Gibson, which is based on the Nissan engine. They're all running the Orica chassis. Everybody's on Goodyear tires. It's a spec tire. And now it's got a little tr sort of train of uh, LMP2 cars with uh, Jakobsen, who's the overall leader in LMP2, trying to put them another lap down. 50 cars still undergoing some work. I think we've got our answer now on James Collardo. He is starting to close the gap slightly on Sebastian Buemi ahead of him. So we could see a good little battle uh, developing there quite soon. And also, uh, Buemi isn't exactly closing, wasn't exactly closing on Nico Miller. Of course, he's uh, made a pit stop, so that will that will change that around. But straight off. That's the uh, to the Corvette. No, might be. Yeah, I think you might be right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. And this is what you don't want to see as, as the yeah. driver. You know, you've been fighting for the win, leading the race, and, and the next thing you're you're in in the garage. It's um, it's uh, yes, yeah, heartbreaking, really. A car that has spent a lot of time near the front of the GTM category, the GR Racing number 86. Ben Barker behind the wheel of that car, but they're uh, trying to catch up. The 56, Rexy, the Project 1AO car. Gunnar Jeanette, now behind the wheel of that car, is on an outlap. The Iron Dames with Rachel Frey in the number 85 car is second in the class. Then the Proton Competition 911 with uh, Francesco Castellici behind the wheel. Then the Kessel Racing, the first time we've, uh, first time we've called Kessel Racing. Daniel Serra uh, is uh, in fifth position in the class in the number 57 Ferrari. Daniel Serra won a couple of times already here, yeah. hasn't he? Once in, at least once in uh, Aston Martin and yep. in the Ferrari in uh, um, GT Pro. Yeah, I think that's brakes, guys. That's a brake line leak. Back on board with Jacobson. Now he's actually dropped back a couple of spots. Um, I don't know whether he's made a pit stop, but he's dropped back down now to P4 in, in, uh, in class. Yeah, that is odd. No, yeah. because he, he didn't make a pit stop. No, I don't know. there was a scoring glitch. Well, yeah, unless he's really saving a lot of fuel and, and well, he's, yeah. he's, he's backed out of it, you know, quite aggressively. Uh, but he's definitely dropped back now. Um, and <clears throat> cars coming from behind as well. Getting the blue blue lights. I mean, he's almost 20 seconds back, actually, isn't, isn't he? From that's the something, yeah, that's something else. That's Unless there was... Yeah, I'm not sure. Unless there's a spin. Well, that would, that would explain it. Because, as you said, he was at the head of a train, so if he had it off or just going wide somewhere, he would have cost him some positions. 
back on board with our second place Toyota. So seven seconds up the road. We start to see the lights now of the Peugeot the 94 car. It just gives you that, if you're that car chasing, that when you see those rear lights, it just gives you that little character. Yeah. Start yeah. to chase and chip away and try and um, eat into that gap. And I, I imagine the team will have told him that he's quite close to him and just to egg him on a little bit. Uh, I'd be interested to know um, who's led the most laps so far. I mean, I, I think that Persia seems to have been out front for quite a while now. Yeah, so it, exactly. Yeah. It would be. Uh, So we've got one Peugeot, one Toyota, one Ferrari, two Cadillacs now in the top five. So this is a replay of the the, Cor the Corvette going, or is it? Or is that another car going straight on? No, that was the the replay of, of what we saw earlier. I thought maybe it was a replay of, of something that happened to uh, Jacobson because now he comes to the pits. So. There's the Camaro, the number 24 car, the NASCAR to Le Mans entry, garage 56. We had John Dooning in a little while ago, and everybody associated with this program is just over the moon happy with how things have been going. Mike Rockefeller behind the wheel of the car now. When it's done fueling, hopefully we'll stay with these pictures and you'll see the, uh, the dance of the Jackman. No hydraulic jacks on this car, as is kind of the standard in, in road racing. This is uh, the floor jack, and looks like they're going to replace some fluids first. So that's the, the high pressure system that's come apart. So this is going to be a long pit stop. But the tire changers were able to do their work in just over 10 seconds in the pit stop competition. And it's quite a ballet to see these guys work with the, with the Jackman and with the way that we can only have in this form of racing. So many, unlike Formula One, where you have seven people for each tire, um, you only have so many guys that can go over the wall to work on the car. And here we go. And we just got the end. That thing weighs uh, about 45 pounds, which we, uh, we worked out earlier was uh, 16 or 17 kilos. Yeah. It's so, so cool to see this car. It's such a such a great thing to see and, and hear. And they're continuing to carry on. They have uh, they're turning lap times in the uh, in the four minute range. They have. Uh, I don't think they have. Climbed as high. They 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 have all of their lap times in the practice sessions were quicker than the GT cars, but they're kind of mired in the middle of the GT field now, in 24th position overall. I think their uh, I think their wish for the day is to get close as close as they can to being in the top 20. I think um, one of the factors is when it rained and the yes. tricky conditions. Yes. They lost their straight line speed advantage, and all of a sudden they. GT cars That's exactly are, right. are on them. So the 50 car now slipped down to 12th place. So that's promoted both Glick and Glickenhaus is up to 8th and nice now. And the 37 car, the core car we've been following, is now in the pits. It's dropping down the order. So maybe they really did have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because he's now been in there for a while. And we start to see the 50 car dropping down the uh, the leaderboard now. Down to 14th overall. 15th overall. Such a shame they were running so well. Led the race various times. Pole position car, of course. Here's Mike Rockefeller. That distinctive downshift. Up through the gears. Five-speed paddle shift on this car. Unlike the... 
Winston Cup. Uh, wow, just aged myself there. <laughs> <laughs> when did you stop <laughs> winning, running that? <laughs> <laughs> A long time ago. Uh, the Cup car of today, which is this is the same as the Gen 7 cars that you see in NASCAR action on Sunday afternoons, but this car has instead of a sequential, it has a sequential gearbox, but it's a paddle shift, as opposed to the sequential shift on the floor, which is what the Gen 7 car has. Other than that, it's pretty much identical. It's 400 pounds lighter than a cup car, and they were able to achieve that through going from steel brakes, which is the, the rules in NASCAR, to uh, composite uh, carbon brakes, which took out a lot of the weight, and also they did some reconfiguring. Full course caution, we have another full course caution seen on the screen yet uh, why we may have that going back to the nascar one other fact is they removed the hybrid system that the aco asked them to put in so in the end the aco said okay you don't need to have yeah. a hybrid and they and that was a big weight saving yeah both the glickenhaus is still still running Still waiting to see why we have this full course caution. This won't. This isn't a safety car. This is just the field gets neutralized to 80 kilometers an hour. Can we see any cars stopped no. on track? Whether well, there's Prima car, okay, we we know that stopped. 63 car, perhaps? No, that's the Prima car. Is there debris? There was a there was a a message about debris on track, but um, this is good news for the 50. Yeah. Yep. How many laps have they lost? Does it say? There. Probably six. Six laps. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Worst feeling. Driver sitting there. Oh, I know. All the hard work's been done. Have so. A, 20 minute rest and then you go again. So now do you become the um, the test the test mule for the sister car? So for example, if you have yeah. change of conditions and you want to try a different tire or something, um, while this car's clearly out of the race f for the win, um, it, it could be used for, you know, to help the sister car in some way. So. I, think, I think you have to. I think you have to. There's so much on the line here. It, it gives you that opportunity to, to maybe go to slicks early or something like that. We have heard that there is rain uh, expected in the next uh, in the next little while. They said 20 minutes uh, about 10, 15 minutes ago. There's the full course yellow is going to end shortly. So maybe it was just debris on the circuit. Yeah, that makes it a uh, a very short caution. Going to go out on softs. Again, we talked earlier. Uh, the Toyota started on softs because of the uh, mixed conditions. Everybody else during the daylight pretty much raced with the uh, mediums. And tonight, as you guys expected, they have almost all gone to softs. So interesting, even though we had a fairly high track temp, no one, no one's, from what I saw, been on hard tires all, all weekend. Current ambient temperatures 19.8, track temperatures 23.1. This looks like the fight for second place. Just looking at the screen there, it says stop for the Cadillac and the Penske Porsche. I hmm. know oh, it's no, it's good, still going. So we've got uh, Rahel Fry in front of Martin Rump. Two Porsches. This is the battle for second place yeah. in the GTM category. Through Tetruge and out onto the Mall Sun straightaway. See who has the see who has the horsepower. 
as these cars will reach their terminal velocity at this racetrack in this section of the racetrack. So Fry trying to hold off Rump as they come to the first chicane. Looks like Rump's trying to uh, at least having a look down the inside. Thinks better of, no, has made the pass. Has made the pass. And now has taken over second place as they exit the chicane. And now his next uh, target is gonna be Gunnar Jeanette, who's a little bit, a uh, little ways up the road. Okay, here's the replay. So it's a straightforward yep. pass down the outside. A good move. Thomas Loudon back there, head of Porsche Motorsport, looking on. On board with the number eight, Sebastian Buemi. Buemi's now really closing in within a second of uh, Nico Moller, so he's within striking distance. So. Uh, and not far behind Buemi is uh, James Collado, so it's uh, it's getting tight up front now. Yeah, game on again, and the Cadillac number two, Alex Lind, is only uh, 12 seconds uh, behind the leader, just eight seconds behind our uh, third place, Ferrari. And there he can see them as they go underneath the iconic Dunlop Bridge down through the Dunlop S's. The Hunter and the Hunted. So when we last talked about him, he was seven seconds behind. So he's closed up, he's probably closed yeah, more than a second a lap on him. If you look on the last lap there, it's 5, 5.31. For the for Nico Muller and 5.25 yep. there, and which was full course yellow, yeah. of course, but yeah, 5.16 for Clara. So, Nico Muller seems to have been in a car for a long time and must be doing yeah. definitely a triple stint. Yeah, triple stints. Of course, it was the Peugeot team that, uh, as you said, 20 minutes or so ago, told Nico that there's likely to be some mm -hmm. rain coming. Nico's probably just thinking he wants to get out of the car before the rain comes. Well, <laughs> I, I think that uh, when it does come, he will be getting out of the car and that will just hand over. Yeah, the Toyota's right, right with him now. This is the battle for the lead. We know the Toyota is good when the conditions are, are, are tricky, uh, Pete. So they'll be, again, looking forward to that uh, potential rain. Exactly. If, if that rain comes, it just puts them in a much better position. I expect the Toyota will breeze by fairly easily. There he goes. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of straight line speed, it definitely seems to me that the Peugeot is possibly the weakest one or certainly not the, maybe not the strongest yeah. um, and even even out of the tighter corners it lacks that boost I mean we were going to see the the Toyota just pull away that extra little bit it just doesn't seem to have the oomph out of the corners he's gone already yeah but we did hear Nico talking earlier about the, the car being just a little bit unsettled in certain areas of the track and we've seen that by their onboard run on the in the daytime as well and we've got the pit stop for car number eight under investigation which is the leader so i'm not sure what that is is about but there's a possible uh issue there with their pit stop so let's uh, let's see what happens with that well the, yeah that's a car that made two stops yeah um and it, it seemed like uh, unnecessary I wonder whether the pit, the, um, pit lane had actually 
you know, was close to Solan. It yeah. doesn't happen it, in the it, full cross yellow, though. It's definitely was a strange one. And we've got James Clarder now catching up again. He's only 1.1 behind uh, Nico Muller. So, again, it won't be long before uh, he's trying to get past. So the 51, the 50 car is now back on track. Good uh, indication of a wet off line there. So the, yeah. the track still has, and even though it's quite quite warm, still hasn't properly dried. It's very humid still. Just a little over 13 and a half hours remaining. whole lot of race yet to be run yeah that that 37 core cool car it's dropped right to the back now it's obviously got a problem yeah he's still in the pits that's too bad they had a really good run going so Buemi's pulled out 1.6 seconds in the last uh, couple of laps so He's just getting his head down and trying to pull out, pull out a gap. Hopefully, there'll be no issue with the uh, with the pit stop. Still waiting to find out uh, more information on that. In uh, the GTE AM category. Only 17 seconds now separates uh, Martin Rump and Gunnar Jeanette. So we'll keep an eye on that, see if uh, the 911 Proton competition entry can close in on Jeanette in the 56. Back on board with Nico Miller. Second place in the Peugeot. Just a little over two seconds behind our race leader, Sebastian Buemi. Must be frustrating for him knowing that uh, he can really do nothing about the Toyota coming by and potentially later on, maybe on the Motsan, the 51 car will probably just pass him on the straight as well. Yeah, because that's the 51 right behind the Peugeot now as they uh, head into Indianapolis. And it's interesting. No, I'm sorry, that's Porsche curves. Yeah, it's really interesting to see the difference in the two cars, how the, the Peugeot is visibly m moving around more, um, and the, the Ferrari just seems to be completely nailed down. But, you know, through the Porsche corners there, fastest corners on the track, the yeah, Peugeot actually looked like it pulled away. So it might look a little bit more nervous, but it certainly um, doesn't lack pace through there. And it's interesting that it would be a little more nervous in the dry, but not as nervous and perform better in mixed conditions when everybody else is nervous. Yeah. Sometimes it can be maybe their, their sort of suspension setup is a little bit softer, the car's a bit more compliant. Um, so when it does become cooler or it becomes, um, uh, you know, inclement weather, that it, the car just seems to yeah. suit those, those um, conditions better. Ferrari's not really gained on him. No, you're right. No. I mean, let's see now. I mean, we were just saying earlier on that it seems to be the straight line speed the Peugeot is perhaps lacking a little bit compared to the uh, the other the other hypercars. But um, let's see if he claws back some of that time now as we go up to the Mulsanne straight. Yeah, the proof will be in the pudding here if they go down towards the first chicane because this is the fastest part of the racetrack. This is when they reach their highest speeds right before the breaking point for the chicane. A little strip team there on the 100 Ferrari. The walking horse entry. Hard on the brakes, and it doesn't look like he closed in that much, guys. No, no. no Nico Miller is driving really well. A lot of pressure to lead the race, but he's, he's keeping his head. Their last lap time were uh, 32 sevens. One was a 32.727, the other was a 32.58. Five, five, 
So Muller had a, a better better lap time last lap. But just by a skosh, there goes your race leader, Sebastian Buemi. Here comes second and third. Just two seconds behind. Over the hump. As we go back. There they are. It's almost as if the Peugeot is starting to close back in on, on Buemi. You're right. It's like it's uh, it's found like a new lease of life. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. yeah. Raised his pace. Who's going to be able to work the traffic better in these high-speed portions of the racetrack? Come the engines to Indianapolis. Well, that worked well for the the Porsche. Not so good for the Ferrari. Yeah. yeah. And it's so difficult um, for these GT guys because they are absolutely on the limit. Yes. And of course, when you've got a hypercar, probably either side of you trying to get around you in a, in a high-speed corner, such as the Porsche corners, um, it's it must be very difficult trying to look in your mirror and hold your line. Going around the number 98, Aston Martin, which is currently 10th in GTE Am. Ian James behind the wheel of that car. Ian... Uh, making his first return here in uh, almost 20 years. I spoke to him. I used to race against Ian in yeah. 1994 in Formula Vauxhall Junior. <laughs> and I, I saw him probably for the first time since about that time in the paddock. And we were just chatting and he's been in America for 27 years now. Yeah, yeah, racing pretty much full time over there. Kevin S just just put in. Uh, I think is is that their fastest time? Yeah, that's yep. that that's a personal best for that car at a three. What is it? Three twenty nine six seven two. The same for the uh, for the Hendrick NASCAR. It's done its best uh, personal best time with Mike Rockefeller at the wheel. So the track's obviously starting to come in a little bit. Yeah. Just in time for it to rain. Exactly. Cooler, rather stronger. Stronger engines, thicker air, more horsepower. So, let's find out what they're talking about at Toyota. Okay, so three laps to go this stint, three laps to go this stint. So, So still, James Collado can't quite get on to terms with uh, Nico Muller. Yeah. Muller's actually matched the, the um, last lap time of Buemi, which is both slightly quicker than Collado. So Muller's, he's genuinely there on pace. He's, he's, he seemed that Buemi caught and passed him, and then since then he's sort of found another gear and yeah, he stepped it back up again. So yeah, as you say, he's driving a great race. Alex Lynn's lapping of a similar pace as the leaders, so very, very close on, on that time, but he's still, um, he's still 10, well, almost 11 seconds behind, but he is on, on pace. Ah, but he was 12 earlier, so he's Chip, close, chipping, he's chipping chip, away. He's chipping away at it. Chipping away at it. So there you go. They're close enough now that we're measuring it in meters, not in, uh, in seconds. Some pretty accurate GPS. Gosh, when you see him that close, it's, is it, how hard is it to stay disciplined and just not take a little bit deeper than you should? Or... I don't want to know. I think you've got some of those, haven't you, Peter? Like yeah. I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wear them on a Saturday night normally. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> What is it about cloven hoof? <laughs> <laughs> right, now he he's on Yeah, now, now he's on. close. He's got to run now. He had a very, very good sector to Collado.
again, there's lots of um, lap times been deleted for track limits, but we haven't seen any penalties as yet. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and no warnings yet either. No, you'd, you'd have thought perhaps by now if we would be that you took your five, uh, your five jokers, as it were. So we have a yellow at Marshall Post, 35. That's gone now. Maybe just a spin. So Muller is matching, and there is the pass. The pass has been completed. So now our running order is Sebastian Buemi. Nope. Timing and scoring line to me. No, he's still there. there he's yeah. still there, yeah. Wow. So I was thinking it'd be very difficult to overtake in the middle yeah. of the Porsche curves. Yeah. In but fact, he's, he's actually pulled out a gap, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he has. Almost a full second now, 9.96 seconds. This has gotten very interesting. This is, this is, uh, the, I didn't expect the Miller to be able to, to hold him off like this. Yeah. This is an excellent drive. This young man's put this car on his back, and because he's turning this almost the same lap times as as Buemi. This last lap he didn't. He was uh, almost a second a second slower, but certainly matching matching what Colado can do. There's the number three Corvette. Still Sebastian Bourdais. Oh, man. No, he's gone round. Yeah, he has. In fact, is he heading into the wall? I think it was just a spin. There was a very... Just missed it. There was a very quick yellow uh, flag. So, yeah, he, uh, he tried to show his intention that he was coming down the inside, but the P2 car was having none of it. That's the 41 car, which is currently third yeah. in the LMP2 category. Rui Andre behind the wheel of that car. A risky pass, actually. You know to. Yeah, but he's trying. He's, he's he's trying so hard to get back. He is, but you know sometimes into there against yeah. the P2 car, yeah. which is very little difference in speed. Yep. It's maybe not, not worth the bother. Yep. Here we go. The run out of Mulsanne down towards Indianapolis. Does Collado have enough this time to get by? He's going to send him around the outside. Yeah. Yep, he's going to make him go around the long way. What's his in front? What cars is in front? He's going to... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah he's See, lucky. Yep, Collado used that car as a pick. Takes the line. The right, hard on the brakes for the left. And now on to Arnage, which is the slowest corner on the racetrack. And job done for James Collado as he takes over second position and is now going to try and hunt down Sebastian Buemi, who has a 4.5 second lead over the Ferrari. I think uh, Buemi's due in the pits at yes. time, but yep. it looks like maybe the Ferrari also. So. Yep. I wonder what these uh, the crew of the NASCAR team, the Hendrick boys, think of 24-hour racing. <laughs> Well, some of them have just come off the uh, Coca-Cola 600, which is the longest race of the season over Memorial Day weekend. Oh, wow. Let's hear what Sebastian thought of that move. Yeah, 10-4, we'll hit this lap. So here he does uh, come into the pits. After that spin, after his uh, little contretemps with the LMP2 car. It's one of the Porsches in front of him. That's the number six car. Kevin Estra behind the wheel of that car. Routine service for both of these cars at this point. Estra comes to a stop. There comes Bourdais. They'll check the car over, make sure there's no uh, damage. Driver change now. Sebastian Bourdais will get out. I think that's going to be Dixon. Scott Dixon, yes, yep. indeed. 
I just wanted to check my helmet chart before <laughs> <laughs> before I uh, committed. But yeah, Scott Dixon, seven-time IndyCar champion. And they'll be checking that car after the contact. I think um, Bordet mentioned about a vibration, whether it was just a, a flat spot perhaps on the tire, but they'll be just checking there's no suspension damage. Peter Dumbreck heads off for his uh, evening rest. Guy Smith and I will carry on with you through the rest of the evening. And this is it, you're straight out onto the, uh, onto the track, onto the Mulsanne, 200 plus miles an hour. Yeah, but it's so much nicer when you're doing it when it's dry. That is Because you at true. least have some modicum of what to expect as opposed to a surprise at every corner. Um, but it's interesting because you go from being kind of in the garage, kind of, it's all quite peaceful and relaxed, and then you get into the car and you're sort of flat out and uh, full adrenaline, so it's, uh, it's a big change. This is a battle for the P2 lead um, now. So we've got two of the smaller teams, into Europol and Duquesne, doing a fantastic job. Um, and now battling for the uh, for the overall lead in LMP2. Neil Yanni, a past winner of this car, of this race, not in this car. Yeah, and he's just been announced as a driver in the Proton Porsche uh, hypercar. So um, that's a great, uh, you know, great to see him in that program. Fantastic driver, um, and he's doing a great job with the uh, Duquesne team. Yep, and gets him back in a Porsche where he, of course, he did so well in the Rebellion as well. He did, he did. Uh, he's a very fast shoe. He'll uh, come into the pits now as the 34 carries on. The Toyota's not been in as yet, so it must be due. Not yet, gotta be any minute. And I assume the Fry will just follow it and try and match it. Yeah, do what he does. So Yanni brings the number 30 Duquesne entry in. They have not had a trouble free run either. Been involved in a couple of close calls and a couple incidents. There is the number eight, as we expected. So that's going to put the Peugeot, number 94, and now the Cadillac, number two, with Alex Lynn. And the 51 did follow the eight in, also as we expected. So the Peugeot's back in the lead again. Yes, Peugeot back in the lead. Doesn't look like they're doing have tires out uh, at, at either pit. So this is just going to be fuel only. Cleaning the windshield. Lotto waiting. Wemmy is released. And there he comes. And he'll go by Collado. Right there. And there you hear the Ferrari firing up. So nothing really lost there for the Ferrari, but nothing really gained either. No. Nope. And these guys were kind of circulating in the same kind of lap time, so um, it's kind of been sort of status quo for the uh, last few laps. So let's see what kind of an advantage now the Peugeot and the Cadillac have. Also, what their energy levels are would be interesting to see. This is that ebb and flow. This is one of the things that I love about endurance racing, Guy, is the, the, the ebb and flow of the pit stop cycles when you have, you know, in American oval track racing, you'd almost call it like they're off sequence because, you know, they'll pit now and the other guys may not pit for five or six more laps. 
Yeah. And that's a and and you have to kind of do the do the math as to what they gain or lose after the pit stop, after things have settled down. Okay, what was it before the pit stop? Yeah. And what is it now? And that to me is one of the most interesting aspects of sports car racing is that is that give and take and it's you know you you get to that point where it's kind of like what i like to call the crossover pit stop where you're so where, where you're close enough now that the next time you make the pit stop you're going to be able to hold the advantage as opposed yeah. to losing it it's like with nico muller and, Al and alex lynn is to see um, if they've gained some time Okay, step 51 is on fuel only. Sorry, correction, fuel only for the Ferrari. You're ahead. We gained in the stop. Okay. They gained a second in the stop. <laughs> well, a second... Uh, Anything to cheer up second. your driver. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was just saying, I think that um, with, the, with Nico Muller and Alex Lynn obviously not pitting yet, and they've been out on track, if they've had clear track and were able to run, you know, continue to turn fast laps, they may well have gained, or we'll have to see once they do their pit stops and we'll, we'll get oh, yeah. a better idea. But as you're right, it, it, it's that ebb and flow, so... Uh, the, the dreaded undercut and overcut. Yeah. Hey, it's funny, because with, with, you see with the racetrack now, at the moment it seems quite quiet. There's, there doesn't need to be many cars around. There's times where the track looks like it's 80 cars on the track, mm -hmm. and so, sometimes it's like you're the only car on the track. <laughs> um, and of course, that's what you always hope for. Um, so this is the leader in uh, into Europol car in LMP2, making its pit stop. So three minutes stop and go penalty for car 74 for not respecting the full course yellow procedure. Who is that? That's the Castle Racing car. Yeah. Yeah, that's the black Ferrari, the black and orange Ferrari. Then, then again, another one that has not had a trouble-free run as our uh, leader comes back out onto the racing surface after their pit stop in LMP2. So that will kind of settle things out because the 30 car has made his pit stop already. So. Once we get a, uh, once they cross the timing line, we'll see uh, just what's happened to the advantage there or yep. not. And at the front of the field, uh, Nico Muller again is managing to maintain that gap back to Alex Lynn. Both cars circulated in very similar lap times, but uh, Lynn's keeping the pressure on, but uh, the gap's remaining quite consistent right now. So uh, down to seven seconds. And it looks like the uh, 38 is going to head back into the garage again. Currently 10th in class, and is four laps down on our leader. So it was a well, it was a promising start. Fully uh, fully started to unravel when uh, Yi went into the tire barrier, the Porsche curves. Yes, yeah, it's, it's shown some real pace this car, hasn't yeah, it? It's been really really, really quick. Just, just been, um, yeah, just a little bit unlucky. And sometimes this place, you know, is just not going to give you a break. And this has been one of those weekends for that crew. Here's your second place, Cadillac, just seven, almost eight seconds now behind. The Peugeot of Nico Muller, Alex Lynn, has just done an outstanding job in this stint. 7.2 seconds now behind. So we'll see if he can eat in. This is starting to look like uh, a four or five horse race at this point. Or Scott Dixon trying to get back on the lead lap. Let's see what they're talking about at Cadillac. Box this lap, box this lap. You stay in the car and you keep the tires. Okay. So gonna be fuel only for Alex Lynn. But it's great we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five manufacturers in the top five. Five different manufacturers. 
That's what we. That's what we. That's what we come here for. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we come here for. In comes Alex. In his marks. On the pit, on the pit limiter. Those cars sound so awful. <laughs> <laughs> And the uh, Project One uh, AO car uh, is still leading in uh, GTE. Got a 24-second lead, so those guys are doing really well. I mean, they've had a they've had a quite a rough season, um, so they're doing really well. You know, they seem to have, if they can hang on in there. So our uh, top two cars are in. The Peugeot has also come in. So Nico Muller looked like there was a. Did Nico get out? Looks like there may have been a driver change there. Again, uh, adding fluids to the Cadillac. Possibly stayed in. Yeah, he may have. No, he got out, and Gustavo Menezes has gotten back behind the wheel of that car. Gustavo is another one who turned in a pretty good stint earlier. Yep. He's, uh, yeah, super fast. Very competitive. Super fast. Is Californian? I think believe it's yes. Californian, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we've got Clara now for four and a half seconds behind Buemi. Um, ten seconds further back is, uh, is Menezes, so. And it's interesting because Colado's not been able to cut in at all to Buemi's lead. No. In fact, Buemi has pulled out a little bit on him. Uh, last lap, he was uh, about six tenths quicker. Tire change now for a new set of boots for the 708 Glickenhaus. Olivier Pla behind the wheel of that car. Another guy that can pedal. Yeah, it's great. The two Glickenhaus kind of are almost like having an inter-team battle. They're kind of in their own their own little race, but uh, doing a great job, and um, both cars are running well and uh, inside the top ten. Yep. And still running. Still running, yeah. And there there are others who are not. So, just to recap, we've got uh, Buemi and Colado. Toyota and Ferrari, first and second. And then in LMP2, it's the inner Europol number 34 and the uh, Duquesne team number 30. And the Penn is racing. Olivier Penny is uh, number 65. Great to see him uh, as a car owner. Uh, Van, uh, Jab Van Ort is behind the wheel of that car. And, and Van Ert actually for this race has a replica of uh, of Penny's helmet when he won the Monaco Grand Prix. Yeah, it's fantastic. And it was a surprise. And uh, he put it on when uh, Penny was in the garage. And he was quite pleased to see that. And then in, in uh, GTEM, it's uh, the number 56, Project 1AO. Gunnar Jeanette behind the wheel of, of that car, affectionately called Rexy. His uh, teammate, uh, Hyatt, has... Uh, the daughter wanted to see the dinosaur, so he's got the T-Rex teeth across the front of the Porsche and little T-Rex arms on the uh, on the on the on the doors. It's a great, great livery, uh, special livery for this race. Then comes the AF course of Ferrari number 54 with Francesco Castellici, and then the Iron Danes, Dames, uh, Rachel Fry behind the wheel of that. So it's Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche. And the, the interesting thing, that, that AF Corsa Ferrari, number 54, that's the silver Ferrari that you see out there of the, of the AF Corsa fleet of, of Ferraris. That car's just quietly, quietly appeared in the top five, and now yep. it's appeared in the top three, just going about their business, workman, workman-like manner. And that's it. That's what this race is all about, isn't it? It's about staying out of trouble. We're going to check in and uh, see what Sebastian Buemi thinks. Okay, Seb, we see you stabilizing with the roll bars. Is there anything we can do to help you? Question? 
Okay, so we're sitting here uh, singing the praises of how Sebastian Buemi is starting to pull out a little bit of a lead on Colado, and then we find out from Team Radio that he's virtually disgusted with his race car and having trouble <laughs> dialing it in, and the crew say, we're, we're seeing you adjust the roll bars. What else can we help you with? Yeah, you see, Colado... God, the, the, the field hopes he doesn't get it figured out. <laughs> He's chipping away, uh, Clouders there. He's just put a little bit more um, time in on, on Buemi. So, you know, he's under, he's under pressure. And, you know, yeah. It's a fight. It's a fight. And he's looking, he's trying to use all the tools uh, his disposable, uh, that's disposable to him in his car so that he can try and, and get some more speed out of that car. It's um, trying to tune it to the circuit. The track's perhaps changing as it, as, you know, it starts to cool down. And he's trying to, you know, dial that race car in um, the best that he can. And, and Buemi's not a guy who's shy about talking to the crew about what he thinks is wrong with the race car. He's, he's, he's pretty vocal. Uh, has been his entire career. Yes. Uh, about uh, he is a perfectionist and he wants that car to be as well dialed in as he can get it. And he's not afraid to let the crew know if it is not up to a uh, standard that he likes. Yellow at uh, Marshall's Post 11. After. That's to the entrance of the first game. Okay. And we can see the, the first two cars actually pulled out a small gap over the uh, Peugeot and the Cadillac. So they're about 13 seconds um, back now. And our, our, our battle is rejoined in LMP2 as uh, the inner Europol. Entry number 34 and the Duquesne team number 30, Neil Yanni, is now closed to within half a second. And I think he's going to make a, make a stab at taking over the top spot here on this lap. The uh, Peugeot number 93, which is the car that's in seventh place overall, a couple laps down to our leader after having some uh, issues early in the race just going through this battle, kind of separated them a little bit. And we're gonna have a slow zone, uh, slow zone, slow at zone three, which is Marshall post six. So that's the, uh, that's Tetrouge. Okay. So we are again into uh, that area of the racetrack for a slow zone. That's been kind of the hot zone in this event. Calamity Corner, if you will. Oh, that was close. That was close. <laughs> that was really <laughs> close. He'll look back at the highlight video and go, oh, my God, I didn't think it was that close. So the slow zone will be uh, taking a look here. Oh, and this is why we have a slow zone. 32. That's the number 32 car. Down the order. That. He's over there on your page. That's the other inter Europol car. Okay. That's with Jan Magnussen. Ah. It seemed like a really strange... Yeah. Almost like something broke, didn't it? Yeah. Just kind of... Those snap sharp spins. Left, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So there's the 94 car, third place car. Gustavo Menendez. Here we go into the uh, slow zone. Yep, and into the slow zone. That's actually after Dunlop. We've not actually had a slow, slow zone for a little while, have we? No, we haven't. We haven't. And they go through Tetrouge. So this slow zone will take them all the way through probably the end of the first chicane. So hopefully we won't see any calamities at the as the uh, removal unit is already there to uh, clear the wreckage of the 32 car Jan Magnuson was was behind the wheel of the car so Neil Yanni is still behind the uh, into Europol car but right on his tail there so 
there you see on the screen the slow zone and how it works. So it goes from the first part of the slow zone is the next zone, which is the warning area that you're about to enter the slow zone. And you're not allowed to do any passing there. And you need to get yourself down to the slow zone speed. And then the slow zone speed carries you all the way down the straightaway through the first chicane. And then you'll see a green flag once you've cleared the chicane. And there you see the 32 car being lifted and uh, be pulled back. And if he's able to carry on, then he'll trundle on. And he's work his way back to the pits as you see uh, folks picking up debris and parts that were scattered after he uh, impacted the wall. Yeah, these marshals have been amazing so far this race. They've been so busy clearing up the wreckage, repairing barriers. Uh, they've just kind of worked tirelessly. So uh, a big shout out to all the marshals. Yeah. Doing such a great job. There's the number 25 car. Comes to the pits fifth in class. That's the uh, TF Sport, the Ort by TF. Charlie Eastwood behind the wheel of that car. The Aston Martin. Unusual color for an Aston Martin. It is, yeah. It's quite nice to see it in, in a different color. Team. Yeah. I don't know, I'm still partial to Felton Green myself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the um, the Project One car is pulling out like a nice gap now, 34 seconds over the second place AF car. So doing a great job there. Um, Gunner Jeanette's got uh, a lot of experience, as you well know. You've, yes. You've raced with Gunner. I have. And uh, he he's an experienced Porsche racer. Another guy who has uh, kind of lived that, that Walter Mitty existence of being a you know, what what does Gunner do for a living? He's Gunner. He's Gunner. Yeah, that's right. He's, he, that's, that's what he does for a living. He's Gunner Jr. That car going slow there. What number is that one? Is that that is that actually the car that, that crashed? Looks like, yes, I think that is actually the Interpol. A little damage on the front, so I would think that it is. And it's about, the timing is about right. Although it does have set him down. It does say the 32 car is stopped, so maybe it's... No, it's uh, on the... Uh, he's moving on the, on the oh, little map there. You can see Ah, him. okay. In comes the AF uh, LMP2 car. AF Corsa, number 80. Again, that's another car that had a pretty good run near the front for a while. Is now 11th in class, 23rd overall. Norman Nato behind the wheel of that car. Work continues on the Jota Porsche, the Hertz team Jota Porsche. These guys won't give up. Yeah, and I think for these guys, they've done such an amazing job and the performance of the car is amazing, but they are new to the car. So when they have a problem, it, um, you know, it's perhaps more of a problem because they're not so probably familiar with um, repairing it or, or fixing the car, certainly at speed. So it's gonna be, um, you know, more of a challenge for these guys to get the car back on track. Guy, for those who, like me, have just stepped away for an hour and wondered what the heck had just happened to this race, what the heck just happened to this race? What happened to the, the 38 Josephine Team Porsche? Is that a legacy of their earlier crash? Um, I don't know. They've just come in the pits again. I, they, they were running really well, actually. They were solidly in the top 10 back amongst the, the, uh, the other hypercars, but they've, uh, they've, they've come back and pushed the car back into the pits and are not quite sure what the reason for that is and just saying because they are new to the car it's probably going to take them a little bit more time to get it fixed because they're probably trying to figure out themselves you know they're learning about the car all the time but um, either way I think that so far they've done a great job and should be proud of, of their efforts um, but we've got a real good battle uh, Buemi's leading now it's only a couple of seconds from James Collado you've got Menezes um, who's taken over from um, uh, Nico Muller, who did, drove a great stint um, and, and led, I mean, arguably you could say that, uh, I'd love to know the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Peugeot has led the most laps so far. Uh, they seem to be out front for a long, long time. And then uh, you've got Alex Lynn, um, not far behind him. So you've really got those sort of, the top four of a solidly 
in it, you know, with the uh, with the number six uh, Porsche kind of on the fringes, but certainly not out of it. Francesco Castellacci handing over to Thomas Floor. Uh, I'm getting, judging, judging by the body shape, that is the 54A, of course, a Ferrari silver car that is currently lying second overall in the GT Am, second overall, second in the GT Am class. Project One AO Porsche, the number 56 car of Gunnar Jeanette is that class leader. That is Rexy, for those of you watching in Technicolor. And uh, third place, Daniel Serra for Kessel Racing. Daniel Serra spent a lot of time racing successfully with Paul Dallalana's crew in the 98 Northwest AMR Aston Martin, now back where he sort of started his GT career in Ferraris, in the 57 Kessel Racing car. Looking here at the lead battle between the number eight Toyota Gazoo Racing and the 51 Ferrari AF Corsa car, Sebastian Bohemia and James Collado. And that's come right down again. It's um, Sebastian Bohemia is playing around with the roll bars. The team had sort of said to him, you know, what, what can they do to help? Bohemia was playing with the roll bars. He's clearly not. 100% happy with that car, and um, he's trying to find the balance. And uh, James Clado's gradually, gradually chipping away at that lead. And uh, again, Menezes in the in the Peugeot, he, he's they're hanging in there. They've got the pace, you know. They they they're there on merit, um, not by luck. They are absolutely in the fight, and uh, you know, great to see uh, see them there. White flags just being waved there, so that's the, that'll be the slower 32 car on its way back in. 63 still at the side of the track, so that car has not got back underway. And that was at the first, was it the first chance? Not at the first you came now. In fact, that's no longer showing the stop, so that is moving as well. So both those cars that went off down there are going. Riding on board with Collado, you just saw him down into, into Indianapolis, having a look and going briefly by an LMP2 car, which then had the better line and more grip and came back past him because at low speed there's very little at all in terms of performance between the LMP2 car and the hypercars and indeed actually the GT cars the, their minimum speed is almost identical I would think um, so it's only really when you get up towards yeah, north of 150 miles an hour that it starts to make a difference. Yeah and sometimes you find with a GT car when you come to a slow corner like a hairpin or a first gear corner they're actually sometimes quicker because they've got more mechanical grip, so they, they tend to have you know, better rotation and quite often better traction because they don't have quite as much power, but they've got, they've got that extra grip. So, um, yeah, in the low-speed corners, it's, um, they're quite often quicker. Gap between the lead cars, Toyota number eight, the 51 Ferrari, just seesawing to and fro. You can see there in, the, in a progression from three seconds down to 1.6, down to 1.2, out to 1.8. In fact, halfway around the last lap, it was down below a full second. You can see there, Ferrari's uh, ENG crew. Well, these are the guys that are producing Ferraris behind the scenes footage as well. Some friends and colleagues of ours. Through the gravel goes the number three car of Sebastian Bourdais and his colleagues. Who's aboard the three caddy at the moment? That's uh, uh, Scott Dixon Scott of this parish. And we've got a five-second penalty for the... 94 Peugeot for a pit stop in Richmond. So that's going to cost them. Well, that will be served at their next pit stop rather than a stop and go. Yellow at Marshall Post 11. And that is at the first chicane. Well, there we go. Now, is that 94 Peugeot? Oh, that's a replay. Yeah. Just a replay of them riding the curves. That car in third place, the three marker lights. Red showing it's the hypercar class. Two marker lights on the 51 car, second in class. And one red marker light on the number eight Toyota. And that shows it is the class leader. You'll get the same with the... Oh, 94 has stopped. That yes. is sideways. Crashed. That is the third place Peugeot. Damage to the barriers, whether it was that car or another that... Mm, that's Has he quite actually a big bounced hit. off the barriers? I think he might have. Yeah, he's uh, on nice. board. He just ran wide and got on that damn mm. part of the circuit. Okay, that's bad news. That you were talking about the Peugeot being in third place on merit, not through luck. It was probably bad luck in qualifying and the inability to find a clear lap that slightly masked what to expect from the Peugeots. We had hoped that they would come good here, that their ground effect, no rear wing, 
aero design package would work best at Le Mans, probably the track that it was exclusively designed for. Win Le Mans, survive the rest. But that, did he, did he get on the damp? It looked... That's what it looked like. Yeah. And, and they've all been still telling their drivers, stay off the damp. Mm. And the problem with the curbs, you know, no matter how much the cars dry out the racing line, around the edges oh, yeah. of the curbs and in the corrugations of the curbs, that's where water lurks. So what is a low grip painted surface anyway becomes a very low grip or no grip painted surface when it's wet. Did you ever guys ever get a report on what was wrong with the 38 car? No, I mean, it so was the uh, crash detection, the black box. It, it, it had failed and okay. the ACO said you can't run without it. All right, well, we'll forgive him the uh, 10 euro fine for front nose. <laughs> In extremis, I think we'd all be it's an there. Americanism. But, but it, a really valid question from the driver. Mm -hmm. um, you know, am I going to do more damage by tr this thing coming underneath the wheels? And we think of Jose Maria Lopez of the Toyota at Sebring. Maximum 100. Maximum 100. All my lights are off. I am so sorry. My lights have gone off, I'm so sorry. All right, well, you know, he's not uh -oh. the first to make a mistake. Now, is that just the carcass of the tire, or has somebody yeah. spat a wheel off? And where is that, and whose tire was it? It it looks like it's the exit to karting. All right, mm. the good news is it made it clear across the track without anybody collecting it. But whose wheel is it? Now, a Michelin engineer might be able to have an... A, a, a fairly educated guess at what width of tyre that was. And what would that tell you? Well, it might tell you, if it was from a hypercar, which hypercar it was from, because the Peugeot has equal sized tyres, front and rear, and it's mm -hmm. unique in the hypercar field. Most have a narrower front and a wider rear tyre, including the Toyota. So all the, the Peugeot is the outlier there. And as a result of, of the way that it's <coughs> had it, or that they have chosen to use the maximum tyre contact patch that they're allowed, Peugeot is actually allowed to deploy its hybrid drive uh, above 150 kilometres an hour, whereas for all the others, particularly you think of the Toyota being front wheel, uh, using the front axle for its hybrid, it's 190 kilometers now before they can deploy theirs. In fact, the Toyota guys, the Ferrari guys are telling us um, that in a, in a lap that in qualifying is three and a half minutes and, and in the race is more, you know, 340, 350, they're only using about six seconds of hybrid power mm. a lap. Now, the misapprehension or the misunderstanding perhaps of, of the hybrid deployment is that in this rule set in hypercar, there is a maximum total amount of energy that the car can produce at any time. And that's measured by torque sensors on the drive shafts on two if it's two-wheel drive or four if it's four-wheel driven. And when the electrical power comes in, then the internal combustion engine power is subtly reduced by the electronics. So you don't have more power it just comes from a slightly different source, briefly. Uh, reports are that that tire was from the 45 car. Okay. The, uh, the CrowdStrike, the Algrave uh, uh, entry. Okay. And, and also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first warning we've seen for abusing track limits, and it's going to Alex Lynn. Yeah, in the number two caddy. Mm -hmm. uh, each driver, it used to be the case up until the end of last year, that each driver would have uh, a maximum of five warnings before incurring a penalty per stint. It is no longer per stint. It is the entire race, driver by driver. Now, the car doesn't earn them, so you don't get in with four penalties already on your car, <laughs> and then the first time you meander over the white lines, have to go and do a drive-through. It is per driver. But it does mean that if you 
let's say you're a bronze driver and you exceeded track limits three times on Saturday, didn't drive during the night, when you get in on Sunday, two strikes and you're back in for mm. a drive-through penalty. Which, to a degree, sounds like an awful lot of a half harsher regimen. But stay within track limits. Well, in the words of the great Doc Hudson, stay on the grey stuff, son, that's what it's there for. Pitched up a car 50 under investigation. When it's not your race, it's not your race. That's the second of the A, of course, of Ferraris. That's the car that stopped for a cooler change, and that was for the ERS, so the electrical recovery system. That ah, okay. system's water cooler had been pierced by a stone and was leaking, and so they suddenly had higher than satisfactory temperatures uh, in their hybrid system and that is devoutly not to be wished. Yeah, I, and I wonder if that was the same kind of water leak that happened with the Porsche. Well, again, these things are super sophisticated. We heard earlier in the race that somebody had to stop for repairs to a power steering cooling system. He's done a great job bringing this car back. Yeah, there's a lot of sparks. Yeah, it's a lot of drama, isn't there? Yeah. But, you know, easily that could just, you know what a grinding wheel looks like on any <laughs> random old bit of steel. Well, it's not on a grinding wheel, but at 100 kilometers now, the track surface is doing a pretty good grinding job. So hopefully it's not actually doing too much long term damage underneath. The fact that he's got four wheels certainly yeah. mitigates against that. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the under side of the car looks like. I was on the wrong side when all these cars were being lifted up. I was inside in the scrutineering rather than outside. Oh, now it's time to come now back. Now there, 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 there we go. Just as he gets to the peat lane speed limiter. Now, of course, hopefully that's working as well because that would really add insult to injury if you then got pinged for speeding in the pits. That's a brave cameraman. There you go. That tire delaminated just as it was coming down pit lane. That's why bits started mm -hmm. flying off. Uh, it's such a shame because the car was doing so well. They were doing a, a really great job and generally in the fight oh, for the win. Fantastic. Fantastic. Had two great stints. Well, now that leaves us with four cars on the lead lap as we get to close on 11 hours uh, and just over 11 hours of the race remaining. And we've got a slow zone at um, Marshall Post 30. I'm not sure what that's for. Mm. That would be... That's on the entry into the Porsche that's curve. Say, now, right who's before... gone off there? Or is there debris? While we were looking at something else, did, uh, did the Peugeot spit bits off? Or are they trying to rescue that wheel slash tire? That... Yeah. Ah, that's, that's true. That's where that was. Okay, here's the incident again, Guy. Yeah, he's gone in, carrying a bit of speed. He's missed the apex on the left, and he's just ran on. And it's actually still quite wet, actually, offline. Yeah. Mm. It's um, it's really not dried at all. So he's just gone in a little bit hot, slightly ran wide, and got that uh, right front uh, tire on the on the damp stuff, and lost literally lost his steering. That front, uh, that first chicane on the Mulsanne Strait has been the real area of contention mm -hmm. for yeah. everybody. See the bit of debris that he was driving by there. Yeah. And there, finally, the tire delaminates. That's been coming in locked. Yeah. Right. I mean, not locked by the brakes, but just not turning. And so it's eventually machined its way through the, the tread of the tire. Not luckily, the carcass. And luckily, again, because the team allowed him to come back in at up to 100 kilometers an hour, not halfway around the lap where it then ripped the, piece, uh, ripped the pieces off the car. Miguel Molina watching the action from the uh, Ferrari of Corsa garage. Again, this battle between the two very equally balanced cars. Sebastian Bermi in the number eight Toyota, multiple race winners and world champions. James Collado, also a multiple world champion. He and Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the 51 car, three time GTE Pro world champions when that was the thing as recently as ooh, last year. Last year, that's They're right. Indeed. Three in four seasons. I mean, they, and, and it, 
That makes it sound like they were utterly dominant. They weren't utterly dominant. It was a, an utterly, utterly tough fight all the way through, and they just managed to get the upper hand over their Porsche rivals, Michael Christensen and Kevin Nash, and they had uh, a world championship as well. That was the missing year for the Ferrari trio. And he's back to us there, walking away. Battistuti Bregliasco. Don't get many more sound, uh, Italian sounding <laughs> team managers, uh, team managers to Batty. Mangio Marte Ferrari's not doing too badly, I guess, for somebody no, no. who's uh, whose <coughs> firm runs Ferraris for a living. Not related, at least not closely related to Enzo Ferrari. At some stage, you imagine there is some distant relation, but not yeah, aware it's how not, distant. It's, it, no offense, but it's not like Smith. <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> Goodness gracious! I mean, you can you can you can barely count the number of Smiths who won Le Mans with, without taking your shoes and socks off. Well, that's is, right. Is there another? I'm not aware of any. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you know, it's such a popular name, or a common name, shall I say. Not many Clements or Duffs, I think, have no, won no, since, since the originals. No. Not Bob, many Bob other Bonatos. Hamiltons. Bonatos. Yeah. No. A lot of Bonatos. Now, the number 93 Some Peugeot like is... New Orleans is, dessert, a Bonato. 93 Peugeot now becomes the, the team's better-placed car as the 94 car slips down the order. That's how tight the battle still is with uh, 12 and a half hours to go because I'm now at that point where I'm subtracting time of day from amount of race left and that. Yeah, that's why I brought a studio <laughs> clock in. It still didn't help me because I'm still looking at the wrong counter, trying to figure out whether it's counting up or down and whether it means time to go or time elapsed. So we're getting close to the halfway point. 38 minutes away. Mm. <clears throat> and each of the teams that started the race has still got a healthy car in the hypercar class. One Toyota, one Ferrari, one Cadillac, one Porsche. And uh, actually, the two Glickenhaus cars, are they laps apart? They're, they're, they're on the same lap, aren't they? They're actually 40 seconds apart, the two Glickenhaus cars, Liv Leopard and Frank Mayer, and then, in eighth and ninth. They're having like an inter-team battle. Mm. But, but they're still going, and fair play, they're both, uh, they're both going and going strong, so. Well, look, Jim Glickenhaus's plan when he created these cars for the hypercar category, even though the rule set changed underneath him once he'd sort of set sail for the new world, or from the new world, literally, rather than metaphorically, um, his plan always was to be able to be watching cars bearing his own name that he had made and designed and conceived racing down the Mulsanne straight at night, just like the cars of his childhood hero in uh, Luigi Canetti and and he he did that and more than doing that last year one of his cars ended up on the overall podium at Le Mans so as far as he's concerned that is a huge number of boxes ticked he would love more people to have come and run cars he would love to have have had customer cars running that never quite transpired, and as a result, uh, he's got a, a program that is struggling for funding. It doesn't have a big manufacturer OEM budget behind it of any kind, so he's funding it himself, principally. They are producing a road car version of the car as well. That has now been crash-tested and seems to be 100% approved. So, again, they were, I'm sure there will be a queue for customers for what remains New York's only auto manufacturer. <laughs> Little white tabs there you can see on the corner of the windscreen. You're used to seeing drivers in single-seaters pulling a tear off off their visor to clear the muck off. Essentially, it's a plastic film across the visor of the helmet, and the same thing happens here. A plastic film uh, is applied across the windshield of the car, the windscreen of the car, and little white tab there allows the corner to be lifted and it's peeled off. And the standard number of uh, tear-offs on a windscreen now is a dozen, so 12 tear-offs, which means that every two hours you can remove one and get rid of all the oil, 
grime, all the dead insects. And boy, have there been some dead insects on windscreens after even a lap of running. And, and also, Guy, the thing that you don't really think about, which is all the black smears from the little balls of rubber that get fired up all the time. And that's probably as, uh, causes as much dilution of your visibility as anything else. So those tear-offs, those are a really key part of, of keeping the driver in the frame. Yeah, and especially as um, you come into the morning and the sun, once you get the sunlight on the screen, that's when it really, really shows up. Mm. And uh, that's the time where, yeah, you need, you've gone through the night and you'd definitely be, uh, be asking for a clean uh, windshield in the morning. You'll often see during pit stops, for safety reasons, mechanics are allowed to clean the windshield, so you often see them cleaning them up. But if, it get, if you get particularly bad, badly peppered by gravel, say, for instance, it's your lead battle again, not much in it is there, then, uh, yeah, you might want one taken off. And there's uh, one particular company who uh, have made a, a massive market for themselves in this field. You just saw in the back of the Ferrari garage, spare windshield hanging from, yeah. the, from the ceiling, 12 tear-offs on that as well. Everything will have the, all the visors, uh, uh, all the, all the tear-offs applied. James Collado lies in second place. What's their thoughts? He made box to slap, box to slap, fuel only. Box to slap, fuel only. Okay. The reliable and calm voice of the race engineer for the 51 car. Now, what about Toyota? Okay, so box this lap, pit confirm, box this lap, pit confirm, you stay in the car, new tires. Battle, ah, new yeah. tires though. Battle just whistling by the Garage 56 Chevy Camaro ZL1 there. No question from the rear light signature what it is, also the distance the rear lights are off the ground gives you a fairly <laughs> good indication as well. They're at uh, way above driver's eye level. Number three caddy is in. Still Dick. Scott Dixon, or is yeah. that the blue and yellow of Sebastian Bourdais? No, Bourdais got out and Dixon yeah. got in. Yeah, well, Dixon was in when it came in, so... But no, what in. I'm saying is, er, yeah. the, on the last driver change. On the last change, so yeah. he's recently in. Andre Lotterer is in the number six Porsche in third place. He's just stopped. So, uh, fourth, uh, no, fourth place, yeah, because number two caddy of Alex Lynn has now cycled up to the top of the pile. Alex with a penalty hanging over his head, hasn't he, Guy? Well, a, a warning. He's, a warning. He's got okay. a warning. He's got a warning, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's going to be interesting. So the, both the leaders are going to be pitting, and uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like uh, Clado is going to be uh, fuel only, and uh, Buemi is going to be taking tyres. And look at the way that Collado is piling the pressure on the Toyota mechanics. The gap was 1.2, down to 0.7, now down to 0.46. They are going to be almost within touching distance coming into the pit entry. Ooh. Yeah, and there they and are. There he is. And that puts big pressure on both teams to perform. And that's an indication of how Ferrari are comfortable in their skin with this car, with this team, with these drivers. That it's like they've been doing it for a decade. And to, to a degree, a large part of the team has. The, the team is a... A melange, that's not the Italian word, but a mixture of AF Corsa GT engineers and technicians and Ferrari Formula One engineers and technicians, and they came together as this program sort of started to grow, well, less than 12 months ago, considerably less than 12 months ago, and uh, look at that. You, you don't get a closer battle than that. If they're like that still, in 12 hours and 30 minutes, then, oh boy, are we going to yeah. have a finish. And this is, you're going to see a little bit of the advantage of having either the first or the last pit stall. Mm -hmm. Because What's he up? will be able to start the service, you know, as you can see right there. And then there's Collado. Well, it's a little bit like a slow zone. The guy who gets in first yes. is going slower. The other guy, guy catches him, but then he's released from it first. And, and in, in terms of the slow zone, that gap should never grow or decrease. And the same with the pit lane here. The fact that the Toyota started work before the Ferrari stops means that the Toyota 
will finish work first, but it will have to get this far, far up the pit lane before we know whether they're ahead or behind. Now, countdown to what? And of course, Is that the fuel count on the on the no, elevator? No, that count was, uh, we saw that count earlier. Yeah, not sure what, not that, sure is. what that is either. Maybe that is fuel. No, there's no. the fuel rig. The, the fuel man has a little readout to tell him how much yep. it has gone in for uh, Troyes. He's on his way, no tires. And there goes the Ferrari because he did not change tires. Wow. They have jumped him. Did the Toyota take tires then? Yes, it yeah, did. It okay. Did. did we see that? Yes, we did. We did. So I'm not saying that then. I'm looking well, at something else. Guy and I saw. All right, there we go. <laughs> so, fresh tires on the Toyota, but advantage Ferrari out of the pit stall. Now, now you would assume. How, how, yeah, how long does that advantage last? Because mm. with those fresh tires, it seems like he's going to eat yep. his lunch take his milk money. Depends how fresh Calado's tires are. If they've only done one stint, they should be relatively good. For the first couple of laps though, Buemi guy will have an advantage. That initial bite, particularly of a Michelin tire, will just give you an extra couple of laps, maybe even three here with that extra little bit of performance as we go again past the Chevy Camaro. Still going though, still going strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All the way up to 24th of uh, 36th overall. And again, a caddy cycles up to the lead of the race. So number three car is in a little bit of a, a zone of its own. One lap off the lead, but one lap ahead of the 93 Peugeot. And then the 93 Peugeot, which is in sixth position, is a further lap ahead of the Glickenhaus duo. And if he can get, if the Cadillac number three Ooh. can get that lap back, then... Yep. And the Kessel car's now moved into the lead of the uh, GT battle. Oh, yeah, so it has. So Project Bond must have stopped recently. PJ yeah. Hyatt's in the car. So yeah. in fact... He's their bronze driver. Yes, that yeah. car has stopped, so... Because uh, Gunnar Jeanette was in it. Okay, so that's driver change there in the last couple of laps. We didn't uh, see that, but that has happened. So PJ doing nighttime laps. You don't have to do nighttime laps. There's no mandation that a, a bronze driver or any other category of driver has to drive at night. And some will not or do very little. And here in the depths of the night, look, prime time, USA time for <laughs> PJ, obviously. But, you know... It, it's part of being part of the team. You don't want to, to feel that somebody else has done all the hard work for you. Um, the other side of it is, you, if you know you cannot be as quick as you want to be or as you need to be in the dark, then it does make sense to allow your teammates to do the work. WRT's Van Sam Vos. Now, so where are they at the moment? Their best car, uh, Louis Delatraz, the 41 car, fourth. is in fourth, and the nine car has just stopped 30 Habsburg's taken over. You saw Sean Galeo, 30 Habsburg's teammate in that car. It's in the LMP2 class, which is being led by Duquesne Engineering's Neil Jarney. That car's had a bit of a, an up and down. Last time I talked about that car, it was skating round a tire wall yeah. in the rain. Number two caddy leads the race. Box this lap, driver change to Richard, keep working the fronts. Keep working the fronts. Now, does that mean there's going to be no tyre change? That's unusual, Guy Smith, for uh, a driver to be told to work the fronts on the way in. Yeah, that is very strange. I, I, on the outlap, for sure, but mm. um, maybe they're going to, well, no, they're going to change drivers, I'd say, if they're going to keep the tyres on, they want to maintain that heat, but. Obviously, doing a driver change, they're going to be changing tyres. So, yeah, that is a strange... You would uh, think. Oh, you, you would think. think. Yeah. So, the gap now between uh, Buemi and... Uh, uh, Collado and uh, Buemi is, what, eight seconds. So, you need to keep an eye on that. Keep pushing, Alex. Keep pushing. We need to try to get the front tyres up. You can do it. 
they're going to keep they're keeping the tires on yeah. when they hand it over to Westy. Now, I think the deal here is that Michelin were telling us that they confidently expect all of the tires to be able easily to triple and comfortably to quad stint. The unspoken underlying thought there was five might well be yeah. on if the conditions are right. I mean, think about this circuit, it's actually not hard on tires. It's, mm. it's not a particularly abrasive circuit. So in terms of doing longer stints, it's not really as much of an issue. It's more of a structural thing um, that they, they may make a call from, yeah, just from a safety point of view. Yeah. So he may have done a double or even a triple on those tires, and they may still be keeping the tires on, but he, yep. they just need him to keep that front tire temperature up. You saw Nicola Pino, Nico Pino, the driver from, if you didn't recognize the flag on his chest, Chile. We don't get many Chilean racing drivers. Uh, he's just showing off, too. He, yeah, it well. Isn't, it isn't bad enough that he's a really good race car driver. He can juggle, too. There's, there's quite a lot there. that goes on. Those, uh, what are the ones with the flashing lights on the board? Oh, yeah. With the, yeah. You know that yeah, the, yeah, of course, the reflex stuff. Yeah, yeah, reflex yeah. Stuff. yeah. yeah. Quite yeah. a lot of that is done yeah. on medicine ball stuff. There was a Tennis time... Tennis balls. That, yes, yeah, exactly, balls, with, with a physio. There was a time uh, during the Jaguar era when Tom Walkinshaw came up with the bright idea of having an exercise bike at the back and getting the guys to do five minutes yeah. sprinting on it to really get the adrenaline we, and the blood pumping. We used to do that at Bentley. We had a... Yeah, yeah same yeah. thing, yeah. 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 Just, to, just to get you... you because even if you haven't been asleep, and even if it's daytime, you know, you just want the body to be absolutely red hot and ready to go. Not in terms of perspiration, but just the blood pumping and the adrenaline up and, yeah. Especially this time of night, you know, you may be a little lethargic and uh, want to get the, uh, yeah, get the blood pumping. Yeah. Is that Arcadian rhythms or some other rhythm? It's Arcadian, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Antediluvian in our case. Five seconds added to the pit stop for the eight car. Ooh. For a pit stop infringement. Now, that's the, the one thing that isn't is speeding in the pit lane. What it may be is a whole host of other things. Not having the earth strap connected correctly, removed too early, um, too many men working on the car, a tire getting loose, a wheel not getting loose, various other little things because the pit stops are quite tightly prescribed. There's no minimum pit stop time. You can be stationary for as long or as short as you want stroke need. But obviously there was some infringement. There are also safety aspects to it, like you must have the guy there with the fire extinguisher, visors must be Ooh. down. Whoa, 51 car, James Collado just outbreaking himself there at the top of the hill into the Dunlop chicane. Sebastian Buemi, how far back? 6.9 seconds. Yeah. 7.3 yeah. seconds. Collado's really honking on. Buemi's yeah. on a fresh set of tyres. And you add that five-second penalty to the number eight car, and uh, it's pretty much uh, mm. even Stevens right now. On board with Sebastian Buemi. So the screen on the top right there alongside the driver mirror, that's part of the car's systems. He will have the onboard safety indicator screen also within the cockpit. In the last lap there, you see that uh, uh, where Buemi was, he did a good time, a 30.3, 30 yeah. Collado 31.9. So he's brought it down a, a whisker, but in two laps, I think two laps since they've been in, Collado's opened up seven seconds. Now, his tyres were absolutely ready to rock and roll and deep into a heat cycle, so they would have been closer to absolute operating temperature than the ones that came out of the tire warmers to go onto the Toyota. But nevertheless, there's Alex Lynn with his Derek Bell liveried helmet. That's what threw me, actually. I'd forgotten that he'd done that. <laughs> um, and then I saw the helmet in a car and I thought, who's that? There's Joe Bradley. Morning, Joe. One of Washington's finer exports. <laughs> No further action regarding the pit stop for car number 50. So certain elements might be examined and then double checked quite often with video mm -hmm. evidence because there are so many security cameras around the circuit. And then, ah, oh, no, OK, that was fine. We've just recounted the heads. They didn't have too many men on the field at the, t at the right time or whatever it was. And so often, often, I think events are reported and then scrutinised then, OK, no, 
no harm, no foul. Hannes Racing's Jot van Oyten in second place ahead of the cool racing car. That's a tight battle on track as well. As 94's battle against the clock continues, trying to get the nose reconnected. Iron Dames now in the lead of uh, GTE. Doing Absolutely. a great job. They're having a great yeah. race. Those pit yep. stops are cycling through. PJ Hart, second place. AF Course is Thomas Floor in third again. Quite a Those number three of... cars have been yeah. swapping through the pit stops as they go. And often from pro driver to uh, bronze driver and back, you'll see uh, a change there. This is why the 94 is in the pit lane, because when you hit things like that, you tend to end up with damage. And unfortunately for Gustavo Menezes, who was going very strongly at that stage, that has dropped them out of the lead three and off the lead lap. And that car is now languishing. Down in 21st place overall, only 11th in hypercar, so out of the points. And how many laps back? It is in danger of dropping eight laps back when the 93 comes around. In fact, it, if it doesn't get out of the pits in the next 10 or 15 seconds, it will lose another lap because the 93 car it just turned into the Porsche curves. I think it's going to lose another lap, which is slightly immaterial because it's never going to get eight or nine back. It doesn't really make much difference. And there are times. Oh, is he just going to come back out? He's going to come out slowly in front of the leader. In fact, he will not lose that extra lap. They've just sent him straight back out. So. There goes the 94 car, and let's check who's in it. Gustavo Menezes is back on the horse that threw him. Hold it. In fairness, he threw. It's amazing, isn't it? That car, when it came in, looked very, very second-hand, and looks yeah, as good as new now. Yep. It's amazing. I mean, and that's, that's the important thing about designing these cars. Again, they need a car that they can repair quickly. Yep. Um, you know, not it's not about just about performance. It's about... Uh, how easy it is to work on the car, how quickly they can, they can fix it in, in those situations and not lose too much time. Because speed on the track is one thing, Guy. Time in the pit lane is what torpedoes yeah. you below the waterline. Absolutely. And, and you look at pretty much every year, the Audi won, the Bentley won, you'll look at the car that had the minimum pit stop time and you can correlate directly with the car that's on the top step of the podium. They're very, very rare that is not the case. Nobody these days has enough of a pace advantage, you can afford to fritter it away by standing still. They see a Molina standing by, waiting for the next pit stop for the 50 car, which is now 10th overall. Historic livery on his helmet as well. That's the extra silver 5-0 that has been applied to his helmet. He hasn't had that in years gone by, so he's got the full uh, Gerhard Berger at uh, Multicolors of Benetton. Remember those days where he changed his helmet colours to the Benetton colours and then reverted later on to the original Austrian red and white. But uh, yeah, Miguel's got a red helmet with a yellow fine and broad stripes that you'll see across the car. And the 50 celebrating well, his, his own car's number, but also 50 years since Ferrari last race at the top class in Le Mans. And Boehm is edging closer to uh, Clado, but he's not making, considering he's on uh, better tyres, he's not making no. massive inroads. He's ch just chipping away probably <laughs> half a second or so a lap. I figured, I, I figured by now he would have caught him. I mean, that's really what we thought when he came out of the pits. But in fact, he hasn't, as uh, Collado, his uh, last lap was a uh, 3.31.9 compared to a 3.33 for 3.30.3 yep. for um, uh, Buemi. And we see Molina there. He's obviously ready to get in. So the next time the Ferrari comes in, it will be a driver change, obviously tires and fuel. And this is one of the things that uh, robs drivers of sleep and rest is that when you're in the car, you're in the car. When you're out of the car, you're not always off duty because the driver that's coming out will go for a rest, but the driver that's due to be in will need to be in the garage, suited and booted, as the car leaves, mm -hmm. because it might come back in at the yep. end of that lap with a major problem for the driver. And you don't then want to be running out the back and waking somebody up. No. So you're two driver stint out of the car becomes a one driver mm -hmm. session out of the car and yep. for the other stint that you're not in it 
you're sitting around. And again, in the wee small hours, that's where all the energy levels sort of sag. So standing around and chatting to people and looking at the data and following the race and all the other stuff that tries to keep you occupied and alert is, is, is part of the unseen battle of, of being on your on top of your game when you get into the car. Exactly, exactly. You see, they're, they're ready for a pit stop quite shortly, which seems quite short to me since it was last in, I don't... Well, it's the 50 car was in... Uh... Ah, he's in the... He's in the he's yeah. On the, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah. Uh, 3.01. Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't necessarily in at 3.01, but that is why... Uh, that is the last time we had a report from Ferrari and what had happened at their stop, and... Uh, Luca, their PR guy, and his cohorts are generally pretty quick. You normally find that when they're within a lap or so of the car coming in, uh, what was being done. On the other side of that coin, Toyota, when you ask them what tyres the car on, they'll say Michelin. So <laughs> there, there, there are ways of, uh, of running the information to, to the broadcasters, and there are ways of running information to the broadcasters. Um, <laughs> some WhatsApp groups are more useful than others. It's always interesting to find the uh, people's positions when they want to go to sleep. They'll sleep yes. anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Corvette teams seem to be habitual hoggers of uh, evening photography and, and limelight <laughs> for, for the antics they get up to. Yep. And, and none of that's gone away, whether they're in GTE Pro running their own cars or in GTM running the car for... Uh, uh, ben, who remains in the car, in the 33 car, Ben Keating, that car had a number of problems early on, very early on in the race, came in with what they suspect was a, a defunct damper on the left front corner, and has not had the rub of the green so far, that car down in ninth, ninth place in class. Worked its way back to ninth, it mm. was much further down than yeah. that at one point. Yeah. Well, There's one... Mike Rockefeller in the NASCAR Camaro, number 24. Just that, uh, you'll recognize that sound anywhere. It's funny when you are on board with the Cadillac, how you don't get the V8 rumble that you get, you get from it as it goes by you when you're on the spectator banking. It's a whole different sound inside to what it leaves behind it. And it's, it, it isn't, it's got a deeper rumble mm. in the car than the Camaro does, and a lot of that is due to the header configuration. Uh, the Cadillac header configuration is different than, than the NASCAR header configuration, and guys used to play with that a lot, and you, would, you could hear the tone of the engine, and you knew who was messing with their, with their, uh, <laughs> with their, with their uh, exhaust. Well, the, uh, the tuning, other factor, and that's of course, what they were doing. They were literally tuning the exhaust to uh, help with the horsepower. Load. The, the other factor, particularly for the drivers, is that when you're sitting in the Camaro, you're driving into the noise. When you're sitting yeah. in the Cadillac, you're leaving it you're behind leaving you. It behind you. Because the right. Camaro's engine is in front of your feet, and the Cadillac's is behind your ear holes. So, yeah, um, the noise gets channeled around you, and. Fortunately for the drivers, it's a relatively cool race compared to the week or weeks yes. that we've had before here. Uh, so the temperatures of daytime highs have been in the very high 20s, early 30s since we arrived a week and 10 days ago, um, up until, literally up until today, yesterday, mm -hmm. Saturday. So uh, there was a little bit of a cool down on Friday, but otherwise cockpit temperatures would be in the 50s in that Camaro, 60s maybe. Mm. I mean, Jim, you and I can think back to uh, French engines, Corvettes and Vipers in yeah. the American Le Mans series in the early years there, where cockpit temperatures would be close on 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, close. And, uh, used yeah. To, used to melt, the, melt your boots, drivers right. would, would... Exactly, have, yeah. <laughs> Exactly so. Special boots. Remember racing Labor Day weekend in Las Vegas? Mm -hmm. And uh, guys like Ron Fellows using asbestos insulated NASCAR boots with asbestos insulation lining that you normally put on the engine bay inside those as well. And, yeah. Right. yeah, feet in buckets of water, lots of problems with core temperature. And we won't have that here, hopefully, this weekend. It's uh, a little bit 
of respite for the drivers and the fans. The downside of which is that it has been a, a degree of rain and that's monkeyed with a few races. Uh, you remember the Texas event mm. where, uh, where we raced in Dallas on the Roval and that was insufferably hot. That yep. was unbelievable. There were, there were a few, there were a few. So we just had a, a slower lap from uh, Buemi a lap or two ago, maybe just caught some heavy traffic, but that's meant the gap now has gone to uh, just slightly over eight seconds. So it's... Uh... Paul, Paul Truswell, the Radio Le Mans stats guru and, and uh, a team manager, as it turns out, for a number yep. of uh, yep. uh, particularly Nürburgring 24-hour teams. And all-around great guy. And all-around great guy. Always had a theory right from day one that at night, cars exhibit group magnetism. They clump. And, and actually, if you look at the tracker map we've got, there are several clumps of cars. That's right. You've got, as I'm not telling you anything you don't know, Guy, at night you've got less long-range vision than you would do during the day because the lights just can't pierce that far. So it makes it a little bit harder to judge all the distances and mm -hmm. to figure out where you're going to catch the cars. And so as a result, you spend, oh, leader is in, in GTE and the Iron Dames car, Rahul Frey is out, and who is going in? Is that Sarah Bovey? I just trying to identify probably, the helmet. I believe it probably is. I think, I think it been, is as well. Yeah. It's been. I think it's almost as the graphic says. Yeah. Frey, then Bovey, then Gatling. Because yeah. earlier Bovey was in the car, and then she turned over to Gatling. Yeah. Pit stop for car number three is under investigation. That's the Cadillac with uh, Dixon. Okay. So Rahel Fry is their top-rated driver. She's a, a gold driver. Michelle Gatting, silver. And the bronze in the team is Sarah Bovey. She's had some great qualifying battles with Ben Keating. They tend to be the pair. And it was really disappointing, actually, that none of the Porsches got mm. through into Hyperpol, and particularly that this one didn't, because Sarah Bovey has got great speed. Ben Keating's got great speed as a bronze driver. Uh, Paul Dallalana was always a, yep. a really strong bronze driver. There are some very quick bronze drivers, and uh, she is definitely among them. She is in the car now. So Charlie Eastwood cycles, uh, oh no, it's PJ Hyatt cycles back to the top of the pile. Project 1AO, the dinosaur car, Rexy. ORT, Oman Racing Team by TF. Charlie Eastwood in that car, he's in second. Thomas Floor in third in the 54 AF Corsa car. It is Vistajet uh, um, firm sponsors. And Scott Huffaker in the 57 Kessel Racing Ferrari. Which of the two is that? Is that Battle Cats or the Yellow Car Guy car? It's the Yellow it's Car the Guy yellow car, guy car. car that he yep. shares with Takeshi Kimura. And that cycles Sarah Bovey down to sixth position in uh, fifth position in GGE Am ahead of Ben Barker the tallest driver in AM in the GR racing car. That, if you're on the outside of the circuit, is black with their traditional yeah, matte yes. black and uh, an orange stripe. But if you're on the inside of the circuit, is the colors that they <coughs> ra raced in when they weren't GR, but when they were golf racing. Uh, so it's got the blue and orange or something very, very close to the blue and orange. TKR Engineering ready for another pit stop. Hugo de Vilda will take over. This is uh, an all-Belgian lineup in the car. And they had, uh, they've had a trying time, haven't they? I'm going to have to flick, they to, sure page, have. They have have to, flick to page two of the timing screen to find how trying their day has been. They're flicking the wrong way, so I've gone back to the live there feed. There we go. Eventually... DKR, our second from last running car, is the Inter Europol car, Jan Magnussen, the 32 car. That seems to be still stuck in the garage. That car, mm. getting on for an hour ago, yeah. was in that two car. It was. It, it had, a, had a weird kind of crash going to the first mm. chicane. It kind of. It looked like as he was braking, the car turned sort of sharp left yeah. and uh, head into the barriers. So. I hope they've got that car back to the pits, but I'm not sure whether they'll be able to get it back on track or not. 
race leader behind one of the two cool racing LMP2 cars. And in front of him, that is the ORT by TF Aston Martin. Charlie Eastwood currently in second place in GTE Am. So as we track up the road with James Collado, we will find out just how far ahead Charlie Eastwood is. And the next set of lights at the chicane would be the Porsche of Charlie Eastwood, I think. Struggling to get... This isn't actually a cool racing car, is it? No, I, I don't think Originally it is. that was grey, but it's I think not. That might be the Jota car. Is that the Jota 28? I think you're right. Yes, it is. Yep. Good spot, Guy Smith. See the mechanics warming up. Mm. We've seen it habitually with the Toyota mechanics doing their... Uh, Japanese calisthenics, but these guys, everybody seems to be doing just a little bit. And actually, I have to say, looks like he's going to rave. Actually, the uh, the Henrik Motorsport guys, all their brake men at the start of the morning, they're at the top end. They're at pit out. Their their morning warm up is as a as a group yep. to sprint down to pit in, mm -hmm. turn and sprint back. Now that's yep. the length of at least two, probably three football fields. Yep. Then they turn and go again. And then they, then they feel they're loosened up, ready yep. for the day, whatever the day may bring. That, that's not immediately pit stop practice. That's just to get them into the field. And Jim, you were saying that uh, particularly in the NASCAR Cup Series, in the top tier, their pit guys, their over-the-wall guys, will tend to be Division One or college football players, basketball players, track athletes, you know, big power yep. and strength athletes. They're yep. not just guys who put the car together and then do the, the, the wheel changing as part of their job. They have a specific talent and that, that is it, their speed and their power. Yeah, and it's not, it used to be, it was just an extra set of mechanics who did the pit stops. And in this case, they are guys who, that's all they do all week yep. is practice pit stops. They're just like any professional sports team. Yep. They have practice sessions, they have workouts, they have film sessions where they dissect all the pit stops uh, from the previous week's races. They have data points. They all wear GoPros during the pit stop so they can analyze their uh, their technique. And yeah, it has become a, a, a real science. It's not just the, I can remember the, the video of the old days, the Wood Brothers with a with a bolt between their teeth with all the extra lug nuts when it, when it was the yeah. five lug nuts. And the, yeah. you know, it was a revelation when they got the air guns and uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's come a long way, baby, I can tell you that much. Yeah, and the same way that we see tens of seconds, hundreds of seconds being fought for in the pit lane in Formula One, same two in the NASCAR Cup Series, even though the races are considerably longer. And, and without uh, seven guys on each tire. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, over the wall numbers are severely restricted. Yep. That means that, uh, as, as with everything, in, in this sport, choreography of how you do things, and teams spend ages, as you said, dissecting what they do and yep. trying to find a way to make themselves better. And actually, this is the introduction, was it a couple of years ago, three years ago, of the uh, pit stop challenge for the teams? It didn't happen during COVID, but it was introduced before and then uh, uh, exhumed and, and uh, restarted. It's a real matter of pride for the teams to be able to win the pit stop challenge, to be cock of the walk for the entire week of Le Mans as a crew. <laughs> never mind what your drivers, your car can do. We are the best tire change team in the business. Yep. That's pretty impressive. And, and that was won, I believe, this week by the Peugeot guys. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure which car it was, but um, it might have been the 93, but yeah, yeah. Great, uh, great effort by those boys. Definitely. Yeah, somebody has got something plugged into somewhere and it's giving us an awful, an awful earth hum. I have a feeling, Jim, that might be your phone's charger. If you put it down... No, maybe not. Something is, definitely. I don't, I don't know if you can hear it at home, but we can hear it Is here. it your computer? I'm not sure. No? No, because it hasn't been anywhere, and that computer's been there all day. Into... Uh, so is that Charlie Eastwood coming into the pit lane? No, but it looks like we might, maybe not quite ready for some changes yet. It was Charlie Eastwood coming into the pit lane. I, hadn't, <laughs> uh, I sort of half Terrible. glimpsed it and then half imagined it. There's a Glickenhaus in as well. Esteban Gutierrez has brought in car 709.
quick clean of the lights to make sure that there's nothing that uh, the race officials can complain about in terms of lack of visibility of lights or numbers or anything else. And also, like your road car, when you're driving on roads that have been wet and are drying, there's an awful, awful lot oh, of grime yeah. being thrown up. Um, and that's exaggerated here because this is not a race circuit, this is public road with a bit of race circuit attached. So exactly like your road car, because that's what use these roads for the other 51 weeks of the year. These are public highways. The chicanes have been added in. You don't come round this bit in your normal road car, but you use the rest of it. And oh. you, you find that the road as well, on each side of the, the white line down the middle, because if you've got trucks and yeah. cars going each day, the road actually gets slightly worn away. So as you can see, we're on this side of the white line. And as we go down here, you'll, you'll cross over to the other side. Um, and when you make that cross, that transition, you can actually feel no. the car just mm. just touching the bottom of the uh, of the road. Well, the um, same way you make that cross, that transition, you can actually feel no. the car just mm. just touching the bottom of the uh, of the road. Well, the no. same way you feel it on, on any basically. normal road. Yeah, you exactly. just get the little depressions. They they might only be a couple of centimeters or an inch deep. But if you think about where the water stays in the chicanes, that's where it stays. It yep. stays in those little channels. And so when you're coming and starting to turn in across them, then you end up sort of skating a little further into the corner than you want, and suddenly your grip is gone and you're in the barriers. And yeah. well, how did that happen? I didn't even touch the curbs. You don't have to sometimes touch the curbs to find the water. And when you find, uh, when you leave the pits with brand new tires that still come up to temperature and up to pressure and full tank, so you've got a heavy car, you've got tires that aren't quite up to temperature and pressure yet, that's when you really feel it. So the car will bottom under braking, the, the car will touch um, for the first couple of laps until you get uh, everything up to temperature. A couple of things with the number eight Toyota car. The pit stop infringement was not all mechanics were back behind the white line ah, before, before the engine was started. So again, it's those tiny little bits of choreography that let you down. Um, and, that's, and that's rare for, for Toyota. That, yeah. you know, and yeah. that's why now we're seeing them under some pressure um, and making those small mistakes, which is, which is, you know, Good to see that they're under that, feeling that pressure as well. Well, I think, yep. for, I think for the first time with this car in the hypercar category, Toyota really having to extend the car to its absolute maximum, which yep. they didn't have to do with just Glickenhaus and Alpine against them last year. Glickenhaus didn't quite have the performance to really put them under the cudgels, and the Alpine didn't have a big enough fuel tank to be able to match them on distance on fuel, even if it could match them on pace. So it was always going to be hamstrung, and, and, and that was part of the deal. The other thing that happened in that number eight Toyota stop was that there was four new tyres for Sebastian Buemi. The previous set had only been on for one stint. So there was clearly something he didn't like about the balance of those tyres. Alpha 9-2, Alpha 9-2 for 12 lap target. Oh, now then, what? Mm. For a 12 lap target? That's not fuel saving. That's what we were told was likely to be a bare minimum hypercar stint. Hmm. So now, does that mean that gives him more attack because they're not going to try and fuel save? And has that been what they've tried to do early in the stint and then gone, OK, that's not happening. We're not saving enough. OK, right, just go for him. We're going to have to try and reset and do that again in the next stint. Ben Keating staying in for a triple stint in the 33 car, saying he felt pretty good about it. That was 20 minutes ago. Doing so, a lot of things that the gentleman driver does not normally do. Man, he can pedal Triple a race stint car. the night, put the car on pole with just stunning laps. And he's super fit. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, he, tra oh, he yeah. trains hard and he's, <laughs> he's driving lots of different cars. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, he trains like a pro. Yeah. And um, he drives like a pro. Yes, he really does. And actually, when we had, uh, when we were talking about him a little bit earlier, John Doonan, I, I always let myself down because I always forget to do stat check on Ben Keating before every race just to make sure that I've got the correct number of dealerships because he'll always correct me and uh, <laughs> the correct number of 
uh, different franchises that he handles. John Doona was saying 27 dealerships. Yep. I mean, uh, and, 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 and that, cha that changed. Across the wide spectrum of... Yeah, pretty much at, every... At one point, he was the largest uh, Viper dealer yeah. in, the, in the world. And again, that's when he came back to Le Mans in the GT class mm -hmm. with the SRT10. And, uh, and then wins with the Ford. One with wins with the Ford. And then uh, that was disallowed because of uh, a technicality infringement on fuel tankage. So you can see Buemi now closed up on the back of the uh, Ferrari with... Um, and Clado um, has got a stack of GT cars ahead of him going to the Porsche corners. So this could get really quite exciting. That does sound a little bit like he's been told to hurry up. We can't go around yeah. here all afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to get the lap on fuel that we were trying to creep out. So, yeah, time to time to get on it and, and hassle the Ferrari a little bit. Yeah. yeah when we Press just... them into a mistake, perhaps. Yeah, he doesn't seem really happy with his car. He's, he's been playing around, as mm. said before, with the, with the roll bars, and he just doesn't seem... I think they maybe thought with the new tyres that might yeah. fix it but he still seems to be just not quite, yeah, fully happy. Buemi not quite fully happy is that he's a sort of constant at Toyota, but the other thing is that the racetrack is evolving all the time. Yes. It's gone dry to wet, and then all it takes forever to get back to dry, then it went wet again and forever to get back to dry. And it is doing that. You know, we talked a little bit about the, the Peugeot going off because there's still wet patches, so they're still adjusting the balance of the car lap by lap, maybe even sector by sector, to take into account the fact he'll go, oh, oh, there was more grip there. I, I brake too early. So now they're going to start, you know, harvesting a little more, or uh, they, you can put a bit more front brake onto it, or a bit less front brake onto it, whatever, to try and balance the car against the prevailing conditions. Kaz Nakajima there in the back of the shot. He is the team manager for Toyota Gazoo Racing's endurance crew. And Kazuki Nakajima, although still a driver, although no longer a driver in this race because the car's been retired, is the team principal. Well, here is the race leader, James Collado. No longer, there's a change. Okay, man, so this will be your last time lap. This will be your last time. All right, so we're getting to the end of the stint, and that's what Alpha 12 means. It has uh, released Sebastian Buemi, and as we cut to him, James Collado was passed for the lead of the race by the number eight Toyota. But you can see his replacement is in the garage. So basically in that stint, what Buemi did was just return the order to what it was when they would made their original pit stop. And they took tires and the Ferrari didn't, so he yep. lost the lead. So it took him a whole stint to get that lead back. And remember, buemi has got a five-second penalty. That's yep. right. On the yep. next pit stop. They'll have to serve on this next pit stop. Quick in and out for the number five Porsche Penske Motorsport 963. Dane Cameron remains at the wheel of that car. That was fuel and go. Philippe Leloup there on the right-hand side. Spent a lot of time racing GT cars with Ugo Schonach when he was running the Viper program. And has been uh, part of his LMP2 and, uh, and LMP1 programs before moving full-time to Toyota. So much knowledge among these different teams over so many years. And that's one of Toyota's really big weapons in its armory is that consistency of being in this championship and racing at Le Mans. Whereas Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, the rest are relatively new. Okay, so Brendan is connected to radio. Any advice for Brendan? Any advice for Brendan? There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's Stay on the gray stuff, son. <laughs> don't don't get out in the don't get out in the dark stuff because uh, especially in the first chicane. So still, even you know, 45 minutes later. Yep. It's yep. still not it's not drying there. Gray good, green bad. <laughs> That is correct. That is correct. Stay out. 
OK, now that will have been somewhere on the way down to Indianapolis, probably. Mm -hmm. OK, let me just double check what you said. He said, this will be your last timed lap. So you want me to do one more lap? Yes, stay out. Wemi trying to build as much of a gap yeah. as he can before the pit stops. Well, because like you said, he has that five second penalty. Trying to recognize the helmet of who was sitting in the garage, but uh, the penny didn't drop. I don't think it was Alessandro Pierre Guidi ready to take over the 51 Is car. It Giovinazzi? I think it was. I think it was Antonio Giovinazzi. And Buemi's really pulled, since he's passing, yeah. he's pulled out a big chunk of time. Well, don't forget, he's on tyres that haven't done a stint yet, whereas Calado's have yeah. certainly done at least two while I've been in here and may well be on their third, mm -hmm. conceivably, possibly, on their fourth. And interesting that the last set of tyres on the Toyota only did a stint. Yeah. And whether or not they had tried something with the medium and went, OK, that's not working. We'll keep them in the locker for when it gets a little bit warmer during the day. We need the softs. Or whether it's something else, who knows. Image box the slap box the slap driver change driver change. So Brendan Hartley will be getting into the number eight car in place of Sebastian Buemi. Mm -hmm. And James Collado will be turning over, we think. Okay, Seb, great job. Box this lap, pit confirm. Box this lap, driver change for Brendan. And the penalty, don't forget the penalty. Okay, well, he doesn't have to forget about the penalty. He's getting out of the car. He's just going to hand over the penalty to Brendan. And actually, predominantly, it's the team's job to remember the penalty because the lollipop man will have to remember not to remove the lollipop. That is the signal for the driver well, to go. Do but they serve the penalty at the beginning of the stop or the end of the stop? Doesn't make any difference. He's going to park the car and get out. Okay. Okay. doesn't make any difference. You'll do it at the end. You'll stop the yeah, car, yeah. do fuel, do tyres, and then when you're ready to go, then you sit for a further five seconds. Okay. Then it's clear that that's been the way it's done. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because in the States, it's exactly the opposite. You can't start to do anything until, until you've you sat for five seconds yeah. because then it is certain that you, yeah. that mm -hmm. you have done it. Well, then, it's, then particularly it's certain for the team that you've done it and, and then you're not creeping an inch here and a, and a second there. That might be a, a more sensible way of doing it. I think, I think the habitual way this side of the Atlantic, guys, that you, you do the pit stop and then you serve the penalty afterwards. Would that be the way you'd have, you'd have done it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I see, for the officials, I can see it makes a lot of sense. Boom, stop. Tick, don't tick, do tick, tick, yep. tick. Now okay, go. go. Yeah. And each of these cars will have a, an, an ACO or FIA official with yep. them, an ACO official with them. There are FIA and WC officials in the pit lane as well, but there will be a pit marshal with each of the cars, and they report on every time the car comes in what it's done, how long it was there and so on and so forth. So they will be informed by their head of station, five second penalty for this car, make sure it's served. So here they come, here comes the eight car. Hopefully yeah. we'll stay with it long enough to find out just what's gonna happen. Uh, looks like the they're, pits. yeah, looks like they're gonna serve the five seconds and yeah. then work on the car. Hard to tell, because of course the fuel man comes in out of our sight from yeah, the left-hand side fine. as the driver sees it, or doesn't see it because it's behind him. Driver change. Brendan Hartley gets in. Driver change. It will be Antonio Giovinazzi in the 51 car. Now, you would assume that that car will take fresh tyres. Cleaning of mirrors, cleaning of windshields, cleaning of lights, polishing everything in sight apart from the bodywork. And because of the penalty, this is almost a free tire change, yep. time-wise, for the Ferrari. Well, it means they don't have to super stress about it. They will do it in their oh, standard yeah. routine, because if you try and slow down, then you will likely make a mistake. No tire change, I don't think, for Brendan Hartley. Of course, we didn't see it, but that will check how long it took when they leave the pit lane, and then remember to subtract five seconds and not get overexcited. But they were slow in the pit lane. Richard Westbrook leads the race for Cadillac. 
in the number two car. That will be due in on the next lap, if all things being equal. Uh, 1 minute 22, so including the five second pit stop, I don't think that was enough time for a tyre change. No, I, don't, I agree with you. And out comes Antonio Giovinazzi, 1 minute 22. That was a driver and well, tyre change. Remember, they changed Boemi's tyres on the last pit yep. stop. So. Yep. I would have been surprised yep. if for a second stint they took tyres off after one stint. There's James Collado, as relaxed and smiley as I think I've ever seen him this week, just loving his life in the Ferrari hypercar. And he said, up until now, it's felt like a more powerful and heavier GT car, basically. He said, here, from the first moment you got it out on track, it's a totally different animal. It just came alive. So you know, just from that comment, that this is what it was bred to do. The rest of it, as Paul Newman might have said, is just waiting around. That's right. <laughs> It wasn't, uh, wasn't Paul Newman, it, yeah, it, it would uh, have been uh, Steve McQueen, it wasn't well, Steve Newman McQueen. Newman might have said it. But... Uh, <laughs> Newman might have said it, but he wouldn't have used a line from somebody else's movie. Uh, it, it was the Steve McQueen line, his character in Le Mans. Racing is life, anything before or after is just waiting. We're talking about Paul Newman, Newman did get to race here. Yes, he Steve did. McQueen did not. He was desperate to race in the 1970 film, but the studio would not allow it. And uh, Paul Newman somehow managed to get that one by A, his wife, and I'm not <laughs> sure how that happened, and B, uh, any uh, studio exec. She was quite supportive of his, yeah. of his racing. Yeah. Well, yeah, doing SECA runoffs or doing, doing an IMSA race here or there, one thing, Le Mans, with Dick Barber, that's a whole different thing. And that car <laughs> finished second overall. Uh -huh. And but for a couple of changes of luck, Paul yeah. Newman yeah. might have won Le Mans in real life. Yep, yeah. so changes of luck and a, uh, a baguette with a... Uh, a belt. A belt in it. Yeah. The story of that is that the Whittington brothers, uh, their car spat off a an alternator belt. Yep. Which of the Whittingtons was in the car? Not uh, Dick. No. <laughs> he was, that's a whole different story. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was Don. Don. Okay, so it was Bill and Don Whittington, the brothers. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, their 935 spat off a belt and initially, did, sorry, well, you didn't it, say Bill or Don? Don. 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 Don tried to then fit the power steering belt, yep. which immediately broke as soon as he tried to fire up the engine. So he was kind of, the deal then now was... Now he's down two belts. <clears throat> the deal was then you could be assisted from outside verbally, uh, but you had to fix the car with anything that was carried with, Everything. only with things that were carried on board. So all, all the tools, all the parts had to be on board the car. Exactly yeah. so. So after a while of trying to fix this and having very little luck, obviously because you can't manufacture a belt at the side of the road, uh, the team prevailed upon the marshals to say, look, it's really hot and he's been driving a racing car and he needs to drink something. So we brought these bottles of water. We brought him a sandwich because he's going to be here for a while. So they handed him the water and the big baguette through the fence. And inside one of the big baguettes was a belt and inside the other big baguette was a belt. So he didn't get ham and cheese. He did get two drive belts. Actually, a actually it was only one. He got the belt that he needed right. to get the car back to the pit, which go. was the alternator. And then they changed all the belts when go. they got to the pit stop. So, so it's, uh, yeah, things happened in life. The baguette that won Le Mans. <laughs> yeah. And so, tonight, Paul Newman, uh, a sensational story. So Hartley's still ahead of uh, Giovinazzi mm -hmm. by 12 seconds. Now that's yeah. quite a margin. That yeah. gap is growing yeah. by, by the sector. So Hartley's tires are stint old. Giovinazzi's are brand new. Okay. I'll have to ask Strangy about that particular message. Obviously, he's a member of their crew. <laughs> I couldn't quite see on the picture. That sort of very Little slightly, yeah. very slightly looked to me like a man on a motorcycle. Or, or, or a man with a big, like, Green Bay G on his chest. Could it? 
Richards, yeah. It couldn't be that he's racing somewhere like the Isle of Man instead of being here. Mm. I, can't Im I can't imagine yeah. that that would be a thing. However, see if, uh, see if Simon Strang can uh, shed a little light on that. In a bit is the Battle Cats Ferrari. This is the other one of the Kessel Racing cars. <laughs> Uh, and this car is, oh, I'm looking on the, oh no, there it is. Uh, so it's Na Naoki Yokozimo, who I believe is Mr. Battlecats, or at least yep. he is the man who is the game designer. Battlecats, you'll know this guy, because you're of, uh, of a much younger vintage than me and Jim. Uh, 800 million downloads or, yes, or I heard something. That. I mean, I heard, an, yeah. an absolutely astonishing number of downloads of that game. Obviously, I'm going to have to go and have a look now to see what it's all about. Uh, I think I will probably tire of it fairly quickly, as I do most electronic things. But, uh, yeah, and, 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 and obviously he's... Somehow a good Ken Follett novel never, I never tire <laughs> of, but electronic things I do. But that's, that is the history of Battle Cats, so that is, uh, that's where Battle Cats comes from. Looking on the screen at our overall leaderboard, Richard Westbrook leading in the number two Cadillac from Brendan Hartley, who is definitely distancing himself in the number eight Toyota from the 51 Ferrari of Antonio Giovinazzi. Andre Lotterer, freshly into the number six uh, Porsche. And I was going to talk about that a couple of minutes ago. We got distracted by something else. Lotterer just set the fastest first sector of the race in that car about five, uh, maybe three laps ago. Mm -hmm. In is the number two Caddy. And again, it's a lap later into the pits than our lead duo. You just saw a glimpse of the sort of double helix 100th anniversary trophy here at Le Mans. The standard Le Mans 24-hour trophy that we're used to seeing with the four pillars and the big number 24 on the top. I think those will also be presented to the other winners, but for the outright winning car and team of the centenary Le Mans, that unique trophy will be presented. And clearly, next year, in the 101st anniversary, <laughs> it's no longer the right trophy. So uh, it will be once and once only. And clearly, at this stage as well, Jim, somebody somewhere is thinking about a design for the trophy that will be presented to whoever wins the 100th running. race. That's right. This is the 91st running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So in nine years' time, all things being equal, and with a following wind, we might be here <laughs> to witness who wins race number 100. And that will be a fairly epic deal. Who won the 100th Indy 500? That would have been Alexander Rossi. That was Alexander Rossi, wasn't that? I was, I, that, was, that was where I was venturing, and I couldn't quite recall whether it was or not. Yep. In, an, in the Andretti Motorsports. Yeah. Michael could never win it, uh, unfortunately, even though he had, he, he had more than enough talent to win that race. He just didn't have enough luck to win that race. Well, Indy 500 and and Andretti family luck is a long, long yep. saga. Most Dude. famous words to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Trouble? For Mario and yeah, although Mario did win it in uh, 1969. AMR, the former Northwest AMR car, still entered as Northwest AMR. Paul Dallalana's business. Dallalana had to withdraw a week before the race in Spa, not just from Spa, but from the rest of the season. Checks time 4:22 in their garage, 4:22 in the studio clock. We're, we're aligned there. Mm -hmm. uh, because of overwhelming pressure of business. Um, and again, we talked about Ben Keating and somehow fitting in, you know, riding 50 miles a day yeah. on his bicycle to stay fit and running all the dealerships and traveling around the world and across the US because he doesn't just do the WEC races in the Mon, he also does, does the whole IMSA yeah. WeatherTech series in two classes. So, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy schedule. And he's, he's probably, getting up towards Roger Penske levels of, of uh, hard work and input there. Still about 30 years behind Roger Penske. I was just going to say. <laughs> comfortably 20. Yeah, yeah. Comfortably 20 uh, years well, behind Roger. Um, Roger, I think, is 89. 
he's 89 now. Wow, See, I, I still think he's yeah. early 80s. Yep, I need to. Because, you know, no, he's not <laughs> early 80s. <He's> <laughs> 89 years old, and he's, uh, you know, all the youth of a, an 88 year old, all the youth of, of a, a 50 year old still. Ridiculous work rate the man puts in. And I really, was really interested to see him in the garage. Knows the name of just about everybody. Now, when you consider the number I'm of sorry. businesses, he'll be, he'll be, eight, he'll be he, he just turned 86 in February. So, what does he have? Like five businesses for every year he's been alive? I think so. Yes. Something like that. Yep. I mean, in the UK, he runs a, a, a string of, of different car franchises. Uh, I Volvo believe he U is the Volvo largest UK? car dealer in the world. I yeah. think he yeah. has the more dealerships than anybody yeah. else. Volvo UK, for instance, that's a Penske company. Wow. Is it really? Yeah. Gu Hall, that's a Penske company. Yeah. I mean, there are things that don't have Penske above the door. That's certainly our Still Penske, Penske company. company. Yeah. Guy I know Rob boots. Dyson was the same way. Rob yeah. had, you know, I can remember being out there. Well, you, you know about Rob. I mean, <laughs> I can't. We, yeah, were, we, we, we all know Rob, yeah. Dyson, Rob Dyson. Yeah, we were uh, we were in Sonoma, and we were going to go the next week to, or we were in Monterey going the next week to Sonoma and back-to-backs. And he asked me, he says, what are you doing between yeah, races? Not. That's a replay of the 94 Peugeot crashing about an hour ago. And I said, I'm just, just going to hang around. And he says, well, I've got this, uh, we make manufacture airplane seats in Seattle. Have you ever been to Seattle? We're going to fly up there. I'll take, take you up on the jet if you want to go with us. <laughs> wow. You own a what and where? <laughs> you know? He's great. I thought you were an upstate New York guy, you know. And yeah, no. He's, Ro Roger Penske's is everywhere. Roger Penske's right-hand man retired about a decade ago because he couldn't keep up with the workload. Because right. he'd said, Roger would say <laughs> things like, oh, we've got a, a lunch meeting with uh, with Denso. We, we need to talk to them about alternates or whatever. And, oh, right, okay. When are they coming in? Oh, no, we need to get on the jet. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah, yeah we're, going, we're going to Japan. <laughs> we're going to Tokyo for lunch. Okay, it'll be lunch tomorrow by the time we get there, or yesterday, or some yeah. such. But, but yeah, I mean, and, he, and he was just saying, and that would happen you know, once or twice a week. You'd be not across the States, but across the, the world. world somewhere for a meeting, because that's how he does business, the old-fashioned way, hand-to-hand. -hand, yep, face-to-face. Yeah. Face face. Face. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No, no Zoom calls here. Yeah. Well, I guess for some for some while he will have had to have Zoom called everybody the same as the rest of the world did. But yeah, he's. Uh, this is the battle for second place in LMP2, 47 car cool racing. Trackies. Rashad de Gruz and Louis Delatran's going at it. Delatran's in the 41 dry, car, isn't it? Because yeah. you've got all these battles going on. Uh, Iron Dame's Sarah Bovey has just set the fastest first sector of the race for her car in second place in GTE Am on this current lap. Mm. So now it's been a while since it's rained, and that's a good thing, devoutly that to be wished that it stays dry at least for another while, because normally when the showers have come in this race, it has produced carnage, and we've lost half a dozen cars. But, you, know what's, uh, you know what's slipped by us? Midnight? Halfway. Yes, halfway. <laughs> it has, actually. Not midnight, but halfway. Half an hour ago, it was 4 o'clock Central European summertime, and halfway through the 24 hours of Le Mans. And Harley now is still pulling away from Givenazzi. It's up to 17 seconds, so he's definitely wow. got the advantage. Well, Brendan Hartley, particularly this season, has been just a little step above in the number eight Toyota, has uh, really, really been driving out of his skin. I agree with you. I think he's, and he's probably, of that driving trio, is probably, I would dare say on the world stage, probably more underrated than, than the others. He's very quiet. I mean, not, yeah, to be fair, yeah he lets his foot do the talk. He does, he does. Yeah, not at all a superstar-y driver. His wife and his uh, little baby, uh, she's no page. longer a daughter, her toddler daughter are here as well. Yeah, just she stole hearts at uh, the Passage. Yeah, right. uh, and, right. and running around with a little gazoo well. flag <laughs> and just, yeah. and, and, I, and I, Brendan's wife was, you know, I was, we were talking and I says, well, there's no denying that child because her hair is just like his. <laughs> it was everywhere. <laughs> 
first met him when he was racing in two litre Formula Renault, one of the uh, armada of young Red Bull drivers. Mm. His history with that team went up and down, or with, with Red Bull went up and down, but... Uh, That's a story for a lot of uh, yeah, Red Bull drivers. Yeah, but he... Where dreams remains, go to die, I think. He then joined... As much um, of a talent as he was then. Murphy Prototypes. Yep, yep. That was his break into sports car racing. Yep. Small, small little team, yep. but... Uh, did a great job. It was, it, it, but it was his first race here, wasn't it, with Murphy? Yeah, I think he was, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Him, yeah. Mike Conway. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah, a bunch of other guys. And in fact, Murphy prototypes disappeared from World Endurance and, and from the from Le Mans 24 hours for a few seasons, but they are back. Road Murphy to Le Mans. were racing, yeah, you yeah. were racing against yeah. them, Road to Le Mans. So, I, and that's great because that was always such a, a fun team and, you know, it was small, Never hugely funded, but just got the job done in such a great spirit. And and again, yeah, did find, you know, drivers who were maybe at a crossroads or, or a little bit, you know, had been neglected or forgotten. Well, you know, Karun Chunduk yep. produced some mm -hmm. great drives in that team as well. Evening, Karun. I, uh, he apparently has dipped into yes. the pocket for 9.99. He was, ah. he, uh, he was, uh, he was messaging Ant earlier, going, how come I'm not hearing you? And he said, well, that's because I guess you haven't paid for that. So I'm not paying money to listen to you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I do that every time we go to the pub. Oh, <laughs> Apparently, Anthony's pockets, according to Karun, are longer than his arms, very much in an Alan McNish style. <laughs> Evening, Alan. Uh, so, yeah, so, but, but then he, uh, he was messaging earlier, so, and clearly he'd heard what we'd seen before uh, we moved uh, in to take over from the Eurosport commentary, commentary day team, yep. the part-timers. Um, and so uh, he has obviously dipped in for 9.99. So actually, if you are watching us overnight on Eurosport or on Motor Trend in the USA or any of the other broadcast partners of the World Endurance Championship and the 24 Hours of Le Mans, if you wish to see more of this, either uh, during the course of the race and with live timing and all sorts of other extras that are on the app, or at Monza, or at Fuji, or at Bahrain, the season finale, then currently you will find the WC app to be at a bargain bucket price, a tenner, or in British money, uh, just under two pints of beer. <laughs> or if you go to some bars, about a pint and a half, <laughs> and certainly less than a glass of Pinot Grigio. Sure. So, uh, sure. yeah, so it is, uh, you know, for, and that, Okay, now it's for half, less than half Le Mans, but the rest of the season. In fact, we have just passed the midway point of the season. Yes, we, we have. We are now 31 minutes and 40 seconds into the second half of the season in terms of A, points to be earned, and yep. B, uh, well, not strictly points to be earned because you don't get anything unless you finish this, but in terms of hours still to be raced, we've now done more than half. We're over the hump by about half an hour. So, yeah, go to the WC app and... Uh, 10 pounds, I would imagine that would be close to 10 dollars and 10 euros. Most things are these days, close to parity, thanks to the B word that we can't talk about. Um, <laughs> and the other thing you could do but as the well. The dollar still doesn't stretch quite as far. Yeah, no, nothing stretches quite as far these days. Uh, everybody's yeah. pretty well aware of that. It's about 12.95 uh, if, you, if you're using dollars. The other thing you can do if you fancy seeing a lot more of this is Again, go to YouTube and find the FIA WEC YouTube channel. There's an awful lot of extra content above and beyond what you see in the races. And most notably is the All Access programs. The All Access programs changed format this year from four relatively short featurettes. They've, it's become a 40-minute program. Very and well it, done. And it is all, and from a TV director, that is high praise. Yep, very uh, well done. It is all behind-the-scenes stuff with the team with the drivers. Um, there's a, a program from Sebring, the season opener. There's a program for Portimao, race two. There's a program for race three at Spa. And this one, I spoke to uh, Cedric, who's uh, the, the guy who uh, produces and directs the whole thing. 
as he was coming back off the grid and said, how was that? Was it chaos? And he said, we've got enough for about a week's worth of programs already <laughs> and they haven't even yep. started the race. Yep. So those Might be guys, part one and part two on this yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Le Mans, the centenary of Le Mans probably, probably does deserve a movie. Yeah. I'm sure there will be one or maybe two or who knows more. Um, it, it's, so, yeah. it's, drive to, it, it's drive to survive without the contrived uh, drama. <laughs> drive to survive without Will or Jack, essentially. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's... Is that too. It is. It is all fly on the wall documentary, and uh, it's it is a, a really entertaining stuff. And one of the you know one of the things that we have the delight of is to is to get to know a little bit about these drivers and about the team personnel. And we're able to show so little of that on TV. I mean, guy, as a driver yourself, you know how much goes on. It is the tiniest tip of the iceberg that actually appears on camera. And the rest of it, nobody really gets to discover until you get these, you know, behind the scenes camera docs. Yeah, and I, th I think you've, we've seen all these um, these documentaries appear and, and, you know, I'm certainly a fan because I think behind the scenes, you want to know about, uh, you know, what goes on from the engineering to the engineering meetings and mm -hmm. the politics. And, you know, just to get here, to be at the racetrack, um, there's so much um, effort and politics to, yeah. to get into this position. Well, you think, I mean, a classic example would be a driver like Alex Albon or, or Esteban Ocon, you know, five or six years ago, they'd have just been and also ran in the back of the grid car that nobody knew or cared about. Now you know the people and their families and yeah. their stories. Everybody's invested in them. Yeah. And that's a huge change for non-world championship potential drivers. You know, there's always the three or four or five or sometimes six drivers who get focused on and, and get talked about a little bit and you learn a little bit more about them. But it's the other two thirds of the grid in Formula One. Yeah. And, and God knows that gets some exposure that you never really get to meet. And that's part of this, you know, again, 62 cars, 186 drivers, some of their names, I won't say, Jim won't say, you won't say, sure. right. cumulatively we'll talk about them. You always get to the end of race and go, wow, whatever happened to yeah. that car? Yeah. I, I literally don't remember even saying that car's name. And yet it's been going around for 24 hours and we've been watching for 24 hours. So, And it's the same effort. They put yeah. the same yeah, effort yeah. in oh, the same exactly. number of laps. Lord, yes. Good Lord. And, and actually quite a lot quite often a lot more per capita yep. because there are fewer yeah. capitas and there are fewer resources going in and so the human labor element of it is is even more extreme back with our iron dames porsche of sarah bovey this will be the last le mans for the iron dames in a porsche because having started their career with ferrari they signed a deal to run Lamborghini's mm -hmm. hypercar program and as a knock-on effect, also Lamborghini's GT3 program. So, and, they, and they've moved back to the front on the yeah. exchange of pit stops They here have indeed. As we're cycling through another set of pit stops for the GTM cars, Scott Huffaker is now, the American is now in second place yeah. in the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Yeah, Davide Regan, he's just, uh, he's just pitted Davide Regan third for Air Corsa. The Iron Dames drivers have, have got quite a, a season on their hands. For instance, when they were in Sebring, they were racing in the IMSA race as well, in a Lamborghini, running back to, not running, driving in a, on, a, on a golf cart, back down to the wet paddock and then jumping into the Porsche. Porsche. And, and that obviously, same track, totally different car, totally different behavior. That can't be a bit of a mind bender either. And they're doing the same in the European season where they're racing the Porsche in WEC. There's the battle for second in the LMP2. Wow, that's close. That 41 is, the, is 47. Yeah, the cool racing uh, car in, with the two blue lights and Louis Delatraz in the WRT car 41 with the three blue lights. I hadn't realized they were quite that close together. That was nearly a change of position in traffic. There they are, down at the bottom of the screen. There you go. And actually, you've got the cool racing uh, team WRT and the Inter Europol all kind of yeah, right together. Yeah, right together. Yeah. With the uh, decay just uh, a few seconds ahead. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really close battle there in LMP2. And if you want to know more about the Iron Dames, just to put a button on that story, the all access from, from Spa has some great bits yeah. with that team. Yeah. 
uh, shows the camaraderie and just how close-knit that group yeah. is and, and why it works so well. Big race for Sara Bovi Spa, being a Belgian driver. Um, am I reading the timing screen wrong? Ninth place, Porsche Pinsk... Uh, Oh no, 10th place rather, a Ferrari of course, Miguel Molina. Yeah. Has he just set the fastest first sector of anyone in the entire race on this lap? I believe he has. That yeah. is a purple first sector. I'm not, yep. it's not that he's in the pit lane and that, that was, no. he, is, he is absolutely flying. Now he's down in 10th place and he's what, mm, three laps off the lead, but whoo boy. That car's still got some speed. And in some respects, he's got nothing to lose, has he? You know, just he can just drive flat out, and uh, he's not really going for position, so he can just uh, really kind of uh, go for it. Brendan Hartley's going for it as well, the leader of the race since oh. the number two Cadillac stopped. Oh, that's, that's trouble. trouble. 47. 47. That's the car that was in second place, the cool racing car, uh, the third place car, cool racing car. That's with Santa Jerus. He was in that battle with uh, yep. Delatran, so I wonder if there was uh, oh, a little bit of No, yep. it's Porsche curves. Look, look yeah. at Porsche the back. in. The back of the car is uh, he's backed it in. That is Porsche in, isn't it? Ooh. Oh, oh, good okay, one. but he's only got half a mile to get yeah. back to the pit lane. Just how much of the cars are going to leave on the racetrack in the process. Now, when the 94 Porsche crashed, we heard Gustavo Menezes saying, do you want me to stop yeah. and take the nose out of the way? If we think back to Sebring last year, there was a slight off-track excursion for the number seven Toyota. Jose Maria Lopez continued, and then the nose dropped under the wheels. The under tray dropped uh, under the yes. wheels. The whole nose dropped, and he shot straight off at much higher speed. What happens here? Oh, he went off on the inside, collected the wall and bounced to the outside. Ooh. So has he come all the way across the gravel trap? Did he go off a long way earlier than the scene of the accident? Yeah. I think he has. I think he's come across the gravel and not quite missed the end wall there and got tagged and turned. Here we go. That's the 34 car that's now up to second place. That's into Europol's Albert Costa. Wait a minute. What happened to Louis Delatraz? Because Costa was closing on them. So did uh, Delatraz, Delatraz get held up there somewhere? Delatraz is, yeah, he's third. Yeah, so he continues. Mm. And into the pits comes the very damaged, cool racing car. Yeah, the left rear suspension is all. Yeah, that's a long stop. See the way the light oh. comes on in the cockpit when they come into the pit lane. Yeah. light flashing that's not the impact light is it uh, or is that just a colored light when they come into the pit lane because if it is the g light no i think it's on both sides i think yep. it's a, a car looks flashing like it's on light. both sides yeah i don't think it's i don't think it's the the impact light if an impact on the car registers more than a uh, requisite number of g then the driver is by regulation taken directly to the medical center. Now, the fact that he's managed to come into the pit lane without any outside intervention means that the car can continue even if the G-Lite has come on and he needs to be examined because it doesn't necessarily dictate damage to the car. That's going to take some time to... Uh, it's pretty big damage both he's, to the front and the rear of the car. He's so. done a job on it, hasn't he? Has, he? Yeah, he, he has. really has. Unfortunately, it does look like it got tagged on the side, spun round, it slapped that whole left-hand side and taken the rear off as well. And this is where you see all the frangible items coming off, all the wings, the nose cone, the crash structure on the front that's bolted on above and below, all the pedal box cylinders, the brake and clutch cylinders, and then all the rear bodywork, all those suspension components are designed to bend and break and separate from the car rather than tear out. So we, we don't go. see where he goes off. Uh, he's no. going off in front. Yeah, oh. he's, he's lost it before the corner, hasn't he? Yeah, he lost it as he turned in. He, I thought he may have come across the gravel. He didn't. He, lo he was on the road, but he lost it a long way out. So Rashad to Jerus in the pit lane. That's a really tough break for them. 
cool racing again such a an enterprising small team talk to Nick Manassian when they were coming through scrutineering and you know, whether or not maybe they had ambitions to look to run a hypercar and he said we're not ready yet we're still a small team we don't have the engineering backup we don't have the workshop backup to run a customer hypercar program yes in you know if we can grow to that size of course we'd love to but at the moment they race this car here at Le Mans they race in the European Le Mans series and in the Michelin Le Mans Cup so they've got quite a roster of drivers and, and team engineers. I was speaking to Sam Hignett um, earlier on this week at, from Jojo and he was saying that the step up to the, the hypercar, the amount of extra people and also the ex extra amount of kit they needed yeah. to run it yeah. is significant. So it's a big investment um, for, for any team to, to step up to hypercar. Yeah, we were talking to the guys at Ferrari about potential of customer hypercars and they said, you know, you would if it was to be decided that cars would be sold, they would need to be run by Ferrari. Yes. Because the sophistication. And they were saying that the perception outside tends to be that these are less sophisticated cars than the LMP1 hybrids, that they are easier to run. He said that could not be further from the truth. They may not have quite such powerful hybrid systems, but as the years progress, the electronics are getting more and more sophisticated and the technology level is getting higher and higher, as happens in all the road cars. And that, you know, that knock on effect, nothing stands still, in, especially in motorsport. Uh, it uh, continues to evolve. So if there were to be a decision in Marinello that, uh, you know, the equivalent of, of Luigi, Luigi Canetti in days gone by, you know, a favorite or, or Giampiero Moretti at the moment. Mm. Can you imagine if Nart and Moretti were still around, there would be North American cars somehow running. Yep. But it would require, you know, uh, Clienti to, to run it or, or a full factory operation to run it, but wearing you know, Momo or Nart shirts. It's like yesterday's parade with the, you know, excellent one winning cars. I mm. mean, in, in five, ten years' time, you probably couldn't do that because you wouldn't have the resources or the people possibly yeah. to, to run it, or you would need an you you would need an army of people. So, um, no, you're right. It's um, these cars are seriously, seriously um, uh, complex and you know high end machinery, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the real real race race cars. Well, you know, I, I was going to say even the the Bentley that you won Le Mans with. You cannot run that out of a, you know, of a two-door domestic garage. You no. just cannot. You need all of the intelligence that goes with it. You know, and this is one of the one of the problems facing historic racing to a degree. That once you get past the Cosworth era of Formula One, Cosworth and Turbo era, and you start to get into the really sophisticated V10s and so on, it's it's almost impossible to run. In fact, even the Turbo era cars. A lot of those are quite hard to run because they run on clunky old laptops for which there are no laptops well, left. Well, that's, I was speaking to my uh, Bentley engineer and I had exactly that same problem. Literally went up into the attic, pulled out his laptop, mm. which had all the, the software on. A big beige Dell. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. the, the basically had the software to run the car, but without this laptop that he'd kind of dusted off and thankfully saved, that car would be going nowhere. And the problem is, those electronics, have you ever tried to open a 10-year-old laptop and get it to, to do anything? It, they, they just don't. After a while, they just don't do anything. And, yep. and there's the problem, is that, you know, nobody has emulated Windows 311 yep. because there's <laughs> not much demand for it except for running turbo era Formula One cars. Joe Bradley knows a guy in the in the UK that that's what he's he's gone around and yeah collected a lot of these old laptops. Do we know him? Huh? Bradley does. No, but do we know him as well? Oh. Did he did he work on uh, ALMS radio in the early days? Uh, no, no, oh, okay. it's not. Yes, no, <laughs> not, it's not Gaza. It's not Gaza. That's the sort of thing that Gaza would do. Like yeah, he's, he's that would be right in his wheelhouse. Cars. It really that, would that's be. who I thought it was when he was talking about it. Gigi Am leader in the pits. Sarah Bovey stays in the Iron Dames Porsche. Again, last year Ferrari, this year Porsche, next year Lamborghini. And just to, to round out that circle, 
As we talked about the fact that uh, the crew were racing different cars in Sebring, they're racing different cars for the rest of the season as well. Because in ACO rules racing here in the World Endurance Championship and also in the European Le Mans Series, they're racing Porsches, but they will race GT3 Lamborghinis next year in the ACO rules regulation when we change to, to GT3 and they are already racing Lamborghinis in the Fanatec GT series. So boy, they are getting some wheel hours in this year. And that's why as a team, they are so close. They almost never don't see each other. Mm. They must all at the end of the year be dying for the winter just to have a few weeks where they're not <laughs> living hand in glove not that they don't love each other to death because they clearly do and get on supremely well but but it's funny know. it's funny as a driver with, with teammates you is it is like a marriage i mean i remember my wife would always say to me you know i'd bring my teammates two three times a day i'd, I'd almost speak to them more than i would my own family yeah. because you have to have that bond you have to have that relationship and um you know, just you're almost second guessing what the other person's thinking, and, and that's what you need when you're at the racetrack. And the other thing, of course, is that you, when you've been together for too long, you do need time away. I mean, you your wife must say to you, as Jim's does, and mine certainly does, uh, when are you going to work again next? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you're just getting a bit too sarcastic for your own good. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, but that's the same with teammates, you know, you, you do need that intimacy. I mean, it, it's, the, it's the 100% trust. That's, that's the thing that all of those hours together give. Absolute trust in each other, that you'll be there and you will do the job for each other and, and everybody will pick up the slack. And I think in, in, in this environment, when you've got two other teammates, it's, it's about knowing your strengths and weaknesses and their strengths and weaknesses and, and actually just working together. I mean, when, when I drove together at Bentley, you know, with people like Tom and Indo, it's, it's trying to be able to help where perhaps they are maybe not as strong and vice versa. If, if I'm struggling in an area, they'll step in. Right. And, and actually, as a team, you become super strong. And you play to each other's strengths yeah. and help each other mitigate your weaknesses. Exactly. And that's when it really gels. Yeah. And, and again, that really intimacy gels. and that trust, that allows the no blame culture. Whereas, right. what's the problem? Let's get it fixed. Whatever the problem is, we don't care why or who or how. Right. The only thing that matters is how do we get around it? How do we fix it? Yeah. Slow zone here. This is Scott Dixon in the number three caddy. Zone eight is still slow. Zone eight is still slow. We're going to pit this lap, Scott. Pit, pit. So that was him coming through into the entry to the Porsche curves. That's still clear up there for the 47 cool racing car. 47, 67, 47 of Russia to Cheris. And uh, that was, yeah, again, the messages are heard in our truck and then they are recorded and played out. So it normally takes around 30 to 40 seconds to pick one out of the ether and uh, decide, OK, that sounds quite interesting, we'll just play that in. So quite often the car is in a different position when we hear it to when it was actually broadcast. But Scott Dixon brings the number three caddy down pit lane. This has had a storied race, this car, hasn't mm. it? In fact, it's had a, a bit of a tough week a catching fire in qualifying. <laughs> in fact, catching fire in hyperpole and while in qualifying. <laughs> and then a crash very early on. Sebastian Bordet, Renga van der Zander, and Scott Dixon, the trio. Renga slipping in. A Cadillac with two cars in the top five as well, so mm, doing a yeah. great job. Yeah, again, that, you know, the more cars you have in your armory, the more you still have left when things start to go a bit squirrely, which is why Audi so often had a three-car field here. It, it may be a sports car, but they, uh, it, it has the feel of a single-seater when he slides in there. It does, it? and with the head restraints and everything else to, to head yeah. protection, it feels very much like a single-seater. Well, again, you know, we're talking about perception. You think, okay, it's a two-seat car, so he's just sitting there and there's space beside him. Uh -oh. There wouldn't be if you tried to get Ooh. in there. Oh, dives across the line. Uh, just to make sure he was across the line before the engine fired up and not to incur a penalty. And, and you know, still got... 11 hours of day to go, or 10 and a half hours yeah. of day to go, and he's 11 hours, and he's thrown himself around like that. And, uh, hopefully, that crew member is a okay. We're going to talk about misconception. Uh, Jim will remember when uh, 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 
Oh, he just, yeah, just slightly lost his balance there mm. coming around the wing. I think he probably clipped his hip on the wing as he came yep. around. All right, yep. And then you're that thing where you're trying to keep your balance and you run, run, stumble onto the floor. Once upon a time, early in the in the early days of ALMS, there was going to be a race in Aruba, which then didn't happen, and we ended up at Las Vegas. Or was that Texas Motor Speedway? What it was the other? Texas Motor Speedway. Texas Motor Speedway. <coughs> End of the season, we were in. And how was it? Who was it? Texas, where we were only on track in the evening because the entire track was booked for the week by the Richard Petty Driving School. So, no, we were, that would have been like that was that, that, that was last day because we were only racing in the evening. So the Petty Plus, Driving there School, was the heat factor, yeah, the yeah. Petty Driving School was there all week, and so given the opportunity, I meandered down and managed to buy myself uh, a ride, a, a guest ride in a car where you're, you're driven around by a, a proper driver. Uh, that was quite interesting. So I thought, you know, we'll go around and we'll do some laps. They actually did a pretend race with racing off pit road and passing on the banking and racing oh, wow. back into the pit lane, which is very entertaining. And then managed to get a drive in the car. And you sort of imagine that a NASCAR is a seat and this cavernous entity. It's not. You sit in a, even back then, and this is 20 plus years ago, sitting in a little aluminium channel with a very high wing bucket seat around you. I mean, it felt like a single seater in the middle or in the left hand seat of, of a big stock car. So it's a. Yeah, the, the perception that the car is a lot bigger than it is it pervades. I mean, the cockpit of your Bentley, I can remember David Brown mm. cursing mm. it endlessly because he's not, <laughs> not quite as racing driver height as you are. It was absolutely, it was barely a single seater, never mind an actual two seater. Yeah, no, it's really, it's funny, every time I get into the car, the, the aperture for the the windscreen is so it's, tiny. It's got smaller. Yeah, it's yeah. got really small. Uh, but it, but it's um, but you know when you get into it, it's kind of snug and it feels good and it's all comfortable. You sit in the GT3 car now. That's something different. That's much much bigger and that yeah. does you do you do kind of get lost in that car. Um, but uh, a five second uh, penalty on the next pit stop for the two car for a technical infringement. So oh, okay. I don't know if it was the uh, if they did. That drive, that uh, mechanic did not clear. Well, that was the three, so something oh, yeah. similar perhaps may well have happened on the number two car. So just to recap, we're heading towards 11 hours remaining. We've completed nearly 13 hours of the Centena in Le Mans. Toyota lead currently in the number eight car and what was a growing gap over the 51 Ferrari grew very quickly as the cars left the pit lane with the Ferrari uh, just in front uh, through the previous stint and losing the lead on the final lap of the previous stint driver changes Brendan Hartley has pulled away from Antonio Giovinazzi but Giovinazzi has sort of uh, stopped that rot and closed the gap a little so it remains under 20 seconds Number two, Cadillac in third place. Those are the cars on the lead lap. Number six, Penske Porsche is in fourth place. Andre Lotter having just stopped. And Renger van der Zander, we saw him take over number three, Cadillac, a lap ago. He is in fifth position with the le lesser delayed of the two Peugeots, the 93 car, uh, a lap back from the leaders with the caddy in sixth spot. And then a further lap behind them, the pair of Glickenhauses, Led the number five at Penske Porsche that had a crash earlier. A cooling system problem delayed the 50 AF Corsa Ferrari that sat on pole position and led early on. That car is now down in 10th. A crash for the 94 Peugeot dropped that back. A crash for the 38 Jota dropped that back. Two crashes for the number 311 Action Express and dropped that back. Uh, various minor issues and a, a trip or two to the gravel. Number four Floyd Van Wall have dropped that back. Number seven Toyota had a was the victim of a big multi-car pileup going into a slow zone, and was fatally damaged in the electronics of its hybrid system. And the 75 Porsche Penske uh, 963 had a fuel uh, an oil pump failure or or failure to proceed because of an oil pump, and that car was retired on the spot. Uh, Action Express due in with 3.11 in a lap or so, 93 due in on this lap, and the 51 Ferrari, there it is. And the eight is the pit lane. Yeah, eight is in and fueling. You can see its energy level going up. 
They've been stopping right together. Mm -hmm. They're on the same lap, and the number two Cadillac should go one lap longer. In fact, looking at 21% sock, that should go two laps longer. So the Caddy is doing softly, softly catchy monkey through the night time, where it is starting to... They are definitely, in this stint, trying to egg out another lap. The problem with that guy is that you really, 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 really need to make sure you've got the extra lap. Because getting 15 kilometers round a 16 kilometer circuit is not good enough. No, no, they're, they're gonna work hard. I mean, they're probably just missing out on probably overall pace, I would say. And they've got to just try and do something a little bit different, trying to eke out that uh, extra fuel mileage is gonna help them. Who's the best gas saver in the IndyCar series? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one Scott Dixon. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we again, you know, talking to the teams, from sim work, they will know who they can go to when they need to save fuel and who they absolutely can't. Yeah. Either because the driving style of that particular driver is a bit throttle brake heavy, or because they can save you the fuel but they hemorrhage lap time. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the bad, you know, we can all drive more economically by driving slower. Driving more economically while not driving slower, now that's a whole different thing, and it's a very different skill, and some driving styles will be more favorable towards it and some won't be. So each of the race car engineers will know if we're going to try and save a lap or two on a few stints and try and maybe creep another, you know, save an entire pit stop before the end of the race, then you'll know if it's possible with the car and with which driver you're most likely to have that sort of impact. So I do wonder if the caddy isn't in on the next lap, then it could be that part of the reason they're just lacking a second a lap or so in pace is that they're trying to save themselves a minute and 25 second pit stop at the end of the race. Yeah, they're probably probably working back now from the end of the race and saying, mm. well, what can we do? We can't beat them on pace, so what? how can we do that? Yeah, and uh, there, there are so many different ways to go about winning this race. The traditional old school Group C way that Norbert Singer perfected was, here's the lap time we need to get us on the fuel we're allowed to the end of 24 hours as efficiently as possible. Go. Then if it rains, we save fuel yeah. and we turn the turbo boost up and we blast past the Jags who can't save fuel and even if they do, well, who can save fuel because you use less behind the safety car, but they can't use any more because they can't turn up the turbo boost. So it was always a, it was always a sort of fairly linear plan to start with. We cannot go any faster than this lap time, and we don't care what speed the opposition goes because we know we can't do that. And then, then something hopefully will change in our favour if we're being left sadly behind. They were rarely left sadly behind on pace. But that was, that was always sort of plan A. Uh, Jim Rover is heading off to the land of Nod because uh, back home it is midnight 01. Here in the centre of France it is 5.01 a.m. And we welcome back world champion Anthony Davidson. And you'll be very glad to know that Karun has dipped in for 9.99 because he's been... I know he, he has. ...commenting on... Well <laughs> done, Karun. <laughs> Big raise of the eyebrow. I, I should think by uh, four in the morning in the UK, he's probably asleep. One of the tightest men on the planet. Well done, <laughs> Karim. <laughs> You're having a sleep. Look at these guys. They're uh, making themselves comfy. Well, listen, if you've either been here for a long while watching the race or have been here for a long while and might have had a drink or two, <laughs> you can fall asleep pretty much anywhere. So, I've just turned on my TV. I see the Toyotas at the front. Mm. How's that happened? Perfect time. Right? That's exactly what I asked a couple of hours ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, perfect time for a recap. It is five o'clock in the morning. We have completed 13 hours of the 24 hours of Le Mans, and we have 11 hours to go, a couple of minutes inside that. You can see the leaderboard, number eight Toyota and the number 51 Ferrari, who have basically been nip and tuck 
uh, over the last couple of hours. They had a driver change last time round. Sebastian Buemi handed over the Toyota to Brendan Hartley, and the 51 Ferrari went from the hands of James Collado to Antonio Giovinazzi. Now, Giovinazzi was at an 18-19 second deficit about halfway through the stint, and that gap has now come down to just seven seconds. The number two Cadillac in third place stops a lap later, has stopped a lap later. They have not yet saved a lap in that car. And a driver change, as you can see, Earl Bamba taking over from Richard Westbrook, who's just done a double stint. Andre Lotterer in fourth place in the number six, Porsche Penske 963, ahead of the number three Cadillac, which despite all its efforts to remove itself from the weekend and the race, uh, the team have managed to keep it going. Little top up on the oil system there. That's what that canister is. It's pressurized and uh, pumps oil into the oil system. And then in sixth place, the best place Toyota uh, Peugeot is now the 93, because the 94 car, Gustavo Menezes, has crashed in the damp first chicane about an hour and a half ago. So that oh car has dropped right down the order. Yeah, he was, as you might anticipate, extremely distraught, but he just, I mean, Guy, the tiniest little damp patch somewhere, and he just zigged when he should have zagged, and he was in the wall on the outside. Yeah, he just carried a little bit too much speed into the uh, first chicane and ran a little bit wide through the left-hander and just got his right front wheel on that, uh, on the wet. Basically, there was a dry line. It wasn't dry very quickly on the, uh, off the racing line, and, uh, yeah, just got onto the wet and couldn't steer the car and went straight into the wall. And I've uh, seen so many do, but yeah. not into the wall. But uh, yeah, even uh, Pierre Guidi earlier on did a, a, a pretty Very similar close. thing. But they were having such a great race. I mean, they were genuinely in the fight. I mean, they were. It was kind of. It was kind of Toyota. <laughs> Ferrari and Peugeot, it's yeah. a very, very close thing. And as the pit stops cycled around, it would go up to first, back down to third, up to first, back down to third. So they were genuinely in the hunt. Uh, the other major name to fall by the wayside in the last couple of hours has been the number 50 Ferrari that had uh, a leak in the radiator for the ERS system, the electrical recovery system. So it was getting all sorts of, sort of hybrid alarms, so they stopped to fix that. So that cost them uh, about 15 minutes, I think. So that's what's dropped them back down. So that car actually has just, uh, about five, 10 minutes ago, we were pointing out that in that 50 Ferrari, M Miguel Molina, who took it over at the last stop, had just set a purple first sector. So as often is the case in the dark of the night, when you're not in traffic, as Il Bamber has now got a, a clear road in front of him, in the cool, cool of the air, Engine produces a bit more power from its charge, and uh, the tyres are working well on the cooler track. They're all on the soft tyre. The, the grip is good, conditions are good, it's dry. You do get some fast, fast laps coming through. And this is great, as you can see ahead, not a car in sight. And uh, you talked earlier on about the clumps of cars or the packs of cars, and mm. it, it's absolutely true. He, as you can see, he's, he's found himself in some clear space, so now is a great time to it's a great time to drive Le Mans at night when there's no cars on track. It's just so quiet and almost eerily peaceful. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great uh, it's a great time to be in the car. Yeah, hard for a normal road driver to imagine it being peaceful with you doing 200 miles an hour at top speed through a forest on public road. But that all the drivers I've talked to about it over the years have always said there is that slightly sort of spiritual, slightly sort of zen feel. And that's when, and Guy, that's, that's when you're in the zone, when you've got what the drivers talk about, you know, the rhythm, everything is just happening automatically. You're not having to force it, barely having to even think about it. I think any, any road driver can probably recognize this feeling when you've done a route a million times and you said you're on a, you're on that that same journey one day and you, you suddenly stop and think am i how have i got to this part where of the journey yeah. yeah that yeah. that is being in the zone it's when you ride yeah. wireframes and go where are you then um don't i know. don't know although i'm coming up the same bit of motorway i've done as you said yeah, and it's eerie and hundreds yeah. of times and and and, 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 and you know, I, always, I always say that in my head the difference between me trying to drive a racing car and you driving a racing car, apart from fitting in it, is that it would take every iota of mental faculty that I've got just to make it move 
whereas you guys are doing it as if you're on the cruise control on the motorway and the vast majority of your brain power is object avoidance other cars you know and that spatial awareness and we, we you see drivers who don't have that capacity because they don't have that spatial awareness and they get into accidents as a result and the, and the best drivers have that ability to think of all the permutations all the calculations to know instinctively without any discussion what the right tire choice is or what the right strategy choice is or where to make the move and that's because you're using so little brain power to drive the car yeah you're, you're just on autopilot and uh, you know even when and, and I know it would be the same for Guy every time we go to an onboard shot you you're thinking with them and they do exactly what you're thinking mm. it's amazing I had a really bizarre experience earlier in the year I was doing a, the, the F1 event with Sky in, uh, in Bahrain and one of these silly features that they, they made us do, they stuck us in go-karts, they, they were the twin-seater, and one had the steering and the other driver had the pedals, <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah, and I sat in with uh, Oscar Piastri, never met the guy ever in my life, and we sat in this cart together, uh, I was doing the throttle and brake and he was on the steering, and I, I kid you not, we Either of is we were doing the controls, but both controls ourselves, we wouldn't have gone any faster. Really? Just and we were racing other carts on the track as well, and and it was the strangest feeling because we it was like we just read each other's minds. So it's the same as when we go on an onboard, we're feeling what the other driver is going through. Yeah. And it's almost that, like a muscle memory, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like a muscle memory of of, of almost being in that in that car with like them. Yeah. High speed game of chess. Yeah. You, you just <laughs> and it's. And we've got the ability, having done it all our lives, to slow down that time. You know, yeah. other people be they'd be you know, eyes on stalks, just just fearful of the speed, and that's pretty much all consuming. But for us, it's we're not consumed by the speed. It's just we then have the capacity to kind of slow it all down, and then think of other things as well on top of that, like where to place the car in. Uh, in, in moves when you're coming up to a slower car or, or racing another car and thinking about where to overtake them. Or what you're going to have to eat when you get out of the car. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, what the weather, what's the weather doing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, have a nice chat with you. Asking you, all you those know. questions, yeah. getting but, all but, that information. But normally when, you, when, you, when you're on the track um, during practice sessions, it's always so busy and so fraught and there's always traffic. So that's why you, when you are on the track and you're on your own, it's it's so unique and so special and that's where you really connect with it and it's moments like that that really kind of make Le Mans so special See, it's they're getting all misty-eyed boys and girls <laughs> it's funny, haven't, haven't, haven't just <laughs> haven't just turned up as well I was literally asleep just 30 minutes ago 20 minutes ago even and uh, and you get here and you get your headset on and, and you're watching you're trying to get your eye in, and then you start trying to talk about it and it's very similar, there are similarities to jumping in the car and having to be on it straight away. And I can tell my brain's not fully, it's not fully it's engaged foggy. yet. It's not flowing and that's exactly what it's like when the drivers jump into the car. You try and wake yourself up, you're doing your exercises and you know, just, you're know, you talking to your engineers before you get in the car and you're trying to get yourself in, in the groove. I can tell I'm just, I'm hitting barriers. It's like my brain's not quite, I'm not quite there yet. And uh, it's just the same when you jump in the car. You, you think, oh, how was I doing it before? It was all so easy before. I was completely in the zone. And uh, you get out there and you're just fighting to get back into it. And what makes the difference is the adrenaline that fires up. And then all the synapses are really twitching away and everything starts to really work. And and that's what adrenaline does. That, that's what makes human beings survive. That's why we have it. It gets the heart racing, it gets the lungs pumping the, to get the oxygen around the body and it yeah. fires the brain into that enormous fight or flight state. And, and that's what you need but isn't to be it incredible able to control that, it. I mean, you'd think be there, that would be there straight away when you jumped into a racing car mm. at 200 miles an hour well, on this brilliant set. You think hey, you would just it would turn for on? Me, it might do for you, yeah, well, but, maybe but that's what we're talking but it's about. But less of an, an, a, a, it's less of a mainlining a, adrenaline in, injection for you because it is more familiar and you're not scared of it. And so it does take that little bit longer 
you know, by the time we got to the Dunlop curve, I would be on adrenaline 11 and you'd <laughs> still be nudging up to one. Maybe. Because I'd know we were going to die and you'd be perfectly <laughs> fine because you know the brakes and the tyres are going to get us around. So that, you know, there's the big difference is that the more familiarity you have, the less you're the less you have that fight or flight instinct. So it, it, it will come with the speed and it will come with the, with the focus but, and, and, and they feed off each other. But that's, that's why, you know, put a, put, put a billy in there. Oh, there, there won't be any shortage of adrenaline and you'll be able to see what color it is as well. It's an interesting so, watch, isn't it? Classic watch there. This is the uh, Garage 56 crew. And they are the hardest working guys in the pit lane. Not that anybody else isn't hard working. It, there's on, on their car, it's just a, a, that extra little tick more physical because they have to jack the car up by hand and all of that stuff. Well, as I always said, when the driver's happy, and, uh, well, happy, but <laughs> when, when the mechanics are hard at work, <laughs> The driver's yeah, always the driver, happy yeah, when the, the mechanics the are hard at work. Exactly. That's what you're saying. Never, never both at the same time. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, when you see sleeping mechanics, you know the driver's out there hard yeah. at work. Yeah, exactly right. Now then, that uh, Hendrick Motorsport Camaro, the Invitational Class car number 24, the, the fans around the track side, a little bit of a lock-up there, under pressure. That's the Duquesne car. Duquesne and Panis, that's a battle for position, I think. It is. That is second place. That's uh, Nico Pino, the Chilean driver in the black and green Duquesne car, locking up ahead of Tiemann van der Helm. So two youngsters, a teenager, two teenagers. Tiemann van der Helm is a teenager as well. In comes the car that was, uh, has been the leader in the class in GT Pro. PJ Hyatt gets out after a double stint. Uh, he took over from Gunnar Jeanette, so I'm assuming that is Matteo Cairoli. Looks more Matteo Cairoli stature than Gunnar Jeanette stature. That's like you and me, Ant Davidson. One looks like a racing driver, the other looks like Gunnar Jeanette. And uh, people be asking, well, how, how does that work then? How does a, a smaller driver work with a, a bigger driver in terms of the controls? Well, the controls these days in the, the GT cars, they can all move to the driver. A bit like in your road car with a telescopic steering and height to adjust. These GT cars have that as well, but also the pedal box can move further or towards the driver. So uh, the seat is pretty much in the same position. They do have a seat insert as well, but um, yeah, gone are the days when you had these huge seat inserts in the GT cars to try and propel the driver further forward. The reason behind that is for the safety, yeah. the head safety. So you're closest to the, well, so the head stays in the same position from driver to driver. For the head restraint. Or 20 years ago, you bought a Porsche 911 GTRS and it was on sliding seat rails. So you literally, the same as a road car, lift the seat bar, slide forward or slide backwards. Now, obviously, in terms of an accident, you don't want the seat sliding forwards or backwards, so you don't want it to burst free from that. So the seats are much more rigidly mounted into the car for lateral movement and forward and backwards movement. And so something has to move, otherwise a six foot and a five foot driver can't share the same car. So it is the pedal box and the steering that move together. So there's a 30 Duquesne car, second place in LMP2. Albert Costa leads for Inter Europol. Who did you have in a sweepstake to win LMP2? I didn't have Inter Europol. You, you better say it was Jota or somebody's going to be coming looking for you. As a former you know Jota I, I LMP2 honestly, driver, I honestly, honestly can't, can't remember, can't but remember. I, deep in my heart, I think perhaps slightly guilty it might not have been Jota. Is that what you're telling me? I I, honestly, I, 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 I think it remember. might have been one of the Uniteds, which is uh, seeming like a, a terrible uh, decision yeah, right that, now. That 10 euros has uh, certainly yeah. cursed them. Uh, I had the garage 56 car coming home in 19 so they need to make up 11 places in 11 hours 10 hours 42 minutes oh i had them at 29th position i know you did i think the chances of them finishing in 29th place are probably slightly less than yeah. finishing in 19th anyway uh be that as it may we uh, let's take a look at this battle so 1.3 seconds in it some pretty tight battles. The, the battle between Brendan Hartley and Antonio Giovinazzi, I wonder what the tyre differences were because Brendan went off like an absolute scalded cat. The, 
the, I don't think they changed tyres on number uh, eight Toyota because they'd only done one stint with Seb Buemi. He changed tyres twice. Uh, he went out with new tyres and at the end of his first stint, Buemi came back in and changed again. And the second set of tyres, uh, Brendan Hartley is on. The gap's ebbing, ebbing and flowing, isn't it, between uh, Giovinazzi and Hartley? It well, was it, down it, at six seconds. Yeah, but it's it was originally at the beginning of their respective stints, and they stopped on the same lap. It was out to 20 uh, very quickly. Um, so it's we've seen that a couple of times, that the Toyota's really got onto the tyre very quickly. And it's taken the Ferrari a couple of laps to come back up. But like I was saying before, Martin, is, was it that both drivers got in at the same time? Yes. Or Exactly the same, same time. time. In fact, okay, the number enough. eight car, uh, Sebastian Bremi, passed James Collado on the in lap, on the okay. way, uh, on the way into the, into the Porsche curves. I think. Looking at the Duquesne car, 48 laps on the tyres, 51 for Panis Racing. So these hard tyres, the only slick that's available in LMP2, they're in a third stint. So triple stint on those tyres at the moment. There's Manuel Maldonado, cousin. Why did Pasta not come to my mind? Cousin of Pasta Maldonado. There's the, uh, there's the juggling oranges. I think they're now only fit for juggling, judging by the number of times they've been dropped. We saw Nico Pino juggling with them before he got into the car. And I know it might seem like they're just messing around, but, uh, well, they probably well, are. the mechanics but, are now, yeah, yeah, yeah but, but the drivers know. were. If they're coming up to a pit stop, and like I was saying before, you want the brain to be sharp, that's a really good way to, uh, to try and switch on. There's the Panis Racing team. Slumped in the seat is Mr. Panis, Olivier Panis. I don't know if his son Aurelian is here. I'd be surprised if he's not, actually. Aurelian's uh, a touring car and sports car driver. Races in the ice racing series, Trophy Andros during the winter. He's been a two time champion in Trophy Andros. And his dad occasionally races there as well and absolutely has no qualms in punting his son off the same as he will with anybody else if he's in the way, <laughs> which is always good to see. The chuckling continues. <laughs> ah, see, yeah. look. Wakey, wakey. Well, there's team boss Gilles Duquesne. <laughs> Not only runs this team, but Gilles has now taken over manufacturing the chassis that was originally the Norma chassis. So those LMP3 cars are now Duquesne chassis. Leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. Oh, I think it's really unfair when they go around showing sleeping people. Let just give them their privacy. Well, but at least in that garage, they're not being painted by their teammates exactly. or, or, you know, decorated <laughs> with flowers or whatever. You know, at least he's just being allowed to sleep peacefully on the floor in the middle of the garage. Like down at Corvette or something, they're the, uh, the masters, aren't they? Of, uh, Master jokers. Jokery. Absolutely are. Right, here we go then. This is uh, Antonio Giovinazzi coming out of the uh, first chicane, heading down the Molsan Strait. Not much ahead of him. The next car ahead of, in fact, the next car behind him is the number 50 Ferrari. And the car ahead of him in the race and on the road, number eight Toyota, is uh, yeah, just about seven seconds, seven, nearly eight seconds now. This is the third place car, Earl Bamba, number two caddy. And that, four, was, uh, that, that was Fabio Shearer, we could see uh, getting ready. It looked like he was just starting his preparations for. Uh, a driver change coming up into Europol. El Bamba works his way through the Dunlop chicane. Keep the car within the white lines on the exit. You can just see in the distance there, the sky starting, mm. starting to become a bit more twilight. Yeah. And actually, because it's cloudy, that's taken longer. Normally, by about 4.30, you're starting to get that golden light coming in, the pre-dawn light, uh, the blue light that photographers get so excited about where there's still a kind of soft glow in the air, but you don't get the harshness of daylight, but it is taking a, quite a lot longer. In days gone by, the commentary positions for TV used to be on top of the ACO building, looking towards the start, uh, towards down towards the pit lane, so the outside of the track, and they were glass-fronted and glass-walled, 
So, boy, you knew when the sun was coming up, would shine over the top of the grandstands and right into you. There's the flame licking out of the exhausts of the Porsche Penske 963. That's a great shot. I've never seen that before. No, we haven't seen that before. I wonder if he's overfueling. Off throttle. The little stabs of blue flame as he comes down the gearbox. Up to our nose, you lift off again. Down through the gears, slowest corner on the track. First now, gear. Because of the colour of the body, we don't see much of that discolouring, but when the uh, uh, 38 Jota car came in with the damaged body panel taking off, you'd see against the gold of that bodywork how black the exhaust marks were all the way down the body. Oh, that's great. Through the Porsche curves. First left into the second. Little lift there. Into the right. Hug the inside through that one. And then you've got karting left coming up. A little bit over the curves on both sides. Inside and exit. And then you're heading up towards the final set of chicanes. Pit lane will be just on the left-hand side of us there. Throw the car in over the curves on the left and the right. Slow it down even further for the Porsche chicane. Right then left. On power, past the pit, start, finish straight. Grandstands on the right and left-hand side. They're not quite as packed as they were earlier on at the start <laughs> of the race. Uh, lots of sleeping people around, but, uh, yeah, drivers hard at work like Lotterer. He's, um, he's no newcomer to this race. Yeah, he's got a few miles under his belt and a few wins under his belt as well. DKR Engineering. The all Belgian lineup, Atugo de Vilde in the car. He stays in, giving himself a little psych up there, I think, getting ready to go. Looked like it, didn't it? Yeah, exactly what we talked about. And not letting the adrenaline sag away as he's sitting there station free, stationary for nearly 90 seconds. It's why, as well, the same as when you get out of the car. And even though you can feel your body's so tired, you're really sleepy, but you can't sleep if you try to sleep. Uh, as I always did when, when I raced here, it's uh, it takes, I found, at least an hour before yep. you could, when you're on the come down from that, that high, that height of uh, concentration and adrenaline, whatever it is, I'd love to speak to a sports scientist about it, just understand why, why that happens, why does it take so long to get back into the groove, and why does it take such a long time when you get out from the car to then wind down and, uh, and fully relax? Uh, what actually goes on in, in the human brain that uh, kind of stops that from happening a bit more instantaneously? Again, I think part of it is the sort of lower level, if you like, maybe of adrenaline when you're really focusing on something. And, and, and even if you're driving a car at the motorway, you know, you do still have to pay attention. You can't just sit there and nod off unless you're in the passenger seat. I'm going to have the same thing, you know, if I've been working in the evening, you focus hard a lot, then you get in the car and drive home, and I'll get home and you know, if I go straight to bed, I'll be lying there staring at the ceiling for an hour. It just takes a little time for your brain to stop worrying, you know. It's, like the, it's like the stress, isn't it? Stress is, uh, it, it, it can either be, well, I think for a... For an athlete, I think it can be quite a good thing when yep. you're when you're in the heat of the moment. Yep, um, absolutely. But certainly not a good thing when you're well in everyday life and when you're, especially when you're trying to get to sleep. No, <laughs> exactly right. Well, I, I always kind of think you know your your brain's been in gear and whizzing around. If you imagine you know like a spinning top, one of those gyroscopes, you know, you pull the string and it's whizzing away. It's going to take a while to slow down. It's got it's got some you know it's got that bit of momentum in it. And uh, if you're thinking all the time when you're driving home, then you've still got that, you know, you, your body may be tired. It takes a while for your, your brain to switch off. Panis car is in, this is a 65 car, full service, but no driver change, so Team and Vanderhelm stays in. And people might be asking, well, why are you cleaning the lights? Why bother clean, cleaning the headlights? But it really does actually make a difference, having a, a clean shield over the, uh, over the light panel in terms of how much brightness you get from it. So if you just left it the whole race, you'd have probably 10% by the end of it, 10% yeah. less 
the lighting. So, uh, yeah, an important time, and, obviously. And, and in when it's been damp to dry and there's all the rubber around, you'd actually probably only have 10% of the lighting you had in the first place. Never mind yeah. 10% less, you probably have 10% remaining. So, yeah, like with your road cars, so many road cars now have headlamp washers for exactly the same reason. You know, salt and the grime that's on your windscreen, you can clean off with the windscreen wipers. But it has the same effect on light going through the light lens and you just have reduced visibility. And when it's you're doing 180, 190, 200 miles an hour, visibility is quite a useful thing. The lights on these cars are amazing. Compared to your road car, any road car, it, you jump in a racing car and it's just like it's daylight in front. Mm. Um, that didn't always used to be that way. No. Headlights have improved an awful lot, even since the time I was racing uh, here at Le Mans. They've improved so much. My, I remember the first Toyota I drove, 2012. We used to joke the drivers. So it was like holding two candles out the front, <laughs> front trying to see where you're going through the Porsche curves. But uh, they, they came on a, an awful lot in, in our time there. And uh, they've got these clever metrics that they hold over in front of in front of the lights to make sure that they're perfect. You get a perfect uh, array in yeah. front, uh, so they're pointing in all the right directions. It used to be done. Back in when I drove for Peugeot here, it used to just be done by eye. Yep. They would sit the more experienced drivers in the car, like someone like Stefan Sarazan, for example, and say, like, somewhere like Paul Ricard at a, an open test day, and say, right, Steph, where would you like the light? So a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit more to the outside, bring yep. it in a little bit. And uh, wow. it's like, yes, yeah, like setting your mirrors. See, you know, Proper lighting is one of the things that's been accelerated by this race. Yeah. You know, decent fuel economy, windscreen wipers, hoods that stayed on cars in the old days before cars had solid roofs, disc brakes and all the other things that have sort of slipped in through the back door. But, uh, yeah, I mean, modern road cars, you'll find a, a whole lot of them have you know, the radar that also is, is your sort of uh, automatic cruise control sensor will also work with the lights to dip the lights as oncoming traffic comes towards you while still giving you a good cone of light. Now, we don't have that drama here. Well, frankly, you don't care if you're blinding the guy in front of you. In fact, quite often you'll do it deliberately to try and uh, distract him when you're trying to get by. But, uh, yeah, still they have phenomenally powerful lights. We always used to go through that deliberation as drivers, you know, right up until my time at Jota, whether you would run a, a blanking on the uh, on the mirrors, mm. so you'd put up with a bit of you know less visibility in the daylight. So you put like a, a darker screen, a darker film over the mirrors, just for that reason. Uh, in the night time, it really come into its own uh, because you don't want to be blinded from the car behind you. You want to kind of s stay focused and not have the lights dancing around behind you all the time. You want to see them, of course, but not be blinded by it. And, uh, as much as it is a distraction in the on the road. It, it is in, uh, in in racing cars as well, but we used to actually say, right, well, most of the race is in the daylight. We're in summer, we're around the, the summer solstice, so you, yeah. you're around the, the, the longest day. <laughs> Hello, Andre Negrao. And uh, yeah, so we'd, we'd come to the decision always that, well, we gave it a go, but uh, in, in pre-practice, but usually you'd, you'd, you'd come to the decision together that, yeah, take the blanking off, and because uh, it was either on or off, you didn't have yeah. the luxury of peeling it off. You had to really stick it down yeah. firmly. That, no dipping mirrors, because that's an extra, you know, couple of grams that would have made a difference. Well, in Jonas, the hypercar, they're, they're digital now. Yeah. Jonas Reed stays in, in the 88 Proton competition at Porsche. This is fifth in the GT Pro class. Just saw the 98 uh, Northwest AMR car changed drivers. Dan Mancinelli, Danielle Mancinelli, took over the uh, 98 car from Alex Riveras. Cool Racing's Nico Lapierre has headed back out in the 37 car. And here is Alpine's Andre Negrau. Last year, racing in the hypercar class. And next year, they will return to the hypercar class with a purpose-built Alpine, a pair of purpose-built Alpine hypercars and engines as well mm -hmm. alpine engine and well not the chassis it's going to be an orica but uh, a beautifully 
presented car, at least uh, yep. from what we've seen online so far, it, it, it looks super stunning. sexy, didn't it? Super sexy, really great looking car. And apparently the Orica chassis is uh, a phenomenal piece of work. What's happened here down into Big the bottom lock up. corner? And that is the ORT by TF Sport Aston Martin. The 25 car was in the top four or five. Where is he now? He's in third place. And that is Mike Dynan, the and for those of you, driver. For those of you wondering, where on earth was he going? The corner goes right and he's gone left. That is actually what you're told to do yep. in driver's briefing and by your team. And it's, it's the safest thing to do. Rather than try to make the right-hander and end up in the, potentially in the gravel trap, and it's so hard to remind yourself that, yes, just fling the car to the left. Yeah. You go round, round the roundabout, the roundabout and, then, yeah, and you can rejoin yeah. safely. Because the public road is still a public road, and that is the junction to go, or the roundabout, the feeder road for the roundabout to go into Mulsanne Village itself. And so, yeah, you can... Uh, turn what looks like sharp left, but it's actually basically straight on because the corner goes hard right and then shoot down there. So Andre Negrau taking over the number 35 Alpine LMP2 car. An Alpine with a lot of success in LMP2, number of wins in the LMP2 category, have not had the best of luck with their two cars. 36 in sixth place with Charles Malaisi at the wheel and this car in 12th place in class. It's quite an interesting insight into how it works with the driver change there from the driver's point of view. You would have seen he had his right hand on top of the so kind of makeshift dashboard, if you like, uh, just to allow the driver helper better access to the seatbelt. So you, you let the driver helper do all the seatbelts, but they will put the seatbelts on loosely, but not, not in terms of the buckles, but the previous driver would have loosened them off before you unbuckle. So it's easier for the driver helper to get them all pinned in, all, yeah. all bolted in. Then you saw his, that right hand go to the helmet to pick off the, uh, the radio attachment, and you plug that in. That's got usually your, your drinks attachment as well uh, intertwined into the radio attachment, so that goes in. Then when they're doing the tires, or at the end of the fuel, you then start working yourself to try and tighten the seatbelts up. Well, you will tighten seatbelts yeah. up. So pull on all, all four straps, uh, both lap straps and both shoulder straps to, uh, to get the seat belts tight enough. And what you try and do as well is feel your way up to see and make sure that the driver helper hasn't twisted the seat belts. If they are, it's, it's better to try to untwist them and get them over the hands device correctly. So all of that is a bit of a fumble uh, with limited visibility, obviously, with the, the the full face helmet yeah, on. You've got so. the full face helmet on and you can't turn your neck very much because the straps that attach the helmet to the hands device predicate against that because that's exactly what they're supposed to do is stop your head twisting and, and moving in, in an impact. So, yeah. yeah, all of that hard to do. You can't see anything. You have to do it by feel. You have to know. Just saw Nico Pino leaving the pit lane in the Duquesne engineering car. The battle for second place in LMP2 hit the pit road together. There's the leader, the yellow and green car, that's into Europol, but the uh, battle for LMP2, second place, uh, they pitted together and left together four seconds apart. And it's jubilant because this man, his mate Gents, has got the car up into 29th place overall. So, for 10 hours, 24 minutes and zero seconds, Jensen Button and his teammates may neither progress nor regress for ads to step one step closer to uh, what I believe is a massive prize pot for about five euros at the moment in the office sweepstakes. But Keep it steady, Jen. Just, just no more, no less. Just 29th is perfect. Well, what they are looking for as a team, of course, is to be around still in 10 and a half hours' time at 4 p.m. Central European summer time and take that car to the chequered flag. John Doonan, the uh, IMSA president and the team captain, he, he wouldn't like to say team manager or team boss, he's sort of the, uh, the steering figure of that programme on behalf of Jim, of behalf of Jim France was saying that uh, it's been two years in planning. So that also was being thought about and talked about during lockdown to get the car here to celebrate the 75th anniversary of NASCAR and the centenary of Le Mans. We talked a little bit about the 75th anniversary of Porsche as a car manufacturer as well. Of course, they've been racing here at Le Mans for almost all of those 75 years. 
and uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the British Lawnmower Racing Association, another fine racing institution, <laughs> and uh, the other big 24-hour race in every British racing fan's calendar. And the only one I've been allowed to do, and build vehicles to race as well. <laughs> so, don't think, I'm not sure I'm up to building. I'm not sure I'm up to building a lawnmower, probably actually because they fell apart a lot. But uh, not sure I'm up to building an MP2 car or anything else. You couldn't cut it, no. No, oh, very good. Oh, very boom good. Uh, you would have seen Ringer van der Zander at the wheel of the number three Cadillac racing car. They're in P5 at the moment. They've had a bit of a heroic rise back up the uh, the time sheets and the yeah, order. Because, boy, there's a car that didn't want to oh. play. It did not want to play well with others, did it? It just had no interest in being in the race whatsoever from qualifying. Uh, they're going to win the lottery or something, aren't they, that <laughs> that lot, and car number three car crew, because uh, the, the luck has really not been on their side. But this is a lesson to all watching how to never give up. And, uh, yeah, P5 at the moment, absolutely brilliant effort from all of them down there at Cadillac Racing. Car crew, yeah. you know, all of the mechanics, team members, really, I'm so pleased to see them still up there uh, in, in the, you know, right in the thick of it in the competition because so many cruel moments have come their way. Uh, like you see, you mentioned qualifying, had a fire in qualifying. Borde had to jump out the car and he had a brilliant start to the race. He still holds on to the fastest lap yeah. of the race so far. There's, the there's, there's no doubting that the caddy is as quick as anything else out there. They just weren't quite as lucky. And poor old Renger as well, don't forget. He's in the car now pounding round, but after Spa Frankersham, yeah. I must say, you know, we questioned at the time what was going on there. It's just a uh, limping. Yes, that's because he's got a broken foot because it was run over by a Corvette. Words you don't want to hear as a team boss, the Corvette just ran over the driver's foot. Wait, hang on a minute, what have I missed? Where, when did this happen? In a pit stop, the Corvette ran over his foot. Not in this race? Yes. Fabio Scherer. Hours ago. Hours ago. No, and, you didn't and tell, he, when I asked my update, you didn't tell me that. That's quite big well, news. Well, that's because we didn't see him hopping around the place. No, it is big news. Yeah, he's yeah. broken his He's ankle. broken his foot. Are you sure it's broken? Yeah, I mean, they think it's broken. Wow. I know. What a trooper. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I can't said, believe it. He said, I don't care. I want to win them on. And if I have to do it with a broken foot, I'm going to do it. Now, he should be in the NASCAR Chevy because that's... That's days of thunder stuff. No, what, no, you genuinely, for breaking no in that I, I'm not kidding you. Genuinely, his foot was so, run over by the Corvette. So he he must be right foot breaking. If he can't put bear the pressure of his own body on it, you're might, putting... he must be right foot breaking yeah. anyway. Well, don't forget that when Brabs and David Coulthard and uh, John Nielsen John Nielsen won in the XJ220, Brabham's foot was run over by another car, and he spent almost the entire race packing it in in frozen bags of frozen peas to stop it swelling like a balloon. I think incredible. And, and, and never dare take his boot off. Well, because if you take it off and you can't get your foot back in, then what are you going to do? That's remarkable. I mean, most of the young drivers, I don't know about Fabio, his braking style. I know that Nico Lapierre, uh, during the Toyota days, he was still right foot braking yeah. and probably still does today. Yeah. Uh, but the younger drivers, sorry, Nico, I am older than you, so I can say this. Yeah. The younger drivers, even younger than Nico, probably will be left foot braking because right, all yeah. racing cars today, it's, it is faster to left yeah. foot brake. And, and they machinery. start in go-karts where you left foot brake, right foot throttle, well, and so, so it's I. not unusual. So I, you know, yeah. I obviously did a, a, an awful lot of go-karting, but then I had to do Formula Ford. Yeah. Which was very much a manual H pattern gear. Manual you see, H -pattern. Now they're not. They're yeah. flappy paddle, yeah. and, and and the clutch is only ever used for leaving the line or leaving the pits. So I think Christian yeah. Clean was the first F1 driver to make it all the way through to F1, never having shifted an H pad gearbox wow. in his life. Wow. So that I mean, and Christian is uh, he's not the the youngest of drivers anymore, but uh, goes to show how long that's been a thing. So I'm, I'm convinced that Fabio's had to adapt his mm -hmm. style here, yep. mid-race. Yep, yep, yep. And just, and just get on with it, absolutely.
Driver change for the 51 Ferrari. Alessandro Pierguidi taking over for Antonio, from Antonio Giovinazzi. So a double stint for Giovinazzi. Brendan Hartley in the pit lane as well. In the number eight Toyota. And there he goes out of the pits. The 51 car came in how far behind? 2.7 seconds back. So in fact, that Imagine. was not the Toyota going out. That was something else. What was that? That was the number five Porsche. Number six Porsche, beg your pardon, Lawrence Van Tour. That was a slow stop on the left front there, wasn't it? Down a Ferrari. I wonder what happened there. It's almost like they questioned whether that was the right tyre to uh, to be going on the car. 1 minute 17, not a slow stop. No, no, 140, beg your pardon, that's changed. Yeah, that was a slower stop. Yeah. yeah. So all that hard work that uh, the driver was doing with uh, Giovinazzi at the wheel to catch. Oh, ten oh, by ten. Oh, the 33 goes round. And that Too was a late. battle for position, I think. The Corvette has been in that battle with the other yellow car, the car no. guys Ferrari. Four. Oh, no, it wasn't it was a position. Late. It was He's too late. He's a lap behind the 33. The car guys Ferrari is second. The Kessel Racing car, Daniel Serra in that car. And the Corvette with Nicholas Veroni at the wheel is down in ninth place in the class. So that was not for position. That was unfortunate and a little bit clumsy. Here's the best placed or better placed of the two Peugeots, Jean-Eric Van. Now, again, both Peugeots recovering from and off. Van put this off on his outlap in his first stint, didn't he? In and, the and rain. I, yeah, and, and, and it, I know it's been incredibly tough on the drivers, really difficult conditions, and we've seen so many driver errors, and there's Giovinazzi, a great stint by him, but who would have thought that, uh, and, you know, I don't want to do a Peugeot a, a disservice here, but who would have thought that it would have been the drivers causing them to go laps down rather than the car's reliability, because that has been the story so far this year with Peugeot, it hasn't had the reliability. Well, since its debut in Monza last yeah. year, yeah, it's been reliability, it's been grinding to a halt with predominantly transmission problems. And always nice, sorry, sorry, Martin, always nice to, uh, you saw that moment there, Giovinazzi out the car, wanders over to his engineer, nice handshake, and yeah. it's when you know it's a job well done when you, your engineer's smiling at you and you go to look at the telemetry, and well done, Antonio. That was a, a real heroic effort, and... Uh, catching that Toyota all the way through. That's a Ferrari the going slowly, or is that? No, it is the D-Station Aston. It is the D-Station Aston. Your eyes are good, aren't they? And rolling very slowly. This is on the run from Mulsanne towards Indianapolis. That's Fuji-san at the wheel. I think I just saw the lights turn off as well on the car. 85 is GTM leader. Sarabovi stays. No, she doesn't stay in. That's her getting out. So Rahel Frey handed over to her, which is either Michelle Gatting's having a sleep and Rahel Frey is back in the car, or Michelle Gatting is in in her turn. Turn. They have been doing double stints in this car, which is a couple of solid hours in the GTE car. I wonder how GT3 is going to shape up in terms of how long they're going to run, because we're sort of used to GTE cars doing an hour. Basically, anywhere, they'll do an hour. I don't know quite what the uh, fuel tankage of a GT3 car compared to a GTE might be, what their economy is like. I'd imagine it's not made that much different. Have a driver change in a, in a Fanatec GT sprint race, which are out on. They don't have fuel stops. 777, very slow on track. It is very slow on track. And it is creeping towards... Yeah, there it is. Lights off ahead. It's just rolling. That's got no power. It's just lights off and it's just coasting down the hill towards... Is that down towards Mulsan? No, or, it's no? from Mulsan towards Indianapolis. This is coming up to um, Peter Dumbreck taking off territory. He's not even here to defend himself. No, but, but that's exactly where it is. I mean, that's the, why you've done it. The, the, the blessing is that he is here to, you know, to talk about it. And, uh, and actually, three, three years ago, went back to the place where it happened 20 years on. And it was quite an emotional little trip. Alan McNish and Louise Beckett went with him, filmed a little feature there. And it was, yeah, it was white hair on the back of the neck. You'll find that as well on the FIA WEC YouTube channel somewhere. That's, that's well worth looking at. Oh, Bamber in already. It just seems like yeah. just a minute or two ago that he was uh, 
in the pits getting into the car. So that's that first in for him has uh, flown by. Here is the D station, is a replay of it. Well, Fujisan immediately knows there's a problem because yeah. he flicks the indicator on and then all the lights go off and there's no one home. It's been a real journey for them so far, this Le Mans, hasn't it? This been not really hard work. Not that's gone a, their way. That's the second car they've brought to this race, and that one doesn't want to complete the race either. It goes to... Is that the drone? Yeah, it is a drone. That means I'm not sure it's a wire cam. Through the RFID logo to uh, pit exit there, and that's uh, the RFID measures the tyres. It uh, scans yeah. the tyres as they pass by. It should, it should actually, like a super, go bloop, bloop. Because that's exactly what it's doing. It's scanning it's the barcode. It? Inside the car. Yeah, scanning the noise. barcode on the... <laughs> on the thing. Bloop, bloop. And because I'm it is RFID. I'm in baggage area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please return to uh, yeah. check-in desk. Um, it would be nice as well, because is it RFID. It'd be great that we could see uh, at all times what tyres people are on. Yeah, we need to be pushing for that, definitely. We need, we at the very least, we need a, a timing screen page that tells us who's on what. The problem is, you know, in, in this build with 60 cars, we need two timing page screens just to see who's on what tyre. We could just come up on the, uh, it, on the, on the graphic, indeed. at least, on the screen indeed. that we see here. And actually, I think, I think, you know, the more we talk about that, the more often it, it's likely to be an issue, particularly now given hypercar, the growing birth of hypercar, and uh, actually, our, our, our graphics providers and our timing providers, Alcamel, uh, yeah, they're, they're always very keen to explore new ways of making it better. So I think that conversation needs to be had. Alcamel, by the way, celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been involved in this championship right from the outset. And there goes the rescue vehicle. I think that's on the way to help Fuji-san, Tomonobu Fuji in the D-Station car, and that is dead in the water at the moment. Now, if they can give him a tow to somewhere and he can get out safely and wiggle wigglers and fiddle with fiddly things and maybe occasionally hit something, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure what it is. You do have a toolkit inside the car for Le Mans. The only race that, where we would have a toolkit and uh, you, you you do go through with the engineers and mechanics as many possibilities as, as they can give you in terms of or in terms of how the car might not be able to get back to the pits in terms of what you need to do as a driver without the help of your mechanics to get the thing going again. But he remains I'm in the car. I'm afraid you can't leave that there, sir, he's saying. Quite possibly with a French accent that I won't insult any of our any of our French hosts by emulating. And again, you know, what one of the one of the features of this being a race in the centre of France is that a lot of the corner workers are French and they, they do speak English, they're multilingual, but or bilingual at least, but again you have a lot of the drivers who may have quite limited English. Um, because, again, they're not all necessarily native English speakers, so there can be communication problems between the marshals, the track workers and the team. There's some, uh, some gaffer that's not entirely staying on, and clearly they couldn't find any in the correct colour of orange for the ORT by TF Aston. Second in the GT3 class. I mean, this car is right in the thick of it. You've got the battle with the, the Kessel Racing, the yellow 57 car, the Car Guys livery Ferrari, the Iron Dames, the pink Porsche, and you've got the AF Corsa silver Ferrari 54 car that's now cycled back up to third. And then this car, the orange ORT by TF Sport car. So TF have had a, a bit of a tough time. They've had a torrid time with this car. This The second car entered this week as the 777, they had to ship one in overnight after free practice. The car was destroyed in free practice one. They had to ship it in overnight and rebuild it with the engine and transmission from 777 into what is John Hartshorn's regular European Le Mans series car. The uh, 72 car, the car that was the Roban brothers, and Vincent Asaclo, that's also run by TF Sport. That car is out of the race after an accident, uh, an accident that then uh, 
Were they running DMB? I don't think they were running the DMB car as well. That car had a minor incident and then would not go back into gear. And as a result, that Aston Martin ended up retired. They have also been running car number 923, the LMP2 car for Racing Team Turkey. That has now retired. So they have got one car left, and that is the ORT. Uh, well, possibly the 777 might come back, but right now they've only got one car that's behaving itself even remotely well. And for TF Sport, this will be remembered, I'm sure, as a very trying Le Mans 24 hours. Yeah, and it, you know, it all started in uh, so the free practice one yeah, session. When, uh, yeah, poor old Casper uh, Stevens when he lost it in turn five, exit of the S's, caught the slide, and then it just went the wrong way and went nose into the barrier, then got collected uh, yeah. by the number 13. No, town motorsport, town motorsport, motorsport, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and that was the big damage. I mean, the damage for the barriers was yeah. inconsequential. It was being thumped by uh, the number 13 car that had not slowed down in the yellow flag zone, and uh, that was what, yeah, ripped the front off the car, destroyed the 13 car chassis as well. That was replaced. There is the car, guys. Car, that's the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Daniel Serra leading, and we're on board with Jensen Button, who has now. Uh, crept up to 28th place, Ant, I'm afraid. Oh, Jens, what are you doing? <laughs> Stick to the programme, son. The idea is uh, <laughs> it's not about your five euros, it's about <laughs> driving the car as fast <laughs> as they possibly can as we head into the final 10 hours of the race. Jensen Button comes down the pit lane. It's great, isn't it? I mean, it has been such a good advert for, yep. to for a different series and this new concept of car for NASCAR. Well, smiles per mile, I would say to John Dooney, you know, there's 300,000 smiles a lap as that yeah. car goes around. Jimmy Johnson was saying, actually, when they were driving in behind the safety car earlier on, he, you know, they're toodling along doing, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, whatever. He, like all racing drivers, he's got plenty of time to, to take in the surroundings. So uh, he said, all the, girl, all the fans were waving at me, so I waved back at them. So during the, <laughs> during the safety car, period, really? he's driving. <laughs> yeah, while I'm out the window waving to everyone, well, not quite out the window because the window net, but yeah, waving to everybody as he was driving around, which undoubtedly didn't go down even remotely badly with the fans. They will have responded even more excitedly the next time of he came course. round. Yeah. Measuring the, uh, yeah, the brake, brake. Yeah, the brake uh, discs and uh, pads there. And the whole, the whole effort has been so professional. That, that yeah. I think, as a lasting memory from this year's Le Mans about that, the, the concept down in Garage 56. That's the thing that's going to really stick in the mind is that how, what a professional effort this has been. Well, I think you expect nothing less. You know, the, the kind of days of thunder built in a wooden barn by an old coot. Yeah, yeah. That, that's even then when that movie came out, that was reflective of a very much bygone era. The the kind of last of the single car owner drivers, the Dick Trickles of of, of this world, would, and Harry Gantz would do, were kind of you know on their in their last knockings there in the early 80s, and it it would be like Yost Team Audi going to NASCAR or going to the Daytona 500 with the car you know it would be damn good because they're the best at what they do. And Hendrick Motorsport, you know, you could have chosen Penske South or Chip Ganassi Racing or, or any one of half a dozen teams who would have done, you know, Richard Childress absolutely a standout job as well. It just happened to be the personal relationships with, with Rick Hendrick that, that got the whole thing rolling. And then you've got a, you know, you've got a stellar lineup. You've got a Formula One world champion who's not averse to peddling other things quickly. You've got a Formula One winner. You've got a seven-time Cup champion with, with, you know, his race engineer Chad Canals overseeing the whole thing. I mean, you just, you just can't go wrong. There's Tomonobu Fuji. I'm afraid for them. It looks like you just can't go right. I mean, you can see the car's not in its familiar bright green and black because it's had so many bits replaced, even in this race. And that does rather look like that is the end of the road for the 777 car. 
Okay, Ali, the track is back to green. The track is back to green. We lost about 40 seconds. The gap is 45 seconds. They lost 40 seconds. I just assumed it's because they did a tire change and Toyota didn't. But that radio message there, we lost 40 seconds. We saw it was a bit of a slow stop, didn't we? Yeah, 1 minute 18 for the number 8 Toyota, 1 minute 40 for Alessandro Pierre Guidi taking over the 51 car. Now, part of that should not have been the driver change because the driver change should be finished before the tyre change is finished. Or did they just lose that time with the slow zone lifting? Yes, the well, I, it, it, I think that was that message. I'm not sure yeah. why the pit stop was longer, but I think you're right, yes. yes. They got caught in a slow zone that Brendan Hartley had not got caught in. trying to figure out how that would have happened with Brendan being further down the road. Well, presumably Surely. it cleared. No, if it cleared it earlier. No, he, Brendan, at, at some stage, Alessandro Pierre Guidi must have gone into a slow zone that was not there when Brendan went past, sort of. But I'm just trying to work out how it would have happened. Yeah, usually it's the car in front, if when the zone is coming into play, and but the car in front just passes before it goes active when the car behind comes into it. That's how yeah. you lose an awful lot of time with yeah. the car behind. Well, that's what must have happened. If there was a slow zone for Fuji, then Brendan Hartley must have gone by him before the slow zone was activated. And then, OK, then Pierre, Gui uh, yeah. uh, Pierre, Pierre Guidi comes into it, and it is a slow zone, it and then have been he it, loses that it, time. It wouldn't have been it lifting. No, it, it, was been, it, it would have been, been when it got to put, yeah. Exactly. GT battle here, we can see a lot more of it now. Uh, some of the cars perhaps we might not have... Ex well, I, 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 actually, I will withdraw that. Not, not have expected to be going well, but have had a clean race and not been spoken about a lot. GR Racing, that's one of them. Right behind Gunnar Jeanette is Ricardo Pera, and right behind him... Is that a... Battle for position. No, it's the it's the the Falcon Horst uh, Ferrari, which is a couple of laps back. Jeff Seagal, the American driver in the blue and black 100 car. But there is the uh, split personality, the two-face, if you like, of this race. The GR Racing car. GR Racing comes from Golf Racing. Originally, the cars were in Golf livery, sponsored by Golf Oil, and they were they were Golf Racing. And then uh, the sponsorship deal ended, but, and so they couldn't call themselves Golf Racing, so they called themselves GR Racing, as opposed to G Racing. I don't know, you know, whatever. Uh, but that's, uh, so their livery then became a sort of uh, gloss and matte black with orange highlights. There you can see it. So if you're on the outside of the circuit for the race, it looks like the normal GR car. If you're on the inside of the circuit for the race, it looks like the old GR car. And here he goes, trying to put the move in. And goes by Gunnar Jeanette. So good pass there. That was for position. Uh, T-Rexes are everywhere in the uh, Project One garage. And again, that Project One car has been cycling in and out of the lead group with differing pit stops. Oh, Jonas Reed! In the barriers, that's a replay. Is that a recent replay? That is recent. It's just happened. That is Jonas Reed, I'm sure, in the 88 car. There's a double yellow at Marshall Post 24 25. Yeah, so that is zone. Indianapolis. It is 88. It is Jonas Reed, the son of Christian Reed, the team owner of Proton Competition. Oh. That was a pretty hefty hit to the barrier. Lots of debris to uh, collect as well for the marshals. So, yeah, the slow zone is coming. You carry a lot of speed through the right-hander there, and you have to get rid of it before the left-hander, which is a lot slower. Driver change in the 50 car. And that is currently... Hang on, where have they dropped down to? Why am I not seeing that? Am I looking down too far and not up high enough? I was I just looking it out as we watch uh, the Ferrari <laughs> 50 in the pits there. I'm looking right 
across Ant and he's looking <laughs> left across me. We, we should each look at the opposite screen. So I'm looking at the circuit map, so you'll be pleased to hear this time around that uh, car eight and 51 are unaffected by this snow zone that's just appeared into Indianapolis this time around. So that's yeah. going to be even Stevens for them. Uh, no winner or loser. Oh dear, that's a very slow stop what for the 50 on? Ferrari. They're getting tired. It's their first 24 hour race as opposed to test. Miguel Molina bringing the car in. I think that's Antonio Fuoco taking it out. Didn't quite see the helmet as he got in. And uh, no, I think that's, no, it's Nick Molina Nielsen. In. Yeah. that's No, that's Nick Nielsen in the 50 uh, car. Uh, slow zone is now in place. And this is on the run into Indianapolis. Yeah, so car eight, our race leader, is Brendan Hartley coming out of the second chicane now. Oh, the GR Asia car very late, accelerated out of Mulsanne corner, had not been told by the team of the slow zone, and it suddenly flashed up in his periphery and on his dash. Big lock-up of those rear tyres. And those are the things that gain you a penalty going into a slow zone too fast. Interestingly, just listening to that uh, and the gear shifts on the Ferrari, every time they upshift, you hear momentarily it harvests mm. some energy. Or maybe it's deploying. When it, it goes through the gear shift, it goes oh, up, up through the gears. It I think it deploys, deploying, yeah. I guess, because it's then, because it's there is a momentary bit, even in a flat shift where it's not at full revs. So, well, all, all the, although the engine will be at full revs, it can't be transmitting all the power because you've got to change the gear somewhere. So there's a little brief burst to keep the the power up to maximum, keep momentum going. Yeah. You know, if you think of, if think of that. Oh yeah, Jonas Reed. Oh, that Nasty. was a big one. That was a big one. If you think about it in your road car, you know, if when you push down the clutch and change gear, even if it only takes half a second, if you have sensitive electronics, that half a second, it can drive you along and replace that gap with the hybrid power. That's exactly what they're doing then, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so in, in between that And then that so moment, you've still got full drive as well as full throttle. Because you're not allowed to boost on top of, when I say boost, I mean yeah. the, the hybrid power of the, uh, from the battery. You're not allowed to have an additional yeah. boost on top of the internal combustion power. So when you're changing gear and I, I suppose they're clutching and it's got, you, you're not allowed quick shift in these in this category of racing. And now, Formula see, one. that's what you see inside the car. And that's where the slow zone starts. So it comes up where you, when you're in the previous Marshall's post sector, it comes up next slow. That means you are in the deceleration zone and you must be aware of where it's going to be. Now, if you're coming down to Mulsan Corner, you're breaking down anyway to the slowest part of the track. You know it's not there. So when you start to turn the corner, accelerate out, you know it's going to be in front of you. There's really no excuse for missing that and, and breaking late. That was Ricardo Pera in the GR racing car, just pushing on really hard, trying to close on the lead group. Uh, I, I, think it, I think it's a, a rule that needs tweaking as well. I, I, the more I think about it, the more I think the next slow, I think it has to disappear. But, it, but you have to have the warning, otherwise people, you don't. Will, will, people will get to the 80k line doing 200 miles an hour. That's exactly what we do anyway. And that's what caught out Kobayashi in the cars behind. Yeah. Driver is a driver reacting to the next slow, thinking they're in a slow zone, yeah. and they slam the anchors on. Yeah. Usually or it's an amateur driver. Or slowing down in yeah. the next slow they zone. They get confused for the line. Yeah. yeah. And that's how Kobayashi's not in this race anymore. Yeah. Because he did the, the right thing by not overtaking the car that slammed the anchors on in the next slow. That's the difference between a 100% pro and some of the other drivers. So if you think about it, we, we're used to seeing the orange board. Oh, hang on. That, he shouldn't have done that. No. He released, he released it too early. Did you see that? Yeah. He released the, uh, the full course yellow button too early before 
Oh, but you, no. could, you could still see on his dash it said yeah. yellow, slow zone. So, yeah, that was an error. Six o'clock in the morning. We have just under 10 hours of racing still to go here at Le Mans 24 hours. Martin Haven and world champion Anthony Davidson watching the action with you wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good grief, is it really that time? Uh, let's hope that you've got a little bit of time to spend with us towards the end of what has been so far an enthralling and captivating Le Mans 24 hours. The first of, well, actually, we talked to it was the president John Doonan about the beginning of a golden era. He said, I would argue this is the beginning of a platinum era of sports car racing. And actually, I think there's probably quite a lot of mileage in that as hypercar really comes of age here in the centenary Le Mans. And, and Davidson, we just saw from the onboards there, the light coming into the sky, it's starting to really become daylight now. If you look to the to the east, it's still quite dark, but in the west, the sun is still soon going to start creeping over the trees, over the horizon. It's six o'clock in the morning in the middle of summer. You know, the birds are tweeting. It's, it's daylight. Tomorrow is here. Yeah. So the 33 Corvette heading out into the growing light. There is a slow zone down from Mulsanne Corner to Arnage because of a high speed incident at Indianapolis for young Jonas Reed, the teenage son of Christian Reed, the Proton competition boss, the 88 Proton Porsche coming at speed from the right hander, the early part of Indianapolis. And then it looked like dropping a wheel on the dirt on the right hand side. And there you can see the marshals there sweeping up the oil. So I wonder whether he had an oil line leaking onto the tires. I, you would assume then he, he would not have made it around the right hand part of Indianapolis. Whereas in fact, he didn't make it around the left hand side. I think that area there being so close to the left hander, he had already hit the barrier. And maybe it's when he hit the barrier, that's when the whole load of oil and fluid spewed out of the car. Yeah, look, they're very yeah. deep into the corner. And that's pretty much, well, yeah, look, you can see the tire yeah. marks, hits the barrier to the right. Wow. And then, yeah, all the fluids would have been pouring out of the car. Looks like the car in the right-hander maybe caught, carried a little too much speed in, and then the car's trying to spin, and he's trying to brake, and then oh, it's off in and into the barrier. so easily done. It's one yeah. of those corners where you have to lift off and sort of roll into it, and you can gain lap time by pushing that limit a little bit through the right-hander. But the key is for Indianapolis to straight line the braking zone. If you, if you carry too much speed through the right, the chances are you're going to have to start slowing down as you're still turning right. And that puts too much energy through the rear of the car and uh, it becomes a big pendulum, basically. And that's yeah. uh, what I saw happen in that that's, moment. Uh, yeah, especially in a 911. Oh, I mean, yeah. Historically, they've always had that. It's more of a mid-engine car than a rear-engined car now with the, the engine not hanging out behind the gearbox. It's ahead of the gearbox, but still mid-engine cars. If you change your mind, they tend not to like it. We've got a good race on our hands here because the Ferrari, certainly through the night time, has had a little bit of a speed advantage over the Toyota that we're watching on screen now. The sole Toyota remaining in this race after Kobayashi was on fairly wiped out of the running, uh, doing the right thing, not overtaking a slower car, like we were just saying, that had slammed the anchors on in a, in a next slow zone rather than the actual slow zone. Kobayashi didn't overtake the car, and the punishment was cars coming up behind him, not expecting the car to be going so slowly. Absolutely, in this part of the track here, uh, actually on the S exit of the S's, slammed into the back of uh, uh, one of the GT Ferraris. That then in turn hit Kobayashi, and then on top of that, it was like a double-pronged attack. He got hit again by uh, one of the LMP2 cars, the 35 uh, LMP2 car, the, the Alpine, and was out of the race. Yep. So, uh, but we've got a race in our hands with the, the remaining Toyota because the Ferrari is slightly faster on pace. The gap's gone down from 44 seconds to 41 seconds with nine and a half hours remaining. And most of that gap is because the Ferrari chasing the Toyota arrived at the scene of an incident where 
the Toyota had got through and there hadn't been a slow zone, the Ferrari hit the slow zone. It was a short one, so we only lost 40 seconds, but only 40 seconds is a heck of a lot. You have to be a lot faster per lap for a lot of laps to make up that 40 second loss. And that, unfortunately, is just slightly the luck of the draw. There's the number seven garage door shut at Toyota. Number seven one remains open. But uh, yeah, it's going to take a long while to get that 40 seconds back, especially against Brendan Hartley, who is definitely, or has so far this season, been the real strong force in that number eight Toyota trio. Well, I mean, not to, yeah, I don't want to, I, I agree with you for the majority of the season, but this race, particularly at the very beginning, Buemi put in a stellar mm -hmm. performance to properly hold his own. You're going to see another shot here of the car going out. He went a little bit wide in the beginning, carried a bit too much speed, got slightly off, off the cambered part of the road over the crest. There's like a crest there. And he went off a little bit too wide. He didn't hug the inside enough. This is going to be a long fix because they need to repair that barrier. Yeah. He'll be desperately disappointed, Jonas Reed. There's Thomas Floor. His 54 Ferrari, the Kessel Racing car leads, but the 54 uh, AF Corsa car is in fourth place. Davide Regon has just stopped. And uh, remained in the car. Gunnar Jeanette in fifth place in the Project 1 AO car remained in the car as well. And the performance of the GTE AM cars seems to vary sometimes. Sometimes one car will sort of be relatively common at the top of the pile cycling up and down up and down with pit stops and then it'll sort of fade away a bit and that tends to be depending on whether you've got a platinum a gold a silver or a bronze driver in in the lineup and in gte am you have to have a bronze and a silver driver you can then have a gold or a platinum and so it depends on the relative pace of who's in at what time um, each of the graded drivers has to do a minimum based on their license status and nobody can do more than a set maximum but it's where they race against each other that will make the difference. Del Rio's first chicane, it's still wet offline of the first chicane, turn eight right there. Copy. Just take margin there at the beginning. Which is exactly the message that we heard two stints ago Seb, have you got any words for Brendan? Yes, it's uh, stay on the racing line. Stay on the racing line in the first chicane. It's still wet. Now, that was an hour and a half ago. And we're now looking at him, exactly the same message to Rio Hirakawa, who is clearly going to take over. Well, not immediately. He's got still 40% energy left to use in the car. So that'll be, uh, what, maybe three more laps. But just, yeah, you know, Rio's clearly suited up got the headset on probably not yet got his helmet on but listening in okay what can you tell me and and that's the message basically car seems to be good Sebastian Buemi was sort of chasing the setup a little bit as the as the night came towards an end and the track dried out Brendan's much less vocal on the radio at least we hear much less of him on the radio asking about changes to set up Seb's always trying to nurse the car and chase the car Brendan Maybe less so, maybe we just hear less of it. But uh, again, passing those messages on. And, and Anthony, you know, when you're in the car and you've been in it for an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, you've got a really good feel for the racetrack and you want to pass as much of that knowledge on as you can without trying to do it in the doorway of the car in the, in the frantic nature of a, of a pit stop. That's what sports car racing is all about. You're sharing that car with two other drivers and you want to, like you say, pass on all of your experiences to the driver eagerly waiting to get into the car, but also build them a picture of how the track has changed. I mentioned when I was, I was on, the, on the mic earlier on, in an earlier part of the race, that you know, when you're out there, you're, you're building this picture yourself and the, the track is an ever-changing thing mm. and you follow it when you're in the car. And when you're out of the car, it's like you're missing, missing part of a movie. You're then trying to catch back up on and you, somebody's trying to basically fill in the missing pieces before you get back in or get get watching it again. And uh, so, yeah, it, it really is filling in those pieces saying, right, yeah, look, the wind direction has changed. The car's now got great grip through Tetra Rouge. 
where the Ferrari comes flying past now. And then, yeah, first chicane, still wet on the outside, stick to the racing line, don't touch the kerb on the inside. It's basically like passing on rally notes almost yep. to the next driver getting it. And it's, it, you sit there listening to it all, thinking, right, okay, right, yeah, okay, got that. And you're, built, you're trying to drive a lap in your mind before you get into the car, and it really does help. And part parcel of being a sports car driver, and it, it's also part and parcel of being part of a professional outfit like Toyota or yeah. Ferrari, any of the front-running teams up and down the, uh, the the different categories that we have here. And it was something I always tried to do as well, particularly in the latter part of my career, uh, driving at Jota and Dragon Speed when I drove with Roberto Gonzalez, a, a, a amateur driver, silver graded driver. And the more you could help him, the more you could help the, the AM drivers, the faster your overall car crew would be. And uh, they almost took even more. You needed to to, to push that along uh, even more. And I would almost give a, an entire debrief on my in-lap quite often as exactly what the car was doing. So braking into Molsan corner. Car feels good, keep the car straight. On the exit, a little bit of instability. Don't touch the curb there. Uh, you know, stones on the approach to Indianapolis on the outside, stay inside into that corner. And I would do this as I went through my lap, bring it into the pits and, uh, and, and Roberto would be there listening. Oh, look at this. Look at this barrier repair going on. This is going to be a long time. Well, a lot of the time you see the big grinders in because when the barriers bend, the bolts aren't necessarily coming out very easy so you normally have to grind the nut off hammer the bolt out and then put in a new barrier and then it will bolt back together and Ferrari would be thinking you know I know there's nine hours 40 minutes remaining but they're thinking come on the, the longer it stays like this there's less of the racetrack that we can make inroads into that gap that uh, Brendan Hartley's got over us we want the track to go full green as quickly as possible El Bamba attacks the uh, Dunlop chicane up and over the crest into the S's. He's driven a fantastic race. All of them have driven a fantastic race. Uh, Richard Westbrook as well, who shares the car with him, of course, and Alex Lynn. A stellar performance through the night stints. And they're still up there in uh, P3, a podium position at this point for uh, that number two car. And one of the joys of the hypercar class being so large is not just that we've got lots of good cars so we've got a stellar array of drivers you've got some really fabulous sports car drivers a lot of whom have been racing consistently but not in the world championship they've been racing in the imsa weathertech series across the atlantic and we haven't seen a lot of them and now more and more manufacturers turning up here at le mans means more and more of the stars that we know and like uh, and love, you know, we can we can watch them in action. It's a battle here in LMP2. That's the third place car. Duquesne Engineering's Nicola Pino and the man who started on pole position in the car that he had qualified on pole, Paul Luc Chatin for Edex Sports, a number uh, 28 car in uh, Pegapon, number 48 car in fourth place. Where did 28 come from? 48 car in uh, fourth place, Paul Le Chatin closing in on a potential podium spot. Yeah, great stuff in LMP2 as always. Here we have the graphics at the bottom of the screen. Edek, like you say, with that driver on board. Chatin was on pole position, a fantastic uh, lap, but uh, gone are the memories of that moment for him, I'm mm. sure, right now. Yeah, I don't... I don't think you think about qualifying the moment the race starts, do you? No, I, I think, I, you know, I always said that it was uh, it was a, a nice thing to uh, flex the muscles about who had the fastest lap in qualifying, but it it rarely translated into any, <laughs> uh, you know, into anything when it came down to race day. Well, ask the man who set the fastest ever qualifying lap, Martin, uh, Mark Blundell. Martin Blundell, Mark Blundell. That didn't translate that well into race time, I'm afraid, for the uh, Nissan R90CK. It was uh, it was not a great race for them. Down to 41 seconds now, the Ferrari versus the uh, the Toyota. 
started at 44 as we keep an eye on that. These guys have just come into the slow zone that takes you towards Indianapolis. There's the Jota number 28 that just uh, yep. passes by. That is not on the same lap as They're the way down lead now. LMP2 drivers. Yeah, Jota have had a... They're a P8 in yeah. the LMP2. They've had a bit of a tough time, haven't they? They are actually two cars back on the road. Robin Freins in the WRT car number 31 is in seventh place, as you can see on the timing column on the left-hand side. The car Robin in the depths of a double stint at the moment. Vector Sport have sort of slipped a little bit down the order. They were actually in the top two or three uh, in the early hours of the night time. That car now down to ninth place in LMP2, car number 10. Ryan Cullen is at the wheel of that car, head of the uh, AF Corsa car, which had problems early on. Ben Barnica is still the Pro-Am leader, though, in 10th place overall in LMP2, ahead of Algar Pro's James Allen. That is second in Pro-Am. And the cool racing car number 37 is 15th or overall, or 15th in LMP2, and that is third in the Pro-Am class. Well, out of the slow zone at the exit of Arnage, you can see Paul-Luc Chatin already shaping up to have a go at the decade engineering yeah. car of Nico Pino, and as they go green There's the there, line. You, you can only act or deactivate the full course yellow button on the line and immediately trying to get some temperature back into those Goodyear tyres. Well, the fact of it, as we saw from an onboard earlier, is you can deactivate it any time you like, but you will get a penalty if you do it before the end of the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. We're still waiting to see that, by the way. I, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he didn't overspeed that much, but uh, yeah, this battle continues. Uh, P3, P4. And uh, tyre warming, slash stroke, trying to break slipstream, weaving around. Right, at that low speed, there's not a slipstream too broken, so he was just trying to make sure he had enough heat in the tyres, because yeah. the next... Wait, once you leave... going, though, didn't it, down yeah. the whole stage? But once you leave Arnage, what's the next big challenge? Turning into the Porsche curves, you don't want to find out your tyres are a bit cold there, do you? Because then you, you don't. don't turn into the Porsche curves, you turn it. into the barriers. He's made, a, he's made a real pig's ear of that yeah. final chicane, though. And uh, that's opened him up for Chatan to have a look down the inside into turn one, but he hasn't quite got the momentum. But it was uh, he left himself a bit vulnerable there. Very hard to overtake in an LMP2 car around this track. You often need the help of some slower cars that you have to work your way past. And again, Chatan getting the drive out of the Dunlop chicane. S tries to stick his nose down the inside into the S's, but uh, nothing doing there. The, uh, Slow cars or faster cars often will, will sort of duck in between two rivals. It's going to be possible between these two, but they are kind of glued close together. You're going to, if, you're a, if you're a hyper car, you're going to want to take both of them or neither. And you see that natural separation with the, uh, the aerodynamics taking play through the S's and through Tetra Rouge. So the LMP2 cars, they almost seem to get affected more so than the hyper cars in that, uh, in that area. So, uh, yeah, a bit of turbulence. It's not much, but it's just enough to uh, take away that immediate threat down into, uh, say, the first chicane like we have here. You can close back up in the slower corners. In the higher speed corners, that, that separation starts again. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello, yeah, Graham. Yeah, the young Chilean there, not uh, letting himself be intimidated by the much, much more experienced and pole sitting, remember, uh, Paul up Chatham. Yeah. Paul uh, had a great run in qualifying, and the team were an absolutely berserk. Their first World Endurance Championship pole position, pole position at Le Mans in the class. I mean, that is an epic result for this small French team. Paul of Chatel has been part of this setup for a long time, and actually, his full time job is with them as an engineer rather than as a driver. Uh, Paul Luc with a solid engineering background, employed by Ed Exports, uh, not just, as I say, for a skill behind the wheel, but uh, with a variety of... Um, absolutely true, Anthony's looking at me saying, what, an, an engineer? He is, he's an engineer. A bit like uh, Mark Lieb. Correct. Yeah, yes. I, I didn't realise. Head of Sport Communications, I think, at Porsche now, Mark Lieb. Yeah, but I'm, well, that's a revelation to me there, yep. Graham. You're, 
Uh, look at Optimal that. Optimal knowledge. Me walking in completely jaded, having turned up. Apologies, 25 you, you minutes didn't, late. You didn't watch all of last year's All Access programs then, did you? Oh, no. no, because they're so much better, the full access this year. So that's why you should be watching this year, definitely. Full, full access, huh? What's that? There was, there was, a, there was a, a, a feature in, uh, in full access last year in the id export team. So, uh, yeah. Full access, yeah, the, uh, the series that's put together, mini that's like documentary from uh, Fly on the Wall, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, after each race. After a week or so goes by, you see it on YouTube. Just, just YouTube full access is absolutely brilliant. The inside story, from a from driver's point of view, team's point of view, all of the, all of the the, the juicy moments that happen from a human aspect in in racing throughout the weekend, uh, or, or a, a long race that we have here at Le Mans. And it really gives you that insight, the full access that we have within WEC. A um, little bit like the, the Drive to Survive uh, on, on, on Netflix. It's yep. a little bit like that, but uh, like I say, a little bit more, a little bit more human. It tells the human side of the story, and uh, I, I, I find it, I find it fascinating. I've loved it this year. They're longer versions. It's usually 30, 35 minutes long, uh, easy to digest, and it really gives you uh, such a good insight into what goes into the race, an endurance race. From, yeah, I, I love them. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't watch them uh, much last year, but, uh, yeah, this year's I found them just easier to follow. And the, and the other thing to say is that those programmes are longer. Why? Because the fans wanted them longer. Yeah. And I think you're right, it suits the format far, far better. And incidentally, if you are a fan of sports car racing, and if you weren't, I think you may well be after <laughs> you've watched a bit of Le Mans, despite my witterings. Um, the FIA World Endurance Championship and the Motorsport Network have just launched this weekend the latest fan survey. Now, they've done this with Formula One before in the FIA, and they have, in fact, done it with World Endurance in the FIA before. Paul Luc Chateau trying to nip a little inch on the corner there, and Nico Pino right on the ragged that edge as he great. got to the, uh, to, to the line. Uh, clearly, they're not going to need those tyres again. But, yeah, you can... Uh, you can partake in the next few months in the fan survey and tell people what you'd like. And, and actually, if you want more content, if you want longer content, if you want more explanation, if you want more stuff about the teams and drivers, then demand it. Now, yeah. this is a team effort right here. So the two drivers been going at it the whole time, desperate for the 10th here, a 10th there, playing cat and mouse with the turbulence, like I, like I mentioned before. Now, the team effort comes into play. Who can turn these cars around faster? And we often see a bit of separation between the LMP2 teams. We're having a replay of this moment as they both came into the pits. There is uh, Pino and uh, behind him, Chatan just desperate to catch a little bit of extra distance, but actually ended up losing because of it, going off track momentarily or off pit lane. Uh, just popping up, by the way, on something scoring. Ten seconds added to the next pit stop of car 41. That is, was the uh, the leader LMP2 in LMP2. Leader, yeah, till... uh, causing a collision with car three at MP th uh, th Marshall's post 35. Now, That's the I caddy. don't think we saw that. Marshall's post 35 uh, is the Ford end chicane. of the Ford chicane. That is uh, into the final element of it. Robert Kubica is on pit lane now, or just actually no, off pit lane left, now. Yeah. So I suspect that penalty has not yet been served. It will be no, next. He took, he took it over from Robin Frines, so somewhere in that. So Robin's had a, uh, some kind of biff, hasn't he? Well, he hasn't had a biff. He's biffed the number three caddy, because obviously, if any bad luck is going anyway, it's going the number three Cadillac's way, because they have had a tough time enough already. But that car is in fifth place. Renger van der Sander at the wheel. You said that was the 41 car, though. Yes, the 41 Fri WRT. Fri is the 31. I beg your pardon, so... Yeah, uh, Frines yeah, is no, 31. Fri no, Frines is, is Sorry, still in Robin. the... Sorry, uh, Robin. Yeah, no, Frines is still in the 31, so who was in the 41? Uh, Kubitz is in there now, but... Yes, yeah, so uh, he's just taken over. 
Uh, to the are. lead, by the way, back to the lead. And I don't want to miss this moment because it's quite, been quite an astonishing day for the 34 into Europe World competition car. Oh, yet mm. again, consistency and speed. And Fabio Scherer, who, which is a name I seem to have been saying quite a lot this season, um, into Europol. 11th place overall, um, and have been circling around first and second place for, where are we now? Uh, this is, well, I'd, I'd say seven or eight hours. Uh, we're, getting up, we're getting close to uh, 14 hours, 15 hours into the race. Um, it was Lou Delatraz who handed over to Robert Kubica oh, in the well, 41 car. So Delatraz too had an incident with somebody. I, I don't uh, think we saw it. it well, uh, if it was, you did, well done. We didn't. It was uh, well. If it was the caddy, it was number three. Car was the one that we were told he'd made contact with. Well, that uh, ten extra ten seconds to the next pit stop cycle will not drop it from its second position in class. But what it is going to do is to very much hurt. It, what is basically a battle around strategy with the inter Europol car, which is on pit lane now. So they're pretty much well, within a lap on the same fuel strategy at the moment. We'll see what the gap is going to be. This is going to cycle back to the 41 being in the lead in LMB2. Quick check of all the tyres there. You see the uh, one of the tyre engineers from Goodyear with a torch out studying. All four of them, yeah, the thumbs up at the back of the car there and he's, as he walks off. Fuel going in. New tyres are sitting there ready. And uh, they were there just as a precaution. So, uh, yeah, that's why that's why you saw the, uh, the guy from Goodyear walking around. Just check in before you send the car back out there on the same set of tyres through the RFID and back out onto the, the racetrack. So, yeah. Really strong effort so far from into Europol. You know, and, this is uh, particularly Fabio Scherer, who's driving with a broken ankle. You're kidding broken, me. Broken foot. Oh, you don't his know either. Was, no. no, his foot was run over by the Corvette. We saw him hopping around the car in the driver I, change. I cannot imagine. Uh, by the way, that 10 seconds is going to hand the lead back to into Europol if positions are retained. The, the gap as the 34 car leaves pit lane and crosses the first timing. Beam is about three and a half seconds, so that ten seconds could cost them a mon. So the, ir uh, the irony here is Swiss driver Fabio Scherer in the Polish sponsored and entered car is chasing Polish driver Robert Kubica in the, in the uh, Belgian entered car for the lead of this race. No, Scherer, I'm sure they said his foot is broken. Uh, and it probably feels like it has been run over by a racing well, car. Well, I saw him hobbling to the car, Graham, and I, yeah. I yeah. thought, you yeah. oh, know, what's he done? Just hobbling around, had a little bit of a, a joke with Martin. He said, oh, no, he's, he's broken his foot. Yeah. I said, oh, it must have been an old injury then, and he's carried through Le Mans, but, you know, that must be uncomfortable driving the car like that. He couldn't bear any weight on his left foot. How and then Martin said, yeah, he, he apparently it happened during this event. How yeah. on earth? Is he functioning at this level? Uh, the other quick thing to say, by the way, uh, the, the thought that's only just occurred to me, if you're Polish, what the heck do you back here in LMP2? Is Robert it? Kibica. And absolutely. Robert Kibica, without question. He's it's an Robert absolutely Kibica. massive star in Poland, but boy, oh boy, do these guys need to turn their attention to what's going on here with this team that is based uh, in their homeland. The fan Poland. base around Robert Kibica is... It's phenomenal. It's it, honestly, it's, it's huge. Uh, but yeah, great that uh, that the Polish team is uh, doing the business, and they've had uh, they've been here a, a long time in LMP2, plodding away, uh, trying to perfect things. And they come here with a great driver lineup and, uh, and a car that seems to be right on the pace all the time. So yeah, share up at the wheel at the moment, really, it's phenomenal. He, he, dry, I'm sure he's having to right foot brake. I was saying to Martin earlier on, I, I'm sure he's a left foot breaker naturally, but I'm, I'm convinced there's no way he'll be able to put uh, no, 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 that brake is the... Oh, big shot for the number 18. Oh, no, another one. We've just That's seen that, Jonas that is... Reed about half an hour ago wreck the car in Indianapolis. That's why the barrier repairs are going on. And this is the number 80 AF Corsa car. It's a pro-am leader. And that is... 
Well, it says Ben Barnica, that's not Ben's helmet. No. Ben's got a yellow helmet. Oh, did something break there? It's not the first and won't be the last accident that we see. That is not the beginning of the Porsche curves. That was a high speed off, and that car is unlikely to go much further. It is. I'm sure it's Ben Barnico. Well, that's well, that's Francois Perodo. Yeah. So it ain't Francois. That's for sure. I swear, Ben Barnico has got a yellow helmet. Hey, there is some yellow on it. Look, has he got it... a tribute livery on it of some kind? Oh, if that was driver error, Ben would be absolutely gutted with himself. Um, I, I need to see another shot of it, but uh, it looked like the car just didn't respond very well over the bump at all on the rear. Almost as if something on the right rear broke. It, was, it snapped around that quickly, and it happened very early on in the corner as well. There was a lot of spark going for the car yeah. as well. That well, is Ben Barnacote's helmet. Uh, we have got quite substantial slow zone now from Mulsan corner all the way to Arnage and through the Porsche curves. There was a brief one at the exit of the first chicane as well on the Mulsan, but that is being withdrawn. But as you could see from the power, the energy remaining, number eight Toyota is due in, 51 Ferrari is due in, Cadillac will be due in a lap later. And that is Ben Barnicote, and that is the end of the race for the number 80 AF Corsa LMP2 car. High speed impact with the barriers. You can see how much the barriers are there to protect drivers and their cars from the concrete walls. That part of the track has been a graveyard for a bit, hasn't it? Let's have a look. Oh, oh came in sideways. He was losing it all the way in there. I don't know, you know, let's push it again. Oh, he has a look down the... Hit the curb. Hit the, the curb and... Oh, he was in the traffic, wasn't he? And he had a look to the inside, and that put him off line, but he wasn't on his usual racing line as he committed to that second left. Oh, Ben. So easily done, just... Yep. He's, he's just wrong line that was the problem yeah he had a look and you feel you just you, you feel that responsibility right there and then you know you've got a, the, the the paying driver of uh, Perodo who you're driving for you feel that responsibility and you've just you've, you've let you've let them down and it happens to it can happen to the best drivers out there Ben is a he's a remarkably good racing driver and uh, he's driven a great race today, oh. but um, his, his, his gutting out. one just it goes to show one moment where you get it wrong, and the whole race is thrown well, away. I mean, you know, Ben has been a winner. Francois Perodo has been a winner. A championship winner four times as the, the uh, Toyota, by the way, comes uh, into the pit lane. But Francois too knows what one moment can do to ambition here for himself and with Corvette, of course, uh, last year. He'll know that feeling. It won't make him any less di uh, less yep. uh, disappointed. Leaders, the, leaders are both in. You saw Brendan Hartley in the number eight Toyota and in two comes Alessandro Pierre Guidi. There's quite a lot of cars coming in, in fact, because you can see the uh, Garage 56 entry, the 24 Chevy Camaro, and uh, one of the Glickenhouses in, 708. The 93 Peugeot of jean eric Van is in as well. Fresh tyres going on to what the tires number eight car. Are they? We've got the new. I would imagine on them. still going to be a soft. It's not that warm outside. Has that Camaro had a single major drama? Don't even start. Oh, why would you say Don't that? Don't even start. There you go. We're in the in the back, something I, uh, we, not when I've been on air have we seen clearly. Actually, is the pit stop. Everywhere else, the door opens, the drivers change. In the Camaro, there is no opening door. They climb in and out the window like the Duke's a hazard. Yep, burglar style. Oh, why am I really struggling to see the, the, the graphic on the, that tyre? I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's the, the It's white, just in the wrong place. There's only one the little diamond. tab. It's only a couple of win inches wide. And if it's not, if the tyre's gone on with it at the bottom and we're not seeing it in the shot, we're just not seeing it in the shot. Five seconds added to the next pit stop time for the number six Porsche. That will be, was a pit stop infringement. One would presume in the pit stop they've just had. Yeah. 
it, and it tends to be well, the last one we found out about for uh, one of the cars was that all of their mechanics were not back behind the white line before the engine was started and it will be some relatively trivial thing change of lead for well it's no. not the lead yet for an mp2 but oh no it is it is the lead this is uh, it is the lead fabio scherer no it's not change is it because robert kubica was ahead of fabio no, scherer and it was, scherer, so. was in, scherer was in the lead uh sure was in the lead before the pit stop cycle uh the 41 car uh, took the lead through Wait. that pit stop cycle, but has well, got no, 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 no. but no. has got a 10 second. Fa Fabio Scherer was chasing Robert Kubica After unless the pit he passed stop. him. No, unless he literally a lap ago, unless he passed him and then he's been repassed, no. he was chasing Kubica. 41 led. Yes. Pitted. Scherer then led for a lap. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, we then had the two pit stops. Right, during so which so the, 41, really lead, the 41 was yeah, waiting for the stop. The okay. 41 was then dealt a 10 second penalty at its next stop. Yeah. And Shara uh, emerged in the pit something like four seconds back. So, in very short order, he's pulled back almost four, four seconds yeah. on the Formula One yeah. race winner and is putting the nose up the inside there just to remind him he's there. And uh, to remind everybody watching uh, this, the driver chasing has done that with a broken foot. Putting the uh, nose up the exhaust pipe of Robert Kubitz's uh, WRT car. As much as we've you know, been singing his praises, what he did, did there in the in karting, I don't think that's in the spirit of no. being in a slow zone. I'm not sure. I mean, it's by the book, nothing wrong, but that's not the spirit of the slow no. zone, almost making contact why, with another car. Why is the slow zone there? Exactly. It is, it's, it is one thing you absolutely do not want the slow zone, is another incident. And he almost hit him there. Yes, but, you know, and you're not allowed to put your car alongside in a slow zone. But uh, don't forget that they are on a limiter button. They are not doing it with their foot. So some teams, and we've talked about this before, will go closer to the limit. And if the limit is 80 k's, some cars, some teams will try and set it at exactly 80. Some will give themselves maybe a kilometer an hour or maybe two of leeway just so they don't incur a huge penalty for a tiny advantage or lack of disadvantage in the slow zone. So if one's doing 79 and one's doing 80 behind it, and they're only a quarter of a car length apart anyway, then you are going to see that gap close because they're so dramatically tight. Yeah, you'll see the gap close, definitely, and uh, it's frustrating when... Uh... What? 101 laps? Have they not been able to get the rear tyre off that car? That can't be right. But the right rear is shown as to having done 101 laps. That can't be right. Compared to the 50 on Robert Kubitz's what, car. Seven hours. 101 laps around an eight and a half mile circuit. Well, I mean, has, he, has he got a broken foot and a left rear wheel that won't come <laughs> off? A right rear wheel that won't come off? I would, I'd love to know if that, that can What are they going to do right? now? Make him drive blindfold? So what, a stint is what? 14 laps? 12 laps? 13 laps? Yeah. In the LMP2. Eight yeah. stints. Uh, LMP2... Uh, 10, 11 laps. It's, it seems unlikely <laughs> that it's done 101 laps. But bearing in mind that the leader has only done 196 laps, that's literally <laughs> half the race. Yeah, let's ignore that. But going back to that slow zone bit, you know, yes, okay, there will be some discrepancy between speed to cars, but it still doesn't mean you could make contact with another car or shove it down the inside well, just you, because you, another team is being a little bit more conservative with their speed limiter. You're in a double wave yellow yep. safety zone, safety zone, and you're nearly making contact. The problem no, is that no, the no. danger in removing the limiter is the car immediately lunges forward because you've still got your foot on the throttle. No, but they release the limiter after karting. No, but if yeah. he's closing on him and he's worried about that, what does he do? If he takes his foot you off the throttle, off. You lift off the throttle. Does it make enough difference? Yes, it does. Okay. You lift off the throttle. You, so many times Ooh. it happens. So, yeah, here we go. The e -deck. E -deck. This is for third. This has been a long time coming. Yeah. Well, Nicky Opinio has done a great job in holding up Paul of Chatin. Young Chilean driver. Yes, Chile. And uh, why has he got the UK flag? GB flag? Who? Nico. On the graphic. 
That would be incorrect. It would Julie. be incorrect. Yeah. Yeah, so finally... Not Chichester, but C H I yeah, or... or uh, no. Finally gets the job of, done. Can't think of anywhere else that starts with C-H-I in the UK. Briefly off the top of my head, but... Uh, he's from Chile, not from the UK. He is. Came so achingly close to the LMP3 title, oddly enough, within to Europe on last year. And uh, had contact from another car in the last 15 minutes of the season. It cost the title. Took some carrots there to come back from that. He was absolutely gutted. I'd like to know how he got that run on him down into the second chicane, because uh, there was no way he was doing that earlier on. I wonder if there's a small mistake there or whatever, but yeah, you can see. So, you know, Scherer has caught up to the back of Kibitza, putting under a lot of pressure, but because of the, the turbulent wake coming off the car in front, it is really hard to overtake an NP2. So I, I want to know how uh, how Shatan was able to uh, get that run coming out of the first chicane towards the second one on uh, Pino. Things have calmed down just a little through the uh, the latter part of the darkness hours. You went and said that, did you? I did. <laughs> oh, we can say that now, because we're not in the darkness hours anymore. It hasn't really calmed down in MP2, or in GCM, or in the overall battle there. We haven't seen a lot of passing, but there are some very, very tiny gaps in the battles. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to you, Jensen. You've just jumped out of the number 20, the number 24. Uh, how was that stint for you? You look happy. It was good, yeah. Um, it's been uh, it's been a fun race for us. It's new for most of the team, you know, doing an endurance race. Uh, and obviously, we've been trying to play as safe as we can with when it rained and not getting off the rain tours too soon. So we we put ourselves a lap down compared to they're not really our competition, but the GTEs. Um, and I think we're either second or first. I think I ever took the leader and we were leading for a lap or so. So, I mean, we're not competing, but we kind of are. Um, and uh, I think we were 28th overall. So I, th I think that's pretty good. Um, you know, for us, it's it's about being consistent, giving the feedback to the drivers. And uh, yeah, the car's really fun to drive. It's, it's really good fun. And you're in a class of your own, but as you said, it's still a competition to you guys, isn't it, as racing drivers? Yeah, and also, you know, the, the GT category, you know, outright pace over one lap. They're probably not quite as quick, but it's very close once they've turned their engines up in the race. Um, but it's the consistency, it's a lot more difficult with this car. Um, and also our pit stops are a bit longer. Um, so yeah, it's uh, lots of things that hurt us, but then there's certain things that help us a lot. And it's such a great job by the whole crew. You know, it's, it's this is a big deal for them. And um, as you can see, most of them are taking a rest behind us. So we won't talk too loud, but uh, yeah, it's the first time they've had to do a 24 hour race. And it is an incredible one to be at. You know, the centenary of Le Mans. Uh, how, how much does it mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, I think uh, for everyone involved, it's Le Mans special anyway, but to be the 100th year and we're, we've got a NASCAR stock car here, which is just hilarious, really. But it's definitely a fan's favorite. It's definitely my favorite. Um, but no, it's a great atmosphere. It's been a manic race. The weather's been so random and uh, it's made for definitely a classic. As if from a driver's point of view, it's, it's tough out there. There's, there's a lot of incidents and the changing conditions that makes it really difficult. And it was hard earlier on with the changing conditions, but we know as fans how good you are in the wet weather. Are you maybe hoping for a little bit of rain later or are you hoping for it to stay dry? No, the, you know, NASCARs don't drive in the wet. So, you know, we've developed a tire for the wet, but we haven't done anywhere near as much testing as we would have liked. Um, and I think we're five, 10 seconds off uh, the GT cars uh, with our wet tire. And, it's just uh, yeah, finding the grip with this car is quite difficult. It's got a lot of body roll, so in the dries we know where we are. Wets is a little trickier. All right. Well, I think you deserve rest, just like your mechanics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, thank you, Steph. Thank you, Jensen Button. Lots going on during that. Let's just catch up with some of it. Into Europol's Fabio Scherer took the lead in NMP2 from Team WRT's Robert Kubica, and this is the lead battle. Uh, big Pond battle for fourth place in GTE Am with ORT's Amadel Harty just hanging on ahead of GR Racing's Ricardo Perra. Very strong run here for the 86 and the 25. Great pass, by the way, and pulling away uh, the interior port car. That LMP2 battle is coming together beautifully. Ooh, Ricardo Perra put the car off the road early in the race, making up for that with a nice move down the inside into fourth place. Uh, 
indebted to Adam Weller, who has dug around in the interweb inbox for hashtag Footloose Fabio news. The official word from uh, Fabio, uh, I'll read it out. I'm lucky the foot is in one piece. It could have been worse. It's OK for normal driving, but I feel it in slow zones. I don't want to know if it's broken or not. Now I just want to drive and win this thing. So far, so good. The pace is good, and we'll do a good job. We're in the fight for the win, says Hopalong. Wow. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, there's, some, there's some big stuff going on in that car. And, and to be perfectly healthy and to be driving the way he is against a, a driver of the calibre of Robert Kubica is entirely admirable. And to be doing it with one foot tied behind your back, and the calibre uh, of the team as well, exactly. WRT. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, they are, they're no slouches when it comes to the speed of, of setting up an LMP2 car. And uh, both the you know, driver and team, Fabio Shearer and uh, into Europol, fantastic effort. I mean, they've been in the mix, in the mix throughout the season in the WC. This is where these are both full season WC cars. This is a double points WC race, lest we forget. And this is not just important because it's a, it's a race win, not just important, not just important because it's the win at Le Mans, but this is double world championship points. And as things stand at the moment, uh, the Inter-European competition team do not have a route through to the World Championship in 2024. They don't have a hypercar program. They're not a GT team. LMP2 will be leaving the WEC. Uh, for next season because frankly there is not room for it and this is a massive result uh, in the build here for uh, the racing makers looking at uh, Rio Hirakawa our race leader in hypercar and that gap to Pierre Guidi behind him seems to be coming down it's now at 13.9 seconds what a magnificent race this has been I uh, just wanted to refer back, by the way, guys, to uh, that uh, interview Steph with uh, Jensen Button. Just the edge of fatigue in Jensen's voice coming. Mm. Um, but uh, the, I thought the most hilarious thing there was it's like you're standing in the doorway of the garage at the Le Mans 24 Hours. Um, now, I know how apocalyptically loud it can be on that pit straight. And he's sort of saying, we better keep our voices down because the guys are sleeping. It's like basically asking, <laughs> it's like putting a rag around the drumstick when you're sitting inside the drum. Can I just point out also that the loudest noise at Le Mans is their own, literally their own car the as it goes by every lap <laughs> and pulls into the pit. So, yeah, I mean, those guys are beat. Jimmy Johnson's actually done the, the, the majority of the drive or more driving in that car than, than the others have. So he must be feeling pretty tired as well. All sorts of entertaining stuff going on. Ryo Hirakawa uh, is not now 19 seconds. He is not a great deal uh, inside or outside 10 seconds ahead of the chasing Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Here's the delayed 94 car. Had a big crash just as Dartner was starting to turn to light. Gustavo Mez was putting it hard into the barriers in the first chicane after the rain had cleared away, but it was still a bit wet offline. Hence the repeated uh, assertions from the number eight Toyota team to the incoming driver to stay on the racing line, especially in the first chicane, Anthony. And uh, so far that has served them well. Yeah, I mean, like Jensen was saying as well, really tough conditions, There's so many incidents out there. And uh, it has been a game of survival. If you could get through unscathed, and it was often the case here at Le Mans. If you, as a driver, if you just back it off sometimes, although it goes against every grain in your body, every instinct you have as a racing driver, if you back it off, you, you get to the end of this race more often than not, and you think, I could have just driven at nine tenths or even eight tenths of my effort, mm. and I would have been guaranteed a podium if yeah. I just stayed on the track. But when you're out there doing it, you, you feel like you have to be pushing like everyone else is. Mm. And when you see it all unfold, and you see that picture at the end of it all, and you go, yeah, I, I shouldn't have been racing flat out at that moment in the race against so-and-so, because look where they are now. They had, ended up having a car problem. They ended up throwing off the track, you know, and it, it, you see it at the end, you go, well, it just, it just wasn't worth it. I, I could have just ended in a much better position 
if we weren't the ones that people were saying, oh, you know, they had a bad bad time at some point in the race. But hindsight's a wonderful yeah. thing. And actually, part of the reason that other people throw it off the track is because you are going at 11 tenths and putting the pressure on them. Yeah. And, and that's what motor racing is. It's not the slowest who wins, it's the first to the flag. It has been a proper race of attrition. I mean, Jensen summed it up beautifully well there, Indeed. didn't he? Just, you know, Indeed. it is tough for us, particularly in the rain in that car, because it's not designed to, to drive in the rain. And uh, it, as well, on top of that, saying because of the lack of body roll yes. that the car has, that it becomes mechanically very unstable. And uh, you rely on that as a driver. You, you feel the car moving around. It's one of the cues that you rely on as a driver to know where the edge of grip is. And him saying that it's so stiffly sprung that when it's in on the wet tyres, that I'm, I've lost that feeling, so it makes it doubly hard. But particularly for Jensen, who's, who's you know, every spidey sense twitches in those conditions so well. Just a, a little quick mention for uh, an artist called Jason Fong, who you will find on the internet. Uh, Jason is, again, uh, uh, creating one new painting every hour of the 24 hours of Le Mans race, and he is uh, selling those off to, uh, uh, for Race Against Dementia to receive a proportion of the sales. So uh, go and have a look for that online and see if you can help contribute. Again, looking at this battle, we are just approaching 7 o'clock in the morning. We are getting down to the nine hours to go mark, and we are fast approaching the end of lap 199 and, uh, so I beg your pardon now, lap 200 as Toyota still lead from Ferrari. They lead, but that gap is coming down thick and fast. It was two seconds last time around. It's been a second faster in Alessandro Pierguidi's favour for the last four or five laps that I've been watching. And Pierguidi is bringing that number 51 car back to the front of this race after that initial moment that he had in this very chicane coming up here in wet conditions a car spun in front of him he's kind of spun in sympathy ended up in the gravel momentarily he's now redeeming 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 himself put my tongue back in very much so because the gap's now down to 10.3 seconds it's coming down quickly isn't it uh, it is michelle catting on pit lane in the iron dames car there's uh, running in second place in GTE Am, and that will be another place gained in the overall order by the number 24 uh, Camaro uh, ZL1. That was the final uh, really interesting part of the mindset I, I got from uh, Steph's interview with Jensen, by the way, is they're measuring themselves against the GTE Am field. They were talking, he was talking about we're third in the order now. Uh, so that's that. Yes. Well, that's what's motivating them. Yeah, yeah. It's, and we, we, if you remember, guys, we had this conversation very early in the races. What, what, what are you doing? What are you measuring yourself against? Second in the order. It now. is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely right. And you know that that for me, the way I watch a race at this stage, things are tending to happen quite slowly. You're, you're tending to think, see people working a gap, and I'm sure that must be motivational for the uh, the Garage 56. You've always got to be. You've always got to be racing someone, Absolutely. somewhere, something, and uh, you know to 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 motivate, so to make it fun as well. Yeah, gaps front and rear. It's that kind of thing. It's yeah. how am I doing against my perceived competition? And even though they're not in the same category, doesn't matter. It's just your closest. It's what's in comparison. What about here? What about next? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's the gap I'm, I'm attacking? And you know you're me measuring your own performance. But it's a lot easier, I'm sure, and a lot more fun if you're measuring your performance against somebody else. I mean, uh, uh, unless, you know, let's not kid ourselves, that car should be way faster than oh, yes. the GTs because yeah. it's so heavily restricted. Yeah. That barn door has got strapped to the rear of it. It's, it's not a wing, it's a gurney flap. It's so a, it's, it's a basically, barn door. <laughs> it's a, it's a dra it's, it's their sole purpose is to Slowing create down, drag. Yes. <laughs> it's not there to create downforce, so it's just a, a losing situation. It's, it's there to uh, to make sure they're not, in many ways, way faster than the LMP2 cars or even the hypercars in a straight line. Yeah, Takeshi Kimura here as uh, Ben Barnicoats, well, now effectively retired. ATA of course, car falls behind the GTM leader on pit lane now for the Delayed number 50 Ferrari. Takeshi Kimura will come back and get another look at him shortly because that's uh, another great story, another true enthusiast, the car guy behind car guy. 
the team based just outside Fuji Speedway. In fact, literally across the road from our other Japanese GT team, uh, D Station Racing. They have their uh, team. Um, yeah, they have their team bases on the opposite sides of the same access road to Fuji Speedway. A couple of thoughts from Anne Davidson. We'll be joined by Peter Dumbreck, and then I'm going to head to the land of Nord for a couple of hours. Graham Goodwin will be in the driving seat. So Toyota lead from Ferrari and Cadillac. It is seven o'clock Central European summer time, 15 hours in, nine hours to go and counting. And I don't suppose we are out of storylines yet. So yeah, seven o'clock, 7.02 to be precise. Trust me, it's uh, still well alike this race. Gap now for the lead, Rio Hirakawa. 11.1 seconds, the good from Alessandro Pierguidi. Next, down the road, by the way, uh, almost two minutes back, but still on the, the lead lap, is uh, Earl Bamba, the number two Cadillac. So still three makes on the same lap in this amazing race. It is a tiny bit less frenetic than it was Peter de Breck when we both had, I think, a little bit of sleep, uh, but still very engaging. Yeah. Lead, lead, we've got a lead battle. Talk about that. Absolutely. Um, I suppose the, the biggest difference for me is the number 94. Parjo has fallen back. I, I gather it had a, a bit of a crash. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you've answered the same questions I had, Peter, when I first uh, got back behind the mic, and uh, it was uh, Gustavo Menezes, I believe, in the first chicane that uh, got it all crossed up and uh, ended up in the barrier, unfortunately. It's still, unbelievably, it's still damp in that first chicane. So before Hirokawa got back in uh, behind the wheel of the number eight car, it was Brendan Hartley relaying the information saying, yeah, you tell Rio when he jumps in the car to really make sure he stays on the racing line into that first chicane because it's still definitely damp on the outside. Uh, it's still busy down the pit lane. Steph, what have you got for us? Uh, I'm just outside the number 10 vector garage. They have just had a front wind change, although it doesn't appear to have any damage. So uh, does that appear to have damage? What might that be at this time of the morning? Uh, Front bodywork change for set the vector. Setup change. Could be. No change in weather at the moment. Potentially, drivers are complaining of, um, I don't know, understeer, oversteer. Uh, at least front, maybe they've uh, just managed to put some more downforce on the car. You know, it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quick way to uh, to change your right, Peter. A quick way to change the aero balance of the car if it's that bad, because it does obviously come with a time penalty. Um, so it better be a lot better uh, in terms of balance and gain you that time back and more some uh, afterwards. But, uh, yeah, a bit of a strange one. There's no damage. Maybe there's damage to the underside of it. I don't know. But uh, Or maybe there was a dodgy light connector or, or something. Um, who knows? But, uh, yeah, it's certainly one way that you can, that you can change. Often in an LMP2 car as well, you get a, a bit of fluttering, a bit of uh, porpoising. Um, and sometimes changing the nose can eradicate that as well. Battle for second here in GTM, and it's the GR Racing car. They're having a fine run here. Takes the opportunity, Ricardo Perra ducks up the inside of the Ferrari. Uh, Davini Regon, that is, for, for, with Ricardo Perra, as both cars just kick up the gravel at Mulzan Corner. And it's Davi, Davini Regon, and all the tyres are on the corner of that car, because that should not have been that, that easy for Ricardo Perra. Regon has not given this up. Inconceivable, they didn't know that was a position. Goes to the outside and they go almost door to door on the run down to Indianapolis. There's an LMP2 car in the mix here looking for a way by, but uh, Perra it is that comes out to the good and through into second place for the car with the dual livery here in tribute to this great race in its centenary year. Regan very not uh, very unhappy about that. It looks like he's not happy to let the P2 car by either at the moment while he's uh, in a tough battle. Now, I'm keen to understand just exactly what happened there. Well, I can see what happened. Ricardo Perra did him. Uh, he's thrown into second place, but uh, it, it's almost as if he didn't know that was a yeah. position. I mean, Regan, exceptional driver, one of the oh, absolutely 
Ferrari factory, boys. But um, a fine run. You know, I said just a few moments ago, it's sort of quietened down a little from frenetic activity. Then you look back at what's happened in the last 20 minutes. We've got a developing battle for the overall lead. It's now down to under, what, about eight and a half seconds, under eight and a half seconds now. We've got, had a lead change and lead battle in LMP2 and a change in GTM for, for, uh, for P2 there as well. Hirakawa's in trouble here. He's, he's starting to uh, hemorrhage lap time compared to Alessandro Pierguidi, who's driving an absolute blinder of a stint right now, or oh, a couple of stints. And uh, it seems like Hirokawa's got no answer to that pace. We're going to so see there is the Ferrari. First time we've seen them in shot together for a long time, thanks to that uh, full course yellow moment where it handed the uh, an, a, a, quite a big advantage to Toyota. And uh, when Brendan Hartley was at the wheel, gained round about 30 seconds. It was a slow stop on top of that for the, uh, the number 51 Ferrari. Something wrong with the left front. Seemed to be a slow stop there, but uh, yeah, Pia Guidi absolutely with a bit between the teeth right now. Is it my imagination or is, does he just seem to be in the car all the time? Pia Guidi. He's, he's just doing this race on his own. That's probably his contract. We did have James Collado with a, a really spirited attack in that car, but uh, it, it is that thing about when you're looking at battles for an hour after hour after hour, you can sometimes forget they've had that change. Giovinazzi does not seem to have a huge amount of seat time in the time that I've been focusing on that car. I think, yeah, yeah same for me. I just, maybe we've been asleep while uh, Giovinazzi's been in the car. But, uh, it's under nine hours now until we find out who is going to be the latest team name, car name, and three driver names to be carved into the 100-year history. There is James Gallardo. His name is not Ray Ban, by the way. That is James Gallardo. <laughs> Uh, another uh, second and a half in the favour of this man we're riding on board with, Pierre Guidi. He's got a bit of traffic here, though. The LMP2 car in front through the S's and Tetra Rouge. He's going to have to be careful of that, though. All four wheels off the track. And that was one of the Prema cars that he finds his way past now. And there they are, both in shot. Toyota, car number eight, heads towards the first chicane. Pierre Guidi with the Iron Dames car in front of him. Will get a little, no, is he gonna get held up in this again? No, he's gonna be just perfect on the exit. So he gets back on power and he'll be able to actually pick up a tiniest little bit of stitching for pulling out. No, not, not anything really, that was, he got through that chicane. That's what you pray for when you're in the cockpit, isn't it, Pete? You just yeah. pray for, getting through the chicane without getting affected by the slower car in front. Yeah, you overtake so many cars around here when you're in the top class that you're always trying to gauge it and, you know, you know, when even from five seconds back, you know that, oh, I'm going hit, to hit this car. Well, not hit this car. I'm going to get caught, yeah. caught behind this car at the wrong time. A new rear deck for the 709 uh, Glickenhaus. They've had quite a good run here. Seventh and eighth, these two cars. They're not done yet. So that it was the 708, much earlier in the race, uh, which was uh, helped by, oh, what are we looking at here? The number, number six, six Porsche. Car. Oh, stay out of the barriers. No, there's the touch. So that is uh, Lauren Van Tour. Yep, from fourth. And that car has got a uh, five second pit stop penalty to come in its next run down pit lane. Seven point six seconds that gap now. So this car we're looking at the car number eight. And he's picked up time even though he's been in traffic. Yeah, he must have, uh, yeah, he must have uh, had a, a, a kinder, a better deal of it somewhere else around the track. Just got more speed, I think. Seven point three seconds is the gap. Rio Hirakawa to Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Gap behind that, by the way, to the Cadillac, not really coming down. It's stable at a minute and about 45 to 50 seconds. Lean time in LMP2. Javier Scherer has pulled away a little from uh, Robert Kubica, but it's two and a half seconds. And in uh, 
GTE Am. That must have been a pit stop just now from uh, Hendrick Motorsports, I think. It's been a bit of a... Actually, it's not, is it? The uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson's been passed by that uh, battling GTM. Been a bit of an, an unlucky lap. You, it, it ebbs and flows, doesn't it, uh, through the traffic. A little bit more of an unlucky lap there, so 7.1 seconds. It, he had got it down into the sixes, had uh, Pierre Guidi on that lap, but now uh, you're going to see Hirokawa just fly around the outside there of the car 56, Porsche. And again, you get into a higher speed part of the track where you have no traffic and that's what you're always looking for but uh, it, it just seems inevitable at one stage we're going to see that Ferrari 51 right on the back of car 8. Yeah, gap coming down towards 7 seconds now. It's, Hirokawa's got to step this up somehow. I think the cars are on similar strategies, they both had a driver change, both changed all four tyres um, we saw Giovinazzi get out of the 51 and Hartley get out of the car eight. So uh, as far as I'm aware, they're on, uh, you know, this is, this is a level playing field in terms of strategy and tires, the, the tire life. So lead battles underway in all three classes here. It is now under seven seconds, Hirakawa from Pia Guidi. Uh, into Europol's Fabio Scherer battling away within two seconds or so of Rocco Pizza and the Kessel Racing car in the hands of the bronze driver Takeshi Kimura being closed down by Ricardo Perra. That gap, 90 seconds, but there's an awfully long way to go. Hirakawa still the uh, the least experienced of the uh, the total Toyota lineup of all six drivers. Seb Boemi, for example, has been there since uh, the inception of that team back in 2012. Still driving with them today. And uh, Brendan Hartley, very experienced. You know, Le Mans winner, world champion from the, his Porsche days in the LMP1. And uh, so he's, he's got the uh, all of the credentials that you need. And those two together have really harnessed that relationship with Rio and uh, have tried to fast through. track his, his yep. progress within the team. But in these kind of moments, I'm sure you got Seb pacing up and down. I can almost hear him in my head pacing up and down. Can't wait to get in the car to carry on the job he was doing earlier on. Right, there has been that, uh, that role for the two older drivers, two more experienced drivers to just, in his very early days in this program, Rio Hirakawa, there was just a feeling of potentially a little bit of vulnerability there. He did surprise us in a very positive way as that developed with resilience and with pace. But this is a very testing moment indeed. It's Ferrari, it's Alessandro Pierre Guidi, already a world champion in GTE Pro. And they don't come any more feisty than Alessandro Pierre Guidi. No, they don't. When it comes to getting your elbows out, does it? No, they don't. And, uh, Double check my uh, reckoning, but at the end of this season, if there's a world championship up for grabs, I know that Alessandro Pierre Greedy and James Gallardo would dearly love. Oh, and the van wall is off the, of the track. Is that on fire? Looks to be, doesn't it? Some kind of drivetrain issue. You've got to say that's that's motor, the ICE. Well, it's smoking away. Not, I'm afraid, the first time this this team has had thermal incidents. Luckily, it's right near the uh, the orange barrier there, where the you we'll can just roll it back. back. Yeah. But, uh, there's Tristan Vautier, late replacement for Jacques Villeneuve, in somewhat publicly discussed fashion. Disagreement between the Canadian 97 former one world champion uh, champion and the team. But uh, that is clearly race over for the 24 car, sorry, the four car. On the right hand side of the engine is a 4.5 litre version, by the way, of the same basic engine, Gibson V8 engine that, that uh, powers in 4.2 litre version all of the LMP2 cars as Hirakawa deals with the traffic in the shape of. The number 24 Camaro gap now yeah. under six seconds, Peter. Exactly five, five and a half seconds. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything Hirakawa, Hirakawa can do to 
stop the progress of Pierre Guidi. He just seems to be on fire at the minute. Unfortunately, actually on fire, uh, briefly, was the Van Wall, and that's the team. Um, congratulating each other on getting this uh, this effort this far. Yeah. It, it seemed by their reaction, they you'd sort expect of them to be disappointed, but they seem to be relieved. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> they seem to be happy with how far they got yeah. in the race. It's a very new car at this this level. Uh, Edex Sport Car pitting from third. This is the car, of course, that was in the battle with Nico Pinho. Yeah, Paul Luc Chatin was our pole position holder. Oh, what's going on here? He's been asked to get back into the car so we can just steer, steer it, it back into yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah, so that was actually a, a well-placed... He, he placed it in, a, in a, the right way so he can uh, get it pushed yep. back quickly and all the drivers out there will be uh, thankful of that as they can get going sooner as a result after this slow zone is lifted. Literally, as I'm looking at the, uh, the screen's uh, confirmation that the 777 D-Station racing car is out of the race. It's just a little bit of housekeeping underway from race control at the moment, so the bottom end of the timing screen. And look at that, look how close they are. It looks closer when it's when they're in that slow zone, but Hirakawa knows he's coming. It's an awful feeling, isn't it, Peter? And you know that this, you see that car coming up behind, you think it's just inevitable. Soon they're gonna be right on me, harassing me, ducking and diving, trying to overtake me anywhere exactly, they can. Yeah. I think that uh, number four car is just about to become our 20th confirmed retirement. That's, that's a long list. Peter? Yeah, I was thinking exactly, exactly that. Hirokawa is going to be looking at the mirrors. He'll have uh, had radio confirmation from the team that the car is coming from behind. And, yeah, there's not much he can do. He's able to, obviously, release the speed limiter button earlier. Yeah, so I said in the slow zone, it, 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 it looks much closer than it than it actually is when they get going again. You get that uh, cat and mouse effect, don't you? And uh, that chain reaction. So he's he's on his way to the final chicane, but <laughs> good. problem is when you can see the car in front, it just motivates you even more. So uh, this this is gonna be this is gonna be hammer and tongs now. Yeah, last few laps it's been high 330s, low 331s for your Hirakawa, it's been under 330 for Alessandro Pierguidi, and the net result of that as they cross the line is the gap is now down to 3.8 seconds. Collado watches on. And he's, he's just about to get in the car by the look of it. He's thinking, it just, just hand me the car in the lead, that's all I, that's all I ask. Uh, meantime, this is the final taker for the lead group in LMP2 for the latest round of pit stops. Fabio Scherer took the lead in that pit stop and will increase that lead unless they have dramas, remember, because there's 10 seconds to be served by the WRT car in that stop that they've just completed. Yeah, they're gonna, that's going to really hurt them. So I saw the tyre graphics earlier on with the WRT, by the way. Their tyres were much older than uh, the, the inter Europol car, so that explains how Shearer could just catch and breeze past Robert Kubica that we see there well, coming into the chicane. Yeah, he's coming into the chicane as the inter Europol car is rolling down pit lane, so it is a... Uh, Significant increase in the lead here. Still measurable in the lowish number of seconds, but it certainly isn't the two seconds it was when they came into this pit stop cycle. Passed by 50 Ferrari to complete the lap. On the Mulzan, though, it is the 51 of Alessandro Pierre Greedy. 3.3 seconds. It's like Thanos. He's inevitable. It's got a little bit of traffic coming up here with the Ferrari GT car just in front in that second chicane. Right there, you're going slower now than you really should be. And uh, breeze past the outside. You're never quite sure. You put a lot of trust in the car that you're overtaking around the outside. And you could see, you could almost feel that, that how tentative he was in that moment. But uh, and that is the right thing to do. You never know where the AM driver might place the car. And then again into the Mulsan hairpin. You have to uh, let your uh, feelings 
override the situation and yeah because you get a sense where the car's going to go and you don't always make the right call but a lot of the time lap after lap you kind of read the body language of the car where it's going to go and in that situation he, he was pretty sure okay i can sweep around the outside the car's seen me that it won't move over onto me yeah, like you say, reading that body language of cars, it's going over bumps and things, and you see the body, the body roll of the car, and you think, yeah. And being a GT driver himself, he will know exactly how that felt. So he's kind of on and off the throttle, waiting to see what happens to that body roll. Does it, does it uh, translate into the car actually sliding, or was it just going over bumps? So it's always better in that kind of moment to uh, play it with a bit of caution, but uh, luckily you've got an, an extra bit of track to run off on, on the outside there. Lap or two on this fuel stint by the look of things, maybe, but uh, back to a full green track now. Yeah, full green track. This is, this is great. What a showdown we have coming with Pierre Guidi and Rio Hirakawa. Rio is giving it everything he can, I'm sure, but that attack is relentless. That's what it looks like on the pit wall at Toyota and Colado. Oh, he's oh, he's loving this moment. Very so focused, isn't he? Uh, they're on the same strategy. They're both going to pick the same time. Uh, just uh, there's a quick look at the virtual energy ta uh, tank. 13% for the uh, Toyota, 14% for the Ferrari. They're bang on. Yeah, they right? came in at the same time. Like I said before, all four tyres were changed. Driver changer. It's full service for both cars. So uh, they do seem to be as far as I'm aware, of exactly the same strategy at this point. 2.2 seconds now, ch a chunk taken in that last sector and traffic coming. I don't know about tyre compound though. That's yeah. the one thing we couldn't quite see in the pit stops. So we think they're both on the soft. You would think so, yeah. yeah. We're, well, we've seen, uh, well, I haven't seen any of the cars running the hard tyre. So it's, it's all been medium during the day and then soft in the night and and the wet conditions also soft. Now this is interesting, car number eight got a spare splitter out. We've seen them doing a lot of this during free practice. Splitter on, splitter off, changing it all the time. Oh. As number 10, Vector Sport, uh, Vector Sport goes wide in the foot, or straight on in the first chicane. Well, pretty clearly we're gonna see these battling hypercars on pit lane very shortly. Steph is down at Ferrari and will be ready for that. The Vector Sport car moves over on the Algar Pro car. That is fourth position, ninth position in LMP2. The Algar Pro car, by the way, in the hands of Colin Brown. That is our pro and leader now. 1.5 seconds between Hirokawa and this man. And we can hear from uh, Rio Hirokawa's radio now. Okay, they'll box this lap, pit confirm, box this lap, pit confirm, box for fuel and front end. You stay in the car. So the overtake's going to be done because of that nose change in the pits. What has happened there? They picked up some kind of debris inside the radio. Let's hear, hear from Pierre Greedy. Okay, mate, box this lap, box this lap, driver change. Okay, box. Is that why he's not going to respond? Is there an error imbalance in that car? Driver change already. Driver change to the Ferrari. Yeah, but Jeff already. Scott has been ready, ready for a while. Yeah, it's, it's strange. Well, I, I don't understand because Pierre Guidi just got in after uh, after Giovinazzi. It, I didn't see that. Yeah, Giovinazzi yeah. is. But from my understanding, he's, he's only been he's only done a double. Yeah. I would have thought we'd be in there for a, for a triple, but maybe well, these soft tyres are only doubling. This uh, this lead change could happen before the pit stop here. So again from the Tota, what's going on for Rio Hurakawa? Yeah, what's dropping? What's dropping? Yeah, copy. Ferrari's close behind now, 1.3, just for info. I'm sure he was well aware of that. Look how much faster. Pierre Guidi can carry, look how much extra speed he carries through the high speed corners of the Porsche curves. Hirakawa definitely struggling uh, with this Toyota and uh, has he got some damage to the, to the splitter there I can see? Well, we'll see whether or not we can get a closer look at that. Uh, I think he has, you know. Yeah, he has, has. and that would explain it. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but the car has had be better much, pace than this, hasn't it? So far, this 
absolutely no step. So it's going to be car number 51 after this uh, after this driver change. So, no, hang on a minute. so Rio is going to stay in. So they are on slightly different strategies here because Rio stays in and Pierre Guidi is going to get out. So it will still be the Toyota that exits the uh, the pits ahead despite this nose change. Yeah, so fuel going in the car. Because they're going to keep the tyres on. You only do the, the tyre change when you do the driver change. Yeah. This is the change for James Gallardo to get aboard the car. Steph is down there with the Ferrari. How are things looking down there, Steph? It's a busy pit stop, I can tell you that. James Gallardo is about to jump in the car and uh, just cleaning everything off. But yeah, it's a it, it's looking like a clean stop so far. They're just trying to get the seatbelts one done. Uh, Seatbelt sorted and then they'll be right out. Which tyres are coming off that car? What's going on, Steph? No tyre change as of yet. I think they're waiting to see, uh, they're waiting to finish refueling and then we'll be able to see which tyres are going on. It's looking like a soft. It's a driver change. You should be looking there for a tyre change for it. And the eight car, just a slight stumble. They do make the nose change in good order. And it is a tyre change. Car is released. And the change comes for the lead is this. The decisive change in the long 24 hours. We're just over eight and a half hours left in the 2023 running, the 91st running in the 100th year of the 24 hours of Le Mans. Ferrari back to the lead and Davidson. Well, that uh, nose change took uh, a lot longer on the Toyota than I expected. So, uh, yeah, Hirokawa stays on board, but. Um, yeah, I, I just assumed that it would be a faster change than that. So yeah. the, the overtake has happened in the pits. Five seconds difference on pit stop time. It was a minute yeah. and 32 seconds on pit road from the Ferrari AF course of 51. James Gallardo it is that heads off now in the lead of the race uh, from Rio Hirokawa. Stays aboard, but with a nose change for that car. Be so interested to see what the pace is now from Hirokawa. So it was even worse in terms of that loss to Pierre Guidi's lap times, it was even worse. It means that Rio Hirokawa had newer tyres as well. Yep. So, so it wasn't as we thought. It was, uh, yeah, Rio jumped in with a with a, a, a fresh set of tyres that had gone on, which always happens during a, a driver change, because that extra time to get the driver in and out is around 25 seconds coincides with the amount of time it takes to change the tyres, which can't be done when the fuel's going in, has to be separate. So that's what you try and tie in all the time. Driver change comes naturally with tyre with change as well. Now watching Rio Hirakawa make his way through the second chicane on the Mulzan, now in the Michelin chicane, down towards Mulzan corner. The gap, 5.4 seconds as they clear the timing sector. For well, the timing sector. I mean, despite this nose going on, the undamaged new nose that goes on the Toyota, he's on older tyres now compared to uh, Collado. So now we would expect, naturally, Collado to disappear off into the distance. And we can hear from uh, Hirokawa's radio, I believe. We've been watching the 38 Hertz Team Jota Porsche. That car led the race, remember, until drama for Ifeye. Let's have a listen to what's going on aboard the Toyota with Rio Hirokawa. Okay, Rio, Ferrari has changed driver ahead. Ferrari has changed driver ahead. Collado in the car. We have a new front end and we changed the rear right tire. The rear right had a puncture, so we changed it. Rear right puncture. That, uh, that would explain why he was suffering so badly in the high speed of the Porsche curve as well. Yeah. We've all watched before, so uh, right rear, slow puncture. Normally he would have known about that anyway. He'd, he'd have got the TPMS warning. Yeah, he would have seen it on board. And, uh, but but it, it must have just been a, a very slow puncture that was under control. But uh, they, that's okay, so that's why they, they came out that, that extra bit of time to change that one tyre. So far, he's uh, maintaining that gap at five seconds. But the advantage he has at this point is that Collado's fresh in, and 
it, it, after a couple of laps, you, you kind of get your eye in again, don't you? But it's Rio's in the rhythm, at least. And yeah. uh, so maybe Collado won't uh, be able to pull away so easily straight away. But I'm sure once he gets into his stride, it will, uh, you, you'll see the gap grow and grow. Of course, all those cars, he's already had that traffic. So, yeah. And probably in the Porsche curves. Well, let's go down to pit lane. Steph has got one of the men who's been very much involved in this battle. Down to you, Steph. Yeah, we're not, uh, not hearing that one. So, uh, yeah, Cadillac number two into the pits. El Bamba jumps out, and uh, Alex Lynn, who did a, a great stint, a couple of stints in the night time, jumps back in. As we said from the start of this race, Alex sporting the helmet colours of well, Mr. Derek Bell in tribute to his fabulous achievements at the race. This was a great, great race, and Cadillac having something of a mixed day, night, and now into the day, but still in the mix here. And, uh, this race can throw things at you very quickly. Oh. A spin for Rexy. The hands are good at Ginetta, I think, still there. Just double-checking that. It's Matteo Caroli, Caroli actually. Actually. just briefly yeah. uh, uh, recently aboard the car. Former race leader as well. He so was, he's dropped, for quite some time. dropped back to fourth place. It's uh, not good at this stage of proceedings. We'll be looking to get back uh, onto terms. So one driver changes looking up and down the order in GTM. Takeshi Kimura it is that still leads the race in GTM, the 57 car. Seven seconds now at the lead gap as Ryo Hirakawa clears the last bit of that batch of traffic, Peter, and now sets off in pursuit. Be very interested to see what he can do in clear air here. But uh, as Ant Davidson said, we've got fresh tyres versus not so fresh tyres. Say good morning to Guy Smith, joins us as Ant Davidson leads for a little bit of shot eye. Guy coming into the early morning here at Le Mans. I know how I feel. It ain't great. <laughs> uh, what is it like getting into a car that's in a battle for a significant position? Well, you've definitely got the um, added adrenaline, which is uh, carries you a long, long way. Um, these guys are very much in the zone. They'll have had some sleep, but not a lot. Um, very much in the battle here, fighting for an overall win at Le Mans at the front between the Ferrari and the Toyota. What a fantastic battle this has been raging through the night. And uh, the Cadillac there in third, third place with uh, Alex Lee is not out of this by any means. They're still hanging in there. Maybe haven't quite got the speed of the leading two, but they're there in case anything happens um, between the two front runners. That's the thing, as the three drivers cycle through, There'll be one that's just got out of the car, so Pierre Guidi now might get a bit of something to eat and then maybe settle back because he knows he's not getting in for quite a while. But um, you'll have the next driver waiting in the sideline. So there's always sort of the reserve waiting to get in the car just in case the current driver in the car right now is uh, uh, enters some kind of problem. That's right. All it takes is for... Um you know, if the driver comes in early or has a problem, you've got to be ready to get into that car and uh, be ready to get on it. So, uh, yeah, it's um, we're kind of getting towards the business end now. It's daylight, we're into the Sunday morning, and uh, looking forward now, the, the end is in sight. A couple of uh, changes, one to a position, and the other one to just the rhythm of what's been a long standing battle this morning. As we've got oh, the inside of the Cadillac there. This is the number six car. This is for position. This is fourth place. Caddy, you can see just on the right hand side, the side window. Position taken there for the moment with the Porsche, a bit of a, sorry, the Ferrari rather, a bit of a pick here. But this is a somewhat spirited run from Kevin Est, reclaiming the fourth place he had. He would have lost that 
principally because of the pit stop penalty he had last time around. So he's back up in the fourth and splits the caddies again. That's the first thing I was about to say for Seb Bourdais. Oh, oh, it's on the limits, isn't it? Isn't he just absolutely ragged edge stuff? Stick with this. And he's got the blue... Uh, blue flags. Blue flags. Well, that's for... It's for the car that he's just overtaken, I think. Ah, okay. <laughs> he's now sitting close behind him. Not so close. This is... Just exactly how this one is working. They come across the line. It is... That was... Was that, was that Est... Or was that Fred Makovicki? Well, that's the six car. I think it's Estre. I mean, he's really... I mean, he's driving it like a GT car. He's throwing it around, using the kerbs. He's really, really hustling that car around. And all he was doing is unlapping himself from the two. Picks my Cadillacs up. It was Kevin Est unlapping himself from Alex Lynn. And getting that lap back. Taking some risk along the way. He just for that, for that overtaking move down into Indianapolis. We'll just watch these pictures. The other battle I was referring to, by the way, is the continuing heroics of Fabio Scherer, we believe, driving with some kind of break or fracture in his foot after that was run over by the Corvette early in the race. And his battle with had overtaken and is now pulling away from Robert Kubica in the uh, number 41 TWRT car in the lead of LMP2. Yeah, those guys have had a great race. They've been right at the sharp end and... Uh, Outstanding. Pretty mistake-free, and that's really what's the difference in LMP2 is uh, is really staying out of trouble and uh, being consistent, and that's what those guys have done and uh, find themselves in the lead of the race. So now I've got my Cadillac sorted in my slightly befuddled Sunday morning head. Unlapped himself from the third place number two Cadillac and now given us trying to close in on the gold the yellow number three car and that is the the, the uh, race for position fourth place under two seconds let's have a listen in to what's going on aboard the number six for Kevin Est yeah I don't know if it's you but copy Mentioned over, was it overseer? I didn't quite get that. I didn't quite get it. No. And I definitely didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't understand what Kevin Estra was saying, uh, and there's another postcard to three confused blokes in a box. Eight hours, 20 minutes to go. Ferrari lead. Oh, in the gravel, just dropped the back right uh, corner in the, into the gravel there. He's really pushing hard, he's really hustling that Porsche around. I think he's trying to obviously get back past this uh, three car, trying to get another lap back. I think they're on the same lap, that's for position. Oh, it is for it's absolutely position. for position. position, okay. Absolutely for position. So yeah, he's giving it absolutely everything to try and uh, close that gap down and get back ahead of the Cadillac. Well, it is Porsche's glass bullet in the gun here. They've had some real glories at the front of this race, but uh, it's not gone their way into and through the night, has it? The six car running fifth, chasing fourth. Seb Bourdain knows he's there, and the body language of the Porsche, I would say frenetic. I think uh, Kevin Estra is well known for grabbing a car by the scruff of the neck, and you know, he's very, very fast, but he's occasionally prone to the odd error, isn't he? Yeah, exciting to watch, I think we'll call it. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll put it that way. Dramatic. Nothing for it. I think so, they, can, they can sense the, I mean, a possible podium position. You know, anything oh, absolutely. up front, and uh, they'll find themselves uh, you know, possibly on the podium, and that's really what they're pushing for right now. So, Kevin okay, Estra, 34 years old now, and uh, as with a large proportion of these new hypercar drivers coming from a lot of these factory efforts, GT teams, and this is a massive opportunity for him in his career. Uh, it's um, huge. He's, I mean, he's, he's won numerous big races, and uh, I'm sure he'd like to uh, 
to add this one to his uh, CV. Has he won in GT around here? I don't know if he's run, actually, I'm not sure if he's won in GT. I mean, he's won pretty much just about every big yeah, GT you, race. You would think he would have. Yeah, um, he's, a, he's an absolutely fantastic driver. Speaking of fantastic drivers, got Seb Baudet there, local man from Le Mans. About to come under some serious pressure. Yeah, and he's actually, Baudet still got the fastest lap of the race at 328.2, uh, which was set earlier on in the race. Yes, that's what it feels like to be here at Le Mans. But when they wake up, they're going to be waking up to a very exciting race. We've said it for a long while. We've been waiting for this moment in sports car racing. This race has delivered. It's continuing to deliver. We've got multiple gaps. This gap for the battle for fourth position. Now under a second and with traffic, Patrick Bourdais, closest to the camera here, his son, fending off the close attentions of Kevin S. right Kevin Estra. back now. Ria Hakawa, meanwhile, just dropping back a little, but that rate of change in that uh, lead battle, not what it was, but this is where the action is right now. Could this be? A potential podium position in 8,017 minutes time. I think Hirokawa has settled down a bit. His pace has improved. That last lap, though, he did lose a couple of seconds. But previously, I think he managed to sustain the pace with James Gallardo. I don't think there's going to be any complaints whatsoever. You know, if this is what we've got coming in this era of this great race and the FI World Endurance Championship. The two battling hyper cars coming up on one of the Glickenhaus cars. They, at the moment, by the way, sitting seventh and eighth. And two. you can see from the body language of the uh, of the Porsche, it's Kevin's really th throwing it around. The car's moving around a lot. I think we're going to see a move here. Be brave moving to there, though. Yeah, that last section of the Porsche cars through karting. Kevin's really tight to the apex, Possibly. really wide, yep. carrying way more speed than Seb. They see the, I think he sees the opportunity that the Glickenhaus may present at some point in this lap. The pace difference between the two cars, or three cars, not that huge. The Glickenhaus in the 332s, these two cars in the 331s. It just needs the chasing car to guess right or be placed more correctly or to find that tiny little gap. Seb Bourdais, a very wise head on his shoulders. He's been around this race for an awfully long time. It's a, something of a family affair with his dad as well. Very much a veteran here in their local race. But some of us, that's your local karting track. For them, it's right here. Not in a position to do it there. GT car ahead. He's using the slipstream of that GT car to help him and try to draft up now behind the Clifton House, which is pretty quick in a straight line. So um, what will he do? Will he let them by or will he? is he going to contest it? Oh, Estrella, almost yeah. in the back of the uh, Cadillac there. Paddy quick out of the corners. Though. It's got good straight line speed con considering it's um, punching the hole in the air. It's got a lot of torque, hasn't it? Cadillac number three. Porsche number six, and the pick could be the 708 Glickenhaus that's running in seventh place. This is the battle for fourth place. The body language of those two cars in this battle could not be more different, could it? I think Seb's keeping it smoother, and as, as um, was mentioned before, um, Kevin Estra seems to be driving harder, but almost like it's a GT car. For the moment, Bordet is fending off the challenge. Now where and if is this, this uh, pass to get another car between them, but perhaps a uh, more significant bit of traffic ahead. It is the other surviving factory Porsche is the next car down the road. It's the number five car of Fred Makovicki. 
Yeah, the that's going to be tough to pass. The Cadillac is drafting up to the, the Glickenhaus, trying to use the toe from that car to kind of pull itself clear of the uh, of the Porsche. And it's whether he can clear him now. He'll be, he'll be eager to try and get that Glickenhaus between himself and the... Um, Trouble, front left. That wasn't coming off well. Car rolls away. Nick Nielsen brought the car in and Antonio Fuoco it is that uh, takes the track. That car down in 10th place now. Previous race leader. And that uh, sticky front left cost something like 10 seconds and that's about that pit stop. So you can see Astra now. This is, seems to be the favourite place for him. Oh, it does take a lot of curb there, doesn't he? We've seen that's but a risky place to do it as well. So fast and possible chance here again would be risky. So going into this section, Seb Bordet was had a good what five, six car lanes and, yep. and it's just been completely closed up now. Caddy, great talk off the off the turn. Still haven't got close to passing that Glickenhaus. And another hypercar ahead. Roger Penske. Of course, the Cadillac starts to pick up some of the dirty air from the Glickenhaus and will start to uh, find it more difficult to, to follow him. So he really needs to try and clear that Glickenhaus as soon as possible. And not lose that momentum, that sort of forward. It's Roman Dumas in the uh, car ahead. One of, if not the most experienced man in this race. He'll know, he'll be being told by the team what's going on behind him. Will he pick his moments and allow this battle to go by safely? Or is he just going to get on with plan A? Which will surely be run to the finish and see what happens around them at this stage for the Glickenhaus team. That's got to be frustrating for Kevin Esther there. Um, he's just unable to, even in the slipstream, to close into that caddy. I think quite a bit quicker through the corners, but... He's... And now the caddy picks up the toe as well. Is better for Seb Bordet, but could it could better turn into worse if he can't clear the Glickenhaus before the second chicane? There's the GT traffic as well, so that's going to make it even more difficult. It's not close enough, is he? I see the Porsche is dropping right back on yeah. the straight there. So, you, yeah, that's a speed difference. So, the Glickenhaus is probably the quickest down the oh, streets. Oh, and he's oh, yeah, tight one. This is going to cost Kevin Astro some time. time. Nothing the Ferrari can do about that. He's getting on with his race. By the way, the number 100 car from Vocalist Motorsport, the hands of Andrew Harianto. And all of a sudden, Seb Bordet can breathe a little easier. i tell you what, he'd love to get that Glickenhaus in between the two, what, he the just... two cars, though, wouldn't he? Still, by the way, not that much further down the road is that uh, other than number five Penske Porsche. That car running in ninth. Still Ferrari in the hands of James Gallardo now leading. 8.9 seconds to go from Rio Hirakawa. You're absolutely right, Peter. The gap in lap pace at the moment is even out little, so the, the, the gap's still changing, but it's about tense. Estra's dropped back quite a chunk, and he's cleared the Glickenhaus now. The uh, Cadillac ahead, so that's another further challenge for Kevin Est. Next question is, in that spirited pursuit what has he done to his tyre life on that car saw so Kevin S make some changes didn't he on the on the wheel there he was making some adjustments to the looks like engine to the engine mode or something so uh, the caddies the caddies passed the big house so yep so say so next challenge for Seb Day. it was just looked impassive it's just been smooth it's just been easy whilst Kevin Estlet has been pogering around behind over the kerbs. It was the moment that gave the gap that allowed Seb Bordet to have eyes forward rather than eyes back. He's going to complete the lap with significantly more of an advantage from the attacking Porsche. So it's allowed him back there. I think he's going to need uh, Roman Dumas to actually purposely let him by because I don't think he's got the straight-line speed to attack that Glickenhaus. 
Ferrari, Tota, Cadillac, Cadillac, and then this Porsche, number six car. Still more than eight hours to go of this race. By the rules, how many blues, blue flags is it? Is I it think in this instance, going? That there's, there's no rule on that. It's simply no rule. I think if there's active blocking, it's one thing, but the blue flag here is around awareness and right. not an instruction to let the car by. Yeah, the clicking house is very quick in a straight line. It's difficult for him. See. Yeah, he's just pulled away. So the gap now, what, uh, well, effectively, it's back to where the gap was three, four laps ago. And still, Kevin Estra not able to clear Roman Dumas. We talked about this uh, earlier yesterday, how you could have different cars on different uh, downforce and, you know, the Porsche in a straight line doesn't seem to be there, but in the corners, he, he's all over it, in the Porsche curves especially, so it could be that that, that car's just running more downforce uh, and the carries more, you know, the wings uh, flatter, more top speed. This race has got a lot more to give. Stick with it. Because it does seem in every phase, whether or not it's a blasting lap from Kevin Estra, whether or not it's a 50-minute cat-and-mouse game further down the order, or further up the order, whether or not it's a class battle for the lead or for a significant position, there has been, always been more than one thing to watch. So to listen to what Seb Bourdais is telling the Ganassi Racing Cadillac Racing crew. In this spirited back Your lap times before. are good, Seb. You were half a second faster than the leaders right there. He's just sticking with the plan, isn't he? And who knows what this could produce? Estra's through. He's drafted past the Glicken House, going into Indianapolis. So the gap now, it's two and a half seconds. That's cost him a further half second in that battle. But we're coming up to Porsche's best part of the track, so I imagine Esther will close back up. And with clear air. Just looking at what the pace is like of Fred Black and Vicky Head. He's quicker than both of them, in fact, at the moment. So it's not a matter of Seb Bourdais dragging up to the uh, next traffic in the matter of Fred Macko. Macko is pulling away from him here, albeit laps down will be a problems. James Collardo now 10, almost 11 seconds clear of Hir Hirakawa. That, that gap is opening up again. Alex Lynn, two minutes behind that battle in third place in the other Cadillac, the blue Cadillac. The other Cadillac in the leading group, that is. Seb Bourdais here. Better part of a lap back from Alex Lynn in fourth in this battle for position with the Penske Porsche, number six. That's the top five, and then the 93 Peugeot, previous leader of this Warwick race, brought some dramas, and now a lap back from Kevin Est. Not seen much from Peugeot this morning. And then into the two Glickenhouses, 709, the second of them on pit lane at the moment. See the 708 in the background there. And completing the top 10, an all hypercar top 10, the number five Penske Porsche, and the second Ferrari in the hands of Antonio Fuoco. What a delight it is to report that coming on for 8 o'clock in the morning at the 24 hours of Le Mans, a top 10, all in top class, and with multiple battles within. And that's what it's been like since the get-go. Driver changes coming, including for the Iron Dames. And uh, the 85 car, by the way, in the hands of Michelle Gatting, and that 2.6 seconds back from the leading Kessel racing car in the hands of the bronze driver Takeshi Kimura. This is the lead battle, and that will be interrupted for the driver change for the 85. After a torrid time at Spa for the all female crew, Brian Lynx. It's yeah, come back into play here at Le Mans, and that's, uh, I think if they're going to have chosen which one would see them in competitive form, it would be this one. That would be quite the headline, wouldn't it? 
They're, they're having a great race. They've been they've been at the sharp end all the way through, and uh, depending on the pit stops, they've, they've pretty much been first or second. Yeah, I was way. I was thinking the same. They've they've had their challengers who've come up, maybe overtaken them, then dropped back again, and and they've just been there plugging away. Um, so impressive to to see how the team's working. The project it's good in so very many ways. The visuals in terms of the way they present this car are good. The message is great. There's not a place for females in motorsport. There's a right. And all three of the girls involved in this effort just go about it with just a great competitive spirit. Who were earlier in the, the, uh, the more earlier this morning, and Davidson and Martin Haven were talking about the full access program. Take a look at the full access program on the FIWC's YouTube channel from Spa. You'll see what I mean about that. They've been a factor over the last couple of years. Uh, fantastic stewardship of this program by Iron Links, by Deborah Meyer, who the co-owner of the team, whose project this is and remains. She's now the president of the Women in Motorsport Commission of the FIA. And that's a, a kind of policy direction from motorsport, gentlemen, that is really making a difference in a very positive way without tokenism. And what we're seeing, I certainly notice it every weekend about a racetrack, is we're seeing far more female faces, not just behind the wheel, but in the garages as well, and not just in some of the, the perhaps more traditional roles that we've seen from women in motorsport for most of my life. But they're out there and making a massive difference in terms of the way these cars are prepared, turned around uh, in very senior roles in team management, in the technical sides of things, in the engineering sides of things. And I think that's a great, a great step forward. And in the FIA, there's, there's uh, many females in the FIA now. So I was working down in Monaco doing driver standard advisor um, and the full F3 steward room was all ladies and me had a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to ask them whether or not they have the same experience, but <laughs> side by side, this is the 25 car. Oh, there's the bonnet uh, up at one corner. That's not the first time we've seen it from Aston Martin today. And that was a change. 33 ahead of 25, Nicky Katzberg ahead of Ahmed El Harty. And uh, TF Sport, I'm sure, have eyes on that 25 car, but uh, there's a problem with the bonnet. Left uh, rear corner of that bonnet on the 25. Armand Al Harty, by the way, taking the opportunity to try to get a bit of a toe back from the Ferrari. It's not going to work, I'm afraid, but Nicky Katzberg goes through, and that car up into fourth place. So Corvette not giving this one up. It's clearly been an issue that's uh, come through this race with that uh, bonnet, because the 25 car evidence that uh, one of the essential items in the sports car racing toolbox racer tape has been used to try to secure that Kevin Esther just set the fastest lap of, uh, of that car in the race six car at 28.9 uh, followed by Nicol Jensen um, in the Peugeot at 29.9 their fastest lap so it's a fast time oh big lock up there for the uh, number six car yeah, he, he, oh, 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 oh. he is absolutely pushing it. Isn't he just it, it halved the gap? Oh. Under eight hours to go now. That was a huge lock up. Got too deep in there, didn't he? And almost just a couple of wheels in the gravel. Oh. The margins here are so, so tight. Graham Goodwin with Guy Smith and Peter Dumbreck. On board and Kevin Ashton. No shortage of action whatsoever at the 24 hours of Vermont. We came into the 2023 race. Expect. Oh, and that was that was it. That was that was very late yeah. up the inside of the LMP2 car, and that Kevin Estra finally a bit of a percentage move that didn't pay off. Gentlemen, how did you see it? Well, it was building, wasn't it? I mean, 
he's he's been on the limit all lap after lap. Yeah, and he obviously previously that he had a big lock up into um, Arnage corner and into the two wheels into the gravel. So he's hustling, and um, yeah, it was uh, it seems to be coming. Just a bit of a late move up the inside of the P2 car, lost the rear end and uh, through the gravel. Yeah. There was a biff with the tyre barriers. He's got the car moving. No contact, I don't think. It was just over the kerb to the inside of it, wasn't it? See, I'm not sure the P2 car did anything wrong there. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think it was a late move from Kevin. You, you know, that's not a place where the P2 car's got much of an option to duck out of that. Yeah, you come into there with what you small brake, you drop it one gear and you get back on the power. So it, it's such a fast entry there. So Seb Bordet, what had been a 1.2 second gap as they come across the line. The gap now, just waiting for that, uh, is 47 seconds. Cost him dearly that. And that, by the way, is 46 seconds closer that Mikkel Jensen is moving to Kevin Estra. He's still a lap down on the Porsche. That's a good chunk of one of those of that lap. The other, that's the, uh, I think that's the 94 Peugeot behind him. So he didn't actually hit anything. He did. He, he did, did he? Give a bit of a bit of a body slam to the uh, tire barrier. Is that the 94? Is that the 93 about to unlap himself or trying to unlap himself for the Porsche? It's the 93, isn't it? So, sixth place car and the fifth place car. It's taken the wind out of his sails, hasn't it? He has. So, now when he's under pressure, and this is under pressure to retain the lap advantage on the Peugeot behind. And up front, the lead now has uh, increased to 13, just over 13 seconds. Gentlemen, both top professional drivers here, multiple factory entries already on your CVs. Big error there from Kevin Estra. He's still on track, he's still in the mix. What's the mindset like at this point? It's. We sort of called it, did, we, did did? we not? Yeah, uh, about an hour ago. He's, <laughs> he's pushing the boundaries, he's driving much harder than Seb Bordet in front. He was driving the car more like a GT car. Um, I'm not sure it was inevitable, but um, the risk factor was certainly increased for him. It was and, high, wasn't it? And it seemed high for a long time. And the fact that he'd already had a, a minor off down in Malta in the same lap, you know, it, he was obviously pushing, and you know, that's the reason why he's employed. He's, he's an incredibly fast racing driver, um, and the team know that. And he's, you know, they, they know what you know what you get with Kevin Estra. Let's have a listen to what's going on the radio with Kevin Estra. We see some damage to the underfloor. Yeah, you can see as well if you look at the rear. Um, deck of so the, the, the rear wing of the Porsche the next time we get a chance to see it. Left uh, light is flashing. Ah, oh, yes. Well, that's not the rain light, is it? That's the light we see when that car's coming into a slow zone. So something's gone wrong with the electrical connection as well. That will be giving Kevin Estra, I'm sure he's got uh, all sorts of warnings on the dash for the Porsche. Mikkel Jensen will have taken that opportunity, rubbed his hands with glee, and seen the opportunity that perhaps there might be a light at the end of what's been a pretty long tunnel this morning for Peugeot. Seb Bourdais, by the way, on pit lane now, so Kevin Estra will take that position for the moment, will be due down pit lane shortly. Ferrari from Toyota, then the two Cadillacs. There is Seb Bourdais. Soaked up that pressure, uh, Peter Dumbreck, brilliantly. He did, he didn't panic. Um... He, he could probably see in his mirrors where Kevin Estra was quicker, but he knew he had the straight line advantage over him. 
So he, he just, you know, maintained, didn't make any mistakes, kept it nice and smooth. I think they're running a perfect race, Cuddler. They are. They've not had the luck and the, uh, quite the pace. Uh, just going to pop down. What have you got for us, uh, Lou Beckett? Welcome back and good morning. Good morning. I've uh, just headed down to Porsche Penske garage. Obviously, the number five just came in for a standard stop. The team seemed to be poised, ready. They didn't. They're not really. They're not really running around or anything like that. They're just standing there watching the TV screens, I guess, waiting for Kevin to come back in now. I don't know if you heard what we heard, Lou, but they were saying some underfloor damage. We've seen uh, that one of the if you like, hazard flashes at the rear of the car on the left-hand side is flashing. There is some damage. It's not visible to us other than that. Um, other than that uh, what else can you see As you're here? talking, Graham, the, the dollies are out for the number six team. Okay, then we see some damage to the underfloor. Okay, we try to continue, just take caution. Something was loose there. Yeah, but look at his lap times. Actually, he's still in the 330, so he's not actually going slow. That's what caused it. He steered away from the potential hit, didn't he? That took him over the curb to the inside of the entry of the Porsche curves and from there on in yeah the car stepped away side, from him no side on hit, wasn't it yes it was slap the barriers so that's the second call we've heard from the bits that they can see some underfloor damage I can see as well some damage that the, the uh, left rear corner of the car Mikkel Jensen running wide as well in pursuit Porsche are ready and it's going to be, I'm sure, for the number six car. At the moment, with that uh, stop from Seb Bordet, Kevin Estra is up to fourth place, but it's not good news for Porsche. That incident, I think, is going to see this car in the garage. It's here again, developing story. It's here again, what's going on for the Porsche Penske number six. Plan is to stay in the car, stay in the car. If you think you can continue, we will we will evaluate the front end to see what we can change if we need to. Otherwise, we'll continue. No tyres. That's what Porsche are going to say. What have you got to say about it, uh, Lou Beckett? You're down there. And there is a little bit of uncertainty within the team. The mechanics are on pit row waiting for the six to come in, but I saw one of them looking to the dollies guy and gesturing. Is he coming in? Is he staying out? Is he coming in? We don't know. You can read all of that as they're standing there. Yeah, they're coming in. They're coming in. So too is the Persia behind you. So Kevin Astro will be with you very shortly, Lou. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll come back to you just very shortly. So this battle that's put underway, the 93 car trying to unlap itself from the number six. It's, uh, it's drama for Kevin Estra, the car we think is going to go in the box. Is it? Dolly's I think looking. I'm not sure they're sure where it's going to go in. To you, Be uh, to, to you Lou Beckett, what's that's, going on? That's the query the mechanics have. They don't know if they're bringing it in the car. However, I've just seen the signs now. I think that car is going in the box right now. So, much They've assessed underneath the car. He's had a look around and then he's, he's put his hand up to point to the box. There's still confusion in the loop. Twenty seconds, we need to add some oil. Oh, to you, Lou. That car is on the dollies, being spun around and going into the number six Porsche Penske box. Is that the moment that uh, marks the end of the challenge for Porsche to win the 2023 Le Mans 24 hours? Is almost eight hours to determine whether or not that, that's the case. While that's all going on, either end of pit lane, the 51 car from the lead in the hands of James Gallardo, the eight Toyota in the hands of Rio Hirakawa, they're on pit lane as well. Dramas galore on track, gentlemen. Dramas now, Guy Smith, on pit lane. Yeah, it's uh, it's all it's all going on, isn't it? Um, this is um, the um, Toyota was almost 15 seconds behind uh, the Ferrari when they entered pit lane. So 
Are they going to take tyres? It looks like it's just a fuel only for the Ferrari. It was new tyres, less time for the Ferrari. It was one tyre, uh, punctured tyre for Ryu Hirakawa. Uh, clears pit lane now. That was one minute and 20 seconds on pit road for James Gallardo. Ryu Hirakawa, I think it's still Ryu aboard the car, rolling now. It See just, just exactly how long. They just haven't been happy with the, the balance of the, the eight car. Um, but they've, they've just been struggling. They just haven't quite got it where they want it, I, I believe. And um, they seem to be just missing a little bit of pace compared to the 51 Ferrari. That will be new tyres, I believe, though, for the number eight car. It's a minute and 31 seconds on pit road, so it took 11, further 11 seconds. Let's listen to what uh, Toto are telling the driver. OK, Joe, new set of soft tyres, new set of soft tyres, and a refuel. 12 laps, mate. The 12 laps don't coming for Rio Hirakawa. New boots on each corner. That will be good news for him at this stage. He is going to need a bit of a, a boost here to just push this forward, Peter. Yeah, I'm just wondering what their strategy is now, whether uh, new tyres in now. Does that mean he's going two more stints, or does it mean that... Because he's not due to do. third stint now, at least. Yeah, so... Is it two stints on a set of tyres? I'd have thought not. It's a straight answer. It you, seems to me a slightly strange one. I could see the damage there, by the way, to the underfloor of the Porsche. This is not going to be the work of a moment, and that car is going to drop back now. Uh, Mikkel Jensen comes onto the same lap, in and out of the pits, onto the same lap as the Porsche. And I think that Peugeot is going to take fifth position from the least delayed until this point of the Penske Porsche 963s. Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Cadillac, Porsche for the moment, but Peugeot looks set to take that position. Then the two Glickenhauses. Having up the order, you know, Jim Glickenhauses, plucky little contenders. Let's remind viewers a third appearance here at Le Mans. Each of the three appearances with two cars, they've finished with every car on every appearance and have never finished lower than fifth. And when you look at what they're up against this year, to be running seventh, sorry, sixth, and, sorry, seventh and eighth at the moment with under eight hours to yeah. go, what a remarkable story. Well, they just seem to be running their own pace and unaffected by the other cars. And, you know, it's a... Uh, it's almost like a victory if they were to finish in the top five, but you know what? More trouble can happen ahead, and they oh, can yeah. just gradually pick away. Anything can happen in this race. Well, you know, when we came back to uh, the race this morning, after taking a little bit of shut-eye, we watched that developing battle between the Cadillac, trying to fend off Kevin Estre. How long did it take them to catch Roman Dumas? That car still got pace. So if they could keep out of the, uh, out of the uh, pit lane and out of the garage, it doesn't take very many fumbles, the like of which is currently being suffered by the number six Porsche. 93, by the way, has gone through and has taken fifth position. Yeah, the number eight car now coming upon quite a bit of traffic in the Porsche curves, which is not what you want and not the place to get it either, but uh, it's pushing on through. It seems to me with the Toyota, they're, they're bolted on the soft tyres all the time. So listen, what's going on now with Toyota again? OK, Joe, the gap is 25.7. Yeah, it's big difference. Copy, big difference, copy. The gap is 25.7. Ferrari did not change tires. This is going to be a testing moment. Big New difference, tires for yeah. Hirakawa. He's going to make an, a, an impact now. Yep, he's, um, I think, feeling a lot happier, more confident in the car. So what have we had for this car? This The drama for this car lost the lead. Uh, in this period of time. Nose change with damage for that car. Puncture in the same pit stop. That was the previous pit stop. Now, having lost that lead, he's back out with fresh rubber. Now is the time to shine, Rio. Number two, Cadillac. That car comes in in the hands of Alex Lynn. He's had a good stint there. 43 seconds behind the lead battle, plus this stop, of course. Still the Porsche in the garage. We'll come back to what that's going to mean shortly. Let's have a listen in to Cadillac. 
Copy, copy. Watch your mark. You stay in the car. You stay in the car. Yeah, this will be Alex going on to a second stint. And we are just a couple of minutes away from Porsche losing another position here. Sixth at the moment. Olivier Plant aboard the 708, and he's in the final sector. And maybe another lap, actually. Looking at that, it might be one more lap for Olivier Plant to take sixth position. Penske are not going to win them on this year. And with the Toyota as well, the gap now at 25 seconds, they won't want that to get any bigger because once you know, once it starts to get bigger, the pressure starts to come off the uh, off the Ferrari. So, so listen to the number two car. We will do oil. We will do oil. So watch the boards. Same procedure. So Alex Lynn waits for the go, gets it there. Away he goes, the electric start. Start with, uh, under hybrid power, hybrid electric power, and then... LMP2. The litre engine kicks into life. Sorry, Guy. Sorry, yeah, I'm just looking at the LMP2, and you've got into Europol still leading, but uh, the WRT41 is only 2.3 seconds behind, so... The change now is with the bits. It's the bronze driver aboard the car. Right. That's when the silver driver aboard the car. And uh, he's done well, actually, to fend off Robert Kvitzer to this point. Excuse me, I can't speak this morning. Mikowski, the uh, family behind the racing bakers, and also team principal now of this effort. They have had a magnificent run. Really, truly impressive. They've been in the mix for podium places in the WC, and that's not sort of come their way. But... Uh, they stand here as potentially in the mix for something a bit more than just a podium. He's feeling much better with those tyres. Yeah, I mean, Rio had a difficult time uh, for his first stint. He already had some damage from some debris on the track. Also, he had a puncture when he came in. But our guy reacted very well to minimise the damage. And then, even after that, he was struggling with the balance. But now, now he has the new tyres and he seems to be much happier with the balance. So let's see this wise what we can do. I think still Ferrari is a bit, I mean, Ferrari is. A little bit quicker, so it's still difficult for us, but uh, yeah, we just do our best and we have full support from our crew, including Castle crew, so uh, we really focus on car 8 and let's hope it works out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One uh, bullet left in the gun, of course, from Toyota, and that means the, the management can focus on that car, and indeed the gap is coming down a little, under 25 seconds now. In time, Alex Lynn making his way through a bit of a gaggle of traffic. And that gaggle of traffic, by the way, is the battle for the lead in GTM. Still, Takeshi Kimura has had a long stint this morning. And uh, the bronze driver for the 57 against the gold driver for the Iron Dames. It looks to me as if Rahul Rai about to take the lead in GTE Am here. Bright yellow Ferrari, bright pink Porsche. Third is Thomas Floor, and he's only 3.5 seconds back, so here we are, 16 hours and change into this race, and the top three in GTM separated by three seconds. So long shot through the Porsche curves, we'll see the silver and red car, where is it? Not quite in shot there, but not so much further behind this pair. There it is, they are the top three. The yellow car, the pink car, and the silver car. And, uh, looking to put pressure on the, uh, the Japanese, oh, uh, Japanese gentleman drive, it paid off there a little bit. It. Pressure was applied. Also, uh, the P2 battle, half a second between position one and two right now. 
So we've got battles underway. Nose to tail in two of the three classes. This is one of them. Just looking at the Garage 56 Hendrix Motorsports car. NASCAR is uh, moving its way up the field, now ahead of uh, all the GT cars. That's the first time this morning we've seen that. That's, uh, that's been their battle we heard earlier uh, with Steph down in pit lane. And then over to Lou Beckett and uh, Jensen Button talking about the fact that uh, they're measuring their progress against the GTMs. That battle for the moment is won. Tougher from here on in as uh, the P2 cars in good health. We've got side by side action now for the lead in GTM. And through and into the lead goes Rahul Fry. Yeah, that's the way that it makes her feel. There will be millions around the world pushing hard, cheering on at this uh, earlier in the morning for this effort. So how many hours does Kimura have to do in the car? Does the bronze driver have to do in the I think it's six. I'll have six to double check it, but I think it's six hours. And uh, once I get a bit of breathing room, I'll we'll have a look at just exactly how he's doing on his driver time. That is the thing to watch at this stage is it's all very well where these cars sit in the overall order, but which of these teams have still got quite a lot of bronze time to burn? And particularly in the GTM cars, they come in chunks of about an hour at a time. Yeah. And you can gain a lot of time with a gold or platinum driver in that time. You can lose a lot of time against the other teams if they've chosen that strategy in a different way. This is where the opportunity to, if you like, burn the bronze time in those safety car periods comes back into play. This is the battle for the lead in LMP2. And again, it's the lesser ranked driver, silver ranked. Kuba in the 34 car against Robert Kaditsa, shiny as the Platinums, Grand Prix winner, of course, in Formula One, his career there. It is Polish driver against Polish driver. I'm sure our friends and colleagues on Polish TV are keeping a weather eye on this one. Absolutely. Fabulous stuff. I think sometimes all three of us from the UK, of course, it can be a bit blasé about what it means about sporting success when you've got a depth of competition available to watch and to follow. But when you've got a nation that maybe is not, and at the inside he does it there, does it beautifully, has to do it off track. I think he's going to have to give that back. The pass was made off track, and he is going to let uh, Kubischewkowski uh, back for the moment. That smart boy, Robert Kubica, got in too deep. Not clean, wasn't. And he's let that one go. There'll be another uh, moment to do that. Calm down, everybody in Poland. Just for the moment. <laughs> 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 and by the way, another brand new nation uh, came to Le Mans with Riandrad. Angola. Portuguese Angolan, Riandrad. There'll be brec breakfast all over the living room, all over Poland right now. Should be able to get him on the run to, uh, if not the first chicane, the second chicane. Could be doing a great job here. And he'll be thoroughly enjoying this, the team are thoroughly enjoying it. It's a multinational effort at uh, Inter-Europol competition. Not really closing up in the, in the draft, is he? We've got the Peugeot coming up behind as well. Look how big the Peugeot looks compared to the P2 cars. Yeah. So much bigger. I think the, the only thing to say here is every single part of the lap that the interior car can make this difficult for the 41 makes it better for them in the long run. The longer he holds them back, yeah, you're Absolutely right. Absolutely right, yeah. And at the moment, it's not even remotely close, so the pass isn't coming anytime soon. So well, again, it's trying to force him to make the error, which he did. He made the error in trying to make the lunge. Team will be delighted with the efforts of their man here, the Inter-Europol team. Robert Kubica, meanwhile, but will be the one feeling the pressure remarkably here. I mean, that move on the last year, Kane, that's not a traditional, because no. it's, it's risky. There was, there was certainly room, I think it, there was room left there. Yeah. There was racing room left there 
but, but he wasn't quite close enough. I'm just wondering whether he's weighed up the situation and says, well, I can't get him on the straights. He's too fast. So I've got to go to an unusual place to get by him. And obviously, with Kubica being a high-level driver, he's looking for every possible overtaking place and weighed up that last corner. He might have another go this lap. Depends if he can get by him into Indianapolis. The inside of the left-hander is a possibility. But then in Indianapolis, again, it's the, the, the pace of the 34 car is going to force Robert Kubica into a lower percentage move here. He's not going to pull, a, pull a, a aside and let him go. And quite right, they shouldn't. This is for the lead at Le Mans. It's 12th place overall. Cracking battle. Drive of his life, Cooper. He will be, it's, a, it's an understated guy. We've got uh, Kimura San now under pressure from Matteo Caroli for second. And Caroli makes the pass. Bright green dinosaur overtakes bright yellow car guy. So it is Porsche 1 2 again now. Nicky Katzberg, by the way, 30 seconds behind here in what's been a fine recovery drive from Corvette. This morning, yeah, I think they can sense that uh, they've got the pace to uh, to get certainly on the podium, if not the win here. And uh, Nicky Katzberg is let's have a uh, listen in with Albert Costa from Into Europol, see what he thinks about the team boss and his progress this morning. I'm with Albert Costa from the 34 Into Europol. Well, I just got back onto pit lane and what a great sight to see. Yeah, I, I mean, it's my third, fourth race in UEG. It's my first time that you come here to visit me. That means that we are doing the right job. And I'm really happy you now enjoying this first uh, debut in, uh, in Le Mans in the uh, well, in a bit, best way is possible. We are fighting for, for the victory. I can't believe that this is happening. This is, I have no words to describe what I'm leaving, but yeah. We need to keep calm, we need to keep doing the job as we, we've been doing until the beginning. And yeah, focus, easy, no curves, no 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 crazy moments and just push, push, push. And you've just been watching Jakob, he's doing a great job right now. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, Jakob is not a professional driver and he's, he's pushing himself a lot on the at-home training, losing weight. And he's up against Kubica right now. Sorry, say again? <laughs> no, but really, it's, it's amazing the, the way he's working on the team, everything. We are working together and he's pushing himself to become a better driver. And this is the result. At least, he's not finished, but this is a great result also for his father, for his family, for his mom, that he's in the, in the heaven. And this is amazing for all the, this family here. All right, well, I hope to speak to you later. I hope to see you later too. Well, uh, that's what it's all about. You can hear the excitement, can't you? Albert know, Costa's uh, voice there. This is, I don't think, a result they would have been expecting at this stage. He's right. This team is very much a family affair. Uh, the reins handed over to Kubert from his father, Lushnar. Uh, let's hear back from uh, Lou. What else can you tell us? It's, uh, history here at Le Mans and within the WEC. They've always sort of seemed to be in there and... Was it last year, year before they finished fifth? You know, they're always sort of there, but not quite. Right now, they're leading it. They are indeed, and uh, there was a big step forward taken from this team in the Asian Le Mans series this year, their first ever overall win in LMP2, done in fine fashion with a very different driving squad than what we see here. But it's not just about the drivers, it's about what the difference can be made by all sorts of aspects from that team. Teams taking a step forward, Guy Smith, it just needs this kind of level of encouragement for people to dig deeper and find something. Yeah, and the um, the Inter-European team have really kind of just been improving year on year. They've really um, have stepped up and uh, have been now challenging at the front and now they're leading at Le Mans. So what a fantastic effort. And Kibitza can't get past him. He's, he's, he's soaking up that pressure so well. He's doing he? a great job. And the thing is, you find that once you catch up to a car, you can catch him quite easily. But if you don't get past him quickly, you kind of almost lose that momentum and yeah. that that, that uh, forward inertia. So he's kind of almost like stuck behind him now. And I think he'll know that he, he's got a bit of confidence to keep it behind him. Uh, if my time is correct, by the way, um, Cooper will be utterly elated. He's within five minutes of his minimum driving time, at which point 
this can be handed over uh, should he choose to do so or why should he at this stage um, to the two professional drivers on the Costa and uh, Fabio Scherer now a bit bottled up now is a moment this is where Kibitza might find it but still held off by Schmikowski uh, so this meanwhile what's going on with Ferrari Gap to Toyota, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Operation okay, from the front line. Operation from, from James Gallardo. Uh, but that gap coming down, what's it? It's about 25 seconds. It was, yeah. ago. This is heating up again. This, 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 this race is just sitting on a, it's not a knife edge yet, although I'm sure LMP2 would disagree, but this is cooking up to something that could be very special. WRT winners here, of course, but also, whilst we might focus on the absolute global news story that was the drama at the end of Le Mans for the overall win 2016, uh, it was WRT that lost the lead on the last lap, the car with Ife at the wheel. The other car came through to take the win, but it could have been, should have been a 1 2 for WRT. Now, that's, now that was easier, wasn't it? That was the Corvette, the so oh, and off for the, in the background for the DKR car. Did he just find it and go there, or was that just. It kind of looked like that because he it, it, it could have just. Uh, it looked like he, he could have kept that place, but. Job done. It's the inlet for. WRT, we're on drive, ready to go. So there's Silver Driver still with time to serve. Let's have a look at what that looks like. Where is Rui with his drive time? Give me a moment as I scroll through this lot. We'll see just exactly how much Silver drive time. And Rui has still got over an hour to do. So whilst that is a position lost for into Europol, if the timing system we've got in the booth here is correct, um, maximum that Kubish Shmikovsky, I do apologise, I've got uh, <laughs> tongue tied this morning, uh, maximum is this lap and one more to get to his minimum of six hours of driving time. So frankly, unless it's this lap for fuel, he's absolutely in the window to do the best job he possibly could have done. And I can tell you, Right now, the next time I see Cooper, he's going to get a great big man hug because that's a magnificent display from him. And if, if you could just sit now, uh, you know, keep it close to Kibitza now, then that's fine. That's great. You know, yeah. just keep that gap uh, close. And he is. He's sticking. Yeah. He's just pulled back in and uh, keeping that car in sight. Under seven and a half hours to go. Ferrari lead this race. James Collado. Gap is coming down a little, it's 20 seconds to Rio Hirakawa after what's been a little bit cat and mouse through the early hours of the morning. Cadillac Racing's Alex Lynn, two minutes and 20 seconds back in third place. Seb Bourdais, a further three minutes back off the lead lap. The Cadillac 6-3-4 after a battle until about uh, 40 minutes ago that involved Kevin Est in the number six Porsche, Estra. A spirited attack did not manage to pass the Cadillac and eventually the pressure told on himself with a, an error into the Porsche curves. The car slapping the barrier at the outside after a run through the gravel trap damaged the underfloor of that car and it's still in the pit garage and as I speak falls out of the top 10. 93 Peugeot in fifth, then the two Glickenhouses making their way back up the order as others fumble in sixth and seventh. The lead car in the Porsche battle now is the Porsche Penske number five, then the 50 Ferrari and the second of the Peugeots, both Peugeots in the top 10. And the Peugeot attack has faded, but they led and led well for quite some time going into the nighttime hours. In LMP2, as we watch the 911, 911 um, take to the track shortly. I think that's Michael Fassbender climbing aboard the car. Team WRT took the lead on the current lap. That just completed that lap. Robert Kibitzer, two seconds to the good now from the interior pull car. Platinum driver versus silver driver. It took him a long time to get there. Those two cars, two seconds apart. 
And a minute and 22 seconds back is Rennie Binder in the on-form Duquesne team effort, the number 30 car, Edex Sports, Paul Lafargue, almost a minute back with Jacques Van Utet in the Paris racing car. It's uh, three French teams, in fact, four French teams then battling behind. And uh, gaps to be addressed. The Pro Amplas led and led well at the moment in 21st position by Algo Pro Racing after traumas in the morning and particularly for Paul Ben Barnicote in the number 80 car crashing out the lead and out of the race. Pro Racing's Melty Jakobsen is, what is that, uh, two, three laps back from the lead in Pro Am in the 37 Cool Racing car that has its own problems overnight. Looking at the Hendrix Motorsport Camaro, gloriously filthy. That's exactly what a race car should look like. Mike Rockenfeller aboard that car and in that pit stop. There goes the Jackman on the left-hand side of the car. We'll do the same on the right-hand side of the car. Didn't see Rocky get aboard the car through the driver's window. No doors on that car. The car drops back again into the lead pack of GTM. And in that battle, it is the Iron Dames. Rahel Fry leads the race, two and a half seconds ahead of a closing Matteo Caroli. Porsche 1 2, 85 from 56 with the Project 1 AO. Choose your weapon bright pink Porsche, green dinosaur. This is uh, this GTM battle is fantastic. It's great. It's, the lead is just changing almost every hour. You know, when GT Pro left the World Championship, the FIWC at the end of last year, we'll mourn it and will we'll forever mourn it. It's provided fantastic uh, entertainment. And GTE Am, the uh, formula with pro and drivers aboard these cars, the sole remaining place in the World Endurance Championship and here at Le Mans for the GTE machines in their final year of competition alongside the ELMS. Again, its final year before LMGT3 takes over next year. We look forward to the uh, the variety that's going to bring. Robert Singer there, so long, and so uh, a part of the Porsche efforts in um, here at Le Mans, and uh, there with Christian Reed, the ever-present starter. Still that number six car. This is a long repair. By the way, Robert Singer's son, the first race car he's designed is the current and brand new 992 version of the uh, 911 GT3R, the current GT3 car. You know all about Porsche GT3s, Peter Dumbreck, uh, down through the years at the Nürburgring most recently. Yeah, I've, I've driven a few. Oh. Aston Martin loose, loose on entry to uh, Indianapolis. It's a 98 car in the hands of Ian James. Ian, a podium finisher here at Le Mans back in 2006 in LMP2. This uh, Heart of Racing backed replacement for Paul Dallana's entry, uh, but on the entry, came together in the days before Spa. They've not had long to put together this effort at Le Mans. So we'll come back to you with Porsches at uh, the Nürburgring. And yeah, I mean, we, I talked about it before. Actually, Matteo Caroli was my teammate uh, in my last year in Falcon Motorsport Porsche. Um, and yes, I, I know how quick a driver he is. He's honing in on uh, Rahel Fry now. Yep, and uh, this is a big story between two very popular teams for two very different reasons. The, the Significance cannot be ignored. We've already had an overall victory in the European Le Mans series for the Iron Dames. They're still awaiting their first victory in the FI World Endurance Championship. And if that could come at the 24 hours of Le Mans, wow, that would be quite something. Well, we've seen them in the mix the whole race. They've we just been, have. They've been in the top three the whole time, just up first, second, third, back to first again. So they're really taking it to the other teams. And five seconds added, by the way, to the 708's next pit stop, the Glickenhaus, in their pursuit of fifth place, the next target for Glickenhaus. Doing it mostly for the moment on reliability. They're climbing up the order. So Rahel Fry from Switzerland. I think it's fair to say now a veteran pro driver has been a factory driver for Audi in the past, Matteo Caroli. 
a Porsche contracted driver, the next stage down from the full factory driver. Italian driver who is passionate about Porsche. There's not many of those, but he is. His words to me were, and I couldn't believe him when I was when he was saying it. He said, "If I don't drive for Porsche, I don't drive." He, that's it. He said that to me more than yeah. once. Um, I remember him putting. Uh, the, I think the first season I came across him at the top level, the European Le Mans series, putting the Porsche, the only Porsche that year, in the European Le Mans series on pole at Imola. And I've really seen a more related young driver. Uh, I think he's a fabulous character. And here he is, the big green dinosaur. Fan favourite would be an understatement here. And look forward, by the way, uh, if you if you like your, your toy cars, I do. And uh, that car, I can tell you, took a visit to Hot Wheels recently. I think that's coming. And that will be one very popular pocket money toy when it finally comes. This is a great battle. It looks like it's about to take a bite out of the Iron Dames car. <laughs> Choose your weapon. Well, the weapon at the moment is a Porsche. 911 RSR 19. The oh. 2019 spec of these cars. Oh. Let's have a listen what's going on with the lead car. James Gallardo. There's vibration at high speed, front right. Uh, I can see the tyre bobbing up and down. Copy that, man. Copy that. Do you think it's pickup? No. Oh. Front right, big vibration. I can see the tyre popping up and down. And he doesn't think it's pickup. Yeah. I mean, the lap time's still good. He's, he's the 29.8 um, versus uh, power power on the 30.3. So. The pace is still there, but um, clearly he's obviously got um, some concerns over that uh, that tyre. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this issue of vibration, try to put it, Peter Dunbreck, into terms that someone can understand and listen to. I've seen your explanation on the stage at Le Mans Scrutineering when you were asked, what's it like at 200 miles an hour on the Mulsanne? And I've often demonstrated to people face to face what, how it was you explained it, and it was both graphic and hilarious but what level of vibration are we talking about by the way that's the lead change that's just happened with Matteo Caroni making his way by well obviously the faster you go the more that vibration comes through the car and um, I, I, I can't remember We're, explaining it to before but I, I, I will do an apologies to our TV viewers I will explain to both the gentlemen sitting to my but to my right what Peter did when interviewed by Bruno van der Stick. The, the question was, what's it like at 200 miles an hour on the Mulsanne? And uh, Peter's response was, <laughs> uh, which it was basically, Peter, um, how can I put this, acting out, uh, effectively being in a tumble dryer. Now, that's a regular run down the Mulsanne. It's not billiard table smooth in a race car. If he's complaining about it, he's got a problem. Just looking yeah. now on the video to see if there's anything. See movement of the tyre. The wheel, rather. It's hard to tell whether that's irregular, though. That could just be... The fact that he's reporting it. Yeah. So this is his first stint on this tyre. Uh, looking at that. Minute 20 on the pit stop. If they did if they did four tyres, that was quick. So I'll listen to what James is saying now. Hey, James. We need at least two more laps, and it's three to make it a 12-lap stint. We can't cut this one short, or we add a stop. There you go, this far out, seven hours and 14 minutes. Team making it very clear, you've got to tough this one out, Sunshine. Gap is now under 20 seconds, but it's not coming down massive. Did on that last lap by three seconds, actually. So we'll keep an eye on sector times here. It's actually quicker in the middle sector than Hirakawa last time. I mean, it could be the balance of the, of the wheel. Yeah, that, because he could have lost the weight off the wheel. wheel. Something as simple as that. So he's, he's basically just going to make it his, his way through at least two laps and hopefully three to keep them on the strategy. And as you heard there from Justin Taylor, the uh, race engineer on the 51 car with a huge amount of experience, ex Audi and with Rebellion for some time as well, Justin. They're counting back here. 
And that's, a, that's quite a moment in this race, isn't it, when you start to count back towards the end of the race. Does it make it feel shorter or longer, gentlemen? I think it's shorter. I think, you know, the end, the end is in sight. Definitely close to the end now, so... Uh, but this is where it really starts to... You know, they can't afford any yelly pit stops because they don't have the time to recover, so... It's a straight fight now between the two... Uh, between the Ferrari and the Toyota, so... And as you said, even even at the lap times he's doing, he's still maintaining that 19, 20 second gap. Yep. Well, as a mark of just how well a light this race is, we're talking here about a gap for the overall lead hovering around the 20 second mark with a little bit of a, a running problem at the moment, 51 car vibration from the front right. In the last 10 minutes, we have had lead changes in both LMP2 and in uh, GTM. But let's uh, go to one of the guys who's been involved in that battle. Louis Beckett is with Robert Kubica on pit lane uh, with Team WRT right now. I'm with Robert Kubica from the 41 WRT. That looked like it was a challenge this morning. Oh, oh. Right. Uh, oh. Actually, compared to, to the middle part of the race uh, and the early part of the race, this was an uh, easy one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the track condition is settled now, uh, which was not the case in the first part of the race. So, uh, yeah, uh, we are fighting. It's not an easy one against uh, Inter Europol. Uh, they are uh, from different league compared to us. Uh, yeah, so uh, a part of, uh, I think that they, they are uh, more clever by using short ratios, uh, shorter ratios than us. Uh, so okay, they gain a lot of acceleration and yeah. It's still a long way to go. Uh, everything can happen, uh, especially with the new safety car rules. So, uh, yeah, we have to keep going, keep it clean and uh, try our best. You jumped straight on team radio and you were feeding back a lot to the team just then. So what were you saying? Was it about those pit stops? No, I mean, I, I, my job is uh, to inform the team how was the balance, how was the car, uh, try to give as many information also to Rui and, uh, yeah, uh, we didn't have uh, proper pressure, I think, for this uh, run, for this stints. Uh, I did triple stint, but then especially the first two were very difficult. There was a lot of slow zones in the uh, high-speed corners, so I didn't put uh, a lot of energy into the tires. I couldn't put because we were going 80 km per hour. So the tire never switched on, and actually, afterwards, they were better, but yeah. Uh, nevertheless, you know, still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you right now, I think Team WRT are rattled by the form of that car. They said something about the short ratios. From memory, I think there were two options for LMP2 ratios. Right. I find it difficult to believe that the Le Mans 24 hours, they've gone for a short ratio option. I agree. There are two ratios for, for the P2 car. As you say, you would have thought there was uh, only one set for Le Mans. Yeah. Um, but they certainly had the speed advantage on the streets, didn't they? Yeah. But it could be aero. I mean, it could be that they're uh, running yeah. maybe a slightly faster car or... Yeah, yeah. Let's have a listen what's going on with the surviving Toyota, Rio Hirakawa, in pursuit. OK, Rio, we see... Uh, we think the 51 Ferrari has flat-spotted its tyres. You're two tenths up, sector one, gap 19.3. Great job. Just keep pushing, mate. Keep pushing. Head down. That's what you want to hear, but trouble here from the number 708 car at Indianapolis, I think that is, has looped it. Can the car be restarted? It's Olivier Plat. Don't think it's hit the barrier, has it? I think it's probably just it's maybe spun on the exit. It might have hit the barrier, you know, looking at... So we look here. Classic error we've seen time and time again here. Yeah, the gravel. Oh, it spits it hard. That is going to be in the barrier. Yeah, it's yeah. clanged it, clanged it hard. That could be a big problem. Don't like to see, gentlemen, that rear wheel clattered into a barrier that could transfer the energy all the way through the car, and that's where you can get mechanical problems. And also the barrier, you saw the barrier take, you know, a huge amount of impact, and uh, it's whether it's actually damaged the barrier, because if it has damaged the barrier, then obviously um, you're going to have to get the marshals on track to start fixing it. Double yellows at the moment, as you might expect, uh, to give Olivier Pla the opportunity to rejoin. He is going to rejoin. 
fabulous stuff. You can see the barrier bending with the impact. But has it bent too far? Lickenhouse ready. He's still not away. Going to need to find reverse. Olivier, highly experienced, needs the push back here. He's not got room to do it. He's struggling to find reverse here for the car. And these cars are not really designed for reverse. reverse. So they have a tiny little reverse gear, and sometimes... Well, the problem here is it's double yellows. The marshals will be instructed whether or not they can go to the track surface to push that car. There is not the protection of anything other than a yellow flag. And I'm pretty certain that without a slow zone, they're not going to be attending that car. He's shaking his head a little, isn't he? Talking to the team by the look of things as well. So we'll listen, what's going on from race control? The slow zone is coming. The driver is supposed to know how to engage reverse, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that is peak Eduardo. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a case that he doesn't know how to do it. I think it's a case that it just won't go in. I suspect that's probably quite right. And that, I think, is why he's shaking his head, which is where I'm concerned. What we've often seen when you see that, that kind of sideways impact through the axle is the damage isn't at the wheel and it's not the drive sh shaft. I think the damage could be in the gearbox. Right. I think we've got marshals on the track now, so the push will happen. And finally, the number five car, a six car rather uh, rejoins the race and that was 43 minutes that small error at the entry to the porsche curves cost the porsche penske number six car it's kevin estra that will get uh, get things back on track let's go and talk to lou lou what's going on down there I know you were hearing radio from James Collado. It looks like that number 51 Ferrari is on its way in for a pit stop. Thanks, Lou. And that will be the two laps that Justin Tiller told James he needed to complete to stick with the plan. He's restricted the damage. That car is crabbing. The 708 car is back on the way, but it is not running in a straight line. Look at that. the spare nose for the 709 prepared for the 708 this time which indicates they're beginning to run out spares such a shame they were having such a great run absolutely as we've seen though it's a tiny little mistake can make absolutely. all the difference and, and can pretty much ruin your race yeah olivier pla will be absolutely distraught with that so let's go down to lou just briefly ferrari is going to be on its way in shortly what's awaiting for it lou you can see antonio giovanazzi ready to get into the car and a fresh set of medium tires are ready for him yeah fair for action with the Leading number 51 car, Ryo Hirakawa has, and it's on pit lane now. So double stinting drivers at the moment, changing tyres and driver every two stints. Is Collado out of the car? It is, yes. Yep, Jim Flatsy in. They're pushing, and pushing hard now. I think, I think they're just trying to keep the drivers fresh. And, I think know. they are, and I think they can sense a bit of history coming here, gentlemen. There was the huge opportunity here for AF Corsa, Ferrari. In comes the 708 from Glickenhaus. If you've got tired drivers, the chances of an error like Olivier Pla just made become a bit higher, and therefore you're better just to double stint drivers, keep them fresh, keep them rested. Yeah. They're in a good, they're in the, the prime position right now. Indeed. Also on pit lane, by the way, Ria Hirakawa from second place. So 51 on pit lane. James Collado to Antonio Giovinazzi. Ria Hirakawa stays aboard the number eight car in and out of the pits. The number two Cadillac in third place. Now in the hands of Richard Westbrook, Seb Bourdais. He sits in fourth. Cadillac still third and fourth as they have been through most of this morning. And it's the Peugeot with the 
is the damage in the rear of the Lincoln House. So I think Toyota choosing to go the other way there. Isn't that the fourth stint of uh, Hirakawa now? Is. He's been in for quite some time. Peugeot up in the fifth place, the 93 car. And that car also recently in and out of the pits. It's Mikkel Jensen bought that car. 709, Glickenhaus takes the sixth position that was previously occupied by the car that's now being pushed back into the carriage after that's hit the exit of Indianapolis. There it goes, Olivier Pla. It is a highly unusual occurrence in the history of this team to see a car in the barriers, uh, in, the, in the garage. You're, you spotted something? Yeah, um, Buemi now is in the car, in the number eight. Ah, we didn't see so, the driver uh, change. Yeah, two fresh drivers. There it is. Oh, oh, shit. God, that was a violent kick, wasn't it, through the gravel trap? Just had the power on where it didn't need to be. It was almost like he got away with it, but then he almost bottomed out on the kerb. Yeah, he yeah. Seemed kick, up, kick the rear wheels up, and that's what got the rotation. Well, you, you can see that a lot of other people have stuck a wheel in that gravel, so the gravel now is a hole. Yes, yes. exactly. Completely, yes, absolutely yeah. spot on. What a brilliant shot that was. Great camera work. That's a fantastic shot. A few minutes till we hand over to Jim Roller in the big chair. It has been a morning of real drama. This has just been the latest one. But as we get uh, close to nine o'clock in the morning here, seven hours to go, it's Ferrari that leads Le Mans. We've had an uh, inter Polish battle team and drivers for the lead in LMP2. The moment has gone the way of the Inter-European competition car, Albert Costa at the wheel of the 34 car, and pulling away from Team WRT now, cycling through with their silver drivers. Still needing about an hour to serve of his drive time. Six hours they must do. Looks like the Ferrari had a slightly better pit stop than the, uh, the Toyota. Looks like the gap now in 28 seconds, so we'll see once... Uh, a little bit further on. It was actually, let's have a look at 21 seconds longer for the Ferrari. So How that it? indicates pace somewhere has been lost by Toyota. We'll keep an eye on that gap. 28 seconds, you're absolutely right. It was down to 19, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, the other side of that pit stop cycle. So what's gone on there? Um, GTM, by the way, and that's been Willow Light 2. And the latest change is it's uh, been a pit stop for the Iron Dames who led coming into breakfast time here. Matteo Caroli for the 56, Project 1A car, And if none of those words mean anything to you, Rexy the Dinosaur leads Le Mans. Dinosaur wins Le Mans. Wow, that would be something. Nicky Katzberg, by the way. And the 53 Corvette back up into second position and up to third, Charlie Eastwood in the ORT by TF, Aston Martin. Top three places, three very different cars. The 25 car, Oman Racing Team. Talked about the Polish nation getting behind what's going on in LMP2. Trust me, little nation of Oman, nation of around 4 million people will be waking up this morning. Whatever time it is in Oman, I'm too tired to work that one out. And we'll be taking a very close interest in what's going on in GTE AM. So I wonder what happened then with this Toyota. It's definitely uh, 28 seconds. Almost 29 seconds. It's gained 20 seconds in the pits, but lost time on track. Let's find out whether or not there's any clues from what's going on with Sepp How can I unlock the red bar? How can I unlock it? OK, Sepp, just try and push it a little bit forward. Push it forward maximum, and then while it's down, pull it back. Push it forward maximum, then pull it back. Unlock the what bar? The roll bar, or maybe, yeah, I'm not sure. So, under seven hours to go now, and uh, as I say, uh, I'll be handing over in just a few moments to Jim Roller. And the next voice you will hear in our third chair will be Anne Davidson for Peterton Breck. Let's uh, go down though to pit lane for. Interview with Louise Beckett. 
I'm with James Collado, who's just brought the 51 Ferrari in, uh, just getting a massage there. Do you reckon he can do that on my feet? <laughs> I could try. I think it's a good little thing. It's like a, I don't know, vibrating thing. I'll be careful what I say. Um, I guess you want to ask about the, the stint. It was, it was pretty decent. The car's there. Uh, it's been a great fight for the Toyotas. Uh, we've been nose to tail for the last few hours and um, I'm just really enjoying it. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a magical place to be, um, you know, and um, you know, so proud of the guys. So whatever happens, just I'm happy for them. I mean, yes, what you guys have achieved so far this season within WEC and here in Le Mans, uh, we are getting to the early hours. We are all getting a little bit emotional, but it's true, isn't it? What you what you've achieved so far is incredible. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think the car's ever gone this far before, if I'm honest, in terms of hours. Um, but you know, it, it always seems to be okay. I mean, fingers crossed. But like I say, we'll just take it lap by lap, stint by stint, do the best we can. And Tono's in the car now on a on a different compound because I started to struggle a bit with the rears. And we'll see how we go. I'll let you rest up a bit. Thank you. Get a bit more of a massage. There's our uh, one-time leader in the, and still is our leader. Yeah, just in the LMP2 category. While while Anthony and I were having breakfast this morning, we saw that car lose the lead to the WRT number 41, but now it has regained the lead. Back in the old days of television, guys, you'd have never seen those pebbles. They would have been little blurs. That's what high definition has done for us. You can see he just overshot on the entry to uh, Molsan Corner into the gravel. Oh, look at that. Perhaps oh, just lost concentration for a second, but um, those stones, there's a lot of stones in that car. That can cause some problems. It just takes a stone to get into the brake disc or in the wheel, and, um, you know, that can cause some problems. So hopefully it won't do. They're having a, a great run and uh, had a sort of a 20-second lead um, over the second-place WRT car, so... Yeah, they had lost the lead uh, when they had their lowest graded driver in the car behind the wheel of the Indy Euro pole. But now I believe they can run through to the end of the race with their higher graded, the golds and the platinum drivers that they have available. So, uh, yeah, so that's a, a rare mistake. I'd have to say for Albert Costa there down into uh, the Molsan corner as Rio Herakara walks away from the pit wall back to the garage. New fastest lap of the race by the 50 Ferrari on a 28.1, 328.1, wow. so new fastest lap. So, Guy, I understand uh, Buemi, who is uh, not, well, is back in the car. Um, once I went off to, for my for my rest, he continued to have roll, roll bar issues. He's still complaining about the car. Yeah, they just don't seem totally happy with the car. They've been playing around a lot with the roll bars, and they just don't quite have the raw pace of the Ferrari. They've, they've kept themselves in the game, and uh, but at the, the last, before the last pit stop, a um, couple of laps ago, the gap was 19, 18, 19 seconds. They did a pit stop, came out, and it was at 28, 29. So somewhere, um, Toyota lost a decent chunk of time. Um, well, they're out of sync, aren't they, with the driver changes? Uh, they, they, yeah. they, both cha they both changed at the same time. They, they, so when we, when we jumped in um, for... Uh, Rio. Rio, yes. Oh, hang on. I can hear I can hear Louise in my ears. Uh, Louise, oh. do you want to come in if uh, Jim hits the panel? There you go. You can tell tell the world, Lou. Thanks, and when Rio put a fresh set of tyres on, he went back out and there was a 25-second difference. So now it's right. 32 yeah. seconds. Rio, of course, being for Rio is Rio Hirakawa. Yeah, so Hirakawa. Um, so at that point, he was out of sync with, uh, at the time, it was Pierre Guidi yes. at the wheel of the Ferrari 51. So that's why I assumed that's still the way be. it was so, when, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so Rio, obviously, he had the right rear puncture, slow puncture as well, for those of you who had missed it. Um, so that's why they lost a little bit of lap time there. They all also, uh, not lap time, time to the 51 car. And they also had to change the splitter. The nose of the car came off. They had a little bit of damage. 
think it uh, affected the balance of that Toyota. And uh, so they still, even with that nose change, they still haven't managed to find the speed that they started this race with. And uh, Graham Goodwin leaps out of his chair and he's pointing <laughs> at a purple He saw purple. Yeah, he saw he purple. Saw purple. <laughs> we are, yes, we are in happy hour uh, where the track is at its best. You got the rubber down from uh, from yesterday and, and coming into today. I know we've had the rain, but the temperatures are cool and you can now see where you're going. So yeah. uh, <laughs> that's where the lap time starts to come from. As we uh, are just under seven hours to go, there's your LMP2 leader. Second yep. place is the Team WRT number 41 and the Duquesne number 30 continues to circulate as our final podium position in LMP2. And how amazing would this be? Uh, probably completely cursed it for them right now uh, into Europol. Regardless what happens through the rest of this race, I mean, it's been incredible. They've had the speed from word go here at Le Mans, mm -hmm. which hasn't been the case for the time that I've been watching their efforts, their efforts at this track. So, uh, or, or, or in LMP2 in general, they've always been somewhere there or thereabouts. But they have had a quick racing car all the way through this event. Albert Acosta behind the wheel of that car currently. Giovinazzi just did his fastest uh, lap of the race, uh, lap earlier on, a, I think it was a, uh, a 28.6, I believe, 7. So the Ferrari's pushing on, got some real pace at the minute, and again extended the lead over Buemi to 33 seconds. And in third place is still the, the Cadillac, Richard Westbrook behind the wheel. And then in fourth place is the other Cadillac, Sebastian Bourdais. Still a lap down. He's not been able to get that lap back. Yes, uh, even with the new safety car rules, we haven't seen one for, for quite some time, and that's probably what that uh, number three caddy is praying for. But uh, remarkable effort that they're back there in P4. It really is, because there was a time when I thought that they were just going to leave the car in the garage. It's been... Yeah. It's, it's had a troubled time here, I think it's fair to say. Uh, you know, the car set on fire we saw in qualifying and then they suffered it wasn't there through no fault of their own a huge amount of crash damage in the race and uh yeah it's it's a show a showcase to everybody just to never give up well and speaking of never giving up the number 33 Corvette racing Nikki Katzberg behind the wheel of that car yeah has now climbed all the way back to second in the GTM race, of course, uh, Rexy, the Project 1 AO Porsche, Matteo Caroli, Matteo Caroli behind the wheel of that car. And then the Iron Dame, Dames, uh, Rahel Fry in the number 85. So it's the, the two Porsches and the Corvette now battling it out as we uh, have just under seven hours to go. It's just past 9 a.m. here in Lazard. Good morning, everyone. Places are a little bit different, but uh, times actually, Guy, are a little bit different, but really things uh, haven't changed much since you and I were together last uh, about five o'clock this morning. No, the tops are very much the same. It's the uh, Ferrari and the, the Toyota. There's the Super Bronze. Ben Super Keaton. Bronze. <laughs> He's Keeping just, his fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, the Corvette, as you say, is making a, a, a real comeback. And, um, you know, it's, it's very much in the frame for a, for a possible win here. Which is and, and amazing. We, because I, I counted earlier. him out. I did. I mean, yeah, me too. I, I thought, no, they're, they're going to carry on, maybe hope for a top five. But they're, it, I mean, we're coming up uh, 49 minutes away from a regular race distance. So it's all to play for. That's right, the uh, Le Mans is uh, round four of the World Endurance Championship this season. And uh, yeah, like you say, Jim, most of our races we have in the WEC are six hours long. And uh, yeah, we're 49 minutes away from that happening. Here comes the overall race leader in the back of your shot. That's the, of course, of Ferrari 499, Antonio Giovinazzi, the former Formula One driver behind, behind the wheel. Yeah, Giovinazzi was uh, 
driving a absolutely formidable stint before he handed over to uh, Pierre Guidi. So he's back out there and he's got the sister car behind him. Number 50 with uh, Fuoco at the wheel who holds on to the fastest lap still. Let's find out what the Corvette team's talking about. Full course yellow. We have a full course yellow. Now, what has happened here? Oh, it was uh, Woco running a little bit wide there, but that's not what the uh, it's not what the full course yellow is about. <laughs> but that was uh, that was a lucky escape there, wasn't it, from Woco? So with a full co <laughs> Picking up some bollards. So with the full course yellow, pit lane is closed. So if you're Corvette and you're close on fuel, you were getting ready for a pit stop. Ben was standing by. I think this is the reason for the full course yellow right here. Just too much debris. Just on the track. too much. Too many pebbles. Too much. Uh, they need one of those big jet blowers. They do. And the guy behind's thinking, "Why use my broom when the guy in front's got a leaf blower?" <laughs> well, I'll just walk he's, behind. He's him. really there to uh, watch the guy's back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> and, uh, I, if I'm the guy with a leaf blower, I don't, I don't want that guy. I want him looking. <laughs> yes, Louise. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the other team that are waiting for their car to come in is the number 43 DKR. The lollipop person is in the pit lane, so they're gonna, um, they're gonna suffer from this closed pit lane. Hopefully, they haven't left it too close. And well, have to it, make emergency service for fuel. Well, that's the thing. If it's yeah. if you have to come in because you're running low on fuel, uh, you're only allowed a five-second splash, mm -hmm. and then you're going to be back in before you know it. Yeah, and then you have to come back in. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's that's the penalty you you suffer with the, you know, if you, it's just unlucky timing. There's nothing that the yeah. team can do. Nope. Could the 50 get any closer to the 51? Yeah. Yeah, I'm only leading the race, mate. Come on, let's. You know, yeah, you're, you're, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I think these these guys are playing too many games. Um, I get the competition. I get that you, you know, you want to be competitive, but unless you've been told to get up there and look at something, you, that, that's just insane. You're you're asking. Eventually, that's going to come back to haunt them. Those kind of shenanigans, like we saw at Spa. You know, and like we, we saw earlier in the race when when they were really going hammer and tong at each other. Just stretch your legs, boys. You got 24 hours. Well, you know, the, the number 50 is pushing on to try and make up lost ground. They're down there in P8, though. Uh, if it's anybody else, yeah, sure. But when it's your teammate, it's um, you don't want to put the, the lead car, your teammate, under unnecessary pressure. Watching a replay there of uh, Buemi. Ooh, big, big old lockup. Lock up. Wow, that's a huge lockup. He's, he's going to have blisters with, with that kind of vibration. Oh, flat spots, yeah. And uh, he's definitely going to be feeding that one. You're right there, Jim. That's what we call blistering. Oh, you call it blistering? Yeah, not flat spot. Oh, no, no, no. On, on your hands. Oh, blisters in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he'll drive through that. As, uh, he'll be more concerned about his uh, eyeballs getting rattled around in their sockets from the from the flat spots. As uh, Fuoco continues to harass his teammate through the Porsche curbs. Let's go back to the pits. Well, just looking at the timing, we've got 6.44 left. 
remember a usual WEC race is six hours, so we're not even, we're still above a normal six hour, um, six hour WEC race right now. Yeah, that's uh, we were just talking about that. That's, you're exactly right. And uh, can you uh, ask the Ferrari guys what's going on between the 50 and the 51? I don't know oh, if you're seeing the monitor. Goodness, but the they are the other end of the pit lane, but ah, okay, I will go up there. <laughs> yeah, we'd it'd just be good <laughs> to know Lou, if they're going to swap them around, because uh, it would make sense if I was the if I was the team boss there, I'd be saying, look, you know, there's no at the moment, no pressure. You're 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 over 35 seconds ahead of the Toyota uh, is Giovinazzi and Fuoco's down in P8. He's a, a, lap, a couple of laps oh, yeah. down on his on the about six laps down. Yeah. Oh, on, let him go. You're right. You're go. absolutely right. Yeah. Monty Jakobsen there just uh, had a spin. So the pit lane is open and here comes the 50 car. That makes more sense yeah, why he was so close makes, now, because yeah. <laughs> he was trying to minimize the time loss before coming into the pits. He looks over the, his left shoulder there just to check the car as he comes in, sees him on his way. So, yeah, clearly on a very different uh, strategy there. But Fuoco was absolutely flying. Fastest lap, like you said earlier on, guy 328.1 on lap 227. Well, that, that will save Louise the trip then. That's good. Yeah, stand down, Lou. Yeah, that's right. Stand <laughs> it all makes sense now. <laughs> for, we, actually, we should have seen because they're on the graphics there, the energy level with the 6% remaining of... Uh, that's a clue. <laughs> There you go. And Fuel behind it, uh, the 33 car has also come in. Ben Keating will, uh, he was boot, uh, suited and booted, but he did not get in. Fuel only, no tires. Same for the 50 car. So the comeback drive continues. Going to leave Nikki Katzberg in the car for one more stint. At least. Yeah, you've got to leave Nikki in there for as long as you possibly can. It's uh, an exceptionally quick racing driver, particularly in that 33 Corvette. He's been outstanding mm. so far this year. Put in a absolutely brilliant drive in uh, Portimao at round two of the championship. Uh, under immense pressure he was that day, but uh, hung on to it. A real masterclass in defensive driving. And this is a huge race for the 33 car from the overall big picture of the World Endurance Championship because they can put a virtual lock uh, on the championship with a victory here, given that it's double points. And in fact, I know Graham Goodwin worked out. There are a couple of scenarios where they could clinch here if they can get a victory. But that's uh, definitely dependent on that. Let's check in with Eduardo Freitas and his team. We are removing full course yellow at 9.18.45. At 9.18.45 in 30 seconds, we're removing full course yellow. So 30 seconds until we uh, go back to action. Antonio Fuoco. Coming up to speed. And full course yellow is gone. Yeah, weaving around on the, uh, the back straight there, the Mosan straight down towards the first chicane, seventh gear, 318, 20, 21, still rising before the braking zone into that first chicane. Down into second gear, get on power as early as you can. See the graphic on the right-hand side. Straight, Glickenhaus, Ooh, yep. going on there. He was stuck there, the Glickenhaus, uh, yeah, it's kind of hesitated momentarily and they had a, a slower car on the left hand side so that bulked uh, Fuoco's progress and he's weaving he's kind yeah, of what, is, not quite sure now it's not the time to try and get some pressures up in your uh... and he gets by you can really see the body language of the car the attitude's different from a car down in P8 compared to that of the uh, the 51 car with Giovinazzi it's just a different it's more alive more energetic more, dare I say, desperate in the approach. And there's nothing to lose now when you're down there. Race Control says the full course yellow is under investigation, which is kind of a broad statement that they're checking uh, that someone may have done something wrong. And it's slippery down there, isn't it? See oh, that yeah, guy? You can still he, see there's a lot of pebbles there. They've they've tried to clean the racing line, but there's a lot off. It's just, I don't know whether the wind has changed direction or what, but it's, uh, or maybe some oil down or something, but Fuoco immediately running wide, almost uh, a copy of what happened to the uh, 34 car earlier on. Yeah, the gap at the top of the field now, 39. 
much 40 seconds between uh, the air, of course, Ferrari and the Toyota. Wind to switch, Anthony, about 180 degrees from when we looked at it early in, early in the race. So track temperature is 26.6. Ambient is just under 20 degrees centigrade. Wind speed's uh, nine kilometers per hour. Humidity 70%. That's why uh, the, the first chicane took a month to dry out <laughs> last night. Well, it took until the sun came out yes. to, uh, to dry it off properly. It, it, that lasted forever, didn't it? The, yeah. the slippery conditions. What a brutal race for the drivers it's been. Set of medium tires there, ready to go on the number 51 Ferrari. They get interested to see, they, they tend to choose the medium. Toyota tend to go for the soft. As the temperatures rise in the daytime, do you think we'll see that strategy change a little bit and we may see them go now, he's back in. Sorry, yes. Do you know what it was? It had to ha have a splash, didn't it? Under the pit lane. Yes, closed. it did. That Ferrari had to splash, so he's back in for a full service Same this time the around. Car. Another penalty. Oh, anyway. The tires are sure you stay the car. The tires are sure. That makes and a lot here more comes sense. the 33 car. So you have to serve. You have to come back in within uh, a lap of so going well, green. So that's. Uh, both being done perfectly by both crews. I wonder if Ben Keating will get in now. Uh, that's exactly right. I bet he will, and that's why they didn't get in. So a couple of teams there stung by that uh, pit lane being closed under the uh, the yellow that we had. So uh, uh, it's uh, even more time loss for all those that suffered that. But However, a break for Keating is the fact that the uh, Project 1AO Porsche, uh, Rexy, is also in also. the pits for their uh, stop, and in fact, here comes Ben sliding into the Corvette. Katzberg gets out. Katzberg will stay and help with the with the belts. A lot of times you'll see mechanics do that. New set of Michelin boots going on. Rexy, I love the arms there. I still don't know why, maybe you know the answer to this guy, but why the GT cars, that the driver helps the other driver. They effectively become the driver helper, don't they, in, in terms of installing the next guy, the next uh, driver in. But the LMP cars is all I've ever really known. You always have a, a dedicated driver helper. I think with a GT car, the driver can actually do more. So uh, when I did GTs, I, I'd always do my own lap belts. And then the driver getting out can then do the shoulder belt. So it's quite straightforward, whereas in a prototype, it's, it tends to be you jump in, you lift your arms up, and they do your full belts. It's so difficult to, to search a little room in the cockpit to actually do much yourself. And I think um, there's just a bit more, yeah, a bit more space. And then it frees up effectively another person. Um, you've got you've got less bodies in the pit. So. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is is that with the um, with the GT car, there's a lot more room. So you with your helmet and everything else coming in, where with the LMP, uh, with the with the prototypes, the, the mechanic has got less around his head, smaller opening. Exactly. He can get in there and help. I was just thought, you know, whenever I got out of the car, car you're in a kind of, you know, you're in a fluster. You, you all you want, all you could think about is just get out, get back into the garage. I'm knackered. I, all I want to do is get the helmet off, drink, cool down as quick as I can. I, I would have been worried I would make mistakes in yeah. installing the next driver and, and be slower as well than a, than a driver helper that's dedicated to the job. So I'm, I'm surprised they've got the, the energy and more so the capacity to, uh, to do such an important job. It, you know, it's such a responsibility. It after tends, yeah, it tends to be the, um, the, the, the driver getting out will just do the shoulder belts. So the driver will do the gets it in, we'll do the, the, the lap belts, the driver gets out, we'll do the shoulder belts. And then it's usually a thumbs up, you know, are you good, are yep. you good to go? I'm good to go, door gets closed and, and away you go. Right. So. Is, is there an opportunity to communicate? You know, sometimes, the, sometimes the, the, it might be just- The brakes are knackered or, you know. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's often, it's very, very quick. It's, you know, car's good or it's got big oversteer or it's a very, very sort of quick exchange, um, but um, yeah. Kind of look him in the face and say, I've thrashed it for you. <laughs> Slap him on the knee. And <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> it was fine when I got out of it. <laughs> That's right.
Yeah, it's making a funny noise. It'll be all right. <laughs> Nothing to worry about, though. <laughs> there is your new leader in the GGM category, the Iron Dames. Rahel Frey behind the wheel of that car. We just saw Bove looking on from the pits. Again, these girls are doing a great job. They keep, they're just, they, depending on pit stops, they're either fir first or the third. They're, they've been in the, in the hunt all day. And, you know, these girls are inspiring so many females um, in motorsport. And um, you, know, you see, you go to a local go-kart track now and you see the amount of girls, uh, young ladies racing. And this is partly down to teams like this, this that are inspiring these girls. This event has a long tradition of female participation dating back to 1930. In fact, 65 women have competed in this event in the past. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's going to boil down to this again, isn't it? It was inevitable. Of course it was. The 33 yellow Corvette versus the car we're looking at on screen. <laughs> the Iron Dames, pink Porsche. It's, this has been the story all season long, usually in qualifying, to be fair. But it's usually that epic fight uh, between Ben Keating in qualifying versus Sarah Bovey. And, uh, you know, the order's a little bit mixed up in this long race today. 33's had a severe setback near the start of the race. And I never expected, I was with you, Jim, I never yeah. expected us to be even remotely thinking about the, the prospect of Corvette being on the lead lap, let alone potentially challenging the Iron Dames, uh, the leaders of this race in the last six and a half hours. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to see that gap slowly close down. But Ben Keating is now behind the wheels. We saw him jump in with Rahel Frey driving the Iron Dames. And, and a great statement for Porsche as well, because they didn't even put one car into Hyperbole. Yeah, in, in the class, there were there were eight cars in GTM, and not one of them carried the the gold shield. It's like I always say, you're probably bored of hearing me say it. <laughs> I never ended an endurance race ever, and thought, you know what? I wish I could have had a better qualifying session. That's right. <laughs> All it is is a uh -huh. it's a great way. It's a muscle flexing contest mm -hmm. qualifying, particularly for the 24 hours of Le Mans. <laughs> I've never known somebody qualify on pole and, uh, you my, know, breeze off into the distance and go, yep, it was all because of that pole. My That's wife how we call it willy wagging. <laughs> 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 Through the Porsche curves goes the uh, Ferrari, number 51. That's our race leader, Antonio Giovinazzi. And he's really taken to this, isn't he? Uh, oh, very his much first so. season in full-time sports car racing in the car that he wants to be in, the yes. Ferrari, the car he never had a chance to race in Formula One. He, that was his primary goal. Sure. You know, like many drivers, they start off, like Guy mentioned, go-karts, single-seaters, you get into first, and you, 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 you kind of blinkered. It's that, it's that fast track to Formula One. It's all you can really think of when you're young and you've come out of, of, of you know, junior formula, single seaters. And this probably wouldn't have been on his radar. He would never have envisaged it happening so early in his career. But my goodness, he's not looking back now. Let's check in with uh, okay, so a Track limit at turn three oh, this boy. lap, fifth call. Track limit, turn three, fifth call. So that's, he's now used up all of his free ones. Yeah, five so. jokers. You're allowed five jokers before you get a penalty. So the momentum's just starting to shift a little bit towards yeah. um, the Ferrari. Everything just slightly going in their favor, a little bit more speed. Webb is on the max out on his... Uh... Copy. Yeah, unsurprisingly. The tires are completely what? They're completely flat spotted. Oh, flat well, yeah, because... Like we saw. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that was a huge lock-up into, uh, well, around turn one, basically, wasn't it? Yes. A yep. Fast right-hander and uh, inside right wheel. I wonder if that's got anything to do with the, uh, with this, this the uh, roll distribution switch oh, sure. he's stuck. Yeah. Possibly. Because yeah, you may have put the put too much weight forward or back. And, yeah. And, and, I mean, 
mean, if you're if you're if you're too light in the front, is that going to give you a tendency to lock the front? Yeah, too stiff yeah. on the front end, yeah. under braking, and uh, you know you, you got that extra extra load going through the front axle of the car, less compliance basically, yeah. and easier to lock up. I, I do wonder if they're 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 really on the back foot there, and this flat spot will not be helping at all, and it loses speed on the straight as well, as we well know, yeah. guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just causes that, that extra drag. It's been a long race for the um, the Action Express car, 311. Obviously lost a lot of time early on in the race. And when it happens so early in a 24 hour race and you kind of just play in catch up, it's, uh, it really is a long race. Yeah, but they're sure still going is. and, uh, you know, kind of use this probably, you know, as much as anything as a test. It's a great opportunity to get more miles on Le Mans, test the car. On board of the two car, Richard Westbrook behind the wheel now. This is third overall. So we have Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac number two, Cadillac number three, and then the Peugeot 93. Now, much like the Ben Keating story, who would have thought that the if we were going to see a Peugeot in the top five, that it would be the 93 car? Yeah, <laughs> you again, Nico Jensen at the wheel at the moment. But uh, yeah, there was a time when we wouldn't have been. Uh, wouldn't have been surprised at all if it didn't make it back out of the garage. Good job, Richard. Good job. People behind is not for position. He's down. And that looks like the. Was that the Team Turkey? I thought they were. They are still still running. But the, the two Peugeots, I mean, well they've had their issues. They've obviously had a um, you know, trip in the gravel. They had the, uh, the contact with the barrier in turn one. Uh, sorry, in uh, first chicane. But actually, the car's been pretty reliable. Mm. Been very reliable. Very, so, very I mean, I'm so. impressed. And actually, they've had good speed, particularly in the wet. They were probably the fastest car on track. So um, they can definitely um, hold their heads high. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of, um, you know, what could have been because they were running solidly in the top three. Um, it would have been interesting to see whether they had the pace to maintain that. There's the number 65 Penny Racing entry in third position in LMP2, about three quarters of a lap behind. Jan van Ert behind the wheel of that car, trying to chase down uh, Aubrey and Jacobson. Those are the uh, top three uh, overtakes, I should say. Giovinazzi again set his fastest lap of the race on a 28, 328.5. So he's not he's not hanging about. He's pushing on and trying to extend that gap over Sebastian Buemi, which is now at 43 seconds. Yeah, there's going to be no waiting around at this point. There's no uh, certainly with uh, six and a half hours remaining in the race. It's still still keep it keep it keep it going keep it going. I think you've got to, I think as a, as a driver and as, as a team, if you start to drive slightly conservatively, that's when the mistakes happen and, you know, you lose concentration. So I think absolutely flat out, full focus, and, um, you know, that's that's what you need to do. Maybe not maybe not 10 tenths, but certainly 9 tenths, because the other thing, too, is, is that any margin that you build becomes a safety net if you do have a problem later on it may not be a big enough safety net but at least you've got something yep. you know and Ke kevin estra there he's also doing a 328.3 in the port which is a, you know that's actually quicker than the leader's fastest lap so it just shows there is the pace in that car lmp2 leader into the pits got some new tires standing by some new good years we may see a tire change the good year uh, engineer tire tech going uh, giving those uh, a pretty close inspection yeah, it's usually when they want to keep those same set of tires on. So you've got their, the other tires all ready to go just in case. And then the thumb goes up from uh, the guy that was just checking the tires. Yeah. So fuel in, and I should expect they're going to keep those tires on for another stint. So it's just a precautionary measure that's taken. Makes sense to, uh, to do that because without the, the help of the tire technician, 
might be you know, a small cut in the tyre right, or sure. something you just can't see from inside the car and the mechanics are, are doing their job around the car. And, uh, you know... Yeah, they don't have time to do no a way. tyre inspection. No way. So, uh, you know, there's no one better suited to the job than, than the person that's uh, and, involved with the, the, the tyre manufacturer themselves. And each of those engineers is embedded with the team. Yeah. So they also know the team strategy. They know what their compound plans are, what they've been using, what they what they want to use, what their plan is for the rest of the race. So he's he's fully in the know and can help them make their decisions. Here's the second place car in the class, Rui Andre. You see the total overtakes there. The hypercar, yeah. category <laughs> LMP2, GTM, 8,181 overtakes. Incredible stuff. Three class racing. There's passing everywhere. There's 2,727 overtakes per driver <laughs> at this point in that car crew. For, yeah, in the car crews for the uh, hypercar. No wonder some of them go wrong from yeah, time to time. Yeah, again. <laughs> I mean, that's a serious amount of uh, calculate, calculated risk to take, should we say. Yep. Yeah, I did work it out once because uh, during the LMP1 days, when obviously they were even faster than they have today, and you were catching cars even quicker. I, I, roughly, you'd have to say it was around four, about four or five cars you were overtaking per lap at wow. any time. Wow! And uh, I worked out, yeah, no wonder, it's, no wonder it goes wrong sometimes because per driver in each car, with your time behind the wheel, around eight hours, you, right, you sharing sure, it yeah, equally. Yeah. Uh, it was around 400, 450 cars you were overtaking alone uh, per driver. Every, a, every one of them perfect. <laughs> uh, perfect, that's, that's so a big word. You'd, you'd be surprised how many near misses. <laughs> yeah. oh, you go to a race and you're, and you're thinking, that was close, that was close. <laughs> I'm and, glad it wasn't just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. You think back and you think, I know we won that race or we had a podium and it was really good. From the outside, it looks like it was really slick yeah. and, you know, <laughs> nicely operated. But oof, if that moment had just gone wrong there, oh, yeah, when I got, when I just thought I, you know, just getting it oh so close and thought I'd, I'd mastered that one. If that driver had just done this or that at that moment, it would have been a massive one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah have, you, have you ever looked back at it and thought, what was I thinking? No, not what was I thinking. It's just more of the... Wow, that was lucky. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you've yeah. you always got to push, but uh, yeah, it's like I say, it's calculated risk, and um, you've got to have some cooperation on the on the track. Yeah, I mean, you've got to have respect, and that's the important thing. Is is when you're racing closely, uh, particularly, you know, against your sort of peers, you've got to have that respect, and um, you know, it's fine mar fine margins. And you know, sometimes when you come up to some of the slower cars, they they don't always see you, and uh, you yeah, that's that's the danger is, is getting collected. Sebastian Bourdais out of the number three car. Scott Dixon back in. These guys have uh, put in a, 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 another outstanding performance. This is a so so we've got a couple of comeback drives in each of these classes that are just very noteworthy. And this for me in hypercar is the is the most noteworthy of, of all. Again, this was a car that, that, that was out of it, and all we got to do is have a little bit of trouble for any of those three cars that are in front of them, and they are definitely in with a shout for a podium. The yeah, Ryle Frey is just on the fastest lap of the uh, Iron Dames' car, so they're pushing on. They know that they, they've got pressure from behind from the Corvette and the Project One car, so she's uh, done a great job there, and she's pushing, pushing hard to keep... Uh, that car up at the top spot. What an amazing story it would be uh, for them. You know, they're, they're a get great car crew, like you said, Guy. Uh, you know, they've had, a, had success already in the World Endurance Championship, but uh, this is the one they want. This is the one they want. And they're, they're on track, you know, the, to, to do that. Uh, you know, not a clean qualifying session for them. And yeah, didn't make hyperpole. But, uh, you know, the car we're looking at on the screen didn't make hyperpole either. But they were and, right and there in the race. Of the race. Yeah. yeah. Until they had their problem. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised, honestly, still to see them in the race. They've had reliability has not been their friend uh, this year. Well, since they 
since they re returned to the World Endurance Championship, it hasn't been their friend. And uh, I think there were modest expectations, to say the least, from even within the team themselves to, to, in terms of the reliability of the car. And uh, I'll just I say that, it's going yep. popping back into the garage. Can't see anything wrong with the car. No. But uh, I mean, look, you're, you're down there and effectively last place in, in hypercar at the moment anyway, but that's due to driver error, not because of yes. reliability. Seb Bordet out the car now, local man. Report from the pit lane is that uh, oil temperature alarm on the Peugeot, so they have taken that back to further investigate. Okay, I wonder if that's anything to do with the earlier shunt that the car could very well be. first again. A lot of talk now down in the Toyota pit about Boemi coming in and switching to mediums. Yeah, they've been running the softs, haven't they, for the majority of the race, and the pace just isn't there. They're just losing time to the Ferrari, and I think they've got to kind of roll the dice a little bit here and maybe just try something different, try and go for the mediums. As, as we start to, as the track temperature starts to warm up, um, they might find that the medium tire is going to be more in the window for them. So let's see how that works out. And of course, remember, he, he absolutely destroyed the set of tires going up into the Dunlop chicane with that lockup. So yeah, well, he'll be desperate sure. to, yeah, he's desperate to get, get rid, of rid of these things. And if that happens early on in the stint, you know, one of the first few laps, you've got to live with it for the rest oh, of the season. Yeah. It's awful. As we said about that vibration, it's literally fillings in your teeth that they're, they're knocked out. So it's, it's an awful thing to have to drive with for, for a full stint. See a comparison there between the 56, PJ Hyatt. The man behind that is actually his uh, daughter is the person behind that uh, T-Rex Porsche paint scheme there. And behind in his mirrors, where he's got yeah. an LMP2 car now, that's the number 41 in second place, uh, Rui Andrade driving that car. But further back, you've got the 33 car. There it is, with Ben that's Keating right. on board. And uh, instead yeah. of a dinosaur, I think we've got the shark. I think we're going to start hearing the Jaws music. Donna, <laughs> Donna, Donna, Donna. Here it comes. The 51 comes in with Giovinazzi there. Race Team leader this. This looks like it will probably be fuel only for this stop. There's uh, getting ready to take one of the. No, they're not going to take the tear off. Oh, it, they were pulling something off the off the top of the top of the car, uh, top of the windscreen. Thought maybe they were going to go with a tear off, but then why would they clean the windscreen? It's the windscreen wiper. They they ah, pull it back. Yeah, I guess yeah, so they can Thank access you. more of the screen with the uh, cleaner fluid, and you don't want to go peeling off too many tear-offs. You want to use them wisely. You've only got, uh, I think, 12 maximum can go okay, onto these screens. Box, 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 box for tires. Stay in the car. So Seth's going to say that this is a couple times now that Toyota has had to, oh, trouble now for the 709. That's the same place as yeah. 708 had yeah. the exit of Indianapolis. Yeah, the 708 ran wide into the gravel, dropped a wheel and bottomed out on the curb. and. Fortune went backwards into the barrier with Olivier Pla, Pla 7 and 9, possibly done something similar. Uh, to what see. I was, yep, a, a, a very <laughs> almost can, the same. Can you say duplicate? But it Ooh, went in forward on the other side. The back. Yeah. What I was going to say about the Toyota, this is uh, at least two times that I've witnessed uh, personally, and I'm sure, and maybe it's happened more, that the drivers have gotten out of sequence with their tires. We saw it at the beginning of the race when they started in the sauce and, and when he stayed in the car and they changed tires and this time he's stayed in the car and they changed tires. They had to because of the flat spots, but yeah. I think this is going to be the first time we've seen the medium tire go on the Toyota. So yeah, we're hearing that the Toyota has in fact come in now and yep, uh, switched switch those switch. mediums. Because yeah. with all of the, uh, the rain that we had, we kept getting the soft compound when you could be on slicks that was the one to be on yeah i think though that they did on that first stint when when they were went out on the softs and the racetrack started to dry enough they went to the mediums and then we got rain and then they went everybody came in for the for 
it's the wet tires. And the number 50 Ferrari just posted again the fast lap of the race on a 327.8, which is seriously quick. Wow. Absolutely flying. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, like we said before, you know, they're out there taking the risks that you can now. Yeah. There's nothing to lose down there in P8. And, uh, you know, if you don't do that, then uh, you, Here is you're not the... leading the race like your teammates. So, yeah, there's the move as expected from Ben Keating on the car 56. No contest there. Another place gained and Keating now up into second place. Uh, look at that under braking, just absolutely perfect. When Hyatt went for the brakes, Ben said, see ya, I'm gonna be ya. Through Indianapolis, this is where the, uh, the double yellow for the uh, 709 has been removed. That car's back underway. Through Arnage, the 90 degree right-hander. So the last lap for Keating was a 3.55, and uh, the leader of that class at the moment, uh, Rahul Frey, 3.55 as well. She's, uh, yeah, keep it, maintaining that gap, but I've uh, got a feeling this, this fight's not over. No, no, no. That Corvette's got some serious pace in it, as we saw in qualifying as well. Here comes the 709 back into the pits. See the NASCAR Camaro number 24. Reminding folks that it's not a NASCAR, it is a NASCAR car. Because NASCAR is the series. That's exactly. So they, they re I've heard uh, Jimmy Johnson and Jensen referring to it as a stock car. So you can call it a stock car. That's not a NASCAR. I mean, NASCAR is the National Association of Stock Car Automobiles. Stock Car Automobile Racing. That's Easy for you to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, if you can't say it, no one's going to judge you. <laughs> because, because in the, in the genesis of the sport, they were stock cars. They were they were showroom model cars that guys would take and modify and and, and turn into race cars. I mean, the actual the actual origins of the sport, believe it or not, were a group of guys who were moonshiners who used to use you know modify the cars to be able to stay ahead of the police and the revenuers and and they would have places in the car to hide the, the illegal liquor and these guys would always be as 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 men are wont to do would be bragging about whose car was better so they started to get together on friday and saturday nights and race their cars on the dirt tracks and that was really the genesis of stock car racing in america i don't think anyone would have a chance of catching that uh, chevrolet camaro no. <laughs> <laughs> they would hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that would go against it. Much much like those uh, jets that we heard flying <laughs> over yesterday. <laughs> oh, so the glue can Yeah. It's they, just... they, I think they're maybe struggling with the um, 708 car. I think also had a new nose. And they... They had to change the, the stickers. Yeah, and now, they they, the now the that stickers. one looks pretty damaged as well. So it looks like oh, the old dear. gaffer tape's coming out. Oh, dear. A bit like Peugeot found themselves in that situation in Sebring. Wow. Yeah. Round one. And they were desperately peeling off the... I can't remember which way around it was. It was 93, 94. They're peeling off the stickers yeah. of one of them to put <laughs> the other one the other car. <laughs> oh. And look at the gap at the top uh, between the Ferrari and... Uh, wow. Ferrari. It's out to a minute. Good spot, guy. That's yeah. after that pit stop, of course. For Buemi. Ah, good point. So, Seb back out there on the medium tyres now. But it's, it's not what I. It's, it's this part of the race is not what I expected. I did think really? Toyota would have the speed to match the Ferrari, not necessarily be faster, but uh, I didn't expect the Ferrari to just be streaking away now. No. His, his first full lap, though, he has set a personal best, Sector One. Let's check in in the pits. I'm at just at Glickenhaus, and the 709, they're actually doing the work in the pit lane to fix that car. But at the same time, the 708 has now come in for a pit stop as well, so they're both side by side. The team are still working on that 709 at the front of it at the moment. I'll um, let you know what happens. I'll try and speak to somebody from the team. Yeah, he went in at, uh, both of them have now had problems at Indianapolis going wide on driver's right. Hitting the hitting the gravel with the right rear tires and then and then bouncing uh, and spinning, the uh, 708 went in on the driver's left. The 709 went in on driver's right. So they both had uh, contretemps at the same spot. Yeah, 
their sister cars got going. Yeah, they've had to put it on the uh, on the trolleys. They, they should have really put that car, the 709, in the garage, but it's ready to go now. That was a that was a, a troubled moment for Glickenhaus trying to get that front end on that car. It really didn't want to go at one point. I wonder if it bent something else yeah, further uh, yes, back. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Or, or even one of the attachment clips, you know, you've, you've got the, well, they couldn't the, even the get, round peg and the round yeah. hole. And, it seemed like they couldn't even get it close enough to ah, get the peg yeah. to, to do its thing. Jim Bickenhouse watches on, and uh, he's now seen two of his cars get rotated at the, uh, the same corner. I've said it before, I'll say it again, history will look upon this man as one of the unsung heroes of sports car racing. A man who believes in the project, has you know, done it all out of his own pocket. That's kind of uh, much like I was talking moments ago about the foundation of stock car racing. That's kind of the foundation of sports car racing. Well, Louise said she was going to see if she could find somebody at Glicken House, and sounds like she may have. I'm with Ryan Briscoe, driver of the 708 Glicken House. Uh, I mean, you guys can't get the brakes right now, can you? Yeah, I mean, it's a shame, you know, because uh, we had both cars sort of looking top five, but hey, we've still got a lot of racing left to do. Um, and both cars are running strong, so, you know, we're going through some noses and stuff, but um, it's been a bit of a theme of the race, I think, for everybody. Uh, after the team bought the 708 to fix all of the repairs for that one, 709 had a very similar one. They thought they could do it in the pit lane, and they had. Yeah, yeah, um, you know. I think I think we, we had a bit of suspension damage on our one, so they had to bring it in, uh, do the suspension. Uh, on that one, it was just body work, so they were able to do it in pit lane pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, not the sort of things you want to have to do during the 24 hour race, but uh, you know, we have a great crew here. They do it as quickly as they can. And uh, we've got both cars on track. Um, and, and honestly, we're running pretty good pace. So we've been really happy with how the race has been going. Absolutely. And your history here is that actually you've always been there at the end. Yeah, yeah, no. And we know that's our strength. And we really went in with the mindset. We didn't want to have any mistakes, no penalties. We've had a bit of both, but, um, you know, we're just going to do our best here and uh, see what result we can pull out of it. Feature in six hours. Yep, that's it. <laughs> so with uh, just over a normal race distance to go, we've got the Ferrari 51 leading Antonio Giovinazzi. Uh, Sebastian Buemi just set a personal best for the Toyota, a 329.3. Well, meanwhile, further down, Antonio Fuoco, our pole sitter, has set the fastest lap of the race at a 327.434. Yeah, almost two seconds a lap quicker than the uh, Toyota. So it just shows the Toyota is definitely lacking some pace to take the fight to the Ferrari. It all goes, also goes to show that the top three are really only there because they've had the, the least problems. I mean, they've, yeah. got, they've got speed as well, but you look at the number two Cadillac as a prime example of you keep your nose clean and a race like this, such a high attrition rate, such difficult conditions for the drivers who we've mentioned and Brian Briscoe touched on it there as well. You know, everyone's had their fair share of misdemeanors, but the Cadillac has really had one of the cleanest races and they're right up there on a, on a podium position. Uh, we've had a change in uh, GTM and for second place. The uh, Oman Racing Team by TF, uh, Charlie Eastwood, has now gotten by Ben Keating in the number 33 cor uh, Corvette for second place in the class. Of course, the Iron Dames continue to lead. Rahel Fry behind the wheel there. Yeah, Charlie and Eastwood. There you see him in the background of that shot. Uh, Eastwood in the orange Aston Martin. Yeah, Charlie is, uh, I think he's a gold-rated driver, not platinum, he's gold. So uh, he's super quick in these cars. Well, he's a super quick driver anyway. He drives LMP2 as well. He's an experienced endurance racer. And, uh, yeah, so he's uh, in a different category of, you know, graded driver compared to Ben Keating, who's a bronze. So that's that explains why Charlie's really uh, flying up through the field at this stage. 
Let's go back down to uh, to Louise. Yes, I'm with Paul Chatan from the 48 EDEC Sport. I mean, hyper pole feels like a long time ago, but uh, you did an incredible job putting that car on pole. Yeah, I proposed, you know, it was a uh, Thursday, so now it's on time ago, but yeah, it was a great feeling. The car was very good, the team did a really great job, so for sure it was nice to start from pole position for, for this race. After, you know, now we are six hours from the end of the race and still fighting for, for a good position, uh, maybe a podium. Paul just finished his driving style time, which is good because now we will be able to push as maximum as possible to the end and to try to come back on the podium. Has the race balance um, of the car felt the same, say, from uh, qualifying to the race performance? Uh, the balance is more or less the same. Of course, we, we are just a bit the setup to have a bit more of understeer because it's always better to have a little bit of understeer for a 24 hours race. But uh, the balance is quite pretty good, the car is really fast and uh, just feel not close to, to be able to, to catch uh, the top. Currently running seventh, uh, you've got a great team here. They always put in a good effort here at Le Mans, so you're feeling confident? Yeah, I'm confident, but you know the others are, are really good too, so we'll do our best and I would be really happy to be able to come back P4, P3, P2, P1 maybe. Uh, that start of that race is the only word we've all been using is crazy. I don't know, did you start the car? So how has how challenging has this particular Le Mans been? Sorry, can you How challenging for the drivers has this Le Mans been? Because we've had rain, we've had dry, we've had so much going on, a lot of incidents from the start. Yeah, it was a really difficult uh, first part of the race. The, the start was quite okay, just the first chicken in the Nodier was wet, so we, we had to be careful there. But uh, yes, honestly, the 10 first hours were really challenging. A lot of pressure because when you are at Le Mans, it's dry at some corners and it's wet at others. And it's really difficult to manage for the tire strategy, even for the driver. We don't know if we can push or not. We, we saw a lot of mistakes just because sometimes when, when there is a lot of water, we are just a passenger in the car and we just try to survive. When are you back in? Sorry? When are you back in? I will be back in uh, something like two hours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Louise Beckett down there patrolling pit lane for us. Interesting conversation. Yeah, good insight from Chatan there yeah. because, you know, you hear it from the horse's mouth that it's what a tough, what a tough Le Mans it's been. I mean, we, we can only watch on and, uh, you know, imagine. Uh, was that some dust getting dust, pulled yeah. up there or just a car? No, it was. Ah. It's a LMP2, the soft. 45 that car, that's the, the uh, crowd strike. Entry. Yargav Pro Carl. Elgav, yep, thank you. Where are they in the order? 45. They are on the other timing screen. Yes, they are. They're leading Pro Am. Yeah, they're 23rd, uh, 11th in class. They're they're class right yeah. behind the Alpine uh, number 35. Well, not right behind, but that's who they're chasing. But yeah, Chatan, going back to that, he, you know, one of, clearly one of the stars of qualifying, and we were all talking about Fuoco and that pole position, epic stuff at Ferrari, uh, giving them their, their, their front row lockout. Um, but yeah, Chatan in the LMP2, it's, uh, it's a hard fought uh, category, is LMP2. Everyone on the Orica, same engines, you know, it's a, it's a spec car, spec chassis. Um, so to do that, it's a, it's a real testament to uh, the, the driver's skill. And uh, yeah, really insightful saying how we knew we had a good qualifying car and we've had to work on the balance coming into this race. You're always putting a little bit more understeer to uh, just stop the car from being so pointy, so edgy to drive, to uh, allow a little bit more understeer in the car to give the driver an easier time, particularly when the amateur driver gets in, as you, as you have to have in LMP2. And there you see the 45 car going off. Let's head back to the pits. I'm with Jop van Oite from the 65 Panis Racing, bringing the car in in fourth, just jumping out. You look like you've worked hard. Yeah, I think I've already done a full 24 hours for my feeling, and I still have to do the last uh, three hours, I think. So it will be tough, but uh, I'm looking forward for the challenges. How's it been? Yeah. And, uh, 
it's it's going well. Like we are fighting for the podium, so I think we have a good good chance. Uh, we just need everything to work out as well towards the end with uh, pit stops, etc. But so far, it, it's looking quite good. We don't always see Panis racing. We do see you at Le Mans. So how does the team team come together? Do, are you doing ELMS with them? Yeah, we do the full ELMS together with Manuel and Taima. So this is just we, because last year we finished second in ELMS, so we got the entry for Le Mans. Uh, so that's why we we do this event. But normally Panis is always uh, always there. All right. Well, hopefully I'll be speaking to you again soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. So just under six hours remaining, we're at the three-quarter mark of the Centenary Le Mans, the 91st running of this great event, but the 100th anniversary of the first one in May of 1923. And right now, Ferrari leads Le Mans. We haven't said that for a long, long time. In fact, the last time that Ferrari was able to win this great race was in 1965. 50 years ago was the last time that they were here with a frontline car. That was the 312 PB that sat on the pole at this great race. Currently, Antonio Giovinazzi leads in the Ferrari, chased by St Sebastian Buemi in the Toyota. He is almost a full minute behind at 59. Point eight seconds and then comes two Cadillacs the number two car with Richard Westbrook behind the wheel and then Scott Dixon in the number three car let's check in with the Ferrari team okay, man. gap is steady at 61 seconds good job managing the traffic so all is uh, seemingly going well for that car in LMP2 we have the Interpol, Inter-Europol, Interpol, I knew I was going to say that eventually. <laughs> They're not a crime-stopping unit. They're a, a, a bakery concern. The uh, Interpol. We are much better with those tires, much better. I just got so unlucky the last pull up. Hopefully you can see now, much better. If you've just joined us, uh, yeah, Sebastian Boemi has not been happy with that car throughout. He uh, flat spotted his tires the first part of his stint. Let's catch you up on the other classes before we do anything else. The inter Europol competition uh, car number 34 leads in LMP2. Team WRT with Rui Andre behind the wheel is second. And Team Duquesne is third. The number 30 car with Neil Yanni behind the wheel. The Hendrick Motorsports innovative car, the NASCAR Camaro, has now climbed to 29th overall. They are uh, just racing for uh, to see what kind of position they can get at the end of this race. And then behind them is our new uh, GTM leader, the uh, Charlie Eastwood in the orange uh, Aston Martin, number 25. He's chased by uh, Corvette Racing's Ben Keating in the number 33. Then comes the Project 1 AO Porsche of uh, PJ Hyatt and then Rachel Freya in the uh, Iron Dames number 85. Those look like the four cars that are probably going to fight this out here in the final six hours. Uh, the Iron Dames were leading until they made a pit stop. So that kind of catches you up with what's going on. I'm Jim Roller uh, alongside Peter Dumbreck and Anthony Davidson. And, and gentlemen, we hope that this race would be given that it is the centenary celebration and epic event. And so far, it has pretty much lived up to the hype. Absolutely, it's been a, a fantastic race. We've, we've seen the top category again, hypercar um, reignited after um, a few years where you know the numbers were not so great. Now we've got so many manufacturers in here and only gonna get stronger from here into next year. Uh, but right down the field, the three different classes that it's nip and tuck between uh, the, the first three cars. So it's, it's great to see all these battles taking place on, on track. Yeah, it's been a, an enthralling uh, Le Mans 24 hours. Like you say, for the centenary, very fitting. Let's hear what Boemi's okay, got to say. Seb, so we did get a track warning uh, for turn three the other lap when you're pushed out. We'll try and do something, but the onboard isn't uh, isn't there, isn't clear. I can't do shit I got pushed. So yeah, I mean, here we uh, go. Uh, uh, as well, as we know, he's he's on his five jokers and yeah. one more, and uh, he's going to get some kind of penalty. So. Uh, 
He's had the he's had the warning flag, and okay, that's he what they're. The that, that's, that that's, that's what they're uh, stressing about right now. So they're trying to get the onboard to prove, if they need it, prove it to the race stewards, because they could get called up. So we'll keep an eye on our uh, telemetry screens that we have to see if that is the case. So, so it his... sounds like he got pushed off in the chicane. Yeah by another car, so that, that would explain it. And if you can prove that, then, you know, fair enough. If you're physically pushed off the track, then, you know, that, that's not uh, through any fault of, uh, of Seb. But that's also another reason to try and keep one in the bank, just in case that does happen. Boy, let's go back down to pit lane. It's not looking good for Prema. They've already retired the 63, and now the nine is in the garage. I haven't seen what's happened, if you guys have, but I will try and speak to the team once they've finished working on this car. That car has gone through many trials and tribulations. It's been on the hook at least twice that I remember. It's funny, isn't it, when we get to uh, the daylight, you can tell that the, the marshals or the stewards or whoever's looking at track limits, they can see a bit more, they wake up a little bit more, and suddenly it becomes more of a thing. In the nighttime, we didn't hear anything about track limits, it'd be funny enough. It's yeah. so hard to see. You you would see across the bottom of the screen occasionally it would occasionally. go to somebody, but yeah, but not with the regularity. <laughs> yeah, right. we, we've yeah. seen zero penalties so far. And with all That's true. With all the, you know, leading up to this, um, all the qualifying sessions, all the laps getting deleted, I was pretty sure by, say, hour six that we'd see the first penalties, but sure. actually we've seen nothing Certainly so Certainly by half distance. Yeah. It's, Certainly by half distance. It's always the way in WEC. You know, they go, it's Eduardo Freitas, is the race director, it's his style. He goes very hard on the drivers in the beginning, FP1, FP2, calls them up into the stewards room, gives them five minute stop and go penalties during free practice sessions, really comes down on them hard. And then when it comes to the race, it all kind of eases off in a hope that the lessons that he's put down, yeah, he lay, lays think. down the law early on. He, he hopes that, uh, it, you know, everyone starts behaving themselves. What's the definition of crazy? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you've been called in on the carpet in the early going, hopefully you, you'll, you'll learn and it makes everybody's life better during the race. The thing that's tough for the, for the driver as well, that FP1, FP2, you're really learning the ropes. Oh, that's and true. so going off the track is more commonplace. That was always my argument. That, you know, you, you, it's, of course you're going to make more mistakes in, in, in when the track's dusty, you're trying to get up to speed. And, you know, you have to, you, you make, you, it's natural you make mistakes and you bring it back from there. You didn't need necessarily like an extra punishment or reminder that it's not the right thing to do. And. Uh, you know, it does come with some frustration as well. It's not easy to, to stay within those white lines at all times. And that's why we've seen such a lot of incidents on this track that's pretty unforgiving around certain points. Yeah, I don't know. There are some people that would believe that if you drive, if you give them an inch, they take a call. Well, you will, but only when there's no immediate uh, risk involved. So, yeah, as I always point. said, there's a psychological impact when you've got a white line or a barrier, it, you know, it's close to the edge of the track. It's here from Estra. Yeah, so he's got uh, some tire issues as well, some vibrations going on, on that uh, number six Porsche, Penske Porsche entry. But uh, yeah, and some discussions down in the, uh, in, the, in the pits as well. What are we looking at here on the Cadillacs, the 311 car on the inside, big lock up into the Dunlop chicane. Gets away with it, I think. I'm just going to carry a mild fastball from that one. You know, Jim, you were talking about the, the differences. What, what, what you, you know, give a driver an inch, you'll take a mile. The job of the driver is to... Is to take <laughs> that mile. <laughs> it's, no, it's to just work these little angles uh -huh. to try and, you know, be that little bit better than your competitors and um, produce a faster lap time and a safer lap time. And, think about all these factors and you know as soon as you see one car doing something that you think is quicker you're, you're gonna start do doing it. that watch the exit of karting look at karting watch for the white line so yeah you go you know the fastest way is to go as close to that white line with the left hand tires right yep. as possible it's not so you give yourself a little bit of margin most of the time so you saw half the car go over there now if there's a barrier totally there, legal if and that's totally, yeah, it's totally legal. legal if there's a barrier there very close proximity to the edge of the track, that 
you know will be a, a serious consequence if you were to go straying too far. Now, it's easy for someone sitting there to go, yeah, but why can't you do that with a white line? Because of the psychological impact. To, uh, as I always say, I don't know anything about rallying. I would, I would be scared to drive rally pin with all those trees around on the gravel over all those jumps. Tell you what, cut all the trees down and put white lines on the side. Oh, oh I'll give it a go. go. I'll <laughs> deep it flat wherever I want to go. If I run out a bit wider, yeah, it's only a white line. Yeah, it's a good analogy. That's my yeah. analogy. So that's, that's the analogy. psychological impact, whether you're staring at a gravel trap, a barrier, a bit of grass, a white line, it doesn't cut it. It never will cut it. So the drivers will naturally just take a few extra liberties. This corner here in, in uh, Porsche Cars as well, that barrier, I remember the days when that wasn't there. Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. had extra space. So driving through the corner, you, you felt that you had more space, and then it came in, and you're, you're driving up to the car, and you're very close. And we've seen a few cars in that barrier yeah, already. Sure. And it, it compresses the, the track slightly, and you feel, whoa, it's, it's yeah. really tight, whereas it used to feel a lot wider through there. It's like walking across a, it's like walking across a beam, isn't it? You know, it's just walking. It's right. right. And the beam is quite low to the ground. And if you fall off it, you can walk the normal speed right. across that beam. Right. Now, if you were to put that beam way up high in the air, how you going to do for How a slow are you going to walk He's across that beam? Up four feet off the ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the psychological yeah. impact. So the white line is the equivalent of that beam being super low to the ground. <laughs> you know, you you know, imagine if so. You're going to get told off if you fall off that beam. Yeah, but you know, it's still just. It's not the same as you being actually physically scared yeah. for your life if you fell off that beam. And you'll never be able to replace that. It's human preservation, self-preservation. Yeah, self yeah. So yeah, we got there in the end. A long-winded answer, but it was a long-winded race. I love that TT, that's another one. That's another, yeah. <laughs> I'd never put my leg over a motorbike and, and go around that track. <laughs> Take all the buildings on the lamp post out of the way. There you see a couple of uh, cars that are on the comeback trail, that being the number 38 Jonah Porsche, the 311 Cadillac, the Action Express entry. Guys that uh, had big problems early, but have carried on for very good reason. These, these laps are invaluable. What you were learning with these, this is the first kind of fully subscribed year of Hypercar. And there, there are data notebooks, just uh, their, their jump drives being filled up with ones and zeros as they try to log lap after lap after lap to learn as much as they can. Their second place car in LMP2, the Team WRT with Rui Andre has come to the pits for its scheduled service. Buemi at the front there, P2, to pull that gap to within the minute. 59 seconds now separates himself to yep. Joe Venazzi. So he is, like he said on the radio, feeling much happier yeah. on those medium tyres. And he said to the guys, look, watch my lap times. I'm feeling much more comfortable. I know I was in traffic the last two or three laps, so ignore those. Yeah, last lap around 329 compared to Joe Venazzi's 331. Of course, it, it comes and goes with traffic, but um, that gap has come to 58.8 seconds now. See the choreography. Yeah, it's a beautiful takes watch, place in a world endurance racing pit stop. Only allowed four guys over the wall once the fueling is done. Ooh, that's uh, that's some fresh debris. That's new. That's definitely not going to need to be cleared up, isn't it? And uh, but somebody has carried on. I'm sure that would be a slow zone. Because, yeah, you know, you're going to need people on track to, to clear up that amount yeah. of debris. People, people have wondered, uh, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of uh, chatter um, on social media about the length of the yellow flags. Uh, I applaud 
the rule that Eduardo lives. Eight, seven, Here's the six, to the slow five, zone. four, three, two, one. Slow zone six is now active. Slow zone six is now active. He does not allow any marshal to go near the racing service. Oh, and it was the 38. Oh, Sorry, Jim. Car. Look, the 38 car was the one that uh, Mr. Peter's Cole brings. Felix Da Costa at the wheel there. He doesn't allow anyone on the racing surface to do any cleanup unless he has the car. Ah, of course. And I, and I, well, that isn't the way it used to be, Anthony. Look at this. It's really similar to the Glickenhaus incident, wasn't it? Just yeah. dipped the right rear wheel momentarily onto the gravel, catches the slide one way and uh, shoots him round the other. He's made it back to the pits. Let's go to Louise. Don't forget, that's the car that pretty much had all of its bodywork replaced after the incident earlier in the race. And I was speaking to the team earlier. They said um, after the 75 Porsche Penske retired, they gave their spare bodywork over to the Hertz Team Jota team as a backup. And the, the team have been preparing it, trying to get the 75 livery off, put their own on. And it uh, looks like they might need it. Well, we can't wow, see that. That's nose. pretty cool. Yeah. Is that going to have to go back in the garage? I think yeah, it will. that's I definitely know, there because is it looks like he's broken it's some of the It's a black carbon, isn't there, it? Yeah. That was a pretty hard hit. Oh, it's the structure of the nose, not the not the chassis. So that's yeah, the, it's that's the yeah the crumple zone. It's the only thing yeah. that's left of that uh, nose assembly. The crumple crumbled. Yeah, it did its job, didn't it? Well, this is the uh, this is the uh, looks like it's a new livery because it's got black uh, black fenders the, with, the, with the, some from, with some wrap put on with some stickers yeah they've uh, they, they've done the best they can in yeah. a short time to get that car looking uh, well they get the livery back on that's the least of their problems right now or oh, they having to look at that front right as well that's sustained some damage i think could that be part of the brake cooling or is it a bit of body work only you see the energy graphics there on the left hand side of the screen Ready for uh, where you got 20 percent. So, stops. Yeah, another round coming up. Going through the slow zone is the the three car. Switched. Apart from the obvious of staying off that exit curb. I don't know what else could be done to stop these incidents, you know, the car snapping. Well, yeah, because they're once they drop off the wheel, yeah, the, that, the, 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 yeah, where that gravel bottoms. ends is squared off yeah. and it's and it's you have the curb and then you have uh, asphalt and that just is launching the rear end of the car and then when it catches it's going to go whichever direction you may or may not have the front wheels turn. It's just an unfortunately shaped curb with a it's like a it's like a triangle on its side. So as soon as you go up and over that triangular edge, it just dips you straight into the stone. So it's uh, you've got support at, uh, only up to a certain point, then you drop off the other information side of it. Information to the pit lane, information to pit lane. This is going to take longer than we expected because we will need to repair the guardrails on driver's left. On driver's left? That's interesting. wonder if that is... Well, yeah, the the Hertz car didn't actually contact on the left side. It no. contacted only on no. the right. There was a bit of stunning camera work before I came on at, at It is the right. It yeah. is the right. Yeah, he's got his lefts and rights ah, mixed up. Cookie hand, Eduardo. Cookie hand. Um, there was some stunning camera work before I came on of the when the 908 went off of it dropping the wheel in that gravel and then kicking and, and sending it on its way. Let's go to Louise. Just picking up again on the Hertz Team Jota incident, Antonio Felix da Costa is out of the car and he's gone around to everybody in the team and shook their hands saying, sorry, mate. Uh, just goes to show the team ethos here, but also, you know, how he's feeling about that. Yeah, he's a real team player, is Antonio. We all know that, and uh, he'll be absolutely kicking himself for that mistake and uh, you know he had he had survived the hardest bit all the way through the rain 
He yeah. watched his teammate uh, give up the lead by crashing out in the Porsche curves, and you know, Antonio had, had driven a, a, a brilliant race up until that point. Real survivor. It's a rare mistake for him, but uh, it goes to show how unforgiving, like I said before, how unforgiving some parts of this track can be, and that's one of them. We've seen so many drivers make that a similar mistake the Glickenhouses just moments ago. Both of them, yeah. To make, name but a few, yeah. So both, both of them making mistakes. You know, we're talking about experienced drivers here as well, and that's part of the challenge of Le Mans. You know, you get to this stage at uh, 20 past 10 in the morning, the sun's back up, you're still out there doing it. You're so tired. Yeah. Your and focus just oh, drops slightly yeah. for a short amount of time. You yeah. put the car, I mean, he was literally probably three inches too wide there. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was enough just to drop the tire off and round she goes. So we saw a shot of the United Auto Sports cars running in tandem. The 22 and 23, both of those cars have had uh, eventful races the 22 car is currently 11th with uh, uh, Freddie Lubin behind the wheel and the 23 car with Ollie Jarvis is in 12th position there they are going through the second chicane separated now by the Ferrari the race leading Ferrari number 51 and one of the Peugeots. I believe that's the uh, 94 car at this point. And the crowd have been absolutely treated, haven't they, to one of, if not the best, Le Mans I've ever seen. The biggest uh, crowd I've ever seen has uh, gotten their money's worth. <laughs> yeah, that's big time, sure. big time. I mean. Yeah, they couldn't have asked for any more action, nope. really. And uh, yeah, still five and a half hours to go for this race. It's uh, under a minute between the lead car and second place in the uh, hypercar category. Richard Westbrook in the Cadillac number yeah. two, still on the lead lap as well. Three cars on the lead lap. Three cars on the lead, yeah. I, I frankly thought we'd have at least one or two more. Yeah. Based on, yeah, based on what we saw earlier on in yeah. the race. But there was a moment in the race I honestly thought, I don't know if I can keep up with this for 24 hours. <laughs> Let's go to Louise. Juan Manuel Correa, you from the number nine Prema, you've stayed in that car the whole time. The team have been working on it, just holding on. And I'm so sorry that you've stepped out now. So tell us the situation. Yeah, it seems like we have a, a broken starter. So our race was already already over before that with, with the accident we had uh, during the night. We were just uh, trying to finish the race. I think we'll be back out in the track soon, but uh, I'm going to step out and Bent is going to go in now and, and take it. Uh, yeah, a shame because the pace is really, really good. I was running with, uh, with the front runners through my whole stint and uh, we're competitive, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. And we can see how hard and fast the team are working to get that car back out. Yeah, they're amazing. We, we had a broken crankshaft after the, the accident we had in the night and they changed everything in 20 minutes. We thought we were done and, and they got the car back out there. So a shout out to them. Uh, yeah, hey, it's Le Mans, first time here. I, I'm still uh, really enjoying it. Well, that's my other question. So I think you were with us in Portugal, was that right? And then you're here at Le Mans. How are you finding endurance racing? It's awesome. Honestly, I, I love every second of it. It's so different, especially this race, you know, Portugal was already very different for me than F2, what I'm, what I'm racing, but this is a whole different level. So uh, a lot of learning. Uh, I got up to speed, which I'm happy about, and I'm just enjoying the experience. Um, you've worked really hard to get back up to fitness anyway for um, after your accident, but how much more do you have to do for this? I've seen some of your socials where you're training in between all of your, all of your stints. Well, it's tough, you know, I, I'm sweating. Uh, it's. We're doing three, almost four hour stints sometimes in, uh, here in Endurance and you need a lot of concentration. I think my, mainly my preparation is more cognitive and mental. You have to stay focused, you have a lot of traffic and uh, it's very intense. Great to have you with us, thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things that people don't still, even, even as much as the sport of auto racing has grown throughout the world in the last three, four decades, 
the um, I don't think fans really realize how the fitness level that you guys as drivers have to achieve isn't so much about the physical side as it is having the stamina to use the mental portion because there's so much concentration. I know that that even in, in, in the part of my old job directing motors, uh, not only motorsports, but, but uh, stick and ball sports in the United States. If I was on the air for two hours, it was total concentration on that event. And that's all I could think about. I had to be, be planning where I was going, what I was doing. And for you guys, like you said, three inches. And that's mental. Yeah. That, that's um, mental. The, the thing is, I think most of the drivers, it's, I suppose it was probably Schumacher back in the 90s that alerted everyone to the kind of fitness level taking it to that next level of fitness and then bit by bit everyone just got fitter and fitter to drive the car like so, tiger woods and golf yeah, yeah so it gets to the point where your actual feelings in the car well there's nothing there you're just strong you're fit and the rest of it's all in the head so you know one manuel Correa, if his name yeah that's yeah. his name um he was just talking about the cognitive side and yeah, he, he is very fit. He drives Formula 2, um, which are high downforce cars. Yeah. He's doing two two races per weekend on, on the Formula 1 weekends. So um, the fitness side is obviously there, but this is a different story. This is about trying to keep, keep the focus up for such a, a long amount of time. And for me... With sleep deprivation yeah, and everything else. There was... I always, I, I kind of find there's two ways to go about it. You could say, right, I am going to be safe. I'm not going to drive at 10 tenths. For whatever reason, maybe you think your car's not quick enough to win, but you're quick enough to take a podium. And for me, I was like, well, at times I was like, okay, I will survive. Someone sang a song about that, didn't they? <laughs> so, um, but then you, you get... You before, get, you get thing, drivers, different subject. drivers like you Kevin Estra, who <laughs> in his last stint, they, they, he was pushing like crazy, absolutely on the limit, 10 tenths, 11 tenths, and the result was a crash that put them, you know, cost them 40 minutes in the pit. So there's two ways to go about it, and you, you, I think you have to play the right, the right way at the right time. Yeah, it's risk and reward, isn't it, really? Um, that's the thing. And uh, you see the drivers, like we mentioned, Fuoco earlier on, mm. there in P8, P7. In a way, nothing to lose. Ferrari came here, they're on the front row. They want to have a 1 2 finish, so let's try all we can. Driving at 10 10, like you say, Peter, just get yourself back up into the into the top three, perhaps even further up if you, if you can. And it might pay off if you can carry on driving like that, but there's no way you would drive like that when you're in the leads, like Antonio yeah. Giovinazzi said. You can see the body language is very different between the two cars. But what um, Correa was saying is that, you know, mentally this race has been so fatiguing because, as we all know as drivers, driving in the rain, it takes so much more mental capacity than driving in the dry. You can't just let the car flow and do its thing you're always, you're, your eyes are on stalks, your body goes rigid because you're just trying to feel yeah. extra, uh, extra input from all four tires driving through the seat of your pants. And before you know it, you realize that your hands are absolutely gripped, like, like, like your life depends Wait, on it in a steering wheel. If anyone's ever Flex. been in a, a kayak or a canoe yes. for the first time in their life, they'll know exactly what we're talking about. Your knees suddenly get wedged into the side, your whole body goes stiff, and every little movement okay. you make, you're, you're absolutely petrified that it's going to escalate further. And that's what it's like driving a race car in the rain when you're not confident of the grip, particularly yeah. a wet track on slick tires, yeah. or even walking on ice or something right, like that. Right. You know. It, just one slip up, quite literally, mm -hmm. and you can really hurt yourself. So you, what do you do? You tense up, right. and the problem gets worse. And for Korea, it's complicated by coming back from that crash at Spa. Oh, absolutely. You know, That's a whole other only, thing. Not only physically, but mentally. As our leader comes to the pits, Antonio Giovinazzi gets out. Looks like uh, Pierre Guidi is going to be uh, taking his turn behind the wheel. And there's a driver change here. 
Jim, I'm going to yeah. uh, love you and leave you and yeah. uh, replace well, myself with story of my life. Graham Goodwin. Story of my life. <laughs> So the driver change is complete. As soon as the fueling is uh, done, we'll uh, see a new set of Michelins go uh, onto the Ferrari. There uh, looks like they're uh, medium Michelins. Welcome back, Graham Goodwin. Did you have a good rest? Uh, uh, well, good a little breakfast. breakfast. It's, um, replacing the Ferrari of um, Davidson with the Trabant of myself. Um, it's uh, this is this is developing into quite. The world's only cardboard car. It's, it's yes. It, it's, I heard what Ant said about 20 minutes ago about this is the best Le Mans that he can remember being a part of. And I absolutely echo that. This is an absolute classic. It isn't quitting. And the best thing for it, about uh, 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 for, from my point of view, is it's not just in the top class. It's in all the classes. Yeah. And this three-class system has come together beautifully. Uh, is great the, battles uh, up and down the order. Sorry to interrupt. Is he's the Ferrari probably. serving a penalty? He's being held, isn't he? Yeah. He's being held. No, is that being held because he's got a penalty or being held because he, they're working a problem? No, there's the, the, there's nobody working. There goes the Toyota. Turn the mechanics switch on. Uh, they could turn the mechanic switch on. That's a problem. Could I he think. not get it started? Could he not get it restarted? Well, could that be a problem that shows itself more than just oh once? Oh my heavens, that is uh, That's drama. Huge. Uh, That's open to right it's back up. Five and a half hours to go, and <laughs> hello, we've, we've got a race again. 65 additional seconds on pit lane with that issue yeah. for the previously leading. 51 yeah. Ferrari, Tota, Kazoo Racing take the lead at Le Mans with five and a half hours to go. This thing has got more twists and turns than, well, this racetrack. Yeah. Uh, and that's quite a lot. It's absolutely astonishing from beginning to end. You ever seen a race like this here, Peter? No, no, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I'm, even, I'm just looking down to the GT Ams again and I'm just seeing Iron Dames have retaken the lead in that. So the, the lead is just changing different car different car different car we had the corvette fight its way back up okay so but the gap is 5.8 the gap is 5.8 show them what you're made of well <laughs> here, here, here we go versus boy me that's quite mouth-watering isn't it and then you add in tota the dominant force here at le mans for well half a decade five consecutive wins looking for their sixth ferrari back as a factory team in the top class for the first time in half a century. So many potential storylines and, well, we said there'd be more drama. There's one of them. It wasn't a dramatic moment, but the outturn oh, certainly yeah, was. Yeah. The outcome of the moment has uh, provided us with a whole bunch of drama. We've gone from the Toyota almost a full minute behind to now leading by 5.6 seconds as they... Uh, Head down the Molson straightaway the first time on their outlaps. The battle, by the way, in an P2 still goes on between into Europe or competition. What a famous win that would be if they make it make this one home. Astonishing from Team WRT and then Duquesne team with Neil Janney, previous overall winner here, and now in a podium position in LMP2 for the team that uh, won the LMP2 class, not the overall LMP2 win, that went to a Pro Am team, but the overall. Olympic 2 class in the opening round of the European Le Mans series this year at Barcelona. Alessandro uh, Pierguidi there you saw from the onboard camera taking uh, advantage of the slow zone to be able to hook up his drinks bottle. Let's hear from Eduardo. It seems that the repair on the guardrail is taking another 10 to 15 minutes. We still don't know but the slow zone will stay there until the, the guardrail is properly repaired. That is, I presume, down in Indianapolis, where we've seen both Glickenhaus it's been and Jota. It's been a couple of years since I've been here. Have, have we seen this much uh, guardrail repair in, in the recent past? I, I don't remember. I, I don't recall had, it. I mean, um, sure, when Rocky had his, his shunt and yeah. Alan McNish had his, you know, you Careless, know those of kind yeah. of crashes. <laughs> they, well, they were, they were, they were massive crashes. crashes. But, but we've seen some 
some guardrail repair from, from fairly innocuous hits. In fairness to the, the guardrail repair at, uh, at that particular location. Oh, yeah, it, it punched it. We've had three cars hit the same place. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly. And when we saw the uh, the incident after, I think it was, was it the oh. click announced the last time? No, sorry, the Jota car last yeah. time. But, but don't get me wrong, I'm not saying oh, no. they shouldn't be repairing it. I'm it's just unusual. trying to remember. Yeah, I don't, just don't remember it happening. It, 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 we are having this, this conversation earlier this morning off air, weren't we, Jim, about um, so a quick listen in before we get to that about what's going on aboard the 51 for Alessandro Piagrini. Hey, sorry, the radio is not working from you to me back there. I think you can hear me, but when I know something more about the issue, I'll tell you. He's on a used tire. He's on a used tire. It's Buemi again. Interesting that uh, we had a problem getting the car back underway. Now we're having problems with communications. Yeah. Yeah. There's a common factor in that, and that is electrical issues. The gap's coming down, though. 4.3 seconds oh, now yeah. between the two cars. Well, one of them's on new Michelins, the other's on used. That should uh, that should have a little bit of a difference. Plus, uh, the Ferrari has been quicker. Just, just frankly, it's been quicker. Andrea Bertolini looks on. A man with a proud mm. history with Ferrari. And amongst the uh, honours for Andrea, who is the nominated test driver for their competition cars. He's driven all bar one forms of Ferrari Formula One car ever. Absolutely astounding number. It's well into the hundreds, the number of Ferrari chassis he has tested and shaken down for Scuderia, including all the historic fleet, including all of the Corsa Cliente cars. There is one car, I think it was a short-lived car from memory in the 80s, that no longer exists. It's the only Ferrari Formula One car and by the even, way, the, even the shark nose because I mean there's no to, to best of my knowledge there's no shark noses real what shark whatever, noses the, whatever there is he's driven he's driven and in addition to that <laughs> does the same job with more or less all of the contemporary sports cars as well wow um, so Andrea Bertolini super guy as well lovely outlook on life always a smile uh, but super focused that did. drove a Maserati as well he didn't did. he to was, the GT1 yeah. World Championship that's right, that's right. That's That'd a, be a good job for you. You could test everything that comes out of the British Japan factory. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go and work with Graham. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're not the tonics taster. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say? What do you want to say? Uh, 25 car, by the way, still with that uh, Luke's bonnet, the rear left corner on the Aston Martin, but it isn't stopping them. Uh, ORT by TF, Charlie Eastwood, 52 seconds back from Rahel Fry, Ben Keating a further two seconds back, and that is a change. That is the ORT by TF car taking second place. Uh, they've, they've actually, while you were gone, they've actually meant to the front. Yes, oh uh, yeah. The, these five, four cars, the 85, 25, 33, and 56, have kind of been swapping positions based on you know, a little bit on the racetrack, and then, and then, depending on which driver's behind the wheel, and then there's pit, pit stop sequences. Well, Ben Keating's made it very clear this will be his last GT drive here. Mm -hmm. um, he loves the GT cars. He's not particularly interested in moving to the GT3 formula. There is Ben behind the Delage livery 48. If we see him back, it will be an LMP2. That is where his future lies. He's had a astonishing array of machinery. Uh, here at Le Mans, ranging from LMP2 cars in two different eras, uh, Vipers, this, this Ferraris, Porsche, Aston Martin, now uh, here aboard the Corvettes. Uh, it's been nine starts at Le Mans for Ben Keating in eight completely different cars. The the patina that these cars get oh, yeah. at this point. Filth. And, and that was the other cool thing about going through the museum is many of the cars nowadays are just left to where they were. In fact, Audi actually lacquered one of them, so it wouldn't go, the patina would Just make sure the Ferrari didn't pass anyone after the next loop. Come in. No stone unturned. Come Separate on, Seb. Never change. Just, <laughs> just drive. <laughs> that is the gap. That's the gap with three cars between the two battling for overall honors here. Do wonder. Uh, he got an extra snowball. 
You know, I do wonder, gentlemen, whether or not they're going to take the opportunity whilst that barrier is prepared to do something about what's a growing ditch behind the curb, ah. which is what's causing the problem. Um, mm. Well, a from short, the, short well, of sticking a whole lot of new gravel in there, I don't think there's much they can do. And the guys will just abuse it and start digging another ditch. We've, uh, we've had three significant incidents for hypercars yep. in the last couple of hours at that point. Back up to speed now after they clear the slow zone. And there is the Ferrari moving past uh, traffic. Now the next on the road is the Toyota just ahead of him as they go through the Porsche curves and then through karting. What I will do, by the way, in the next uh, hour or so is a quick review as to where we stand in the Pro-Am standings. Not just where they stand right. on track, but more particularly as we approach kind of five hours to go, who has got non-professional driver time to burn? And that's a very significant factor for many of these teams. I have yep. to say, astounding level of attrition in GTM. I think we've lost half the field. Yeah, almost half the field. Ten retirements um, in GTM. That is not something we're used to seeing. Been a lot of incidents, unfortunately. Yeah. At least two of them were GT on GT uh, mm -hmm. incidents that saw both cars retiring, the 16 and the 16 getting together, the 55 and the 21 getting together. Difficult conditions earlier on in the race with uh, the rain coming and yeah, going. Sure. Slow zones, we've seen quite a, quite a few impacts as cars have come into slow zones. Car in front slowed down and caught the ones behind by surprise and, and they've concertinaed up. You see a good shot of uh, Pierre Guidi right out of central casting, isn't he? Oh yeah. I need a Ferrari driver. That'll, you'll do. There yeah, you go. 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 And the name for it Ferrari. as well. <laughs> the name for it as well. Into the garage for oh, the number six. six. Car. That's uh Car was troubled early this morning after a how can we put this, Peter? A spirited attack from Kevin Est. Yeah, um, it was yeah. good to, to see, to... and he was he was driving hard, and that's why he's there. Just unfortunate, uh, small mistake put him off into the barrier. Down in 20th place overall, 11th in the class, but not this man. Sebastian Buemi and his teammates have been right at the pointy end of the spear on this centenary celebration of the 100th uh, anniversary of Le Mans. The Department of Redundancy Department there, sorry about that. Um, uh, and question. he has been at the in the battle for the top three the entire race, as has the 51 car behind him, Alessandro Perguidi. And then comes Earl Bamber in the Corvette. Uh, yeah. Camara, uh, yeah, come on, get with it. It's a yeah, GM product, Jim. It's a Jim. Sim. Come on, starts with the C, 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 C Cadillac. Uh, that car, by the way, last pit stop under investigation for the Caddy. Uh, three yeah. minutes and 46 seconds through the slow zones behind uh, the lead battle. So keep an that, eye on whether or not that might have... Thank you for problem. saving me, because that's where I was trying to go, and that's why... <laughs> um, so it's going to be... We've heard from Eduardo Freitas, it'll be some little while with this slow zone in place for that barrier repair. Driver's right between Indianapolis and Arnage. And, uh, that's there because the uh, gravel trap has spat a couple of hypercar carbons at it. That's what it's the Toto. Okay, Seb, if there are no marbles, try to minimize distance. If there are no marbles, try to minimize distance. Minimize distance. Minimize distance. To what? To the. If there's no marbles. So that would mean edge of the race. It means going off line. It means, it, it means going, taking the optimum line, doesn't it? It means yeah, not meaning, running wide it or, means, or track limits. Yeah. But he's on a. He's 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 he's. Don't get that one. That's, yeah. a, that, that's not a message I recognise or no. heard. Twitter will now light up that we're being oafs and uh, and being silly that we're missing something. Uh, can't work that one out. At the moment, we're expecting. Oh, don't blame you. Potentially, I can't talk. Uh, potentially, an update on whatever the issue is at Ferrari. Yes. You just joined us. Um, cars are in this order in this slow zone, coming through the instant site now. We can see top of the picture. That's where the barrier pair is going on. John Alkin, the president of both Stellantis Group and Ferrari, and changed into Sunday morning clothing. Uh, and a very designer Ferrari outfit on yesterday, John. And, uh, and here we go. 
as they go through Arnage hard on the gas. Yeah, the Ferrari Belderweight losing over a minute and the lead uh, with the car seeming to be unwilling to refire after a pit stop. Oh, now that's going to yes. hurt his pace and that's going to oh. give the Ferrari a chance oh, to get heavens. on the back of the Toyota. The LMP2 Pro-Am leading Algar Pro Car was exactly where the Toyota wanted to be and now we've got nose to tail action again. I do think he made the right call there, yes, though, yes, because yes. that is a oh, well. We saw it with uh, Kevin Estra. If you, if you try to overtake into that corner, you might well come a cropper and have contact. So he he just decided to be cautious. No point to throw it away there. Well, the no, choice live to fight yeah. another day because <laughs> absolutely uh, he can maybe he can hold him off. Well, the choice he made means that uh, might be a slightly smaller gap by a couple of seconds, but he still leads the race. Kevin That's Estra, right. but a different choice. He's down in 20th position now, and the car back in the garage. Better to have your mirrors full of Ferrari than to have your mirror in the uh, somewhere over the fence. That's the, the, you know, when we were talking earlier with Anthony, that's the, the difference between leading the race and having a yeah. little bit more caution and then full attack from behind and deciding to roll the dice yeah. a little bit. And that dice sometimes comes up on the wrong number. I think uh, Sebastian Buemi would always pick a fight with Pierre Greedy than a fight with a gravel trap. Yes. And <laughs> that's what we've got now. It is the number eight Toyota in the hands of Sebastian Buemi. Huge success here at Le Mans up against, well, not the newcomers. They've been with us in GTE for a decade mm. at the pro level. But that effort and a whole lot more besides transferred with a resumption of history for Ferrari back in the top class oh. and side by side Takes almost on the exit, slightly bought there by the Volkswagen's Ferrari. But Buemi's not had any luck in traffic. That's twice now. Uh, in the space of half a lap, he's been balked by traffic, and now he's going to lose the position unless he can just, he's got the inside position going to the chicane. He's going to force it here. Yep. And he gets it oh, done. So oh, my heavens. Alessandro Pierguidi, much to the delight of his crew. Passion. Passion everywhere. Said we'll not give this, this, this one up. Not passion. It's, uh, no. <laughs> uh, ten seconds added, by the way, as we watch this. Still developing. Lead battle. Five hours, 12 minutes to go. The, the lead changes again. This is going to be an interesting turn. Yeah. No worries, Seb, no worries. Still five hours to go, mate. Head down. Into the slow zone. He'll be seething. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. lost momentum, didn't he, coming through that first chicane. It was, wasn't was quite done, but almost done there. Almost toughed it out here. Ferrari much quicker in the first phase of that straight, but the Toyota came back at him, it's ultimately, as he did at uh, the entry of the Porsche curves, Peter Dubrek. Uh, decided discretion was a better part of valor there. Again, you know, I thought for a second he might try and force it back down the inside, but yeah. he decided, nope, get out of it. Let's lift it fight another five hours, and we'll see how it goes from there. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Back into the slow zone. This is so, and, and see, this the slow zone now helps Wemmy because he's not going to, uh, Pierre Guidi's not going to be able to pull away. No. You know, because he's the momentum uh, is lost. He can use the entrance into the slow zone to uh, to pull up on him. Let's go back down to pit lane and Louise Beckett. I was just waiting on an interview from James Allen from the uh, 45 Algarve Pro, and he is constantly on the radio to George Kurtz, who's in that car at the moment, who you saw Buemi come up behind. Can you imagine how that driver must be feeling as he's, uh, it's his first Le Mans, as he can see in his mirrors, Buemi and uh, Pierre Guidi behind him. Guys, I'm gonna tell you something. Just try to look. When you think that the slow zone is going to be lifted, you anticipate the stop. We anticipate the stop like Bertha did. We try to be in the, in the garage refueling while they are removing the slow zone. Yeah, copy, Seb. We'll have a thing. We'll have a thing. 
so he doesn't want to be in the pits when they remove the slow zone because then that gives the competition yes the, the chance to run flat out but whatever you do Seb do not tell Ferrari has gotten that interview in the Algarve pit. Let's go back to her. I'm with James Allen from the 45 Algarve Pro. You've been talking on the radio. I thought you were talking to George, but no, you've been talking to the pit wall. Is that correct? Yeah, I've uh, just been talking to David to make sure what the plan was going forward. So, I mean, we've, we've got a, a decent lead over the next prime so we're, we're focusing on that. So, realistically, we're just going to be relaxed, make sure we get to the end, and hopefully we'll take a trip here at the end of the day. Yeah, you're currently leading the Pro-Am in the LMP2. George is putting in a great run right now, and he made a lovely move to move out of the way for the hypercars behind him just then. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, could have, that could have gone a bit wrong. I think there was a bit of confusion between, between Sebastian and, and George, but uh, luckily everyone came out of it, so it was, it was really good. And George has been amazing all week. He's, it's his first time here, and he's really picked up everything really, really quickly and really well. I'm, I'm quite happy for him, and, and I hope he gets the result he deserves today. Right, well, hopefully we'll speak to you later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Jens Pierre-Guidi's put the hammer down. Two seconds to the good. Yeah, he's uh, pulling pierre -Guidi. Quick word about uh, James Allen, by the way. He's uh, looking at a second 24-hour win in LMP2 uh, this year after the astonishing finish at the Relic 24 at Daytona. He took the win literally on the line from the car he's now driving in. That would have been interesting um, after the press conference. It uh, switches ac switched across from the winning car at Daytona to this campaign with CrowdStrike Racing by EPR. And uh, like a pro racing, right four laps of the good in LMP2 ground. That's another class, by the way, that's had significant attrition. It is a 2.2 second gap for the lead in. Uh, the leader of in the hypercar, three minutes and 45 seconds for the top three. Transfer that to an MP2 Pro Am. Just looking here, it is better part of 10 laps for the top three. As a, an outsider, if you like, coming in once a year to come and sit beside you guys and have a chat, Pierre Guidi has been incredible so far. Yep. I mean, this my, week, my my feeling, Peter, is this is a new and extremely important program for Ferrari, and they've made the choice that the vast majority of the the driving squad have come from their GT uh, pool. Slow zone is back to green, and it looked to me like, if anything, Toyota got the better run there. Sure did. Remember, we did hear from Ferrari that uh, they were in trouble talking to Pierre Guidi at this no. side of the circuit. And that has paid off for them. But you're right, Pierre Guidi, he's had his moments where it's not gone all his way. Big hiccup for him at Sebring with uh, a reasonable shot that uh, sent that car tumbling down the order. And I do wonder, Peter, he's absolutely came in as a multiple world champion GT Pro, uh, one of their stars, but then young drivers in the other car, the pressure being exerted. And there's been moments when I have been concerned that maybe that's getting in his head a little bit. Right, you're a driver that's had a long career. That must be tough when you're at the top of the, your game and someone new comes in. It's always going to happen. You know it's going to happen sooner or later, so... You know, maybe maybe this is just giving him his second wind. You know, he's what 39 yeah. years old, so to be astonishing to think get, of getting into a hypercar at 39 for the first time and doing this kind of job. And I, I, I want to knock on wood because I, I don't want to jinx him. But yeah, he's doing a great job. There you go. Cheers, yeah, Jim. Double yellow is just about behind them. So a double yellow flag's just about just behind them at the Forge game. Now it's removed. Closing in. It might have been a quick spin for yeah. some. Closing in on five hours to go, and it's 0.6 of a second as a lead gap. Oh, my goodness. 
Still, the lead battle in LMP2 is the same lap. And in GTE Am, just waiting for the team Jody Carter to circle back at, uh, with five cars on the lead. I think it is GTE Am. Well, if you hear track signs, you've had a treat so far. Still five hours plus of this to go. And if you've been tuning in with, in with us throughout this great race, thank you for being with us. And I hope you're enjoying the developing storylines. They are legion. Ferrari still lead Le Mans from Toyota, but it's close, very close. Looming just a little way back and still on the lead lap. The first in the Cadillacs, number two car in the hands of Il Bamba. So three different hypercar makes on the lead lap with almost 19 hours in the book. Did they run in? It's another Five. Cadillac. It's the first of Peugeot's, and they came in. There's a Marta Ferrari, the AF. Grand AF Corsa, and who would have written the script for Peugeot up until problems hit them in the middle of the night? They really did look very strong indeed. Uh, this is the dock out I from... I was just going to say, we've got the uh, AF Corsa, we've got the, the Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Peugeot, and Porsche all in the top six. Yep. And all of them have had their moment in the sun yep. with the lead of the race. And all of them have had issues. Yep. So... Well, the great part about this era now, and this is really the first time it's bloomed, with absolute respect to Tota and to Glickenhaus, and to Alpine for that matter. The great thing about this is, if you're going to win it, you're going to have to fight for it. And boy, have we seen some fighting here. We, we often talk about other codes of motorsport and the hope that people will discover just how good this is. Well, judging by what we've seen on track here, gentlemen, could transfer that to other forms of mixed martial arts as well uh, because it's been epic stuff. Peugeot flying over the curbs there, first chicane, their first of their cars down in fifth place. This bodes very well indeed for the future of this race and for the future of the FI World Endurance Championship and the future of the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship, yeah. their GTP equivalent of these cars. Yep. This also, for me, in some ways, harkens back to the Audi victory where Lena Gade was the uh, engineer. And I, I believe, if memory serves, that that was the year that both Rockefeller and McNish had, had their crashes. And so Audi was down to one car much like Toyota is here, and they were in a pitch battle with Peugeot, and it was right down to the final half hour when they were making decisions about tires and, and that sort of stuff, and Lena made all the right calls that brought that car home. Uh, and the great conversation on the radio between her and Andre Lotterer, that you've got to do this, you've got to bring it home. And, and they did, and that was a, an outstanding victory. And this is what comes to mind here. Can Toyota carry on going for a fifth consecutive victory that will put them with the likes of, of Audi and Ferrari and others with the consecutive win streak? Or will Ferrari be victorious on its return, 50-year return to top-class racing here at Le Mans? Oh, or will they both hit problems and Cadillac yeah, pop and out from yeah, nowhere yeah, and who's going to say that? Or right. each other, I think is the other thing. It's close enough, but oh, when yeah. you get down to uh, when it really Brass matters. Um, we did ask a little earlier whether or not anybody might have any ideas about that, uh, what we thought was a cryptic uh, message to separate me about the shortest possible distance. And delighted to say, Michael Zalavari uh, down under in, uh, and around the Adelaide area. Uh, Michael, lovely to hear from you covered the overnight stint uh, for part of uh, Delhi Sports Car, Michael, and a keen part of online communities that support this uh, great area of racing. And I think he's nailed it. He thinks the message to where Boebe is about the slow zones, take the shortest possible path. Oh, there you go. If there's no marbles. There you go. Well done, Michael. Clearly 
both my intellect and my fatigue have combined to provide less good answers than you were able to do at this time of the morning. 11 o'clock just passed by the way here in France at this astounding circuit in front of an amazing crowd what well, is always a great race but this year in particular is truly an historic moment in motorsport five seconds now Pierre Greedy to Sepoemi shouldn't be too much longer before we see this slow zone come to an end I think it was about 15 20 minutes ago that Juan Freitas was predicting 15 20 minutes ago Gilles de Cain there enjoying his morning croc monsieur behind this team, the number 30 Duque team, the sister part of the organisation. In fact, that has well, gone back to green, hasn't it? We're full green again. Slow zone has been withdrawn. Also uh, part of the LMP3 landscape, Gilles de Cain, taking on what was previously the Norma programme, and is now the Duque Cain D08. As you can see, uh, Gilles in the wheelchair there to the right-hand side, and also, only driver, early days of GT3. Uh, hustled no less than a Dodge Viper uh, with some success. And controls in that car. The fastest lap of its race for the race leader, pushing on now, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And on the same lap, Earl Bamba, obviously with the uh, track back to green. Woko to the pits from and, and 7th. I think the two car is going to have a five-second penalty added to its next pit stop as well, so trying to uh, carry on with that. So we're moving. That's uh, what you uh, call in the business a uh, tape rewinding on the air. Yes. Here that's on the output. Ah, yes. The art that is Le Mans. So here is the art dokes, and uh, this is the 85 car, still leading the race in GTE and. And uh, could it be another class win for female drivers here at this event? Seeing that yeah. side at the bottom, Sebastian Buemi lap deleted. So that's definitely number five now. Yeah, yeah. If 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 it's not uh, if it's not six, that's five. We may see uh, uh, we may see a warning flag. Look after this. Is the the last thing you want is a drive-through penalty at this stage. That could be the defining moment. This is the race leader in the middle of those three cars, the 34, behind Edex Sports. Edex Sport 48 car, the all blue livery, is running fifth, and the Panis Racing car, fourth. That is a battle for fourth place. Panis and Edex with the race leader in LMP2 between them. So he, he, those cars. he pushed by a minute ago, uh, just on the exit of Porsche cars. So he's got in between, so obviously now he's lining up. We know the 34 car's got great straight line speed, so he's good chance he'll tow by now. Looks like he was going to do that. Fabio Scherer, by the way, if you didn't join us earlier this morning. Um, he's an injured foot after being run over, we believe, his foot by the Corvette. Uh, not sure whether or not there's a break. Who is that? That is Fabio Scherer, who's leading oh, yeah, the MP2 yeah, race, yeah. Uh, but certainly in some pain uh, with one of his feet but it's not stopping him he's currently a minute and 38 seconds clear of the chasing wrt 41 car and this is an epic run from into europe all competition uh, but uh, the battle he was in between there is for fourth in class panis racing in the hands of timo van der Hel from the netherlands and not her in germany two very talented young men i suppose if it was your left foot you could not left foot break and just kind of I think that's do it. the old fashioned heel yep. toe kind of thing. Not stopping him. He's, he's gone by yeah. and he's pulling away here. This, I mean, frankly, one of the all time great LMP2 oh, yeah. runs in this modern era. We've seen some 
faultless runs from the acknowledged super teams from Jota, from WRT, from United Autosports here at Le Mans. But you know, this is a team that's been bubbling under a little. It's been challenging there for podium positions throughout this season in the FI World Endurance Championship. But this is form we've not seen from them before. We've seen some great stints from a number of drivers who have driven for the Polish flag team. But Fabio Scherer just seems to find more and more and more. Came into LMP2 with United Autosports a few seasons ago. Seems to be in a happy place here. What are we looking at here? This is a replay side. of his move. But that's the uh, Delage getting by. The yeah, the 48, 48 going by yep. 65. Yep, and that is Lanzer. His first season of LMP2 racing as a full season driver. Um, big success with DKR Engineering principally in LMP3. He's a rapid young man, Lanzer. Noticing from the helicopter shot. No one has gone home. <laughs> Why would you? Quick, quick lap time as Peter are coming. All of a sudden, the last lap column is lighting up blue. And that's quickest laps in the race so far. Wow. For a yeah, number of teams. 3.28 for Seb Way Meet, 3.28.8. 3.28.7 for Earl Bamba. That's the second consecutive fastest lap of the race for that car. 3.29.7 for Paul Deresto in the Peugeot. 3.30 for Esteban Gutierrez in the 708. Uh, Klickenhaus, and then we get into Fabio Schirro with the 3.37.5, uh, the fastest lap for Inter Europol, which, by the way, is nowhere near as quick as the fastest lap for the Team WRT cars, so it's consistency that's winning the day there. Here, though, is the leading car in GTM, Sarah Bovi climbing aboard as out of the number 85 Porsche climbs for a health ride. And we saw that the uh, number 25, Aston Martin, went by to take over the lead, Charlie Eastwood, behind the wheel of that car. See how far back Ben Keating is. He was only probably about 30 seconds behind, so he may come by as well. As the driver change is done, as soon as the fueling is done, it looks like that car will get some new. There goes uh, Ben Keating, the aforementioned uh, Corvette driver, now in the second place. That puts the Iron Dames back to third. Now they've got plenty of time. They will get out of the pits in front of PJ Hyatt yep. in the Project 1A Porsche. So this is going to move them back to third position. Routine pit stop. Four new Michelin tires. New driver, uh, Sarah Bove, as uh, Graham rightfully pointed out. Back into the fray with her, against her, uh, her arch nemesis in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, Ben Keating. And these two have had some outstanding qualifying battles throughout the season in the World Endurance Championship. And that's that's the great thing about the, the new qualifying format. It's uh, it's proven to be is just very exciting. It's a, it's an extra day of great racing now Absolutely. That, that we have in the World Endurance Championship. Just an update from uh, the FIWC's media delegate Rachel Cavers, who's been working hard through this race. And she updates us with the condition of Fabio Scherer. Says, not too bad. Is uh, feels it when he's not racing more than when he's in the car. And Brendan will do that for you, won't it? Pushing through, still left foot braking. He will be fine, but I, mean, I think you and I, and certainly you, Peter Dumbreck, will know that's going to hurt later today and certainly tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, the adrenaline does get you through. Oh, he, he, he's hopping out of the car. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't even put any weight on it. Yeah, yeah, he's he's to the point where when they do the driver changes, he uh, one hops. Yeah, yeah. You so you into the real. pits for some new painkillers and back out again. Three cars in the 327s in that top three. So Bamba with another quick lap in the caddy. But this time, Alessandro Piagridi responds to the attack from Sepuaimi. It's a 327.890, but it's a second quicker than the fastest lap from the Toyota. There is PJ Hyatt in the Project 1 AO Porsche, Rexy. With the big teeth and the short arms. Could be the king. There is your LMP2 leader. 
Fabio Scherer. Looks like he's going to stay in the car, fuel only. Got the thumbs up from the uh, Goodyear technician. See if they uh, decide to stay with these skins or if they'll put some new tires on the 34 car. Um, if my numbers are correct, I think Sarah Bovey's got a stint and a half still to do in this car as their bronze driver. She's a good bronze, but she will be ceding time to drivers around her. Just look and see whether I can see where PJ Hyatt is in this order. Uh, PJ is about where he needs to be. He's, uh, he's five minutes and 57 seconds at the six hours he needs to do. So that bodes well in this battle between those two Porsches. How about Armand well, Arhati? If, if Bove does a double stint here, then she'll be good. Uh, but she will lose time to the Golden the, uh, and the Silver Drives yeah. and the other cars. Uh, Armand Arhati, meanwhile, needs about another 40 minutes. Not quite a full stint uh, for the Armani driver. That's now our new leader, Charlie Eastwood, pushing on. Ben Keating. Uh, he too is about a minute away from his six hours. Ah. And here is the often mentioned sound of the NASCAR Camaro. Jensen Button behind the wheel of this car. Looks Again, like a video right game, out of it? casting. Give me an English Formula One. <laughs> With a big smile. And there you have it. He has just had a ball driving this car. We had John Doonan in. Around 11 o'clock, and and the whole team Small, is just miles wide. over the moon, just yeah. absolutely over the moon. So I, I think mission accomplished. There he is, there he is, that, and that's that's that 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 <laughs> <laughs> But um, there is Coach Jordan Sailor flexing. Yeah, and this has been to see uh, Chad Knaus and some of the other people who are such veterans putting their foot in the water of this type of racing. People with, you know, championship pedigrees oh, yeah. who know the sport inside and out uh, is just uh, absolutely fantastic. And to see them have this modicum of success is, is just outstanding. 34th overall, that's not quite as high as I thought they would finish. I, I figured they would uh, they would get into the 20s for sure, maybe even crack the top 20. The but there's still stop, time. There's yeah, the last pit stop, 11 minutes on pit lane, yeah. so there's clearly yep. been a, a, some form of issue. Gloriously filthy, that car. I have zero doubt that whatever happens with the Camaro ZL1 after this race, it will be a car that Hendrix Motorsports and Jim France, for that matter, will treasure forever. Truly historic, 75 years of NASCAR, 75 years um, of stock car racing in the United States. And they've come here all guns blazing, loving every moment of it. And to explain why, by the way, Jordan Taylor is in the garage. He's here as the reserve driver and also as driver coach. Lots of experience here, Jordan, particularly in GT cars. And uh, with the full respect of the NASCAR family, Hendrick Motorsports and all three drivers. He's been a uh, key part of the test procedure here. Does look odd seeing that car, but he handles well, Peter. It's not bad, isn't it? Uh, to put in the lap times it's been doing, it's been quicker than all of the GT cars. So it's not just quick in a straight line, it can go around corners as well. Well, I hope this encourages everybody around the the organization, not just of this race, but other races too, to just take a look in the books and see what else can be done along these lines. I just think it encourages more people to be enthusiastic in more depth. It's great to have people who are really enthused about a battle for the overall lead in a great race like this, but it's better still when you've got all the storylines to write. And I know one of the things that John Dillon was telling us last night is the thing that has blown them away more than anything else, aside from the, the welcome here, which I think they expected, but have still exceeded their expectations. It's the it's the level of media interest in that program. Welcome back this morning to Martin Haven. Morning, everybody. Uh, good morning again, everybody. Good afternoon again. Good evening again. Um, little tweet two minutes ago from NASCAR Garage 56 account, NASCAR G56. 2,000 miles, 
With 230 laps of Circuit de la Sarthe under our belt, the next-gen uh, G56 has blown past the 2,000-mile mark or 3,218 kilometres, whatever those are. <laughs> <laughs> That's love... almost three and a half Coca-Cola 600s. What I like is the respect with humour. Yeah, I mute, and, and I think that's absolutely mutual. I don't think there's anybody oh. in the pit lane that goes, well, they're taking the garage that could be used by a proper racing car. No, and, no, and there's, no. so, as we said to John Doodle in the middle of last night, there's a, a, at least 300,000 big smiles every time that car goes it's around this track, and that's just here. There is nothing bad whatsoever about that effort. Charlie Eastwood, by the way, from second place in uh, as a GTM on pit lane. That puts uh, Cycles Ben Keating back through to the lead. Might yeah. I better get my Zumba class going online. I'm going to just zoom that in the, in the back of the, uh, the booth while we're watching Earl Bamba in the caddy. Uh, so the story of the 51 Ferrari, which has retaken the lead after briefly losing it in pit stops, that was a power cycle for the car. It wouldn't fire, so it had to do the control all to lead. If you turn, try, try turning it off and on again, so that's exactly what they did. Um, it seems to be perfectly OK. The slight worry, obviously, is every time you turn it off, if it doesn't fire up again you can lose 10 or 15 but of course once you've done it once it doesn't bite you quite so badly the next time no. peter you you go oh, okay it's that again right we, we'll do I that so, so the recovery will be quicker yeah. in fact while the change is going while the uh, power change is happening and everything it could be maybe functioning except you can't fire it until all the men are behind the line so you can't try to fire it until all the men are yeah. behind the line so there is yeah, you can switch the ignition off. I think quite a lot of time they probably leave the ignition on just so there's radio comps and everything else. Um, but yeah, once you, once something's caught, yeah, you think about the Jota car a couple of years ago that ended up winning here, which was in second place for most of the morning, and its air, onboard air jacks failed. So they basically got one of those inflatable bags you use to sort of jack up vehicles on soft ground. And they were having to pump it up at one end in a pit stop and then the other end in a different pit stop to swap tyres a pair at a time, front to back or side to side. Um, it had a misfire as well and, and they still managed to flog it to get it to finish, which in the end on the last lap turned, about, turned out to be to win the race. So these things will take a lot of abuse. What they don't like is um, sharp stops using the scenery and they, that's been... Uh, there's been a lot of that going in, or in, in good weather as well as in bad, hasn't there? Well, looking down that second page over there, we're, we've got a lot of R's beside cars, so, yeah, a lot of retirements. Well, there are 20, or there have been already 20 retirements out of 62 cars. That's the highest in quite a number of years in terms of retirement. Okay, so box this lap, box this lap, pit confirm. Box this lap, driver change to Brendan. So Hartley about to take the wheel of the second place car. It is 8.4 seconds the gap. We have four hours and 42 minutes still remaining. And it has changed the balance of power between these two cars before when Hartley has come in. He's immediately been very quick. Now, the last time that happened was day to night, and I wasn't quite sure how the dialogue worked there because Hartley was very quick initially and then gradually got reeled back in. And I wonder whether they'd gone with a softer tyre on the Toyota to give him that initial edge. Okay, Ali, box this lap, box this lap, fuel only. Box this lap, fuel only. As you can see from the energy graphic, okay, Peter, okay. the number three Cadillac is the outlier there. It's only recently stopped. The others, 6%, 7%, 5%, they're all coming in this lap. So. Your top six, barring one car, with four hours to go, are on the same lap of pit window. Never mind uh, an approximate uh, e equivalent strategy. Yeah. It, it's really easy, isn't it, to get sucked into the um, the mindset that we're close to the end of this race. It's almost five hours still to go, but mm -hmm. what we are into now is a phase of the race where the leading two cars are going to have to hit a problem for Cadillac to win it. Well, that's entirely possible. Or safety car, because that brings them onto the tail yeah. of the pair. And that is also equally possible. We've had safety cars predominantly because of incidents in weather, but not exclusively so far in the race. And I have to say, this is as frantic a lead battle sprint as I can remember in quite some time. And we're, we're back to... Audi versus Porsche versus Toyota, yeah. P1 hybrids, you know, absolute 
full oh, combat, and that was three teams. Yeah. 2011, you know, 2015. Now, what we've yeah, had recently is the, the Toyotas controlling the race, and it's going to be one or the other that wins, and they're obviously not going to attack the same way as Toyota will attack Ferrari now. Yeah. It's a better pit stop this time. It's an undelayed pit stop. Yeah. One minute and 16 seconds on pit, uh, the pit lane for the leading Ferrari. Cadillac, That would be a full service stop. And here comes the Toyota. Remember, Behind. just one Toyota left in this race. Behind the Ferrari there, coming out was the third place car in LMP2, the uh, number 30 Duquesne car. So that has, uh, well, that was coming into the pits. In fact, that's dropped out of the top three. LMP2 into Europe, the 34 car, green and yellow. WRT, the 41 car, still in second. Louis Delatraz not able to overhaul Fabio Scherer, but Scherer must be at the end of some epic stint. 65, Panis. Timon van der Helm again. He's been in that car a long while, keeping that car up towards the sharp end of the field. And in GTE Pro, from... We're nowhere, we might as well pack up and go home territory. Corvette Racing's Ben Keating leads from arch rival Sara Bovi in the pink Iron Dames Porsche. Mike Dynan for ORT by TF lies in third ahead of Thomas Floor. That 54 Ferrari relentlessly right in the podium hunt there from start to finish. And then Gunnar Jeanette in Rexy, the Project One AO Porsche, has dropped down to fifth with uh, a pit stop he's just made. Before I forget this, um uh, a word for Thomas Fleur. We've not mentioned him very much in this race, but his level this year has been raised absolutely dramatically. I don't 100%. know what he's, what he's been having in his breakfast cereal, but it's working. Well, maybe he's had time. Yes. Know, and that's so much of this with these drivers, is finding the time to actually focus on their driving. Hey, Ali, just for info, previous lap we had a track limit in Tete Rouge. That's the fourth one, OK? And the significance of that, Peter, is if you get five, then you are on the way into the pit lane for a penalty. So five is the warning flag, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Six is the penalty. Six, the, yeah, you get five warnings in the entire 24 hours. So basically in eight hours of absolutely foot welded to the floor racing, yeah. you can transgress five times and no more. So we've seen no penalties so far from any driver yet. It does mean, though, when we get into, let's say, with four hours and 37 minutes to go, let's take the four off the beginning of that. It's entirely conceivable that with 37 minutes to go and maybe the prospect of one little fuel splash before the end, we will still have a four-second gap between our leaders, well, whoever they might be. Uh, that's entirely possible. I'm not counting out one of the tightest finishes ever in history. It's 19 seconds, the gap at the moment. That is significantly less than a drive-through would take yeah and that's why that's important because the first penalty would be a drive-through penalty carry on doing it it would be a uh, it would be a, a short stopper it would be yeah. a stop and go yeah and then it starts then to get five five seconds, then ten seconds then 10 seconds so it's, yeah. it can't just be frenetic pace at any cost that's what that rule is there for it's about keeping it fair it's about making sure yeah. that we're all racing the same racetrack and not uh, an alternative line and, and Peter, t taking the shortest distance means the shortest distance, but within the white lines. Absolutely. Uh, we were talking, Jim and I, about the drivers basically pushing the envelope as far as possible. But sometimes you overstep and pick up uh, the potential now to pick up a penalty for running wide is, is just getting harder and harder. And actually, the more severe penalties are unlikely to come from the stewards if you're running out wide, because there have been so many incidents, there's so much debris, there's so much gravel, so many sharp little bits yeah. of carbon around, that actually running out beyond the track limits is just looking for a sea of comedy tacks to puncture your tyres, isn't it? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, exit to Indianapolis, we've seen at least three of the hypercars in the wall there. Yep, 38, and both the Glickenhaus cars all spat out of that uh, growing ditch behind the uh, the kerb. With drivers who have all got plenty of ability. These are the fumblers, these are not, you know, rank amateurs. These are highly professional drivers, but, as, as, <coughs> excuse me, as Anthony was explaining earlier, it's a, it's a, 
it's a ramp with a vertical drop at the end of it, and if you go off the vertical drop, you can't ease the tyre back on. You're as likely to puncture the tyre if you try and wrench it back on as you are to get spat out with gravel traps. So there is probably a need, I think, for that to be either rebuilt as a much more level curb or built with an upslope and then a downslope into the gravel trap from which you can hopefully nurse your car. It, it's yeah. so easy. I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a ridiculous comparison, but it, it bears the... 30 seconds it will tell to take the story on the way back to the airport. Port him out. Uh, the WC race comes down the hill from the hotel. Uh, large commercial vehicle coming the other way down a, a, a narrow country lane. Went slightly off the road to allow this vehicle to happen. And the way in which I rejoined the surface, the sharp edge of the, uh, the tarmac, ripped the side out of the tyre yep. on the inside. Tyres are built to take a, a phenomenal amount of punishment. The guys in Michelin were saying, the left rear in Spa from the pit lane is taking 1,500 kilos of downforce wow. from the pit lane. And they were saying, and that's the issue there with a cold tyre. It's not up to temperature, it's too stiff, the pressure is too low at a normal sort of setting that we'd use with a heated tyre. And so that's why they were having to ramp up the, the base pressure. So you go out on a cold tyre that's also overinflated quote uh, so that makes the the, the warm-up even harder uh, the way of looking at this is 20.7 seconds down the gap between Pierre Greedy and Brendan Hartley it looks to me at this phase of the race gentlemen that Ferrari have got the pace it's now about just trying to edge away where you've got the pace with no error whatsoever well I I think, Peter, the way they've gone about this, as if they've been doing it all their lives, and, and to a degree they all have, but not this. Yeah. Not this in hypercar, not trying to win them on outright. A lot of the Air Corsa team have got that experience from their GT programme. A lot of them have got winning, trying to win overall experience from Formula One. But this is the first time they've done this, and it's the first time they've brought the car here. But they're just running a natural race. I mean, they just look so relaxed in the way they're doing everything. The same professional manner of going about it that Toyota have exemplified over the years because they've been doing it for years. And I'm, I'm just so impressed with Ferrari. Absolutely. Oh, Overstressing yeah. or overthinking or second guessing anything. They're just making the right calls at the right time and driving hard and fast. And staying cool. We saw that with the, the full reset with the car. They lost one minute, but they, there was no big panic. They, they just went about their business. They got back on track. Um, Boom. Pierre Guidi hunted down the Toyota, got by him, back into the lead. Yeah. Ben Keating have just a little moment there where the car was not quite going to make it round the Dunlop curve. Dunlop chicane as it is, so... <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Nicky Katzberg, his team. Oh, that's Nico Veroni, his teammate. I think Veroni is due to get in. And here is the arch rival, the second-placed Iron Dames Porsche. Sarabovi, Ben Keating and Sarabovi have produced so many entertaining qualifying battles. In qualifying in the regular World Endurance Championship, like in Hyperpole here, the bronze-rated drivers have to qualify, and Keating and Bovi have just been going hard at it. Then at the end of a, I'm going to have to check, triple, possibly quad stint. Literally and, just looking right now. And the team was saying this will be the end of his minimum drive time requirement. So uh, that will. will bring him, uh, can bring him to the end of his driving. Six hours, 16 minutes as we uh, count uh, for Ben Keating. What about Sarah Bovi as well? We've uh, seen, Sarah's got a way to go, yeah. We've seen them regularly cycle through between her, Michelle Gatting and Rahel Frey and the Iron Danes keeping the pressure on at that Corvette. So it is, remember, it's the bronze and silver drivers that need to complete six hours, both in GTM and in LMP2. Front oh, sorry, we'll so. back to us there. See the cap at the far end, Andrea Piccini, one of the Piccini brothers that uh, runs the Iron Lynx operation. Uh, it is an hour and eight minutes that Sara Bovi has got to do. OK. Now, it's, it's no slur on Sarah's ab uh, ability. She's been stellar at uh, defined bronze level, but she has got time where she's going to be measured against not Ben Keating. 
but silver and gold yeah. and for that matter platinum rank drivers to the end of this race and actually part of the way that they've got the corvette back in has been to have some of their to have their pro drives nicky casberg nick veroni driving through the night same with sarah Bovey. although actually the iron dames have rotated through in in regular rotation sarah's not been sort of parked overnight or when it was wet they have all stepped up and all done their their stint in time didn't see at any stage where they sort of changed the rotation it's all been uh, as it was expected from the start also uh 25 minutes or 24 minutes still needs to be done by nick of looks like he's about to get aboard the car yep he's been a very popular addition to this crew ever smiling tall young argentinian driver I think he's got pretty quick as well. Well, in the, in the new era of uh, GT racing here at Le Mans and the LM GT3 class, I think a teamwork-minded, young, fast, at the moment, silver rank driver is going to be no small thing. And whether or not he retains his silver rank and goes to gold, I think you're going to find that that young man is with Corvette for quite a long time. That is the lead battle in GTE AM. Third is the ORT by TF Aston Martin, the orange Aston Martin, for those of you watching in Technicolor. That's uh, Michael Dine and Gunnar Jeanette in the green T Rex livery. Project One Porsche is fourth, uh, fifth, fourth. Uh, fifth is GR Racing's Ricardo Pera. That's the car that's black with uh, orange highlights on one side and orange and blue golf colors on the other side. And in sixth position, and also in the pit lane, or has just been through the pit lane, is the silver A, of course, of Ferrari car number 54, Davide Rigon, heading out on track, staying in that car. So driver change, as Ben Keating completes his minimum driver time. Looks like Sarah Bovey will stay out on track for another lap or two. Right behind her is the car guy, Kessel Racing Ferrari. That's Daniel Serra. He's not passing her for position. He is a lap behind the Brazilian pro. That's led there the is the car in yep. third place, though, that orange Aston Martin, and that gap is coming down. Yep, Iron Dames lead the race. ORT by TF have led the race. Corvette Racing have led the race. Project One AO that's led, led the, race. the race. 54, uh, that's led the that race. That's led the race as well. Uh, Kessel, they've led the race. They absolutely uh, have. Northwest AMR, I don't remember I leading don't the race. I don't think they have. They had an early problem, if you remember, with the yeah. bonnet latch. And I don't think the 911. Yeah, they, that, they had two problems. They made contact with somebody, it popped the bonnet up, they fixed it in the pit stop, and it then popped up again. So then they properly fixed it. I assume they used a larger hammer the Six. next time round. For our uh, Porsche, by the way, back into the garage. It's looking less and less like it's going to be a great afternoon for this squad. This is the car earlier this morning involved in a battle for that uh, Andre Lotter getting out of the yeah, car. So this is not going to be quick work. No, Andre Lotter um, having to miss the Formula E race in Jakarta or opting to miss the Formula E race in Jakarta. There's uh, about nine drivers from Formula E who did race in Jakarta on Sunday and then came back from Indonesia for qualifying and practice. Well, Kevin Estra, it was that um, had the problem with the car in spirited pursuit of a potential podium position. It was uh, chasing down the Cadillac. This so is... this has not been a change for the lead, again, to reiterate the car guy Ferrari, which is absolutely flying at the moment. Daniel Serra, that yellow car, has just unlapped itself from the class leader. That's the Iron Dames Ferrari. There's the second place car. And a Corvette, by dint of that pit stop, drops about half a minute behind into third place. But again, these cars all slightly out of sequence with each other. And so, Peter, the teams on the pit wall will know absolutely... That they won't care what the hypercars are doing. They won't care what the LMP2s are doing, which we're trying to follow as well. They will just be watching their peers, their class rivals. That's what the focus is. Yeah. Winning what you can win, never mind what everybody else is doing. Well, it's essentially three, three races taking place in the one race. And you know what? It's great to be the overall winner. You, you know, you really want to be that. You only be in the hypercar, but the LMP2 and the, and the GT, they're as valid winners as mm -hmm. the top class. You know, the, the fights are just as big. The uh, competition is just as strong. 
and it's it's great to see. I mean, we're we're spoiled that we've got three races going on here Wh that which, we can watch, which have none of them refused to uh, uh, have. Uh, you know, they did just refuse to stop being exciting. They are all really, really tight, close races. And again, you know, if you're on the podium in GTE Am or LMP2 or Hypercar, you're going to stand up on the one of the most famous podiums in any sport anywhere in front of 300,000 people and receive one of the world's most famous trophies. That, I don't care what you're driving, that is a reward for a, a year and more of hard work that's got you to this point. Daniel Serra, by the way, uh, can I think do the majority of this race from here. Uh, Takeshi Kimura has now completed his uh, required six hours minimum driving time. Scott Hothaker is well over his required time. There is the trophy. Yep. It's fabulous centenary trophy. trophy. It's been around the world. Uh, this, but still can't find its babies. <laughs> so Daniel Serra's in with because he's not going to go and do four hours and twenty-four no, minutes. So he can't. So who else is he? Scott Hothaker, I suspect, will. Yeah, uh, have a, a stint in the middle of this one. I think we're going to see Daniel in for a while. Likely he's got Hufferka in, yeah. in maybe a couple of hours' time and probably Daniel back in for the finish if well, there's the, anything the, to be gained by that. He can do no more than four in any six hours. Uh, in which case he'll do four hours. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh, oh and that's trouble for the 9 uh, nine one, that's one. one That's Michael Fassbender. That's Michael Fassbender. Oh, no. And that's, and that's a lot of tyre wreckage oh. now. He's gone in backwards, again, into the Porsche curves. Wow. Uh, Michael Fassbender coming towards the end of his driving stint here. Uh, he had 18 minutes left to complete his six hours. Well, he's going to have to go back out again then, because that's he not going to be completed What's in pit here? lane. Got it's, wide. Yeah. The car spat back again, and that's a big hit. That's a big hit. Yeah. Well, it's climbed the tyre barrier. It's still driving, and that's... It's just one of those classic Le Mans accidents. That it's one of those places where you'll see it time and time again. He's, he's trying to keep the car within those white lines. Yep. Yep. Uh, but in that instance, he should have just opened the wheel and run the car wide. Took, yep. took the, the penalty that was coming his way for going over the white line, but now he's going to... I have to spend some time in the pits to get that fixed. Yeah, that car coming in from ninth position in the hands of Michael Fassbender, the Irish German Oscar Nomoni. This is the end of a, a five year program it is. to come to, to, to bring his driving level up to the level where he can compete in Le Mans 24 hours. He's raced in Porsche Carrera Super Cup, he's raced in other GT programs, he's raced here on Road to Le Mans. There you are, look, there's a a few guys on the podium just that's, having that's a, a photo. Yeah, it is. Media and PR guys there. I would suggest to you that's probably this year's voting committee for the media award. <laughs> Let's hear okay, from. Okay, we put the car inside the garage. Fuck. Apologies for obviously the excitable language and exactly as you said, Peter, he was just trying to tighten the line when he realised he was going to run out wide. It's going now, to take a bit of a clean up yeah. as well as a rebuild of the tyre barrier. There's going to be a longish slow zone because all those tyre stacks need to be replaced and probably rebelted back in as well because that's all part of the safety uh, on the corner. That is homologated. A little bit of arm waving going They're on. Concerned about is that, that corner. Is that, that end of game I, arm waving? I, I, yes. Does body language in the back of the garage is not at all encouraging. Louise Beckett is down in the pit lane. Louise, or is that Steph? I think it's Steph in here. Okay, you are at the garage, Steph. What do you know? Well, let me tell you, this car does not look good at all, and the marshals are frantically running around, uh, the mechanics, should I say, are frantically running around for the bits and pieces that they need. In reality, there could be a front and back change to the car, but there is just too much damage to that right side of the chassis that just will not be able to be fixed and replaced, so it could be that this is the end of that race. All right, well, if you can hang around there and try and get word from the team, thank you for that. We'll see if we can get a, a final... Uh, word on that, but yeah. again, even with, with four hours to go, there's a lot of time to fix the car. It depends how much of it is actually fixable. Just watching uh, Peter and Brett's uh, 
facial expression with the hit that was the grimace that was a big hit yeah it was a big hit and i was looking at the marshals <laughs> they were yeah. very close behind the wall as well so thankfully everything held up and um no no um parts of the car went over the wall so uh, i'm hoping that is not the end for michael fassbender here as a well worldwide celebrity often when you put your head above the parapets and do something different, do something with passion. There's a lot of people out there that choose to criticize and to mock, but I can tell you from multiple, multiple experiences of watching him apply his chosen trade here, that uh, he's done it both with passion and with absolute commitment. I mean, it's very easy to stand at the sidelines and go, OK, well, he's not good enough to do that. He is good enough to do that. Much, much better drivers than him have made the same, if I, not bigger, errors. I was, uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We've yeah. seen some very, very professional drivers make yeah. errors of that magnitude. And, you know, it can happen to anyone. There He'll no be work super going on that frustrated corner. because last year the car got away from under braking down to the first chicane, ended up in the barriers. And now again, you know, and this is all it has to, you have to bear in mind. Everyone's going, oh, he's been doing it for five years. Well, you can probably count the number of races he's done on his fingers and toes, in, almost in total. Whereas anybody else of his age or of, or of any age, when they get to this level, will have been racing full time for at least a decade, you... probably more like 15 years if they're in their early 20s. And he does not have all of that instinct yet. He's good, he's quick, he's competent, he really addresses himself to the racing. But, but you know, all of those years of having crashes and learning how to avoid them, that takes time to build up. He's doing it all in public. That's, that's yeah, over. It is over, that's, I'm afraid. That's... That is the end of the road for Michael Fassbender and the rest of the crew of 911. Martin Rumpin, the cap there in the background, shaking hands with the boys. Richie Leitz as well. Yeah. That's, uh, he'll take his time just to gather his thoughts, but I'm sure we will hear from Michael. I hope he's OK. That will have rattled his cage a little bit. Yeah, think tough. about it this way. Just go. Think about doing something completely different you've never done before at a level you've never done it before. Musical instrument is a good example of this. Go and yeah. learn a musical instrument. How long does it take you before you don't make an error? And you're a concert pianist or a concert violinist. And, and that's the level we're looking at. It's not being able to play along with your local, you know, string ensemble or something. This is absolutely virtuoso performance at the, at the highest level. There is nothing more demanding than this in terms of driving sports cars. And the, and the Porsche is still, you know, these are not easy things to conduct quick. Yeah, you hate to see it for any driver. And the Clara publicity, there's clearly going to be an opportunity to see that from the inside track. That is part of the deal that's been done. It's to open the, the doors in the same way that we've got the WC full access. There is Michael. Well, look, it's part of what they do as actors. They expose themselves, they leave themselves open to criticism and ridicule by becoming something that they're not. Now, this is a whole different level of becoming something that you never were before, and he has applied himself with just the same, you know, exposure and, and vulnerability. And I, I always ad admire anybody. I mean, all the bronze-rated drivers in the GTM class, the gentlemen drivers who are racing and ladies drivers who are racing in, you know, on a non-professional basis in anything around the world, they're doing it because they are passionate, not because they wanted to be Formula One world champion or because they wanted to win Le Mans when they were kids. They're doing it because they've predominantly discovered it later when they've got an opportunity to do so. And, and it, it just, it, you know, that yes, it's fun. Yes, it's exciting. Yes, it's demanding and thrilling and adrenaline pumping and everything else. But flipping heck, it's hard. Well, I mean, I'll say this, this about this and the final word on it before. I'm sure we will hear from Michael. I'm sure he will come out and talk to Steph. Um, but he's got the same passion we've got. Yep. And that's the beauty of this form of the sport. It's not the same for every level of elite sport with all the barriers between us and the people we'd like to talk to. There's no difference between Michael and the guys at the absolute elite level. I always tell young journalists coming into this trade, you go into a conversation with the assumption that these guys are as passionate as you do 
And if you're not boring and you are respectful, that they are going to be keen to talk to you to tell their story. And that's exactly what I found with Michael when you've given him the space that he needs to do the things that he's doing. And if this is the end at Le Mans, it's not the end of his race career that will uh, complete the European Le Mans series. And I think we'll still see him racing somewhere. Um, but if that's the way that his Le Mans journey ends, then I'm very sorry. Maybe he needs another five-year project to to go again. Happy car. There you go, yeah. Car is a unfortunately. But um, I'm enti P2, entirely then. in awe. We can do P2. Entirely in awe of someone doing two things at elite level. Yep, 100%. And he does two things at elite level. He's a stunning actor. And that is his trade. This is his passion and the time that it must have dedicated to the physical and the mental preparation uh, to just do this is pretty awe-inspiring. Some onboard audio from either the Ferrari or the Twice. It does sound like the Ferrari, but uh, you were watching there the battle at the top of the LMP2 class into Europol's Fabio Scherer and have Louis Delatraz in the WRT car number 41. That's the red, white and grey car. And the black car with the green highlights, Duquesne teams, Nico Pino now. We are ready for WRT to come into the pit lane. So this will be the car in second place. Delatraz has been in for a while, I think. Uh, so let's see whether he comes in. Through the slow zone, there he is. And the into Europol car, easy to spot. Green and yellow halves to the car, basically. Long slow zone into the Dunlop curve, uh, into the... Uh, Porsche curves rather, and then all the way through the chicane out onto the start finish line. You can see vehicles heading off in the direction of that impact to Michael Fassbender with repair equipment aboard. And somebody ducking into the pit lane there. And until that tire wall is repaired, the slow zone will remain. Thierry Tassin watching on, another of the great Belgian racing legends who are involved with the WRT racing crew. And it's your Paul lead, by the way, is going out over two minutes now. And uh, the silver driver, Kubat, has done his six hours. So if Fabio Scherer is fit enough, we've, he's got that problem with his foot, we've been told isn't that much of an issue oh, aboard the car. You need to go and have a little I look saw for, it. for some hopping of the video. Out, hopping out the posted, car. Yeah, hopping, literally hopping the car around the car as if it's some sort of added value pit stop challenge <laughs> lark. But no, he, he was run over by the 33 Corvette. Yeah. But, um, um, the team originally said they thought he'd probably broken bones in his foot, and, and that may transpire to be the case. If he, frankly, even if it's just severe bruising, uh, having suffered that um, once before, um, that, that is no joke. Well, I broke uh, a couple I, of toes in Sebring, and I've only really stopped feeling it about two yeah. or three weeks ago, and that's a long time, and I've not been driving race cars. No, indeed. Uh, by the way, the lead gap between Alessandro Pierre Guidi and Brendan Hartley still hovering around the 19, 20 second marks. So that's uh, that's not really moved so much since we went through the last pit cycle. There's a battle on track. WRT car just leaving its pit box. There goes the Alpine. That's sixth and seventh. You can see on the graphic just leaving the pit lane. So there's what between them. What was that sort of 10 seconds, maybe? That's come that's down a with close that little battle, isn't it? That's uh, 20 seconds taken out of that gap. Uh, with Mathieu Vazifier. That will be a change in well, full, full service, Ferdi Habsburg. Yeah, quite a slow full WRT service stop car. for WRT. That's not like them. Very much not like them. Also, recently through a pit stop is Jeronic Verne in the uh, Porsche, the number 93 car. Um, Smith has come to join us from uh, fresh from breakfast at United Auto Sports with a little mini tube of refreshers. That's going to go really well with my double espresso. Is that going to be presently. like what's-its-names in a bottle of Coke? <laughs> but they're actually love hearts, so... Uh, oh, thank you. Well, oh, there'll okay. be some messages there. that will be lovely. Absolutely. I'm sure that was Richard Dean's personal idea. He's got that kind of outlook. <laughs> so this slow zone in... Uh, good, good morning, Guy Smith. Morning. Uh, the slow zone in uh, the Porsche curves, and this as a result of Michael Fassbender getting spat out as so many have. Actually, this heli shot, if we hold it, we will see what the result of this. This is turning off the public hi highway, the first element, and then you come through this right-left sequence. And as he turned left, look at the impact there. Yeah. He was trying to avoid running out wide, and in fact, he said it on the radio, exactly 
as uh, as Peter Dunbreg had suggested. He was trying to avoid running out wide there and, in, and getting another track limits infringement. I don't know how many he'd had, whether that might have been a drive-through infringement, but he was desperately trying to avoid it and just tighten the line too much. Car looped into the pits. LMP2 leader in the pits. Yep, Fabian Scherer stays aboard, so we won't get a chance to see whether or not he's still hopping around on that. He uh, will still be foot. hopping around. The, the, yeah, the, absolutely. the hopping around will not have stopped. Whether the foot's broken or not, it what? is clearly far too painful to even walk on. What did you ask, Guy? This, we're now close to 20 hours into the 24 hours of Le Mans 2023, and the way this racetrack develops, multiple, multiple, multiple incidents, gravel everywhere, bits of tyre debris everywhere, bits of car, carbon everywhere. How filthy does this track get through that? It's, it, it, there's places where it's barely a single line. Yeah, it, it's pretty treacherous. But at this point in the race, the track is not in great shape. And obviously the marshals do a great job. And if there is an incident, they obviously clean up. We saw that at um, Mulsan Corner. But, um, and also the cars now are starting to become a little bit secondhand. The brake pedal might be getting a little bit long. There might be nursing a, a, a gear box issue or whatever else. So really the end is in sight and um, you know while there's many people still fighting for position some of these guys are just literally just nursing it to the end of this this point and um, they just want to get that finish so if the weather remains sort of fairly constant presumably sort of end of the night early morning is, is about the zenith of the track and then it just continues to degrade as more and more muck gets thrown out and more and more gravel and tire debris and, and it, it becomes although the grip level is good online there's quite a lot of the lap in any lap you're not online and, and that's it you've got the marbles the marbles of rubber little, little pellets of rubber offline and while that's okay if you're driving online when you're not online which these hypercars and even the p2 cars when they're making the passes around the outside of the porsche curves they are risking putting two or possibly four wheels into those marbles and t let me tell you when you got those marbles you have got marbles for a reason yeah. you you might as well hit wet patch so if you imagine it been like a single line on a dry track it's a very similar situation so these guys can't switch off although the track is dry one small mistake run a bit wide and they will um pay, pay the price for that leaders on pit road number eight in and out full tank of gas no driver change sebastian Bre uh, brendan hartley remains in no tires and you saw uh, sandio pierre guidi there he is coming down the pit lane was uh, the uh, who was that coming down the pit lane in front? Uh, number six Porsche Penske car, I think. First team Joe Chen and Pitts. The WRT well. car just coming down pit lane as well. Oh, and six that's cars the other the WRT car. Yes, it yeah, is from second MP. That, that was the red car, the red tail that I was thinking. Oh, there's the, Port, uh, the uh, Ferrari, but it's not. So Toyota and Ferrari no longer stopping on the same lap. No. Their last stop was on the same lap. The stop before that was on the same lap. We've seen the leads change in the pit lane on the same lap you can't do that if you're stopping a lap behind somebody else so ferrari crept another lap in or have toyota somehow been forced oh, to stop a lap see what short. I can find on the state lane some uh... because guy these guys have been going at it 11 tenths there is absolutely no sign of any backing off between alessandro pierre guidi and the ferrari and brendan hartley in the toyota They've been going at it absolutely hammer and tongs. What happened the last pit round of pit stops? I don't know if you saw it, but Pierre Guidi was in first from the lead, then the car wouldn't restart when they dropped it onto its wheels, and then, then they had to power cycle it, lost about 30 seconds. So Brendan went by, or Buemi. Buemi went by at that stage, retook the lead, and then it's like somebody had lit the blue touch paper. Alessandro Pierre Guidi came after him like a woman scorned he just tore into him and went straight by and took the lead and, and we, now he's a lap ahead yeah, or, or a lap longer on fuel somehow do we know what the issue was i mean i guess the concern is is we know that the ferrari's got the pace he's got a pace advantage but you know that issue oh oh slow zone, slow zone. 311 caddy wasn't aware of that, that wasn't 311 ready for caddy it. is very marginal energy it needs to come in right now at six yeah this is left. this will be his in lap it, it well the, the last pit stop the most recent one where brendan took over uh, there was no drama at all ferrari dropped down gone yes right so it, you know it's, it's a power recycle required it? you know, for the right. ferrari we've all got a, we've all got a laptop we've all got a phone but no, switch on, you stupid thing. You you were fine five minutes. I mean, it's yeah, that. It's, yeah. That's exactly what it is. And and you know, in a million pound race car, you hope that the electronics will be, and they are, much more resilient. But on the other hand, 
everything has a has a limit somewhere. James Gallardo said, he said, you know, even though they've done multiple long distance endurance testing, they're still kind of they're kind of in the unknown at the minute. I think they even this is surpasses what the testing they've done. Yeah. So um, we are in the unknown. But yeah, it's super impressive by the uh, two top two cars just been at it, hammer and tong all race long. And most of their distance testing was actually pre-season as well. They've done one since the season started. I think at Paul Ricard, they did a couple of winter tests. So actually, one of them was wet. So. They've got knowledge, but at that stage they had little knowledge of the car. You know, now they've got a lot more knowledge of the car and also therefore, you know, ramping up the knowledge of what it can and can't do in the wet on a real racetrack or on this racetrack, which isn't a real racetrack, if you know what I mean. So, you know, and, and again, I'm sure in, all the way through your career here, there are things that you have to do here and you cannot do here that don't relate to anywhere else you go because of what it is, because it's public highway. What, what, what's impressed me actually is the uh, the AF course team. How, when I saw them in Sebring, they looked like they'd kind of just been thrown together and kind of were running a car, a very fast race car. Now they look like a proper, well-oiled race team. And not, not dissimilar to how we were with Bentley. I mean, they've only done a handful of races together. Now they've got people that worked together previously, but when you try and merge different groups of people together, it takes time. Mm. And, and with a new uh, car, and a complicated car. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, at that. But, the, but the, the, the spirit in the team is just so relaxed and on it. It's, it's quite remarkable for what you say. It's, it's right, it's a pickup crew and a brand new one. I mean, Porsche were in the same deal, but Penske Porsche team at Sebring, they had engineers working on the car who hadn't even been paid because they'd not been in the company a month. That's how new some of these programs are. I mean, the fact that we've got a battle like this at Le Mans, you know, in those circumstances, is remarkable. Uh, three points of interest here. The number six Porsche confirmed they're changing the hybrid battery in that car. Um, confirmed, too, that that was an early stop for Toyota. Waited to find out exactly why. Well, the, the key to, we'll have to wait until the uh, written reports well, come out on Thursday for the, that, I the, think. The key to that is the level of energy that's still left, left aboard the Ferrari at the point at which that happened. It's all about the slow zone. The other point of interest, and guys pointing it on the screen, is being called to race director immediately is the team manager of the leading car in LMP2 into Europe World competition. Now, has somebody overstepped their drive time allocation? Have they the, got... Uh, the only thing is that there's a minimum, minimum six hours. They're on maxima. Um, I don't think they're close to that. Four hours in any six is, is the main maximum figure. Yeah. Meanwhile, Nicely executed driver change. James Collado with fresh rubber. Brendan Hartley up to speed with tyres that he's already done a stint on. But he's been in really good form in this race, Brendan Hartley. Just seems to have had a little bit of pace over his teammates in the number eight Toyota. Well, the big change here is, that was 20 seconds. It's now four seconds. And that's the full service for the Ferrari as opposed to the fuel and go. Gas and go takes a lot less time than if you're also, because you can't start the tyre change until you finish the fuel. The driver change can go on at that stage. And again, that slightly seems a non sequitur to me, but there we go. Um, so, yeah, there's Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Let's have a, a media quick duties. Chat. Yeah, yep. quick chat with uh, Lecky, one of the French networks, sporting network, keep uh, France's biggest sporting oh, newspaper. Oh, there's the 311s. The That's just out the pits, the 311 car in the hands of Jack Aiken. Was he coming into the pits then? Out he was. Of the pits. He was coming into the pits no. when they had that lock-up. Oh, yes, yes. And so that was in for the stop. I don't Jack think Aiken it was Jack in the car. In the yeah. gravel. At that point, I think Jack's just got aboard the car. Now, we're at four hours and one minute to go. What happened here? Monsanto corner. Oh. oh. That was actually the first chicane, that's, wasn't that's it? That's not Monsanto corner. That is the chicane he crashed in in the wet. Crashed on the exit, didn't he? Crashed yeah. here at the same apex. place. He almost met exactly the same fate. Oh, my goodness. That was a strange, kind of a strange accident, really. Well, kind of steps out on the rear, hit the kerb, which knocked it straight. So we're going to go to another slow zone. We are about 20 hours in, less about 30 seconds of this race, gentlemen. If you like, a European Le Mans Series race to go, and the lead gap is 3.7 seconds. 
It's very strange. That is really deja vu. That is that is almost the same incident he had, the same incident jean eric Verne had in the 94 Peugeot, straight off into those bits of barriers. And in fact, all, in fact, all the advertising hoardings are back shows how much work has gone on there because they've been repeatedly uh, assaulted and attacked. Not just those two cars, a, a, hard, a huge number of them have. Our class leaders with four hours to go, James Collado, Fabio Scherer, and Sara Bovi. Stand by to clear slow zones eight and nine at 12.30. 12 0 30. Our well, work marshals are back at it. Yeah, that is about to be removed, whereas we've got one just about to be introduced or is introduced at the first uh, chicane. Yeah, that will go from uh, Tetra, just before Tetra, the end of the S's, down to the exit of the first chicane. The slow zones are in sort of standard blocks. So you get Tetra to first chicane, first chicane to second chicane, second chicane to Mulsanne Corner, Mulsanne Corner to, corner to Indianapolis Arnage. Um, so to, to allow the cars to go by and still continue without really affecting the race, but allow a slow speed of car progress so that marshals can work at the side of the track in relative safety. Earl Bamber on pit lane, and as Earl comes to halt, the number six car after that uh, hybrid battery change leaves pit lane. And uh, its next target will be the car that's in trouble, three laps ahead of it, Action Express car. Andrew Lotra rejoins in 25th position overall, the wrong end of the LMP2 battle. Is still though the 51 Ferrari being chased, and here is the view from ben, Brendan Hartley's windscreen of James Collardo is now aboard the 51 car ahead. The number two Cadillac, meanwhile, back in the hands of Alex Lynn, currently shown as being a lap down. I don't think it is. Think we'll see that uh, change again when we see a timing sector change. So Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, and that slow zone for the recovery of the 311 Cadillac, in the hands of Jack Aitken, and a bit of a whoopsie at the first Mulsanne chicane. It's been the graveyard of all sorts of ambition and fortune there today and yesterday. See the safety monitors inside each of the cars there, showing Ren and Hartley it's a slow zone, reminding him of the speed, though they will all have an automatic speed limiter button on their steering to press. Four hours to go at Le Mans, Martin Haven. Le Mans winner Guy Smith and Graham Goodwin in the booth watching the action with you. We're in a slow zone down to the first chicane on the Mulsanne straight after Jack Aitken got caught out in the Action Express Cadillac on his outlap from the pits and uh, dropped the car off the road and lightly into the barriers. Not a, a big impact, Guy Smith, but at this stage, just another frustration. He had a, a crash early on. He will be really beating himself up for that. Yeah, it's had a, it's had a tough race. Um, I mean, those guys have been uh, incredibly strong in the US, but um, you know, at this point, they've just got to put it down to experience. Um, I think it, it's probably Jack's first time here at Le Mans, so he's having a bit of a, a tough baptism of fire, but um, you know, he's a great, great driver, and I'm sure he will learn from this, and uh, I'm sure they'll be back next year. Yeah, I'm sure. Actually, it's one of the stalwarts of the IMSA program, the IMSA WeatherTech series, and the ability to run the same car in both has not been lost on them. Full course green, full course green. I look after my, over my shoulder, that's exactly right. Both slow zones have been removed at the same time. That's uh, a nice little bit of synchronicity that was not necessarily intended, just the work has been tidied up. So we have a green racetrack, four hours to go. That is a, a European Le Mans series race, as Graham Goodwin said. And we have 1.2 seconds in our lead battle. Third place, we have got Cadillac. Fourth place, Cadillac. Fifth place, the remaining healthy Peugeot car. Number 93 is creeping back up the order. John eric Van in the car. He crashed it heavily in the rain early on Saturday evening. And that car is now back up to fifth overall. And in sixth place is the number five Porsche Penske Motorsport car of Dane Cameron here from the number eight Toyota team. 
Okay, Brendan, plenty of energy available for override or no cuts. Plenty of energy available. The energy deployment in these cars has a maximum value and it is constantly monitored in real time. Now, there is no rule as to where the energy can come from. It can come from squirrels yep. on a treadmill or internal combustion engines or More electricity likely internal combustion engine, or anything else, but there is a maximum. But what that is saying is that you can now deploy the energy. We heard that happening with the Ferrari when we were on board during the night. At times like when you're in the flat shift and the engine, although the engine, the internal combustion engine keeps revving, as the clutches change gear, you're not transmitting that power. What the clever electronics can do is instantly and very briefly transmit the electric power. So your maximum power remains exactly as it was, even for the fractions of a second you're changing gear. And when you change gear, I don't know how many thousand times in a race, all of those fractions, those add up. And that's the kind of freedom he's been giving. OK, they had a problem with their charging system. Clearly, they've worked around that, and they no longer have a problem with their charging system. So what's been going on uh, while well, we've been going through this, though? So it's a 311 car, by the way, it has been recovered to the pits and is now back on track, uh, getting in the hands of Jack Aiken. Um, we were questioning why. There's a bit of a bobble over the curbs, curbs there coming through Tete Rouge from the uh, number eight car, why the early stop. It was to take advantage of the slow zone to, say, to effectively grab back some track position. Boy, that has worked. And from 20 seconds down, uh, the Toyota now two seconds down. We're going to have to do some hard sums to see whether that's going to count back later in the race because that's what they've done. They've traded track position for their fuel window. The other factor that's worth keeping an eye on here, gentlemen, there is the leader, there is a second place car, and there is the number 50 car, which is sitting seventh, but could be a factor here in Ferrari strategy. Sector one even, gap 2.0. So what James Lauder, I'm sure, is hoping for is the cavalry, in the form of Big El Medlina, in the 50 car, can be a, how can we put this, a confounding factor for Toyota's attempted attack here. Any pressure from behind to unlap from the second Toyota is going to take some of the brain power that's going to be required for Oli's front and attack on the leading car for this race. And there's what? under four hours to go. And the other thing is, there's no guarantee it's going to remain dry. We might get a massive cloud burst. The leaders might all end up in the wall. There might be a safety car. If the 50 Ferrari can unlap itself from the leaders, then it's got a much better chance, if it's on the lead lap, of being back in the frame all of a sudden. And, and this race has taken one or two weird twists already. That it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that the, the script writers haven't finished with us. Yeah, if that, if that number 50 car can get in front of the Toyota, it will just be a thorn in the side because they just want the straight fight. And if you can get the 50 car in there, it will just be a buffer between uh, the two cars. Excellent Sector 2, Brendan. Excellent Sector 2. Gap 1.3. Almost within DRS range, isn't it, if <laughs> we had such a thing? But again, gives a great indication. I, d I think really my biggest takeaway, apart from the quality and, and actually the survivability so far of these hypercars, because almost every issue has been predominantly human-inflicted or yeah. scenery-inflicted by the humans, my takeaway here is actually this is a little bit like a spec formula race in that the driver seems to make a bigger difference to the total equation than I can remember in a number of years. You get somebody who's really on top of the car and suddenly it's just a different car and, and that is changing with which driver is racing against which in, in their rotors. And it's also great to see them tweaking the strategy. You know, maybe the, the slow, there's a slow zone, so we'll pit lap early. Small little things there just to try and gain some time here, gain some time there, and it all, all adds collectively adds up. And clever thinking that Toyota have not had to do in recent years because they've not been under the cudgel like they are here. This is an absolutely knock-down, drag-out, knife-fight of a race. No one's got an advantage. Everybody's got a foot on everybody else's throat. And, and yeah, this is... They're absolutely having to really think that they haven't done since the Audi, Porsche, Toyota, LMP1 hybrid days. They've not had this level of sustained level of intense competition. Yes, the Alpine hypercar was quick, 
but it never had the fuel capacity to, to match them on, on endurance. So it would be quick, but we always knew it was going to fade. And so they didn't have to match it in the same way that they have to match Toyota and Porsche and Cadillac. If they let them go by sticking too rigidly to plan A, there may no be coming back. Yeah, you've got to be flexible and thinking on your feet, and that's what these guys are doing. And it's great to see Toyota having this battle. We know we know they're a brilliant team. We know they've got great drivers and uh, you know well organised. But this is them, you know, backs against the wall. This is really seeing what they're made of, and you know they're really stepping up to the plate here, showing why they are you know multiple Le Mans winners and, and wet champions. And yet, for all their experience of this race and their third year now here with their car. The new bugs, the new kids are on the block, Ferrari, Cadillac, Porsche, Peugeot, because Peugeot, although they know the car, have never raced it here, they're all right there. They are all right there. And again, Graham, that's that's a, an indication of just what a good rule set this is by giving you targets to attain rather than a box to be constrained by. It's allowed some free thinking with a lot of very different concepts, but the end result is They've all hit the they've all hit the goals. The, all their the, darts the, are in the bull. Let's have a listen. What's going on with Toyota? You're doing well, man. You're doing well. Keep pushing. It is a battle now. And the other point I was going to make here, gentlemen, is we're lucky. We're sitting here and watching fantastic pictures of a fantastic <laughs> motor race. But what's better still is there's never been more ways to follow this racing. Oh, who's that gone off? And where have they gone? Somebody got away with that. the Toyota just catching the... Was that the Toyota? It's like smoke, wasn't it? It looked... Maybe the car... Whoever is in front on the road... Oh, no, it's a 50 Savage oh, car. It's off the road. Somebody had gone off. That's... Uh, it, is, it is Daniel Serra. Yeah. He must have been getting right towards the end of a monster stint in that Kessel Racing Ferrari. He was absolutely flying, unlapped himself off all the class leaders. Uh, we'll hold for a moment to see whether or not we get another view of that. We saw the dust cloud. Ooh. I thought for a moment it was just one of the leading cars that caught the edge of the track. And I'll come back to the point I was about to make about Dust was in the air before they got there, but I couldn't see anybody ahead of them on the road, and we didn't see initially anybody in the gravel. So... That's Team Jota. That's 38 car after quite earlier. battle worn. It has been a difficult one. It is a double yellow at Marshall's post 24 25 to protect that instant site for yeah, Daniel. Looks but like they're preparing to get the car back on track, but uh, obviously any chance of uh, a good result is going, other than a finish, which would still be a good result. Yeah. Point I was about to make there was there's never been an easier way. Uh, easier or rather more choice in following endurance racing it is a complex sport and to do what we do to do what the fans i know at home love to do you can't do it without timing screens and data and yep. different ways of crunching it and the way in which the geniuses in our production uh, facilities manage to translate that into graphics that are useful for us and for other people to follow we talk a lot don't we about the manufacturer partners here and about uh, you know, about Michelin and about Total Energies. We don't talk very often uh, about Alcamel Systems, who's providing us with solid service uh, as part of the history of this World Championship. Well, well it's more than that. You know, it's a, it's a 20 year old company. They've got a lot of experience. Not only does everybody rely, and this, this is not just us, this is the teams and the drivers on all, you know, looking for all the sector data for every driver on every lap. But their willingness, in fact, their enthusiasm for constantly evolving the graphics package to include more information, more for the fans to learn. Because if it's written there on the screen or written on our timing screen, the information is the same, but getting it to the fans is easier. And, and they've been such a part of, of keeping the information Okay, Brendan, you're going. doing great. The slow zone will be active from turn 14 to turn 17 this lap. Uh, we'll remind you when you're closer. Slow zone from turn 14. Still. So the basic stuff from who's on the radio, the slow zone or full course yellow or red flags or whatever logos at the top, all of the you know the timing and information, the new energy level oh, indicator a, for this season. That's been a lifesaver. And and what we'll what we'll talk to the guys about when we finish the race 
is working on a way in introducing the tyre information as well. We've, you know, we know basically what's going on in Lando P2. If it's raining, it'll be the wet. If it's not, it'll be the slick. But in GTE, and especially in hypercar, and that's really where the focus is going to be over the years, knowing who's on the soft or the medium or the hard, at the beginning of the race, for instance, would have told us all sorts of great information. The Toyotas have started on the soft. It's 40 degree track temperature. Wow, no wonder they're going away. You know, those sorts of things, when you learn about them later, explain a lot. But having the ability, and I'm sure somehow, the guys at Alcamel will make that happen. That's the kind of thing that the fans will see. The well, same we as the manufacturer's logo and the car number and the car or the driver. That time information will be, uh, it, you know, when it's on screen all the time, it's just a constant drip, drip, drip of information to the fans. And, you know, those guys have been great for, for pushing that along within our, our on-screen package. There's, there is that uh, that phrase, isn't there? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but having a lot of knowledge <laughs> is absolutely brilliant. And uh, thank you to the guys to us, yeah. and the girls at, uh, in Alcamel Systems. They've been working hard again through the whole week, in fact, two weeks uh, here. So listen again into what's going on at Tota. Well, actually, what's the plan? Am I doing it now, what, is, what is the plan? Yeah, we'll talk outside of the slow zone. Come on. Look at how close the second Ferrari is to the back of the Toto. Yeah. That has caught up going into or in the slow zone. That could be an interesting moment. But that is Brendan Hart. You know, under the pressure we predicted he might be a lap or so ago. Uh, he's looking to get eyes forward onto the first of those Ferraris. But the 50 car in the hands of Miguel Molina is right there with him. It is six laps off the lead lap, the number 50 Ferrari. So. He needs to get a few more back, and that's not going to be possible in four hours of racing, three hours 45 of racing. So uh, there's not a chance he's going to end up on the lead lap. But again, that constant distraction. The last thing that Brendan Hartley wants now is uh, a Ferrari in his mirrors. When he's trying to look forward and chase down James Gallardo, he wants to be uh, eyes forward and trying to close that gap. And it looks like the 50 is behind him. He's flashing his lights making his intent that he's right behind him and wants to force Brendan into a mistake. Well, wherever you've been for the last 21, 20 and, and a quarter hours, uh, if you've got the opportunity to, to stay with us for three hours and 42 minutes to see who wins this three hours, 45 minutes, only American Le Mans series race, it's a, it's a great opportunity to see who may end up with the trophy at the end of the centenary Le Mans and how that's going to work because again, We've got no indication. The chances are it might be the 51 Ferrari or the number eight Toyota. Chances are equally easy that it could be neither of the above. Okay, Brendan, so the plan is to keep you in for a third stint. We are wondering if we can keep the tire. Do you think the tire can go three stints? Question. Okay, he's complaining that the 50 Ferrari is gaining too much in the slow zone. I'm fed up with that, and probably actually the 51 Ferrari is gaining too I much think he's in the right. slow zone as well. I think he's right. That car is significantly closer. Uh, now, what we didn't see is where the gain was. Well, now, there's a couple of things going on here. Obviously, all three cars are being driven by extremely professional drivers under extreme pressure. The deal with the slow zone is you must be doing no more than 80 kilometers an hour, like the pit entry line, as you hit the line. Except there is a very slight leeway. It is a very slight leeway, but there is a very slight leeway. It was a, a little moment early in the morning where two cars were nose to tail in LMP2 in a slow zone and the car behind was closing on the car in front, and they were so close you could actually see them almost touching. Is it a tow going for a pass? Yeah, this is, is exactly what we said might happen. This he's a trying to unlap to himself. This is pressure for Brendan Hartley. Yeah, he's got his own race to run. Well, it's, it's more than that, isn't it? Because the pace we're seeing now from the Ferrari to unlap himself for one of how many? Six, Six laps. Uh, might not be replicated if he gets by. Well, it will have to be because he'll get blue flags and he'll have to move aside if he is in front and holding up the Toyota. 
track is back to green, man. Track is back to green. Everything is green. Now, the deal here is, actually, in the short term, this could not work particularly well for Ferrari, because if Molina gets by and is just a tick faster than Hartley, what happens then, Guy? Hartley sits in the slipstream. It helps the Toyota speed up. Yeah, I mean, I think two it's just... Two cars will be faster than... Two cars are faster than one, for sure. But I think the Ferrari has the speed to break. If he gets past the Toyota, he can break the toe. And... Um, and just basically sit there in between the two of them, probably get close to the 51 car and just kind of play rear gutter, as it were. Well, and again, then those two would work quicker than the Toyota on its own. And so, yes, there is definitely that element to it. Drama in LMP2. We said that the team manager of car 34 had been called to race control. It is car 34 reported to the stewards for a safety car infringement. I believe at the moment, 49 seconds. That is going to be at least, Martin, at least a drive-through penalty. Yeah at least so into your pulse fabio shara has got enough on his plate but uh, a tiny safety car infringement and it, it won't be a monster thing like passing a whole line of cars because these guys are far too good for that it will be something fairly small but still a significant rule break and by the way when we're talking about small and breaking the rules ted you need to put on sunscreen before you go to the beach to say hello to the family back home to Matt Morgan, uh, enjoy your day on the beach. And Ted, put the sunscreen on, and then Gaga will talk a bit more about racing cars. So, a couple of uh, the jobs you have to do. Uh, confirmed 9/11 as we thought. The 9/11, uh, 9/11 is a retirement. Yeah. Uh, the other one is a bit of a drama for the Hendrix Motorsport Camaro new gearbox. Oh, OK. That is the first significant delay yep. for that effort. But they're fitting the new big gearbox, and we won't see that car again by the look of things. Uh, that little bit of pressure and the traffic has played into the hands of James Collado because what was 2.0 seconds as the gap is now close to five. Now don't forget, Collado's on fresher tyres. This is his first into the car. Brendan Hartley coming towards the end of a second stint or deep into a second stint. Now, whether they're going to triple those tyres or not, we didn't quite get the answer to that. The engineer was saying, we'd like to do a triple. Do you think the tyres can take it? Stop talking to me in the slow zone. <laughs> OK. Is that a yes or a no? We, didn't, we never quite got to the bottom of that, but I, I guess we will find out. I think it's... I mean, if, if I was Brendan, I mean, he's... he's trying all he can to keep um, Collado yeah. close by. He's, he's also got um, Molina right behind him, and they're asking him to stay in and to do it on new tyres. track in this car all the way through we had a number of messages from Sebastian Buemi during the night chasing the track and then front roll bar it's the front end of the car that's seemingly more of an issue than the rest they, they seem to be making more changes to that car it's almost like on the oval with the uh, weight jacker you know, yep. they're constantly tweaking and playing around with that car whereas we've heard nothing from the Ferrari guys about any kind of changes the track is obviously quite quick. You got Phil Hansen there, set the fastest lap in the United car, 22, and likewise uh, for uh, jean eric Verne, yep. just did a quick time. So the track is still quite quick. Well, track temp is nearly doubled. It's now up to 38 and, and above. Air temperature is up to 23. It's a much warmer day than we're sitting in our it is quite hot out there. Okay, Brendan, quicker in sector one and sector two this lap. Great job, mate. Let's not forget the guy in front is on new tires. The guy in front is on younger tires than you. Uh, I just remember him. I'm sure that you'll see the gaps. There'll be frustration. Oh. And off the track uh, briefly for Brendan Hartley. Um, maybe took a little bit of advantage in doing that by avoiding... Rexy. Um, 
Yeah, avoiding Rexy. Well, at least he avoided Rexy, and that's what he'll want to have done. Gunnar Jeanette in the green Porsche coming out of the pits, the Project One AO car. That down in uh, fifth place in its class. That's his outlap, so he's trying to build up speed out of the pit lane. The Toyota coming in fully lit and battling for victory. Oh, the, I suspect the worst that will happen there is uh, uh, an addition to the list of track limits violations. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, that was, let's put it this way, in the, from the book of Canny and Foxy Cunning, that uh, I'm sure whatever happened with the uh, the second Ferrari closing in on in, on him came yeah. from. No, that was, that was accident avoidance. That was taking to the hard standing to get by because the alternative was hitting him hard from, and it would have been a hard hit from behind and that would have put them both out the race. So there was there was no option there, was there, Guy? That's one of those whoop, twitches as a, a racing driver pure, where you've gone by. Pure reaction, it's just a pure avoidance. It would be an invest investigation. Indeed, that's confirmed it was an overtake off the track. So it'll be interesting to see exactly what comes out from, from that. Well, they will look at the data and see how much more slowly the Project One car was going than on the previous lap. And the team may have told Brendan, car leaving the pits right in front of you, watch out, he's going to be slow. But even so, you're not sure how slow he's going to be. Nick Nielsen getting ready to get aboard the number 50 car. So this is going to be interesting because we haven't really had eyes on the 50 cars fuel strategy, where they are if they're in the same pit stop rotation. I'm not sure that 51 and 8 are due in just yet. Uh, they've, they've got different strategies from now because uh, the total stops. Uh, yeah. Nothing more. Oh, no. no I think you're right, yes. Uh, the so Ferrari was at something like 30% energy when the, uh, the total stopped. Let's take a look at the energy graphics, boys and girls in a truck, and uh, see what it looks like. It's not, your, it's not like your fuel gauge in your car. If you drive a if you drive a mild hybrid, then it's much more like that. You've got a, an ICE and an electrical power source, and it's that total energy that is the maximum for the car. And that is what we uh, what we represent in what percentage of this basically of their power for the stints they've got left. Now back in the LMP1 hybrid rules. You used to have a maximum that you could deploy per lap. That's no longer the case. OK, Brendan, doing a great job. Gap is 5.9. Last time around, car ahead 28.2. You were 28.5. You're doing awesome, man. They're really encouraging him. They're really kind of not coaching him, but they're, they're really supporting him and yep. giving him some positive feedback, keeping his uh, a positive vibe. You know. that's, that's exactly right, and, and uh, keeping him in the right mind frame, keep attacking, he's getting away from me, it's okay, he's not getting away, he's just creeping away, and he's got fresher rubber, it'll come back to us, and it's all those things that stop you as a driver doubting yourself, and what's wrong with my car, why is he getting away, I was quicker than him last time, yep. it, it's all of that, it's all part of the psychology of the, of the sport. And a lot of the time, the best relationship between the driver and the engineer is all about that. Yeah, we know it sucks to save fuel, but you're doing exactly what you need to do, and this will pay off for you. Just, we know, you know it will, we know it will, we discussed it, we just know it hurts a lot right now. You know, there's that sympathy level. And you can see the, um, the 50 car caught up to the back of the number eight, but because it didn't get the pass done, it's kind of lost momentum. You get to that point where if you don't get it done within the first couple of laps, you find you're in that dirty air and you start to gain, lose a little bit of damp force, maybe work your front tires a little bit harder, and it then becomes harder to make that pass. And then Hartley, purple first sector on this lap. Wow. Uh, Fastest so lap of the entire race, potentially. Yep, That's so. now held by Antonio Fuoco in the 50 car. For a long time, it was Sebastian Bourdais in the number three Cadillac that was set on lap three of the race. Fuoco set his fastest lap 227 laps later. Significant penalty, by the way, coming for the 709 Glickenhaus. That's the car running in eighth position. That puts on aboard the car, speeding in the pit lane, a stop and 30 second hold for that car. And that will lose it in position to its sister car, yep. dropping back down to ninth place. Yeah. Seems unlikely that'll be a repeat of last year's podium finish for 
Flicken House. Brendan, any further feedback on the tire? How does the tire feel? Question. Didn't quite get that one, I'm afraid. I think he said it's sort of stabilized. I think he, it clearly feels good in the car. This is them trying to claw back 10 or 15 seconds without having to make that uh, that uh, tire change. Well, he's done the fastest first sector and the fastest personal yeah. uh, sector too. So clearly he uh, is comfortable with the car. Yeah. Well, this could be a new fastest race lap. His last lap was a 328.3. The fastest race lap a 327.4. He doesn't have to be an awful lot faster in sector yeah. three, and the road is relatively clear. So that Aston Martin. This Aston Martin in the wrong place. This could be the fastest lap of the race for Brendan Hartley. Now, what that means for the longevity of the tyre, means it's in a, in a good place now in the second stint, but will it do a third? Tyre's coming for the number 50 car. Yeah. So they're going to be full attack, but uh, for the moment... Uh, you see the Ferrari got really... He got balked. Yeah, that's yeah. crossed him. Yeah. So that takes the pressure off Brendan Hartley, doesn't it, in a big way. Nicholas Nielsen, we know, is standing by to get aboard this car. Is it going to be this lap or yeah. the next? Looks I like this, this lap. You wouldn't be taking the tyres out of their blankets and rolling them through the front of the garage unless he was due in imminently. You're not going to leave them sitting Here there for comes. two or three laps. Did he come in? If somebody did, yes, he three, did. 27, it, 9, 9, 2. it is Brendan Hartley in pursuit. Under six seconds, the gap. 50 car rolls down pit lane. First it, time under three minutes, 28 for that car. Will be Nicholas Nielsen, man with an extraordinary record of success with Ferrari, with Air of Corsa in recent years. I think I said earlier in the show, at least one major race win or title every year since 2018. And right in front of him was the Air of Corsa 54 Ferrari, the silver car that is currently in fourth place yep. in GTE Am. Davide Regan, I think, getting towards the end of his stint. We saw Thomas Floor sitting in the garage. I wouldn't mind betting that he's about to get back into the car. We just double check as if he has to. As he has to. Uh, the Corvette works his way to the top of the uh, mm. GTE as well now. Yeah. The Nico Verone hasn't run over any rival drivers recently. Yeah, Thomas does need a further 54 minutes. Yeah, so it'll be a, 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 another stint for Thomas Floor. I kind of imagine this might be the right time to put him in. Track yeah. is cleanish. Weather is goodish. He's rested-ish. And by the way, we saw the orange Aston Martin that uh, the Toyota managed to clear. That is uh, with the pit stop for the 54. That means both the 25 and the 56 move ahead as Ooh -ooh. the 93. Beat Peugeot. Peugeot. This is the fifth place car. Into Kev the garage. Back in the garage. That's bad news. It's not always really bad news. Essentially, when the car is on the pit apron, you're allowed a limited number of people to work on it. Correct. If you need to do anything other than routine service, back in. Change the nose, change the tail. That that comes under, you know, the stuff you do on the petrol forecourt. Anything else, back into the garage. Then you can throw unlimited number of people at it. So nose is off. Hoses blowing stuff out of air holes. Is this power steering issue? They're working at the back of the car as well. There we go, warning flag for car number eight for overtaking beyond the track limits. Mm, okay, so it was a warning. We know why you did it, but it is illegal. Just don't do it again. Okay, fair enough. I, th that's pragmatic to me. Yeah. You know, it, it was either that or risk a very big accident because you had the 50 car right behind. If he got sideways, the 50 car would have been right in there as well. Uh, meantime, Nico Veroni is putting the hammer down and has put in the fastest lap of the race so far for the 33 car, 350.439. Now 78 seconds to the good over Sarah Bovey, still working her bronze driver time in the 85 Iron Dames car. Now, when she finishes this stint, will she be done? Uh, apologies. Right, when she finishes this stint, she will be, she I think she'll be fine. I think yes. she might be. They've rotated yes. through, and then we'll go to Michelle Gatting, the silver raced, uh, silver graded driver, and then the gold. Louise Beckin is at Peugeot. Good morning, Louise. I'm on my way to Peugeot, but the 93 is back out uh, and on its way to track now. Okay, so whatever it was, it was swift. If you could ask what it might have been, that would, uh, I know, obviously, that'll be in your remit. Uh, it was a fairly quick in and out, can't have been much more than about 90 seconds. 
Yeah, Sarah Bovey, four minutes from the end of her required minimum of six hours. OK. It's a drive-through penalty for the LMP2 leading car. Prover taking on the safety car. So Fabio Scherer, 47 <laughs> seconds to the good. That is going to leave it mighty tight for the lead of LMP2 with under three and a half uh, hours to go. And that's why he's been rocking on like a man possessed. But I mean, he has anyway, but even more so. Miguel Molina looked like he'd been working hard for a living there. It's, uh, it's pretty warm in the cars. Cadillac number three. And a ring of van der Zander when it came in, but it's a driver change there. And, uh, That'll be Earl Bamba, I think, the white helmet. I know, he's the number two car. OK, Brendan, box this lap, pit confirmed, box this lap for fuel. Scott Dixon, of course, the uh, Kiwi flag, so that'll be Scott Dixon taking over that car. And box six lap for Brendan Hartley. There's the 34 car, Fabio Scherer has another two laps to comply. Yeah, behind drive through penalty. Oh, <laughs> fully twitched up. And of course, what you can't do is combine it with a routine pit stop. So if they need one, when they need one, they'll have to do that separately. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, as uh, Miguel Molina gets uh, late exclusive uh, abuse of track and its warning flag, but he's out of the car now. Yep. Uh, but there is a battle firmly underway for third place in LMP2 because Neil Gianni is being caught by a flying Paul Loup Chatan, pole sitter. Last time around, uh, two seconds taken out to that advantage, and it is a two second gap. New nose going on to the front, number three, Caddy. I don't know if it's new, new, or just a replacement nose. Seems to have gone through a few body panels, and most of the caddies have. Seven and nine, Glickenhaus in the pit lane with Nathaniel Berton at the wheel. That'll be serving that penalty. And there is 41, the remaining healthy LMP2 WRT car. Louis Delatraz comes in and hits his marks. He comes in from second place. As you said, Graham, the gap was very small. And uh, Louise Beckett is there. I'm at Peugeot 93. They had a lack in hydraulic pressure, so they just needed to bring it in, get it resorted, and, and back out again. And as the, t as the team have just said to me, they did a fantastic job to do it so quickly. They did indeed. Thank you very much, Lou. And that's a change to their transmission system selection. They went from uh, electronics to hydraulic. And it is a transmission that Peugeot build themselves. They didn't do what Audi did, go to Ricardo. They haven't gone to x -Track. They well, may have had some input from x -Track. We saw x -Track guys in the garage with the team, but uh, it is a uh, predominantly self-constructed transmission. And that's been really the Achilles heel of the car in terms of reliability since its debut in Monta last summer. Into the pits is our GTE AM leader. Nico Veroni stays in. See his knees tucked up right behind the steering wheel there. He's a considerably different height to Ben Keating. He and Nicky Katzberg both uh, a bit taller than their bronze rated teammate. So they have to tuck themselves in into the convoluted space. Out goes Robert Kubica in the 41 WRT car. And Kubica passed the team of the car that failed on the last lap of Le Mans two years ago. Yiffy Yi then at the wheel. They went from being briefed by the ACO officials in the garage. OK, now what happens now is when the car passes the chequered flag, we'll go with you and we'll stand by underneath the podium. Then the driver will come in in the car. Then we'll oh, hang on a minute. And they walked over to the other side of the garage. I mean, that's how close they were to winning Le Mans. That's tough, isn't it? And you can imagine that the same was probably happening with Toyota back in 2016 as well. I mean, you know, everything was in place, ready to go. In the pits and receiving service, number eight Toyota, Brendan Hartley stays in. No change of tyres, it's on the medium. They'll be good for three stints, maybe even four. We heard his race engineer saying they wanted to triple them. It looks like that's exactly what they're going to do. And actually, Guy Smith, his pace has been pretty good all the way through the stint, hasn't it? So that might well work. Well, let's catch up with Louise Beckett in the pit lane. I know it's probably old news, but the 9-11 uh, Proton competition of Michael Fassbender, uh, the door has just gone down. Such a shame. When I came back this morning and saw they were still in the running, I was really happy for them, okay, but their race is over. Yeah, 
9-11, confirmation of its retirement. All the body language, I'm afraid, when the car came in was, that ain't going anywhere. It had a big, hard slap on the wall in uh, the first part of the Porsche curves, as many cars have. That's kind of, there's been some parts of this track that have claimed more than their fair number of victims this year. I mean, the race of attrition in that particular element of the Porsche curves and the first you came on the Mulsanne. Boy, the number of people who've not had an incident there is probably smaller than the number that have. And Indianapolis as well as, as mm. the exit of Indianapolis is uh, also good. Just going back to the tyres, we said about Brendan Hartley now on his... Uh, would it be his second stint on these tyres or third stint? Third, third on this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the car can feel pretty good by the end of the stint when you're on low fuel, but now when you fuel the car up, you've got a lot more weight. Um, the tyres are obviously are getting older, so it becomes more and more difficult um, as the stint goes on, obviously. But uh, his pace has been good, and um, you know, absolutely no reason to be changing tyres at this point. Fabio Scherer in the pits. That was a fuel stop. He will be in again next lap. He still has not served his penalty. And that's so a drive through, isn't it? That was not the drive through, so he's going to yeah. have to do it. Yeah, because yeah. he's already pa passed by once. That's the second time past the line. It will need to be mm. this lap. Where in fact it won't be Fabio, because there is Fabio. You can tell, not just because it looks like Fabio, but also because he's limping like John Wayne on a bad day. So he is out of the car and he's being driven again by Albert Costa. And yeah, look, he can barely even stand on the foot when he's been running around the car gym for the pit stops. He hasn't been hopping. running, he's been hopping. hopping. That's right. So yeah. I missed it. What actually what happened? He was run over by his foot. His left foot was run over by the Corvette. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday, now, yesterday this, evening. Is this drive-through just, I'm catching up? Just no, that's just the driver in. change. That's full-service right. driver but, change. They but, still have a drive-through penalty for forward. passing another car under the safety car. Okay, that's and what so, I wanted to find out. If, yeah. yeah. Have and we I, still had anybody uh, get a penalty yet for track limits? There's been... Don't go there. <laughs> well, no, uh, actually, there, there hasn't been. Actually, that led to the demise of Michael Fassbender's car because he was coming into that first left, a really fast entry into the mm -hmm. Porsche curves, yep. and knew he was going to run out yep. wide and, and tighten the line and spun the car. And he, on the radio, he, uh, Peter was saying, yeah. he was trying to avoid track limits. And on the radio, he said, sorry, guys, I've hit the wall. Damn it, track limits. Yeah. That's what he was trying to avoid. So, And, and it's a combination of you put the lock on because you mm -hmm. want to tighten the corner, and then you think, OK, I'll need to lift as well. So you lift yeah. off, and, and suddenly the car... Especially with the Porsche. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, All and that it, unsprung weight in the back, even he, though that engine's still been moved way up. He was still, really lucky. He was just trying to do the right thing, and it yeah. unfortunately caught him out. And he almost climbed the wall there, too. That was yeah. the other thing. That, that, Nicholas oh. Nielsen in the Ferrari, the number 50, he's just on the fastest lap of the race on a 327.3, <laughs> so... They are pushing hard still. They are six laps down to our leader. There is the number eight Toyota. Just fresh off uh, a fuel stop. There goes the 51 back out. Uh, the irritant, the uh, the grain in, uh, of sand in, in the shoe of Brendan Hartley that was the 50 Ferrari, because that stopped slightly out of sync and it dropped back a little, Nick Nielsen's no longer in the position right behind that second-place Toyota that Miguel Molina was. So, so that annoyance for Hartley has gone. He was able to just distance himself a little bit, got a couple of breaks in traffic, and then he was gone. And then that sort of... that magnetic attraction was broken, wasn't it? And, yeah, and, yeah. and the 50 car never got back up to it. And again, I think you know, every time Hartley has been in the car, he has made quite a difference to, to the way that the balance of power is swinging. And, and it's, it's like a, it's like Newton's cradle. It's like going yeah. from one side to another. It's just constant motion and right now. Hard to tell which is actually in the better place. The Ferrari, which has got a cycle fresher tyres, and Brendan Hartley in the Toyota. The gap is 10 seconds. The gap is 10 seconds. It's interesting. What's the gap? I don't see it. Yeah, three hours to go, mm. and uh, we're, I don't see him. That's fantastic. But, but, you see, but the, I mean, that, they, they, they're close enough. He thinks he should be able to see him. He, he could before they both stopped. So let's hear from the Porsche team, see what's going on with them. 
right? We're, <laughs> we're not going to hear from the Porsche team. That's been waved off. Question. Well, there's the 56 Porsche, the Iron Dames car, that still remains in second place. 85, beg your pardon, uh, in the GTE AM class. It's still the Corvette leading. Nico Veroni, Sarah Bovi, at the end of this stint, will have done her drive time. So her silver and gold rated teammates. Michelle Gatting and Rahel Frey can finish the race in the remaining three and a quarter hours, or three hours or so, as it'll be then. And Ahmad El Harty, ORT by TF. Now, he claimed the first ever World Championship pole position for an Omani driver when he put the car on an amazing pole at Spa. We were watching the battle, as we often do, between Ben Keating and Sarah Bovey, and then yeah. boom, yeah. the nowhere. most yeah. astonishing lap from Al Harty. Now, he's got plenty of experience as far from his British GT racing days, but that was a, that was a, a proper run. And he might be in a position now where he becomes the first Omari driver to stand on the podium at Le Mans. They are in third place and very much in contention. In comes the number two caddy, Alex Lynn at the wheel, and this car well, it's in the all Cadillac battle for the final podium spot. That's going to have to be a tough one there. They're actually a few laps apart, but it doesn't take much to happen to the number two car to swing the balance to number three. Well, I guess either way, it would be a caddy on the podium, which would be, I think, all, all things considered, a great result. I'm yes. sure they would have liked to have been yes. fighting for the win, but I think um, they've just not quite uh, got the pace of the, of the leading two cars, but uh, still, third place would be no... Eh. Eh. And they've not had the luck either. Both, in fact, all of the Cadillacs have had an incident or, or two or three or four. So that's taken them out of the hunt. We saw the number two car open. For viewers uh, that of a certain age, no, that <laughs> is not Derek Bell. It's uh, a Derek Bell replica helmet, including down to where he had the Union Jack on uh, the top of the forehead. That is Alex Lynn. He wanted a helmet. So many drivers have got different helmets, specifically for Le Mans. See, Miguel Molina's got uh, his regular pattern, but where it would mm. normally be white, it's got monochrome representations of Ferrari's racing history here. Alex Lynn has gone for this. Um, who was it who in uh, the Panis car? Jop van Eutert, yes. instead of having his own regular helmet, secretly had had his helmet painted in the livery of team owner Olivier Panis in the helmet he wore when he won the Monaco Grand Prix in Ligier. So that was a, a little touch. So some of it is Le Mans relevant. The guys in the 50 car have all got red and yellow Ferrari livery, like on the car, and a 50 on it as well. They've sort of taken their own livery off for this race. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. A nice little touch from Alex Lynn. Clearly, Dinger is a bit of a boyhood hero for him, as, as he is for many of us. I try, try not to remind him too often of, of the fact that he was in the in his prime when, when we were still young but he's he's still very much in his prime and, uh, and clearly Alex yeah reflecting that so number two car rejoins still in set in third place it is a lap behind the leaders a safety car could change that mm -hmm. in a heartbeat with the new safety car regulations if he ends up in a queue in the safety car with the leaders behind him, and there's a two-thirds chance that that would be the case, because we have three safety cars, and the way they fall is kind of arbitrary. And he could end up on the back of the hypercar field and on the lead lap, and suddenly that could change the dimensions of this race and the dynamics of this race. And Guy, that's kept the race more alive even maybe than it might have been in all three classes. Yeah, I mean, all the way through the, the the grid, there's, there's action. Um, obviously, at the front, we've got a great battle. We've got the uh, Inter Europol car. Um, I believe it's now done its drive through, so uh, we'll see exactly where that shakes out, whether it stays in the lead or not. Um, yeah, it should have done, shouldn't it, by yeah. now? And its last pit stop was 32 seconds. Well, there you go, that's what a pit lane delta is yeah. 32 seconds. So, yeah, drive through 32 seconds. Anything beyond that, and there's been work done at a standstill. And he holds at 15, almost 16 second lead still. Yeah, so that 50 Two seconds minutes. that he had in hand after the pit stop was very, very important. On board with Andre Lotterer, just the 10 wins in World Endurance Championship racing.
Interesting that the chassis number of the 963, 963 number 111, it's not that, they didn't start at 001 and have built 110 before they got to this one, but that will be great for, um, for chassis number geeks in many years to come because you won't just have it written down a, on a piece of paper in scrutineering, there'll actually be video evidence That's right. of the car. And normally you can go around the outside here, but you see he's having to keep it more in the middle of the road yeah. because of all the marbles. Mm. At the beginning of the race, it would have been a no-brainer, but... Um, and, what, and what a great demonstration of what happens when you hit traffic yeah. at the exact wrong spot. You can, yeah. hear, the, you can hear him back off, you can see the... Yeah, changing down the gears. Yep, yeah, exactly. Totally changed the way he took that part of the racetrack. It's like being, a, you know, in your golf GTR on a country road and you come up behind somebody enjoying a, you know, Sunday drive with Granny. You know, you change down a couple of gears ready for the gap to come and then, yeah, it, it, it definitely affects the speed of the car. Of course, this Sunday drive is a little quicker than most, hopefully. Hopefully, not that it's quicker than most, hopefully. Hopefully most Sunday drives are slower than this. And you can see how recently he has been in the pit lane. The Alphamel graphics there on the right-hand side of your screen showing brake and throttle application and also the energy state of the car. So that will be its mild hybrid system and also its internal combustion engine. And on the left-hand side, the gear selector position, five up to six, goes up to seven. And on the left, watch the speed. 321 is the magic number that takes you to 200 miles an hour. Anything north of that is into slightly scary territory. Nudging right up to the limiter, not quite to the limiter guy. What is actually the fastest point on the circuit? And the reason for that is because if you get into the slipstream of a car at those speeds, you want to have a little margin so you can headroom. take advantage. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. as soon as you hit that limiter, the car just stops accelerating, mm. which is obviously not what you want when you're trying to make a pass. So that'll be set at sort of 77, 7800 RPM with another 250, 300 RPM in hand. Because when you're in the turbulent air behind a car, close behind it, it's less hard, if you like, for the car to push its way through than, than standing air. And so you get that little advantage. You will have felt it yourself in, on a, in a road car behind a big truck. I mean, especially when you go past a truck, you feel the bow wave, you feel the yeah. wash. You know, you can see it with a boat. It's no different with a truck. That's why that's why aerodynamics is called fluid dynamics, because air is yeah. a, acts the same way as very thin water. Very, very thin water, but, but it's got that. You know, you see cars side by side on the straight and they're bobbling around. Well, that's why, because if you imagine two boats, they'd both be bouncing off each other's bow wave. So, so that wake, that air wake is very much a, even though it's tied up in boats, it's tied up even more in racing cars to help generate grip and to help take hot air out of the car and all of that. It's still, you're still bouncing around on these cushions of air. And that must be, when you first get into this, when you first get into high aero dependency cars, that must be an absolutely mind-warping experience to, to get to grips with why these weird things happen that are invisible. And, and again, it's, you know, when you, with these cars, in theory, the faster you go through the corner, the more downforce you have, so the more the car has been pushed into the ground. And, and uh, it's, it's getting your head around that. Louise Beckett. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on the pictures yet, but the 38 Hertz Team Jota is in the garage. The driver's out of the car, they're not going anywhere, they're cleaning the car up, and what they're doing is waiting for the car, um, waiting towards the end and aiming for the car to be classified. Okay, and can you ask Sam how close to the end of the race does he need to go to actually make sure the car is classified? Because that, that will be the main thing. I'll come back to you on that when Thank they're expecting to go back out. All right. And uh, enjoy the tea while you're there. So, he's, uh, he's at uh, Hertz Team Jersey. Yeah, the 38 car has had a trying time, it is fair to say, that uh, hybrid. Uh, the first car in private hands. Next time out for the World Endurance Championship, Monza in July. If you quite fancy a bit of watching this stuff trackside, and particularly, actually, there were fans in Portimao who could not get 
who could not get uh, tickets for Le Mans. There may well be other fans from Europe who couldn't get tickets for Le Mans who decide to go to Monza instead. Um, that's, yeah, you can, you can watch these cars trackside and you'll be able to see all of that going on. You'll also be able to see Proton racing their customer Porsche as well. Into the garage again, problems for Porsche. Last time it was 93, this time it's 94. Now the 94 car was crashed earlier on as well by Gustavo Menezes. So both cars have been in the barriers. 93 was crashed by Jean-Éric Verne. Verne had, had a, a brief chip into the garage. They had a hydraulic pressure problem and their hydraulic gear selector shifter, I would think, would be the problem there. And I wonder if that is the same deal with the 94 car. Jean-Éric Verne going through the Porsche curves. You see the, the wear and tear that these cars Ooh. go through. The wrap coming off the right front fender. Yeah, it's lived a life, this car. A box v slap, box box, driver change. Okay, so he will come and spin. Uh, never mind that, look at the pitot tube on the mm -hmm. left-hand side mm -hmm. there. Barely even attached, it's bending yeah. right back. Now that measures airspeed, why do you need that? Well, you correlate it with the wheel speed, but wheel speed can be affected by weather. So aircraft have a pitot tube to measure their speed over the ground, whether there's a headwind or not. Uh, they correlate their airspeed with actual ground speed. And that's exactly what you're doing here. Whoa, ho, ho, oh, ho. Boy, Is that Valentino oh, Rossi backing the Toyota in? Brendan Hartley taking some tips from the doctor. But he needs to stay on the other side of that white line because it's not just the marbles, it's the gravel as well, Guy Smith, that is such a big factor late in the race. Every gravel trap has been visited by everybody. He's on tires are in it, their third stint, but that, that's down at Mulsan Corner. That's a handful. Yep. Okay, Brendan, you need to control brake pressure. You need to control brake pressure in those places. I know it's difficult. The tires are getting old. Yeah, so young apprentices there at TGR. What did you take? As, as, as a driver, what did you take from that? Controlling brake pressure so he can't play with the balance anymore or the harvesting anymore. That all seems to be optimized. And these things take a lot of stopping. There's a lot of pedal pressure. Yeah, uh, you can actually modulate the pedal. So usually um, with a downforce car, the first hit is normally a hard hit of, of, of pressure when you've got the downforce on the car. And then you actually bleed off the brake pedal as you go into the corner. And as you roll off the pedal, you carry momentum and roll speed through the corner. But that first input is so important. And it just seems that while the grip of the tires is, are going away, perhaps that first input been aggressive is just on balancing the car so he just needs to be a little bit more possibly break a yeah. fraction earlier and just a little bit lighter oh john elkin the uh, ceo of automobili ferrari has changed out of his hawaiian shirt of yesterday is a little bit more dressed up sunday if he's off to church later certainly has that look about him looking very sharp this morning he was looking very chill in uh, I, I didn't quite we didn't really quite get a look at the shirt close enough to see what all the various different colored patterns on it were I'm sure it was very Ferrari Le Mans related let's hear again from the eight Toyota crew okay Brendan we have a question for you is four stints possible for you physically is four stints possible for you question yes the codicil to which is, as long as I don't stay on these doggy old tyres, if you give me fresh rubber, I'll do it. Louise Beckett. Well, if you remember, that's exactly the same call that we heard earlier in the race, right at the beginning, exactly the same answer. He said, yes, I can stay in, and I'm not sure if the tyres will last. Yeah, put me in, coach. Definitely he's up for the fight. And, and you know, he knows what it means to win Le Mans. He's won it with Porsche, he's won it with Peugeot, and he wants to win it again, and he wants to win as tough a Le Mans as there's been in a decade and, and more, and probably certainly in his knowledge of Le Mans. I, I'm, I'm struggling now to think of another one where it's been so cutthroat and so cut and thrust all the way through. 93 okay. for uh, Porsche, uh, oh no, 93 Peugeot has been and gone. 94 Peugeot still in the garage. Let's hear from Louise again. 
Yes, I don't know if you saw what happened on track. I, I didn't. Um, the 93 Peugeot came in and had a nose change. Now, that's the one that had the hydraulics issue as well, which was a quick turnaround. But I don't know if you've heard anything or seen anything other than that on that one. Again, that may well be an issue with hydraulics. By the way, the, the reason that Peugeot, uh, that Peugeot, Toyota stopped out of sync a little earlier was to come in while there were two long slow zones on the track, mm. which reduces the speed of everybody else on the track, which then means that your pit stop quote takes less time. Yes, so it was a shorter stop, top themselves up, but again, you know, fuel and track position both that in that equation. That's the was Battle that the Cat's car ah, throwing off a bit of the uh, liner. Peugeot nose. That's nose of the Peugeot. So that was where it lost bits of its nose. And that the replacement is on, but the onboard we saw a little earlier still had the 93 car with bits peeling off. So there's Carlos Tavares, himself a racing driver. I think I'm right in remembering that he's raced here at Le Mans, maybe in one of the support classes. Now, a few moments ago, we saw the Ferrari number 50 starting to close in on the back of the Toyota number eight. And earlier, you guys were talking about how the 50 had been hounding uh, Sebastian Buemi, or, or it may have been Brendan Hartley. How much of that is, is bothersome, or can you just put that out of your mind? I think it's quite, it's a real pain, to be fair, because I'm just saying, I think that, um, you know, Brendan just wanted to focus on, on uh, the lead Ferrari. And when you've got the sister car behind you flashing its lights, basically just been a nuisance, it means that you're... Then why, not, why not let him go? He's six laps there. Because then you've got another car between you and the leader, so uh, he, he then can he then can also start down. backing yeah, you up. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. just another... Yeah. Less than three hours to go. We're just past one o'clock here at the Circuit de la Sarthe, the centennial of the 24 hours of Le Mans. We're going to enjoy leaving you to do your own commentary for 10 seconds while we swap Jim into the uh, commander's chair. And Ant Davidson will join with Guy Smith. So we will have our world champion and our Le Mans winner in the crew. Uh, none of the rest of us have done either. No, no, just those two. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we'll take a quick pause. We'll be right with you in just a second. Again, Guy. Hello. What's been going on? Give us an update. Uh, well, we are pretty much in the same position as before with the Ferrari leading the Toyota. Still pretty close, but sort of 14, 15 seconds. It's kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. But Looks uh, closer, though, than the last time I, saw. I left when there was a minute distance between the two of them. So what happened there? Um, the Toyota made a it short stopped and did a pit stop under a slow zone and uh, gained a little bit of time. It actually uh -huh. got down to about two seconds from sort of about 10, 12 seconds down to two. So that was a smart move, but they gained uh, a little bit of track position, but um, obviously... Uh... It looks like the 94 Peugeot that is in the pits is getting a new steering rack. So they had issues with the uh, with the steering very early on in the race. We heard, uh, was it Jean-Eric Verne? After the moment, only went off in Molsan and uh, got it beached in the gravel for quite some time. And he had a message saying, we need to cool down the, the power steering rack. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, it's clearly a bit of a, an Achilles heel on that car. And now seems like it needs replacement. I mean, that doesn't sound like a, a short... Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, a short bit of work down there, does it, Jim? No, not at all. Not at all. So, so yeah, Hartley's, uh, Hartley's hanging in there. He's, um, he's, on, um, he's on his third stint on the tyres, and they've asked him to stay in now for a fourth stint. Um, whether if, I, I doubt he'll stay on the, the tyres for a fourth stint, but you never know. They can do it. I mean, it's yeah. not unheard of uh, to, to be able to do the quadruple on uh, particularly the medium tire. Yeah, with, which, the, with the Michelin really runners. So, yeah, it, it can be done. You obviously need to do a, quite a bit of time management as well. 
and therefore, you know, around the high speed corners, just throttling back a little bit, not pushing them, overstressing them. And those are higher energy corners. And you can see there the, uh, the conversation going on down at uh, Peugeot with uh, Loic Duval in the background, suited and booted with helmet on. There's the Glickenhaus technical team. Yeah, Keeping an eye on the data. Still got there. Two cars in the mix. I mean, they're P8, P9. The car we see on screen there running in P9. And uh, they've, yeah, they've had reliability, but like many other drivers out there, there's, their drivers have suffered as well. Been a mistake or two, hasn't it? Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's to be forgiven because I've never seen a Le Mans like this. It's, it's, it's calmed down in terms of the conditions now. But uh, the problem is now the drivers are so tired, they're absolutely sure. fatigued from yeah. what they've been through, this relentless, changeable conditions. And uh, yes, this is a hard enough race anyway, but this has been absolutely savage for them. Is this the type of time when it's just adrenaline that gets you through it, when you're really, when you're that tired? This is where you are digging in, you're digging deep into your reserves at this point, because you are tired, you know, you've not slept physically, mentally tired, and, um, you know, but you know that the end is closed, so, You've got, the, you know what the end game is, so you, it keeps you going. Particularly when you're embroiled in a, a, a immense battle like we got with uh, Toyota and, and Ferrari, they're essentially just down to the two cars, the Ferrari 50, you know, still that six laps behind, so you can count them out. So it does come down to just, you know, those two mighty brands fighting it out right through to the end with two hours 54 minutes to go 14.6 seconds with, separates them with two cadillacs lurking they're lurking just kinda, and yeah and that's that's all yeah. they're they're lurking that's like the vultures just yeah, circling yeah. around <laughs> waiting to pick up the scraps that's uh you know it's all they can do really they they have had the speed but they put themselves in a position to be able to do that absolutely which, especially for the three car which has really had to work hard to get back into fourth position it's not been easy for those guys. They've, they've had their, their issues, but um, but they're still running. And uh, anything that happens to the guys in front, they are right in the, the pound seats to. So just with just under three hours to go, as Anthony just said, we've got 14.7 seconds separating first and second overall. In LMP2, we've got 23.7 seconds separating first and second. And then down in GTEM, where we see the number 33 Corvette, with Nicholas Veroni behind the wheel, we've got three cars within a minute, all on the same lap. So it's the Corvette, then the Iron Dames with Sarah Bove in second position, 23 seconds back, and then the ORT by TF Aston Martin, number 25, with uh, Ahmed Al Harti behind the wheel of that car, a minute and eight seconds back. So it looks like Michelle Gatting is going to be uh, next in on the next round of pit stops. And she will take the, the next stint. Uh, Sarah Bove has now completed all of her drive time, as has Ben Keating. So we will probably see the pro drivers in these cars the rest of the way. Ben has been formidable this race, yeah. hasn't he? Absolutely. I mean, we call him, you've heard of Super Silvers, we call him the Super Bronze. And uh, I said it after qualifying, he's better watch out because he's going to be elevated to a gold if he's not careful. His uh, actually, performance has been actually, that great. Actually, I remember exactly what you said because it made me laugh out loud. He says, that gets you in instant gold territory. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, <laughs> such was his performance in qualifying, but there you're only comparing bronze for bronze. Yeah. Uh, as in the GTM category, you need to qualify in the, hy in, in the hyperpole, your bronze drivers. And uh, yeah, unfortunately for them at the time, the, uh, the car we're looking at, 85, the Iron Dame, they weren't in Hyperpole. Uh, so, yeah, Sarah Bovey still at the wheel, like you say, Jim. And uh, so that's the bronze driver in, uh, in the Iron Dame. So uh, Ben has done his time. You know, it goes without saying, of course, the, uh, the pro drivers, the, the platinums, the golds, mm -hmm. they do have a natural speed advantage sure. still over, yeah. over Ben Keating. Um, you know, I only joke when I say he's uh, gold status. He's not. You know, he's he's just a fine bronze driver, and uh, he really has made the difference though today. He's not single-handedly, of course, but he's clawed back and got that car from barely even being on the on the timing page. I mean, it's bottom of the second timing page. I think it's about fighting your individual battles. So you know, it's when uh -huh. he's against the other bronzes.
can he win that battle against the other bronzes? Yeah, that's and, and, and he can. And, and, and I think it's the same with the golds against the other yeah. golds or the silvers against the silvers. Let's check in with the pit lane and uh, Louise Beckett. Well, unfortunately, it's not looking good for Peugeot at this hour. Uh, the 94 is in the garage. I think you've seen that. The team are working hard on that. But they've just cleared. That's the steering rack, apparently. And they've just cleared the 93 garage area. It looks like that one is coming in as well. I can't speak to the team at the moment. But when I get any more info, I'll let you know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting, wouldn't it, to find out how long that steering rack change would be. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it can be done in, in, a, in a blink of an eye no. at all. It sounds like pretty hefty work to me. But, uh, and, and it, you know, with that, are they even considering changing the steering rack? Having said that, Mikhail Jensen has just set his fastest sector one in the Persia. So more vibration issues being reported for the Toyota. This time it's Brendan Hartley. He definitely wants to get off those 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 boots at this point. Well, that's the thing, you know. The, the, even if you don't suffer any lockups and flat spots, you can easily end up getting your tires out of balance, just the way they naturally wear. And uh, so the longer you take them in, you know, three stints, maybe even four stints. It's pretty natural to get some vibrations, particularly through the fronts, because that you feel that through the steering, um, rather than the, the seat, seat of your pants with the with the rear tires. Uh, you feel the the rear tires vibration, uh, the vibrations a lot less than, than the front tires. Yes. I was I was gonna say uh, b before the camera switched to something else that one of the things also about Ben Keating, and we just saw it right there, and that's what made me remember it is his enthusiasm is infectious. So even if the team is down, had some trouble, I'm sure he's the kind of guy that, okay, boys, we can do this, and then goes out and throws down some really fast laps, like, see, we're, we're all in this. Follow me. He's got that I'll American the gates can of do hell, attitude. my brothers, and not <laughs> abandon you. <laughs> yeah, that American can do attitude. It, you know, yeah. it is infectious. You're absolutely right. And, uh, and that's what you need within a car crew. Mm. You and need somebody, you know, to, it's that relationship. You need to, when you're down, you need someone else sometimes to pick you back up. And, and every team member has their, has their chance to, to, to do that. And uh, that's part of the joy of, uh, of Le Mans and, uh, and sports car racing in general. It's not a, it's not a selfish game. It's not, you're not out there alone. As, as we see now, the yeah, 93 getting pushed back in. As Louise predicted, that car going back into the garage while the steering rack they, work continues. Now, some teams will tell you that a steering rack could take as much as three hours. So, so they did this earlier on. They took the bodywork off, and then they were blowing cool air. So it's almost like it was getting too hot, so they're trying to cool it down. Um, when the car's stationary at the end of pit lane, I've heard it myself, where it makes this incredible high-pitch noise. It's almost like radio interference or something. And I asked, uh, I asked one of the drivers, uh, what, what's that, that noise about? What, what's, is it like a, there's a motor whirring or something inside? Is it something to do with a, a, the hybrid system or what is it? And they said, no, it's, it's to do with the power steering. Wow. And that was, that was a long time. I mean, that was last year. At, at, yeah, at, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Monza oh, yeah. last year I, I noticed it. Whether it still does that or not, I, I'm, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I just thought, at the, at the time I thought that sounded odd. see the suspension and the uh, brakes working on that Corvette. And also the aerodynamic effect yeah. as well. From yeah. all the rain that we've had and the dirt yeah. that gets spread over the bodywork. Very cool. Model makers take hours trying to perfect that, that patina when, they, when they're going to make a car that has uh, got the dirt on it. Yeah. I'm sure, and that's that's one of the cool things about Le Mans is that afterwards, if you the winning car, it's a tradition mm -hmm. to just leave the dirt, the the all the flies. all the damaged bodywork, flies, everything, yeah. yeah. The battle scars. Yeah, and, and I think Audi even lacquered the car over once. Yeah, one I year, heard that. So that. Yeah. What did they do to your one guy? Oh, there's a story behind that. In your garage, is it? No, there's a story behind that. They actually wanted to keep it. Um, as you said, with all the battle scars on, and it went to a show, um, and somebody cleaned it. You're joking. It went to a car show, and, and they somebody <coughs> cleaned the car. 
Oh, we can't have because it looking it like dirty. this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and you can't, you can't. It's not like something you can fake and just let's just throw some flies and some some dust on it, make it look dirty again. Oh it, dear. So it's 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 still got the, a few battle scars, but it's uh, hasn't quite got the, the full wall paint on it. Here comes that driver change for the Iron Dames. It'll be Michelle Gatting getting in, Sarah Bove getting out. So yeah, like you said earlier on, Guy, it's so driver, the driver becomes driver helper in GTs. Yep. And uh, you could see the uh, the shoulder straps going on into place and buckled in. And then they, they also do the radio as well. They, I've seen on the outside edge of the seat, like where the, the headrest is. Quite, quite often, yeah, but you have the radio on actually into the seat because it's um, obviously it's accessible that way, yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, the, these girls have done fantastic again all day. They've been they've been fighting all through this 24 hours, but you just can't help but feel that the, the, the sort of balance has swung now towards the Corvette. It, it's worked its way up to the front, and it, it seems to have been the the it, quicker car. It's going to take some beating now. Yeah, oh, yeah. especially yeah. now that we've got, um, you know, the pros in the car. I think it's going to be, uh, between uh, Barone and Katzberg, very, very quick two drivers. I mean, there's getting pole position, and we've all said, oh, it doesn't really mean anything in, in the lawn anyway. Uh, it's just a little bit of showboating. But uh, when you see the margin that Ben Keating took oh. pole by, well over a second, you think, OK, if they can have a reliable car, surely when he's in the car, like you said, Guy, it's, when it's bronze for bronze, yeah, that he's, he's got the advantage. He's got a massive advantage. Yeah. I think that's what he's had around here. Usually, they're fairly evenly matched. We've seen that with uh, Sara Bovi all year long, actually, in, in qualifying in, in the World Endurance Championship, the first three rounds we've had. There, it's always comes down to those, pretty much down to those two in quality, and it's separated by the few tents and, and the race. You know, they, in WEC, they have to start the race as well, the Hans drivers. So, uh, and it's always a bit of a showdown between those two. Um, but not here. It, it seems like Ben's just had the advantage the whole time. And the other thing that was interesting about Hyperpole was that he had the, the pole sewn up and went back out and just, you know, hold my beer. I can beat that. And, and basically did. I mean, not just beat, thrashed. Yes. Yeah. 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 Annihilated his own lap time. So, yeah, look, the car is clearly hooked up. But uh, bad luck certainly struck them at the start of this race. But my goodness, since then, they have more than taken the fight to the rest of the field and now head them with, uh, what have they got? Uh, about a minute yeah. lead. Yeah. yeah, 13 seconds. Wow. Yeah, into Europol again, doing a great job. 21 seconds ahead of the uh, WRT car. So, uh, yeah, just maintaining that lead. As you say, that's kind of how, that's pretty much level out. That's pretty much staying constant. So is the 17 second margin between Collado and Hartley out in front. That, for, since we've been talking about the GTs and other categories and Peugeot's problems, it was 17 seconds, it still is. It's kind of it's kind of like half a second a lap, just just chipping away, just adding a little bit each time, just that little bit quicker and gradually building that lead up. So I think um, Hartley will be keen to uh, get these tyres off and get some new tyres on and see what pace he's got and go about trying to uh, close that gap down to uh, Collado. How does uh, Ferrari answer at this point if they do start to show some speed with those new tyres? Do they? Do they just stick to their uh, tire strategy? I think at this stage they've got to stick to the, 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 the plan. Um, uh, it really depends if, if uh, Hartley comes back with with some real pace and it's a concern and the speed in which is catching, then they will have to go with tires or be a bit more aggressive. But I can't help but think that they've still got that advantage. Um, even with with the older tires, they seem to still seem to have the pace. So, yeah. um, it does it. So at the start of the race, you know, obviously not as much rubber down as there is now. Uh, slightly different wind condition. Cars in a bit of a different state. They've taken a, a bit of a beating, yeah. all of them out there. But uh, the Toyota more than held its own at the start of the race when we were in the hottest conditions. We're now back into the hottest conditions at uh, quarter past or 20 past one in the afternoon here. So hotter conditions. The sun's actually out. It's probably warmer now than it was at the start of the race, actually. And I feel like that's where the Toyota's at its best. 
Yeah. Um, now they're on the medium tyres, and yeah, I, you would naturally expect the Ferrari on fresher tyres to be edging yeah. away. Is, is, More there, is there any advantage, and I, and I certainly wouldn't expect them to do this with two hours and 40 minutes to go, but on the last stint, if they're close, you know, if they're if they're almost the single digits, maybe they're they're only 11 seconds back or, or something like that. Is it worth throwing a set of softs on and trying to uh, get it, or is it is it a misnomer that the softs are going to get you more speed, even if they don't last as long? So the softs, I mean, it's more complex than that. The softs yeah. are, it's not necessarily just soft, medium, and hard in terms of compound. It's, uh, there's, there's heat element yeah. to it as well. So you can have a soft, higher temperature tyre or a soft, lower temperature tyre. We've got a team radio here from Harley first. Copy. Okay, Brendan, box this lap, pit confirm, box this lap, pit confirm. Vibrations are not a concern from the number side. So the team they can see. Hands, though. Yeah, exactly. So he, look, the driver has to relay the information. Obviously, he's concerned sure. that it might be damaging the car. So right, the driver course, can yeah. take a, you know, quite a bit yeah, of yeah. vibration through the body and the hands, whatever. But he's more concerned for the car. And yeah, there's still right. two hours forty minutes. Yeah. Why is this doing? It? Yeah. I don't want this thing to shake itself to bits. So I relay the information. You look where you need to on the data. They have the load cells through the suspension, and they can see and report back to the driver. Don't worry. It looks good. We can take a certain amount of frequency, and it's well within that at the moment. Gotcha. So chill out. It's cool, just carry on driving as fast as you can. But we'll, if it's hindering lap times, we'll bring you in, we'll get you on another set you know, when, it, when the time comes, which I think we can't see the energy levels uh, at the moment, but uh, I assume they're getting to a point where... Yeah, he told me to box this lap. Yeah, so, this lap. So, so they'll, yeah. they'll change the tyres, and I suspect they'll keep him in the car. That's the, that seems to be the plan. But I didn't know whether it was because of the energy level, like the fuel low, the fuel level at the point, or because of the vibration. Uh, yeah. I, that's the thing I I, yeah, I, I, I need to I'm confirm. So I assume it's the energy levels. Um, so yeah, he'll get on a, on a different set and he'll he'll be he'll be fine. But um, so oh, yeah, were, here he is. Uh, it's, uh, Louise confirms from the pits that it's mediums uh, that will be going on the number eight car as uh, Hartley comes in. We saw the three car come in and make their pit stop. No driver change there. So Brendan Hartley will stay in. The fuel goes in. Going to take a, a tear off off the uh, windscreen. Saw them uh, reaching up there. You can see just above the wheel well, those little white tabs just going off the top of your screen there. That's where they reach around and pull off one of the tear offs. 12 per windscreen. And the windscreens come to the track where those are already applied. So the tear-off uh, request has been answered. He wanted a towel and some water. Ah, energy gel. He took some energy gel as well. Yeah, well, that's that stuff's. It, well, that it, stuff's mag that's that better living. Well, chemistry. I, I, mean, I had a story about AJ, AJ Foyt, the Daytona 24 Hours, and he came in. He asked for a, a burger and a, and a coke, and he came in and he literally had a swig of coke. Went, left the pit lane with yeah. a burger in his hand, and apparently when he came at the end of his, his stint, it's like mustard all down his yeah. white overalls. Yeah. Some ketchup. <laughs> you think he's kidding? No, that's I, did, yeah. no I don't think that's I could. I mean, yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. Hey, I'm McDonald's. surprised if it had a wrapper, if the last thing that didn't come out of the car before the door went down was the wrapper. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Very different. I mean, that's the only thing missing from that uh, NASCAR car entry. Okay, Brendan, new set of mediums, new set of mediums on the car. Go get him. That's the message you want. Him. Yeah, exactly. A minute and 41 seconds down at this point. But obviously, the, that will change drastically when the 51 car, James Collado, has to come in for his pit stop. So this is the this is the that classic racing, the the, the in lap, the out lap. You know, this is this that, is tough. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is tough. Especially this time of, of the race. Absolutely, you know, 22, yeah. 21 and a half hours in. Yeah, it's hot out there. You're sweating. You feel it running down your face inside the helmet. You, you're so tired. You're drained. You're nothing left. But somewhere within you, you have to dig even deeper in these moments to try and find that lap time that you know the car can do. But it, it, probably the only better radio transmission you're going to get from your engineer is, is that you're the winner than go get him. 
in this day and age of, oh, we need to save fuel or we need to conserve this or don't do that and easy on this. No, go get them. It's a head game. Yeah. You know, you've got yeah. two cars very evenly matched in performance, very evenly matched, and you've got two drivers very evenly it's, It comes down to a head game. Box this lap, box this lap, driver change. Uh, driver ch so driver change, Collado will come out. Interesting, uh, two American voices as lead engineers on, on these cars. Yeah, he's uh, he's been a bit of a revelation this year to us uh, in the World Endurance yeah. Championship. Justin Taylor, the uh, yeah car 51's engineer, he's come out with some quality quotes. Is he former Audi? Was he at Audi? I think before. I believe he, yes, was. he was. Then yeah. he was doing IndyCar yes. as well. I think. Yeah, yeah, yep. And he was uh, he he was kind of an understudy to. Um, oh, I'm embarrassed. Here's some more radio. Radio, drinks tube, radio. A slice of pizza. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I mean, it, you, you get reminded, obviously, when you come down the pit lane to detach the radio uh, and uh, remember your belts as well, because uh, when your car stops, you need to loosen them before you unbuckle so that the next driver getting in isn't compromised with the seatbelt still in the, the tight position because the driver helper won't be able to buckle them in. So, uh, yeah, all those things can really uh, hold you back. And you see there, Pierre Guidi, uh, sorry, uh, Giovinazzi in, and he's pulling down on the shoulder straps, right. and getting himself comfortable, making sure they're on the hands device in the right way. Yep. You don't want them slipping mm -hmm. underneath the hands device or twisting in any way. Um, you don't want anything to, to compromise your uh, your focus. And with the Ferrari bit at the, the beginning of the pit lane, it gives you the option to be able to tighten your belts while you go down the pit lane. You can tighten them up. Brendan reporting that the car feels much better with these tires, so maybe he flat spotted them or, or something like that. Uh, the, the name I was trying to get, uh, guy helped me get, Brad Kettler. That's he, it. Was, he was an understudy of Brad Kettler at Audi. Yep. Champion racing. Yes, back right. In the day. Yep. So yeah, you asked me earlier on, Jim, about you know, why wouldn't you put the set of soft tires? So Brendan is obviously he's on the mediums, uh, as is uh, Giovinazzi, and uh, the reason for that is it's a high-speed circuit. I mean, there's only one or two uh, relatively slow point. corners. Good point. Uh, Arnage and Molsan. So on a high-speed circuit, you get a lot of uh, movement within the shoulder of the tire. The softer tire, in its construction by nature, flexes around a lot more and it spooks the driver. It's it, part it, of what makes it softer. Exactly. That, yeah. it, it's just basically more squidgy. So that's why they put it on in the, the wet, damp conditions. It's your best chance of survival in those, in those lower temperatures because gotcha. you, then you need the pliable nature of to the tire to be there. Yeah. And, and it heats traction. itself up. A bit yeah. like a squash ball. You, know, you yeah, whack yeah. it against the wall and it heats up. Physically, it heats up through the kinetic energy. And that's what the tires are doing. Um, but the hotter it gets ambient and track, and the faster you can go and the less moisture on the track there is, right. you can then afford to start running a stiffer construction tire, okay. the, i.e. the medium right. or a stiffer, a stiffer compound. And effectively, that gives you more of a platform. So when you're in the corner, in the Porsche corners, the tire is a little bit stiffer, the shoulder of the tire is a little bit more solid. Sure. So you can feel effectively, it's almost like feeling the grip because when the tire is moving, it, that's when the car feels like it's squirming around and it doesn't feel like it's taking a set. It, it, it makes your contact patch bigger, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. yeah. Does. So but, but after, the, after the exchange of pit stops, it's now 16 seconds. So Brendan Hartley's outlaps and his uh, time on those new tires. Let's see how Giovinazzi can respond as he can, is about halfway through his outlap. I can't, Jim. Let's dramatize this a bit. It's 15.8 seconds. Come on, let's get into the driver's heads here. 50, no, forget it. Let's just call it 15 seconds. <laughs> Brendan, yeah, you're 15 I, I seconds to, behind. I used to tell our announcers <laughs> in the United States when somebody says, well, that's, a, you know, they pretty much got this in the bag. It'd be like, well, that loud click you heard was everybody turning off to go to watch something else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not in this case. Nobody will be going anywhere. This is going to be right down two and a half hours remaining in the centenary celebration of Le Mans, the 91st running, the 100th anniversary. 1923 was the first time that they got together to try and prove the automobile and 
prove that the innovations and that the technology was safe and that the car was car automobile was going to be reliable. Well, we're doing the same thing today. It's all about innovation. A hundred years later, the first fully subscribed year for the hypercar here at Lassard, and they have delivered. They have delivered. The uh, front of the field uh, boasts Ferrari, Toyota, two Cadillacs, a Porsche, two Glickenhauses, a Ferrari, and a Peugeot, all in the top nine. So. Uh, absolutely stellar first first time out here at Le Mans for a full hypercar field. Not the, not the first time for hypercars, but uh, to clarify it, full time for the hypercar field. Yeah, literally all of the major manufacturers, Ferrari, Toyota, Cadillac, Porsche, uh, Peugeot, have all had a, a, a chance to lead this race. Mm -hmm. That's something I didn't think we would see, honestly speaking, yeah, this, yeah. in this event. Uh, the centenary, I didn't think, based on what we've seen so far in the World Endurance Championship, you, you wouldn't have put money on the fact of that happening. So I, mean, I, I joked earlier on when I said that the first two hours of the race, I thought, I can't, I don't think I can keep up doing this for 24 hours. Like, it was like a sprint race. I was changing positions all the, all the way through. 33 car out of the lead of GTM, driver change, Nicholas Veroni out. Nicky Katzberg in. And they show you how it's done, don't they? Yeah. The Corvette garage crew, they really show you how it's done. This year, it's a combination of not only the Pratt and Miller guys, but some of the Labra competition guys, who for many years were, were kind of the, the European answer to Pratt and Miller in the United States with the Corvette when it was the, the C6 models. Uh, but the C8 here is the C8R is uh, being run by a combination this year. So Romain Dumas in the Glickenhaus has just done a 329.5. So it's a pretty impressive lap time. You know, not not a million miles away from from the uh, the rest of the hypercar. So you know, well done to those guys. And that guy doesn't give up. I don't care if he's racing here in the Glickenhaus or he's in a Galaxy 300 at Goodwood Revival. He does not give up. And there you see. Handshakes all around for uh, Nicholas Moroni. That's a great feeling, you know, yeah. you get out of the car and the whole crew is high-fiving you. I suspect he's done. Well, yeah, done, yeah. but yeah. also, you know, that is job well done. Yes. And, um, you know, it, there's no better feeling than that. And, you know, it, it's, that's, it's, that marks the difference, really, for me with, and, and highlights exactly what sports car racing is all about that real family feeling within the team and you can share that emotion with your other teammates as well and success is is trebled in that way yeah and it all as we said before it goes back to the attitude of the of the team leader but not only that that is the you know you used to see the same thing when it was uh, the full factory effort you know, with Dan Binks and, 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 and the guys in, in the Corvette squad, that was the kind of reception that the drivers would get after a job well done. There's our, our LMP2 leader, the Inter-Europol uh, competition entry, number 34. Albert Costa behind the wheel of that car. They have uh, had a running uh, race with the team WRT. Robert Kupitsa, number 41, for gosh, at least the last uh, eight hours or so, there have been others that have tried to come up and challenge. Uh, uh, Paul Jutan now is in third place in the number 48 car for the uh, EDEC Sport. And the other team that's been been right there in the hunt for the podium has been Neil Yanni and the Duquesne team, number 30. But everybody's been chasing 34 and 41 for, for the last little bit. And it continues on with just under two and a half hours remaining. I wonder if they'll ever change their car back to that luminous yellow and green concept that they had the whole time. Like, more like their, their garage hoardings, actually. Yes, yeah. That's the color that well, they that, have well, been running. But that's the color of the other car. Remember, they started two cars in this race. Yeah, uh, but usually the solid colored car the, the white is, car. is yeah. the luminous yellow. <laughs> and uh, I always felt like it really clashed. And I do prefer this. Tell you what, if they win this thing, they're never going back on those <laughs> colors. <laughs> that's the difference right there, surely. I think the only people in, in the sports world who are more superstitious than race car people are uh, NHL hockey, hockey. Really? Players. Oh yeah. 
you make the playoffs, you're not allowed to shave until you get until you get knocked out of the playoffs. So all these guys look like lumberjacks by by the end of the playoffs. And so they're gonna wear the same set of socks until they they fall apart. I mean, it's it's yeah. insane. The car's going to grow a beard, and they're never going to uh, change back from that uh, golden golden yellow color. Still two hours, 25 minutes to go, though. And there is the, uh, the competition, the number 41 WRT. Behind his sister car, actually, 31, that is in where? There's in... What is it? Fifth. Fifth, so yeah. Not that far off the hunt. Wow. Robin Freunds. There's the, uh, the Jota squad. They had such high hopes. At one point, they were leading overall and they were leading LMP2 and what an accomplishment that would have been but it's going to be an accomplishment just to get these two cars to the finish line as they have the, those crew guys they're going to they're going to deserve their uh, their post race adult beverages after this one because they sure have earned it yeah. and at the front the Ferrari uh, and the Toyota the gap now is 15 seconds it's pretty much kind of been 15 seconds for well, since they did the pit stops, it's maybe gone down to sort of 13, 14, and back to 15. So Hart is not really making any inroads into Giovinazzi's lead at the minute. Doesn't seem to be. Uh, yeah, last lap, both of them 328. Yeah, high 28 for Brendan, and slightly lower 28 for Giovinazzi. And it's really, you're in the hands of the traffic. I, I feel that the two cars are so evenly matched on pace at this point in the race that. Uh, you can have, as we often said as drivers, you can have the golden stint, where every car you come up, you just Apart. overtake in a straight line. Yeah, <laughs> and you get the slipstream off them as well for good yeah, measure. Thank you, you. you come and you go, I, honestly, I had the golden stint. I always used to joke with uh, Buemi about it and he, him too. Uh, you won't believe it, man. I had the golden stint. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, you say it, Don't worry about the fast lap times. It, it was, it's not me, it was the traffic. Yeah, and then there's a yeah, stint right. where traffic just oh. appears from nowhere. Yeah. Just... Every time. Yeah. Every where do you guys come from? <laughs> They're in the way, yeah. That's what you pray for when you're inside the car. You're constantly thinking, OK, right, I've, I've overtaken another car here. That was a good one. Oh, I've overtaken the car. Mm, that's a semi-bad one there, but I wonder what the other car in front's <laughs> going through. Hopefully they're having it worse than I am. <laughs> like the battle at the front that has kind of settled out at 15 seconds. This battle here in LMP2 is settled out at 22 seconds. There you see the, uh, the Lodge liveried. It's amazing when you're in traffic, how you become a mind reader. Because you're always thinking, what are they thinking? Yeah. I, I always try to put yourself in the car ahead's position. And what are they thinking? What are they going to do? Because you're trying to second guess all the time. What, what are they going to do? And I'm going to do the opposite. And you're constantly hearing the gap. Uh, if you're yes. Giovinazzi, you're hearing Hartley behind 14.5 seconds, and, and Hartley will be hearing the, the, the opposite of that, yeah. and uh, how much further ahead the car is, and and you're just you're trying to assess, you know, okay, right, they've just I've caught the gap a little bit there, but I was a bit lucky in traffic, so maybe that's because they were a little bit more unlucky than me that time around. And then you hear the next lap, and the gap creeps up a little bit. You go, no, OK, it's, and my traffic wasn't so bad. That means that it, yeah, they're, they're, it was traffic the lap before for him. Oh, no, I'm not quite as fast compared to him as I thought I was. And you're constantly going through that thought process in the car. This is our third place car in LMP2. You may recognize the badge on the nose of that car, Delage, if you're a student of history here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. That is a nameplate that dates all the way back to the beginnings of the French motor industry and the early days of this great race in the, in the 20s and 30s. Here's your fourth place car in the class, the Team Duquesne car with Neil Yanni behind the wheel. Understand Neil is gonna be moving on from this ride to the uh, Proton Porsche, which is a uh, great opportunity for him to get back inside the, uh, get back in a Porsche. Uh, I'm sure he'll bring a lot of experience to that team. A lot of prototype experience. Yeah, an awful lot of prototype experience. And the, uh, the number 30 car there, as you say, Jim Decane. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Matthias 
Kayser has had a, a bit of a shortish stint in the uh, Vector Sport number 10. And it's now uh, Gabby Aubrey behind the wheel of that car. And he's in now, apparently, until the end of the race. I think with Neil Yarny, ex-Port Porsche factory driver, the links that he has with Porsche will help um, smooth the way with the Proton team and that kind of development well, yeah. path. I, I think I think they, uh, Proton themselves, as, as you all know, have great links to Porsche themselves. But what he, I think, will add to that is the prototype knowledge. And also, um, I saw that uh, Proton are going to be the, the first customer of the Ford GT3 for the Mustang. So, really? Yep. So they're going to be running the, the... So they could potentially have the, the Porsche in the hypercar and the Mustang in the GT3. GT3. Wow. Do you think we'll see a Ford hypercar if we're going to see a Ford GT3 car? Here comes the, the 93, 93 back out. Three back out. A much faster change than we, uh, than we feared. Yeah. Now, is that the one that had, that had the steering rack? Yeah, it, it is. Okay. So out they go. Great. Good team effort there by they, Peugeot. They both had enough problems. I'm starting to get them confused. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not what the team notes. were going for this, this race. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Sorry, I, did, Peugeot. I did fear, though, and uh, I'm sure the team felt the same, that they've been riddled with lots of different reliability problems so far this year. And, well since their comeback to sports car racing, frontline sports car racing. And uh, so, yeah, we, I didn't expect them to, to, to be quite as reliable in many ways as they've been, let alone the pace that they've had. So there is uh, Gabby Aubrey that I spoke about earlier on in the number yep. 10 Vector Sport, gets lapped by the number 50 Ferrari with uh, Nick Nielsen. He started this race with Nick. in the LMP2 category, of course, last year in the AF Corsa. And Sean, he had a, an early pole position, made a real name for himself, and uh, here he is now. Now, we just uh, a few minutes ago had a very interesting discussion that I thought was a great explanation from you, Anthony and, and Guy, about about the soft tire. And then we see the, the LMP2 car, the graphic came up and showed that they were, as we see, the... Uh, the Camaro, the number 24 car, having some work done. Uh, looks like uh, looks like that's almost exploratory. Like they're trying to figure out what might be going on, as opposed to trying to fix what they know is going on. I but, wonder why it dropped down the yeah. order now in uh, 39, because it sits in the pits getting lapped. Uh, a gearbox is what we're hearing, a gearbox issue. So that would be that makes that you know that's that's going to be stressed on that car. But my point, Apart, sorry, sorry, Jim, but while we're still on the on, yeah, on that yeah. car, just a question uh, for all the fans that don't follow NASCAR. How so? Obviously, the ovals you're not you're not really changing gear that much. But what about street? How long is a street course race for for those competitors? Um, normally, a couple hundred kilometers. Like an hour, an hour. Kind oh of? no, more than that. More now, yeah. two and a half hours. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like the length of a. A, a Grand Prix or something. A little, little bit longer. A little, little bit, longer. bit longer than a Grand Prix. But no way as long no, as it's just no, done. No, no, So it's quite a good proving ground yes. for it then to come here. At oh, yeah. And that, yeah. The, the oh, yeah. This, in, in 24 hours, this thing has probably lasted eight cup races. Right. So, you know. And how long would they usually keep the gearbox in? Do they have restrictions on that in the, no. in the series? No. no. Okay. It's just why whatever your maintenance plan is. Okay. I'm sure a new one comes at every event. But like you say, I mean, on an oval, depending on the on the oval, certainly on the super speedways, they're, they're very seldom shifting. But on yeah. the mile and a half, there's a lot of times you'll shift. Certainly on the short tracks, there's there's a little bit more shifting. But like you say, not not like it is here. So Brendan Hartley now has just done the fastest lap of the number eight on a 337, uh, sorry, 327.8. And the gap's now down to 11.8. Uh -huh. So Whoa. he's starting to to chip away now at that lead mm -hmm. and uh, make some inroads. We've got a race in our hands. Yeah, here we go. Two hours and 16 minutes to go. Just to put a, a finish what I, the, what I was trying to say, we saw the graphic come up of the LMP2 car with hard tires on. Now, what we need to point out is, is that they are not Michelins. 
they are Goodyear. So Goodyear comes at this from a completely different standpoint. It's a controlled tire. So they really just have kind of a soft and a hard. They don't have a they don't have that medium option. Yeah, exactly, Jim. So, you know, control tire, like you say, you can you can go out and buy those tires if you're a race yes, team. You, can. you buy them, you can keep them. Um, you know, the technology is still very high, but it's, uh, you know, there's no tire war in, uh, in LMP2. It's uh, you know, part of the reason. That gets it's expensive. It, yeah, exactly. It's to keep costs down. Um, you know, it is a, they have the monopoly there uh, as a tire manufacturer, you know, in many ways for good reason, because it, it, it's, a, it's a privateer category. It should be a privateer category with amateur drivers paying their way to go racing. And uh, so it makes a lot of sense. You just have the one slick tire, the one wet tire, and uh, they, they brand it as a, as a hard tire. It's you know, nice. a nice bit of marketing as well. And sure. yeah, it's, it's, it's great for them um, that they have LMP2 as, as their category. And uh, it's great to have Goodyear involved, of course, for, for the World Endurance Championship. But the tires that you see on this car, yeah. number eight, the Michelins, you can't go and buy those no. tires. <laughs> they are. There's a lot of tech in there. And, uh, you know, and, and if one comes apart, the engineers are out there looking for the pieces oh, yeah. afterwards. Well, these things, collecting. They're, they're actually called. not going to go missing. Technically, yeah. they're a confidential tire. So yes, they, you know, they actually, the, the teams have to sign a contract yes. to basically say that they will not. Almost every like tire an NDA. Yeah, the tire has to be returned because they've got all their tech and their IP in that tire. Oh, yeah. And the last thing they want is that to go to another manufacturer. It's, so it's Proprietary information. Now, here we go. Uh, we talked earlier. Uh, I asked kind of, you know, just maybe it was a silly question. I don't know if, uh, how much it bothers you when the, when the car that's a couple laps down is behind you harassing you. Well, now the tables are turned. The 50 car is now ahead of the 8 car. The 8 car is catching the 50 car. How wide is this Ferrari suddenly going to become? Probably about as wide as the... Um the circuit <laughs> as wide as as wide as the uh, the blue flags will allow uh -huh. Jim, that's, uh, <laughs> i mean you gotta you gotta be careful uh, but uh yeah you, you can make life a little bit difficult yeah, just tell the next driver be careful if you put too much brake pressure in four feet you lock the brake you just have to be careful about the ventilation otherwise you lock the rear brake if you push the pedal too hard Great information. Great information. So, uh, Brendan referring to turn 14. Yeah. Uh, I believe, unless they've changed things since I was there, turn 14 for them, unlike our turn 20, <laughs> is the most end corner. Okay. Yeah. It, where he had the rear locking. Right. So yeah. it makes sense to me. So that that's you know every team every team I've ever driven for has their own uh, oh, uh, references oh. for which corner numbers or names they give around here. So, uh, yeah, we, we go by the, uh, the ACO and FIA's uh, version of the track. So for us, it's turn 20. But that's very interesting to me as a, as a layman that, you know, tell the next driver, be careful of brake modulation. And that's, that's, the, that's the kind of things you might talk about. Uh, those are the things you might talk about. Uh, on an old driver exchange, well, but it, now it it's might be, got to be done over the radio. It might be that, you know, we've seen before that under braking, the car's maybe stepped out as he braked into Molson Corner, and he's just basically warning the next guy that this might catch you out. The last thing he wants to do is not warn him, and uh, the next driver has an issue. Let's hear from uh, Nick Nielsen. Oh, that Toyota is coming behind. We'd like to stay in front. And they will ask for blue flag soon, so let's push as much as you can for those last uh, three laps. And we stay in front of that Toyota. Let's give it all. So there's your answer. Yeah, I mean, stay in front, but within reason. Within the allowance of what the blue flags... Yeah. Which is and much different. Stay in front is a much different command than don't let him buy. Exactly, and, uh, you know, there, there's no... It's not like a single-seater racing where you've right. got huge wings uh, that get affected from even this far back, believe right. it or not. Uh, you can get a lot more, a lot closer than that uh, as this now switches to the car 51 with Giovinazzi, not to be confused with the uh, number 50 car that's further down the road. 11 seconds down the road. Nicholas Nielsen behind the wheel of the 50. 
So out on the racetrack right now, we've got Antonio Giovinazzi leading in the 51. Brendan Hartley trying to chase him down 11 seconds back. And then in the Cadillacs, uh, uh, Richard Westbrook is in the two car. Ranger Van de Zanda is in the, the three car. That's one of my favorite names. That, Christoph Bouchou and Ranger Van de Zanda. Doesn't, doesn't get much better than that. Frank Makovicki is uh, in the number five car. Romain Dumas is in the 708. 709 is Nathaniel Breton. And Mikael Jensen is in the number 93 Peugeot. And when he said about the, the maps, the circuit maps, um, quite often, well, most of the time, actually, the team will print out a little map and they'll put it inside the car, whether it be on yeah. the steering wheel. Or, and then whenever I've had it where people have sat in the car, they've, they've seen this little map of the circuit, say Le Mans, for argument's sake. And then we said, why have you got a map? Do you, do you not know where you're going? Do you know where, where the circuit goes? Yeah. And basically, it, it's for that very reason, because when you're discussing the... the the, the, the circuit to the engineers, they may, is, is to make sure that we're all calling the corners the same. So if they say it's turn 10, I look on the map and I know what, sure, where yep, they make. Or right. if I've got an issue and the car stopped, they know where, we're we all on the, talking from the same uh, page. Yes, it's more so for, you know, when you're in the garage and you're doing the debriefs between free practice session or during a free practice session when you're back in the garage. Yeah, you can even point if you need to. Yeah, yeah, and the engineer's got the, you know, got the circuit map usually just plastered on their laptop somewhere. And uh, so, yeah, you, you're, uh, you're referring to the same corners. But, yeah, the reason you have it in the car for the race is, like, say, Guy, if you've had a mechanical failure, like we saw with uh, Kobayashi, due to that, it's still... I can't believe he's out of the race from what happened. For those of you that missed it, in yeah. the, uh, the dead of the night, uh, there was a slow zone, a next slow zone on the run-up towards Tete Rouge, and uh, he was about to overtake a slow-moving AM driver in the, uh, in the LMP2 car. So it's after this sequence of corners here, the S's on the straight towards uh, Tete Rouge. Kobayashi goes to overtake the LMP2, realizes he's, a, he's in a next slow. At this point here, slams on the brakes. Two racy LMP2 cars come up behind him, one of them Guido van der Garda in the 39 car. And there was an unfortunate GT Ferrari that was in there, number 66. He got completely he smashed into the back through. from he van der Garda. Yeah. Sent the car flying. The Ferrari, as a result, smashed into Kobayashi. Then the Alpine on the right-hand side smashed into Kobayashi as well. Car out of the race. Yeah. It wasn't Camus. He did exactly yeah. what he, he was played supposed by to the do. Exactly what he was supposed to do. And Set as you can map. see, there's the map. <laughs> so when Kobayashi did pull over, he would have been looking at the map, yep. and uh, the team would have had their map, and they would have been saying, hey, if you can get to such and such corner or such and such barrier near such and such, then you can get into a recovery yeah. position, try this with the car, try that with the car, but the car just didn't respond. It was uh, the red lights came on, the telltale sign that uh, there was a serious hybrid issue and had to be taken away on the on the low loader and dropped off in Area 51, as they call it. There's the United 23 of Tom Bonquist working his way back up the field after uh, some problems earlier on in the race, but doing a great job. Let's check in on the uh, other United car with Stephanie down in the pits. Well, I'm in the garage with that 22 car at the minute. Um, it was in the garage a little bit earlier on for uh, some quite a bit of damage repaired. In fact, it's getting a new front wing right now. Let me just move out of the way. Uh, but that car went out for one lap and has come back in. So clearly whatever fixes they have done have not worked sufficiently. Driver in the car shaking his head. Don't know how long this is going to be. Well, any time at this point is going to be uh, disappointing for those guys. Philippe Albuquerque was the one who was behind the wheel and he brought the car in. There is the Alpine number uh, 36. You said uh, uh, Goodyear's going to go on that car. Phil Hansen, Frederick Lubin, and Philippe Albuquerque sharing that number 22 car. Looks like uh, they may be ready to come back out. Indeed, they are. Uh, wheel the car out, drop it down off the dollies, fire her up, put some new Goodyear rubber on that car, and send it on its way. 
Let's go down to uh, Stephanie. Uh, just on that, it seems that they've changed the front wing back to the one that they came in to replace. There is a little bit of superficial damage at the front of it, uh, but it doesn't look too structurally uh, unstable. So they've put that wing back on after going out and doing one lap on the replaced wing. So it looks like Brendan Hartley now is uh, closing in even further. He's got to try and get by the 50. He hasn't gotten by him yet. He's apparently reportedly on the radio asking for the blue flags. Yeah, but he is. Uh, I'd like to see another shot. Uh, can't wait to see that when it comes. But uh, yes, clearly he's uh, catching up now. He's just dipped inside the 10 second bracket, 9.996 seconds behind 9.871 is just changed <laughs> and his fastest coming lap coming down and he's yeah he's properly got the bit between it he needs this little bit of uh, aggro i feel yes. it's like something yeah, to wake yeah, him yeah. up and although you know he's doing a brilliant job anyway but this is the fire that he needs to uh, fuel him on in his bid to try and catch Giovinazzi. and that's only two tenths of a second off the fastest lap of the race by the ferrari of nielsen so you know, they're finding some pace in the late stages here. They're really kind of, uh, as you say, got the bit between the teeth and the fight is on. Definitely seems so. Uh, I wonder which drivers they have left uh, to cycle through. I think it's going to be Rio Hirakawa in the car next, but uh, you never know if, if the team feel like Seb is the one to uh, bring it home and take this fight to Ferrari, then then uh, you can always adjust your plans. You I think do whatever it takes, basically. I think this is Hartley's fourth stint now in the car, I believe, so he's doing a great job. Yes, it is. Remember, they came on and asked him if he could uh, physically do it, and he says, I sure can. Now he is, and here we go. Yeah, you, need, you start needing blue flags now at this moment. Yeah. Where he was before, uh, he wasn't getting affected by the dirtier, but you are now. So I think for a fair fight, I think the stewards have to do the right thing. The race yeah. director. Yeah, he is to, close enough now. He has to back out of it. I suspect the 50 car should be in either this lap or the next lap. Um, he could have a little slow lap, a slow, slow ride through the Porsche curves. Yeah, you, you just want to see a fair fight, and uh, you know that it's not his race. It's um... here we go. Actually, Let's hear what Brendan thinks about this situation. Yeah, copy. The car ahead will box this lap normally. The car ahead will box this lap even if he doesn't get out of the way. Well, there you go. And I don't think it's gonna uh, as they go around the number 33 car with uh, Nikki Katzberg behind the wheel. Imagine the penalties that would be coming, oh. uh, be coming car 50s at Nick Nielsen's way in uh, yeah. Formula One. Right, <laughs> imagine doing oh, yeah, this yeah, in yeah. an F1 race oh, with yeah. a lapsed car and the blue flags. It's yeah. one thing in, uh, in, in WEC that would often frustrate me as a driver and be like, oh, you know, the blue flag's there. The blue flag means get out of the way of the, of the lapping car. Well, but, uh, but I, I also think, and this is just my personal opinion i think some of the blue flag stuff in formula one while it's necessary for some of the cars i think some of it's a little over you know why should you have to roll over and play dead you know especially if you're in a battle with somebody else now, you know i mean this is a classic case he's not in a battle with anybody else it's, oh, no, but if, if you're, you're in a battle with somebody else why I should you have to roll over and play dead because lewis is coming but no, they, they, yeah. Oh, you mean if you if you're a battling car with somebody else? Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. The problem is the problem is, Jim, is that it's it's all to do with the aerodynamics. Oh, well, I understand. It's just all to do with it, and, yeah. and just because you can't see the effect you, oh, yeah. from the outside doesn't mean that it's not there. It is this invisible barrier, and it's you know you you start hemorrhaging downforce when you get even you know within three seconds of the car in front. Uh, you, you can't believe how it feels. So uh, I think that's why you know they are there. The you engineers get involved and they're overly vocal and you yeah, know, they're oh, trying sure. to yeah, make yeah. a point about it. But yeah, yeah there's there's a time and place definitely. But most of the time, I think I stand by it. I think that it's you know you want it to be as pure as possible and, and as fair as possible. You and I need to have a bottle of wine sometime and, and get into some. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. 
but I, 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 think, I think it's a little too nuanced. Entertainment-wise, yeah. yeah, you know, let them fight. Well, and I don't but. even think it's entertainment-wise. I think it's more, uh, again, if you're if you're battling for that last uh, points-paying position, that's that's important to you. Um, Absolutely, it's, as, it's as a team skill. monetarily and, and everything else. It's but part of the that's skill not what we're here way. to talk about. Formula One. We're here to talk about the the. Uh, race at hand, which is Brendan Hartley now less than 10 seconds You're behind both. our race leader and in, in the American vernacular of what we call stick and ball sports uh, which is anything but car racing when you can get that, if you're trying to come from behind if you can get the, uh, the, the number of points you're behind into single digits, it's, it's very much yeah, it's it's very much uh, a mind game, and it encourages. There you go. And there there, he is. Yeah, how far out is he? I can't see him. Well, now he can see him. How do you keep the red mist from coming in when you can see him? Yeah, is it red car or is it red mist? <laughs> and the two front cars in the, in the 27s, they are really the pace is really hot, the, almost matching the fastest laps of the of the race. Oh yeah, Joe Bonazzi, Joe Bonazzi is not hanging around. No, he, he's not. He's not lifted off, trying to save fuel, trying to save tires, trying to save the car. He's he is uh, doing his best. We are now under two hours, under two hours to the end of this race, and it is all to play for still, all to play for. Just nine seconds separating our leaders in the overall category the hypercar category in lmp2 27 seconds separates our leaders and we still have in gtm five cars all on the lead lap now the corvette has a substantial lead of a minute and 19 seconds but any sort of issue on the racetrack that lead will evaporate and that will open the door for the iron dames who are in second place and or the number 25 aston martin who is in third. So with two hours to go, there's a look at the full running order. There you see that uh, GTM battle down in 27th position. Looks it, like the um, Garage 56 car is back on track again. Yes, they, they've, gone, they've gone back out and some transmission issues. We've had uh, 20 cars retire from the race which is probably a little bit more than, than if I had been forced to pick a number before the race. I don't think I, I would have picked 20. Um, although with, with 62 entries, uh, th that's not, uh, doesn't seem to me to be an overly large number. Um, but I didn't think we'd see 20 retirements. Yeah, I'll There's Charles that. Leclerc. Charles, uh, hey, if you want to win this race, uh, I'm feeling pretty fresh right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. I'm kind of light I, I as well. I got my helmet and boots out in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty lean and light. Yeah, it's a bit of an advantage. Which, for those of you who don't know, the, the car has its weight within it in, uh, in, in uh, hypercar yep. at uh, 1,030 kilogram minimum weight. It can be higher than that with the uh, obviously with the BOP adjustments, but that's the minimum weight target for all the cars. So you can't be under that, but uh, the driver is just on top of whatever that weight is. Oh, really? Ah, so a guy like me would be out of luck. Unfortunately. <laughs> you get to the bar first though, so it all goes around and comes around. Okay, Brendan, box this lap, pick, confirm, box this lap, change driver to duo. Uh, All right. Oh, that's nice that you got uh, Seb there with Rio, helping him out, even getting ready, and uh, sure giving him every bit of advice that he can give him. I'm sure, Rio doesn't need it, but nice to see that uh, support that team sister, yeah. sister car as well. Brendan's found himself in a bit of traffic here. He's completely boxed in. Look, he's just waving goodbye to speed on the straight. It's the worst situation. You've got the GT there and the LMP2, and you're much faster. And that's where the hypercar really makes its speed up on this track in the straight line. So 
Yeah, loses a bit there. The gap grows to 10, back to 10 seconds now. Amazing stuff between these two. Lead quartet in LMP2 have all just come and gone through the pit lane as well. We're starting to get into the nitty gritty, aren't we? Where, as both of you guys will know, on the pit wall, they know exactly how much fuel they need in the car now and how much they're going to need to get to the end of the race. Two hours to go, two o'clock Central European time, 22 hours down, two hours to go. Hands up everybody who knows who's going to win this one. Yeah, us neither. Ferrari, Toyota, and just if something really screwy cap happens, maybe even Cadillac. I was going to come out with a really cheesy comment there and go, I know, I know, the fans. Yay! <laughs> they win. Yeah, well, 100%, <laughs> and also an awful lot more fans than may have watched it in the last few years because of the influx of manufacturers into the hypercar class, the influx of competition, and particularly, I mean, particularly and especially the car that leads the race now, the F word that we are allowed to say on air, Ferrari. That is going to bring eyes, has brought eyes, I'm sure, to Le Mans that have probably barely even heard of the race and have certainly never seen it. Brendan Hartley brings in the number eight Toyota after a valiant quad stint. Rico Hirokawa will take over the young Japanese driver who joined the team last season. And right now, this is Coke versus Pepsi. This is whoever blinks first loses this race. And right now, Toyota and Ferrari are trying desperately to think of a way of outfumbling the other guy to gain some kind of material advantage. Because we've heard from drivers in both cars, it's just hearing from James Collado after his last in, he said, there is nothing between us. They haven't got an advantage over us. We haven't got an advantage over them in the long run. Sometimes you're on fresher tires, sometimes you've got a fresher driver, but the cars are pegged exactly as the rules had hoped to produce. This is the beginning of platinum era of sports car racing, and it features the biggest name in motor racing. Antonio Giovinazzi, mo most consummate, no, <laughs> Ferrari, a Ferrari. But it does feature Antonio Giovinazzi, and, and what a time for this young driver to get into a top flight Ferrari program. Wow. Yeah, so uh, let's see how Ferrari play this one. And also, all eyes are on you, Rio Hirokawa. Now, if there's ever been a time to shine, this is your moment, boy. Well, to answer a question from somebody who said, I've just woken up after watching them on. The only question I want to know is, is Rexy still racing? Answer, yes, Rexy is still no, racing. Right on cue. Right, right on, on cue. cue, exactly, exactly. So the... Uh, that is the Project One AO Porsche, which has spent time in the lead. Trouble for the uh, IDEC car that started on pole position. Left rear puncture, that will be from debris probably rather than contact. And that car with Lawrence Hur at the wheel, a multiple winner here at Le Mans in LMP3 machinery in Road to Le Mans with the uh, DKR engineering team. That car will creep back. It is actually on an outlap as well, so that is double pain for them. Giovinazzi is just about to uh, come up on that car. And this is where you don't want a tyre to come off the car in front of the Ferrari. <laughs> it's also exactly the corner you were talking about earlier, Guy Smith. The corner you do not want to catch a car in the Porsche curves because you're going to have a big accident if you run out on the loose. Yeah, you can see how it really compromised his uh, entry to the Porsche curves of turn 19. Had to go wide, get a little bit onto the marbles. And you, you've seen, like we said before, Guy, you're reading the body language of the other car and you think, hang on a minute, that LMP2 car, they're usually much faster than that. It's moving around a lot. Yeah. Just give that an extra wide berth. Now then, inside the final two hours, these cars will need at least another two stops to make it to the finish. Toyota will stop earlier meaning they will need more fuel, meaning they will spend a fraction more time stationary than Ferrari. And it's on those tiny little twists of fate through the race that sometimes very close decisions get made. Leader in. Antonio was only into the car last time round. Seen a couple of times they've topped up the pressurized oil system in the car. 
There is some attention around the fuel rig. Just checking the tyre wells, getting rid of bits of build-up of tyre rubber in there. You don't want a, a big fist-sized piece shaking itself loose and attaching itself to your slick and then thumping its way round and round and round for lap after lap. Seems like an eternity when mm. you're sitting in the car, leaning the race and the fuel's going in. And that man in the fuel helmet could be really critical at the end because when they're going for a full tank, it's a full tank. When they're not, it's got to be to the tenth of a second. You don't want to put in a drop more than you absolutely have to because this is, this is going to probably be as close a top-class finish in the real world as we have seen. I mean, this could be down to metres. And in terms of Le Mans finishes, do we know what the closest one was? We do. Uh, I think the closest... Is the closest real one still 1970, uh, when 1969, when Jackie Eakes ran across the track, started uh, walked across the track, refused to run, started last, and won by metres? There is a spin from the punctured tyre. But that is a brand, well, I don't know if it's a brand new set of tyres, he is on an outlap. There's the DKR engineering car. They've been in the wars, these guys. Yeah. They've run a tough race. It's been a torrid time. Charles Leclerc watching the action from the Ferrari garage. That's an unusual position for him, isn't it? To be in the Ferrari garage watching a race. That he's, he'd never be in a good mood normally if that was the case. It's quite often the other way around, though. I see a lot of the uh, the WEC Ferrari drivers yeah. at the F1 event. They, they work them hard. OK, Rio, the gap is 16.0. The gap is 16.0. Let's hunt them down. Again, really calm voice on number eight cars. Race engineer. There's been a change in their engineering setup. Uh, for a number of years, they've had a, a different engineer on the car, but this is working really well. There's the relevant positioning on this track. Antonio Fuoco in the number 50 Ferrari. Was that 26 Six laps nine. ago? Set the new fastest race lap. So that car, although it's not on the lead lap, is still going very quickly. Had a really good in lap. That's brought the gap up to 16 seconds. Really good in lap and a good stop. And again, we've heard this all the way through, either with the 8 or the 51. Doing all the right jobs, you're hitting all the right numbers, excellent work, keep it up, you're going great. You know, and it, as a driver, what, it, what does that mean, you know, when you're... Because you are sort of isolated, you don't have all the data, you don't have the big picture inside the cockpit with you unless you're really following somebody or they're really behind you. You need that continual update of how things are progressing, right? Yeah, when it's as close as this, you need all the information because, you know, you need to know if you need to be pushing harder, if you are, you know, making inroads on them. So any information this stage is super important. Steph went with in the pit lane. Steph, apart from it being hot and sunny, what's going on? The battle is super hot in hypercar right now, but it's also going off in LMP2. Uh, the Panis, the six, 65 Panis Racing Richard, car. Box, 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 box. Okay, so Cadillac coming your way. Tell us about Panis, the LMP2 car. So this has had a battery issue and has actually been in the garage for quite some time. It looks like it's getting ready to go back out. A couple of garages down as well. There is an issue with the 39 graph car. Uh, it looks like front right axle damage, but it seems like they're immediately heading back out. Car tires are going back on the car and they should be running very soon. OK, one of your colleagues in the pit lane wearing a suit, uh, white suit for Le Keep. Uh, is the wife of driver Patrick Pillay of the 39 Graf racing car. So undoubtedly they will have an inside line onto what's going on with that car as well. You can see Earl Bamber waiting to take over the number two caddy, former race winner for Porsche in Le Mans. And the number two car, his teammate Richard Westbrook has that in third place. First time at Le Mans with this programme, first time at Le Mans with the Cadillac Racing Organisation for GM Racing Chief Laura Wontrop Clauser. And if they can pull off that result here for Chip Ganassi and all of the team, that's going to be an enormous result. You know, you look at guys like Chip Ganassi and Roger Penske and, and the, you know, the big names in US racing, 
They don't just race in single-seaters, in Indy cars. They don't just race in NASCAR. They race in the IMSA WeatherTech Series as well. And you know that they know the weight and, and the, the gravitas of Le Mans, and you know that they want to win it. And here's the first chance they've had in uh, half a lifetime to come and do so on an equal footing with the same machinery. And look how well they've stepped up to the plate. The, the Porsche Penske crews, the Cadillac racing crews have been right in there swinging from the moment they arrived. Cadillac number two comes in, stops in the pit box. We saw El Bamba limbering up, getting ready. This driver change with Richard Westbrook. You see, just unplugging. We've got this driver uh, helmet cooler in that car. Oh, no, he's, having a, he's having a drink there, so he's staying in. Mm -hmm. So Earl was ready in case yeah. he decided he would get out. He's obviously going for another stint. Oh, number three going very slowly. The only luck this car has had is bad luck. Now, what happened there? Has he had a little moment, or did the car need a bit of a reset? And again, Sebastian Bordet at the wheel. This car set light to itself, not in a major way, but no fire in a race car is ever trivial because there's so much wiring that is potentially going to get damaged. That was in hyperpole and didn't get to set a lap, or not a fast enough lap, but... Run wide in Arnage. Yeah, possible. It looked like recovering from a moment. Arnage will maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe just gathering it all up out of Indianapolis. No rattling from underneath the car, but then the stones will probably be long gone. Carries on going, doesn't dive into the pits, and he's back up to full racing speed. Either a transit van or the garage 56 NASCAR going into the pit lane in front of him. Is that car running again? No, it's still in the garage, so I'm not sure quite what that was. Oh, oh and there's a trouble. Toyota. There is trouble. That is Arnage. Is there fluid down there? He's been hit in the rear, look. He has been hit. Or has he hit him on the rear. Or he's, or he's hit the rear. Oh, my goodness. Rio Hirakawa. And now again, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. He does not want to put the car in the gravel. He's missed the terra firma. He has been off backwards. Where's he been? Well, we heard uh, the information getting relayed to him via Hartley, didn't we? About that very corner saying, watch out for the rear because it's that tricky. Wasn't, that wasn't the Cadillac avoiding the stationary Toyota. No, but that was down at Arnage where we saw the recovering Bordet. That was coming out of Arnage before Porsche Curve. So this is a separate incident. I think it's only just happened because yeah. I saw the, the yeah, yellow. Yeah. Here we go. Just locked the rear yeah, brakes. It is the rear. So it, yeah, sorry, it is Arnage, In the but note. it was the rear. Oh. That's Flat exactly the front what Hartley and was the talking rear about. Off the barriers. That's exactly what Hartley was talking about. So uh, Cadillac's up to yeah. second. You saw when the car stopped, did it have three marker lights on or two? Charles Leclerc. You know, th this is where this is where you cannot let your emotions take it all away from you. You know, you've both been in a situation where you're getting close and you're getting closer and you're getting closer. Don't lose focus on what you're doing because that's when it all comes unstitched. Let's hear from the Toyota. Okay, your box, 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 box. Yep. Ah, oh, that's not how I thought it was going to come to an end, Toyota's challenge today. No. 16 seconds behind. He was keeping the gap around 16 seconds, but clearly driving so hard to maintain that gap. And uh, exactly as Brendan... I think they've been struggling with the rear brakes, something with that car from very, very early on in this race, and they've been managing it well. Been chasing the balance a lot. Yeah. We've heard a lot of conversations more front, less front, more roll bar, less roll bar, changes made, changes reversed as, as the track has changed. And, and, and again, we talked about this earlier the same may well have been going on, Guy, with, with the Ferrari team. We're just not hearing every message from every car. So it may be that some of theirs haven't been relayed on air and they may have been doing similar work. Yeah, the number eight car, the, the radio traffic has been pretty busy, hasn't it, uh, back and forth. So they've been, they've just been struggling um, with the balance pretty much for the second half of this race. But they've done a good job to keep uh, the Ferrari in, uh, you know, in, in 
striking distance, but uh, yeah, it's a real shame for uh, for Raya there. Now, number two caddy on an outlap. Richard Westbrook still at the wheel. You saw Earl Bamber watching the monitors. So it's on the same lap as the number eight Toyota, but it has not yet passed it. So it is not yet up to second place. But there's Earl wondering what might happen. There is the number two car, still showing three red lights on the side. Red is the colour for hypercar. That's the backing number on the illuminated panels on the nose and on the doors. And three, of course, means it's in third place. Two in second place. Rio wow. car will rejoin. Fresh nose, fresh tail, and hopefully nothing damaged in between. But the caddy is on the lead lap. We now have three cars on the lead lap and an hour and 40 minutes to go. So a three-car Grand Prix with the field spread out and Davidson. This could be highly entertaining. Yeah, it's just uh, like I said, though it wasn't it wasn't what I expected. Uh, the team have done well to turn that car around, but yeah. Bitterly disappointing for Rio. Let's see what he okay, says. Okay, gap back to the Cadillac is three minutes and 18 seconds. Three minutes, more than three minutes. We're okay. So rather than I'm the attention, right. so rather than the attention being forwards, it's now shifted to who's behind, mm -hmm. and that in itself is very telling. But you know that's damage management. That's making sure he knows he's not under attack from behind. Get your head down. Get up to speed. Go get the leader. Did you see in the background that shot? You had uh, Kamui Kobayashi chatting with Pascal Vassalon in the back of the garage, just, you know, mimicking the overseer moment with the brakes and Pascal nodding along. Hey, man, the Toyota just left pit lane, so he is almost a lap down. Again, no risk, no risk. And that, again, is a critical damage limitation message. In fact, <clears throat> Excuse me, as the 51 car comes out of the chicane, there he is. The car in front of him is the number eight Toyota. And we talked when you're hunting, we heard Brendan Hartley going, what's the gap, where is he? Because he'd lost, in, in a, a change of pit stops, he'd lost visual contact with the Ferrari in front. Now, Giovinazzi has eyes on the second place car. Just pace yourself with him, make him do the work, don't overthink it, just relax and oh, breathe into the about, rhythm. He doesn't have to think about uh, the car in front of him. He doesn't have to think about Hirokawa. This is the best radio message he could ever wish to hear. You're almost a lap ahead. Just sail it home. An hour and a half to go. Don't do any, no heroics. He doesn't have to care about the car in front. Just, just bring this thing home. And that, got the suddenly, speed. that suddenly takes some of the fuel equations out of out of the picture yeah. because they've got a little margin in terms of time. So if they need to spend time doing a splash and Toyota doesn't, then they're good. Both the other those teams were, yeah, so, sorry, both those teams were pushing as hard as they could. That's yeah. what was so enjoyable about it. You you mentioned at the time, guy, like look at their lap times compared to anyone else. They are yeah. they've elevated themselves. They had elevated themselves to a whole new plane and something was going to give, something was going to crack. But Giovinazzi can't, can't relax now because he, you know, once you switch off, you relax, that's when the mistakes can creep in, so you've got to keep the focus. But then you start to listen to the car, every gear shift, what was that noise? It's, it's tricky. Well, let's get down to the pit lane and see what the temperature is among some of our contenders. with driver of the number two Cadillac, Earl Bamba. It's, it's been a good race for you guys so far. As you know, it's not over until it's over, is it? No, um, I mean, it's been a wild race. We had a really good start. We led some laps, the first ever laps here for Cadillac Racing uh, in Le Mans, so that was kind of proud. And then we had the rain and the night. You saw a lot of incidents, a lot of cars crash out, but we've managed to survive. And still two hours to go, and it's still one third of a normal WEC race. And we see what madness happens in that, so. Um, yeah, we just saw the Toyota have an issue, we can have our own issues, so um, trying to hold on there for that podium position. And you guys are on the lead lap now, is there any chance of you guys surpassing Toyota? We saw what happened to them. No, I mean, no, they, I think the Ferrari and the Toyota's got a little bit more pace than us, um, but I'm going to jump in for the last two cents and 
right, well, good luck. We'll see where we end up at the end of this. It's been a crazy race. The guys behind me have done a fantastic job. Um, you know, Cadillac's done an amazing job to develop the car in the last 18 months to, to arrive here and, you know, to, to lead and to be fighting is great. Well, we look forward to seeing you back in the car. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steph Wentworth. Thank you, Earl Bamba. So, yeah, they're not getting their hopes up too much. See the garage 56 entry still on the pit apron, but it's out of the garage now. Mike Rockefeller in the Henrik Motorsport Camaro. There it is. Looks like their transmission swap fix has been made, and they are ready to go back out. Out to comes the 93 Peugeot. And this car currently in ninth place in the hypercar class, ninth overall. There's... Uh, Paul De Resta watching intently from the garage. Peugeot uh, disappointing in qualifying. They didn't manage to find the pace they wanted to get anywhere in the hyperpole shootout. But as soon as the race came, the car really came alive and showed the potential that it had shown in free practice. And unfortunately, incidents robbed them of a chance to challenge for the podium. But it's been it's been a leader, as is Cadillac, as is Porsche, as is Ferrari, as is Toyota. I think the only brand, uh, brands not to have led have been Glickenhaus and the Van Wall. So all of the other main hitters in the hypercar class have been pretty much there on pace. And a, a number of the Porsches have led the race, both Toyotas, both Ferraris at one stage or another. One factor that has helped keep the hypercars together, the LMP2s together, and the GTEMs together, particularly when the weather was vile, is the new set of safety car regulations, where the three safety cars that we've used for a decade or more here at Le Mans are all scrambled to bring the field under control, and then once the major incident that's required a safety car is fixed, they all merge into one queue, all the cars merge into one queue, and then they are waved around. Anybody who is in the queue ahead of their class leader gets to go around and join the back of the queue. And then all three classes are organised in terms of speed. So the hypercars at the front, LMP2s in the middle, and the GTEs at the back. And that's helped keep the racing alive. It's stopped people losing laps unnecessarily just because of the, uh, the quibbles, of foibles of fate and where you get stuck in the safety car queues. Now, that could also bring our field back together if we get a safety car in the next half an hour because in the final 60 minutes of the race if there is a safety car we will not have the merge we will not have the wave around we will not have the drop back so we will go with three safety cars because it will take a good couple of laps to merge and drop everybody back after the danger has been passed so that can no longer take effect after we get into the beginning of the final hour. Nicky Katzberg on board the 33 Corvette, and he will do the final 90 minutes in that car. There is the current uh, challenger in third place, Rahel Frey in the Iron Dames Porsche. They've been in the lead battle, and Rexy, the Project One T-Rex liveried Porsche, up to second place. But the Corvette of Nicky Katzberg retains the lead after that pit stop, and the uh, Oman Racing TF Sport Aston Martin. That's the orange car in the background of the shot. That's fourth place. So we're looking at the gap there between Matteo Cairoli in Rexy and the Iron Dames Porsche. There's the challenge, though. The ORT by TF Sport. Charlie Eastwood driven Aston Martin is the challenger for the final podium spot. And Rahel Frey needs to keep that gap alive. Yeah, Charlie Eastwood's been uh, absolutely flying all race long in that car. And he's slowly catching, catching the whole time. Good graphics there at the bottom of the screen. He put in a, an absolutely brilliant stint uh, during the night. You see, you see the bodywork still all skewed as it's uh, taken a bit of damage at some point. Certainly not affecting the performance that, that much for, for Charlie. 
Yeah, he's probably finding the extra few tenths in himself that yeah. might be robbed uh, by that aerodynamics. The only, the only slight issue when the aerodynamics or the bodywork moves is the aerodynamics move, and things like where the low pressure area is that helps suck the hot air from out under the bonnet, if that disappears, then you start to run problems with overheating, because although you're going through the air at the same speed, if the air is trying to be rammed in by the movement of the car but can't escape significantly, then you, you, know, you stall the air in the radiators, and if air isn't flying in your radiators, these cars don't have auxiliary fans, so you run the risk of getting into an overheating problem. So the TF Sport team watching there, the ORT by TF Sport, Oman Racing Team. Pole Citizen Spa, last time out, and looking for a first podium here at Le Mans for an Omani driver. Ahmed Al Harty is the key to that program. The young man from Armagh. Now Harty had a pole position, didn't he, to combine yeah. pole? Uh, that was in, in Spa. Spa. Yeah. yeah. We, were, we were setting up the Ben Keating Sarah Bovi battle, and then <laughs> boom, <laughs> there he was. Watch this. He Quick said. as he liked, absolutely. Didn't quite find that pace here at Le Mans, but nevertheless, the car has been very resilient in the race. In fact, the only TF Sport car that has not been a right nut of pain all the way through. That's their only car remaining in the race out of three Aston Martins and an LMP2 car that they started. And he is closing little by little on Rahel Frey. So the Swiss driver in the pink car will have to hang on, stay ahead of Alston and Charlie Eastwood. So the Iron Lynx, Iron Dames garage. There, the Iron Lynx car, yellow car of Claudio Schiavone, out yesterday in the daylight hours with an accident. Claudio, the key behind a lot of this Iron Lynx programme. Effectively run by the Pacini brothers, they're the joint team managers. So it is, back out of the pit lane. Well, my prediction was that we'd finish 19th. It's currently 39th, so I was even further away than that Davidson, who reckoned 29th. And was jubilant from out two laps when it moved from 30th to 29th, only for then to move up to 28th. Have you mentioned the issue for the Palace racing car? Uh, we had a brief talk about Palace. Yeah, what else a, you know? It's a master switch on the starter motor. That's it's not what uh, we definitely did not get that yeah. out. So a master switch and starter motor. Can't, mm. can't start the car. Yeah. Mm. Which means you don't stop it, which means it's parked. Just a few years ago, um, it was the same issue for, I think it was a G-Drive car. I've got a funny feeling the opening into it was in that car as well. So it's obviously Yob's fault. That helmet, that Palace helmet's not bringing in much luck, is it? No, no not really. Might have brought him a few smiles from the boss, but... Uh, was, it, was that the one where they drilled holes in the rear no, deck was, so they could was, stick a stick in and hit the starter motor? Uh, the one year where they went to DP2. Guy? Sorry? Sorry, you're pointing at something. Uh, sorry, no, I'm just saying pit stop for car 34 under investigation, so... That is our long-time leader in the LMP2 category, still in front of the Inter-Europol car, despite having to serve a drive-through. Uh, it served a drive-through this morning for overtaking under the, under safety, the safety car. car, and it turns out, we find from the official notices, that the offence had been committed at 8 o'clock on Saturday, and the uh, penalty was applied post 9am, I think, on Sunday. Yeah, so, so that's something of a quite a while to examine the, the details there. Across. Ooh. You can see how Rahel Frey is responding to the pressure from the Aston Martin. This is for a place on the podium. And uh, important result this would be, come what may, because the results behind Corvette, if indeed the uh, 53 car doesn't seem to to see, is it Rahel Frey? It is Rahel Frey. Leaping Sorry, over the curbs. You, um, what's that that you didn't hear? That? With uh, coming very close indeed to the title, the Corvette won't make it if we get the cars finishing broadly speaking where they do. The bigger problems in terms of keeping the World Championship, the WC alive, is that a large number of the contending cars are out. But 
Project One, oh yeah, Project One have just been in and out of the pit lane. That's why Matteo Caroli A looked slow going up through the Dunlop curves. I thought, oh, is that the normal speed? And B appears now to be fourth, not second. So this is now the battle for second place. Iron Dames Porsche versus ORT by TF Aston. And a cool that racing, number 33 car still out front. Yeah, history awaits here, whatever happens here. John of course, the, the major headline is Ferrari and yep. coming back 50 years afterwards. And boy, do they look happy about it. But there's all sorts of other records, one in particular about nations and drivers and winning in this 100th year of the Le Mans 24 hours. Should the 51 car win, I believe I'm right, that will put uh, James Glado winning, will mean that uh, the same number of French wins per driver is equal by the UK. Oh, wow. Well, I ball the living daylights out of everybody by saying every year this is Britain's biggest motor race. Yep. It has been, well, British entries, private or factory, have been a part of this since 1923. Yep. And against the advice of W.O. Bentley, a group of... Uh, well-heeled enthusiasts brought their Bentley over to take on the Continental makes and uh, fly the flag for the British motor industry. And then seeing how well they did, WO decided actually there might be something to that. Yes. He was always a, always a man with a, a great view on promoting the brand being a good thing. And somehow there was just a little germ of an idea there. and. That led, of course, directly to Guy Smith winning Le Mans in a Bentley. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, eventually. In a roundabout way. Yeah. yeah, no, no, not at all in a roundabout way. It's a, it was a, a direct response to the history of Bentley when Bentley changed owners most recently. That generated the, the impetus to create, to recreate success at Le Mans and, and to relive those glory years. And yeah, you were part of it. I mean, to be. A British driver, part of winning Le Mans in a British car, there's not many have done it over the years, and, and there's been a century of trying. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, isn't there, down at Interpol? They're nervous about whatever's under investigation here. Well, uh, if they get a drive-through, and they've they got a drive-through before, it'll take 32 seconds. They're currently 26 seconds ahead of the second-place Team WRT car of Robert Kubica. Yeah, it's going to be very tight. They have got a pace advantage. They've had that throughout this latter part of the event. Mm -hmm. So if it's called now, there's an opportunity still for that battle. They do stand, by the way, to beat the first ever Polish class winners here as a team. I do, that I don't find hard to believe. I haven't looked at Polish everybody in the here. 1920s, but... No, uh, 1933. OK, there we go. 90 years ago. Wow. And that was a DNF. And here is the battle for second then. Rahel Frey in the pink Porsche, Charlie Eastwood in the orange, Aston Martin. And this is, well, last time round, up to Dunlop chicane. Rahel just too deep under braking, trying really hard to hang on to this. Really, really hard to hang on to this. This is not about second place. This may be... In fact, about any position on a podium, and Eastwood's got the speed advantage, pulls out of the slipstream guy. He's put the car exactly where it needs to be on the racing line. He's just got to try and hang on there, run the outside, yeah, making a clean pass. Brave stuff there by Charlie. He's in a rich vein of fame of form, isn't he? He just seems to be driving better and better throughout this year. Whatever he's driving, whether it's a P2 car, he comes here as the overall Asian Le Mans Series champion. And he put his trust in Rahel Frey there, didn't he, as a fellow pro. I'm on the outside. You can tag me into a big spin, but I know you're better than that. You know, they've raced against this pink car for a number of years now, and they trust the drivers. And, and you have to have that trust when you, you are do. going on those outside passes. You've got to have that respect, especially at that kind of speed, and, and clearly that was there. But, you know, she's fighting back. She's not letting this go. She, she realises this is a... This is a, a fight for, for a podium finish, if not a potential win, if anything happens there to the Corvette. So she's got to keep on the back of that uh, Aston Martin and keep the pressure on. Look at the rate of attrition in GTE AM. It's fast. It's, I've never I mean, seen it. Nine never cars seen it. running. And 
OK, the weather definitely played its part. We've had lots of wet races before, but it was the sort of mostly dry, absolute delage and dry again nature of the track, I think, that really caused the havoc. It wasn't just in GTEM, but there were, there were cars off driven by very, very well-experienced and highly respected drivers in Remember, all three classes. Four of those GTM cars were eliminated in two separate two-car incidents, yep. 60 and the 16, um, effectively took each other out. It was the same with the 55 GMB Motorsport, Aston Martin, and the number 21 from AF Corsa. 66 car was part of a multi-car pile-up as well. He was an innocent victim of somebody else checking up in a next slow rather than slow zone. Race leader goes by the class leader. There is only one car in the invitational class. I don't think that's diluted, diluted in any way the enjoyment of the Hendrick Motorsports crew. Jimmy Johnson, seven-time NASCAR winner. I haven't asked and I uh, haven't had a chance to, but I would like to bet that Jensen's relationship with this program didn't come because he's Jensen Button, Formula One world champion. I sense that it came, and, and I, I don't remember it as a fact, but I know that Jimmy Johnson has done the Race of Champions. I know that Jensen Button has done the Race of Champions. I sense it's off duty in a hotel somewhere where that friendship first has, has started to grow, and I think that was the, the link that brought them in. The Rocky Link, not too sure, but he's uh, you know, well known in North America, good pair of hands. I'm not sure if he's done road course races for Hendrick Motorsport before now, but uh, that was a, a good addition as well. A man who knows what it takes to win Le Mans. It goes through a large 311 car just behind, so 16 very American cylinders mm. circulating in close formation. Um, one other thing to watch, we've got an hour and 20 minutes left in this race. Peugeot's in formation two. The gap on track between the lead car and the second place number eight Tota is opening up again. Three minutes and 24 seconds. That yep. means something like six or seven seconds on track between them. And if the 51 car pushes and overtakes the number eight, there's a lap down, then the safety car is not going to help them. No unless by the vagaries of making a pit stop in the next 20 minutes somehow the Toyota stays out and the Ferrari doesn't and then they end up but I mean that's all ifs and buts again a safety car is unlikely to be weather related 50 on pit road as is the team WRT car second in P2 yep 31 Robin Frines has just been through and gone as well that WRT car, their second car, is fourth in LMP2. Now, they've got history with this track as well, having nearly had a 1-2, having had one car stop on the final lap and still claiming victory by what's probably the tightest ever margin in LMP2, one of the tightest ever winning margins in any class here. Uh, the Ferrari will obviously have to stop earlier. They've fueled the uh, Toyota when it came in for repairs. Another car on pit road, it's one we've been quite quiet about in the last few hours, but it leads its class. It's the 45 LMP2 Pro-Am car of Algar Pro Racing with attrition in the LMP2 class. The Portuguese flag team, Colin Brown at the wheel as it came in, dominates that class right now. I think it's still, what is that, four laps of the good over the second place cool racing car. That's the Jakobsen out there still. The young man signed confirmed the sign recently as the the Peugeot junior driver. Third place in that art class, and what much further back is the DKR engineering car. Well, I was looking at the DKR car and seeing, because next on the timing screen in 35th place overall rather than 34th is Prema Racing's, and that's not Pro-Am, is it, though? No, so that's a pro car. Uh, The Graf Racing Pro-Am car, Patrick Pile, number 17, uh, number 39 car, six laps further is back. six laps further yeah. back. So, so third place looks relatively safe for the DKR. Colin Brown is back out and uh, running in the lead. So a warning flag, by the way, for that uh, cutting across underneath the Dunlop Bridge by Rathoff Wright. Yeah. Pleased to see that um, race control make the same mistake I keep making with the changes of numbers between various championships we cover. 83 and 85 <laughs> has been something of a movable feast. Yes. It is the 85 car that gets the warning. Corvette racing lead, a minute and 32 seconds clear 
Nicky Katzberg from Charlie Eastwood. A further 3.2 seconds now to Rahel Fry, the podium positions into Europol with a pit stop under investigation. Lead, 41 car from Team WRT just out back onto track. And that should mean we are one further full stop from home. Now, the other thing is that WRT now stopping an Interpol into Europol not having stopped now means that if there is a penalty applied immediately and to, into Europol take it immediately, they will emerge from the pits in the lead. How they then get to the end on fuel compared to WRT, I don't know. But the longer it goes now, the closer to the end, and we talked about this with, with the uh, Ferrari and Toyota, Toyota stopping a little earlier, the earlier you are now in the fuel strategy, the more it might hurt at the end of the race. Louise Beckett in the pit lane. What do you know, Louise? I'm standing right next to the Inter Europo 34 team now. The, the lollipop guy is out. He's calling the car in. They've got a fresh set of tyres for him. I'm assuming they're going to do the stop for... Oh, no, they're doing a, a full service right now. Well, you get and there's a hopping Fabio Scherer getting into the car. You could at least have carried him. Oh, that would be outside assistance, I suppose. <laughs> so to explain why Fabio Scherer is hopping, uh, his foot run over by the Corvette, we believe. Yes, yeah. I, I, I believe it was the Corvette. Louise will uh, just downstream of them towards pit in is their sister car the garage is down on that what's the next one along so they've got ida uh, idec 48 and then the next one is the 33 corvette yeah, yeah. I, i'm sure i read so i heard somewhere it was 33. he's right on the scene watching the pit stop with us well this is a new color scheme two shades of green and yellow for the finger green and yellow into your ball team they win this one, they're never going to change it again, are they? No, and why would you? I mean, uh, and the other car was a sort of mirror image with uh, a white background and, and narrow yellow and green stripes. Now, what were they yelling about there? Were they, they were pleased with? Or? I think they were pleased with that stop. Yeah. yeah. They well, 29 for WRT. What yeah. was that stop for at Europe? It was exactly the same. 29, so they lost nothing. OK, so now we wait and see whether there is a penalty coming for them in the last 75 minutes. So, they were warned, well, we were told that there is an investigation, so we'll wait and see what happens. There is the second place car, the number 41 WRT car. 24 seconds is the gap, and Lily Delatraz hustling now. Mm -hmm. That means that if Albert Costa has to serve a penalty, he will come out eight seconds behind as of now. It's a 32-second drive-through. That's the pit lane delta. OK, Ferrari getting ready for driver changes. Is he on his second stint, Guy? In uh, the lead car? In his first, I can check. Don't for you. Cool. I think he might be in his second. I think Antonio Fuoco might also be in the second. Yeah, Fuoco was definitely on his second, possibly his third, even actually. And and back home, when you're sitting on your sofa, you go, Yeah, but he's in the car, leave him in, you know, leave him in. Mm, no, it's another 75 minutes to go. Yeah. And if he's been in there for an hour and a half already, OK, yeah, I'm, re I'm good to go, I'm good to go, except are you going to be good to go in another hour when it might really, really come down Absolutely. to the nitty-gritty? Just don't, don't change things just for sort of some emotional reaction. If it's, if it's due for him to come in and, and jump out the car, then swap drivers. You're all going to be on the top step of the podium anyway, or you're not. But well, that is unlikely to be changed for the better by not changing drivers and keeping them fresh. Sometimes as a driver, the best place to be is actually in the car because the time yeah. passes faster <laughs> and you're in control. Yeah. There's nothing worse than standing um, watching the car with a final sort of hour or so to go and not being in control. So um, it's a real sort of toss-up really which way to go. But 
Yeah, Jeff, that's it's, it's, it's driven brilliantly so far. The other advantage is with fireproof gloves on, it's much harder to chew your fingernails. That's <laughs> true. It's and you tend to be busy. Only second stint at the moment, Sergio. That's second stint. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, I thought, thought they had both changed at the same time. So our class leaders in hypercar Ferraris, Antonio Giovinazzi, Fabio Scherer for Inter Europol, still leading in LMP2, and Corvette Racing's Nicky Hatzberg. He's got a, a Texan hat like everybody else. Nicky Katzberg is leading in the Corvette car number 33. So we have a total of... Do we only have... Do we have still 40 running cars? I thought we, we might have, have 40 lost running one cars or two. with the Jota car a long-term pick call at the moment. Yeah. So I suspect that will be a we'll large lap wonder. Wounded. Be a last lap wander there, ready to send it out, but not long before the end. So whatever ails that car, it's clearly not going to last for long. And that should be, assuming nobody else falls by the wayside, our 40th and final finisher. At the moment, we have lost 22 cars from our 62 starters. So that is a high rate of attrition, the highest we've had in a good decade. It's a uh... Yeah, been a while since I can remember seeing this many outs, and a lot of it weather-related, lots of incidents, mm -hmm. lots of the multi-car incidents at that. It's lacked for nothing in terms of drama of the welcome and unwelcome sort, has it? Well, it's been a hard one to walk away from, Guy. <laughs> Whenever you had somebody taps you on the shoulder and go, all right, sunshine, off you go. You're kind of, oh, yeah, no, but I can I, I'll just watch another... F and so, actually, one of the, one of the great things that, that's happened in our commentary lives in the last few years, other than having fantastic guests in the, in the booth like you, is that we've now got a sort of double-sized room, so we've got somewhere to sit and watch and listen Absolutely. when you're not on air. And, actually, that's, that really helps with our understanding and living of the race, because we're like those, you know, all the fans at home who are sitting in the armchair where they were at lunchtime yesterday with their wife going, are you going to sit there all day then? <laughs> well, yeah, if I can. Right, I'm off then, I'll see you tomorrow. And and the screens and the, and the iPad with the timing and the, the app and Ferrari's garage cam and the Corvette, or the well, Camaro like, garage it's cam. It's like being at home, isn't it? You wait for the adverts to come and you make a cup of tea. Well, you know, <laughs> here the, the adverts aren't coming, we just want to watch the show, so it's... Um, I think whether you're a fan or you're you're, you're a part of the show, it's um, it's just so exciting what we're seeing here. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the the tone on social media as well as bumping into a couple of people between commentary extents. Got 51 on the radio. Let's see what's going on for the race leader. We've got to that point. Okay, mate. Box the slap. Box the slap. Driver change. Box the slap. Driver change. Okay, I'll tell you what it's going to say. As a, okay, Antonio. Box this lap. Box this lap. As a mark of that level of attrition last year, eight cars plus one non-classified car. On this year, 22. Wow. 22 what? Non-classified cars? Uh, 22 cars already retired yeah. in this race. Last year, it was one non-classified car and eight retirements. Wow. So it's almost three times the level. Well, and, it, I, and I don't think that is all weather-related, but, uh, yeah, the, the incident breeds incident breeds incident. Where there's been a slow zone, that has actually caused, uh, or drivers have had incidents. DKR in the pit lane as well. We've just seen them in there. The Vector Sporter in, Edex Sporter yeah. in, and so too Action Express and the 94 Peugeot team. They've come and gone. Louis Delatraz is closing on into Europol, and he's taken seven seconds out of that lead since those two pit stops just a, a couple, couple of laps ago. Wow. So out is Antonio Giovinazzi, and in... Perhaps for the rest of the race is their talisman, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, three-time GTE Pro World Champion with teammate James Collado. What a great pairing they have been in terms of cohesion and success and just pure speed and aggression behind the wheel. Um, Alessandro, by the way, together with Antonio Giovinazzi, will be the 19th and 20th. Italian winners of this fantastic race, which will that take you their nation, their nation ahead of the United States. Uh, both have 18 winners at the moment. Oh, 18 and wins, sorry. And was Luigi Kinetti the then counted as US or Italian? Because he, he was a US citizen, so I'm assuming he would have raced with a US license. I'll check that for you. Luigi Canetti won twice 
in Ferraris, became Ferrari's North American distributor and ran his own team, North America racing team, for many years. OK, new mediums, new mediums. OK, let's just get our free practice programme underway here. <laughs> we got a 67-minute session. Let's see what we can learn. Italian. Well, let's get down into our lead battle in GTE Am. I'm with Ahmed Alharti from the 25 ORT by TF. Oh my goodness, how are, this is a terrible question, but how are you feeling right now? I honestly, this is, might be the first time where I don't think I can get the words out of my mouth, to be honest. It's, uh, wow, what a way to race 24 hours of Le Mans. Um, you can see we're, we're really, really fighting for this podium and it means so much for everybody here, the hard work that was happening throughout the last 16 years, you know, is here right now and everybody drove their hearts out. The team is working unbelievable with the strategy. All the other competitors are really amazing and they've all, you know, been driving at the best levels possible. And, you know, we survived the first four hours and then we survived the night and the rain and the visibility. And now it's just about trying to survive this last hour and a bit. So, you know, um, I don't like talking much before the race finishes, but uh, you know it's such a special thing, and I hope um, I hope everyone's watching back in Oman, and I hope that you know we can we can bring it in a very very decent position, hopefully. Summed it up perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ahmed Al Harty with Louise Beckett, the newly named OMG by TF. The Amali Racing Team, the orange car in second place in the GT Am class. And you can hear he is definitely feeling very tired and emotional right now. And again, like our female racing drivers in the race, you know, there's a, a proud history of women racing in this event. It dates right back to the very earliest days in the 1930s. But again, if you don't see it, you can't be it. You know, he will inspire undoubtedly another whole bunch of young, enthusiastic kids in Amman, in the Muscat, and, and other regions around, you know, that part of the Middle East to go out and do things, because they see it happening. And, well, and Guy, you know, yeah. we're used to that in the UK. We're used to that in Europe. We've got a century of motorsport and more to draw on. We're used to seeing it. We grew up with it. There's lots of parts of the world where it's, it's a new thing, and, and it encourages people to get involved. Absolutely. And uh, with this race as well being the centenary, you know, we've got eyeballs, we've got people watching the sport, and hopefully we're going to create a new fan base. We're going to get new people, Ferrari fans, Cadillac fans from the US, um, racing fans. NASCAR fans, just yeah. racing, just racing fans. fans. It's been an amazing and, event. You know, how can you not be um, impressed and excited by, by this race and this, this championship? I think actually you talked about their racing fans, NASCAR fans, who would previously almost certainly unlikely to have been watching Le Mans, will have tuned in because of Hendrick Motorsport and Jimmy Johnson and gone, what's this all about? The same way that Formula One fans who are fans of Ferrari will have tuned in to see what's going on just because they know Ferrari are doing it. And people who, maybe not even Formula One fans, but have heard that Ferrari is racing this crazy race, there will be all sorts of eyes on it. And if you are a first time fan and you've in any way enjoyed it, tell your friends. We race these cars several times a year. The next race will be in Monza in July. We'll race them in Fuji in Japan, and we'll race in Bahrain. And then an eight-race calendar next year. Yeah. Yep. Which and so willing. there is a lot of this stuff on air and online. You can catch up with it all. And just a little info from James. Uh, he had a couple of times the power steering go a little hard in Fast Indy, so just take extra care there. That's not what you want to hear. Now, Graham, you were jumping up and down, getting ready to tell us something about something a little earlier. And just simply, you mentioned the NASCAR uh, Garage 56 effort. And if you're watching, you're a NASCAR fan, and I'm, I'm sure you're looking at the timing screens as well, and you're thinking, yeah, that's a bit disappointing. Don't be. Uh, you've made friends here for your part of the sport. Um, all the cynicism about, you know, a novelty entry melted away in a nanosecond. The technology, the team spirit, the attitude, the aptitude, the outlook have all been warmly embraced here 
and you've flown the flag very proudly. And for... damn it, the noise. Oh, yes. Uh, there's, you know, like I said, yeah, in the middle of the night, we're talking to IMSA President John Doonan, who's been sort of re responsible for making sure this program came together. There's been 300 plus thousand smiles every lap that car it's has fantastic. turned around here. Jimmy Johnson was saying early in the race, when they were behind the safety car, he realized that every time he was passing a big bank of fans, you know, down at Indianapolis or on Arch Corner, everybody was waving at him. Two so he waved back. Yeah, two Cadillac uh, on pit lane now. Yep. Earl With... Bamber takes over for Richard Westbrook after a triple stint for Westy, and that will take that car through to the end. So we'll listen to what's going on with Rio Hirakawa in the chasing uh, Toto Kazoo racing car. Okay, Joe, box this lap, pit confirm. Box for fuel only, you stay in the car. Rob Clouser, the head of GM Racing. And we Pressure. talked about some of the, the women driving in this race, a proud heritage. There are more and more and more female faces and voices from the cockpit, through the garage, the engineers, team bosses, corporate principals, corporate bosses, the head of Peugeot is Absolutely. female as well. You know, we've got race control with female race directors. That, again, you know, the more, the more young women and, and young girls get to see people like them in, in positions in motor racing, the more it encourages them to come out and do something that they might be passionate about as well. And, and that, again, greatly helps to grow our sport in, in all directions. Completely so, correct, yeah. yeah you were saying about uh, uh, female drivers here at Le Mans. Dorian Pam became the 65th female starter in this race. She will not be finishing it, sadly, with the elimination uh, of the 63 car accident for uh, Danny Kivia. Hearing from Louise Bonaway, the caddy on its way with Earl Bamber at the wheel, and it's a fresh set of mediums with almost precisely 60 minutes to go. There are still going to be storylines to be written here, gentlemen. This is not done, but in 10 seconds' time, one thing changes, and that's the safety car rules. Yep. We will be into the final hour of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Right now, you just saw the Corvette that leads in GTE Am. OMG by TF, the Oman Racing Team. Charlie Eastwood, that Aston Martin is in second. And the Iron Dames, Rahel Fry, still in third place ahead of Rexy, the green T-Rex livery, Project One Porsche of Matteo Cairoli. And he is getting on for 40 seconds behind. And there it is. Three o'clock Central European summertime on the Rolex clock above the start finish line. We have an hour to go in the centenary Le Mans. Century of history. 23 hours of exceptional racing so far. 60 more minutes to go. Let's hear for, from the number two Corvette uh, Cadillac. So, one hour to go, one hour to go. Bring it home, no risk. Well, the sister car, car number three, driven by Sebastian Bourdais, as you can see, is two laps off the lead, uh, or two laps behind them, in fact. So, uh, four minutes 58, it's a, a three minute 28 lap, so it's more than a lap behind. So there will be no attack from behind, but the yellow-nosed caddy, I'm sure, will try its best to close up in the final hour behind the blue-nosed caddy. In comes and Toyota. 311 is still going. Toyota comes into the pit lane. It will need to do one more stop. They cannot go 58 minutes on fuel but it stops before the race leader, or four laps after the race leader, three laps maybe after the race leader. Out of sequence, remember, because of that incident. Well, and, and also Arnage. because they, they took a short stint, a very short stint, when there were a couple of long slow zones, they ducked in for fuel. Again, trying to roll the dice, trying to make a difference. Guy Smith, when you're in this, when you're in the in the clinch, like right in the closing stages, you know the cars are equal. If you just do the same as the other guy, it, it doesn't break the deadlock, it doesn't break the stasis. So you've got to try and make a change, do something different. And there are ways you can do it with fuel, with track position. Yeah, you've just got to be creative. At the end of the day, you know, doing the same thing. If you haven't quite got the pace, you're not going to win the race. So you've got to be creative. So. Um, whether it be, uh, as you say, whether it be fuel, tyres, stint length, you've got to try and, uh, and make that difference up. And Unfortunately, we're not going to see that with the with the Toyota here, you know, losing so much time with that um, accident. But still, it's in a great position. Anything happens to that Ferrari, 
And uh, yeah. as we know with Le Mans, anything can happen right down to the last lap. Look, we've done 23 hours. There's two minutes in it. That ain't much. Yeah, Brendan Hartley that crosses to stop. Yeah. the pit wall. Away like, goes to the brakes. It's, one, it, it, it's barely more than a standard fuel stop but it's also one stoppage somewhere on track and, and recycled. For, uh, you completely know. correct. And, and Toyota, of all people, need no reminding of that. Hello, Matt Davidson in the background. Uh, Toyota need no reminding of, uh, and nor did WRT for that matter, or anybody else who's been here in the last decade, need any reminding of what can happen at this crazy race. 57 minutes. Less some change in seconds as the number eight car goes off in pursuit of Alessandro Pierre Guidi, Rio Hirakawa, it is at the wheel. And a B2, meanwhile, 14 seconds is now the lead gap. Fabio Scherer being hunted less successfully at this point in the uh, cycle by Louis Delatraz. And it's now WRT 2 3 with Robin Fryens having made his way by Rennie Binder in the Duquesne Team 30 car some little while ago in GTE Am. Now the 27th position, Nicky Katzberg has over a minute and a half of advantage over the charging Charlie Eastwood. He has uh, pulled out nearly 17 seconds now over at Rahel Fry. Matteo Caroli in the Project One AO Rexy. The dinosaur liveried Porsche is on pit lane now, but will be the final routine stop for that effort. All those four cars have been exceptional. And this weekend. Rahel Fry was just creeping away from Matteo Cairoli, which is not an easy job to do. Cairoli is not in a, a Porsche by accident. He knows how to pedal those things. He's a Porsche Junior factory driver. Very Six. much being groomed for success. 62 cars started this race. 16 of them were in the hypercar class. At the moment, the top nine are still hypercar entries. There are three other runners at pace at the moment in that uh, in that uh, that class field in amongst the LMP2s and the 38 Hertz team Jota car which is still uh, on the in the garage and we expect to finish the race as a last lap wonder or last couple of laps wonder yeah it is currently the last car that is not retired 40 cars potentially could take the flag on board with Antonio Fuoco who's just been warned about track limits too many more warnings, so he's going to have to be cautious. That means, by the way, three retirements in the Hypercar class. We'll, we'll come to those. And the 50. It'll be wild, but first we're going to go down to Louise, who's in pit lane with Team WRT. I'm with Vincent Voss, Team Principal for WRT. Well, this is interesting, isn't it, going into the final hour? Yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, uh, things are going okay, I would say. I mean, we always try to fight for the win, and uh, this is what we do at the moment. There is a 13 seconds gap. We try to catch up. Let's see. I mean, it's it's how it is. I mean, uh, I did forget how long was a 24-hour race. Uh, it's long. Let's see that the finish. And especially how long that last hour is as well. Yeah, especially the last lap. Oh, yeah, you've been there before, so many things can happen. Thank you, Vincent, we hopefully speak to you later. The yeah. car of Antonio Fuoco closing in now on Rio Hirakawa to unlap itself. It is currently, what is that, five it laps is down? five laps back still. Uh, this was happening three or four hours ago. The 50 car was right up behind the number eight Toyota. We were wondering what would happen if he managed to make a pass and get by stage it didn't happen in traffic lots and lots of danish flags lots of flags of all nations the first running of lamar a century ago only four nationalities were represented france as you might expect here in lamar there were entries from belgian drivers british drivers and german drivers and now we have i think i remember correctly 32 different nations represented on the grid some major motorsporting nations and some on the Minho end of the scale. And by the way, radio, that is into Europol's pit board, or not a pit board, but... Uh... Just reminding him that uh, Johnny Walker's sounds of the 70s comes up <laughs> <laughs> shortly on radio. I think, I think as well, Martin, by the way, with the exception of Antarctica, representing every continent on yep. the planet. Six continents out of the seven, you're right. Antarctica do not... Well, Antarctica don't... 
uh, have a nation state, so they don't have a representation either. But uh, I suppose somebody could come from the Ross Ice Shelf who might be a full-time scientist and part-time racer, but that sounds a little less than likely. Leaving some of the debris out of the cooling grills. This will be the final stop, routine stop for the Iron Dames. Well, indeed. What a run they've had. Yeah. But great I mean, spirit of this this effort. What great, a always is. over the last few years, but what a race they are having here. They stop from third place, and it's going to be tight for the podium in GTE Am. Into Europol leading in LMP2. Fabio Scherer uh, back pedalling the car. You need two legs to pedal, so we'll have to come up with a better <laughs> a better way of describing driving the car with a single foot. Now, what he needs is a Chaparral 2F. Not because of the high wing, but because of the automatic gearbox. Yeah, it's uh, 12 seconds down the gap. It is still closing, and we've still got a pit cycle to go for both of these cars. And Louis Delatraz setting the WRT 41 cars fastest first sector of the race. Box Fabio. OK. They probably don't need to write Fabio on it. If you put 41 and box, I think they'll, he'll probably get it. <laughs> 34. 34, indeed. It's been a long, long day. <laughs> and a long night and another long day. I, d I don't think writing on in biro is going to really work. He's <laughs> coming past you at 160 miles an hour. Get a bit more gaffer. This you, is... You could just actually stuff, stuff, isn't there. it? Need to, throw, need to throw a bread roll at him. Hang on a minute. Box. There's 50 minutes to go. Yeah. Can't do it on fuel. He can't do it on fuel. Box now. So why is he boxing? Has oh, he got a penalty? Early. That's very early. Has he got a penalty? Well, we haven't been informed of the penalty, but the team may have. It is the last hour of the race. Things might not happen. Now, are they just preparing it? Yes, it's not going to the pit wall. It's going to the back of the garage. Oh. Have a bit more gaffer on, because if he hasn't got a radio, they can't tell him. Oh. And we don't have the signalling pits at Mulsan Corner anymore. There's Michelle Gatting. Looking quite drawn as well, Michelle. Yeah. Emotional. Yeah. And it's in a very emotional event, this. Well, their car has now dropped out of third place with its final pit stop. But have we had the final pit stop for the Corvette? Have we had the final pit stop for GR Racing no. and Ricardo Perro? No, because we if have. we haven't, and if they need to stop again, then again, the battle is on. It would mean... Probably, I would argue it would mean as much to the crew in that pink Porsche to finish on the podium Le Mans as it will to anybody else, whether they're winning the centenary Le Mans for Ferrari or anything else. I think that crew have as much invested emotionally in this as any other team yeah. in the business. That would be an enormous, enormous result for them. And it is hanging in the balance. Duquesne Engineering just on the fringes of the top three in LMP2. Let's hear from them. I'm in your journey from the 30 to Chem car. Uh, you're just getting ready to get back into the car now, so it's going to be full attack, I take it? Yeah, full attack. We had to look because of my four hours within six hour drive limit, and I'm just like on the limit. So now we just try to take over the tires from Rene and see if we can get that third place back. So you're going to stay on the tyres, but you're going to swap the driver? Yes, that's what we're going to try. Uh, yeah, we didn't think that we have to fight that hard for P3, because at some stage it looked all good until our punctures. So that's Le Mans, yeah. So let's see. Sure is, and you know it well. It's good to see you here, and hopefully see you at the end. Thank you. Edgy stuff all round. Yeah. You can see the faces at Interiorapol. They're worried, and they should be. Ten and a half seconds now. Louis Delatraz is closing taking chunks of time out of their long, long-held lead. This young man turning heads around the world with his sports car pace on both sides of the Atlantic. All sorts of weird things happen at the end of races like this, as, as we've seen in, in years gone by. Uh, WRT lost a 1-2 result a couple of years ago when Yiffy Yee's car failed on the final lap. They ended up Jeff with Rouge. one yep. car winning, Robin Frying's winning the race just from Tom Blomqvist at Jota. Could it be that they might get that one too this year? They've already had a win in the road to Le Mans, the BMW GT3 car. Valentino Rossi was driving that they run 
regularly for him in the uh, G Fanatec GT Series. He had his first win in the GT3 car. He was on the Le Mans podium for the first time since 2008. But there's other stuff going on as well. A little further away in seventh place overall, Gabby Aubrey was supposed to be going to the end for Vector Sport. In the words of Fiona Miller, entering her final hour as a press, uh, a press member of the press corps here in Le Mans, he is toast. Oh dear. So they are going to pit and put Matthias back in for the final, what they think should be five to seven laps. Yeah. So GR uh, Racing, by the way, are now making that final pit stop. That okay. should cycle the 85 ahead of the 86 with 47 minutes to go. Well, Rahel Still Frey pushing. is the highest rated driver. She's a gold rated driver in the Iron Dames car. And uh, they can see the ORT by TF car. There's the Duquesne car, car number 30. We just heard that Neil Jarney will be loaded in in place of Rene Binder. He'll take Rene's tyres and then go hell for leather after a podium spot. But he's about to be put a lap down by the leader, who is still absolutely flying, Fabio Scherer. Fastest lap of its race goes to the... Team WRT car, a 336, 146, 10.2 seconds. That's the number 41 car in second place. So again, that charge from Louis Delatraz is bearing, for, or is that Frines in the, uh, no, that is Delatraz in the 30, uh, 41. Yes. So you can see 34, 41 ahead of the 34 car on the track, but behind in the points. That's the overlap, there's not much in it. There's the ORT by TF car. The car still running a comfortable second place, so mm. just about 100 seconds off the now dominant performance from Corvette Racing. And that's a car that's had its troubles this yeah. week. Oh, it was nowhere. I mean, it was pack up and let's go home and go to the pub tonight kind of territory early on in the race. Lap three laps to go. OK, and you can you can see there that you could see what Albert Costa was doing, couldn't you? They're closing, they're closing. And they're trying desperately to Desperate. communicate, aren't they, with Fabio Scherer? Look, how, how heroic. You know, look, he's it's, it's, it's hopping into the car. He's got no radio. He's got no clue about gaps. He's left to find his own pace. They can't even signal him into the box without putting sticky tape on a, on a piece of cardboard. I, I think uh, David possible Brown can relate plug. to a lot of that <laughs> from, from his time with... Here comes uh, RT by XA TF. 220. So, RT by TF. I think I'm going to put a bit more gaffer on that bonnet just in case. And the gaffer is sort of peeling off. The bonnet hasn't, though. The bonnet pins at the front are holding. There's a young audience member. I wonder how many times that young man will come back to Le Mans. I, I wouldn't bet on him being here, maybe even for the 150th celebration. There you go. This is the 86 car with its commemorative livery, half and half. And look at the filth on the track. So half the viewers outside the track don't see any of that they just get the black side anybody who's on the inside yeah. of the track only gets the gulf side it's a, it's quite bizarre they're looking at two different race cars for the entire race and unless it spins they never see the other side of it no uh, not quite clear where we are with the pit stop cycle by the way for the 54 ferrari All yeah i can tell you is Oh, in now. Says right. it's so in each case, yeah. the, the battle for second place, or third place rather, in GTM is separated by six seconds. And I think the GR Racing car has come out ahead of the Iron Dames. Yes, it has. OK. But it's being closed. Yeah, battle is on. Well, there is the Corvette that leads in GTEM. So our three class leaders as we get into the final three quarters of an hour here. Ferrari, of course, a lead with number 51 in the hypercar class. There is your GTM leader, Vicky Katzberg, in the 33 Corvette. And into Europol, the green and yellow LMP2 car leading in that category. Fabio Scherer in, uh, I was going to say serene silence. I suppose probably not very silent in an LMP2 car. Not in really. comes the GTM leader. But Scherer with no radio comms, they're desperately waving things at him to try and keep him up to speed. Make sure he doesn't come in too early or too late. Final stop for the 33. Final stop for Corvette Racing at Le Mans. It mm -hmm. will be a very different look to the Corvette presence next, next year here in a different car, the C06 GT3R, and with a different team to be revealed. Yeah, the focus for the GT3 Corvette will be on customer racing. Yeah, and... Uh, I'm sure there'll be a fair number of these men and women.
behind this effort and efforts over the last better part of a quarter of a century with more than a couple of tears in their eye. This has been a, an effort that has attracted so much attention, so much loyalty. Yeah. The most popular sports car team in North America has made a lot of friends here at Le Mans. Also scared the living bejesus out of a lot of people with the mid midday train horn. That that we will miss as much as we will miss the sound and, of these cars. And and our our friends over the years have been part of the the, the Pratt and Miller Racing Organisation, Corvette Racing. Doug Feehan, particularly, who was the figurehead for a quarter of a century and more, and the Danny Binks and all the guys who were here through the early days of the ALMS and uh, have brought the cars back to Le Mans time after time after time. 31 into the pits from third place. Okay. And that drops it immediately down into fourth. Robin Fryens will stay in. I can't imagine Jellignite would get him out of that seat right now in the final 45 minutes. No, the race last year ended badly, didn't it? With an error at Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Having won the year before, and, and that's the other side of the Le Mans coin, of course, because for every, even Tom Christensen, for every win, there's been a year when you haven't won, although he's had a fair share of podium finishes as well. Yeah, it's uh, Tom's record, 18 starts, 40 NFs, 14 uh, podiums, including nine wins. Pretty decent uh, record not for a batsman. Yeah, yeah, not bad at all. What goes to the other mine other board the car in the garage at this stage, Guy? I, I suppose it depends where you're on the race. I mean, 2003, what was that like in the final hour? Well, I mean, I was lucky to be in the car for the final sort of hour and a half. So, um, as I was saying before to Martin, I think it's probably the best place to be because you're kind of preoccupied. You've got obviously to focus on driving the car, but um, at that point, it can only go wrong, really. So um, you obviously were just focusing on making sure you get the apexes, don't make any mistakes, and really just looking after the car because um, it really is the longest hour. I mean, for... Uh, for Alessandro Perguini now is just wanting to wish this next 40 minutes away because he just wants to get that Ferrari to the finish line in one piece. And in many ways, what we're watching here, this run for the last 40 minutes for Ferrari, not dissimilar to the run you had for Bentley, a famous make coming back after such a long time. And it's all on the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, ben, Bentley's gap was was more than half a century, nearly three quarters of a century. So it was a it was a long old time. You just saw Ben Keating there in the Corvette Racing Garage saying thanks and well done to the guys. Not all of those crew members, I'm sure, will be with us in Monza. I'm sure they've got extra crew who have come in here for the Le Mans 24-hour race, and it's been a, a good partnership so far. And actually, if they finish on the top step of the podium here. They will be within sniffing distance of the championship title. It, it's going to depend on exactly what happens with the podium positions, but I think if my maths is correct, there will be a maximum of three teams in with a chance of winning the title. Um, and that's come particularly courtesy to the fact that a number of other uh, cars in the order haven't finished this race. Remember, for the WC points, as you watch the Ferrari uh, completing the lap, uh, the cars that are not the WC entrance are effectively invisible. Louise Beckett. Just going past the 65 Panis Racing Garage and the car is in the garage. But what they are thinking to do is the same as, as Hertz Team Jota and go out for the last half an hour of the race just to finish it and get classified. All right, excellent. Well, if they've done enough laps up until now, as long as their final lap was is within Two minutes of the lead of their class this time, something uh, I can't like remember that. This, it's, there's, there's, there's now a, a final lap. There is a um, vector. Uh, maximum, and that yeah. came actually after Peugeot waited for the flag uh, with Seb Bourdais yeah. in the first year of the 908 programme. That, by the way, is what caught out, well, didn't catch up, what caught out the uh, Toto in 2016 was the failure, but that's why that car was not classified, because they couldn't complete the final lap yeah. in the minimum time. You can do 23 time, hours and 59 minutes. You can do 24, 24 hours and more, but if you don't make it to the checkered flag, Correct. you didn't start. Well, you don't finish. WRT's um, 41 is now on pit lane. Louis Teletraz comes in. He was about seven seconds back from the Inter Europol car. Inter Europol's penalty, by the way, ha was rescinded. Okay. So they came in and served that drive through. The penalty was rescinded, which is why they didn't come in and serve a penalty. So 
Luckily, they didn't do the penalty first and the drive through uh, the and the pit stop afterwards. They did the pit stop, argued, then had the penalty rescinded because once you've served it, you can't unserve it. Not, they can't give you that 32 seconds back. Now we don't yet know what uh, we're going to see from WRT next season outside of hypercar. We most certainly know that we're going to be seeing BMW with them as representatives for the factory. We've been likely to see GT3 cars too, so this will be their final LMP2 pit stop at Le Mans. Let's get down into our GTE field again. GR Racing in the podium contention. Let's hear from them. I'm with Ben Barker from the 86 GR Racing. We are 37 minutes remaining of this 24-hour race, and you're currently running in third. This is tense. Very, very. Honestly, I don't want to speak too soon, but we've had uh, yeah, a mad race. Um, we had damage early on, and, and the guys did an amazing job to repair it. We were almost down two laps. We managed to get back onto the lead lap. But, um, yeah, now we're now we got into third. So Ricky's just got to manage the gap. They're super close behind the Iron Dames, and um, we just got to hold off. Right, thank you. I'm not going to speak to you anymore because I know you can't say anymore. I'm going to go and hide somewhere. I'll add this, by the way, uh, with the news we saw earlier this week, news that Proton Competition, the uh, dominant, in terms of the numbers at least, uh, Porsche customer team in GTE Am are switching to Ford, it leaves slots open for the GT3 cars we expect to see here next year. And a good result here for GR Racing could secure the future for that team. Yeah, because they're racing Porsches now. Iron Lynx are racing Porsches now. But the Iron Lynx race, team will the, be racing yeah, Lamborghinis correct. next year. That's their deal. So it does open the door open, leave the door open you know, for maybe somebody like there, maybe somebody like Project One to be part of that. Maybe one and one. There's still a possibility that we may see two times one car for two teams rather than a two-car team. And that could just fall nicely for Mike Wainwright and his very loyal crew. Final so, stop for the number 50 Ferrari. This car, as you can see, just slips down to sixth position as the better placed uh, number five Porsche goes by it. Phenomenal outlap, by the way, from Louis Delatraz. Louis Delatraz in the Team WRT 41 car chasing LMP2 leader Fabio Scherer. And we have yet to see Scherer being waved in. Cadillac number three will come in this lap. And there'll be a few more pit callers before the end of the race. Not sure that you're going to get... Yeah, you. if you fill now, you'll get through in hypercar. 34 on pit lane. This is the critical pit stop, as is the third place Duquesne team car. So, final two contenders... If this race finishes on pace in LMP2 on pit lane now, it's all about what fuel is needed and how quickly and how trouble free can it be done. Oh, tyre change as well on the 50 Ferrari there. They had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So Fabio Scherer, is he going to get out or is he going to stay in? <laughs> I'm more notes in the door of the garage. <laughs> oh, they've opened the door so you can see the notes, haven't they? Go, go, go. You would think that maybe a team member, or they could, uh, I was going to say they could talk to him on the radio. Of course, they can't talk to him on the radio. That's why they're waving notes at him and holding sticky tape boards out. Here's what I made earlier. The most important pit stop in the history of this team yep. is done. And we'll see when it clears the timing beam at the end of pit lane. Here comes the 41. What Into is the gap? Is, is the absolute definition of a family team. Father and son running it. Kubishmir. Michowski is the young man whose dad, who runs into Europe, a huge bakery concern in Poland, had the money to start racing. They started in uh, small sub LMP3 cars in V to V races, came up through the Michelin Le Mans company, LMS, and here they are looking to try and win Le Mans. It is the, the length of the pit straight is the gap, 33 minutes to go. There's a lot of very nervous Polish people there. The number five, Porsche, why is that going so slowly? Why is that going so slowly? That's the number five car, Michael Christensen. He's got an issue. That is not racing speed out of a Mulsanne corner. 
That I is racing speed out of Mulsanne Corner. He was very low on fuel, wasn't he? Let's take a look at the energy. No, he's not. He's got two thirds of his energy left. So what's going on here? This is the sixth place car. Remember here, you've got to cross the line to finish this race. His next threat are the Glickenhaus cars behind, currently seventh and eighth. He is stuck in third gear. Is he stuck on the pit limiter for some reason? On the, on the, it's, he's doing 85, which it, the limiter should be 80. Yeah. He's 85 kilometers now. That's it. That, that's doing no RPM. Oh, it was, it was doing RPM though, wasn't it? It was doing sort of seven. Seems, seems very slow three for three cars in fourth. Said Bourdais will stay aboard the car. Mm -hmm. Something loose and flappy in there, wasn't there? 11 seconds is the LMP2 lead gap. And look at the huge size of the lumps of rubber coagulating together that get thrown up into these cars. And that's what we talk about when we talk about the big lumps that get stuck on a tire and it suddenly feels like the car is going to shake itself to, to pieces, Guy. That's the huge amount of, that you can run over without noticing and suddenly the car is like vibrating to bits. Yeah, sometimes it sticks to the actual tire, actually gets caught between the, uh, the, the, the tire itself and the wheel arch. Yeah. It can do all kinds of damage. Or, or, or gets stuck inside the rim and becomes like an out of balance exactly. weight on your road car and shakes your fillings. Very, very slow. Crawl back to the pit lane. This is really cruel for Porsche Penske team. About to be caught, by the way, by the LMP2 battle. Yep. That's at the moment making its way down towards Indianapolis. There's the sister car, or one of the two sister cars, one already out the race. Half an hour to survive. One side. There's the leading car in GTM behind two. It's the team's best placed car as well. Watch for the yellow and green into Europe or car go by, then look for the red and white WRT car, which I think is around 10 seconds back. Here it goes. Now, that was probably half a lap ago when he was crawling away from Mulsanne Corner. And on the data, they will see what power has been transmitted to the wheels. There are data sensors on there. The FIA uh, will be monitoring them in real time on all of the driven axles of all of the cars in the hypercar class just to make sure that nobody's exceeding their power delivery limits. So the team should have that data as well. And he's obviously, it sounds like, has got maybe only one wheel of rear wheel drive. The uh, LMDH hybrids, they produce their hybrid power and that is directed to the rear axle. So all the power goes through See the wheels. Here. This is second chicane. So you can see the engine was revving. He was fully lit going down into the second chicane, Anthony Davidson. Box of the neutrals, it seemed, as he was trying to get on power. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I could see on the graphic as well when it came up, he uh, he wasn't able to put any throttle down. As it's making very back. We're going to say a big thank you, by the way, to Guy Smith for his contribution yep. on this broadcast. He's got to leave. He's made a fulsome contribution to the centenary event. Got racing and rotating on, on the podium with his the, the so That was a while ago. <laughs> and uh, as a very valu valuable and. Uh, Welcome addition to this commentary team for the 2023 centenary edition of the Lawn 24 Hours. Hope we see him again soon. Absolutely. Behind the microphone and behind the wheel. Thank yep. you so much, Guy. Indeed. Safe journey home. And uh, good night's sleep as well when you get home At tonight. I think, I think everybody will get one of those. So 51 Ferrari must be on its way in. Number eight Toyota will need to stop as well. Number five Porsche coming down pit lane and. 51 car will go around one more time. So Toyota will stop after the 51 car for its final stop. And we'll need to take on less fuel, which will take less time. Real question now for Porsche Penske team at Davidson is, can they fix whatever it is in 20 minutes to get it back out inside the final 10 to try and make it a finisher? Well, it was either drive shaft issue or gearbox issue. I'm going for gearbox. Seem to happen on the upshift. You can hear from uh, Ben Keating. 
I'm with Ben Keating from the 33 Corvette. Ben, this is always a tense moment going into this final hour. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, no I've come radio. to expect this no from Nicky Katzberg no after the no race in Portimao, the to race me. at Spa. No team radio. It's hard for an old man's heart to watch Nicky Katzberg uh, in these races like this, but uh, uh, we've had a, a, a really crazy race. Lots of ups and downs, so much drama, uh, you know, with the weather and, uh, you know, uh, just all over the place. I, I'm really grateful to be where we are right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, 30 minutes left to go, fingers crossed, uh, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of emotion, you know, tied behind all of this, so we'll see. There is a lot of emotion, I can feel it and see it, um, and I'm, we were worried that we weren't going to be seeing you again, but you're just telling me now that you do intend to come back for Le Mans next year. It's my hope. Uh, yeah, I would really love to run in the Pro-Am class of LMP2. I run LMP2 in IMSA, uh, and because I did a full season of WEC, I did not use my automatic entry for LMP2 before. Uh, so uh, I'm hopeful that uh, they'll have me back uh, to run in an LMP2 car. Uh, I would love to do Le Mans for a 10th time in a row in nine different cars. That would be fun. That would be some record, and I think if anyone can do it, you can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Arch enthusiast Ben Keating. Yeah, a tenth Le Mans entry in nine different kinds of cars and in two different classes as well, GTM and then LMP2 Pro-Am. But right now, let's hope that if they end up in about an hour's time standing on the podium as Victor Victor's in GTM this time, he gets to keep the trophy. Well, it'll be double winner uh, because 2022, of course, won the Tio Sports in the Aston Martin. But the Correct. remarkable thing about that uh, that figure, the uh, nine different cars who makes it back is, he has that ideal opportunity if he can get a, a drive in Orica at 07, because remarkably, this dominant car in LMP2, whilst he races it and wins in it in uh, North America, he's never raced one here. Mm. So the door is open for that. Yeah, I think Keating's really been there. Uh, He's had such a solid performance here. Brilliant in qualifying, as I said earlier on. And uh, I think the thing that I'm most impressed by, not just with his efforts, but the whole team, was that never give up attitude. They had problems with the uh, suspension earlier on in the race, and uh, they just put their foot down, got on with the job. And Ben particularly, you know, brilliant effort to, uh, to get that car right back up to the sharp end to lead this race as into the pit lane comes the car 51 with 5% energy remaining you can see on the left hand side of your screen there yep inside the final 25 minutes uh, good thought from my buddy Ken Childs watching in Durham North Carolina would it be the second time only a Garage 56 entry has finished Le Mans if the number 24 car finishes. Signaling method car 34 in the signaling area under investigation. That's waving the bit of plastic out because they didn't have any radio. Uh, the answer is uh, Frederick Sose finished. I think mm. his... He's classified as a finisher. Yes, he was. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the Academy car he put together finished. I'll check that. Okay. In which case, possibly the third. Now, you can see that all the pit boards are on sort of swivelly arm things, so they swivel out of the way, and that's a, presumably a safety rule. Uh, you don't normally have somebody holding a pit board out anymore. And uh, you saw the 34 team making a big plastic sort of name card from the top of the garage into a pit board for Fabio Scherer because he's lost his radio. I would sense that perhaps there might be a little fine he's going to have to recycle the car isn't it this could be drama for ferrari eh? of no. course uh, it happened before the engine refused to stop about four hours ago refused to start again and they had to go through a power cycle and that time i think it was also Alessandro Pierre Guidi, you can hear his engineer very calmly giving him the instructions. It's right there in front of you. Do this, do that. Wait there. Sit there. Okay, lights are on. Is anybody home? Yes, they are. Okay. So twice in this morning, early afternoon, or the af early afternoon and uh, mid-afternoon now, the car, yeah, heart-in-the-mouth moment at Toyota. Damn it, they're saying. But 
The eight is at Arnage, by the way. Yeah. OK, just a moment of worry there. Now, they've had two or three. <laughs> James Gallardo can't bear it. It's... They've had two or three. Absolutely no drama pit stops since then. No drama at all. Fired up, boom, gone. And now it's done it again. Louise Beckett. I'm just looking at that picture of James Collado now and think, I've seen that about three times before here, but when he's been in GT, and most of the time it's turned out OK and he's won, but uh, just that picture of his head in his hands. Yeah, that's a very... <laughs> it's, a, it's a not... And again, as Guy Smith said, and again, Ab Davidson will be the same. When you are in the garage, powerless, and just watching and waiting for the axe to fall, that must be... A pretty tough deal now then. Nose cone being moved in the Ferrari garage. I don't think that's to make room for the dancing and celebrating. No. Final pit stop by the way underway, or on pit road rather, for the number two Cadillac. Looks at the moment in third place and not threatened on pace from behind. Uh, LMP2 by the way, uh, Fabio Scherer is pulling away from Louis Delatraz, but we have that pit signalling under investigation. The method of pit signaling, which we saw, was racer tape spelling out a message with no radio for the 34, mm. uh, getting him to box, and also team member over the uh, with arms over the wall trying to signal how many laps to pit. Yeah. I'd have to check if not regulations. This this stage, <sighs> lap of the gods. Yeah, that that would be extraordinarily that harsh really if they cruel, receive a if real penalty for that, particularly given that it's not just a car trying to finish the race it's about victory in the class in the uh, p2 cars you do have or any car you have meetings lots of meetings prior to the race you know full well when you have the fuel warning light coming on you know full well at which point on the circuit if it comes on there you have to box if it comes on in another place on a track you're okay to carry oh, on it's 709 709 it's yeah, 708 is in the pit lane, Olivier Platt, that car, 709, is in seventh place. And the car behind it, the eighth place, number five Porsche, the also in the pit lane. Out again. Oh, this first chicane. I mean, it's bone dry, and it's still catching out cars. It's always a tricky one, that first chicane, because you're braking, turning into the right, and then you carry on braking as you turn the car left, and... That change of uh, body roll in the car really doesn't like it. You come from such high speed, of course, down the Mulsanne straight. Yep. Now he's completely beached that car. Won't be able to reverse out of it. He's going to need external help. He is, and we've got under 20 minutes to go. By the way, the sister car, just before it uh, pitted, had gone up to sixth place because of the issue for the number five Porsche Penske Motorsport 963. So the lead car, the full season car, 708, is in sixth. The seventh place car, remember, to retain any finishing position, you have to cross the line. Yeah. Well, he's in a position where they can easily push him back and put him onto terra firma relatively easily and relatively quickly. I think, I think he's going to need a lift. Toyota team are on their feet. They will be ready, I don't think this lap, for the number eight Toyota Gazoo racing entry, but maybe the next lap. Antonio Giovinazzi there, James Collado. Sitting, waiting, watching. How many GT wins have they had? Colado Pierre Guidi? Uh, here? Mm. I'd have to go and check. Yeah, um, I'd have to go and check what as well. A, one other very uh, quick thing to, to mention is GR Racing in the hands of Ricardo Pera is gradually edging away from the Iron Dames in that final podium position. Mm. The gap is growing very slightly. It's out to seven seconds now. Rahal Fry was Taking time out of him. Well, there you go. Call me a liar. Number eight car comes down pit road. Yeah, see, I didn't think they needed to come in now. 13% would have taken him round at least another lap. But in they come. 709 Glickenhaus. I think they come in as well. Guys, I think they might have come in because the uh, there's a full course here. Yeah. The um, slow, zone slow zone is about to come out. Exactly right. So you might as well do the pit stop now in hope that... Uh, it won't be there by the time you get back out, but I'm pretty sure it will be. Another one of those racing vision tear-off visors being peeled off the windscreen. And the answer, by the way, more. about James Collado and Alessandro Piergridi uh, for uh, wins here in GT Pro. The answer is um, Collado has two wins in 2019 and 2021 and three second places. Wow. Uh, Alessandro Piergridi 
um, as the two wins and two second places. OK. That is in GT Pro, which ceased to be part of the championship at the end of last season, so they took the final title as well, the third of their championship titles as a duo. And, of course, winning them on with double points, 50 points for victory here. That never hurts your championship campaign. Number eight team is done. 17 minutes to go in the centenary Le Mans. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin and Anthony Davidson. Well, they didn't go down without a fight, did they, Toyota? And I think that's what uh, has impressed me the most with them, their efforts this race here at the centenary event at Le Mans. They were, they were, you know, fighting right to the end. We're still 16 minutes still to go, of course, but, I mean, in terms of pure performance, it was very evenly matched with Ferrari, and to the point where they had to both push themselves into uncomfortable territory, I'd say. I completely agree. And I think that's what's defined this race. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it, it, it pushed both driver and machine right over the limit at points. And, uh, yeah, like I say, massively uncomfortable and something was going to give i had the feeling something was going to give they were they were trading fastest laps all the time uh it was at the time it was uh, brendan hartley uh, versus uh giovinazzi and it you just felt like you were going to meet boiling point and uh yeah it was rio when he got in the car warned by brendan hartley that the rear end was very unstable we had to be careful with the saturation of the brakes and how it was too much on the rear end he couldn't do anything about it uh, there were clearly it was clearly the achilles heel of that car this whole race or pretty much the whole race warned by brendan but still the rear locked up into arnage and uh, and that effectively cost them the uh, the chance to take the fight all the way to to the the dying seconds of this race. Of course, Cadillac racing in third and fourth. Delighted to have those sounds of America. Delighted to have this sound of America. Awful lot of fans saying the only reason they've been able to stay awake through the night is that every four minutes there's a thundering V8 alarm clock comes, comes rolling by. I'm delighted also to have had on the team another voice of American motorsport, Jim Roller. It's. I hope it's not been a disappointing race for your return to Le Mans. Oh, heavens no. This has been fantastic. This has been everything I'd hoped it would be. Uh, it has been absolutely wonderful to finally see these hyper cars in person. And Anthony summed it up greatly. I mean, this is, uh, came down to the final uh, 45 minutes. You can't ask for more than that. There, maybe they'll be second guessed about maybe who should have finished the race for uh, for Toyota, but I'll leave that to, to other people. There's a happy man right yep. there. And you're going to have um, two American class winning cars. Yeah, that's right. That might be a first. Yeah. With the Corvette winning in GTM, at least at the moment, and the Hendrick Motorsport Chevy Camaro winning in the Invitational class. OK, well, I feel win, the one, but, win, you know. Winning, winning popular opinion. Well, well absolutely. <laughs> winning hearts and minds yeah, here exactly. and, uh, in a huge number. And I mean, not saying that they have won yet. I mean, if, if anyone knows better than anybody else, it's me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and <laughs> just, if, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, YouTube 2016 Toyota, then you'll know. Uh, literally the last lap of the race we were in the lead by a minute and a half and we didn't win um so i'm not saying that probably have one but if they were to win then you want to beat the best you don't want it handed to you this race hasn't been handed to them they've had the speed they were on pole position as front row lockout they haven't made strategical errors they've been right on the money all the time all the way through this race all the drivers driven brilliantly well one little error from Pierre Guidi in the night, but that I forgive him because there was a spinning car in front of him in that first chicane. So he's, he was actually one of the pivotal moments of the race where he really got that car into the lead and, and excelled. Uh, and you want to beat the best. That's the thing, Toyota are the best. They're leading the World Championship. We've had three races, they're leading the World Championship, and they come here with the target on their back. And when you stand on that top step of the podium, you want to look over your shoulder and know that the best is standing next to you, and on that day, you were better. I completely agree. You've taken some of the words out of my mouth on this one. The best thing about this race, we'll come to the events in due course, is it's not been easy to win. It would have been, it's been very easy to lose for some people, but it's not been easy to win. The depth of, of competition, 
the scale of that competition. Um, this is uh, the 31 WRT car, the third place yeah. car. That was uh, not as he lost a Ferrari third place. nose coming through a garage. It was a WRT nose yes, coming through a garage. Problem it's a identified the colour. So have they got a braking issue or a clutch issue? It looked like they were working, or a steering rack issue. It looked like they were working on the master cylinder. Decay go through into a podium position and that's for why this. You saw the excitement and the, and the, no, 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 don't, no, don't yet. Don't yet. Everybody's done holding yet. their breath. But the final thing, it, it, it is thrown incident and it's thrown drama and it's thrown fantastic racing and uncertainty at us. Mm. Lap after lap after lap after lap after lap. This is truly a worthy race for a centenary. And Jim Roller, it's been an epically talented field in the hypercar class. You can't possibly fault the choice of any of the drivers in the cars. No. In GTM, in, G in LMP2 as well. It's just been such hard, close racing. The, the, my last trip here was 2019 before COVID, and in the intervening years, I have seen an improvement in the GTEM category. And, and it really showed in this event, not only with the way uh, Ben Keating qualified the car, but the way that team came back, the great battle with the uh, 25 car and the 85 car. Uh, we, I've enjoyed the, the Ben Keating, Sarah Bovey um, battle all season long in, in the bronze category. But Ferrari is going to, uh, in 11 minutes, they hope, they have fingers crossed, that they will, will gather finally their 10th victory at this great race and that is uh that's a milestone that that they can hold proudly that's a massive result for ferrari it's a massive result for this rule set it's a massive result for the 24 hours of le mans ferrari are back in the top class and in winning form we said after hyperpole that uh, that would be a news item that would be in timelines yeah. otherwise we'd never have seen anything about this the and boy are we going to get another one the only manufacturers that have won more porsche and audi yep yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, yeah. again, it's one of those things that happens in life that if you wrote it in the script, yeah, they come back after 50 years and they win one of the toughest races on record. Oh, okay, that's a bit far-fetched. Can you just put a bit more jeopardy in there, a few more failures? Listen, from day one, we knew that they had potential. We went to Sebring and they shook Toyota. I mean, genuinely shook Toyota by taking pole position. Then Toyota fought back and took the race win, they won two in Portimao, they won in Spa-Francorchamps, but there's been a Ferrari on the podium at every race. They started their return to Le Mans with pole position in the hyperpole, with a front row lockout. How much of that was just sprint race pace? How long would the cars last? Well, the answer is they've traded blows with everyone around them, slugged it out, and they are still standing at the top of the pile and as a team as well, we kept saying they were a test team when they arrived in Sebring. They'd done a lot of kilometers in testing. Obviously, as a new team, you're allowed to do more testing miles than an established team like the likes of Toyota. Uh, but still, you're not a race team. This race is the first time I've seen them be a race team. Take it easy, take it easy. No need to push, slow laps are good. Here, Neil Bamba in the number two car lap. For whatever reason, you guys are. I've uh, I had my audio turned off. Yeah, nine minutes to go, and uh, we're closing in on history. 1973, the last time a factory Ferrari team entered here. 1965, the last time a Ferrari factory team won overall here. Master Gregory and Jochen Rint in the Ferrari 250 LM. I was one year old. <laughs> I was minus 20. <laughs> uh, 38 te Hertz Team Jota coming out, as is the number five Porsche, ready for the final lap. 94 Peugeot should leave the pit lane now as well. They're going to need to find some pace to make sure that they are classified as finishers. DKR have finished their final pit stop. And it looks as though the number five Porsche, unless it leaves, is not going to make it. Well, those two guys, their teammates, Rio Hirakawa, they know what it takes to win Le Mans. They've done it plenty of times. It looks right now as if it may not be their turn. 
For info, if we do three minute 38 lap times, we reduce one lap from the race. Mm. Okay. That um, seems like more do... of an order than a message. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That seems like the, definitely the right thing to do. Yes. If you do three minute 35s, we have to do another whole lap, and we may not want to do that. So just, yeah, lift and coast, lift and coast. Not necessarily go slowly, not lose your focus, just lift and coast. So Ferrari 51 leads from the number eight Toyota Kazoo Racing car. That is the line now for what should be the anti-penultimate anti -penultimate time. Cadillac Racing's number two car in the moment, completing the overall podium positions in the classes into Europol, 16.3 seconds ahead of Team WRT <laughs> and Duquesne team. That's what it means to Albert Costa. Yeah, focusing on the phone. Don't think about it. Absolutely. Don't look at it. Wait for it to happen. Yeah, the problem is that the, uh, the internal combustion engine doesn't know there are six minutes remaining. <laughs> no. The gearbox doesn't know there are six minutes remaining. It doesn't know what time is. <laughs> no. It doesn't live by time. And it actually, just does its thing, and when it breaks, it can break. And actually, and, the, and it, it's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be okay. okay. <laughs> and in the inter Europe kind of car, because right? he's not got a radio, yeah. Fabio Scherer doesn't know absolutely how much time right. he's got uh, absolutely right. But, uh, but that is right. This, that, how many times do we have to have this race throw drama at us um, before we stop making assumptions? That's why I'm calling it as I see it at the moment. In GTM, it's this car, magnificent run from the Corvette racing team all season to this point. Double points for the WEC, that's less important right now to Ben Keating is watching the TV uh, and the, the, uh, the, the car tracker. They are way ahead of the ORT by TF Aston Martin, Charlie Eastwood, uh, looking to bring the 25 car home. What a day for the tiny nation of Oman. Six like minutes. any uh, like any Gen Zs would be doing, just go straight to the phone. If you Absolutely. want to preoccupy yourself, straight to the mobile what phone. What did drivers do before there was Twitter and and, and 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 TikTok to watch and WhatsApp? You know, what did you do when you didn't have a phone to distract? You couldn't it's do anything. To focus we were on, just it? we were stressing like Ben Here, Keating. That's what we were doing. They, they paced and they went out back and smoked a cigarette. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this we were is like the... Ben Keating. And look, this is how the youngins do it. Just this go straight to the mobile phone. This is how difficult this race was. Three safety car periods. Three Three hours under safety car and lots of full course yellow as well. Ben Keating is just all over this, isn't he? Yeah. Before we forget the final podium position at the moment in the hands of GR Racing, they have fought for that position all day, all night, and all day again. Uh, Mike Wainwright, Ricardo Perra, who's at the wheel of the car at the moment, and Ben Barker winning a battle. And it, boy, was it a battle with the Iron Dames yeah. uh, with five minutes to go. And it is, yeah, that's going to be a tough break from the Iron Dames. They've been in contention for a podium here at Le Mans all the way through the race. They've led, they've been in the top three, they've been in the top six, always on the lead lap. And just to miss out by 10 seconds, that's going to be a tough one. For many, many years, uh, one of the most popular sporting shows in America was ABC Wide World of Sports, and its famous opening was the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think I have seen in a, a long time a better picture that shows agony of defeat than the look in poor Brendan Hartley's eyes just moments ago. Well, that we was, saw, we that, shall, that saw Michelle great. Gatting as well, very yes. red-eyed in the Iron Dames garage when it seemed that they were going to lose that podium spot yeah. that they've been fighting so hard for for the last few years. But just finishing this race, you're a winner. I know that sounds like, you know... It, it does sound trite, but, but boy, it's not, this is it's one of the not. toughest things you'll ever do in sport. And, and I think... learned that the first time I, in 2000 when... Uh, uh, when I for my first time back after my, my uh, since 1995 and it to see the teams that may have finished fifth or sixth but had fought back from great adversity or, or a crash to finish the race they were just as emotional and joyous at the end of the race as the winners yeah I think it, the, it gets to that point doesn't it where if you're in contention for a win, of course it's going to hurt, but there's a point for many of these teams where the objective has become get it home. Last lap for the 2023, 24 hours of Le Mans. Alessandro Pierre Guidi on, I'm sure, what be, will be a phenomenally emotional tour of the Circuit de la South. 12.626 kilometers to take it all. The glory, the headlines, but most of all, the win at this great race. 
and what a race it has been. In-depth look at the tribunes, absolutely rammed. But how many of these cars have actually won? Martin Avon, bring them home. 24 hours ago, everyone was a winner. One of the busiest grids I've ever seen in motorsport and what looked like one of the most relaxed. Everybody excited just to start the Centenary Le Mans to be part of a packed field of talent in GTE Am, in LMP2, and especially in this burgeoning hypercar class. And for everybody, a capacity audience of more than 300,000, the celebrations that had built up to it, it was just a big party waiting for the starting signal. And 24 hours later, quite incredible history is going to be written here again at Le Mans. The last time a factory entered Ferrari, raced in the 24 hours, it finished in second place 50 years ago. 50 years later, the team again started from pole position. And they're on the final lap of this epic voyage. The car rolled out at Fiorano less than 12 months ago, beginning the physical part of this development program of the 499P. And the Ferrari AF Corsa team have worked relentlessly since, testing, formatting, homologating the car, and then bringing it to America, taking it to Sebring to start the FIA World Endurance Championship season. Ferrari, Cadillac, Porsche, Glickenhaus, and Floyd Van Wall came here to take on the established benchmarks, the multiple winners, the five-time consecutive Le Mans winners Toyota Gazoo Racing, and they all had a chance to lead. Almost every car in hypercar at some stage led the race. Toyota lost a car early, Ferrari lost a car early in the night time, and Peugeot and Porsche struggled more perhaps than would seem fair. But in the end, one team only can come away with victory, and incredibly, it seems that Ferrari will complete that fairy tale story. Half the history of this race has gone by without Ferrari, one of its most successful marks. And when they return, they have got two GT multiple world champions in the car, and they are going to end up with victory here at Le Mans. And we will have three different hypercar brands on the podium. Ferrari, Victors, Toyota taking second, and Cadillac Racing in third position. As the clock reaches four o'clock Central European summer time on Sunday in Le Mans, it is going to be victory in the centenary race for 51 Ferrari AF Corsa. And it is Alessandro Pierre Guidi, I'm sure in floods of tears, who takes the chequered flag. What an enormous moment for the team, for Ferrari fans across the globe, and for that trio of drivers. Ferrari wins Le Mans. Ale, we won Le Mans! <laughs> Astonishing, astonishing race in the LMP2 class. The first ever Polish winners into Europol. Fabio Scherer, who had his foot run over by the Corvette early in the race, has hopped in and out of the car and with his teammates have brought this tiny, literally family-owned and populated team to the very highest accolade in their division of the sport into Europol competition, win LMP2 from WRT with Duquesne in third place. A huge result for that small French team. But look at this, just can't believe the celebrations. Toyota Gazoo Racing, Rio Hirokawa will bring the number eight car to the line in second place ahead of the numbers two and three Cadillacs. And Corvette Racing will claim victory. Oh, my God, man, I have no words. After 50 years, we are back. That will be clipped up and across social media while the caption is still on air. Antonio Giovinazzi, Ferrari have won Le Mans outright. How does that sound to you? You've all worked so hard. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, really emotional. Uh, I have no word to be honest. You know, it's, uh, I dreamed this since I was a kid. Now I'm here with Ferrari winning Le Mans. It's uh, just a special day. I've got goosebumps, so I just cannot imagine how you feel. You can go and celebrate with your team now. Thank you very much. Louise Beckett there in the throng of a very Italian party. And Cadillac Racing, what a result for these guys. Sec a third and fourth for the number two and the number three cars. 3-1-1, the Action Express car also running. They get all three cars to the line. What a great effort and great for GM, great for Corvette Racing. Their final Le Mans in this format. And great for Ben Keating. He wins again as Nicky Katzberg brings the car across the line. Fabulous stuff, yep. isn't it, from this effort? Uh, third place, by the way, secured after a late run. Uh, tried to get to the back of the GR Racing team. Five seconds short, though, it will be GR Racing behind the RT by TF. And this is our LMP2 Pro Am winner. Yep. So Pro-Am victory going to Algarve Pro. Colin Brown bringing a car to the line. Congratulations to those guys. Again, small team. Yeah, Colin coming back after his last appearance here in 2008. Colin Tracy Brown uh, a week ago let a lady switch seats with the lady on the airplane because she was afraid of flying backwards. And I told him when he did it, I said, you know, you might get some good karma next weekend. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And what a sight. This car, when it, when it rolled out at Sebring, looked like a race car. And boy, has it behaved like one. Jakob Skomosti, 34, is the LMP2 Le Mans winner. That is just incredible for you to achieve. Yeah, I mean... It's just incredible, as you say. Uh, it's a dream come true, and I think it's all what we, we've worked for for the past years. And it's uh, it's just I'm just speechless that it happened. Really speechless. I'm so happy for you, Alva Costa, joining the team this year. And wow, it's paid off. Please call me the ro the oldest rookie of the championship. I'm rookie. I won I won the match now. But I can say I'm lost the words. This is amazing. I, well done. <laughs> my dad. Oh, I'll go and let you see your tear, your family. Well done. Can be a huge number of tears here. That tiny team into Europol, they've barely been racing for 10 years. They have started in regional sports car racing in Europe, and it has grown and grown through the entire ACO ladder from the Michelin Le Mans Cup in LMP3. They moved into LMP2. And then they have moved into the World Championship, and Chip Ganassi gets a car on the podium at Le Mans. And that's something that he will remember a very long time. And he gets one over on his old friend, Roger. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> the two Peugeots, by the way, how much better did they do than we thought they would coming yep. into this race? Yep. The other quick thing, uh, it is the first Polish team to ever win a class um, at Le Mans. And uh, you're right, family-owned team, very proud indeed. Quick thought for our friend Martin Carter Fleming, who played a great big part yep. in the uh, development of this team. And this, by the way, is only their second ever race win in LMP2. Wow, The first came impressive. only this year in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, fantastic for them. Hi to Cara and uh, our thoughts as well. And uh, great thanks for more than a quarter of a century of helping us out, helping me out particularly to great Fiona Miller who has just finished or will finish later this evening her last Le Mans but there James Collado he's been in victory circle he's been on the podium he's never been the first one out not like this not like this, <laughs> not like like this. Antonio Caleta, the man behind this effort the man that's uh, been tasked with delivering this and I'm sure for arguing with what's been required to make it tick and Charles Leclerc in there somewhere enjoying the delights of a very different Ferrari team claiming victory. What it? a thing. And by the way, we also saw the Garage 24, the innovative entry, Hendrix Motorsports, their NASCAR Generation 7 Camaro, the boogity, boogity, boogity made it all the way through. They might have had to have rebuilt the tranny, but, you know, what's an American classic car if you don't have to rebuild Build the, the tranny. tranny occasionally? There you go. I, I, may I may never forgive you for the boogity, boogity, boogity. <laughs> that wasn't my fault, but I, I'm, I'm taking that. That was, uh, that was a, a great, great addition to the field this year. Let's hear from Toyota Gazoo Racing. 
Camille Kobayashi, that was one hard Le Mans. Yep, obviously, yes. Uh, I think we did everything we could do. I think we did a great job, amazing job. Unfortunately, we I think we have not enough pace to the race. And Micah also had a very bad luck during the race. It was not our day, but uh, definitely we will come back strong. And I think the team this time made really strong. Everybody be together to only one goal to winning. And really thanks all the team, all the effort from Japan, from Cologne. And of course, uh, Mr. Toyota-san, Morizo-san, and uh, our president, Sato-san, back in Japan. Yeah. And uh, this time, uh, our grandfather, hybrid grandfather, Uchiyama-san, came as well. It's really a shame we couldn't win, but uh, yeah, I think we had to become strong. Thank you. Thank you. What's it going to be like in Marinello on oh. say, Tuesday when these guys show up with the trophy? I was going to say it's walk quite into quiet the, quiet walk into they'll the still be recovering from their hangovers. Walk into the Formula One shop and put that bad boy up there. Yeah. Rub on it with their sleeve. Well, and, and the deal there you is, go, fellas. the deal Beat is, that. of course, that it's not your standard 24-hour trophy. It will be oh, a yeah. unique trophy, the Centenary so. Trophy will be very different. They will get their own personal Le Mans 24-hour replica trophies. What a what a wonderful moment for, for fans of motor racing everywhere. Ferrari is such an evocative name. They've been part of the sport really, you know, since the post-war years. They've been just the, one of the dominant names in the sport. And to take victory at Le Mans, and, and not just in a single car field or, a, you know, with no opposition in one of the toughest races in years and years and years. And actually, to, to my great delight, that's what the centenary race will be remembered for. Yes, all the fun and all the show and the old cars and getting great names back here and, and, and all of that. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But in the end, we will remember this as, wow, do you remember that race when Ferrari came back? Wow, that was, we said at the beginning, this could be one for the ages. It was. I don't think we quite believed it, did we? I don't think we quite believed how good this could be. The greatest thing about this race, it's not that Ferrari had won it, it's that Ferrari had to fight for it. Yep. And we've had right. great winners in this race, but great losers as well, uh, and in depth. And what we've seen through the last 24 hours on this fable track, is ample evidence that there's more and better still to come. And the fact of it, Jim, is that Toyota could have won it easily. Cadillac could have won it easily. Peugeot on pace could have won it easily. Porsche, Porsche could have won it easily. Jota. You know, I guess. Hurts team Jota. Actually, probably Glickenhaus couldn't. Probably, almost certainly, Floyd Van Wall didn't have the pace and longevity. But the five big hitters, they all led, and they could all have been on the top spot. They all had Le Mans their chance. shows these guys. That's right. And you, you said that at the beginning of the show. It isn't necessarily uh, on paper who's going to be best. It's who does Le Mans choose. Yep. And Lady Luck has shined down. And, and, there, there's, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is a lucky win. But the difference between hero and second and possibly third. Look at that. Well, the difference between fire. 51 and 50 yeah. is zero. Other than one Lady problem. Luck, that's right. Le Mans one, shows 51. One, one problem, that's right. That's all it is. In, in a class that is now dominated by factory entries, I can barely believe we're saying that, um, <laughs> all of them have got headlines they can take home and justify this. Mm -hmm. All of them. Yeah. Glickenhaus bring home a headline that says, we are still 100% top 10 Le Mans finishes with every car we've ever Never entered. Entry. There is one entry and one entry only that ends without a headline they'd like to write, and that is the, sadly the four car, but uh, Hertz Team Jota won, could have won this race. Well, they could do have won the this race. They do hold absolutely. the record for most starts without finishing. In that there you go, season. absolutely right. And the fastest lap of the race, that went to Antonio Fuoco in the number 50 Ferrari. The, the Toyota number eight, that had the fastest time in the first sector of the race but the fastest time in sector two and sector three both went to 
Antonio Fuoco in the 50 car. But for now, it is all about three men and one car. Antonio Giovinazzi, you can see. James Collado will get in the other door. Alessandro Pierre Guidi. How many years do you think he aged while he was busy control all deleting in the final pit stop in the final half oh an hour? Oh my god. Look oh at those images. God. Look at the stand. The shot of Collado just with his face yeah. and his hands. His, yeah. Look, this is back to the absolute zenith of Group C, but there are more grandstand seats and there is more standing area on the straight. I can remember watching the beginning and the end of the race, Jaguar versus Porsche versus Mercedes, all of that. It was like that. It was shoulder to shoulder, it was elbow to elbow. But there is more here. There are more facilities now than ever before. There's more viewing, there's more you know, toilet blocks, there's more showers, there's more catering, there's more everything. It's a better event. It's a better more event. Than, yeah, more than 300,000, getting off of 350,000 people watching us and that's aside from all the caterers all the security staff all the people working in franchises and shops and, and everything else and all the vip guests and a worldwide audience yeah and that's that's before we even turn on the, the tv cameras yeah just just the crowd here alone justifies this as one of the greatest Le Mans races ever. I just interject for 10 seconds to just clear up one last thing in the inbox because there was one last investigation we hadn't called. That was the Inter Europol uh, investigation, uh, and that's uh, for the pit board reprimand. Yep. The, the result will stand. It, it would have been beyond reckless, cruel, and heartless to have done anything other than say, guys, we know why you did it. You can see all the other pit boards, they're all firmly fixed, they can't be dropped in the track, they can't be, they can't come out and they hit a car. Something handheld and loose and wobbly it's could do. So for safety reasons, that's why it's not done any longer the old manual way. And probably that's not a bad thing, but yes, we understand why it happened. In the same way that when you go off track to avoid a much slower car and avoid an accident, now it's not legal, but we know why you did it, so you only get a reprimand. And there is Matty Pregliasco, a man who has been instrumental in so much success for AF Corsa and Ferrari in the GT categories. And now, good Lord, wins Le Mans outright with this team of young men and this car. Yep, a Ferrari race driver himself back at the beginning of the century, Batty, and I'm sure he could not be more proud of what he's <laughs> been a part of here. Extraordinary well, scene. Now then, three-time GTE Pro World Champions, James Collado and Alessandro Pueguidi, and they have just added 50 fat points to their championship. Could they also win the title? <laughs> OK, that's a long way away. We've got three more long races to go. And right now, they don't care. But when they rock up to Monza, and by the way, if you can get a ticket for Monza still, come to Monza. Can you just imagine? Question for Graham. What is the status of the 33 in the championship? The uh, not, victory here I need to almost do crunch, clinched it. I need to crunch, uh, crunch the points, but they're very close. They yeah. can certainly clinch it at Monza. And they came pretty close to doing it here. They have got a massive, massive lead. 325,000 people were here to watch this. That is the official wow. crowd figure. And again, 3,000 marshals around the circuit. Thank you to every single one of them. Thank you to all of the organizing staff, the security staff, the people who checked us in and out when we were coming in and out of the circuit, the people who looked after everybody on the campsites, the people who have been supplying food and drinks to everybody, to our caterers. And actually closer to home, just want to say so much as ever, thanks to AMP Visual, without whom this would have been a radio show that only we would have heard. There would have been no pictures, no video, no audio. And to Alchemel Systems as well. Alchemel celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've provided graphics for the World Endurance Championship and for the ACO all the way through. And uh, they work constantly to improve what we can show you at home. And we will continue to do that. Everything at the moment, everybody is looking to improve 
and they do year by year and we will try and keep pace with that and do the same so thanks to all of our partners to the championship partners as well the tire suppliers like michelin and goodyear to total energies who've supplied the renewable fuels not just for all the cars racing here but also for all the tyre heaters here as well. That fuel has been supplied, sustainable fuel free of charge. There's Nikki Katzberg, may possibly wear a cowboy hat with pride again, I think, as he celebrates victory in the 33 car. There you go. And the shades. There are your overall winners, and you can see in the green and yellow overalls the guys from Inter Europol as well. There have been many men who have proudly waved the prancing horse of the Scuderia on the top step of the podium. And these are just the latest three to be able to do that. And in this particular branch of the sport, it's been a 50-year hiatus. That's a long wait by anybody's standards. As for LMP2, uh, Manley's first year in LMP2, Albert Costa moving over from his Lamborghini GT3 career. Mm. A man who had his foot run over by another class winner <laughs> and a baker from Poland. Uh, yes. That is quite the fairy tale story. Kubis Michowski, the baker's boy. And there are the marshals applauding the fans, the fans applauding the marshals, and rightly so. And again, um, you know, every time we've been out and about in the paddock and in the village and around the circuit, it's just been joyful. It's been beautiful weather, really scorching hot weather all week, actually, until race weekend. Uh, so the fans have had the best of everything here. An exciting race, fantastic atmosphere, and uh, a, a few really, really astonishing results. Got to spare a thought for the crew of the Iron Dames Porsche. How far behind in the end? Just five seconds. five seconds after 24 hours off the podium, and that is a tough, tough one to take. They will come back, and they will win. They are good enough. They will do it. Ferrari victorious in the Centenary Le Mans. Toyota Gazoo Racing, car number eight. The defending champions take second. Cadillac third and fourth, and then a second Ferrari ahead of the pair of Glickenhouses, the better of the Peugeots, in eighth position. And in the end, we only lost permanently two of our hypercar entries. Of our 62 starters, 40 made it to the finish line, including the much delayed Hertz Team Jota car, the final car to be classified in the Centenary Le Mans. Well, there will be a very great deal of high fiving, hugging, celebrating going on. Forward rolls in the gravel traps, yeah, why not? Kids running wild, yeah, why not? All the gates have been open. What the organizers want more than anything else is for a sea of humanity that can't be beaten underneath the podium. That's the joy, they're gonna get it. And we've missed that, and we through the COVID years. I was gonna say, that's the thing, you took the words right out of my mouth. That sea of humanity is the classic Le Mans shot. This is what it's all about. As Don Paino said when he founded the American Le Mans series in a quarter of a century ago, for the fans, that's why they do it. That's why the teams come, that's why the manufacturers come. They come for the glory, but the glory helps them sell cars. It helps boost their image. That's why they're here. For some manufacturers, they've been doing it since day one. You think of Porsche. For some, they've been doing it for more than most of them can remember. You think of Toyota and Ferrari. Well, they haven't done this for a while. There you go. There come the gates. Come on in, kids. Bring the flags. Fans of all ages here. So great to see so many. And again, because of the centenary, I'm sure even more people made even more effort to make it a family holiday or to bring friends, to bring new friends, to convert more to this glorious, slightly crazy, what am I talking about? Utterly bonkers form of motorsport. I've been here with my kid. I'm here this year with my kid. Yep. And uh, close to 30 years difference between when we turned up here in 1995 and this centenary year. And the emotions are still the same. Mm -hmm. it Absolutely. It is still and always will be an absolutely world-class motor race and a world-class event. A, an event on a scale not very easily matched around the planet and the storylines they start now they're going to take a while for the ladies and gentlemen in the press room 
and the broadcast edit suites to put together, but they include, of course, that's a win for Ferrari. Uh, two of the men that have taken this win are now winners in two separate classes, including the overall, Tom Christensen and Charles Leclerc there. Again, you can see our guys filming for the all access programs, which will be out in around 10 days. Boy, that's, if you thought Le Mans was sleepless, wait oh. till you try, wait till you try editing Le Mans and all of the different backroom footage you get into 40 minutes. That's a sleepless 10 days, my friends. That's a sleepless 10 days. Before we forget, uh, because we're gonna get into the ceremonials of this quite correctly very soon. If you're a first timer watching the Le Mans 24 hours and you've enjoyed this racing, guess what? We do a lot more of it and we'll be racing again next month. Um, and it's gonna be a quiet provincial circuit where there's gonna be no excitement <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, just outside Milan, Monza yeah. <laughs> greeting their Le Mans winners. Oh my gosh, what is yeah. that going to be like? Well, we said in qualifying that pole position surely would have put another 25,000 on the ticket sales. I, I, I don't even want to think about it, Martin. No, I know. <laughs> Ferrari, Ferrari told us that the ticket sales are up five-fold on last year. That was before qualifying. And that was before qualifying. I, I, yeah, it's, it's going to be a sea of humanity and most of it wearing red. I cannot wait. <sighs> L.T. Jakobsen there with mm -hmm. Ben Keating in the middle. Uh, Nicolas Pierre with his back to us at that point. Yeah, Mountain, the second place car in the Pro-Am category. Yep. So we have four podiums to get through. GTE Am and LMP2 Pro-Am, LMP2 and Hypercar. The Invitational car does not get a podium. What they do get though is 325,000 big broad smiles and a huge thank you for bringing that Chevy Camaro Gen 7 Cup car to a whole different audience. There will be people here, of course, who know about NASCAR, who probably are passionate about NASCAR, about many other forms of motorsport. And there'll be a whole bunch who never really gave it a second thought, but who have been noisily and excitingly converted to the possibility that going round on an oval in a pack of 40 plus cars might actually be really quite entertaining and dead hard work and all that. President of the ACO, Pierre Fion on the right hand side there, Fred Lacan in the blazer who runs the FIA World Endurance Championship. You saw Charles Leclerc there as well, greeting fellow Marinello representatives in that podium room. And one of the great joys about Le Mans, because it's a team sport, is you don't get that staircase of awkwardness and the pre-podium room of awkwardness that you see so often in Formula One with two or three drivers who may not necessarily want to be that close to each other after perhaps a fractious race. Here, even if the race is very, very, very tired, tight, in the end, when you get into that room, you're united by one thing. You conquered Le Mans. Le Mans did not beat you, and that is a tough thing to say. It's a tough thing to achieve. There's an awful lot of cars that came here. Fully a third of our grid didn't make the checkered flag, and that is a high attrition it's, rate. It is an extraordinary, I think, for mm. the modern era. No and it wasn't crunched. cars breaking down and falling apart and catching fire and blowing turbos. Generally, the scenery had more effect on the shape of the cars than any other item. Well, did Yanni told us they would be fighting for the podium? They did. They've got there. Yep. And Third uh, place finish. Absolutely. Neil with Renny Binder and Jan Nico Pino, a Chilean racer on the podium at Le Mans. Yet another nation. It's got to be a first, hasn't it? Even without checking, you think that must be a first. Let's take a look at our overall classification then. Ferrari AF Corsa victorious over Toyota Gazoo Racing. Cadillacs finishing in third and fourth places ahead of the delayed second Ferrari. Glickenhaus sixth and seventh to get a 100% top 10 finishing record ahead of the better of the Peugeots. Into your pole, Team WRT and Duquesne fill the podium in the LMP2 and in LMP2 Pro-Am. Algarve Pro's number 45 crew take victory from 37 Cool Racing and the third Pro-Am car, DKR Engineering car number 15. Corvette Racing 
ORT by TF and GR Racing are our podium finishers. GR taking the third spot in GTE and by just five seconds ahead of the Iron Dames. And you can see, again, the agony and the ecstasy, the tears of joy and defeat in that pre-podium room. For every winner, there will be a whole host of teams that could have, would have, should have. And that's what makes them come back. Because whether it's Le Mans that defeats you or a rival, either way, you've taken on the challenge and you don't want to stop until you succeed. Your smiles for Sebastian Buemi and Brendan Hartley. Brendan just really looking after Rio Hirakara. Comforting the young man. Yeah. Yeah. He probably feels a degree of responsibility for the fact they're not on the top step of the podium. In the end, uh, again, it sounds slightly trite, but win as a team, lose as a team. And that is so much a part of this sport. And the Toyota crew, Kaz Nakajima there in the centre, there to greet the winners. Tom Christensen there to present the trophies as well. To James Collado, to Antonio Giovanazzi. And that Sandro Pierre Guidi didn't go grey during that uh, final <laughs> <laughs> refusal to fire up. But I tell you what, I bet his heart rate spikes to a rate that he's previously almost never seen. This is oh. the point where everybody's waiting for the podium, and then everybody doesn't want to go home, but they know they've got to. Well, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Well, you can <laughs> overnight, but you need to kind of yeah, shuffle off tomorrow. What we're looking at is what is going to be one of the photographs of the year because you've got Ferrari winning Le Mans, a sea of humanity and beautiful sunshine and beautiful weather. And these photographs will go around the world and around the world and around the world. They'll be on social media for days, if not weeks, if not months. Uh, by the way, Alessio Salazar uh, from Chile, but uh, never got on the podium, no. remember, because he was taken out of the car and switched between two yeah. Jaguars. Him and Martin Brundle. Brundle, Brundle was switched into the second car before Eliseo managed to start the car. You're absolutely right, Stuart Dent. I'm sure you were shouting at the TV to remind <laughs> me. I was here. We were both here. I should have remembered. Well, there you can see the... Slightly different look to the 24-hour trophies below the centenary trophy, still on the four pillars, but without the standard Le Mans 24 logo, they've got a centenary logo as well. So those drivers will get an exceptional trophy as well. Just on the right-hand side there, you saw, I didn't see that before, the number 14 Nielsen pit board. The number 14 Nielsen car was gold with a whole series of images from the history of Le Mans on the pit board. The famous shot of Michael Delaney saluting one of his rivals <laughs> in Steve McQueen's film Le Mans. Great. I had not spotted that before. If you didn't see it, you'll have to look back and, uh, and get it there. There's Gilles Duquesne. The game, arch enthusiast. On the podium. Mm, absolutely. You think of another French arch enthusiast. The man with most race entries here at Le Mans. 33 entries as a driver and then a dozen more and more than that as a team owner and facilitator. Henri Pescarona, our very best wishes go to him and best thoughts, I'm sure, from everybody in the booth and around the world. Henri Pescarona, one of the great names of racing at Le Mans. By the way, 12 podium positions up for grabs in these four classes, 11 nations across those 12. Oh, <laughs> the only good. one that's... repeated with two is right. going to be the United States of America, yeah. plus the innovative car. Corvette Racing, of course, winning GTM, Cadillac Racing in Hypercar. Every other nation is a unique nation on this podium. From the tiniest to some of the very biggest and yeah. most powerful in this sport. First time in a very long while that the overall trophy will be awarded and followed by the national anthem of motorsport, the Italian national anthem. And that, they're all looking quite happy now. That will bring on the floods of tears. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, it just absolutely will. Not from me, if not from them. So here come in third place. Leading the team out is Richard Westbrook. There is Westy. Uh, he wasn't. He, I thought he was going to be the first out the door. He wasn't. So the team of the number two Cadillac they had the least misfortune of the three caddies. They came home in third place. 
the number two car, Earl Bamber, Alex Lynn, and Richard Westbrook. <laughs> Earl Bamber on the left, knows the view down from this podium. He's been an overall winner before, of course, with Porsche. Alex Lynn and Richard Westbrook. Alex Lynn carrying the colours of five-time Le Mans winner Derek Bell on his helmet as his little tribute to the centenary of this great race. Is this going to be the first time, Martin, the two schoolmates have stood on the same overall podium, Brendan Hartley and Earl Bamba? Yeah, both from we up together near Wanganui, in fact, Earl from Wanganui. Good morning, good Monday morning to my friend Don, friend Don Point, also from Wanganui. And uh, there is the crew of the number eight Toyota, Sebastian Bermi, Brendan Hartley, and Rio Hirakawa. And for the first time in 50 years, Ferrari wins Le Mans. Not in GT, the overall winners of the Le Mans 24 hours, the centenary Le Mans. 2023 it is the crew of ferrari number 51 alessandro pierguidi james collado and antonio giovanazzi they came they saw they conquered and fittingly enough those were the words of julius caesar in the opening of his Tales of the Gallic Wars and Veni Vidi Vici, 50 years since the last time it was done by Ferrari here. 58 years since Ferrari have triumphed at Le Mans. 50 years since there's been a factory entry in the 24 hours and the centenary trophy will be lifted by crew of the number 51 Ferrari 499P. To present the, present the trophies is Pierre Fion. So he presents the trophies to the crew of the number two Cadillac, the president of the Automobile Club de l'Ouest, whose predecessors came up with this crazy idea back in the late autumn of 1922. Team boss Patty Pregliasco looking rightly happy. Whatever else happens in the remainder of the season, this is the one, this is it, this is the whole shooting match, this is the big ball game. The second place trophies go to the team who could so easy bar one tiny twist of fate, one turn of the cards have been on the top step. President of the Department of the South, of the South, they are the local governing body. And they also are the owners of the property. Maintain all the public roads around this region in a state in which they can become one of the world's most famous racetracks. The crew of the number eight Toyota, Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley, Rio Hirakawa, so close. And they fought like tigers throughout. It was an epic battle for victory in all three classes. But the Grand Marshal, the most successful race winner here at Le Mans, Tom Christensen, presents the Victor's Trophies, unique Victor's Trophies with the Centenary logo on the top. To Alessandro Pierre Guidi, to James Collado, and to Antonio Giovanazzi. Team boss gets the big one for Marinello. And the Centenary Trophy is going to need some lifting. I think that is best left on its plinth. Joy pretty much unlimited. And uh, you can see the, the looks of relief on many of the crew's uh, faces, can't you, down in the pit lane? Yep. What are we going to fill this with? Well, the obvious answer is <laughs> champagne. <laughs> because we are, of course, in France. Look at that. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. That's exactly what every photographer has been hoping for. Just an absolute sea of color and humanity. Actually, that gives you a pretty good indication of what the pit walk looked like in the autograph yeah. session. Put a few drivers' tables out there, and there you have it. The Rolex watches handed, and a new deal signed between this famous brand and this great race. Long-term deal will mean the winners will continue to get uh, one of the most prized of their prizes. Come on, it's Tom. Don't leave him hanging. Tony <laughs> Giovanazzi leaving leaving Tom Christensen hanging with a, with a fist bump. Congratulations to all of them and to everybody who brought cars here, who brought teams here, who brought drivers here, who brought hopes and dreams here. The combination of every single one of them, all 62 teams, has created quite a remarkable event. Not going to be many faces in the photos when the trophies go up. They're such enormous things, aren't they? Particularly for the winners. Photoshop's going to be taking a beating tonight yeah. at Media Room. <laughs> Overwhelmed, I think, is the uh, the overwhelming emotion that you're looking at in the faces of those three Ferrari drivers. I yeah. don't think they can quite believe it. I'm not sure what the Italian for it hasn't really sunk in yet is, but that's going to get bandied around an awful lot, I think, amongst uh, our drivers. And of course, the winner's selfie. That's as much a tradition now on the podium as almost anything else. Chicolori floated in, as is the Japanese flag. And now everybody gets to smell like a winner. <laughs> Our bandsman down below, thanking the lucky stars that somebody placed them downwind and behind a firm object. Otherwise, they undoubtedly would be the subjects of some very sticky champagne showers. Doesn't do well for your trumpet, does it? it really doesn't. I don't think a trombone slide would, <laughs> would work particularly well, full of sticky champagne in this temperature. However, uh, this is the beginning now of a long round of interviews and press calls and meet and greets that can only extend all the way, you should think, to Monza in a month's time because everybody will want to talk to the Ferrari drivers that won Le Mans. In the white shirt, Bruno Von der Steek. He has been the speaker here at the Circuit de la Sarthe since 1992. And for anybody who's ever been to Le Mans, his voice is instantly recognizable. Antonio Giovinazzi, James Calado, Alessandro Pierguili! Remarkable, remarkable scenes. 50 years is a long time not to be doing something. Yeah. I, it, to come it back is and, 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 and pick it up in this sort of manner. <laughs> Uh, for those of us that were both lucky enough and unlucky enough to be here in 2020, lucky enough because we know a lot of you wanted to be here, and unlucky enough because it was beyond weird. Um, this does your heart good? It just does. It's amazing to see you all here, and uh, thank you. And there is no word to, to describe the emotion I'm feeling now, just looking at this group of amazing people, and uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Forza Ferrari! There's a lot of red in that crowd, isn't there? Merci à vous, messieurs. Merci à vous. Et encore une fois, see the photographers there. As you look down from above, there above the podium, getting those shots of the drivers, the trophies, and the crowd below. There is the car. The image of that car will go around the world. Mm. Already has. Yep. And we'll keep doing it until Enel Coletta on the left. 
and three winning drivers in front of a goodly proportion of the 325,000 people who are here to watch this astonishing race and this amazing triumph for Ferrari AF Corsa and the number 51 Ferrari 499P. Once again, Martin, there's the result. Yep. Ferrari, Toyota Gazoo Racing and Cadillac Racing completing the podium in LMP2. Victors into Europol ahead of Team WRT and Duquesne. What a result for two very small and very dedicated teams. In GTM, Corvette Racing ahead of ORT by TF and by five seconds, GR Racing snatching the final podium spot from the Iron Dames. And the Garage 56 car coming home, 39th spot, the penultimate car running at the flag. Jimmy Johnson, fittingly, bringing the Hendrix Motorsport car to the line. Rick Hendrick and his crew spent nearly two years developing that car. Chad Canals, Jimmy Johnson, and uh, Rocky, Michael Rockefeller and Jensen Button bringing the car through. And we're going to take a look at our LMP2 Pro-Am category in a moment or two. Toyota still lead the World Championship from Ferrari. That battle will tighten up, and as you can see, there is a 25-point spread, one win between the crew of the number eight car and the number 51 car. That makes life very entertaining. And look who's in third. It's the crew of the number two Cadillac. And there you go, it's Ferrari up to second place in the World Championship now, and Cadillac up to third, it's game on. Well, Toyota undefeated so far in the FIA World Endurance Championship this season, but it could happen. And again, the way I, th I think the thing that's impressed I me most differ. about Le Mans. I beg to differ. They've just been defeated. Yeah, it, yeah uh, up to now. Uh, the way that's impressed me most about Le Mans and the way that Ferrari have taken it as on, as it's as if they were never not here. Yes. It just has been the most yes. natural thing. They've not been tetchy or tight-lipped or or closed-doored or or nervous or overthinking or second guessing they've just come in relaxed and flowing and gone and done it of course now coming back and doing it again that's another whole thing but i have been singularly impressed by the the re genuine relaxed and almost carefree attitude with which not unprepared not serious not professional but not stressed way in which they have dealt with the entire thing. The history element of it, the expectations, the hopes, all of that. Yeah, they know it's there. It's not stressing them out. Inside the team, it's a little oasis of happiness and zen calm. And that's a remarkable thing to achieve in a team that has not raced as a team until the beginning of this season. So we've had already an Italian team, of course, winning overall. Japanese team, Toyota Kazoo racing in second, and a US team in third overall. We wait now, I think it's LMP2 we're going to be seeing next. Yeah. Well, the band down below who are playing the anthems have got a couple of good choices. Okay, uh, the Italian anthem, pretty standard stuff. Uh, in GTEM, Star Spangled Banner, okay, most bands are going to know that. Our uh, LMP2 Pro Am winner. A Portuguese flagged team, a little bit less of a familiar anthem. And our overall LMP2 winners, a Polish flagged team. Yeah. That Fabulous might stuff be here. one that they may not to play very frequently. So Duquesne team's number 30 squad come to the podium. Ilyani has been on this podium before on the top step, of course. And so we see Duquesne. And uh, Chilean racer Nico Pinho. His 2022 season finished with despair. But, uh, he'll stand on the third step. On the other side, the number 41 Team WRT crew, they fought hard for this. Yep. First Angolan driver on the podium at Le Mans. Pizza and Louis Delatras. But the winners. Extraordinary story, this yep. absolutely extraordinary story. In the sense there, Rui Andras, the first Angolian, Angolan driver to finish on the podium. There is Kuba Schmichowski, 
the most unassuming racing driver I think you will probably ever meet. Albert Costa, whose career is just going to start getting vaulted into the stratosphere. And Fabio Scherer, apparently Ben Keating has been down to apologise to him. Uh, it, it seems he has broken a toe, probably his big toe actually. Uh, so, uh, Nicky Katzberg, I beg your pardon, apologised to Fabio Scherer. There he is in the centre. Well, luckily, he didn't have to hop onto the podium. He can stand our LMP2 winners, the Polish anthem. Wonderful stuff. And by the way, we didn't get Michael Fassbender on the podium. We right. did get Sasha Fassbender, team manager of the European competition, on the podium there. His younger brother. The you can see the state of the cars of there underneath. The, the, the battle scars on these cars. <laughs> Even the ones that have been damaged are just covered in filth. Road filth, dirt from all the cars and lorries and trucks that use the public highways that gets thrown up in the rain. And all the little black marks, black smears all over the car from the marbles, from the rubber that gets thrown off by the tyres of the race cars. Poland's biggest name in motorsport on the second step of the podium, but tomorrow morning the biggest name in Poland in the newspapers will be the team on the top step. Yep, into Europe all. Well, thanks again, as we have mentioned a couple of times to Total Energy, the energy and fuel supplying partner of the FIA World Endurance Championship and of Le Mans, their 100% sustainable fuel used not just in every racing car, but in all the tyre heaters in the paddock. Robert Kuditz on the left, Rui Andrade in the centre, Angola's Rui Andrade and Louis Delatraz, one of many second generation racers in this field. We had a third generation as well with young Jonas Reed, whose grandfather and father both raced here at Le Mans, whose dad was also in the race, Christian Reed. And the mayor of Le Mans presents our winners, the Inter Europol trio, with their trophy. Closest to us with the glasses is Kuba Schmirovsky, Fabio Scherer in the middle, and Albert Costa with the beard and the biggest smile. Amazing. Yeah. What a remarkable achievement. It is a very small family operation. And Inter Europol, for those who don't know, is not uh, a European-wide police operation. That's Interpol. Inter Europol is a Europe-wide Polish-based bakery concern. So the racing bakers have done it. A well, while before Fabio Scherer goes for a jog, I reckon. Yeah. And actually, if he's broken his big toe, that's going to be hurting him a long while. Hopefully, it's not too bad. A little pain for the next few weeks. But every time it hurts, he can look at his Le Mans winner's trophy. And it'll make him feel just a little bit better. It'll make him feel a heck of a lot better. Not many people get to win Le Mans in such exclusive company and very few do it without able being able to even walk to their car great stuff and those images will be played in 20 years time of a driver hopping around to get into a race car we go oh, i'd forgotten that even happened who was that it is it is going to be one of those images that will come back time after time i think by the way this is dramatically alters the points in the FI World Endurance Championship and uh, Interpol competition won the few teams in LMP2, which is a class that will leave the WC at the end of this year that does not have a, as yet a clear path forward. And this isn't going to hurt, is it? No. Nope. Absolutely not. You can see our class winning cars down there, the oval winning Ferrari, front and centre. And the LMP2, the LMP2 Pro Am, and GTE Am class winners. Well, that WRT, they fought for that, and uh, yep. at uh, two or three points, I thought they got that one. But the spirit in this little team from Poland, amazing. Well, LMP2 was a mirror of hypercar. You could go almost literally from first to last with a little incident or, or sometimes even a pit stop. It was so close and so tight for most of the race. 
none of these really even looked like being partly resolved until we were pretty much at lunchtime on Sunday. It's incredible. I, I think most of the race I was looking to the Spanish flags, some people saying, vamos, 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 Albert. Thank you, thank you so much for all the support to all the people around these days. It's been amazing. Thank you, Boku. Bye, merci beaucoup, Jolie. Fabio, how is the, the left foot? Let's speak tomorrow about it. Today I don't feel it, and it's unbelievable. Merci beaucoup. Jacob, congratulations. I think it is the most beautiful day of your life. Yes, of course. I mean, my racing life at least. It's uh, the most amazing experience. And I'm just so proud to have the Polish flag waving here on the top step of the podium. It's, uh, it's a dream come true, and I think it's, it's just amazing. I'm speechless. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, Jacob Lesowski le confirme, mesdames et messieurs. Albert Costa came up the single seater ladder, thankfully for all the commentators, at exactly the same as Antonio Felix de Costa. No confusion there whatsoever no. when Costa they're in the same well, categories think, and in the same races. Is the chosen uh, moniker for Albert Costa, but uh, as you can see, massive enthusiast, as Martin said earlier in the broadcast, Cuba. Uh, a very understated and private individual, but uh, you can see the emotion on his face. That is the result, 20 laps, uh, 28 laps completed uh, by the 34 car, and it was eventually 21 seconds to the good ahead of the second place team WRT car, with the third place going to Decane team after winning a bit of a duel with the number 31 team WRT that actually eventually fell behind. Yep. The uh, the RPNL 36 team WRT lead the World Championship or the World Cup rather four points just now mm. ahead of inter Europol competition in the yep. two United cars who did not have the best Le Mans this year. Oh. That is a really tough battle and inter Europol claiming victory with team WRT's 41 car in second place that makes that a super car uh, tight battle with half the season almost left to go. So just four point spreads between those two crews. Well, this race in LMP2 was never a two horse affair. There were not yawning chasms in it, nor were there in GTE Am. The final podium spot decided for the crew of GR Racing by just five seconds. They're jubilant. The crew of the Iron Dames Porsche will be crushed. So GR Racing, Mike Wainwright, the tall figure of Ben Barker and Ricardo Perra, who did the anchor leg there in the centre. Go one better the last year, fourth last year for this team. And indeed, this exact driving crew. Second for ORT by TF Sports. ORT for Oman Racing Team. And if you're listening and uh, looking in from Oman, I'm sure this is a very happy day for your proud nation as well. That's come courtesy of Armand Harty, a massive flag carrier for his country. Or as Louise almost renamed them, OMG by TF Sport. <laughs> there is TF, Tom Ferrier himself, yeah. former racer, uh, raced up to Formula 3 standards in the UK, then started running cars for others and has never stopped since. So uh, Amado Harty, Michael Dynan of the USA and Charlie Eastwood and our winners in the Corvette Racing C8R, Nicky Katzberg, the very slightly taller figure of Nico Veroni and the ebullient Ben Keating. I mean, Daly, by the way, the team manager on the other side of the podium for GR Racing. And <laughs> great to see. So Ben Joy. Keating once more on the top step at Le Mans in a GT car. Built in America, the win in the wins for GT didn't last long. This one, hopefully, will stick around. Indeed, nine years, eight different cars. He's won with, well, in fact, one across the line with three of them. He's kept the win with two of them. Mm -hmm. The four GT, very popular car back in the day. Unfortunately, losing its win to a technical infringement the, uh, the day after. And uh, GR Racing. How important might this be for their future in the FI World Endurance Championship? Again, another team that punches above its weight. Can't argue with a podium at Le Mans. A huge result for them. Very big day indeed 
and Gamal head of Bosch Motorsport. Again, one of the key suppliers to the FIA World Endurance Championship. And Tom Ferrier receives the ORT by Tier Sport trophy. Ahmed El Harty on the left hand side of your shot there, the first racing driver from Oman to claim an FIA World Championship pole position. And now he claims his nation's first Le Mans trophy. Is there a better ambassador for sports car racing than Ben Keating anywhere in the world? I'm not sure there is. No. The enthusiasm and yeah. the, the application, the talent, the drive, fantastic. Nick and Veroni, right. a new star. Nick Katzberg, an established star. And Ben Keating, frankly, just a sports car racing icon. Just a star star. And he was the man who brought all the cowboy hats from Texas for the crew. So if you find their photo, their team photo, at uh, Scrutineering Le yep. Bézage in the centre of town. They are proudly sporting those. It means you can't see any of them, but uh, a <laughs> whole bunch of people in race suits and hats. Could be anybody, frankly. And a thank you to Pratt Miller and yes. all the ladies and gentlemen that have entertained us so royally through two decades or more of Corvette racing in GTS, in GT1, in GTE Pro, and in GTE Am. Well, Jim and I can both remember back to the early days of American Le Mans series when they were running Corvettes with Opposition Wanted written down the side of them. <laughs> and Opposition came, and they have been part of the sports car firmament ever since. Wonderful. Congratulations to the crew and to the teams and drivers. But in fact, again, as we say, always of every team and every crew that gets an entry here and comes here. It's a it's an illustrious deal to have a car entered for Le Mans any year, never mind the centenary year, and to get the wretched thing to the finish line after and 10 days of, of toil and trouble and quite often 24 hours of extreme reluctance on the car's part is a, is a huge deal. At the Présage Place de la République, you said it's an American car. So, uh, of course, a very important victory at Le Mans with Chevrolet Corvettes. Ah, the 25th anniversary of Corvette racing. <laughs> Merci. Uh, the uh, 100th anniversary for Le Mans, the last GTE uh, race at Le Mans. Uh, to be an American car, uh, an American team, the American driver is uh, just incredible. Thank you to all the fans. Uh, uh, you made it special. They really do. They and really, really do. And on behalf of the fans, Jim, I think we'd say Merci same to the teams. Le <laughs> ah. Getting some coaching. Merci le public. There you go. How, how do I say? Oh, before I forget this point, class victory for a Corvette. Wow. Uh, before I forget, by the way, with Nicky Katzberg on the podium there, uh, we've already welcomed to the podium two drivers who, since the 21st of May, have won two international 24 hour races because both Nicky Katzberg and Earl Bamba took the overall win at the 24 hours of the Nürburgring. Uh -huh. Just last month. There Astonishing. They are multifaceted. A very, very popular winner. Absolutely. So our final podium should be for the LMP2 Pro-Am, but Corvette Racing, ORT by TF and GR. GR by 5.3 seconds over the Iron Dames. That's a, a tough blow for that crew of the pink Porsche, but their time will come. They will win races, they will win titles, they may even end up winning Le Mans. They are too good not to. Corvette Racing leads the overall team's trophy race ahead of our T by TF, and the Iron Dames just three points back in third spot. It is now not quite a formality, but Corvette Racing have a very strong lead. Ben Keating, Nicky Katzberg, and Nico Veroni 
again likewise ahead of Abadar Harty, Charlie Eastwood and Michael Dynam. So it looks as though the title will go to the crew of the yellow Corvette and uh, the battle for second is on. Not quite sure I understand those points, but if that's correct, uh, Ben Keating and the Corvette team need four points to clinch the title in Monza. Well, or otherwise, it's a little finish. more than writing their name on the top of the entry list, but uh, they will be going for victory in the remaining three races of the championship. And to remind you, those are in Monza in July, late September at Fuji in Japan, and then in November, in Bahrain, the season finale once more, the duel in the desert. Yeah, so we've had one back-to-back -back winner here at Le Mans on the podium already. That was Ben Keating, won last year with TF Sports in uh, GTE. And we're about to see another, and it's the team and one of the drivers uh, with Algar Pro Racing back-to-back -back wins in LMP2 Pro Am. We'll welcome the team to the, team to the podium. They're going to form that uh, three-squad staircase of talent. Yeah, DKR Engineering in third place. They will come out first. The all Belgian crew, all in Belgian colours. Great to see their reward after what was quite a trying race. Really quite hard work. The car didn't really seem like it wanted to play ball very often. The 43 crew pushed hard. Maxime Martin, familiar face. And I would give this crew livery of the race. Oh, great. Yeah. Look great, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. look really good. Absolutely outstanding. The Michael Delaney quote on the front splitter and, of course, the, <laughs> the homage to the, to the three great uh, records at Le Mans yeah. on the tailwind. Cool racing from Switzerland. Alexander Quani, Milti Jakobsen and Nico Lapierre, always a popular figure here. They don't need the team boss to go alongside the drivers because the team boss is one of the drivers. Mm. Kenny Jenklas, by the way, the team boss of DK Engineering. They're going to build it. Yep. Tom Van Rompuy and on the left, Maxime Martin. Adds podium at Le Mans to class wins and overall wins at Spa 24, where his father and uncle both won. This is the winning crew from Algar Pro Racing in the colours of CrowdStrike Racing. The team, as they Operates in the Inter Weathers Export Scar Championship. George Kurtz, Colin Brown, back for the first time since 2008, and Relics to an Every Hour winner, now Le Mans winner for the second time, James Allen. And Stewie Cox there, the team boss of Algar Pro, joint team boss of Algar Pro. You better say that quickly. Second, second, almost most important person in Algar Pro. He's very happy to be up there. <laughs> Isn't he? So. Gentle giant, Stewie. The Portuguese anthem for Algar Pro Racing. Of course, Dewey Cox knows that he's second to the car, the team, the mechanics, the pets, you know, pretty much everything else. But uh, he's up there receiving the trophy. And loving it, I'm yeah. sure. Good year caps on top of the heads of all of our podium. This is the class together with the main LMP2 class shot with Goodyear rubber. DKR engineering crew taking third place in LNT, LMP2 Pro Am. Easy for me to say after barely any time talking at all. Torek Fusier, the pre uh, vice president of the ACO, presenting the trophies to the crew of the 37 Cool Racing Organization machine. Let's get it together, aren't they, for yeah. this group? Nico Lapierre, the de facto team manager. Player manager drives the car, organises the team, writes the theme tune, sings the theme the tune. And the vice president of the ACO presenting the trophies to our LMP2 Pro Am winners here in the Centenary Le Mans. And again, the familiar shape of the Le Mans trophy with the Centenary logo, and that will be very proudly displayed in Algar Pro Racing's truck, office, or wherever, because you're never going to win one like that ever again. Well, they'll have a unique double uh, picture on the wall. Sam Cox, the other co-owner, the wife of uh, Stewie, was up on the podium last year. Stewie gets that opportunity this year. They work extremely hard and have a very happy bunch of customers. National motorsport has not been easy over the last several years. 
keep coming out winners. Guys, nice guys do come out ahead. And actually, one of the things about this year's Vermont is that has significantly proved to be the case. In a paddock full of nice guys, Lady Luck chose some of the nice guys to be on the podium and to be on the top step. They lost out just by thousandths. Uh, Algar Pro at the Rolex 24. Unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately for history, James Allen was the man that uh, took that win away from them. George Kurtz finally gets the champagne cork out, and uh, Stewie Cox gets face full of fizz. Well, he's dressed for it, dressed light for the weather, and also for the champagne shower that he knew was coming. Cork goes into the crowd, and the final words courtesy of our track speaker, Bruno Van der Steek. Well done to him, to his uh, co-commentators, Thomas Bastien, and uh, the English voice of Le Mans, Chris McCarthy, who's kept the fans entertained and informed throughout the 24-hour race. Um, so, yeah, pretty cool to come back and do one, one better. I mean, it's an uh, incredible race, super proud of these guys. They did such a good job driving with me, and, man, great team effort, great teamwork, and, uh, wow, it's pretty cool, really cool. Thank you, all the fans, people of France. Oh, vive la France! Il a dit, mesdames et messieurs, Colin Brown pour son mot à l'arrivée de cette édition. That's how to do it. That's how to smooth your exit out of the circuit today. Merci au commissaire, merci au volontier, and vive la France! So congratulations to everybody in all the 40 cars that finally made it across the line here at Le Mans. Congratulations to everybody who. Got it together to start. Really, really happy to be on the podium, says Maxime. Incredible to experience the atmosphere here with all these fans and to be here at the centenary race of Le Mans. Prendra bientôt le volant d'une voiture dans la dénomination. Apparemment, se termine par bêta, mais ça c'est pour dans quelques temps. Là déjà, c'est cool d'être sur le podium. C'est magnifique. C'était une édition exceptionnelle et exceptional running of this race. Great to be on the podium. Merci à tous. Vous avez été merveilleux. C'était vraiment un honneur de courir ici aujourd'hui. Thank you to everybody. You've been fantastic. It has truly been an honor to race in front of you. Thank you so much to all of Cool Racing for working so hard the last couple of weeks. Merci aussi Alexandre. Bravo. C'est un un c'est du sport collectif hein le trophée. Oui exactement. Je pense que le numéro un de la collectivité c'est le public qu'on a aujourd'hui. C'était irréel comme comme fait. Il n'y a pas de don pour faire ça. Merci à vous tous. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of I have no words for this going around and that's exactly what you heard there from Alexandre Kwani, Marty Jakobsen, first time at the event and he's really experienced one of the good sides of Le Mans, a race that was tough, hard fought but ended up with them on the podium. So confirmation coming in a moment or two of our Pro-Am finishes. And this will just be a race result, not a part yep. of the FIWC this class, this season. So it will be the professional results of the race only. Well, um, until we get there, Algar Pro, the winners with Cool Racing, car number 37 in second place. And DKR rounding out the podium with the number 43 machine ahead of rivals Prema and Graf. And that is it for the Centenary Le Mans. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to everybody for their input into everything that has gone to make this one of the most exceptional sporting events of the last decade and more. On behalf of everybody who is in the audience i'd also like to extend our thanks again to our partners who have made this possible amp visual and alchemel systems congratulations to all you guys for yet again producing superb results and on behalf of all the crew behind the scenes 
the crew led by uh, Best Sports Art Director, Olivier Denis and Natalie Fargier, everybody in the trucks, in the compound, everybody out there operating cameras, running cable and everything else. And for those you've seen and heard from, from Louise Beckett, Steph Wentworth, Guy Smith, Peter Dumbreck, Jim Roller, Anthony Davidson and Graham Goodwin, I'm Martin Haven saying thank you for joining us. We'll see you in Monza in a month.